<laughs> I actually have two stories, and I'm not sure I would call them ghost stories or not. Perhaps they are angels, but nonetheless, they happened and are not necessarily related. When I was in high school, I was madly in love with a guy two years older than me. I was a senior, and he was graduated and in the Air Force. He was my first love. Shortly before my high school graduation, I had made tentative plans to visit him at his base in Mississippi. I called him with my plan. He was less than thrilled. It was during this call that I found out he was seeing another girl, and we broke up. I was utterly devastated. I kept the pain to myself mostly, and nobody really knew how terribly it affected me. I was beside with myself with my heart. A couple of days after we broke up, I was in my bedroom upstairs. I heard my mother call my name from the bottom of the steps, and she sounded very strange. She said, come down here. You got some flowers delivered to you. I went to the kitchen, and my mother looked utterly baffled. I was convinced they were from Dan, and he wanted me back. The bouquet was huge and beautiful, with roses and exotic flowers and greens. It was obviously a very expensive arrangement. I opened the card and it said, What the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls a butterfly. Signed Anonymous. I asked everyone I knew if they sent the flowers. Nobody owned up to it. Nobody. My mom tried to call the florist. The florist said that the only thing they knew is that it came in FTD, which meant that it wasn't local. To this day, more than 15 years later, I still don't know who sent those flowers, but I somehow like to believe that they were a gift from an angel. The second story happened this past year. Both of my parents died this past year, both unexpectedly and very young. My mom died of a burst aneurysm in her heart. My father died of complications of a heart bypass surgery. She was 59, and my father was 62. After my mom died, strange things began to happen. The first thing was the night of the first funeral home visitation. I was at that time at home, writing a letter to my mother to be placed in her casket to be buried with her. My sister and father were at my parents' house getting dressed with my sister who was ironing in the basement, heard an extremely loud crash come from upstairs in the kitchen and made her jump. She said she had been thinking about mom. My dad, at the time of the large crash, was standing in the bedroom trying to decide what suit to wear. He said that he was thinking, no, I shouldn't wear that suit. Yvonne, my mom, wouldn't like that. My dad and my sister went into the kitchen, above the kitchen sink, was a window that my mom had filled with crystals and stained glass pretties that were suction cupped to the window. My mom's favor was of a blue stained glass oval of an angel praying. It was that glass ornament that had fallen into the sink and made the crash. Those ornaments had been there for years and never fell into the sink, but they did this day. Two days later, I had to attend a doctor's appointment. My mother and dad were leaving to meet the funeral director, and I was leaving for the doctor. I stopped and said, shoot, I don't have money for the copay, and I'm running late. I don't have time to stop at the bank. My sister gave me the money for it. On the way to the appointment, I realized that, shoot, I was meeting a friend for lunch, and I still don't have any money. I thought to look in the console of my car, but I knew there would be no money there. I never have money in my car. I looked anyway, but when I opened the lid, there sat a $5 bill. Odd, but I was so glad to see it. I didn't think too much about it until later when I thought hard about it. I didn't leave that money there. That same day, my sisters and nephews went to my uncle's pharmacy and Hallmark shop where my mom had worked also. My mom had always bought Beanie Babies for my nephews from there. My nephew was looking for a specific beanie, and I'd been unable to find it for months. That day, they found it at the shop. My uncle didn't remember ever seeing that one before, and he took care of the order. 
few days later, I was sleeping. I was exhausted from the funeral. I was taking time off from work. Nobody was home. The window was open. And I was dozing peacefully when I heard quite clearly, Carrie, Carrie. I sat up. My heart was pounding. I heard my mother. She was calling me as if I wasn't supposed to be sleeping, like she always used to do if she thought I were oversleeping. One of the things that my mom always did when she was alive that annoyed me was to yell my name from the bottom of the steps. I heard it so vividly that morning. I want to say it was in my head, but it woke me up, and her voice was as clear as day. My bedroom was the entire length of the top floor of a Cape Cod house. I had my own smoke detector up there. From that day on, whenever I would get really upset about losing my mother, that silly smoke detector would beep. Beep, 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 beep. I changed the battery. Beep. But it happened only when I was upset, or thinking of her. The crystals on the phone began to fall off regularly, where they never did before. The phone in the kitchen, which had a speakerphone function, would click on its own violation when someone was on the telephone. It happened about five times. That, too, had never done that before. Suddenly, everything just stopped. No more odd happenings. Then my father went into a coma. Several friends from out of town were staying at the house, and keeping a vigil with us at the hospital. One evening, everyone was at the hospital, but a friend of the family named Jenny. She had heard the stories of my mom's hauntings and the smoke detector going off. She was reading a book, alone in the house, and the smoke detector in the downstairs hallway started going crazy. Jenny got up, walked into the hallway, looked up at it and said, Miss Harley, we aren't ready to let Don go yet. You can't have him. Is that okay? The minute she said that, the smoke detector beeped one more time, and it never did again. It completely freaked her out. Shortly after my father died, all strange happenings seized little by little. They do not happen anymore. I wish they would. It was almost nice thinking that my mom and our dad were hanging around and watching us. Thanks for reading. One time when I was about 14 years old, I was babysitting for a police officer and his wife. The police officer was on duty that night, and I can't really remember where the wife was going, but nonetheless, they hired me to babysit. I had never been to their house before, and I remember when I got there, how creepy this house had seemed. It was an old house down in Wald Lake, Michigan. And I can remember the house did not have modern heat ducts. Instead, there were registers in the floor in the upstairs that you could peer through clear to the downstairs living area. I don't remember too much about the incident, other than hearing some footsteps upstairs and other noises after I put the couple's children to bed. I could hear the noises very well through the heat registers, and I remember it looked as though somebody had walked right over one of them above me. I remember going upstairs to check to see what they were up to, only to find them sound asleep. I also remember trying to wake them, and it was obvious that they were fast asleep. And besides, they were very small children, like three and four years old, certainly not old enough to pull off any kind of prank very well. And so I went back downstairs, a little concerned, since the house was dark and creepy to begin with, and I had heard these strange, unexplained noises. But, after going back downstairs, and the noises started again, I immediately called dispatch, and got the police officer on the phone, and demanded that he come home, and take me home immediately, as I would not stay any longer. I never babysat for them again, and I do remember the police officer trying to convince me all the way home, that it was just my imagination, because the house was old, etc. In either case, I never went back again and told the police officer very nicely to find another babysitter. Another incident happened when I was in high school, shortly before graduation. I used to babysit my little sister after school for a couple hours 
before my stepmother got home. One afternoon, I was babysitting her and watching TV. She was very young at the time, about four years old. This was the time of day that she usually took a nap, and she fell asleep on the couch next to me, like usual. While watching TV that afternoon, and I wasn't watching anything scary, I think I may have been watching either Oprah or a soap opera. I distinctly heard the sliding glass door in the finished basement open and close. You know the sound of sliding glass doors. The sound is very distinct. I didn't think anything of it. My father and stepmother usually came and went through that door, since the finished basement is actually on the ground level. In the living quarters of this beautiful log home is actually on the second floor. This was a common and most used entrance into the house. My father worked out of town during the week and was only home on the weekends. Anyway, like I said, I didn't think anything of it. I thought my stepmother was home and expected her to come walking up the stairs at any moment, like she usually did when she came home. I also remember thinking, Boy, she's home early today. I just kept watching television. After about 10 minutes, I noticed that she had not come up the stairs. So I went to the stairs and called down to her, but got no response. I thought to myself, that's weird. I know I heard the door. Then I heard what sounded like somebody downstairs. So I called again and again and nothing. So I peered out the kitchen window and looked down into the driveway and her car was not there. I got scared at that point. I thought to myself, oh no, not again, remembering other incidents while babysitting. And I ran to the telephone to try to call her at work. The phone was dead. I absolutely freaked out at this point. I grabbed my little sister, who was still fast asleep, threw her little winter coat on. It was the middle of winter time. Grabbed the biggest butcher knife I could find and ran out the front door. I ran down the deck steps and into my dad's old pickup truck in the driveway. I locked the doors and just sat there in total terror. I didn't know what to do. There was no doubt in my mind that somebody was in the house and I stared at the house for what seemed like forever until my stepmother got home. Of course, she couldn't understand why I was so hysterical. But what on earth I was doing outside in the pickup truck in the middle of the dead winter with a butcher knife of all things. Anyway, she checked the sliding glass door to the basement. It was locked. There seemed to be nobody in the house. And if it were a real person in the house, there was no way they could have escaped unseen by me as I sat in the old pickup truck. I remember how scared I was. The house is in the woods, and back then, there wasn't another house closer than about 80 acres away. By the way, the first thing my stepmother did when she got home and investigated my claim was to check the telephone, which was working fine. Oh well. I know she thought I absolutely lost my rocker that afternoon, but I know better. She still laughs and teases me about it whenever it is brought up now. My little sister who is now 20 years old, doesn't remember a thing. At the same home, during the same time in my life, shortly before high school graduation, I experienced the strangest things each night in my bedroom, after everybody went to sleep. These strange things occurred for at least several weeks. I would fall asleep, but awake at around 1 to 2 a.m. in the morning, because my bed would be shaking. Now, I just want to clarify, this log home is not old or anything. It was only about 10 years old at the time, and was very, very beautiful. I had a beautiful bedroom with pretty pink carpeting. There was nothing really creepy or scary about this house, nor the woods that it was situated in. However, every night like clockwork, for several weeks, I would awaken to feel my bed shaking uncontrollably, and I would throw the covers over my head and just shake in total fear. Then it would stop. I would fall back asleep, and by morning, I would think it was just a dream. Except, after a while, I started realizing that it was no dream. It was really happening. 
And I can remember one night yelling, stop it, go away. And that was the end of it. It never happened again. And after what happened in the earlier story I just told, I never spoke to my parents about it. The only person in the world that I told was my boyfriend, who also happens to be my husband of 14 years. He is convinced that I am sensitive to spiritual things. As I said in my last letter, because of the experiences I've had in my life, like those said about above in the actual ghost I saw that I spoke about in my earlier email, I'm so very much interested in ghost hunting. My husband would have no part of it, so when it comes to this stuff, I'm on my own. I just don't know where to start. I guess there is a part of me that wants to do this, so I don't feel like I'm crazy. Also because of the so many unanswered biblical questions that I have, that I somehow feel like if I do this, I might feel more resolved in my beliefs. On the other hand, it could prove to be even more confusing. Who knows? If you have any suggestions about how to go about doing this secretly, I can't let anyone in the community I live know what I'm up to. I'm a business owner and a local politician, and I don't need people thinking I'm nuts. I would appreciate any advice you would give me. Thanks so much. Eleven years ago, I moved into an old little walkout rambler that sits on my father-in-law's business property in the country. We call it Ghetto in the Meadow. Don't get me wrong, it's okay, but tiny, and at that time, needed some repairs that have since been done. It had at one time been moved to the country by the man that had lived there for many years in the house, until he died in the hospital. His name was Myron. I had to move my king-size waterbed in the unfinished basement, because that's the only place that was big enough for the bed. My boyfriend refused to sleep downstairs, because when we were downstairs, we could hear footsteps above us going back and forth. One night, we fell asleep on the floor, watching TV on the main floor. Sometime in the night, my boyfriend moved to the couch and left me on the floor. It was about 5 a.m. that I woke up stiff. We were talking and heard a noise like soul walking upstairs. Then we heard a blurp, a blurp noise in the bathroom. I chokingly told my boyfriend that it was Myron, and he had to go to the bathroom. Just after I said it, the water in the bathroom sink came on. He wanted me to stay in the living room, and he would check it out. No way. I was right behind him and watched, as he had turned the handle to shut the water off. After that... We had many things happen. Lights in the TV would turn on and off. A broom in the basement would get knocked over. And I smelled pipe smoke in the living room once and perfume in the kitchen several times. Our beagle would stare up at the ceiling as if watching something by where you get up to the attic. Many times, my boyfriend would get his gun and go looking around the house because we would hear strange things. He got a double water bed that would fit in one of the two small bedrooms. After that, we would hear a lot of noise in the basement by a workbench. We lived in the house for five years. My mom couldn't believe that we would stay there, but it was pretty much harmless stuff, and it wasn't like it was happening every night. Just when we started to feel like maybe we imagined what happened, something else would go on. Before we moved, I tried to get my husband to come to bed instead of sleeping on the couch. I got his usual reply in a minute which meant he wouldn't be moving. I went into the bedroom, and it felt really cold, so much so that I went and checked the thermostat in case it got turned down. I had just got uncomfortable and heard my husband yell out my name. He said he heard little feet scurrying from the kitchen to the living room really fast and go behind the couch. The couch was only inches away from the wall, and something slapped him on the back of the head. He didn't go back to sleep that whole night. Maybe something was telling him that he should be in bed with me. I found it funny, but he didn't find the humor in it. We had a baby and moved into our new house. I heard balls inside one of her blow-up toys move and went to check on it so I wouldn't wake her up. I thought the toy was by the register and the air conditioning was on, but it wasn't even close by. 
Twice it happened. One afternoon, I laid down for a nap. I remember seeing a very good looking man come to my bedroom door and talk to me. At first, I was afraid. But when I saw his face, I definitely wasn't. I couldn't remember what he talked to me about, but asked if he could see our baby before he left. He turned around and looked in the other bedroom for a minute and turned back around and said my name and told me how beautiful she was and that she'd be waking up. In that instant, she was crying. She was gone and I was awake. Do you think it was a dream? Or who was it? Myron from Ghetto in the Meadow or my husband's brother that died? After that, nothing unusual happened at our house. My brother-in-law moved to Ghetto in the Meadow and said at first, the lights would go on and heard noises, but nothing happened there in years. This is my experience with a haunted house. Me and my family moved into this big house about 15 years ago. I had two small daughters and my husband at the time. The first night there, I was alone and had just put my kids to sleep upstairs and was just laying down myself when I heard someone in the kitchen. It sounded like they were going through the drawers frantically, looking for something. Well, I was terrified as I knew that my husband wasn't there. I went downstairs to see what or who was there and nothing was out of place. And that's when other things started to occur. My youngest daughter wouldn't go upstairs by herself. She always told me that there was a man up there. I didn't understand it till later. As we settled in, things got worse for me. I would be watching TV. The volume would go up and down. Ashtrays on the table would move. The drapes would sway when the windows weren't open. I was bathing one time in the downstairs bathroom and felt something touch my shoulder. It felt very cold. I had things of mine stolen, and I'd never gotten it back. One night, I was just dozing off, and I felt the covers being pulled off of me. This really scared me, but I tried not to think about it the next day. I was cleaning the stairs, and a very deep voice said, Hey you, right beside me. The hair stood up on my neck. That night, at 2 a.m., someone came running up the stairs, stopping at the top. Of course, I saw nothing there. My husband told me that he awoke one night, and there was a very tall man standing in the corner of our room, dressed in black, just watching us. The next day, my oldest daughter told me that a woman who was dressed like a nurse carrying a tray came out of her closet, walking towards her. She had a name tag, but it wasn't legible. It scared her pretty bad. One morning, I was down in the basement doing laundry, and I hated to go down there. When I got this terrible feeling, I tried to ignore it, but it got worse. The hairs on my neck were tingling. I knew that something was coming up behind me, but I couldn't move. Then it was like someone stomped on the cement floor. It was so weird, because the floor vibrated. I was so scared that I threw my laundry and ran up the stairs. I would also go to bed with jewelry on and wake up, and it would be off, and I would find it somewhere in the house. One morning, I woke up to find a straight razor in my bed down by my feet. I think that did it for me, and I wanted to move out. And the kids' bedroom window would never stay shut. We tried everything to keep it shut, but I would go upstairs, and it would be opened. My mother babysat for me one evening, and when I got home, she was white as a ghost, and told me that she would never watch my kids here again. We also had a dog that we kept tied in the corner of the yard, right by the area of the basement that scared me the most, and I saw him digging, and didn't think anything of it, until I returned, and saw that he dug a hole waist deep, and was still trying to dig. His paws were bleeding, and he was foaming at the mouth. I had to pull him out of there. It was horrible. He finally moved out, and for a long time, my daughter was afraid that the man was going to follow us. I looked up the history of the house and found out that it was built in the 1800s. That was all that I could find out. The house is still there. I drive by it sometimes 
and wonder if the people who live there now have any problems. And there's a lot of ghosts in my family, so I'll just tell you a few. My grandfather passed away before I was born. He used to wait for my aunt, sitting in his rocking chair, every day to get out of school. Well, one day after he died, my aunt said that she came home from school to find her babysitter with her jaw hanging open and wide-eyed, staring at the rocker. It was rocking by itself, and their dog was sitting in front of it, begging. Suddenly, the rocker stopped moving, and the dog started walking slowly back to the door, which was deadbolt locked. The door unlocked in front of everyone and swung open. So did the screen door. Normally, if the back door was open, the dog would run out. He didn't. Then both doors shut again, but they didn't lock. Another story is told by my mother and my aunts on my father's side. They were all playing Trivial Pursuit when a question came up about one of the wars that my grandfather had fought in. Meanwhile, there was a pot of spaghetti sitting on the stove. My Aunt Patty said a smart comment about my grandfather and the war, just joking around. Well, the pot of spaghetti flew across the room and landed right next to my Aunt Patty's feet. It dumped everywhere and just missed her. I think he was just trying to tell her that her joke wasn't funny. My personal experiences are different. One, for instance, was when my grandfather died in 1990. Two weeks later, me and my cousin slept in my grandmother's house. My aunts and fathers lived there. Well, about 8 p.m., we both went into the living room to watch TV, and my grandma's rocker was rocking by itself. That I saw with my own two eyes. Another incident was at my cousin Sandy's house. My cousin Brandy and I were babysitting. She was on the phone with her boyfriend when the kitchen light switch started turning on and off by itself. It was going up and down like someone was turning it on and off. Okay, last story. The story to my cousin Sandy's house is even weirder. A man had hung himself in the attic a couple of years before she moved in. My cousin was a dancer, so she used to exercise a lot to stay in shape. Anyways... She told me a few stories about when she was exercising, and she would get tapped on the shoulder. Or once she heard someone calling out her newborn son's name, and no one was in the house. She heard knocks in the front door, the attic door would open, and shut continuously. Her brother-in-law was there on a few instances. Whoever he was, he wasn't good. He was definitely there to scare, so she moved out within six months. I have a few more that I can think of, but I think this is already too long. I don't know if there's a reason for so many hauntings in my family or not, but I wish that it would stop. You never know what would happen if someone really ever got one of these spirits angry. Thanks for reading my family history. I hope you enjoyed it. I didn't. My story has to do with things that happened to me as a child. When I was six years old. My parents bought a very old house, probably around 100 years old, and that was back in 1976. It was a very large home, and some of the original wallpaper was still in it. I've always been in kind of tune with the supernatural, and I also have a psychic sense. I'm not saying I am psychic, but I just know things, and I can't explain it. Well, anyway, I know that my sister was very afraid of this house. She is three years younger than me. She would either sleep with my parents or with me, and she would never cross the long hall that ran through the center of the house by herself. I know that one day, I was sitting in the living room, and I got this really weird feeling. It really felt like I wasn't the only one in the room. I felt like someone was staring at me. Now keep in mind that my mother and sister had gone to the store, so I was in the house alone. At this time, I was about nine years old. I was sitting on the floor, and I just happened to look up. If you are familiar with old houses, you know that some of these have glass windows at the top of each door that I guess people used for ventilation before air conditioning was invented. Well, 
The upstairs of this house had been added years after the original one story had been built, and the steps that led upstairs went even with the glass window above the door in the room I was in. There was also a small triangle of wood that was missing from the step, and that is where my eyes shifted to. There was something looking at me through that space. I was so scared that I grabbed my dog and ran to the front porch, just hoping my mother would drive up. I don't know what it was, but there was something up there. People in the neighborhood were always asking if the house was haunted, and one time, an old woman I had never seen before asked me if I knew of the girl that had been locked in her room, in my house, and she had died there. There's also another story that happened in the same house. My uncle was living with us. He was 70 years old, and I was about 10 at the time. One night, I heard him calling my father. He was shouting, and that is what woke me up. My father went running into his room, and this was my uncle's reply. I know you're not going to believe this, and I know I shouldn't be seeing this, but I do. There's a black woman standing in front of the fireplace, holding a little girl's hand, and she's wearing a red coat and hat. Then, my father said that my uncle's eyes followed something around the room, and then my uncle began to scream again, No! Go away! Don't come near me! Then they disappeared. My father said he had never been so scared in his life, because my uncle was being so rational about it, like he knew he shouldn't be seeing something like that, but he did. I knew there was something in the house. Although we moved out when I was 14, I still drive by to look, and I still do get a creepy feeling about it just from driving by. My mom and one of my sisters just moved to New York, and we are living in the house my mom grew up in. Both of her parents are dead, and have been for a number of years. Ever since we have gotten here, my mom and sister have felt something in the house. I can't feel anything, but I can see something. The other day, I watched my dead grandpa of 11 years walk into the room. I ran upstairs so fast once, I was able to move and stayed there until my sister decided to come downstairs for bed. The next day, we started talking about what happened. My sister said that once she got into bed, and underneath the covers, she felt something on top of her, giving her a hug, and hugged her until she fell asleep. My mom then joined in on the conversation, and said that her parents still live in this house. She told us that she actually sat down the other day, and talked with her father, and then her mother joined in, and told her to talk to someone in our church. She did that, and found out that the person she was supposed to talk to was in charge of genealogy, and that they actually knew the same people from San Diego. This kind of spooked me out, because it took my mom a good few months to tell me this. She always tells me something I should know, after I see a spirit. Thanks for reading. Many people see spirits in houses and such, so they conclude that the places are haunted. However, I believe that I am haunted. I've seen spirits my whole life, but some, when I was a child, I can't even remember, so my mother tells me. The one I'm going to talk to you about happened when I was about one years old. I'm now 18. We lived in a town just outside of San Diego, California. The people that lived in the house before us abused their children and locked them in the closets. My mom has found evidence of this but does not know to what extent these children were tortured. My mom has had many experience with the evil spirits that lived in the house. One day, when I was finished playing with my blocks, she went in to clean up after me. She knew exactly how many blocks were there and found that one was missing. She looked all over the room and even felt around on the bed and still couldn't find it. She then left the room to see if I had it with me, which I didn't, so she went back into the room, and there it was, just sitting on the edge of the bed, where she had previously looked and felt. My mom always kept the house spick and span. She hated a messy house. She had just finished cleaning the living room when she left, and came back in 
and found a hairbrush in the middle of the floor. No one had been in the bathroom or the living room since she cleaned them. The spirits knew how to make my mom mad. They would always take things and put them way out of place. So my mom was always running around, putting them back into place, just to find them out of place again. She was always cold in the house, even if she was just sitting by a roaring fire. She would always see little black figures running across the room. And when she would look to see again, they were gone. So finally, my mom took my sisters and me out of the house and swore we would never go back in until my dad said a prayer to get rid of the spirits. So my dad was inside for a little bit, and then he came out and said that he said a prayer. My mom questioned him for a while, and then he had her convinced. So my mom took all of us back in the house. She then turned to my dad, and in a very stern voice said, You didn't pray. My dad, of course, asked her how she knew. She said, I'm sitting in front of a fire and I'm cold. His face just fell. So my mom had us all sit down and have a family prayer together. After that prayer to get rid of the spirits, they've never come back. We then moved out of the house, and I've been able to see spirits all the time. Every house, I've either seen a spirit or felt someone watching me. This is still going on. Just three days ago, I watched my grandfather walk into the room. He has been dead since I was seven years old. If anyone knows what is going on with me, please email me. When I was seven years old, my parents, my sister and I, lived in a home that was a one-story house that sat way back from the street. My aunt used to babysit us when my parents were away at work. Anytime I got into trouble, my aunt would make me go into a little bedroom in the back of our house, and she would make me stay in there for hours at a time. I never knew why, but I was definitely afraid of that room. And the whole time I was in there, I would hide under the blankets, too afraid to move until she came to let me out. One day, while I was playing in the yard, I found out why I was so afraid of that room. While I was playing outside with my toys, I suddenly got the feeling that I was being watched. I looked around me, but I didn't see anybody. I went back to playing, but I just couldn't shake that watch feeling. I turned to look at the house to see if maybe my aunt or sister was around, and I saw a woman in the bathroom window, and she was watching me. I know it wasn't my aunt or sister, because they both have very dark hair, and the woman in that window had very light-colored hair. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid to move. I stayed outside for the rest of the afternoon because I didn't want to go into the house. When my mom came home that day, I finally went inside. I didn't say anything to my mom or anyone about what I had seen. I was worried that they wouldn't believe me. So, I kept quiet. My sister and I shared a bedroom. And that night, I woke up to the sounds of cupboards opening and closing like someone was looking for something. And I heard glasses being moved around and the water being turned off and on. Well, being a little kid, I figured I was just imagining it. And as I laid there listening to this, I looked over at my sister, who was sleeping through this whole thing. The next morning I asked my mom if she was up last night, getting a drink. And she said no. But she looked at me kind of funny. That night, my mom had some friends over. And she sent my sister and I to bed early. My sister felt right to sleep, but I just kept thinking about what I saw in the window and what I heard the night before. My mom and her friends started talking about a lady who had hung herself in the back bedroom of our house. I could not believe what I was hearing. My mom then went on to tell her friends that she hears noises in the kitchen at night. The next day, as I was playing in the yard, I saw the woman in the bathroom window again. I started to cry, and my aunt got mad at me, so she tried to lock me in the back room again. I was kicking and screaming that I didn't want to go in there, but she wouldn't listen to me. As I sat on the bed, under the covers, I heard the door swing open. I thought it was my aunt to let me come out, so I uncovered my head, but nobody was there. I then started to hear a squeaking noise, kind of like something heavy hanging from a wooden bar. It sounded like it was coming from the closet. 
The closet wasn't really big. Walk in one. There was no way I was going to look in there. I just sat on the bed, listening to this noise, until my aunt came to get me. I later found out that the lady hung herself in the closet of that back room. I'm just wondering if anyone knows why she did this, and when it took place. Well, that's my story, and believe me, it is all completely true. Although this is a truer tale, it's not one of your spine tinglers, just something odd that cannot be explained. It was told to me several years ago by a colleague and happened to her mom, Jean, and some friends. Although Jean lived in Romford, Essex, she regularly went to a keep fit class, a small school hall in Upminster. The class had finished and her and her friends had piled into a car and drove around the corner parking near the chip shop, and they all ordered fish and chips, like you do when you've just had a good workout. They were all sitting in the car quietly eating, while one person noticed something odd and nudged the person next to them. Eventually, they were all mesmerized, mouths agape, chips forgotten, as their attention was focused on the activities in the churchyard, over the road. Quite clearly, they could see a solid nighttime funeral possession of a coffin being carried on the shoulders by six pallbearers, all decked out in long, black-tailed coats. They silently watched the procession walk from one side of the church and disappear around to the other side, St. Mary's Lane, for anyone who lives nearby. Of course, they all asked each other, did you see what I saw, knowing full well they did. The next day, Jean decided to visit the church as she just had to know what had happened. Maybe someone was buried late last night. However, she got to the church and found the vicar. She worded the question carefully so as not to look like a complete idiot. It was completely stunned when the vicar told her that no funeral took place last night. She said that from the look on his face, it was fairly obvious that he knew why she was asking. But being a vicar, he simply smiled and walked away. Spooky. I've been past the churchyard as my grandparents used to live just down the road, and it is quite creepy looking place. All the stones are really old and crumbly, and covered in moss. None of the names or dates are readable. It's one of those graveyards where you can look at for a little while, and then you kind of shudder and have to look away. I used to think it was my childish imagination, but even these days, the place still gives me the creeps, even in the middle of summer. Well, like everyone else, I'll start off with some background information. I'm 19 right now, and ever since I was young, have had a fascination with death and what lies beyond. Every time I would read something, I would try to think I had a similar experience, but I didn't. I've lived in Chicago for most of my life in the same house. Nothing really special about it, except our basement floors are basically entirely dirt, but that doesn't really mean anything to my story. When my mom found out she was expecting my third brother, she decided we needed to do a little remodeling and room changing. So I ended up having my brother's old room, which also used to be my brother's room. Nothing unusual happened while I was living there until the end of my senior year in high school. I was asleep one night, and the room got unbelievably cold, although no windows were open, and it was a warm night. I buried myself under my blankets and tried to go back to sleep. This would happen from time to time. Then one night, I was woken up again by the extreme cold when I saw a shadow of a man whose figure I could not make out, just watching me sleep. He stood about a foot away from my bed. When he noticed I was awake, he just turned and walked out of my room, but he went through the wall right next to my door. The first few times I saw him, I was petrified and would just close my eyes tight till I felt the room was warming up. There were also times when I would see him coming from the kitchen, which was outside my room, and walk back into my closet. Also at night, I would hear things fall off my dresser, and I would just call me as I could ask him to pick them up. And when I'd wake, everything would be as I left it. 
I never told any of my friends or family about this because they are not believers. Till one day, my mom had called me at school since I had moved out for college, telling me my sister refuses to go or sleep into my room anymore. That she woke up one night and came screaming into my parents' bedroom about a man who was watching her while she was sleeping in my room. I didn't say anything while my mom told me, but I did interrupt her before she could give me the description of the man my sister gave. I told her what I had seen, and my mom dropped the phone. She kept asking how I knew, so I finally told her I had seen him before. I also told her if the lights ever go out of my room, to calmly ask the man to turn them back off. My mom just laughed at me. Also, I should mention, since I moved out of the house for school, my room remains hot to room temperature while I'm gone. But when I come home on weekends, the temp does not go above 50 degrees, no matter how high we set the heat or how many little heaters we put in there. Then one night, my mom was clearing out some of my sister's clothes, so I would have room for mine when I came home for the summer, and my dad was sitting outside in the kitchen watching TV. It was relatively late at night, and my mom had just finished clearing out a drawer, but was about to get up when the lights went out. My mom said out loud, Look, I'm almost done here and Jennifer will be home next week, so please just put the lights on. And just as she finished, the lights went on, and my mom ran out of my room. Since I've been home for the summer, my room is back and stays at a normal temperature, which I'm thankful for. But I still hear things in my closet, and I'll see a light shine through the closet doors, although I don't have any lights in the closet. Twenty years ago, when we moved into our house, a duplex, we were good friends with a tenant, and she had told us that she was going to be gone for the weekend. So we were home, sleeping on a sofa sleeper in the living room at the time, and we heard noises from the upstairs, sounding if someone was dragging furniture across the floor. My husband went to the stairs and yelled up to see if there was someone there, and the apartment was dark, so he came downstairs and we fell asleep, not thinking any more about it. Well, the next day when she came home, she came downstairs and asked us if there had been a problem upstairs, and we said no. Why? And she said that she was just wondering why we moved all of her dining room chairs into the kitchen. At first I was scared, but then for years nothing had happened, until Jenny was born. One night, my husband had gone hunting, and I was awoken by a noise of her mobile being turned on. I went into her room, and she was just lying there awake, watching the mobile move above her. Then the last time that anything happened was about three years ago. My husband and I had divorced, and I was seeing someone. Well, my friend as I call it, must have not liked him, because he always kept his cologne on the dresser, and at least once or twice a week, I would come home and find it either knocked over, on the floor, or in the garbage. At first we blamed the cat, but then we started closing the bedroom door, and it would still happen. Of course, he never believed. Nobody ever does, but I do. Nevertheless, I'm not with him anymore, and have since been remarried, and have no problems. Sometimes when I'm alone, I do feel that there is someone or something there with me, and my daughter. I'm sure that you receive thousands of these stories, but mine is true. Whether you or anyone else believe mine, I know in my heart that it is true. Back in about 1982, I became resident manager of an old rooming house in Placerville, California, better known as Hangtown. Placerville is just a few miles from Coloma, where the gold rush took place at Sutter's Fort, on the American River. The rooming house, during the gold rush era, was the only hospital in the area. It consisted of 42 rentable rooms and several miscellaneous rooms that were used by residents for laundry, storage, vending machines, a TV room, community kitchen, dining room, and my office. I'd been manager for about six months before the chaos started. I've always been a sensitive, Having had several experiences all through childhood and adulthood, 
One cold winter night, a bad storm had moved in, and the main highway to South Lake Tahoe had to close, trapping several skiers and gamblers halfway up the hills. It didn't take long before the motels and hotels filled up. I got a call from the police department asking me if I could accommodate the stranded travelers. I let them know that I had about 10 or 12 vacancies, but to let them know that our power had failed due to the storm. All streetlights were out, and there was total blackness everywhere. There were several steps leading up to the entry door, and I was afraid that in the darkness, someone might get hurt. All of the tenants helped out. We gathered up the candles and put them out on the steps. We dug up some old coffee percolators and made the coffee the old way and set out to greet our guests. They didn't come in one at a time. They came in at about ten at a time. I paid some volunteer residents to get rooms ready while I checked the people in. There was a group of the younger residents there at the stairs with flashlights ready to take the new guests up to the long flight of stairs to the upper rooms. As the guests would arrive, these men would chant, Welcome to the Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. All went well, and the next morning, everyone thanked and said they had a wonderful stay and really enjoyed the off-the-wall hospitality. Shortly thereafter, we had a tenants meeting. During the meeting, these men were chanting the words to the song Hotel California and called my attention to several verses. During the storm, I had lit the candles to show the guests the way. At one time, the community kitchen had been the manager's resident kitchen, and the day of the hospital had been emergency room. In the master's chambers, they gathered for the feast. Other verses fit also. Every time the song would come on a radio anywhere in the rooming house, the volume would be cranked. Then one night, as I sat up figuring the next day's bank deposit, I heard screaming. It was the young girl down the hall on the first floor, who was living there with her small son. She told me that there was a face of a man on her wall. My husband went and checked it out, and yes, it was there. Later that night, about 2 a.m., she came to my office again and said that she kept hearing a whistle, like a bamboo whistle, and a child's voice calling mommy outside her room. I went down there and heard the same thing. One of the young men who was still up watching TV went outside to check it out. He said the sound was coming from every direction he walked. He would hear it from the south, north, east, and west as he walked. By now, the commotion had woke up just about everyone in the rooming house. The TV room filled up with people telling me of the experience that they had been having but were too afraid to talk about it until this night. About 4 a.m., Everyone went back to bed. I stayed up, along with two of the younger, more brave men. As we sat in the TV room talking, we heard loud stomping, coming from somewhere in the back part of the lower story. At the end of the main entry hall, there was a swinging door that led to the laundry area. Beyond that, the garbage room. Beyond the garbage room, there were other empty rooms that I was told later was the hospital morgue. As we passed the community kitchen and started to approach the swinging door, the footsteps got louder. We all looked through the window at the top of the swinging door and saw no one. Just then, the door swung open and stayed open as though someone were holding it. Needless to say, me and these brave men backed up quickly. No one was standing there at the door, but it remained open for several seconds and then swung shut. It was a quiet, still night, so the theory of a breeze or wind is out. In a few minutes, the footsteps started again, just as loud as the first time. We looked down the hall, and the swinging door was opening and shutting continuously and with a lot of force. We were all speechless. All this time this was happening, we were still hearing the whistle and the child's voice calling mommy. In the nights to follow, there were several incidents, and some residents that have been there for years moved out. Within a matter of a few months, I was gone. I've never gone back there, but I wonder to this day 
if there are still occurrences at that place, every time I hear that song, it brings that place to mind. And when it does, I get a cold chill, and every detail is just as visible in my mind as it was that very night. My best friend Kay just moved out of a house that is most definitely haunted. The house is in Dayton, Idaho, a small town of about 200 people, about 10 miles north of the Utah-Idaho border. It sits on Dayton's main street across from the city park. It's a large old house that has been divided into a two-family dwelling. My friend lived in the front part of the house, while another family lived in the back. Kay told me that she and her three kids never liked the house from the beginning, but she had taken a new job in Preston and needed to find a house to live in. After spending days looking for a place to live, she was told about this house and went out to look at it. She said when she saw the house, it looked dark even though the sun was shining. When she went inside, she said the house was even darker inside, and there was a heavy feeling in the house she just couldn't shake. She really didn't like the house, but it was all that she could find, so she took it. From the beginning, she and the kids disliked living there. Her 14-year-old daughter hated staying by herself in the house and would do anything to avoid being alone. She said that she always felt like someone was watching her. One afternoon, when she was alone, she saw the dark figure of a man looking through the hall window at her. This really scared her. The hall window was high enough off the ground, and you would need a ladder to see in the window. When you pass the hall window, the hall turns and goes past the stairs and ends in the master bedroom. This part of the hall at the house of the stairs is always frigid. My friend had found a new home to rent and was eager to get out of the house. I was helping her pack, and I had mentioned to her how cold that hallway was by the stairs. It was like walking into a freezer. She said that it was always like that. Even in the summer, when it was 90 degrees outside, she said that the hall was freezing cold. I thought at first it was cold, because the storm windows had been left open, so I closed them. Then it dawned on me that it wasn't that cold outside, because we'd been having such a mild winter. It also felt like a cold wind was blowing across the hall, even though there was no drafts anywhere. The cold spot never moved. As soon as you went into the bedroom, or upstairs into the bathroom or kitchen, it was warm. But as soon as you stepped into the hall, you froze. Her eight-year-old twin boys would never go to bed alone. Kay told me that they were scared to sleep without each other being there. Mac told me that he and his brother Jared never went to bed alone. That it was too scary to be up there. Until they moved into this house, they had never been afraid to sleep alone. Kay and her kids finally moved into their new house. The other family that lived in the back moved out two days before Kay did. Renters never stay long in that house. Their new house is bright and cheerful, a stark contrast to the old house. I've experienced a lot of these kind of things all my life. But this was the first time I had never experienced psychic cold or cold spots. I get cold just thinking about it. I read your personal story. It was spooky, but I enjoyed it. Thanks for having the courage to share it. I've also had some paranormal experiences, but considerably mild in comparison to yours. Please allow me to share them with you. The first possible experience occurred when I was very young, under the age of eight years old. I had an imaginary playmate, but my mother thought I was in touch with the entity. The playmate was adult, male, and went by the name Shadow. I don't remember Shadow, but I do remember the last time I talked about Shadow, because my mom asked me why I didn't mention Shadow anymore. Apparently, I would talk about him at great length. I said that Shadow had gone away. My mom asked me when he would come back, but I said I didn't know. When my mom asked where Shadow had gone, again, I said I didn't know. My mom told me she used to hear me talking to Shadow, and then it sounded one half of a telephone conversation. It wasn't like I was making up the other half of the conversation, but merely responding to something that was being said to me. 
Perhaps I was in contact with the entity. However, Shadow never frightened me. He was a comforting presence. Perhaps it was an entity. Although I've wondered if I was in contact with my guardian angel, then again, I've always had a strong imagination. Perhaps it was just an imaginary playmate. The next paranormal experience happened in my brother's home in Moss Beach, California, approximately one-fourth of a mile from the Moss Beach Distillery, a restaurant that has a reputation for being haunted. When this experience happened, I did not know about the hauntings of the restaurant or of the history of the area. My brother's house has a downstairs bedroom. It has long been considered my bedroom because I always slept there and always with the door locked since everyone else slept upstairs. One night, I was awakened out of deep sleep by a man's voice, a voice much deeper than that of my brother's. The voice sounded angry, full of accusation, and said, you don't belong here. I had a brief glimpse of a man in my room. His back was to the window, so he was in silhouette, but very solid looking. What I could see was a very craggy and rough home looking face, and he was wearing a heavy canvas jacket, like the type firemen or fishermen wear. He was pointing down at me in the bed. However, it was just that brief glimpse, and then it was gone. I've wondered if I dreamt it, because I was able to go right back to sleep. However, I doubt I would have dreamt that I didn't belong there, because I had spent so much time in my brother's house that I felt I had as much right to be there as my own brother did. When I told my brother of the incident, he said he had something spooky happen also. One night, about 2 a.m., he was still up reading when he heard someone coming up the stairs. My brother built his house from scratch and was very familiar with the entire house. It wasn't one creak that he heard. He heard every stair being trod upon. Thinking he had a prowler, he got out a gun and went to find out who was in his house. He found nothing, and all the windows and doors were locked tight. He said it was very eerie. Later, we found out that Moss Beach coastline, not too far from Half Moon Bay, was the site of a lot of illegal bootlegging activity during Prohibition. There were accidents, gunfights, and other tragedies that follow illegal activity. Since finding out about the history of the area, we have since wondered what it was that my brother and I encountered. The last paranormal experience that happened occurred within a three-month period after my mother's death. Perhaps I should say experiences, because on three separate occasions, I heard knocking. I was living with my maternal grandmother in the house my mother grew up. Each time I heard the knocking, it was just three, evenly spaced knocks, but they were loud. Third time it happened, I went to answer the front door, convinced that someone was there. My bedroom was in the back of the house, which was some distance from the front door, so the knocks had to be loud for me to have heard them. I'm not positive, but I think it was mom coming back to say hi. There's another possible experience. Both my husband and I felt something pressing down on the bed while we slept. The first time it happened to me, it woke me up. I thought the cat had just jumped on the bed near my feet. When I realized the cat was next to my pillow, it got my attention. But again, I was not afraid. The cat often moves his head and eyes like he is watching something. Something I can't see, and only in the bedroom. And when I'm in the apartment alone, taking a shower, I hear a man's footsteps coming into the bathroom. They always sound the same, and I'm guessing they are a man's footsteps, because the stride is wider than a woman's, and heavier. Like I said, my experiences are very mild in comparison to what you have experienced. I've never felt fear during the experiences, but later... Contemplating the possibilities, I tended to spook myself. Pretty tame stuff, but every now and then, it grabs my attention. I haven't tried to talk to any entity, if indeed there is an entity, because I would rather the experiences remain merely an amusing conversation piece, and not the source of a major investigation. Thanks for letting me share my story. You have a terrific sight. I hope to visit again. Hi, I just wanted to submit my story of some experiences we had in the house my daughter and I lived in 
from August 2001 to February of 2002. This house is located in Pendleton, Oregon. In July 2001, we lived in a small duplex that burned down. So my daughter and I lived in it for a short while. Then the hospital I worked for had a house that no one was living in, so we were able to rent it. This house had a complete upstairs, then another apartment downstairs. When we first moved in, we didn't notice anything at all. Then my dad moved in with us and lived in the downstairs apartment. First thing that happened was in the very early a.m., like 4 a.m., we could hear a baby crying from somewhere in the house, but the exact location could never be found. Then my dad, who was a true skeptic of the supernatural, actually admitted they had seen a young woman in a large brimmed red hat in the downstairs area. Both my daughter and I could hear people walking up and down the concrete steps that led to the downstairs apartment. Shortly before Christmas that year, I was laying in bed, mostly asleep, but aware of the house, and I heard very distinct footsteps coming up the back steps, walk through the kitchen, dining room, living room, and into my bedroom. I even heard the bags rustle at the end of my bed as they walked by. I stand straight up, thinking it was my dad coming upstairs to tell me something, and when I looked, there was no one there. I laid back down and heard the footsteps walk back out of my room, through the other two rooms, and back down the stairs. One of the most interesting things that happened was that my daughter loved to sing, and she was recording herself singing on a very simple old-fashioned tape recorder. She sang three songs. On the first one, everything was fine. Then on the second one, it started out in her voice. Then all of a sudden, it was a man's voice singing the song. Then that song got over. Then it went back into her voice. This was so scary, we couldn't believe it. Then right after the new year, my dad became very ill and was admitted to the hospital for over a month. While he was gone, the haunting became even more noticeable. We would hear very loud noises coming from downstairs, and the TV would turn on and just blare. So, I completely locked up the downstairs so no one could come or go from any of the entrances. One night my daughter and I were watching TV, and all of a sudden, the TV downstairs came on so loud, it was shaking the upstairs. You could hear people walking around in circles in the kitchen, and you could hear voices of two men arguing and talking, coming from the downstairs. We ended up having to move, so I don't know if any haunting continues there or not. The house has since been sold, and new people live there now, and I've always wanted to ask them. Hello, my name is Laura. I've had a lot of experiences in my life. A lot of people say ghosts follow me, and especially my sister-in-law, who has been around me when things seem to happen. I would like to share two incidents in particular that scared my family and also myself. The first story starts when we moved into my grandmother's house. Everybody in my family said it was haunted, but I did not believe it. I visited there and spent the night there a lot, and nothing too strange has happened that could not be explained. It was the second night in the house, and I was giving my daughter a bath. She was taking her bath, and I was sitting on the sink, plucking my eyebrows, when all of a sudden, she turned to me and said, Mommy, there are red eyes in here. I said, What? Where, honey? She turned to show me, and look on her face was that of sheer terror. I would never forget the fear in her face. She let out a piercing scream, and I was afraid. She was acting like someone was coming after her. I ran, grabbed her out of the tub, we slipped to the door, and I dove out of the room. My husband was dead asleep on the couch, but he flew up and went into the bathroom, swinging his arms. He thought someone had broken in or something. She was really freaking out. We were in the living room trying to calm her down. She was hysterical. All she kept saying was, He's gonna get me. Don't let him get me. And we said, Who? And she said, The man with the eyes. We let her know she was okay, and nobody was coming for her. We almost calmed her down, 
And as soon as we said we wouldn't let anyone get her and that she was safe, the garbage flung across the room and it was loud. That was the last incident that night. My cousin was sleeping over one night. She went home crying because I told her about the incident that happened. And she got a little vocal to the ghost. And a screwdriver flew off the fridge and hit her in the stomach. And there were happenings like doors opening, water turning off, scratching at the doors, and on. And toys going off by themselves. Second story. We recently moved from Fort Lauderdale to St. Augustine. We actually moved to Lake Butler. We lived out in the middle of nowhere. One day, I was up watching TV. I had nothing to drink, and I do not do anything else. Anyway, I was watching TV and got distracted by something out the window. It looked like a green glowing circle. It was about the size of a golf ball, and the light was gleaming off of this thing. I was wondering to myself what in the world. All of a sudden, came another one, and then another. In like two seconds, there seemed to be at least ten, and it looked like they were trying to come through the window. I got scared and turned my head, thinking it would go away. As I turned my head, I looked at the door window, and a flash of heat lightning, or some kind of flash lit up the window, and it looked like a man, almost transparent, but not quite. He seemed dark. I don't know. Anyway, it is hard to explain, but it got me so bad, my body hurts. I ran to the window, closed the blinds, and ran to bed and forced myself to sleep. Things still happen a lot. My family and I just choose to ignore it. I hope you all don't think I am crazy. Thank you for listening. Yorktown, Colonial Parkway, Yorktown, Virginia, 1970. It's been years. I don't believe in an afterlife. But the shared experiences of a detailed calm hysteria leaves us talking even today. The three people today continue to describe the uniforms, the hollow sunken faces, the slumped shoulders, and the look of complete and total submission in an eternity of dread that wrapped around each soldier. We were lost on the parkway in that very small town around the battlefield. I hadn't had my driver's license that long which created anxiety. The two people with me were concerned about the lack of turning room on the second well-maintained road, and the fog kept getting heavier and heavier. The headlights picked up soldier after soldier, walking towards us on either side of the road, not even looking at us, but straight ahead with such exhaustion. I mentioned their gray uniform. The uniforms were not well kept, and that struck me as being unusual. I'd been around the military all my life. These were not current issued uniforms. It never occurred to us that these men fit the description of ghosts, except for their facial expressions. We all agreed that when I got the car turned around without getting stuck somehow, maybe we should give these guys a lift. I found that place to turn around, and the headlights abruptly focused on a man dressed in a gray uniform with a yellow sash. And why I think this must be a shared hysteria, a tri-corner hat. We all remarked that the uniform must have been a strange mixture of colonial and civil war staging. But the night was so cold, and why would so many men go to so much trouble for a part of the parkway that wasn't even being traveled that night. The three of us tried to figure out who started the conversation of ghosts. We didn't discuss ghosts, because at that time, we didn't believe in them. But somehow, we were able to share a feeling that we, or one of us, transferred into a very large, very real, shared mirage of dynamic proportion. And that's what haunts us today. What is in the human mind that could project such images to other people? How could we have seen, simultaneously, in such detail, these soldiers who looked so dead? Maybe that was the key word for our hysteria. We tested each other. What did the soldier in the turnaround look like? I knew. 
I only had to hear it from the other two. And so, if this was a prank, congratulations guys. You've held our interest for years. But was it really worth the expense of makeup for one last car in an empty, two-lane foggy parkway? My husband has been cleaning this church for three years, and he, as well as the rest of our family, has experienced some very strange things. So as at least one other member of the church. First, it was just a feeling of a presence that you just couldn't shake, a glimpse of a shadow from the corner of your eye, and the occasional sound that could not be explained. My husband worked his regular job from 4 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. and would go to the church after leaving his job, and that was when he would experience most of the things. Then, it didn't seem to matter what time of day it was, and it even started happening when the kids would be there helping. Our two boys are now 9 and 12, and we never said anything to them for fear of scaring them. They were in the upstairs room where my husband was cleaning, and suddenly, the piano started playing one note over and over for a minute or so, and then it stopped. The boys were very frightened, but also very intrigued by the whole thing. I've been a victim of Henry, as we affectionately call him now. I've heard many things, little bumps and unexplainable noises. Our 19-year-old son took over the cleaning job for about six months this past summer. And he's also heard many things. Things like footsteps in front of him, doors on other floors slamming, and other little things like that. He also went to clean in the middle of the night, mainly because it is easier to do when no one is there to get in the way, or so he thought. When my husband took the job back over, it wasn't very long before he would start experiencing Henry again. Oh. Did I mention that he would always seem to find dimes lying in the oddest places? Sometimes, as many as two dollars worth in a few hours of cleaning. Never finding them in places where people would frequent in the building. We never felt we needed to fear Henry, since his presence never seemed to be a threatening experience. But there was a woman who has been a longtime member of the church. She was there one day by herself doing the books when she had heard moaning to the point of causing her to call the police because she really felt that someone was there. My husband had arrived while the police were in the building. They had asked the woman to wait outside in case they found someone, but needless to say that no one was there to be found. They kind of humored the woman, but my husband told her of his experiences and she said that this wasn't the first time that things have happened to her there either. The most disturbing thing was when he was in the boiler room, cleaning some mops before he left, and me and my two sons were outside warming the car, and suddenly, he came running to the car with a horrified look on his face, and shaking tremendously. I could tell something was terribly wrong, but he didn't want to frighten the boys, so he waited to tell me after we were able to be alone. He had revealed to me that he actually saw two men walking down the stairs in the back of the boiler room, talking to each other, as if he wasn't there at all. They were dressed in the style of the 20s, and seemed to be almost floating down the steps. There isn't any way to enter the room from that door, since it is locked, very securely. We have had many of the people we have told these things to, try to explain them away, but there is no human explanation for these things. There's been times when we went there and left only after a few minutes because there is a sense of something just not being right. I come from a family that my mother and sister always had experiences. I also had times where I know the other side is present in my life. My four-year-old nephew had come with us one day and the children were all playing in the preschool room for about an hour. The next time we took our nephew, which was only the second time he'd ever been there with us. They were in the gym playing. He came out in the hall and asked me where the big fella was at. I was shocked that he would say that, since the only people there 
on both trips he made with us, was us. I didn't want to frighten him, so I just asked about the big fella, and to which he responded, you know, the big fella that was here the last time we were playing. Well, I feel that this is really all that needs to be said to explain, just who or what is there in this church. A child that doesn't know what we have all experience can hardly imagine the same thing if it isn't so. Right before the Christmas of 1999, I had what I can only call a weird experience. I'm a firm believer in ghosts and the supernatural, and have been told that I'm psychic, as well as experience unusual things. However, I'd never seen anything until that night. For whatever reason, I woke up around 3 a.m. to see a man in my bedroom doorway. I live alone and my two cats were asleep on my bed. My first thought was an intruder, and I remember quickly screaming and reaching with one hand for my phone, and the other for the reading lamp on my bed's headboard. The man was rather large, and was wearing jeans and a green plaid shirt. Just as quickly as I saw him, he turned around and silently walked out of my room. After a minute, I got out of my bed with my phone and walked around my apartment. No one was there and there were no unlocked doors or windows. What is so unusual is, if it was a true stranger, my cats would have darted under my bed because they are not used to strange men. Maybe it was a dream, but I doubt it. This was too real and scary. I live in Williamsport, Pennsylvania about an hour and a half north of Harrisburg. This story happened to Nancy, a co-worker of mine. She was seeing a guy named Dave, who had heard stories about an old abandoned house north of the city where strange things were said to have occurred. It was set back at the end of a dirt road, quite a distance from the highway, next to an old railroad track. This old brick house was supposed to have been used as a temporary hospital, for Civil War soldiers. I don't know whether these soldiers were Confederate prisoners or wounded Union soldiers on their way north. Word of mouth had it that a group of people went inside to look around. When someone commented on the view from the bathroom, his companion led him back to the room and showed him the same window, which was, in fact, bricked over. Dave convinced Nancy that they should check it out. They drove out to the road, over the railroad tracks, and parked in front of the old house. It looked so foreboding that Nancy, who was driving, decided she didn't want to go inside, so she turned around to head back. They didn't get far, because the car stalled on the railroad tracks. Surprised and half-jokingly, Dave asked Nancy what she was doing. Nothing, she said, as she frantically tried to restart the engine. I'm not doing anything. Nancy turned the key over and over, but the engine wouldn't catch. Suddenly, they were surrounded by a fog so deep they couldn't see in front or in back of them. Nancy panicked and scrambled for the door handle, but Dave restrained her, saying, You're not going anywhere. Then, they heard the train whistle. Nancy and Dave looked to the right and saw the glare of the single headlight coming directly towards them. Nancy put her head forward, closed her eyes, and gripped the steering wheel as tight as she could. She screamed and braced herself for the collision, but all she felt was a swoosh, like something going right through her. She described it as an energy force passing right through her body. Immediately afterward, the fog blew away, as if by magic. Nancy grabbed the keys in the ignition, turned it, and the engine started up with no problem. Nancy jammed her foot down on the accelerator, and the tires squealed as she drove away as fast as she could. That was the presence of a ghost train.
I'd been tormented, scared out of my mind, and had jokes played on me for years on end by what I and my friends and family believe to be some kind of entity or spirit. I don't wish to become anyone's school paper or test subject. I would just like some advice to maybe deal with the problem. It all started when I was 9 years old and my father sent me to bed. I was never really scared of the dark, so my father would allow me to tuck myself in at night. But this night, it was going to be different. My mom was on the top floor of a three-story house, and I never made it to the third story. I thought I saw something move in the darkness of the third floor, and then I heard very clearly someone say my name. There was one particular moment on the stairs in the house where I would see the apparition of a fog just gliding through the stairs, up and down. And another time, I could have sworn I heard the voice of a little boy saying, come over here. I also got really bad sleep paralysis, and that same boy that I thought I heard would appear over my bed and choking me. I would resist. I would try to scream as loud as I could, but to no avail, nobody could hear me, and the boy was just choking me. He had the look of evil in his eyes, and actually, his face was half disfigured. It really looked like his face was melted off entirely, and then I would awake, and I'd be lying in my bed, in my room in the dark. For the nights after that, I would constantly hear the boy whisper in my ear, over and over again. I was consciously awake. I could hear things. The voice was incessant, and it wouldn't stop at all. I couldn't stop hearing the voice of the little boy, and it just kept tormenting me. Every time I'd sleep in another room, I would never hear these voices or see anything. But the moment I stayed in that room, something was just off. There was another experience I had in that room. But I'm honestly not sure if it was sleep paralysis or just another experience. For whatever reason, I had the door open to my room. And this girl, this lady actually, just flew into my room. She had a dress on and she was hovering above me. I say lady, and she had a white dress on. But in actuality, her face was completely blackened out. So I couldn't tell if she was actually a lady or not but she had long hair and had feminine features. As the events started happening more frequently, my father had to carry me kicking and screaming to bed. This started happening at least twice a week. I became so afraid of the dark. And one time, when me and my father were walking down a dark hallway, something brushed against me. It scared me so bad that my dad found me curled into a ball on the floor. Then, things started happening around the house, like vases being broken or stains on the floor that no one ever saw. They always blamed me for everything, so naturally, everything was just put on me. I spent most of my childhood in trouble for things I never did, and the more trouble I was in, the more things would happen. Cupboards being slammed, doors being shut, the usual poltergeist activity. But it was all blamed on me. I was convinced the house was haunted and that whatever was haunting the house didn't like me at all. Finally, I convinced my father to allow me to move in with my mother in the next town. For two weeks nothing happened and I thought I had escaped it. But one night, my cousin spent the night and it all started again. We were watching television and suddenly the power went out. It was storming really hard outside, and it sounded like someone hit something really hard against the front door. My cousin screamed. The lights and electricity flickered. She thought she saw someone staring at us through the living room window. She described the presence as the hat man, dark silhouette, only an outline. And when I went to see what she was screaming at, it was gone. 
Whatever this thing is, the boy, the woman in the white dress, and that hat man, it's all following me, even into college, and it terrifies the hell out of me. I just want this thing away from me, whatever it is. I'm not making this thing up. I don't even know why I would make my life more difficult than it needs to be, but I really want a resolution. Thanks for listening, and I hope I didn't frighten you too much. I've been reading the stories passed on by others, and thought I would share something that happened to me. But before I do, let me tell you a story my great-grandmother told me. My mother's mom died when she was five years old, so my great-grandmother raised her and her brothers and sisters. One day, as she was sewing in her bedroom, she said she felt someone come into the room. She looked up and saw her daughter, my mom's mother, standing at the doorway staring at her. Before my great-grandmother could do anything, the ghostly visitor said, where is the baby? Shaken and thinking she was seeing things, she thought she would go wash some dishes and get her mind of what just happened. She had been washing dishes for about five minutes when she felt someone enter the room. She turned to see her daughter back again. As soon as their eyes met, her daughter once again said, where is the baby? Thinking something went wrong and scared to death, my great grandmother went to the backyard to check on the baby. When she got there, she found the yard empty and the gate opened. She went looking for my mother and saw her walking towards the busy street near their house. She was able to catch her just before she walked out into the street. Years later, I was home visiting my mother. As I walked past the front room towards the kitchen to see my mother, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a woman sitting in the front room. She had shoulder length colored hair and was wearing a black dress. I thought it was my sister-in-law, so I went on into the kitchen. I talked to my mother for a few minutes, then asked why Tony was sitting in the front room, all by herself. My mother looked at me funny, and told me that Tony was at work. I told her she was nuts, and went to the front room to get her. When I got there, I found no one. Thinking she may have went upstairs, I searched for her and found nobody. I told mom that I really did see someone sitting in there. She asked what she looked like. I told her and she said, oh, that was my mother. Before she died, she told me she would always be near me. I don't know if I saw her mother or not, but I do know I saw someone and then they were gone. I really did see them. I know I did. Mom has since told the other stories of when Mother was around, but I'll have to pass those along another time. This story is as true as anything that I know of, and happened very recently. Tonight, to get technical, to give you a bit of background about my house, there's a hill to the right side of my house, which tends to give my friends a bit of a fright. I, on the other hand, have never been afraid of it. In fact, it has always intrigued me. My friend Emily and I had been sitting in the house and had gotten bored. I told her how my other friends had gotten scared of the hill and we decided to go up and just goof off. At first, we were joking around and laughing. As we got closer to the top of the hill, we quieted down for some unknown reason. We were looking into the woods, which rests at the top of the hill, and I saw a white figure. At first I thought it was just light through the trees, then I realized that no light could go through them and that no light was that bright outside. I was wondering if it was my imagination, but I looked to my friend and saw the look on her face. She had seen it too. When we blinked, it seemed to fade. And if we talked about it, it seemed to make itself more known. I think its energy source was running low. 
It didn't seem to take the image of a person, but it did seem to bend over and shrink just to get bigger again. We weren't sure if we were just seeing things, so we went up three or four more times to verify what we saw and that we did see something. Each and every time, it was still there and it was white and glowing as ever. For this story, I must give you a bit of background also. My boyfriend had been telling me of an experience he had. He was walking through a graveyard and he felt a presence and an evil one at that. He didn't tell me much of what happened that night and I never really wanted to know. But one night, we were on the phone and he told me that I was there with him. And I asked him, what? He said the ghost from the graveyard. He started to ignore it and it took his breath away, literally. I could hear him gasping for air. Later on, he told me that it made his heart stop for a second. He swears that this is true. Finally, he decided to go back to the graveyard. I was still talking on the phone with him, trying to get him not to go. My friend Heather was here, and she wanted to use the phone to speak to him. We had pleaded to him, that there was a dark energy there and to not go alone and that whatever else was at the graveyard would follow him back home again. He wouldn't listen. He screamed at us through the phone, which was something that was very unusual for him to do. He was always quiet and calm, but on the phone, he was loud and angry. So, we ended up chasing after him to the cemetery. When we got to the cemetery, we didn't notice anyone there. We called him on the phone again. This time, no answer. Heather and I were terrified of what was going on. So we went back home and we noticed that he was at the house, going up towards the hill. We screamed, Josh, this isn't funny, and saw him go up to the top of the hill. When we finally caught up to him, he got on his knees and looked as though he was praying to something. What he was praying to, I have no idea, but he was praying. The moon was huge that night, and it was like he was in a trance. We couldn't get his attention, and then he passed out. I then shook him hard, and he finally woke up and was in tears. I asked him why he was doing this, and he said he didn't know. I truly believe that he was possessed. And whatever followed him the first time into the cemetery got inside of him. My favorite cousin was raised in a typical San Francisco townhouse. Typical in every way, except the haunting, I suppose. The ghostly occurrences happened to just about every member of the family that stayed there. So I'll give you some individual accounts. It began with the usual sighting, a shadow seen on several occasions standing at the foot of the bed, yet it intensified with time. Eventually, the shadow manifested into a stronger image. How? Why did it gain power, or did they become more open to that other plane of existence? My uncle was finally awakened, not just from the usual discomfort that accompanied the presence but because he was being shaken violently by his legs from what appeared to be a heavyset sailor who seemed not simply angry, but malevolent. Well, as if that incident hadn't already scared the heck out of Uncle Rami, the presence began manifesting in other intimidating ways. He would often come home from work earlier than everyone else, only to often see the same man glaring at him from the living room window. He must have been successful at ignoring the presence initially, for it resorted to another tactic which finally worked. Uncle Rami let himself in from work this last afternoon and headed back to shower and relaxed from his day. Once in the bathroom with a door closed behind him, a series of horrendous pounding began on the walls of the hallway, accompanied by the sound of angry stomping down the hall and towards the bathroom. 
His first instinct was to get out quick, only to find that the door would not open and seemed to be held tightly shut from outside. After about 15 minutes of the poundings and stompings, the house went quiet and Rami took the opportunity to flee from the house. He sat in the driveway in his car for two hours until the rest of the family came home. Rama was only five when the family lived there, and this was the only time in his life that he had the problems that were so frequent in this house. He became a chronic sleepwalker and talker, so much so that you couldn't tell he was sleeping. Oftentimes, he was found in the living room talking to someone or just whimpering with the front door open. He never remembered what he was dreaming, and of course, was always disconcerted when awakened and finding himself not in his own room. The scariest occurrence of this type took place in the middle of the afternoon. My aunt, my cousin Rochelle and myself were in the kitchen making sandwiches. Rama was out playing in the living room. We were panicked by the sudden sound of his boyish voice hitting the high pitch that hysteria causes as he screamed, he's in there, he's in there, the bad man is in there. My aunt dashed in to grab her son, despite the fact that obviously someone had broken in, only to find Rommel sitting straight up on the sofa in the otherwise empty with front door locked room. She tried to shake him out of his hysterics, for he seemed wide awake, but it literally took a slap to the face to snap him out of it. No, she's not an abusive parent. Of course, she was calm upon awakening with no recollection of the dream or remembrance of the hysterics. My cousin had a small dog during the time they lived in the townhouse, who of course was always barking at nothing. The walls, the hallway, the bedroom door. No wonder, considering what manifested to the people of the house. It died under highly unusual circumstances. The family had all gone out for the evening, and upon returning home, were surprised to not hear their pet yipping at their arrival. The doors and windows were all locked, nothing was out of place, except that the dog was gone. They searched all the rooms, under beds, anywhere he might be within the house. Finally, my uncle chose to open the door to the basement to check it out too, only to find that the dog had somehow managed to open the basement door, put its leash on its collar, and wrap the leash around the banister in order to hang itself from the stairway. Obviously, the dog could not do any of these things, yet the house was entirely secured. I just figured. It's lucky that the presence is so bent on scaring my relatives. To begin with, I live in Los Angeles, California, in the valley. My house is a very unsettling place. Ever since I can remember, there have been unusual going-ons and oddities. The history of the house is this. The house was built in the late 50s in the Hollywood Hills, somewhere or other. I'm not quite sure, but it was eventually moved for some reason to the valley in the early 60s, at which point my grandfather bought the house at an amazingly reasonable price for such a then luxurious and beautiful house. My family moved in and they've lived there since. Now begins the second part of my story. When my grandfather was nearing the end of his life, he began to see things namely my grandmother, whom he had divorced decades earlier and who had died about three years earlier, and a small girl who he would become agitated at the sight of and wave away, saying things like, get away, you're gone, and the like. It was very unsettling, as I said. He, however, was not alone in his unusual experience in the house, as well as my aunt and father, who've also experienced oddities here as well. And nearly all of my friends who have stayed the night, and most significantly, me, 
My aunt has heard voices here when she was younger and has seen a man out of the corner of her eye, standing at the corner of her bed, watching her. She also said that this caused her to have difficulty in breathing on occasion. My father is another story altogether, but I'm unsure as to his reliability as he is quite frankly bipolar and schizophrenic. But several years ago, after my grandmother died in 64, he went quite insane and said that a thing in his room told him to hurt himself. I would otherwise discount this as part of his psychosis or mania, but after that happened, I came into the possession of the house as part of my inheritance from my grandfather, and when I first moved in, as there was hardly any furniture and I was staying there, I had to stay at his old room at the end of the hallway. There are no windows, and the only illumination is from a wall towards here, precisely in the middle of the hall, which will play in later oddities. When I lay down in there with my dog to rest a little bit on the mattress, which had previously been his, I felt decidedly unpleasant, as if I were being watched, but was suddenly so tired that I immediately fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, and my dog was huddled in the corner, whimpering and watching the ceiling in the diagonally opposite corner of the room, and seemed very frightened. The unpleasant feeling of being watched had greatly increased, and I left the room as hastily as I possibly could. When I had first moved in, about a week after the oddness with my dog, and before I could move over my bed from my previous residence, I'd moved over my father's bed from his old corner room and begun to sleep upon it. Things were fine for about a month or so, until one night, I awoke to see the silhouette of a tallish man standing in the doorway to my bathroom. There was a bathroom attached to my bedroom and a door leading out from the bathroom into the entrance hall by the front door. The man was standing with his arms slightly bowed and head lowered with shoulders tense, and seemed angry for some reason, very angry. The man pointed at me, and I blinked, and he disappeared. What was even more disturbing about it was that the man appeared to be composed entirely of shadow, as if the brightest light possible were shining behind it, while the lighting behind it was just as it always is, as at that time, I usually left the entrance hall light on for anyone coming home late, and the light in my bathroom was on, which was directly flush with the man. Even more disturbing was that after I blinked, the man was gone, and when I looked to investigate, the door was once more closed, but the door was unlocked, which it never was, and the light in the bathroom was still on, which it also never was. I made a thorough search for my room, and it was completely sealed, and there was no possible way for what happened to have happened. About a day or two later, and this is the weirdest, most terrifying part, and the most horrific, I was laying in bed. The one my father had shot himself on after my grandmother had died, although he did not die of it. Hands began to form out of the mattress and massage my body. At first I thought it was a dream, as it was so absurd, but did not feel bad, and was actually soothing, until the hands began to gouge and claw at me, trying to pull me into the bed, at which point I began to shriek, and jumped out and off of the bed, and watched as the hands very sinuously melted, almost back into the mattress. My body hurt very much, and I went to observe myself in the full length mirror which my grandfather had hung upon the door between my room and my bathroom, which had been his. He was a short man though, so I don't believe the shadow man had anything to do with it. And I noticed that my entire body, from ankles to just below my neck, was covered in glass, as if I'd been scratched all over as well, and many were bleeding, although not profusely. I ran out of the room and did not sleep the rest of the evening, and in the morning, removed both bed and frame, and put them in the trash and on the curb. 
After this, I began to have nightmares in which a massive presence chased me through the rooms of places in which I'd previously lived, or I would be in a normalish dream. I'm presuming that they were normal because I had never had a real dream, only nightmares, and that I would sense something approaching even through the walls of the buildings and the dreams, and then it would appear and rush at me, and attack by grabbing me by the neck and throttling me, and though it did not speak or even make sound or have form, I could see it as if it did, and it had the form of a large human-like thing. It could taunt me as if I could hear its thoughts. It strangled me and lifted my feet off of the ground and prevented me from calling out or even making sound. And I would struggle until I finally awoke. Many of the times I would awaken to find large handprints upon my neck, larger even than my hands. The worst of the strangulation dreams was one set in my back hallway. In the dream, I was walking about the house and heard something frying in the kitchen like eggs. And when I went in there, eggs were on the stove. And I felt such an inexplicable horror. After I went into the kitchen, I heard my dog whimpering in distress and ran to the sound and found her in the back hallway. And she was being held up by the throat and throttled as I had been before. I ran over shouting at the shadow thing and threw myself at it to force it to release my dog. And she was thrown back against the corner of the side hall, which leads to the other bathroom of the master bedroom and laid unconscious, at which it began to throttle me until I managed to shout out God and was dropped and awoke immediately to find my neck was severely sore and with bruising all over it. When I went to check on my dog, she was whimpering and my mother could not figure out why she had suddenly began to whimper in the middle of the night. Thank you for listening to my story. I know it was kind of wild. But there are definitely shadow presences in this home, and they are really torturous. I hope nobody ever gets to experience what I experience. But hey, it makes for a great story. Being a kid from a large single parent family, we moved around a lot. One of these homes was on 1864 Robinson. We were poor. My mom tried hard to give us the things we needed, but she had no help. My two younger brothers and I used to share a room and a bed together. We used to sleep upstairs in a large room, just opposite the bathroom on the south side of the house. It had a large window, with no curtains or coverings, so the streetlights used to shine through at night. At the end of the room was a closet that had no door. We rarely used it. One night, I was awakened by a large blue light coming from outside the room. I thought it was from the bathroom, but it was an intense blue and seemed to grow brighter and brighter. The door to our room was partly open and all of a sudden, a young boy was standing in the doorway. He stood there, looking at me. I was frozen with fear. I tried to yell, but nothing came out. He was bathed in a blue light that, to this day, I have yet to experience again. He floated above the floor. He moved slowly towards me, gliding on air. He then floated along the wall, away from us to the closet. He stopped, turned and floated in, the light disappearing. I couldn't move. I tried and tried. Finally, I slid off the bed and crawled to the stairs. I tried to walk down, but my legs gave way and I fell. My mom awoke and rushed to see what happened. She held me as I told her. She put me in her room and went and got my brothers. No one ever went in that room again. I used to go by there from time to time, 
until one day I went and there now was a new home built there. Makes me wonder if anything strange ever happens to them. I have three stories to share. The first is an experience I had 20 years ago. My aunt, who lived with us, passed away. When she was alive, she would go out and get a snack around the same time every night. After her funeral, every night at about the same time, the refrigerator door would open and close. This went on for a couple of weeks then stopped. Every so often I still get a whiff of her perfume, as if she just walked past me. The second was experienced by both me and my daughter. She was very close to her grandfather her entire life. He passed away in 2000, shortly before the birth of her first child. Shortly after his passing, my daughter said in the middle of the night, she would feel someone sit on the corner of her bed. When she would turn to look, no one was there. This was something her grandfather had done when she was little. After the baby was born, my daughter started noticing other strange things. The baby would turn her head, as if watching someone walking across the room, but no one was there. One night, she was holding the baby and the baby was staring at what, to my daughter, was a blank wall and laughing. My daughter looked at the baby and there was a reflection of the figure of a man as if he were standing exactly where the baby was looking. Several times when I was babysitting at my daughter's house, the baby's musical toys would turn on by themselves with no one close to them and the baby would stare at that wall and laugh, as if someone was standing there. My daughter doesn't live in the house any longer, and the strange things seem to have stopped. The third is the strangest of all. My son and some of his friends went to an abandoned house that is supposedly haunted. The story is that a man killed his entire family in the house and then himself. There are bullet holes in the walls and the upstairs to support the story. Finding nothing of interest upstairs or on the main floor, they decided to investigate the basement. They found a partial wall at the end of the basement. They noticed a terrible odor coming from that area of the room. They looked over the top of the wall and found nothing but some old boots and a shovel. When they went back to go upstairs to the main floor, there was wet blood on the stairs. It had not been there on the way down. They nosed around on the main floor again and found some money tucked in a broken TV set. There was blood on the money too, but it was dried. Each person took a bill home with them. They all started to have extremely bad luck, car accidents and such. They thought it might be connected to the money, so they took it back and placed it where they found it. The bad luck went away. They checked the basement again, but nothing was there. Others say you can drive past the house and see lights on in the windows even though there are no working lights and there is no power to the house. Some say they've seen the figure of a child or a lady in one of the bedroom windows. My son and his friends have not been back since and my son refuses to even drive past the house anymore. Growing up as a minister's daughter, I was very skeptical about ghosts all my life. 
Then I went to a small private college in Tennessee. My first year was pretty uneventful, but the second year I moved into a new dorm. My room was a suite of two rooms with a bathroom in between, and my former roommate lived in the other room. The first year in the suite there, there was only one occurrence of what I now think was a supernatural event. Normally, the doors between the two suites were kept shut. But one weekend, the girls on the other side of the suite asked my roommate and I to feed their hermit crabs while they went home. They had been gone for a day when my roommate and I came by to our dorm from lunch to find every single electrical appliance running, including the microwave, radio, and hair dryers. We had left the door to the adjoining suite open, but as we assumed it was just some silly call to prove it was there, it did. We had all been in the bedroom, and after our conference, we all went into the living area together. A huge stuffed bear that had been on its usual place on the floor when I had left the room earlier was now sprawled across the couch. Of course, we were pretty scared then. The pranks became worse. Wet towels no one had used would be on the bathroom floor. Breezes coming from nowhere would move the dust ruffles on the bed. Things would be taken out of drawers and left on the floor. On homecoming weekend, I was the only one who had stayed in town. I was in the suite alone, taking a shower, when I heard someone unlock and open the door to the living area and walk in. I heard high heel shoes walk across the floor, through the bathroom, and through the other room and walk out the bedroom door. I thought at first that it was one of my roommates who decided to come home to homecoming after all, and I called out, hello? But no one answered. The only other experience I have had is at the house in Vermont where Joe Walsh used to live. My husband's uncle is the caretaker there, and shortly after I met my husband, he took me up there to look at the house. I had not been told of any ghost stories connected to the house at this point. As we walked around the house, I became increasingly agitated. By the time we were upstairs, I was having trouble breathing. As we started toward the ballroom, I knew I had to get out fast. I was terrified and sensed just an overpowering feeling of evil there. I raced out and I refused to even look at the house anymore. Later that day, my husband's uncle told me about all the different stories and encounters people had reported about the house. A man had hung himself in the very room that I had trouble breathing in, and at night, the uncle heard sound of people and objects moving frequently. I am now a true believer in ghosts, but I am also terrified of them. And I hope these are all the experiences that I will ever have. My name is Kirk. I'm about to turn 18, and I live in New York State. I apologize in advance for the length of my story, but I never get to talk to anyone about these things that happen. I'm looking for answers as to whether or not the house I live in is haunted. I don't talk to my friends about them because I always get the weirdest reactions when I mention them. You know, the kind of look someone makes when they think you're insane. Since I was a little kid, I'd always found the paranormal music. My mom believes in ghosts based on her own experiences, which I might say are quite frightening. I have two older sisters, and both have related their own personal experiences to me. So, in a way, I suppose that was influenced into finding the supernatural interesting. I live in a two-family house that my family owns. We used to rent the bottom apartment out to people back in the late 80s to early 90s. The tenants have said that the downstairs apartment is haunted 
and a psychic my mom brought over one time said that the apartment was indeed haunted. In one of the rooms downstairs, my great-grandfather passed away. The house has been in our family for a while. Also, my mom's nephew who came over from Ecuador was living with us when I was about seven or eight. Hard to remember. He died while living here in a car accident in Lake George. Is it possible he has unfinished business because his wife and daughter live in another country? Also, my mom's boyfriend of a long time ago. This is back in Ecuador, which was probably in the 60s, died on a hiking trip. My mom loved him and always insists that he watches over her. That's just some background information because they could all be possible haunts. The experiences I'm remembering are all recent ones. We moved from our old house in the early 90s and moved to Salem, Massachusetts. After three years, we moved back to our house in New York, and after that time, it's the only experiences I remember. My older sister slept in our redone attic when they were teenagers. I was envious because they were on a whole different floor of the house. I used to think the attic was cool. Both my sisters have had stories about the attic. My sisters moved out long ago, which gave me the advantage of choosing a room up in the attic, being older and all. I chose the room which was my oldest sister's because of its size and location in the house. It was the last room and had stairs in the room going down and leading into the second floor apartment. The first night I slept up there, a good friend of 10 years stayed the night with me. He's the only one I talked to about my experiences with. It was about 2 a.m. and we were lying awake, starting to doze off. He had his disc man with him while playing a CD with the headphones off of his head so we could both hear the music. I was lying there. When all of a sudden, I heard the distinct and startling noise of a marble rolling down the stairs that was in my room. It finally hit the bottom of the stairs, and I asked my friend if it was him that did that. I remember thinking, great, the first dang night I'm in here, and something weird has to happen. I definitely would have seen if my friend had thrown the marble down the stairs, but he didn't. By the way, this actually happened one more time before, not happening since. That story can probably be explained easily, but there are other weird ones. In the same room I was sleeping one night, I'm 95% sure I would have closed my closet all the way before I went to bed because a thing like that would bother the hell out of me and I wouldn't be able to sleep. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night to a very strange noise. It was a quick and harsh boom mixed with a whoosh sound. I looked around my room to find the source and my eyes focused on my closet door. The door was open. I sort of stood up and chuckled because it was three in the morning. I closed the door and went back to sleep. I later analyzed the sound because I remembered when I woke up. What it sounded like was the closet door being pushed hard from the inside and rubbing on the carpet as it opened, which would account for the whoosh. I was never scared, just sort of curious as to whether or not it was insane. The next experience was definitely an odd one. It was the morning. Morning is like 12 noon to me, especially in the summer. And I'd woken up and was getting ready to take a shower. I made my way downstairs and was heading to my mom's room to get a towel. No one else was in the house at this time. My mom was working and so was her boyfriend. As I was passing through our dining room, I felt something cold hit my right earlobe. Within a couple seconds, my fingers were up to my ear to pinch whatever was on my ear because I thought it was a bug. I took my fingers away and realized that what hit my ear was a drop of some liquid. It didn't feel like water. It almost felt like oil. 
It had a strange smell to it, almost like a perfume oil smell. Very confused, I rubbed it in my fingers and looked around the ceiling for the source. But if you think about it, an earlobe was an awkward place for something like that to land on. If it was coming from above, it would have hit the top of my ear, right? But that's not the end. I shrugged it off, got my towel, and went into the bathroom. I took my shirt off and splopped. I felt a drop hit my chest. Now this was weird because I was totally in a different part of my house. And again, the chest is an odd place if the drop is falling from above. Before touching the spot I looked at it, it definitely splattered with some force because it was spread out a little. I touched it and smelled it, and it was the same dang substance. Why is this relevant? One night, I awoke to hear a very disturbing noise coming from the bathroom. Nobody was up at the time, and I heard a very distinct gurgling noise. I walked towards the bathroom to see what it was. When the lights turned on by themselves, and the shower curtain was moving, remember, nobody was up, the lights were off, and they somehow managed to turn themselves on. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to inch closer to the shower curtain. I had to know if something was behind it. I moved the curtain, and to my relief, there was nobody there. But then the lights turn off once again. I start to get really freaked out and rush to turn on the light. I look across the hallway and I see what looks like an elderly man in a wheelchair with an oxygen mask on his face. He looked about as real as any living person would. Now, it wasn't like I saw this figure for a long time. I wasn't on meds and I'm a sober person. I wouldn't even say I was tired. The encounter lasted about 10 to 15 seconds. It was fast, but it was long enough that I could see this man. I honestly felt like the liquid that I felt came from this gurgly elderly man. I found that very interesting. And later, I told my mom about it. She thought I was joking and laughed it off. Then grew very concerned after I insisted that this was something I saw. She thought I was having hallucinations and wanted to take me to the doctor, but I urged her that I was of sound mind. Although she did later tell me that something similar happened to her, where she could have sworn she felt the presence of an elderly man, but she never saw anything. Lastly, there was an unexplained experience that happened in my room. One of my cats was sleeping on my bed and I was sitting in this love seat I have, watching TV. My lights were off, so I couldn't see anything clearly other than the TV. Something startled me when I heard something hit my wall, as if being thrown, like a hammer hitting a wall. I then started to notice that my cat uncharacteristically started hissing at the window and moaning. She's usually a very quiet cat, but something really seemed to bother her, and she wouldn't keep quiet. She kept meowing for what seemed like five minutes. I didn't see anything in the window, and the cat for the next week persisted to meow in terror before she just gave up. She never did that ever again, and it was quite bizarre. It really started to scare me. On a separate day, I've heard cabinets opening and shutting. These things terrify me because I still have no explanation for them. Is my house haunted by a timid spirit who wants to know that it's there? Any comments or advice would be appreciated. Hope you found my story interesting. During the summer of 1976, my mom, older brother and I decide to accompany my aunt and her family to West Virginia and North Carolina to work in the tobacco fields. I was about 11 years old at the time. 
after a two-day trip from Texas to West Virginia, we were assigned a house to stay in while we were settled into work. There were several of us, ten in all, and we were tired from the trip, so everyone just basically picked a spot in a place and readied ourselves for bed for that first night. It was not a restful night. At about 3 a.m., we were awakened by the sounds of a woman crying and wailing in the room with us. Looking around the room, we could see that everyone was accounted for and no one was crying. The sounds increased in intensity and lasted for about 10 minutes. When I say wailing, I mean just that, a horrible, low sound, very similar to some of the sound effects heard in the old Scooby-Doo cartoons. I realize that sounds somewhat funny, but I swear it's true. I'm not sure if my eyes were just playing tricks on me, but in the darkness of the room, it really looked like there was a figure kneeling down. You could see it well enough in the dark to know that it was a gray outline of some figure. Interestingly enough, after the 10 minutes of sobbing, I noticed that this gray cloud ended up disappearing as well. Thankfully, we weren't to stay in that house for very long. Another house with more room for 10 people was assigned to us. That was not an improvement. The next house was a two-story one located somewhere between Hendersonville, North Carolina, in a small town known as Soul City. It was situated about 200 yards off a road, with a long driveway and a set of railroad tracks that ran along the other side of the road. There was a large white house off to the north of our house, about another 300 yards away. The house had a large open field in front, and was surrounded by woods on the other three sides, and a shed, and an old open water well in back. Spooky enough setting during the day. At night, things would happen, such as lights turning on by themselves, footsteps heard upstairs, when everyone was in plain sight downstairs, the sounds of something heavy being all dragged through the house late at night, after everyone had gone to bed, knocking on the walls, and my brother swears he's seen what appeared to be a black hooded figure at the foot of his bed. I remember I had my window open once while asleep at night, and I could have sworn I heard the sounds of a horse running across the field outside. Nobody in our area owns any horses at all, and you could hear the sounds of neighs. I ended up looking outside and saw absolutely nothing, but there was definitely a horse that I heard. I swear to anyone reading this, these events really happened. I know people often make claims like that, which make it seem like it's fabricated, but I really want to put an emphasis on the validity of these stories. All I have is my word, but I'm telling you, these events are so real. I'm 36 now an army veteran, college educated, and I have an interest in ghosts and the supernatural. If anyone has any clues about the house, the one near Soul City, North Carolina, its owners, or perhaps even its history, please email me. When I was in eighth grade, my mother, younger brother, and I moved into a rental home on Grace Drive in Wilson, North Carolina. I'd always been interested in ghosts, but never had any experience. This house would change that fact. As soon as we moved into the home, I had a very uneasy feeling, only in my room. I always felt like someone was watching me from my closet. Also, feeling uneasy, I could not sleep with my door closed and forbid my mother to close her door while we were sleeping. I also started sleeping with my pillow on top of my head in order to feel safe and secure in this room. On several occasions, I felt someone pushing the pillow down hard on my head as I was trying to go to sleep. It was not sleep paralysis because I had just laid down, 
At first, I thought it was my brother playing with me, to the point where I yelled out his name for him to stop, because the pushing hurt. However, when the pushing stopped, no one was in the room, and I was all alone. One evening around dusk, my mother and I were sitting on the front steps that were located between the bedroom, end of the home, in the living room, where my brother was alone watching TV. My bedroom was located on the front of the house, with only one window. I had a lamp sitting on my bedstand, in front of the window, and beside the bed. I stood up in order to illustrate a point to my mother, now facing the house with my bedroom window in sight. All of a sudden, I saw movement in my window. It was a shadow and act of sitting on my bed. Once it sat down, the shadow seemed to fade into the shadows of my bedroom. I stood there looking at my window and said to my mother that my brother was in my room and that he needs to get out. I immediately went into the house to find my brother still watching TV. I asked him what he was doing in my room and he just stared at me like I was crazy, saying that he had not left the living room. Of course, I went to my room to find no one there. We lived in the house for about two years, and only when we moved into our new house was I able to sleep with my door closed, with my mother's door closed. However, this new house was where my mother saw her first ghost. This happened about two months after we moved into the house. She said that she was laying in bed one night unable to sleep because the street lights in the city were so bright. She said that she looked over to her window and saw an old man standing in her room in front of the window. The old man walked over to the bed and looked down at her and then backed away only to disappear. She smartly did not tell me the story until I'd been away at college for three years. We are assuming that the old man was Mr. Barnes, who we think may have died in the house and was just checking in on the new occupants. That was the first and last incident that occurred in that home. I'm 16 years old and live in a small town in Texas. It's about 28 miles south of San Antonio. When I was in third grade, my family decided to move down here from Corpus. We began living with my grandfather and soon decided to buy property of our own. My mom and dad bought the property located right next to my grandfather's, which just happened to be the entrance to a coal mine that was very active about the 1900s. We built our house right next to the entrance to the coal mine. Our back door opened right on top of the entrance. By the time the house was built, I was about 13 and finally had my own room. One night, I was struggling to sleep and heard footsteps. Of course I was frightened, but somehow I went to sleep. I kept telling myself it was nothing. While I was sleeping, and this part of the story doesn't make sense at all, I had a dream that I was part of a well-known Jewish family in Europe in the Great World Conflict. I saw soldiers take my husband and I to a ditch in the middle of nowhere where they got rid of my husband. In my dream, I understood German. Next they got rid of me also. As I died in my dream, I woke up in real life. As I awoke, I heard more footsteps marching. They sounded like soldiers, Germans I assumed. They marched through my kitchen and some by my bedroom door, kind of like they were watching me. This is the first thing that happened to me. It didn't make sense because I thought they would be dead miners or something. About two years ago I became very depressed as many young people do and I tried to off myself. My mother came home from work and found me passed out and throwing up in the kitchen sink. They rushed me to the nearest hospital 
where they thought I was going to pass away. I saw my mom crying next to me and became relaxed. I was in total peace. I felt completely happy. Suddenly, I felt two men walking around me talking. I tried to turn my head to see them, but couldn't. I heard them speaking to each other, and one sounded older than the other. They said, look, it's so sad she's so young. And the other one said, look at her mother. At this point, they quit talking and continued to walk around us staring. Then, the feeling of peace was gone, and I heard two other voices. I kept saying, who is that? And I was scaring my mom to death. Right after that, I passed out, and when I woke up, I was in a hospital room. I didn't tell anyone exactly what it was I heard. I did tell my boyfriend at the time. I'm not sure he believed me. After that, I would hear voices at my house, people talking to me, but there was no one there. I heard them almost everywhere I went, but I didn't tell anyone. After a while, I tried talking back, but never got a response. The voices were never really clear. There were many at one time. It just sounded mumbled. I tried not to tell people about my voices because I was afraid they would not talk to me anymore. I felt I had a gift. They have stopped talking now. I haven't heard them for about a year now. I know it all sounds weird, but it's true. I also live next to a graveyard, which is weird I know. It's where most of the dead miners are buried. I think they try to talk to me sometimes. There is also one last account I had more recently. I was trying to go to sleep one night in the house all by myself. I looked out into the living room and saw a solid black figure running around. He looked as if he were hiding. He ran behind furniture and walls and really just scared the heck out of me. It was the only time I saw him though. It was the last of all my encounters. First of all, let me explain. I'm from England. I'm a 26 year old male living in Cambridge. I was born in Yorkshire, North England. Just up the road from where I lived, was a place called Oakwell Hall, located in an area called Birkinshaw. Oakwell Hall is a fairly small house compared to some in the UK, but it certainly has local character. Many a day away from school would be spent wandering around the grounds. Local legend has it that the hall was once inhabited by a great local family named the Bats, hence the local town of Batley, and that one of the sons of the family a womanizer and gambler of no small repute, found himself in a duel fought on the local moors. The servants all knew of this, and so were relieved. The sounds of his horse were heard, re-entering the stables. They were even more relieved when the son was seen walking through the hall, up the stairs, and to his bedchamber. They then made a rather spooky discovery when they noticed a bloody footprint on the staircase. Thinking their master was injured in a duel, they entered his chambers to see if they could help him. He was not there. The bed had not been disturbed. There was no horse in the stable. News was later conveyed that the son had died in the duel, and every Christmas Eve, the same bloody footprint can be seen on the staircase. This is not what I saw. I was eight years old, and it was the school holidays. Two friends, Stephen and Stuart and myself, were walking through the garden when Stuart noticed one of the windows was blacked out. We noticed it as the sun was behind the house and so should have been shining pretty much through the hall and out the other side. Thinking that there may be something going on, there are occasionally demonstrations in the hall. We entered the building and up the stairs. As we got to the top of the stairs, Stephen remarked he felt a bit funny, and I suddenly felt cold. 
The next thing we saw was a black blob about a half a meter off the floor and about 1.5 meters tall flow out of one door and into another. Stuart asked if anyone else had seen it, and we all said we had. Stuart then started to walk through down the corridor very slowly while Stephen and I stayed at the top of the stairs and were quite scared. Stuart looked around the corner and then ran back to us. We were so scared at this point that we just ran out and down the drive to the gate. Stuart told me later that he saw a figure about six foot tall that seemed to be made of shadows. He was dressed in a long coat and wore what looked like a top hat. He seemed to be looking for something and then it became aware of him. He told me much later, about 10 years later, that it looked over its shoulder at him and rather than a pair of eyes, it had a single red slit that seemed to pulse. I've been back to the hall since and seen nothing out of the ordinary. However, I felt very uneasy about certain rooms. Oh well, there you go. I don't know if this qualifies as having a haunting or possession, or if I'm just crazy. I've read several stories on your site, which is great by the way, and haven't come across anything similar to one of my experiences, which I'll tell below. My father is suffering from advanced rheumatoid arthritis along with hepatitis C, not a good combination. Anyway. I've been living with the pain of knowing he would be sick and in pain for the rest of his life since I was 16, I'm now 22, and watching him suffer and struggle with his diseases. Because of this, I've become increasingly interested in whether or not there is another phase of existence after we leave this world. I've been asking, both mentally and out loud, for some type of proof of this mostly for my own comfort. Anyway, I've recently been hearing noises that sound like a lot of people talking at once in my house when I'm home alone. It doesn't bother me or scare me, and it's so faint that it could be my imagination. Along with this, I've heard walking on my ceiling, my rooms are in the finished basement, and thinking my fiancé was home, went upstairs to greet him only to find myself still alone in this very house. Since I've been asking for proof, I wonder if it's only my imagination, but this next part was scary. I heard the voices. Sounds like a crowd of people all talking at once, but this time I wasn't hearing them externally with my ears, but originating from inside my head. I had this weird feeling that they were all talking directly to me, rather than just overhearing things like the other occasions. Anyway, the voices in my head just kept getting louder and louder, and all of a sudden, I was laughing uncontrollably for no reason. Probably doesn't sound too scary to you, but the whole time I was laughing, about five minutes, I was having thoughts like, why am I laughing? Why can't I stop laughing? There's nothing funny about this, and such. I was scared and physically willed myself to stop laughing, which didn't work. The voices started fading after about five minutes, and my laughing reduced to giggles, and then to shock silence. I've never told anyone about these things. I even think I sound crazy. And no. I was not on any mind-altering substances at the time this happened. Has the voices laughing thing happened to anyone else out there, or am I just crazy? If this has happened to someone out there, please email me. Okay, I know there are skeptics out there, but my grandmother, my mom and I, are very in tune with their spirits for some reason. I'll start with my grandparents 
babysitting ghost. We call him that, because only kids could see him if all the adults were out of the house. To explain the house a bit, the hallway is L-shaped. There is a bathroom to your immediate right, then two bedrooms, bedrooms one and two, on your left. When you turn the corner, there is a bedroom, number three on your left, another bathroom on your right, and the last bedroom, number four, at the end of the hall. My mom's dad was at work, and her mom and all my mom's brothers and sisters were outside, talking to friends and such. My mom was just sitting and watching TV. As my mom was watching TV, she saw something moving out of the corner of her eye and looked down the hallway from the living room. There was a very tiny old man sitting in a rocking chair, reading a book and looking up at her from time to time. She said he just smiled at her and kept rocking and reading. When the adults came back into the house, he disappeared. Two of my cousins have seen him also. The one thing that totally freaked us out was after my mom and I moved in with my grandparents. My uncle Kay had died in the first bedroom about a year before. He was really into drinking and drugs, so one night his heart, liver, and kidneys just failed on him. He was the practical joker of the family. Anyhow, my mom and I came home one night. My grandparents were out. We both had to use the bathroom really bad, so my mom ran to the first one, and I went to the second one at the end of the hallway. All of a sudden, I heard my mom yell, Hey! I was about to open the door to ask why she was yelling when I saw a hand open the bathroom door. I hurried up and finished my business and ran to my mom and asked her what happened. Why did she open the door to the bathroom and not tell me what she needed? Then I realized she was still in the bathroom. She said she saw a hand opening her bathroom door. I told her I saw the same thing. We're the only people in this house, and this happened on the opposite ends of the house. She just looked up at the ceiling and said, Kay, stop scaring us. We don't want to play with you right now. Your jokes aren't funny. We heard the most evil laugh we could imagine. At that point, we looked at each other and ran out of the house. When we came back, my grandparents were home and we sat my grandma down and told her what happened. She had to have the house blessed three times before the spirits went away. I was visiting some relatives in Denton, Texas in early July of this year when this strange event took place. My relatives live in a trailer park and some of the trailers are sitting close together. One late night when I was there, my nephew left his cigarettes in his car, so he went out to get them. I went with him. As we were walking to his car, we noticed that next door, there was someone rummaging around in a trash can that was in the back of the neighbor's truck. We thought nothing of it, thinking it was just one of the neighbors looking for something they threw away. As it was dark near where the vehicles were parked, we couldn't make out who it was. Well, my nephew got his cigarettes out of his car, and we were walking to the front of his trailer, where there is a bench you can sit on. We were walking towards it, when we noticed whoever it was that was walking through the garbage can was now walking up to the next door neighbor's porch, which was a good 20-30 feet from us. For whatever reason, just the sight of the person made both of us freeze while this figure just stood at the foot of the next door neighbor's porch steps with its back to us. It was almost as if this figure knew we were looking at it, but it wasn't even facing towards us. It just stood there, and we felt that somehow it was looking at us. Somehow. In the light of the porch lights, we could make out the details of this figure. 
The figure was of a small boy. But what was weird was that his head was shaven on both sides of his head, and in the middle was a blonde mohawk type haircut, except it wasn't the short type, but more of the longer hairstyle mohawk. His kid had 80 style clothes on, the short, multicolored and unbuttoned, light blue shorts and white tennis shoes. This kid just stood there for a few moments and began ascending the next door neighbor's steps in a stiff, awkward way. Its arms were close to its sides, and as it went up the steps, it just continued staring straight ahead, not once looking down or in any other direction. Then, the view of the kid was obstructed by the neighbor's porch, so we could no longer see him. The weird thing is, we never heard the next door neighbor's front door open or anything, that would indicate this person went in. My nephew and I, very unnerved and chilled, ran into his parents' trailer. We sat in his living room for a while, trying to rationalize what we had seen. He told me that the neighbors had two girls, but looked nothing like what we had seen. We asked my nephew's mother, my sister, if she knew if the neighbors had some relatives over, and if so, if they had a boy that looked like what we described. She said, not that she knew of. Well, the next day, we go over to the neighbor's trailer and ask them if they had anyone over that looked like what we saw. They said, no, we've had no visitors in two weeks. And no, we have no boys or children like what you described. My nephew and I then noticed their two girls in the living room. We confirmed that that was the only children they had. So, who or what could have been? Where did it go? We didn't hear it go in the neighbor's home that night. So maybe it was just the strange neighborhood kid and went through their backyard to where they were going. Well, that would have been very difficult since the neighbors have one of those extremely high wooden fences with no doors on it in their backyard. Besides, why would it go through the trouble of going up into their porch when they could have gone around? It's an old trailer park, and there's no telling how many people have lived and died in a lot of those trailers. I'm just glad I don't live there. Something and everything about this is strange, and what we saw that night, I know in my heart that it was not normal, but paranormal. I'm just glad the figure never turned around to look at us. I don't know what would have happened then. I'd hate to find out. My name is Paul, and I live in Canada, in the province of Nova Scotia, in a small city called Sydney. This small city was at one time an industrial center with coal mines in a large steel plant that employed thousands. This area's past employment promises has drawn in many foreigners to settle here, and we have a rich history of superstitions and beliefs. I should say that I'm not exactly a believer in ghosts, although I have an open mind to the idea that there may be something to it at all. Anyway, on with my story. I think I was 17 or 18 when this happened, which was around 1987. I was working for my local McDonald's restaurant and was working until 2 a.m. It was shortly after midnight when I took a break and called my girlfriend to say goodnight. As we talked, she stopped to see if someone had come down the stairs from the second level of her parents' home because she thought she had heard footsteps. She checked the stairs twice, but nobody was there. The conversation turned to the fact that at times, she would hear sounds in the house as though someone was walking the stairs. Our topic then returned to the normal teenage babble until she happened to look into the adjacent room. She thought she saw someone sitting at the end of the sofa. She put the phone down momentarily while she turned on the light in the darkened room. It was only a sweater and a jacket laid over the backrest of the sofa, so we resumed our conversation 
Once again, I can tell you that she had no thoughts of anything paranormal. She was thinking that maybe someone else was home, other than her sleeping parents, as she had a number of older brothers still living at home. I can remember that as we talked, she stopped dead in mid-sentence and started to weep. I was wondering what was wrong, thinking that I had said something to upset her. When I got her to speak, she told me that there was someone there, standing in the doorway of the room where she had just been. She sobbed that she was trying to sit very still in the hopes that this apparition would not see her and just go away. I tried to talk to her and settle her down, not quite sure if this was a joke or not. I think that the figure stood in this position for at least five minutes. Then, just when my terrified girlfriend calmed down a little, the figure moved into the hallway and assumed a sitting position, legs crossed. I again had to try and calm her down by talking to her and asking her to describe what she was seeing. The figure, she said, appeared to be a boy of about 8 or 10 years old. He was wearing a modern looking winter jacket and a winter hat. She said that although the facial features were not plain, the eyes could be clearly seen and were blue. The hands and feet area of the figure faded out of sight. This boy sat on the floor, not 10 feet from her, and looked right at her. Another minute or two passed, and then my girlfriend started weeping again. I remember her whispering, Oh, Paul, it's a girl. She told me that the figure had reached up and pulled a hat off its head and long blonde hair flowed from under it. The figure sat and stared in my girlfriend's direction a few minutes more and then appeared to stand up and go back into the room where it came and disappeared. My girlfriend stayed on the phone just long enough to be sure it was gone. Then she hung up with me and ran for her parents' bedroom. That was the end of the experience, and had lasted about 15 minutes. She asked her parents the next day if they could think of who this may have been. They had no ideas, and probably didn't believe her. I wasn't quite sure if I believed her either, and I kept asking her if she was playing a joke on me. She insisted she saw what she saw, and she wasn't comfortable talking about it, for fear that it may reappear. I'm now married to my girlfriend, and she still swears every word of this is true. She still doesn't like to talk about it. No one has ever seen a ghost in that house before, or since, that I'm aware of. My wife over the years has gotten spooked, and came running to me saying that she felt uneasy, and was afraid she was bad, but she hasn't been. I don't know if you respond to these letters or not, but if you do, write me a note to tell me what you think. Thank you for reading. While I was working at a hospital in town, I had the opportunity to come in contact with many ghosts. I worked on the geiatric floor, and elderly people died there every day. If the power suddenly went out and immediately came back on, a person had just died. This happened every time. One of the most notable apparitions that I've personally seen was a man with a cane that is seen wandering the halls at night. People admitted to the hospital would often report tapping sounds and seeing an old man's face grinning at them from the hospital door, which all of them had. One lady of about 80 kept telling me that she saw this man's face in the mirror in the bathroom, and that half of his face would look badly beaten and disfigured. There have been reports of a cloak man praying over the dead bodies of the recently departed. I can remember one incident where I walked into the morgue, and I saw a body that was recently pronounced dead and covered. I could have sworn that I saw the fading presence of this monk kneeling over the body for a few seconds, then disappear. I would feel the air in the room be so cold, 
but after he vanished, it warmed up. Another popular ghost at the hospital was the Grim Reaper. The Reaper was a dark figure that would come through the window at the end of the hallway. He would shut doors, touch you on the shoulder, etc. Late at night, you could feel that someone was there, and you would see a dark figure out of the corner of your eye. As soon as you looked up, he was gone. My favorite story to tell is this. I was helping a woman get her bath early one morning. I was asking her how she slept, how she felt, etc. She told me that she did not get a wink of sleep because of the man's face she saw in the window. She said that she thought it was tree branches, but she got up in the middle of the night and saw that it was a man's face staring at her through the window. This woman was just in the hospital for a kidney infection. She wasn't on any drugs that would make her hallucinate. On third shift, you could hear children giggling and hear them running up and down the halls, but there are no children on the floor. If you went past the operating room at night, it would be locked, but inside, you could hear instruments clanging and things being thrown around. Haunted church stories seem to be popping up frequently lately. And I'm here to say that I have a brief story that will involve just that. There's this Catholic church that I used to constantly clean. This was in Vermont, and the church had to have been built in the late part of the 19th century. Very beautiful windows, looked immaculate. Anyway, I used to work as a janitor cleaning the halls late at night, when I would be the only one there. There were many times when I would hear the organ notes playing repeatedly. I would hear the echoes of human voices speaking together, like whispers, and sometimes even clear words. One night, I was cleaning around the church once again. I was all the way at the end of the church when I heard the organs going off. It wasn't the usual sound either. It sounded monstrous as if someone was literally stomping on the organs. I looked immediately in the direction of where the organ sounds were coming from, and I could have sworn I saw a cloaked figure at the organ and playing it. It was the typical transparent looking apparition, and when I walked even closer to get a better look, the figure had seemed to disappear. That was of course the worst of what I had witnessed, but there were times where I would see the organ once again playing by itself. I'd see a note or two being pushed down by itself when nobody else was in the room and it was quiet. Anyway, that's all I have to report. I don't work at this church anymore, I'm happy to say, but I thought it was worth sharing. I wish I could say that this wasn't a real experience, but unfortunately, I can't. At least this will always make for an entertaining read. My name is Shannon. I'll be 18 in 11 days. I live in Georgia, and I'm writing to you because I feel so alone. For as long as I can remember, I've dealt with ghosts. I don't know what they are or what they want from me, but they seem to follow me. For the first five years of my life, I lived in a trailer in Mississippi. I can only recall one incident from that because I was so young. I remember it was a beautiful day in spring and I was sitting on a picnic table in our backyard making mud pies when suddenly I heard what I thought to be my mother's voice calling me from the woods. I started to follow it. The closer I got, the further out into the deep woods the voice seemed to go. I almost followed it all the way into the woods, thinking my mother was calling me. But suddenly, I heard my mother's real voice calling me from the trailer. I turned and saw her waiting for me next to the picnic table. So I ran back and told her what had happened. She, of course, said that it was my imagination. About 12 years ago, our family moved here to Hiram. 
Every single night for years, I was terrified to sleep because I saw shadow people. They were like three-dimensional shadows that looked like people. I saw them in my room at night after my parents would put me to bed. When I'd call my parents into the room, they would turn on a light and the shadow people would be gone. They said it was my imagination. Lots of other things have happened and there have been witnesses to some of the events. The house will shake at times. The doors will open and close on their own. I've seen dolls move on their own. A glass has exploded in my hand for no reason. I know glasses will explode from temperature changes, but there was no change in temperature at all. There was a music box that music would play in other rooms of the house when the music box wasn't around. I've heard footsteps when no one was home or awake. I've heard voices. The list goes on. I thought maybe that there was something wrong with me, so I went to a psychiatrist. She said that there's nothing wrong with me. I've learned to verify that I'm really hearing something, because even my cats notice something and hear a lot of things. If they hear it too, their ears perk up. I've tried talking about it before, and they either don't believe me and think I'm making it up, or they think I'm crazy. I really feel alone, and it would be nice if you could get me some sort of guidance. What should I do? Should I do anything? Well, I apologize for the long email. I'm sure that you get a lot of mail every day, and I hate to add to the pile. Thank you for your time. My name is Luann. I'm 19 years old and live in a little redneck town in Virginia. I live with my grandparents and have lived all my life. My mom was 14 and in the eighth grade. My mom had a very best friend named Wendy, who was 13. They did everything together. Soon after our house was built, Wendy's parents were not getting along and were going through some separation and divorce procedures. Wendy and her mother had moved to Woodbridge, Virginia, soon. During the time of the separation, Wendy spent a great deal at my mom's newly built house. They spent much of their time in my mom's room, which is now my room. Then came the time for Wendy and her mom to move. It was very early one morning. Wendy was in the back of the van, holding a glass coffee table steady. This was in the days before seatbelt laws. There was a drunk driver on the road and hit the van head on. Everyone made it out with semi-serious or minor injuries, but not Wendy. The corner of the glass coffee table hit her in the head and killed her instantly. Years later, in 1985, a week before my mom found out she was pregnant with me, she was in the family room talking to my grandparents about going on birth control. My grandmother and my uncle both caught a glimpse of a girl standing behind my mother, and after that two-second glimpse, she was gone. My uncle and grandmother agreed that it looked like Wendy. Oh, and she was actually shaking her head when she appeared. We believe that she was shaking her head because she knew my mom was pregnant and didn't want her to go on birth control. Ever since then, everyone in my family has caught a glimpse of her in our house. I usually never get any negative feelings when she materializes, but there was one moment I witnessed her ghost that completely terrified me. I was in the shower, I was home alone, and I had the door completely wide open. It was late evening, and I heard the door to the bathroom slam shut. It startled me so much, so I got dressed and headed out the door. I could have sworn I heard my name being called in a gentle, quiet whisper. It sounded like a little girl. I go downstairs and walk into the living room, and then I see the lights flickering. I also start to hear the sounds of footsteps walking across our hardwood floors. 
At this point, I thought I had an intruder in the house. I go to call the police, and after I hang up, I rush upstairs to hide in my bedroom. The thing was, as I was running upstairs, I could have sworn I saw the presence of a little girl in black in the corner of my eye as I ran for the stairs. It was only for a couple seconds, and of course, my mind was just thinking about hiding from this intruder. I could have just been seeing things, but I swear, I saw a girl for a second. The police showed up, of course, couldn't find anyone, and all was quiet. My parents came home, and I told them what happened. They were just happy that I was safe. It wasn't until a few days later that I realized it could have been Wendy. Because my room used to be my mom's room, she's in my room most of the time. I feel her presence there a lot. When I'm upset, no matter where I am in the house, I can feel her there. No one has seen her until my mom became pregnant. My family believes that she was sent to watch over her best friend's daughter. This happened to my cousin and I in Lado too, in a ranch style house my family and I used to live in. My cousin woke up in the middle of the night to my voice, or so she thought it was my voice. She looked at me, and I was sound asleep and not talking. Also that night, it was probably 4 or 5 in the morning, and I felt someone pecking on my knee, and it wasn't my cousin because she was sound asleep. So I just thought it was my imagination. As we were eating that morning, my cousin had told me what she had heard. I freaked because I knew that whatever had pecked me on my knee was not my imagination. Nothing was ever actually seen in this house, but a lot of things were felt and heard. A few months after that incident, my cousin was staying the night again. Everyone in the house had been asleep for two or three hours, but my cousin, she was so addicted to the game The Sims, and she was still on the computer. As she was shutting down the computer, she heard voices coming from the hallway directly to her right. She looked down there and saw nothing. The voices she heard, she knew were not any of ours, so she ran to the floor where she had made her bed and covered her head up. I guess the voices must have stopped after that. A lot of times I would hear cabinets shut, dishes clank together, and other odd unexplainable noises. One night, my brother got home from a friend's house around 1 or 2 in the morning. I'd been asleep on the couch in the living room for at least 4 hours, and my parents had been asleep in their room for about the same amount of time. As my brother got out of his car, he looked towards the door that went directly into the living room from the outside. It had a little window on it. He could see the light from the TV that I always left on at night, but he also saw a black figure looking at him from the inside. He ran in the house and noticed I was on the couch sound asleep. Then he went into my parents' room and asked if they'd been up and they hadn't. What is scary is that the thing was in the same room with me. The next night, I slept on the couch again. Do not ask me why. My brother was not home yet, and my parents had went to bed. I was watching TV, and I got kind of uneasy, so I laid down and covered up my head. After a while, I heard the glasses in the kitchen sink clanking together. I started to sweat, then I felt as if someone was coming into the living room, where I was. When my brother arrives home, and the noises stop, I got up and looked at the dishes in the sink, and none of them had been moved. About 14 years ago, we moved into a house that was built in the 1950s. I believe that used to be a boarding house, and was right in front of a cemetery. There were lots of noises heard there, 
and a few spirits as well. I remember staying home one day from school and my mom was asleep because she worked nights and I heard a voice say my name. It scared me because we were the only ones home and it was a voice I had never heard before. My mom would be home during the day by herself while my brother and I were at school and she would hear a music box playing. At the time, we had music boxes, but they did not play the song she heard. My mom would be sleeping on the couch, and she would hear footsteps coming through the kitchen, which was right next to the living room where she was. One time, when that happened, she grabbed her shoes and didn't come back till we got out of school. She also would be sleeping in her bed, and it would start shaking. This also happened to me. The shed in this house was directly behind my parents' bedroom because their bedroom used to be a garage. Well, anyway, my mom would be lying on her bed and she would hear someone or something walking in there. The odd thing was, it sounded like boots on wood, but the floor in there was concrete. We had a little dog out there at the time but there is no way it could have sounded like that when it walked. One night, my mom, dad, and brother we were all sleeping in my room because we put the air conditioner in there in the summer. Well, anyway, it was a cool night, so they had turned the air off and left the door open. My mom, for some reason, looked at the doorway and felt as if there was a presence there. She just put her face into my dad's back and went to sleep. The next day, she found out that her beloved dad had died, who lived in Kansas, and hadn't been found for a few days. She believes that it was him in the doorway. My brother saw a ghostly head in his bathroom one night. It was in a mist and was bald on top with hair around the edges of his head. We believe it was my great-grandpa. This happened at my grandma's house on September 2nd, 2004. It was my grandma's birthday and my mom, my little cousin and I, went there to have cake and ice cream. Well, my little cousin decides she wants a Miracle Whip sandwich. She pressed up against the door frame, asking my grandma if she could have a sandwich, when all of a sudden, she looked towards the microwave in the kitchen and screams, drops the jar, and runs to the couch where my grandma is and my little is crying hysterically. We were all like, what just happened? For some reason, I became very cold and got goosebumps and had the urge to sit up. My little cousin wouldn't tell us what she saw. My grandma tried to tell us it was a mouse or a buck but I highly doubt it because she wouldn't have acted like she did. My grandma believes in ghosts, but I think she said that to make herself feel better because she knew she was going to be there alone when we left. My little cousin, I believe, has forgotten about the incident, so I did not know what happened. Other things have happened at the grandma's, like something kicked her bed very hardly one night, and she also seen the spirit of a young girl dressed in white one day while lying on her couch in her living room. She's seen a shadow-like figure outside her window, which she knows wasn't a human because her cat started hissing and acting weird, and there's probably been other things that happened that I do not know about. I don't believe I've actually ever seen a spirit, but I know I felt that because in certain places, or sometimes when I talk about the spirits, the back of my neck starts to hurt and feels weird, and sometimes my head will start hurting. I have so many stories to share with you, but I will send them at a later time. My cousin and I were out in Glenpool, towards the boondocks where my grandparents used to live, watching TV late at night. We weren't really tired, hyped up on caffeine, from Pepsi and Sprite, just hanging out and trying to see how long we could go without passing out to sleep. At first, I thought I was just hearing things, 
or my cousin thought I was being a jerk and screwing around. But the louder the sound got and closer, that's when we both turned the volume down. We then went to turn to each other and ask the same question. Was that you? Did you hear that? Of course, it was like a scratching, shuffling sound outside, and we both dismissed it, thinking that perhaps it was the family pets or wild animal, since the house was out in the middle of nowhere. Instead, curiosity got the better of us. I suggested that maybe it was a ghost, and she promptly crawled towards the window for a peek. She didn't say anything, standing still, like if she moved something would see her. I started to talk, but she silenced me with the wave of her hand. When I got over to the glass, I stared off into the black yard, expecting to see a deer or something. Instead, what I saw was a thing best word used to describe it. It was all black, nearly invisible in the shadows it clung to. The only way we were able to see it all was due to a distant light pole. It was skirting around. I guess the dogs must have felt the tension in the air, because at that moment, they all went into wild barks at this intruder. It swung its head, or what seemed like a head, towards the sound of the barks, then up to the window we both watched it from. There was nothing there, no face, nothing at all. Needless to say, both of us were terrified to see a hooded, faceless figure staring back at us. It disappeared, melting into the shadows. The dogs yipped, dashing for cover. Both me and my cousin were cold, shocked, afraid and speechless. We don't know what it was looking for in our yard, or what it was at all. I used to believe it was a person thinking of robbing our house, or at least I tell myself that so I don't get freaked. Though the truth seems a lot creepier, it is still the truth, and neither I nor my cousin can deny that. When I was 11 years old, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up to hear the sound of my dad plowing our driveway. He soon left for work, and I couldn't fall back asleep. After all was quiet, I got out of my bunk bed and climbed down my stairs and walked into the hallway. I went to the bathroom and then back to my room. I climbed into bed and crawled over towards my pillow. It was then that I turned around and was about to pull my blankets over me when I noticed two bright green lights in the corner of my room directly in front of me. They were glowing and hovering in the same spot I just walked through. I was confused and tried to think of all the possible things they could be. Smoke alarm light? Glow in the dark plastic stars? Anything? I started to get more scared as the time passed because I tried to eliminate the fact that it could be a spirit. I tried to figure out if it was my eyes playing tricks on me. Perhaps I saw the lights from a clock and my eyes just needed to adjust to the darkness. I didn't turn any lights on while I got up. I blinked my eyes in a different spot on my wall and tried to see if the lights would follow my eyes. They didn't. At this point, I looked back to the spot and there they were. I was so scared. They were eyes and they were staring at me. I was terrified. I couldn't move at all. I was laying down resting on my elbows, just staring at them. They moved forward a foot or so, very slowly. Then, they moved back and just as slowly, vanished to left through my wall. I was so scared they would come back. And that's the end of the story. Riverdale Road has a lot more than just that certain place by 132nd, 
Riverdale Road is spooky throughout the entire road. It's weird. Sometimes the road stretches and shrinks. The bad side of the road actually starts on 104th, North Glen, and goes all the way to the end of the Highway 7, Boulder. But anyway, from 104th to Highway 7 is approximately 13 to 15 miles. I was paying attention to the mileage, and I was going about 35 to 40 the entire time. I started at 104th, and by the time I got to Highway 7, I had only gone 9 miles when I turned around to go back the other way towards 104th again. When I got there, I went 16 miles. Now tell me that isn't creepy. If you pay real close attention to the road, you could almost see it stretching. There was also this turn called Dead Man's Curve. It's a real sharp turn. The recommended speed is 25, but easily done at 40. There's a cement block wall bordering one side of the turn. If you turn that corner around 2.30 a.m., you will see a woman in the middle of the road, holding her hands up, waving for you to stop. When I went around that corner, I didn't have time to stop, because she's right there, after you do a half 90 degree turn. I ended up hitting her, I got out of my car and looked all around. Absolutely no one was around, but there were handprints on the hood of the car. Also, if you turn onto Riverdale from 112th and turn left, there will be a huge line of trees on the either side, and it just looks like a dark cave of trees, and there's a very mean jogger spirit that hitchhikes and jogs around there. My sister and I were driving around on that road and went through that little cave of trees and she said she first got a glimpse of the light on his shoes on the left side going away from 104th and as you get closer you can see that it's a person and he was holding out his hands for hitchhiking then all of a sudden knelt down in the running position and as soon as we got close enough he jetted out in front of us. My sister said that there were bodily fluids and body parts all over on the windshield, and she blinked, and it was all gone. She said as soon as he knelt down getting ready to run, she saw that his face was just a skull, and his hand was bones. So yeah, it's not just that spot right by 132nd. There are millions of ghosts and spirit stories for that road, believe me. I've gone up and down that road billions of times. I used to do it about five to seven times a day for about a year, so I know that road pretty well. I moved to Overland Park, Kansas, during my sixth grade year, along with my brother, stepfather, and brother. The five-story house we lived in was in a new neighborhood, and I never took the time to research the land on which our neighborhood was built. Of course, I didn't know what experiences I would find myself in throughout the next few years. My night's routine consisted mostly of sitting in the sunroom on the fourth floor that looked towards the hallway leading to the two bedrooms, a bathroom, a linen closet, and the staircase which led to the master bedroom while reading whatever book I had at hand. I can't recall how long it had been since my family and I moved into the house. However, I remember this night clearly. My parents went out to eat and I stayed behind at home. I was curled into the corner of a sofa that sat in front of a set of windows reading Guardian by John Saul. The first incident happened well after the night sky had darkened. I was concentrating heavily on my book when I began to hear a knocking coming from outside. It sounded almost exactly like someone hammering on the side of the house. Looking up for my book, I turned and looked outside to see who could be outside at such a time. However, I couldn't see anyone. So I turned around and made myself comfortable to engross myself in my book. 
Again, the banging continued, and the most effort I put into looking out the window again was angling my head and looking out of the corner of my eye. After a few minutes, the sound outside stopped, only to begin inside. This time, it sounded as someone was banging a hammer on the pipe in the basement, three floors below. The banging was four or five short clangs, and then silence. I'd raise my book again, until I was interrupted by another round of clangs. The only thing I can do was try my best to ignore it. As I continued to read, I experienced this unnerving feeling of being watched. I tried to reposition myself on the couch, shifting my legs from underneath me and stretching out, but nothing would unshake their presence. I finally set it on propping my feet on the table and resting the book on my knees. It was then where I could see in my peripheral vision a man standing on the top step of the staircase leading to my parents' bedroom. He stood in complete black, perfectly still, and watched. When I looked directly at him, he disappeared. I figured all the noises in the man I saw were a result of reading the book, and because of this conclusion, I refused to look up at the staircase again, regardless of the fact that the man was still there. I never spoke of the clanging of the man once my parents came home, because I figured it was my imagination. My parents were arguing when they came home anyway, so I tried my best not to get in their way. Most of my time was spent in my room, when there were others in the house. You could blame it on adolescence and wanting to be by myself. It was there in my room where another strange incident occurred. I had my radio cranked to the highest decibel and was rocking out when I heard a knock on my door. Turning down the radio, I rushed to the door and opened it to find no one standing outside. I shrugged, thinking I was hearing noises due to the loud radio, closed the door and cranked the radio back up again. A few minutes later, I heard the knocking again, but this time, Instead of turning down the radio, I opened the door while the radio blared. Again, no one stood at my door. I walked into the bathroom, which was immediately to my right, and checked behind the drawn shower curtain because my mother would love to hide and jump out behind me as I walked down the hallway. Well, she wasn't going to get me this time, only she wasn't behind the curtain. I walked down the entire hallway, checking the kitchen and bedrooms before going to my parents' bedroom. It too was empty, so I hightailed it to my bedroom, shut the door, and sat on my bed. I figured whoever wanted to come in would, so I no longer answered the knocks. Whoever it was knocked twice more and then stopped. Months passed and the knockings continued and the man stood on the top step of the staircase. After a while, I became so used to it, but I never mentioned it to anyone in my house. I always figured it was my mind playing tricks on me. Eventually, the sounds and the man disappeared, and I never experienced them again until years later. My mother and I were standing on the back porch one night while she smoked a cigarette. No one was allowed to smoke inside because my younger brother was an asthmatic. While she smoked, she mentioned, I see people in this house. I casually looked at her and replied, You too? I can't remember the look on her face, but the sound of her voice distinguished her fear. She told me that she continuously saw three people standing on the staircase leading to her bedroom. Only the people she saw were dressed in white. She said that the people she saw stood on the stairs day and night, whereas the person I saw was dressed in black and only stood at the top of the stairs at night. She told me of a night when she was smoking in the garage and she heard a knocking on the door. Figuring it was her husband, 
she knocked back in return. Moments later, another knock, and she returned it, and again, and again, until the door opened, and her husband asked why she was knocking on the door. Her answer was, because you were knocking. He informed her that he had been downstairs watching television. A year or so after I shared our experiences, my mother and brother and me, of course, moved out of the house and into an apartment across the street from the neighborhood. My mother and her husband were separated, but he continuously stayed at our apartment anyway. One night, my mother decided to drive back to the house to feed our dog that we left behind at the house while my stepfather was inside our apartment sleeping. I remained behind as well, sitting outside in the back patio. My mother was gone for 10 or 15 minutes before rushing back through the front door. The hairs on her arm were standing on edge and she couldn't seem to collect her thoughts. She finally asked, do you think I'm crazy? I laughed and asked why. She explained. While the dog was eating out in the garage, she had gone inside to close the blinds in the formal living room. While her back was the rest of the room, she heard a distant voice saying, get out of the house. She said she shook it off and walked up to the sunroom to close more blinds, where she again heard, get out of the house. Finally, while closing the blinds in the kitchen, she said that the voice was so close that she ran out of the house without closing the remaining blinds, jerked the dog into the garage, and sped back to the apartment. A year later, we moved to Georgia, where there have been no experiences in any of the houses we've resided in. I've been debating with myself as to why she and I would see people standing on the same staircase, and if their different clothing represented anything. Maybe because that's where most of my parents' fights would take place, or what was trying to get our attention by knocking on the walls. What I do know is that now, now that my mother is no longer married to the same man, we haven't experienced anything of the like since. My ex-boyfriend lived in a very old part of town, in a house that was built in the 1800s. At one time, the home had been a stately and elegant one, with a long and gracefully curving stair as the focal point upon the entrance into the foyer. Through time, and with the coming of rough economic periods, the home grew into disrepair and was eventually sectioned off into a two-family home. One side housed a family of bikers, whose moonshine sent many a folk into orbit. We didn't have any moonshine the night this happened, and then the other lived my boyfriend and his roommate. One night, myself, my boyfriend Nick, Nick's friend Dave, and my friend Stacy, who was dating Dave at the time, were at the house. We were descending the grand staircase I mentioned earlier, on our way out to enjoy our Saturday night. All was dark, except for the soft lighting coming from the kitchen, which was illuminating the front doorway. On the front door, we saw the unmistakable silhouette of a woman in a long old-fashioned hoop skirt, like women wore in the 1800s. She scared the wits out of me and Stacy, and we both refused to go any further down the stairs until the rest of the lights were put on. Chickens, aren't we? Although Nick and Dave were in a position to see the woman's shadow, for some strange reason, they were unable to see her. Maybe she only liked women, but I know this for a fact. The next moment we actually saw the woman, it looked as if we saw her with her eyes gouged out, and she was running towards us, flying down the hallway. It was actually pretty creepy but it happened in the corner of my eye, so I don't know if I was hallucinating or I actually saw her full steam ahead, but it definitely creeped me out. Another moment, my friend Stacy was upstairs. 
and the door was completely wide open. The bathroom door, that is. And she saw that same woman, in Victorian era clothes, just laying in the bathtub with a gun, her eyes gouged out. I honestly don't understand what happened to this woman. At first I thought it was pretty innocuous, but now I understand. She must have been murdered. There's no other explanation I had than that. Thanks for reading, and I hope you enjoyed the story. I've always been hesitant to talk about this story, but what I tell you is true. In 1992, when I was separated from my wife for the first time, I was living at Old Farm in an apartment. One Saturday night, when my kids were off to their grandmothers and my girlfriend, who was a teacher, had an event to attend, I found myself in my apartment all alone. I rented a couple of movies, ordered a pizza hut, went on over to the whirlpool for a while, and sat down to enjoy a peaceful night, alone at last. I was really looking forward to a night by myself. When I was reading in bed, I noticed a black silhouetted figure standing in my bedroom door. The figure appeared to have a cloak drawn over its head. I couldn't recognize any features, nor was there any attempt to verbally communicate. I was wide awake, and I was terrified. My heart was racing, and I kept pulling the covers over my head. It seemed like every second was one of terror. The figure stood in my doorway well into the morning hours, and I knew my eyes were as big as they could get. When the silhouette disappeared, I was covered with sweat. My hair was raining wet. I rushed out to the front room because I really couldn't believe it had left me. No, the only thing I had to drink was a Diet Coke with popcorn. I'm not a big drinker. After the ordeal, I quickly showered and raced off to go hiking. I can honestly tell you that no communication with the figure was made. When I would ask who you are, there was no response. This went on all night, until by the grace of God, it went away. This event has always affected my life. I know of another person who had a similar experience like mine. Can you tell me what was standing in my door, why there was no communication, and why me? Have you ever had any stories like this reported to you? Until now, the only person I ever told this story to was a good friend who is a Catholic priest. It still scares me to tell this story. Why was there no attempt to communicate? And yes, when I checked my doors, they were all bolted and locked. My father loved the state of Maine. Not enough, however, to give up his cush job in Boston to live on the going wage of a down Easter. So every summer, from the mid-fifties until I reached high school, we would vacation on the scenic Maine coast. Very seldom will we stay in the same place twice. Usually, it was some remote cottage located on the outskirts of some tiny coastal town. A two-week ordeal was in store for me, with no TV or friends to speak of. To keep me sane, my mother would buy me comic books and play board games with me, long into the night. We'd been at this cottage now for about ten days, and I was counting the hours until we would leave. It was a chilly August night, and dear old dad had a few too many, and drifted off to bed. Our terrier, Joe was snoozing on the carpet in front of the fireplace, and through the big picture window, the surf was something out of a South Pacific movie. The waves were gently breaking on the rocky shore, not 20 yards from the cottage. The only sound was the reverie coming from a cruise ship that was passing off the point. In summary, 
The night was calm. Suddenly, Joe jumped to his feet with his hackles up and growled at the door. I yelled at the dog to be quiet as he interrupted me over a card game. In an instant, the front door blew open and with a bang, it hit the interior wall. Just then, a ghostly presence entered through the doorway. He looked as if he was from the colonial era, had a musket in his hand, and seemed as though only half his face was visible, even though the figure itself had a blur to it. This lasted a few seconds, then the figure disappeared like a fog that evaporated. Joe cowered, and my mother's hair moved like it had been ruffled by some invisible breeze. The playing cards scattered about, and before we could take a breath, the door slammed shut and Joe went back to his sleeping position. We decided not to tell the old man, as he wouldn't believe it anyway. A few days later, we were filling up the old Plymouth for the return trip to Boston, and my father started gabbing with the local about his vacation. With the windows of the car down, we heard every word. So where did you stay? The man asked, with the main dialect. Oh, down on the point at the Jensen Cottage, my old man answered. Folks around here know that place well, the man said flatly. They referred to it as the front door. My name is John. I'm 41 years of age and currently live in the city of Lincoln, England. During my life to date, I've seen several ghosts, and whilst I still find them surprising and of course fascinating, I'm no longer afraid of whatever they are or appear to be. I saw my first ghost at around the age of eight whilst having in my childhood home a large Victorian house on the edge of Manchester, England. The ghost was one of a young boy of a similar age to mine at the time. He was leaning over the banister rail of the stairway landing outside my bedroom as I was making my way up to bed. The shock and surprise of seeing him sent me flying downstairs into the front room of my house. Needless to say, that none of my family appeared to believe what I told them I had seen. Although over the years, I've experienced strong sensations of ghostly presences. My next positive encounter was not until I was 22, whilst living and working in the city of Newcastle. I'd obtained the keys to a vacant industrial building, which my firm was taking over. My job was to assess the work involved in converting the building for its future use. I'd locked myself in the building and was therefore sure that no other person was on the premises and was proceeding up some steep and narrow stairs when I felt a hand touch me on the top of my head and give my hair a friendly ruffle, rather like an affectionate parent may give their child. I immediately turned around, only to find the stairway completely empty. Surprised, but not afraid this time, I continued my inspection of the building. We moved into the premises, and although I had my office at the top of the stairs where I had my encounter, and worked there often late into the night, I never saw, heard, or felt anything unusual there again. My next encounter took place right here in Lincoln, about three years ago. Walking her dog out late one night, I noticed the cyclist approaching me along a side street. I thought the cyclist appeared a little unusual in so far as he was riding an old style sit him up and beg cycle. His hair looked rather old fashioned too, and most curiously of all, he appeared to be wearing an old style Royal Air Force uniform. I could see the street light reflecting off the silver buttons on his uniform tonic, and from the chrome handlebars of his cycle. He got to within about 30 yards of me when for some reason, I glanced down for a second. When I looked up again, he had completely disappeared from the street, and there was no way in which he could have left the street 
in the vicinity of where I last saw him. I wondered whether his appearance was, in some way, connected to the fact that there used to be an open-air swimming pool adjacent to where I saw him. This pool is very popular with air crews during World War II, and I can only assume he may have been on his way for a midnight swim. My most recent encounter was very brief, occurring during the first time I visited my mother's cottage in North Wales. Built around 200 years ago, the back room opens directly out into the rear garden, with the narrow stairs descending into the back room right beside the back door to the building. Whilst coming down the stairs, I saw an elderly woman walk through the back door and disappear. She was aged about 80, approximately 5 foot tall, wearing a grey dress with long sleeves, a white apron, and her straight grey hair was tied up in a sort of bun, which in turn was covered by a small handkerchief on the top of her head. She was followed immediately by a young girl, aged about 10 or 12, dressed in a long light, colored smock. Her hair was very long, blonde and straight falling down her back. She also disappeared straight away. I have no idea what ghosts are or why they appear. I do not see them as threatening. In fact, on more than one occasion, a curious sensation of contentment seems to fill the air after they have gone. I have noticed that my mind is not thinking about anything in particular at the times I have come across them. Thanks for reading. I grew up in western New York and knew the local legends of ghosts, the Rochester Durant White Lady, for example. I never really put much faith in them. I never had an experience until I left New York. In October of 99, I was transferred to Elyra, Ohio. After a few weeks, I was asked to work in Sandusky. I accepted the promotion. But having just settled into a new apartment, I decided to commute rather than move again. Halfway between Elyra and Sandusky, there was a rest stop on I-90, Route 2, just outside Vermilion. I would stop sometimes on the way home for a bathroom break, or rest a bit. It's a funny design. You drive around and park in back of the building, between the building, and wooden walking trails. I usually got off work after about 11 p.m., but it was usually pretty busy, so I never gave much thought to stopping there late at night. One night, in March of this year, I'd stop for a bathroom break. I noticed that there was only a few cars in the lot. It was a warm spring night. I wondered why more people weren't out. As I returned to my car, I had this urge to walk into the wooded area. A stupid thing to do, as it would be easy for a human assailant to hide on the trails. I walked in about 10 feet, and the path split to the left and straight ahead. I walked a little further straight ahead and felt something in there with me. I turned and started to walk out when I heard a noise, kind of like a lumbering sound. Feeling foolish and thinking there was probably an animal, like a hedgehog or deer, walking through the woods, I looked back and saw a pair of yellow eyes on the path quite a while back. I knew it could not be an animal, as only the parking area was lighted. The only light in the woods came from the ambient light and the moon. I quickly closed the distance between myself and the parking area, keys in hand. To my relief, Nothing pursued me, and the eyes were gone, or at least, I couldn't see them anymore. I went straight home. The next day, I felt rather silly, thinking about the matter during the day. None of it seemed like it should have scared me. I rationalized the whole thing. That night, I stopped for a bathroom break. Feeling brave, I decided to once again check out the woods and dispel my fear once and for all. This time, 
I walked out only halfway to the fork, and I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. I was not afraid in the usual sense, rapid heartbeat, sweating, etc. I just had this feeling of not being able to walk any deeper into the woods. It was like the air got heavier the further I walked. As I walked out of the woods, the feeling went away, just as it had come. I decided to come back on my day off and investigate, during the day. I'd never been in the day, and I didn't know where the trails led, or what was in the woods that attracted people to them. I returned a few days later with my jogging shoes, ready to explore. The trails wrapped around to each other, and only totaled a mile loop. There was a ledge, a cliff area, but it was fenced off and there was no way to get down, but I could see a stream in the distance. I didn't feel anything strange at all. Nonetheless, I made it a point not to stop there after dark. A few months later, I was transferred to Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which leads me to my next story, but we are still looking into it, and it's AM now so I need some sleep. And this is a true story. And this happened to me when I was 8 years old. I'm now 28, with 3 kids of my own. It happened in my hometown of Soak Village, Illinois, which is known to be a place that Indians pass through, using South Trail to get to other destinations. At least, that's what the official story is. There are others, like myself, who believe more. We believe that Indians actually settled there, if only for brief periods of time. There's always been talk of bones being found when a pool was dug up or a garden was put in, but most say it's just that. Talk, not me. I believe it. I also not only believe, but know that the ground the Silk Village is residing on is sour, cursed, beyond anybody's wildest dreams, and I have many stories to support that belief. But for now, I will start with my first story of proof. It was a cold normal night in the season of autumn, cold enough to keep you inside your house and snuggled under a blanket. I was doing exactly that. An eight-year-old can only do so much during these times, and I chose to do my homework so I could read later. I'd been listening to a Rick Springfield album on 8-track. I was playing it on my 2XL robot toy. This was a toy that you could put 8-track cartridges in that was made by the company to be a sort of trivia game. You'd play the cartridge, and it would ask you questions and tell you jokes. He had two big red robot eyes that flashed red when you were correct. It had three buttons you could push to answer your questions. 2XL could also play normal, 8-track music. And of course, its red robot eyes flashed in time with the music. So it was doing exactly just that on that cold autumn night, flashing its eyes to Rick Springfield, and I was quite contented. My bedroom was on the second floor of my house and faced north, along with my bed. I had a window north of me and east of me. Of course, it was dark outside, but it was so warm inside and so very comforting. Every now and again, I'd look up for my homework and just look out into the darkness. No reason. It was just something I did. Well, this was the last time. I ever did that again in that house. As I was sitting there, all of a sudden, I felt instantly cold, and every single hair in my body was raised. My blood felt like it had ran cold, and decided to just stop pumping through my body. My heart was racing. I was perfectly terrified, and I didn't even know why. Yet, my 2XL was suddenly stuck and it kept playing the same verse from Rick over and over, hole in my heart, and its eyes weren't flashing anymore. No, they were just burning bright red. 
blood red. Then I felt this magnetic pull, like something was pulling me to my right. I turned my right head and looked out the east window and saw something that haunted me for the rest of my life. Sitting just barely outside my window, levitating, was the most horrifying image I'll ever see in my life. A creature about two feet tall, but sitting Indian style. His skin was snowy white, and you could see the outlines of his bones because he was that skinny. He wore some sort of white cloth draped sideways on his body. This is why I later named him Gandhi Monster. My young mind thought his skinny body and his white cloth looked like the real Gandhis did. This creature's head was too big for his body. His two horrible, big dark eyes were piercing my soul as he stared at me. He opened his mouth and grinned a grin at me that haunted my dreams for years. His mouth was full of long, snarly, razor sharp looking teeth dripping with blood. I don't know how a mouth could fit so many nasty teeth into it, but it did. I watched as the blood dripped from his teeth and slid down his chin and onto his white cloth diaper shorts. He raised his hands and reached for me. The fingernails were at least four inches long, gnarled looking, and sharpened to points, also dripping with blood. I wanted to scream, I wanted to run, but I was locked into place by his piercing eyes. I couldn't breathe. I felt as if my brain was being scrambled and my soul was being raped. His grin became larger and he opened his mouth wider. He kept looking at me as if he knew me, as if he had been waiting for me. He started to lift his arms and it looked as if in seconds he would actually be inside my room and not just outside my window. All traces of reason disappeared and my mind snapped. I still don't know how I did it, but I managed to tear my gaze away and leap off the bed and out my bedroom door, screaming with every inch of my soul, all in like two seconds. I could feel him pulling me. I could feel that horrible stare penetrating my back as I screamed down the hallway to my mother. Of course, when her and my father and younger brother came back, it was gone. But they knew I saw something, and they did not try to tell me it was my imagination. They comforted me and taped up all the windows in my room. They actually had to pull down all the shades and seal all sides with duct tape. I couldn't even sleep in that room for almost a year. My brother even remembers coming into the room with my parents afterwards. The Gandhi monster was a story we didn't often tell, but it always brought fear to speak of it to us and to others. My parents never spoke of it again either. As I grew up, I tried to face my fear and sleep in that room, but never did I sleep with my back to a window, never. 18 years later, I moved to Florida with my own little family and I found peace within myself, but I'll never manage to forget that creature, and I'll never sleep or sit with my back to a window, and I will never forget the one thing I heard it say to me in my mind as I was running out of my bedroom door, someday I'm coming back. Hey, I'm in my mid-teens, and I've experienced ghostly encounters. The one that really freaked me out was when me and my family moved to Scotland. For a few months, we lived in chalets. Me and my older sister shared one on our own. A few weeks after we moved in, we began to feel uncomfortable and felt as if we were being watched there, and there was also a threatening atmosphere. We told our parents, and they said it was just because we were next to the graveyard. A few weeks later, 
I was lying in my bed with the door open when a tall dark figure stood leaning over me. I didn't think at that particular moment, but it wasn't until my sister asked me if I felt somebody was in my room the previous night. We started the talk and she too felt as if somebody tall was leaning over her. I then started to sleep in my sister's room and the figure didn't return so I moved back into my own room but then again the figure returned this time. It was kneeling beside me. The next morning I told my sister and again she felt the presence of a tall man. Our dad told us that the large house next to us was where the Vikers used to stay until the house was sold. One night, my mom came in and she was holding two necklaces with crosses on it. Me and my sister aren't religious, so her mom thought it had something to do with that. So we went to bed holding the crosses. That night, it was very uncomfortable in both rooms. After that, we haven't felt the presence of the tall man. The figure that visited did so on a few occasions. Each time, it felt as though it was getting closer and more angry. When the crosses were given to us that night, the figure seemed very angry. Its face was literally pressed into mine, and it felt as if he was gritting his teeth at me. My sister also had this very uncomfortable, menacing figure who was pressed into her face. All you could do was hide under the guilt, closing your eyes really tight and hope you'd fall asleep quick. Since that last visit, nothing has returned and we've since moved then and nothing. We don't even use the crosses anymore. Other things that we didn't think of as being connected at the time now do seem connected, such as the chalet that mom and dad were in, although the same, was different in feeling. Because mom and dad's chalets always had a comfy feeling, yet ours didn't. Whether it was because there was just me and my sister alone in there, and it was our imaginations or not, we don't know. Although in mom's and dad's chalet, there was only one more person over there. From the moment we stepped into the chalet, it was always cold, even with the heaters on. Plus, there was often a bad smell wafting around. A lot like fish, rotten. This was only in my bedroom, possibly me, my sister says. Also in my room, there was a strange noise of scratching, as if someone was sketching or writing. This noise accompanied the presence of another figure, smaller in stature and of the female sex. My sister also felt the smaller presence, but not the noise. She only came once, very different, not menacing, quiet in nature, and much older. She was almost a comfort, but it's still not nice to be watched over at night by ghostly figures. It's strange, because we didn't actually see anything, yet you get so much from these feelings, the sex, age, angry, happy, etc. Plus, we get almost exactly the same feelings. But is it just our imagination? Are we certifiably insane? Are we demented? No, we definitely feel we had a visitor. Previous to this experience, my sister had not really believed in it, ghostly visits and such. But now, I think she has had a change of mind. Me, myself, I've always believed. My mom's granddad often visits, a kind presence, bringing good luck, such as when she was having problems. He visits to let us know everything will be okay. He often visited when we were babies, watching over our cots. Our dad also saw what appeared to be him. Whenever he visits, we know him by the distinct smell of putty. He used to repair windows. So really, we are used to the visits, although my sister had never experienced any until now. Unfortunately, it wasn't a happy experience, one not to forget. Happened to surf onto your website 
and I just wanted to let you know that I saw Resurrection Mary in Justice, Illinois back in October of 92. After getting off of work at 3 a.m. from a chemical plant, Witzko Corporation, near 51st and Central in Chicago, I was driving by that particular cemetery at about 3.30 a.m. on my way home from work. Driving by, but initially not thinking much of the site, as there was a nightclub with women of ill repute nearby. I saw a woman in a light blue or white palm dress standing by the trunk of what looked like a black park limousine at the front SW Cemetery driveway off Archer Avenue to the cemetery. I slowed down quite a bit to get a better look at the odd sight, but then drove off. I thought it was probably a prostitute with her John. However, looking back at my mirror, maybe a second later, the woman in the limo were gone. Let me reassure you that there was no way that I would have missed the limo driving off in that second that it took me to look back in the mirror. They weren't on the road or in the cemetery because I looked for taillights. The cemetery gates are pretty large and it would have taken a great effort and time to open both of the cemetery gates for the car to get through. I did not think much of the incident until a few days later. I was talking with some of my employees that lived in the area near the cemetery. Two of my employees mentioned that I'd probably seen the ghost called Resurrection Mary. I didn't much believe in ghosts until that incident, and I'm still somewhat skeptical, but I cannot fully explain what I saw that night. That incident is still vivid in my memory, and kind of creepy to think about it, to this day. Ever since I can remember, I've always had an interest in ghost stories. That is why I'm writing you this letter. No, I don't have a ghost in my house. A friend of mine told me about this place at least 10 months ago. I was so amazed at this story. I asked if you would take me to this place. No one really ever goes there. I guess because it's so creepy and dark looking at night. But during the day, it is okay. Nothing strange happens. Well first, before I tell you more about this place, let me tell you the story of why it is so unusual. The city is called Lake Forest, California. They call it Canyon Creek, I guess because it is nothing but canyon and wide open spaces of nothing but rocks and wildlife. The story goes back 30 years ago of a lady who was in her 40s. Nobody knew what her name was. She lived alone with her two great dating dogs. She was very rich and owned all of the canyon, which is like miles and miles of land. This lady never married and had no children. It was just her dogs and herself. She lived in this trailer park home, and it was not a pretty house by any stretch of the imagination. Well, about six years later, the story goes that a police officer got a call about the lady and her dogs. The officer went to the lady's home and knocked at the door, and no one answered. The officer ended up breaking down the door, and what he found next was horrifying. It is said that the officer found the lady dead. Nothing was left but her decaying body and her bones were visible. Worst of all, laying right next to her were her dogs. They had both died as well. Now, on to the paranormal part. People who have never been to this place don't know what to expect if they come into this place. It's unpredictable. Sometimes, when you go back to the area where she passed, you'll notice paranormal phenomena. Other times, you won't. A man was driving alone on the canyon by himself one night, and the story goes that he saw the presence of the lady standing at the side of the road with her two dogs. The man did not stop at all to give the lady a ride. He just kept going. This other story was told by my friend. My friend told me that his ex-girlfriend and her boyfriend went up there one night to check it out. 
They stopped where the lady's house was. They were only there about 15 minutes away, when they were just talking and listening to music. Then, all of a sudden, they heard a knock on the side door of the driver's seat. They both turned to look, and they saw the lady standing there, knocking on the window. She was dressed in all white and covered in blood. They also saw the dogs nearby as well, far off into the distance, appearing as silhouettes. They sat there in shock for three minutes, horrified by what they just saw. For some reason, the lady was still knocking at the driver's side of the window, but in reality, it was really not that long. They both said that she must have been there about 40 seconds. After that, my friend said they never returned back there. That was not the only story that happened to anyone. There are far more. What I would like to know is who is this lady and why is she doing this? There is something more to why she has to haunt people who have done nothing to her. Maybe it is because she does not want anyone on her land that she loves so much. What could it be? Here's my email address. If you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. I would like at least some kind of feedback on this story. Please, I beg you. I'm so confused and I'm scared. Please let me know what is going on. I find this intriguing. I never shared this story before, but this seems like the right place to do it. When I was born, my parents rented a portion of a three-family house. The house was huge and previously owned by an old German woman. Apparently, the house belonged to the same family since the early 1700s when it was built. After the old German lady died there, there was no one left in the family to take on ownership of the house. Someone new took the house over and rented it out to three other families. As soon as we moved in, my parents had odd things happening on a daily basis. The TV and all of the lights in the house would constantly turn on in the middle of the night. One night, my dad had some friends over to watch a football game and all of the power in the house kept going on and off. His friends were so freaked out that they left. What bothered my mom the most was that all the rooms in the house stayed warm, except for mine. My room was always like ice, and being a newborn, my mother was concerned. She would turn the heat way up, and still my room stayed cold. One night, she heard a woman's voice coming from my room. As she neared, she could hear an old lady singing a lullaby. When she opened the door, the rocking chair was swaying back and forth and my room was warm. After this occurrence, my room remained warm. This became an ongoing thing in the house. The rocking chair would constantly rock, no matter where in the house my mom moved it to, and oftentimes, she would hear a soft voice coming from my room. The lights continued to go on frequently in the middle of the night. As I got a little older, into the toddler years, I can still remember certain things happening. My parents found it odd that I am able to remember things so clearly. I can describe my bedroom in distinct detail as well as the other rooms in the house. I only lived there from newborn to two and a half years. One night, I woke up and felt absolutely terrified. I remember climbing out of my crib onto the little table and chair set and stepped onto the floor and dodged from my parents' room. As soon as I climbed into bed with my mom and dad, I heard my aunt, who was asleep on the couch, screaming. My mom woke up and ran into the living room to see what all the fuss was about. My aunt kept crying, I saw her, I saw her, over there by the lamp. Apparently, my aunt says that she saw the old lady standing at the foot of the couch by the lamp. When my mom reached over to turn the lamp on, she disappeared. All of my parents' old friends remember the house, and everyone has a story of something that they experienced there. We know that the old lady died in the house, probably in the section where we lived. At first I think she was angered that the house no longer belonged to anyone in her family. She was harmless, and just wanted to make her presence known. 
We only lasted there for two and a half years. Sometimes we drive by the house and contemplate stopping in to see how the current owners are making out, but I never had the courage to go back. Here's some spooky experiences that I remember from my childhood. The first one didn't happen to me. It's something that my mother told me about. Her mother died in 1959. A few years later, she remembers waking up in the middle of the night and hearing her mother calling her name. This always gave me the chills, especially if I thought about it at night. When I was maybe six or seven, something happened that scared the living daylights out of me. I can still picture it in my mind. A short time after I went to bed, I was lying there awake and I looked up at my bedroom door, which was closed. There was a window across the room from the door. The curtains were open and the moonlight was shining through the window, making a square of light on the door. In the middle of the square of light, I saw the shadow of a hand slowly moving back and forth. I was so scared that all I could do was just stare at it. I was trying to scream, but no sound would come out. Finally, I managed to get my voice to work and I yelled as loud as I could, Mom! My mother came running in and I told her what I saw. I don't remember if she saw the shadow too. Probably not. She didn't see anything outside and she shut the curtains. Now, there were no trees right outside my window that were close enough that they would make a shadow. Not to mention that this did not look like a tree branch. It was definitely the distinct shape of a human hand. Looking back on this as an adult, I realized that this was most likely not anything supernatural at all, but someone actually trying to break into our house, which, quite frankly, is more scarier than a mere ghost. When I started screaming, the person heard me and ran away. Shortly after the previous incident, I asked my parents if I could move into the room across from that one. Gee, I wonder why. My new room had a little trap door in the closet, leading to an attic of sorts. My parents never used it for storage, as it was too hard to go up there through the trap door, and it most likely wasn't even high enough to walk upright in. When I was about 10 or 11, my best friend and I were playing in my room, and we noticed that the trap door was open about an inch or so. We slid it closed. Every once in a while, I'd look up there and find that it was open again. I'd keep sliding it closed, and then a few days later, it would be open. My friend and I naturally assumed that we had a ghost in the attic. I really don't remember if I actually heard anything up there or not. Around the same time, the same friend would occasionally spend a night with me. Several times, we'd be lying in bed and hear the sound of a newspaper or some sort of paper being crumpled up in the living room when we knew no one else was up. We called this the newspaper ghost. Another time, I think I was about seven, I was riding my bike around in circles in the street. This was in a housing development where there was very little traffic. My aunt, uncle and cousins were visiting, and I recall looking at the bathroom window on the side of our house and seeing my aunt's face looking out the window. Later, I mentioned it to my aunt, and she said she hadn't been looking out the bathroom window, and neither had anyone else. Now, I realize that this could have easily been a reflection of something in the window, but at the same time, it seemed pretty spooky to me. In the summer of 69, I was about 13. We had some relatives staying at our house for about a week. One evening, after everyone had gone to bed, I was still awake. As a child, it always took me a long time to get to sleep. I was always too wound up, I guess. Anyway, all of a sudden, there was this loud crash that came from my closet, like something metal or aluminum falling on the untiled floor. The thing that came to mind was a metal vacuum cleaner hose. There was no vacuum cleaner or any other large metal object in my closet that could have fallen and made such a noise, and even if there was, what would have made it fall off the shelf? I was too scared to get up and look in my closet 
or go and ask anyone if they'd heard it. Now, this was a small three-bedroom house in Levittown, Pennsylvania. If anyone is familiar with the houses, if a loud noise occurs in any part of the house, it would be impossible not to hear it all over the house. The next morning, I asked my parents, aunt and uncle and cousins, if they heard a loud crash in the night, and no one else had heard it. And by the way, I looked in my closet in the morning, and nothing was out of place. This has always puzzled me. Here are a few things that have happened in the last few years, in the house I live in now. Nothing blatantly scary, just weird. I thought I'd share them just for the fun of it. One night, I was asleep, and all of a sudden, I screamed and woke myself up. My husband came running in, and I couldn't for the life of me remember what I'd dreamed that had scared me. But I had a vague memory of looking beside the bed, and seeing something in the form of a human being, made up of little points of light. There have been a few occasions where I've woken up in the middle of the night, and heard a kind of electrical humming that sounds like it's coming from our bedroom closet. My husband said he could hear it too. I could never figure out what's causing it. It sounds like it could be the refrigerator running, except that the kitchen is not right next to the bedroom. And if it was the fridge, wouldn't I hear the noise every night, since obviously the fridge runs all the time? I haven't heard it in over a year. Just as well, it gives me the willies. I want to say that I can sympathize with your situation, although other than apparitions, my experience varies greatly from yours. I do want to share what happened to me with you, but I do want to warn you ahead of time. I used to be a reporter, so I can get lengthy. My first experience happened when I was a child. I was seven years old and lived a completely normal life. My parents didn't smoke dope or dabble in the occult, so I really had no knowledge of ghosts, other than the traditional Halloween experiences every child encounters. When I turned seven, my family moved from Metro Memphis, Tennessee to rural Independence, Mississippi. We moved into a house that my father renovated. Rather than trying to draw a diagram that may get scrambled and transmit, I'll try to describe the layout of the rooms involved. The way the home was originally laid out you walked in the front door into the living room. To the left was the kitchen, open without walls to the living room. To the right was a bedroom door. Straight ahead was a hallway leading to other bedrooms, laundry room, and bathroom. After my father was finished, the front door was added onto a new wing of the house. The living room was enclosed into a bedroom. The bedroom now directly led out into the hall, which now led to the kitchen also, and had a new doorway to the bedroom that previously opened up to the living room. Is that confusing enough? We moved into the house, and I immediately was terrified of my sister's bedroom, the one that had previously opened up into the old living room. I just felt that something was there, and it was watching me. I felt like it wanted to possess me or something stronger than a mere presence. Also, I never found out why, but hers was the only room with security bars on the window. No other family member noticed anything strange in the house. I ended up in the new bedroom, and sometimes at night, I'd hear noises. Being so small, I don't remember exactly what they were, but frequently, I'd see an incandescent, glowing form in the shape of a human walking across my room. What made me know that it had to be a previous occupant of the home was that it would walk from the bedroom I was so scared of through my room into the kitchen, the way the house used to be laid out. Once when my grandmother came to visit, my parents forced me to sleep in my sister's bedroom. I was so terrified, but I finally went to sleep. When I woke up, I saw what appeared to be an ectoplasm swirling above my head. I spent most of my childhood years terrified of sleeping. Being a middle child of an older sister and a younger brother, I'd hide my prized possessions jewelry, money, whatever I thought I didn't want them to get a hold of. Almost every time I hide something, it would disappear and reappear later in a different location. Thinking my siblings had discovered my hiding place, I'd find a new one, each time to have them disappear and reappear once again. 
the really strange part came later. We sold the house when I was 13 to another girl's family I went to school with. After she'd move in, I'd asked her one day if she noticed anything weird in the house, and she said no, but her sister refused to go into the bedroom that scared me. Sister's explanation was that someone was watching her, and she was a middle child also. I guess there must have been some connection to middle children. I said something years later about the house being haunted in front of my aunt. She said she'd always had a feeling that something was wrong with the house. I'd appreciate your input as to what you think my experience meant. I had a person tell me one time I was a demon that wanted me, but I'm not even sure. While I lived there, although I was the only family member that had strange experiences inside the house, I wasn't the only one who had strange experiences in the area. In the fall, between the hours of 10pm and 12am, my mother would see balls of light floating in the field and wooded areas across the road from my house. She would always ask me to come look, but I had enough terror inside the house, and as far as I was concerned, the woods were my only safe haven while at home. So I never looked and never witnessed the lights myself, but both my sister and my mom did. When I was 19, I started dating this guy who was friends with a neighbor from the house I'd lived in. Basically, he lived catty corner from me, with their house backing up to the woods mine faced. My new boyfriend asked me if I ever saw anything strange in the woods. I said no. He told me that his neighbor's kid, who was a friend of his, told him that he'd seen balls of lights in the woods. I then told my boyfriend about my mother and sister's experiences. So apparently, it wasn't just restricted to my family. Another experience I had was when I was in my early 20s, when my grandfather passed away. We'd always loved each other very much, but didn't have a close relationship because of my grandmother, whom I didn't get along with. I was present when he passed away, and was devastated. Three months passed, enough time to allow me to grieve and get on with my life. I was asleep one night, and awoke to find my grandfather sitting on the side of my bed. He told me not to be scared, that he had a message for me. He told me I needed to get my life straight, or I was headed for trouble. I remember he held my hand, and told me that he was going to tell me what heaven is like, but I'm not allowed to remember what he told me. I remember him being present for a while longer, but can't remember a word he said. Now that I'm an adult, and have some time and distance between me, and these experience I had as a child, I'd like to try to discover what these experience meant or why I was chosen to have this one. Do you have any suggestions? Also, even now, I can drive by a place or house and tell that it's haunted. Does that mean that I'm psychic or paranormally gifted? Usually I just get kind of jumpy and frightened, but one night I was out repossessing vehicles, something I did part time for a while, and my partner pulled up to this house. I was so terrified of that house that I told him he better turn around immediately or I was getting out of the vehicle and running. Please help me to understand what is going on with me. I'm finally getting to a point I accept it and want to understand it rather than how I've been so terrified in the past that I didn't even want to talk about it. In 1983, when I was 18 years old, I was severely ill. I woke up one morning and my face was badly swollen. My mother took me to the emergency room. I was placed in the ICU the next day as I went unconscious. It would take a team of doctors over a week to finally diagnose me. It was a rare disease. There was only two case histories. They both died from it years before. That's why my doctors had no idea what it was. It was from a sinus infection that had backed up behind my brain. From this, I developed a brain abscess. The night before they would make the decision if I needed brain surgery to remove the abscess, I was lying in my hospital bed, praying that the abscess would have shrunk a little. I felt someone standing beside my bed. I was sure it was a nurse, as it was very late, too late for visitors. When I turned to talk, it wasn't a nurse at all. It was my grandfather, 
who died one year earlier. At that moment, I wasn't afraid. He said to me, you'll be fine. When I asked if you were sure, he then replied, do you doubt me? I replied, no. He then said, everything will be fine. You will be all right. This part has puzzled me ever since he told me. He said, take care of your mother. This was my mother's father. And he simply turned around and walked out of the room. The nurses came in and I was wondering what happened to my grandfather. They didn't say anybody walked into the room and they told me to calm down. I swear I knew what I saw. I knew it was my grandfather. But the whole situation was just weird and it gets weirder. I thought he meant that I would do fine through the surgery. My grandfather. Now here's the kicker, he had brain surgery about 7 years before his own death. Even crazier, the next morning I had an x-ray and they came to tell me that my abscess was completely gone. First of all, I have no idea what happened, even the doctors were confused. They wanted to take even more x-rays and I obliged and they confirmed no abscess whatsoever. As for my grandfather talking about my mother. I had no idea why he was mentioning her. She was pretty healthy at the time, but it makes sense now. Recently, she has been diagnosed with MS, diabetes, and in September, she had heart failure. In November, she almost died and had triple bypass surgery. Through the years, my family has had many encounters with the spirit world, but this was the most wonderful one. My house is haunted by something, someone. It's never really bothered me. It's nothing big, doors opening, radio turning on and off by itself, footsteps, floorboards quake, noises in the attic, but as I said, it never really bothered me until about four months ago. I always wake up in the middle of the night, but one night, I woke up around 2.30 a.m. to a tight feeling in my chest. It wasn't so much tight as it was heavy like a weight or something, but it wasn't all that. After a while, I couldn't get back to sleep, so I tried to put on my TV, only to find I couldn't move. When I tried to sit up from a glass of water, the weight on my chest got heavier. It was like someone was sitting on me, like a child, not moving, just a weight. I tried to arch my back, and the weight got heavier, and I couldn't breathe. I really started to panic and sweat. I was extremely scared at this point. I started to cry a little because I didn't know what to do. Then, all of a sudden, I felt a slight pinching on my right elbow and that's all I can remember. I woke up the next morning feeling fine, just as I did the day before, although I had a red mark where I felt the pinch. I don't understand why on earth the ghost in my house will be sitting on me. Nothing has occurred since the normal phenomena and an extra thing has started now. In the bathroom, we have a pulley light switch and a hanging mobile, and when you're in the shower, the light switch will start to swing, followed by the mobile, when there is no breeze whatsoever. I know it sounds stupid, but I swear it really happened. Thank you for your time. My life has been relatively free of paranormal occurrences, although one morning at age eight, I experienced the much dreaded sleep paralysis. There is, however, one other story worth mentioning. In 1991, I was a 20 year old army corporal stationed in Germany. By this time, I was a graduate of French commando school and was in charge of my own cavalry recon squad, a jeep with two other guys. One chilly winter night, my unit was deployed somewhere in southwestern Germany in the wilderness during field exercises, we were literally in the middle of nowhere. Me and my crew spent half the night slinking through the woods doing the usual cavalry style patrols. At around 2 a.m., we were told to stop the jeep and set up a listening post in a clump of trees. I decided to be the first watch of the night while the other two guys got some sleep. After about 30 minutes of staring into black nothingness, I decided to get up and walk around a bit. With a weapon in hand and a radio on my back, 
I began to prowl around the area. Yes, it was unbelievably dark, but at least this was keeping me occupied. Suddenly, a very average night turned into a counter I will never forget. After several minutes of walking, I suddenly realized how quiet the night was, not a sound to be heard from, an animal, or even an insect. Thinking this was a bit strange, I walked a few more paces before realizing I was right in the middle of a very old deserted village. I pulled out my night vision goggles and noticed that the village consisted of about seven or eight old stone houses. Only the walls remained as the old thatched roofs were long gone. Suddenly, I felt this dark, evil presence like a weight on my shoulders. I knew I was being watched by someone or something and I knew that I was not welcome in this place. I slowly turned around and began walking back the way I came, with every footstep in the tall dry grass sounding like a firecracker. It was very slow and painful walking out of this place. I consider myself a rational person, but was truly scared as I made the long walk back to the jeep. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the night inside the jeep. As you read the stories on the site, it may be hard to appreciate the feelings others have felt if they try to tell their tales. I promise you, the fear and success we have felt during these tales are the most important part of the story. Hi, my name is Brooke. I work at an assisted living facility in Pennsylvania. I worked the 11 7 shift. So of course, there are a lot of stories about the place already, but besides that, I was wondering if the experiences I've had, as insignificant as they may seem or be, could be the activities of ghosts, or just my mind. Of course, I'm not the only one that claims to have seen things, but who knows. For instance, I'll just be walking around the building, and I constantly think that I see things, like out of the corner of my eye. It's not a definite thing. It's just a shape. It's either black or white. A lady I work with always sees black when she sees things out of the corner of her eye. As for me, I always see white. The forms are white, that is. Is there a reason she sees black and I see white? And today, for instance, I was walking and I was sure there was someone behind me. When I semi turned around, out of the corner of my eye, I swore there was a figure for a split second but it was gone. It scared me to death, actually. That is why I'm writing to you today, because today, that was the closest a form or figure has ever been. No one has ever died in this facility that I work in, but they have died in the hospital. The building has only been open for four years, maybe five. I was just wondering if these could be ghosts or just my eyes playing tricks on me. A lot of the residents say that they see a woman in white in their room or sitting on their bed. I don't know how to explain or take that either, but I appreciate your reading. Thanks for listening as well. The story I'm about to tell you happened to me directly and has forever changed my view on the supernatural. I would like to state for the record that I've always been a skeptical person who never believed in anything that couldn't be proven. Before my experience, I didn't believe in ghosts and never given the topic a second thought. Since that period of time, it has always been on my mind frequently. This is my story. The event in question occurred several years ago at my grandparents' house. I was 19. I'd been out with my friends and returned home around 2 a.m. I retired to my bedroom on the second floor of the house and got into bed. I'd been lying there for two or three minutes, reflecting on the events of the evening, when suddenly, I heard the muffling screaming of a woman coming from the basement. Almost immediately, the screaming began to slowly ascend the stairs and within a minute had reached the first floor. It continued to ascend the stairs and 30 seconds later had reached the second floor and it was right outside of my room. The screaming was very loud and was clearly that of a woman. My bedroom door was closed and I could therefore see nothing. The screaming continued outside of my room for approximately one minute and then slowly began to descend the stairs into the basement. When it reached the basement, 
The screaming ceased, and the house was silent. That is the end of my story. I feel that in order for me to give an objective account of this occurrence, it is important that I detail my own actions and opinions. When I first heard the noise, I recognized that it was coming from the basement, and although it sounded like a woman screaming, I immediately disregarded this as being ridiculous. I started to try and rationalize what I was hearing. However, my analysis ended rather abruptly when I realized that the noise was getting closer. By the time I reached the first floor, it had become quite loud, and being unable to think of any rational explanation for such a noise, I became convinced that the ghost of a woman was ascending the stairs of my grandparents' house. I became completely terrified and quickly sat up in bed, both so that I could hear better and so that I could run, if necessary. When I reached the second floor and was outside my room, every hair in my body was standing on end and my hands were literally shaking with fear. I was too scared to move and for that reason remained stationary until I returned to the basement and the noise subsided. I stayed where I was for several minutes, waiting for the noise to return. When it didn't, I got up, turned on my light, and sat back down on my bed. Being wide awake and in no mood to sleep, I spent the next couple of hours lying in my bed, listening and thinking about what had happened. Eventually I fell asleep, and the next morning, when I woke up, my light was still on, and I was completely convinced that I had heard a ghost. I spent the entire day gathering information and trying to figure out what I had heard. The only other people in the house were my grandparents. My grandmother is a sound sleeper, and my grandfather is hard of hearing. They heard nothing. They bought the house in 1966 and sold it in 2000. During that time, they never heard anything that even remotely resembles what I described. My mother lived in the house for several years in her late teens and never heard anything either. I myself lived in the house on and off for years and never heard anything before and have not heard anything since. I consider that maybe the pipes or something else in the house made the noise, although I don't think any pipe on earth could have made the noise I heard. I dismiss this theory anyways, because if the house did make odd noises, someone would have heard them in the past 30 years. I also dismiss the wind because I have spent many windy nights in the house and heard absolutely nothing. In the end, I came to the conclusion that there was no earthly explanation for what I heard and that what I experienced must have been supernatural. It sounds crazy saying that, but I know what I heard. I will never forget it. I'm sure it was a ghost. In conclusion, I would just like to state that all of my friends think I was asleep and that the whole thing was a dream. I would like to touch on this briefly. The first thing I would like to say is that I know I was not asleep. Here's my case. I'd been in bed for two or three minutes, less than five for sure, and was laying on my back thinking. I've always had a difficult time falling asleep. It usually takes me 20 to 30 minutes, and I've never been able to sleep on my back. At the time, I was making no attempt to sleep, but was lying there, thinking. Secondly, no matter how real a dream seems, you always wake up afterwards, and that's how I know you were dreaming. I don't think it's possible to remember a dream without waking up and realize you are dreaming. If it is, it's never happened to me. If it had been a dream, I would have woken up and said, wow, that one was weird. That never happened. I was awake. Thirdly, I turned the light on after the occurrence and it was still on when I woke up in the morning. I know for a fact that I was awake. That is my story and I swear to you that every word of it is the truth. I don't know if you will believe me, no one else will, but I swear, it's the truth. I am 17 years old. In the past 7 years, I'd live in 3 different houses and every one of them had a ghost. The first one we lived in was from 94 to 96. The occurrence that spooked me there happened in my parents' room. A week before anything weird happened, a bunch of knickknacks fell off my mother's headboard. So, she put it back and pushed it away from the edge. On Easter morning of 95, I was with my brother, sister, and dad, watching TV in the living room. About 20 feet away from my parents' bedroom door, I heard a bang, and my mom came running out of her room. She really wanted to know who was pounding. Apparently, when I heard the bang, all the stuff had fallen off her headboard and kind of flew off this time. Not only that, but this Oreo tin can she had looked like it had been stepped on. 
After that, our next door neighbor told us that she had seen this old man that lived here before us in the backyard on the day he died in the hospital. Now, the living room looked into a hallway. In the hallway, you could see into my brother's room and my parents was right next door. The living room had a clear view of my parents' room. One night, my dad fell asleep in the living room. He was sleeping, facing the hallway. He suddenly woke up and looked into his room. He saw this cloud of smoke billowing in the hallway, moving towards his room. He jumped up and yelled fire. When he yelled, my brother woke up and saw this. The cloud settled in the hallway and disappeared. I know this was not any kind of imagination because my brother and my dad are very logical and analytical people and they both witnessed this. In the next house, it was never anything really. The only occurrence that happened was the night one of our cats died. The cat house was in the corner of my room and I had a nightlight next to the cat house. I looked up to the top cat house and I saw the shadow of our dead cat. The cat loved sleeping on the top every night and this night was no exception. The third house is the house we have lived in for the past three years. I believe it all started with the woman. My dad wakes up early in the morning to get ready for work. When this happened, my mom would occasionally fall asleep in the living room. There is a door next to the entryway that leads into the back hallway where all the rooms are. The first room is my brother's, the second is my parents, then he turned, and then comes my sister's room, and lastly, mine. Now, on this morning, my dad woke me up and looked over. He saw the back of a woman and assumed it was my mom. He got up and went out into the living room and saw my mom sleeping on the couch. He went back to his room and no one was there. After that, I had an experience with a man. It was about four in the morning and I was suddenly woken up by the feeling of a large man tapping my foot. I looked up and no one was there. I have this ticker stuffed animal that I got for my birthday from my sister. At the time of my next story, my large dog slept in my room with me. She would sleep up against the door so I couldn't sleepwalk and open it without waking up. I woke up one morning and my ticker was nowhere so I figured it rolled under the bed. I opened my door and it was laying outside of my door. About a year ago, my mom started sleeping out in the living room for health reasons. The wall our couch leans against is connected to my brother's room. We had a family friend staying in there while my brother was in boot camp. One morning, my mom woke up about 7 a.m. She heard a knocking on the wall between the living room and my brother's room. She thought it was just her friend when it moved to the wall behind her computer about 10 feet away. This is an inside wall and there's no way there could be any knocking. It then moved to the ceiling. She said it sounded like someone knocking. A couple nights later, I heard her banging in my parents' room. Their bathroom is across the hall from my brother's room. My bathroom is across from my sister's room, and the bathtub stalls are back to back. When I heard the banging, it sounded like it was coming from the wall where the shower head is, and they have a lot of shelves over there, so it would be impossible to bang as clearly as I heard. A couple of hours later, I heard shuffling footsteps in the hall coming from the bathroom. On two occasions, my dad has seen a streaking white figure that appears to be a cat, but we are not positive. We have also seen shadow people walking in the side yard through our shutters. Not long ago, our next door neighbor told us that the houses in our neighborhood was built on Indian burial ground. We are not sure if this has anything to do with all this. The house we live in now appears to be the most haunted so far. I'm 17 years old and I used to live in an old house made in 1921 in Haverhill, Massachusetts that I know is haunted. One day, when I was 10, I was in my upstairs bedroom with my two sisters coloring. I think that's when it started. We were home alone when we heard the closet at the end of the stairs slide open. Then we heard it slide back. The sliding doors of the closet always made a loud rumbling noise when it was open. When we heard it that day, we didn't get scared at first because we thought my mom had gotten home from work, so we ran downstairs to greet her to find that nobody was home. We looked around and then looked outside to see if the car was in the driveway, but we were alone. 
or so we thought. We ran back upstairs to our room and grabbed shoes and hangers for the so-called protection. Then all of a sudden, we heard footsteps racing up the stairs, then back down. We never saw anything actually reach the top of the stairs, but they ran up and down repeatedly about 10 times, then it stopped. We were so scared, we just sat there crying, waiting to hear more, but nothing else happened. Then, when I was 15, I was taking care of a dog, and when I brought it to the foot of the stairs, he froze and just stared at the top. I didn't think much about it, so I picked him up and brought him up the stairs to my room and closed the door. The dog then began crying, and it seemed to be getting nervous and uneasy, and he started scratching at the door. When I opened the door to let him out, he ran down the steps so fast that by the time I got out the door, he was gone. After that, many more things started to happen. I woke one morning to hear something or someone dragging themselves in the rug next to my bed. I was so frozen with fear that I didn't even look to see what it was. The cabinets in our kitchen would open and slam shut by themselves. I could also hear the silverware jiggling and slamming inside the drawers. There are even moments where the computer keyboard would also type by itself. I've also had my foot slapped and have felt something sit on me while I was laying in my bed. There are also too many noises and weird things to explain and also creepy dreams. So I'm glad to be out of that house. Well, I would like to know if the house is some kind of history or if anybody died there. Last year, after we moved out of the house, our cousins were sleeping over and we were talking about our old house. One of my cousins, who slept over our house a lot, asked why our dad always walked up to our room and why he did it over and over without ever coming into our room. We told him about the day we heard the racing footsteps running up the stairs and she got so freaked out. My other cousin also said she hated sleeping in our room because she always heard those same footsteps coming up the stairs but never making it to the top before it ran back down again. Now in our present house in Orlando, Florida, weird things have suddenly begun to happen. Noises, shadowy figures, and also short wide figures have appeared. I always seem to see something in the corner of my eye. When I turn my head to look, there is nothing there. And my sister felt somebody whistle and blow in her ear. Well, that's all I have for you for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for reading. Hello, my name is Nikki and I'm 14 years old. Unfortunately, I don't remember the details to my story very well because it happened when I was about 4 or 5 years old. But anyway, my family lived in a large house that was actually quite old. One night, I was asleep in my bedroom upstairs and I awoke in the middle of the night. I went straight across the hall to my brother's room and asked him to come downstairs with me because I was scared and wanted to sleep with mom and dad. He asked me why I was so scared and I said I didn't know. So he came down with me, we started down the stairs, and I froze at the sight of what I saw. There was a little boy at the end of the stairs. Now, this could have been my younger brother, but my brother was just a few months old. This little boy had brown hair and was just sitting at the bottom of the stairs. I wasn't scared, so we kept walking. We got into my parents' room and I was getting ready to climb in their bed, and all the lights in the house came on at once. My dad woke up and checked the circuit breaker, but nothing was wrong, so he went through the house and shut off all the lights. Well, the next night, I saw the same little boy, and the same thing happened again. This activity continued for a few more days, and my parents checked out some information by the guy that lived there before. He said a little boy around the age of five died because he was very sick. He died in the middle of the night in his sleep, and a few hours before he went to sleep, he turned all the lights in the house on because he was afraid of the dark. I have never seen anything since, even though I have moved several times. I always somehow sense when there is an unknown presence around them, but I will always remember that night. I have since been afraid of the dark, though I hate to admit it, but it is not like anyone is going to criticize me for it. Honestly, never, ever in my life, ever thought I'd be writing to you. 
My name is Jackie, and I am 19 years old. I live in Saskatchewan, Canada. I found out about your website on the radio. I was listening on Halloween, and they said that this was the coolest website to go on. I started reading the stories in my spare time. Right now, I'm about halfway done the second page. I haven't been reading much for about two weeks. Well, anyway, here goes my story, and I speak nothing but the truth. Last night, I was hanging out with my friend at her house, and my boyfriend called and said Grandma was feeling very sick, and that my dad and mom wanted me to spend the night there in case anything happened. So I called my grandma, and she told me that she was going to bed, and that I didn't need to rush over. She said she would leave the door unlocked, and that I could come in at any time. I got to her place about 12 a.m., and I stayed up until 1.30 a.m. Then I went to bed in the room across the hall from her. It helped me that I could hear her breathing, because then I knew she was okay. I woke up in the morning, and my arm was numb because I had been lying on it. I woke up and started to shake it out. I opened my eyes and looked up. The blind was almost shut, but I could see out the last two inches that it was getting bright out. Then I got a weird feeling, because I couldn't hear my grandma at all. I also couldn't hear her up. I was just thinking, I should roll over and look towards the door in the clock and see what time it was and get up and check on her. Just as I was about to roll over, and by this time, I was very awake, a cat jumped up on my bed. I did not see it. I was facing the window with my blankets over my head. It jumped up just behind my knees. My grandma does not have a cat. I knew right away that it was slippers, or as my grandma likes to say, good old slips. Slippers died about 15 years ago. Well, anyway, she jumped up on the bed and walked up to my shoulder and laid down on my upper arm. I totally felt that. I was thinking, no way, this is not happening to me. I was totally paralyzed. I couldn't open up my eyes or even wiggle my fingers. Then there was a very loud, sort of rushing noise in my ears. It was like a cross between a blank TV station and the furnace times a hundred. I was not paralyzed with fear because up until now, I wasn't scared. Then when I couldn't move, I felt totally terrified. I thought maybe something had happened to my grandma in the night and this was a way of saying goodbye or something. Then I totally forgot about the cat and I thought that I really wanted to get up and check on my grandma, but the cat and noise were still there and I still couldn't move. When I couldn't move, I was thinking about your website and I totally understood how terrified people can be when this happens. I was just trying to think if there could be a rational explanation for why I couldn't move. I know that I was not so scared that I couldn't move. I just couldn't move. Then the noise went away, and the cat was suddenly gone, and I could move again. I quickly curled up in a ball and laid there for a few minutes until I was sure that whatever it was, was gone. I did not want to see a shadowy figure in the room. Then I quickly flew out of bed and into the hall. By this time, I heard a radio was on, so I knew that my grandma was up. I was standing in the hall, and I realized I had no pants on, so I turned around quickly and flipped on the light. I put my pants on and ran into the kitchen. I sure scared my grandma because it was 8 a.m. and I didn't have work until 11. As soon as I got into the kitchen, the phone rang. My grandma could tell something was bothering me. So she rushed my aunt off the phone. I told her everything, and she believed me. And then she started to tease me a bit and say Kitty gonna get you, over and over. But she told me she has never seen or felt slippers, but she has heard my dog Flanagan scratching at the door and breathing. He has been dead for about a year. At 9.30, I drove my grandma to my aunt's house. I went in, and my aunt said that it looked like I was sick too. I told her that slippers had come to visit me, and she thought this was so cool. She told me about all the stories of how her cats had died and came to visit her. She told me that she feels cats come off the bed and purr in her ear, and there is no one there. And she also told me that she was downstairs, and she looked at the steps and saw one of her dead cats sitting there, and another one of her dead cats ran up past it. She told me that she had a cat that would drag stuff around the house and leave it in weird places. After it died, she started finding stuff in weird places, like mitts on the steps and shoes in the living room. 
just like the cat did when it was alive. Then she asked my grandma to remember about how for a long time, after the dog Sandy died, they could hear his nails tapping up and down the hall floor. Once, they both heard it at the same time. My aunt felt bad for me that my experience was so spooky. She said she has never been able to move. She said that poor old Slips must have felt really bad that she scared me. She also said that I must have scared the cat, and that it was too bad that we couldn't have comforted each other like she does with her cats. I went to work and told my friends. They all believed me. Two of them started telling me super weird stuff that happened to them. One girl never told anyone in her life what happened to her because she was scared that no one would believe her. She decided to tell me because it was obvious I would understand. I will have to get them to write to you. One girl even has a book about everything that happened to her. Thanks so much for reading this. I know you will understand. Writing to you was the first thing I thought of when it happened. Maybe reading your stories heightened my sense of awareness or something. It did not heighten my imagination. Thanks again. I live in London, Ontario, Canada. I moved into a complex near the beginning of September with a very, very tiny history altogether. The complex itself is fairly new, and as far as I've been able to find out, only has had one death, and the house it happened in has no report of any mysterious incidents. With my stay at Unit 40, I've experienced a couple of things that seem quite odd, and I'm not alone. My mom, has experienced a few things as well. All that has seemed to happen seemed to be directed towards the entire family, where in contrast to your story, the spirits seem to be focused on you. The things that have happened have not been harmful or even seemingly of evil intentions. If there is a spirit at all, it seems to only want to be recognized as being there. I picked up the feeling of someone being out of place, first I think. It all started with the basement door. Someone will close it tightly and go upstairs or to another part of the house. But whenever someone returned to the door, it would be open only an inch and a half every time. At the top of the stairs, on the upper floor of the house, there is some sort of a wall that is only about four feet in height. Whenever standing there, I would get the odd feeling as if I was standing in someone else's place. Sometimes to the point of feeling nauseous or overwhelmed with an intense throbbing in my muscles, when informing my mom that I felt someone or something was also with us, she sort of shrugged it off. But it wasn't until she told me that the reason for the door opening was that people weren't closing it tightly, that the door opening stopped completely. After that, things that weren't so easily put off started happening. One night, I went downstairs to do the laundry. By our washer and dryer, we have two sinks. One, the closet to the washer is always filthy. The one next to it is spotless, and out of habit, I took a glance into the sink to make sure nothing was there, and of course, nothing was. Well, before I could even finish putting the laundry on, my dad came to the door. My mom and dad are not divorced, just separated. He stayed for no longer than 30 minutes, seeing as though the other member of the family besides my mother and I, my brother, 10 years old, 11 in March, was not there. When he left, I went back down to finish the laundry, taking another glance in the sink. I saw, which quite frankly terrified me, a tiny footprint pressed into the dirt. Seeing as no one beside me had been in the basement in the brief 30 minutes I was away, I got quite scared. Trying to think of all the things logically, I kept coming to the question, why? It was most definitely a footprint, slightly smaller than my brother's. The footprint is still in the sink. We're keeping it until we can take a photograph of it. And even if a little kid did it, and I just didn't notice it before, with the bad light and all, why the sink? There are no windows in the basement, and the only way to get to the basement is through the house. And with 250 pound rotties, not too many little kids are happy about going through our house. Another thing that bothered me was that it was only one foot. If a little kid did it, how did it get into the sink in the first place? The edge of the sink comes up to my little brother's neck. Another happening was my mom experienced something. She was upstairs sleeping, and I was sleeping on the futon in the living room. The next morning, my mom came downstairs and complained about not being able to sleep last night due to the fire alarm repeatedly going off. She said it happened twice. The first time she stayed in the bed, the second, she went downstairs to investigate, and nothing happened. 
The latest thing happening was involving my mother as well. I was down in the living room once again, and she was upstairs half asleep. She informed me the following day that the night had been too stressful to her due to hearing what she thought was me going up and down the stairs all night. She told me she was about to call out to me, seeing as if I was coming to bed, when she heard me stop outside her door, which was only open slightly and act as if I was trying to hear what was going on in the bedroom. I sleep in the living room because I cannot fall asleep in my mother's room. I don't sleep in my room because the cats have it taken over. Whenever I'm in my mom's room, I hear scratching on the wall. Well, more like fingernail tapping and creaking. It's so bad and so realistic, I fear turning my head towards the sound, thinking I'll see someone standing there. With all that has happened and all the pets I own, two dogs, two cats, one rat, one parrot and fish, the only one that has responded to anything was my one cat Spooky, who is black and about six or so years old. Whenever Spooky is out and about the living room area, she becomes quite agitated. Her emotions are if there is a fly or bug pestering her. The way her back jumps and hair stands on the certain parts of her body is interesting. She growls and hisses, then jumps away from the area. Then she seems to act fine. I'm not sure if there's more to what is happening than I'm not seeing or if I'm seeing too much into everyday things. However, whenever I put off our experiences, my mind drifts back to the footprint in the sink. My mom and I get the feeling that the spirit, if one, is one of a young girl about the age of 12 or 13. When asking someone that has had a few ghostly experiences of their own, an older woman, she says nobody has had anything happen to them in Unit 40, but one time, one of the previous owners took a picture of a porcelain doll on a couch, and in the photo, the doll was glowing. The most unusual thing about this though, is that it was like brighter than the flash itself, to the point that the doll was just a blur, but the woman said that the people were just weird themselves, and not to worry about anything. My cousin, Brian and I, were extremely close for as long as I can remember. He was about 12 years older than I am. He would go camping with my family a couple times a year and play Santa for me during Christmas. I have a lot of great memories with him. In October of 92, Brian died of a drug overdose. My family suspected that he had been using drugs because he wasn't as involved with family like he had been stopped going camping and spending Christmas with us so he could play Santa. He was very into boxing and was pretty popular among people in Scranton, Pennsylvania. When he died, I took it the worst. I was in fifth grade and had to get counseling from officials at school because I cried all day and I even mentioned to people that I wanted to be with him. So my family thought I was thinking about suicide. At Brian's funeral, I never went up to his coffin. I couldn't face the fact that he was lying there dead. He loved pulling pranks, and I remember throughout the whole wake wishing he would jump up and say it was all a joke. For a while, I felt guilty of his death because I thought that if I knew him about using drugs, I would be able to talk to him and he would have ended his addiction because of me. After suspecting his drug use for a while, my family found out it was true, but they kept it from me because I looked to him as my role model and they didn't want me to hate him. My cousin Chip, Brian's older brother, got married in 97 and I was a bridesmaid. In the church, there was one section of the pews that was blocked off so the photographer had easy access for taking pictures. In the middle of the ceremony, I saw Brian sit down in the section that was blocked off for the photographer. I couldn't believe I was seeing him because, well, he was dead and had been for a while now. I kept looking at my mother to see if she noticed him but it was obvious that she didn't from the looks of concern on her face towards me. All I did was look at Brian and look at my mom and tears would stream down my face. My mom kept mouthing to me, what's wrong? Brian stayed for most of the ceremony and when it was almost over, he looked at me, smiled and left. After ceremony was over and the bridal party had ended, I ran out of the church hysterical crying, but I did so that no one noticed. I'm sure people assumed I was crying because of the joyous occasion, not because they saw a ghost. My mom met me outside and asked me what was wrong. I told her Brian was there and she didn't believe me. She asked me what he was wearing, thinking I was lying. I couldn't come up with just anything. I told her what he wore from head to toe. 
She didn't believe me until she realized the suit I described to her was what he wore in his coffin the day he was buried. I believe wholeheartedly that he was there and he only let me see him because he knew I wasn't over his death and he wanted me to be okay. It was his way of showing me that he was okay and I didn't have to worry about him. To me, it was his way of showing us that he still thought about our family and that no matter what, he would be there for all of us on our special days. I always had a hard time thinking about him, so he was brought up on holidays or even when my family was together. It was in those critical moments I had to leave the room if I didn't want to burst into tears. I've had a lot of closure since seeing him. I'm now able to talk to people about him and even go to his gravesite without breaking down. Now that I'm in college, I chose a profession where I'm able to work with people with addictions and that need counseling, hoping that I could save other people from experiencing the pain I went through. An online friend of mine sent me her site when I told her about the experiences in the home I now live in. I find it so interesting, the work you are doing. I'm always afraid that people will think I'm crazy. I'm 47 years old and live in a home that was built in 1955. So many unusual things happen in the home. Whistling in one bedroom, a strong smell of perfume, and a white shoulder even in my guest bedroom. The constant thinking someone's coming down the hall day and night. The whistling is always early in the morning. The most eerie, unusual experience I had was when I was playing the piano. The hymn, Amazing Grace. It was as if someone had opened the back door and was standing in my living room beside me. Even the dog refused to go to the back hall and in the room, something she had never done before. Late, I told the daughter-in-law about the experience. She said that was the doctor's favorite tunes. I also asked her if he whistled a lot. She said, every morning. The house was lived in by Heat, his first wife, his second wife, and his sister. He died in the master bedroom. The first wife died in the middle bedroom, and the sister-in-law died in my now computer room. Her scent, of course, white shoulders. I moved to this town. The house been on the market for four years because of its reputation. Nothing bad happened. In fact, it is rather comforting sometimes but at times, unexpected. The really only bad thing that happened was that one of my Civil War plates, collector's plates, came crashing down while the others were still fine. I guess the doctor really can't stand liking General Grant. Anyway, thanks for letting me share my story. I've long avoided writing to someone about this experience. Reason being is I'm a skeptic and don't want to rush to judgment. To this very day, we have no idea what caused the ruckus, so anything is possible, I guess. The experience actually happened to my mother, not me. I tried to recall it to the best of my memory from what she told me. This happened over a year ago, May of 1999. We had moved into a brand new house. No one else had ever lived in it, and it was a newly developed area a month before. One morning, I got up as the norm, getting ready for work and waiting for my mom to finish. All of a sudden, very unlike her, she poked her head out really quick and asked if anything fell or broke in my room. I told her that everything seemed fine, nothing out of the ordinary. Then, all of a sudden she blurts out that we must have a ghost then. I must have gotten pale. Reason being is since moving into our home, I've gotten back into looking up info on the supernatural. That's how I even came across the site. In fact, the night of the incident, I had been reading stories, looking at photos, etc. It just felt like a really weird coincidence. Anyway, I asked her what had happened. Apparently, the night before, she had her back to her doorway, reading a book in bed, trying to fall asleep. I was already fast asleep in my room, with the door closed, when all of a sudden, she heard a massive crash. I'm an extremely sound sleeper, so I never heard it. She jumped out of bed, thinking her cat had knocked down a plant or something. He was constantly getting into things. When she came out, she looked all over and couldn't find anything wrong. Since the weather was nice, I knew she had her window open and asked if maybe it came from outside. She said she had thought of it, but the noise came distinctly from inside the house. She said it didn't sound like it came from the way of the window. We also didn't have anything outside 
that would have caused the noise. Our garage is full of all sorts of stuff she brought back after father passed on. Grandma was gone a year before him. I thought maybe something crashed in there, which to be honest, would surprise me. We had stuff packed in there as well. She said maybe so, though she was still doubtful on it. But still, the noise was extremely loud, and she remembers that to this day. Since then, we've been in the garage milling around, and never have come across anything down or destroyed. We never have figured out the source of the noise, and we've never had any other experience happen since. I'm still very skeptical as to what happened. I'm going to tell you about a ghost that I'm pretty sure is haunting me. Her name is Nellie Ellen. I've never actually seen Nellie Ellen, but I can really feel her presence. It started when I was about five years old. I had one of my friends over, and we were sleeping in a tent under the skylights. My friend woke up at about 2 a.m. in the morning and said she wanted to go home. She was sweating profusely and was very pale. I got scared and I asked what was the matter. She didn't want to tell me, but I finally dragged it out of her. She said that she seen an old lady looking at us through the top of the tent, through the skylights, and she was bloody, holding a broken teacup. We ran to my mom and slept in her bedroom that night. I never saw her though, but my friend really scared me. Over the next five years, only small stuff happened. Footsteps down the hall, knocking, etc. When I was 10, I had one of my very good friends over. She woke me up around 2, like my other friend had, and she was crying. The room was so dark, so I turned on the lights. My friend had a bloody nose and was crying really hard now. I asked what happened, and she insisted that she got them all the time, and we called her mother. Her mother came, and we were talking about how my friend was really upset. I said that she told me that she got nosebleeds all the time. Her mother said that it was odd that she lied, because she never gets nosebleeds. When I went to school, I asked her what really happened, and she said, Nellie Ellen, and we've never been friends since. Years later, odd things began to happen again. I was up late, watching TV, and I heard knocking coming from my window. Nothing was there, though, that I could see anyway. The next day, I did some research on my house. I found out that there used to be a woman named Nellie Ellen who owned a tea shop in the bottom of the house. I asked a neighbor about her. My neighbor said that she used to be friends with Nellie Ellen until she went crazy. I was informed that Nellie Ellen would sit on the roof in the late hours of the night with her teacups and talk to herself. One night though, Nellie Ellen accidentally locked herself out of her house and was stuck on the roof in the blistering cold. She tried to get in, but she couldn't, so she had to break a window to get in. But some of the window hit her, and she was so weak from breaking the window in the cold, she was left to die on the roof with the thing she loved the most, her teacups. A few weeks had gone by, and nothing had happened. But one day, my dogs got up and started barking at nothing. They are very protective. They usually can't get up the stairs, but somehow managed to and started barking at the roof. I was sure it was Nellie Ellen. I asked her what she wanted, and the dog stopped barking. They just stared at the window in the attic. She didn't say anything, so I told her to leave me alone and never come back. I think my wish was granted though, because I didn't see her again. The yellow house on Elm Street in Kansas was home to a restless spirit that had died from illness in the bedroom upstairs. I, as a young girl in high school, chose this room as my own. It was soon after moving in that I heard scuffling noises as if he was walking around, wondering what I was doing there. One night, in fact, I woke to find him lying next to me. It was like millions of gray dots forming a human shape. At the time, I thought it was my imagination and blew it off. Then he became more active. I could hear a slamming of the back door and someone running up the steps and then you could not hear anything else after a big stomp at the top of the stairs. One night in particular, I heard a stomp outside my bedroom and then a scuffling of someone walking slowly. 
It came to the right side of my bed and stopped, then to the left side and stopped. Then it went to the end of my bed and stopped at the same time. My heavy curtain flew out over my bed, straight as an arrow. Needless to say, I was scared out of my wits. I knew I had to do some research and find out what needed to be done to lead him to the other side. I went to the library and read up on everything I could. I asked around town and found out his name and that he had died in my room. I then decided to talk to him. I said, Maynard, you need to go to the other side now. Your work here is done. I cannot remember how much time lapsed, but one night, I heard another thump in the hall outside my room, but this time, an elderly lady was leading an elderly man from the hall into my closet. I watched them without any fear at all. It was such a peaceful thing to witness. Someone came to lead Maynard home. I'm now 47 and still remember this so well. My father lives in the same house and I do not feel any presence there now. I will add a PS. When I first moved there, a man's wedding ring fell from the top of a door and rolled across the floor to me. At the time, I was a romantic and said, I will marry the man who fits this ring. I still have this ring, and since it is so large, no man has ever been able to wear it. Several years ago, sometime in 1984, I was living in a small town outside of Fort Worth, Texas by the name of Crowley. At the time, I was in my early 20s and I had a roommate. His name was Mike. Anyway, one night, Mike and I were sitting around, watching TV, and having a couple of beers. As it got late, and we were getting tired, the strangest thing happened. In the bathroom in the hallway, just a few feet away, we heard what sounded like the toilet flushing. Mike looked at me kind of puzzled, and asked me if I heard it too. I kind of laughed, and said no. As I switched the light on, I felt my hair stand up. The water in the toilet was still going around. Since we lived in a trailer house, we both just blew it off as poor construction. We continued to sit and have a few more beers when Mike looked at me and said, Do you smell that? I sniffed a little and said it smelled like gas. Since the stove in the kitchen directly behind us was the only gas in the house, I immediately stood and turned to look. What I saw absolutely scared the hell out of me. All four burners in the stove were on. I finally got up the nerve to turn them off, and we had no problems that night. But that's not the end of the story. Several days later, Mike called me at work. It was around 11 p.m. He asked me if I could come home right now. I could hear the fear in his voice and asked him what was wrong. He said he was lying on the couch when he heard what sounded like kitchen cabinets being slammed close and he was very scared. I went home as quickly as possible and found Mike outside waiting, afraid to go into the house. We quietly went inside and found nothing out of the ordinary. I know that this sounds very strange and would be easy to make up. The few people I've had told this to just don't believe it, but I was there and it did happen. The only problem is that for all these years, I've wondered what happened. Was it something paranormal or just ordinary things that go bump in the night? I guess we'll never know for sure. This is not as complex or as interesting as other stories, but very real nevertheless. I was working as a janitor in a restaurant in the Sacramento, California area in the 1980s. During this time, I bought some books on ghostly hauntings to include one book called Poltergeist, which gave detailed accounts of numerous poltergeist cases. It was with this book that I had left laying about the house, and then one of my older brothers noticed. He pulled me aside to warn me that I should be careful with what I was messing around with, because, in his words, messing around like this is like knocking on the gates to hell. In light of the fact that he experienced, ironically, while also working as a janitor, a very disturbing encounter of his own. I took this warning seriously. So one night at work, shortly after my brother's words had gotten the best of me, 
and I'd put the book aside. I was busy cleaning the dining room carpet. The place was closed, and the only ones in the building were two other janitors, and myself. Picture a Denny's-like place, with the cook's line adjacent to the dining room, a larger kitchen and back, and an upstairs with a storage room, an office, and employee restrooms. I had completed about two-thirds of the carpet, utilizing a big, rotary-style, industrial buffer. It was 4 a.m., and I'd parked the buffer and the cleaning items with it, in the middle of the non-smoking area, away from any tables. I turned and headed for the cook's line, where one of my coworkers was busy cleaning. We exchanged words, commenting that it was time to take a break and make something to eat. He was looking at me as I approached the sandwich side of the cook's line. Then, about 15 seconds after I'd left the buffer, there came the loudest bangs that I've ever heard indoors. Three heavy raps, bang, bang, bang. It sounded exactly like a giant fist had pounded down on one of the dining room tables. It hit the table so hard that I could hear the silverware rattle. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I spun immediately around as the sounds came from where I just left, the buffer in the non-smoking area. I saw nothing and spun around back to around my coworker. What was that, I asked. I don't know, was his answer. I thought that was strange since he was looking in the exact same direction of the noise. To this day, he maintains that he's seen nothing. I immediately went over to see if the buffer had gone off on its own and banged into one of the tables. To my amazement, the buffer was as I left it. I expected to see one of the tables. These are your heavy, wooden tables, tipped on its side. All the tables in the section were okay. No silver was disturbed. We immediately searched the building armed with knives and cooking utensils for the elusive visitor. No one was to be found. We tried, but could not even come close to, duplicating what the two of us agreed was a banging on one of the tables. We could barely get the silverware to rattle. This was way beyond what any person could accomplish and get away with without either of us seeing him. I would say that if we took one of these tables and dropped it from the roof onto the parking lot, it would still not be loud enough. Sorry. I cannot say that I smelled something, saw shadows, or heard voices. I ditched the books after that, all except for the one called Poltergeist. Thanks for reading. I live in Hawaii, and there are many different types of ghosts here. We even have our own tour of the most haunted places on the island, where I live, Oahu. Every year, my family camps down at the beach for the Labor Day weekend. In 1992, my boyfriend and a close friend of my cousins joined us for the weekend. The place we camped had a lot of ghost stories. The beach and all around it was said to be haunted. It did not help when that year, a person was found murdered only a short distance from where we were camping. My boyfriend and our close friend had to work and were coming down to the campsite one night. My cousin and I were on the beach relaxing, waiting for them to return. When they got back, we made a fire and sat around talking. All of a sudden, we got onto the subject of ghosts, and my boyfriend started to tell us of what him and Robbie saw while they were coming back. Robbie did not want to admit what he saw, and while they were arguing, my cousin, who was sitting behind us, started to freak out. All of us thinking that something horrible had happened turned all of her attention to her. She said that she saw a guy floating on the water and he told her that she should be very afraid. After we had calmed her down, my two cousins and I had to go to the bathroom. Upon returning from the bathroom, we were all talking and did not notice our shadows. I was in the middle of my two cousins. Our shadows had a slight outline because our backs were facing the light. My cousin stopped all of a sudden and we looked down at our shadows. Next to my cousin stood a shadow of a man. This shadow was lighter than ours and did not have an outline. Nobody was by the bathrooms except for us. I tried not to panic, but both of my cousins ran and left me there for a brief second by myself, and then I started to run. All of us grabbed onto each other, and we did not stop until we met up with the guys and told them what happened. That same ghost haunted us for about a year. Sometimes, still to this day, he will come back on the same night when we first met him.
Back in 1985, my family moved to a large house in Wibley in Washington. I was 17 when we moved into this place, and from day one, it just gave me the creeps. The constant feeling of being watched was unnerving. Within the first two weeks of moving in, I had my first real experience. We had finally gotten our furniture and was very thrilled to get my bedroom unpacked. That night, I lay in my bed, very smug in my cozy room. The house was dark and my two younger brothers, little sister, and parents were asleep. I began to feel very cold and nervous. I lay there, wondering why I was feeling so odd. Suddenly, there was this horrible screaming coming from the hallway. I jumped out of my bed, grabbed my baseball bat, and ran out of my room. I ran down the hallway towards my little brother's room, convinced that someone had broken in and was attacking them. I ran into their room to find them sound asleep and safe. I checked my sister's room and my parents. All were sleeping and fine. I went back to bed, thinking I must have imagined it. It happened again three more times. Finally, I woke my dad and told him what was happening. He thought I was nuts. Nothing else happened that night. Of course, sometime later that year, I began to hear scratching sounds. The sounds mostly came from outside my bedroom windows. It sounded like someone was taking a rake and running it along the sliding right under my windows. I had three windows in my room. One faced the south and two faced the west. My best friend and I would stand in front of my windows, looking down, trying to figure out who or what was causing this sound. We could actually hear it move from one side of the house to the other, but could see nothing. When this sound would happen, I would say it's just Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street. Other interesting things would happen, not so scary, but weird all the same. In the wee hours of the morning, say around 2 or 3, you could hear the kitchen cabinets opening and shutting, as if someone was looking for a glass. When you near the kitchen, the sound would stop. I've heard this along with my best friend, her boyfriend, and my siblings. When I would be standing in the front yard with my friends, you could see the living room curtains open slightly as if someone was peeking out. This would happen even when none of my other family members were home, so I know it wasn't them spying on me. My friends would point it out to me. Who's watching us? There was a spare bedroom in the finished basement that would cause a strange sensation. You would stand in it and become disoriented. You couldn't figure out what wall was west, south, east or north. You know how you can stand in say your living room and say this wall is east and behind it is the kitchen. In this room, you couldn't pinpoint any landmarks behind the walls and you would become dizzy. I had a friend, he was in the army and very macho, stay in that room one night because he didn't believe me. In the middle of the night he left, he said it freaked him out. To this day, we still talk about it. Items would disappear and reappear somewhere else odd. Music from a music box could be heard in the afternoons. When I came home from school and I was the only one home, the kicker was, we didn't have any music box. You could hear someone walking up and down the stairs, only when I was home alone. Nice, huh? When I would talk to my parents about it, they refused to say anything other than don't say anything to your brothers or sister. I spoke to my youngest brother six months ago. He's now 20, and he informed me that he was aware of the hauntings and had many a scary story of his own. The same with my other brothers and sisters. Although I've been over 11 years since we moved out, we still think about this house, and I wonder if the current owners are having a problem with Freddy. I have lived in this house for 15 years, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happened, till I put a chalkboard in the kitchen for messages from my husband and children. About a day after I hung the board, my favorite aunt passed away. She has Alzheimer's. On the board, the word why began to appear. I began to question my family about the messages. No one knew anything about it. One night, my husband had enough and questioned everyone about the message and became angry that no one knew anything about it. He yelled at the board, why, what? I was thinking dinner that evening, and my youngest daughter was taking a bath 
and she yelled for me. I left the kitchen and the board was empty. When I returned to the kitchen, the chalkboard was covered with the word why again. Suddenly, I felt the presence of a woman. It was my aunt who was with me. I told her that she had died and it was time she rested after having a hard struggle with her sickness. I erased the board before anyone could see it again and took it down. Nothing ever happened again. I feel my aunt didn't understand what had happened to her and had come to me for answers. Why? That was the magic word for her. To this day, I still don't know why, and I don't think I'll ever know why. All I know is, Alzheimer's is a horrible disease, and once you have it, there's no coming back from it. The story I'm about to relay was told to me by a very reliable friend during my years in college. I had no reason to question the authenticity of his story, since I knew him to be a very level-headed man and was not given to ghosts and goblin stories. It appears that his grandfather lived in an old home out in the lonely countryside of North Carolina during the 30s and 40s. He was a farmer by trade and a very religious man. He lived there some years alone, his wife having died of an unusual sickness. I had occasion to visit the area myself, and if you go to this area of North Carolina today, you will still find many cousins and aunts and uncles living very near one another. It was the same way during his grandfather's time where he lived there very near to his son, my friend's father. In fact, the homes were only two miles apart and connected via a dark path that wound through a gloomy forest through which the relative often traveled on visits back and forth. It was always the goal to leave well before sunset. Lamp oil was a precious commodity before and during the war years, and one could not waste it on long trips in the dark. On this particular occasion, my friend's grandfather went to visit the relatives on the other side of the forest. It was Thanksgiving time, and the trees had shed most of their leaves going into winter, and there was a cold chill in the air. The family had a joyous time together feasting on turkey and all the trimmings. Grandfather was deeply engrossed in all the family time, and no one noticed the sun starting to dip low in the horizon. In fact, too low for the safe journey back through the forest. Even though the members of the family pleaded with him to stay the night, Grandfather shrugged them off. I have to start out early tomorrow morning for town. My house is closer. I'll be alright. He departed just as the sun disappeared behind the horizon, and everything was bathed in the misty light of twilight. As I said before, Grandfather was a very religious man and wasn't in the least bit intimidated by ghosts and ghouls. So the trek back through the forest, although very dark without a lamp, didn't even cross his mind as being risky. It was a waning moon that evening and cloudy, so there was very little light, and under the eaves of the forest it was even darker. He told his grandson later that even though he knew the trail well, he found himself thrashing around in the underbush on several occasions. He even miscalculated the stream that crossed the path around halfway through the forest and got his feet soaking wet. It had rained through the night before, so the trail itself was muddy and his feet started getting heavy from the mud. It was at about this point in the trail that he felt something, as if something were following him. Never having been on the trail after dark, he explained it away as his imagination. Perhaps another 50 yards down the dark trail, as he recalled, he heard something behind him splash through the creek he had just crossed only moments before. I didn't know what to think of that. Maybe a deer or something that was just spooked down the trail by his passing. He later told his grandson. It sounded like he was in a big hurry whatever it was. Perhaps it was the uncertainty derived from the extreme darkness. Maybe it was his imagination. But when he heard a twig snap no more than 20 yards behind him only seconds later, he knew it was time to make tracks. His grandfather was in his early 40s at the time and was in excellent physical condition like many farmers from the years of working with their hands. From his estimation, he was only a half mile from home when he started running, more of a jog than anything, as he recalled. The mud made it tricky work, and his feet were pretty heavy with the thickness of mud clinging to them. But when he broke from the trees and saw the shadow of the house around a hundred yards away, he heard whatever it was behind him give out a guttural growl, as if it were exerting itself by pouring on the stream for the final stretch. 
That was his cue to let loose with full out run for his life, mud or no mud. He didn't look back, but he heard the beastly thing behind him chugging for air and crashing through the underbush as it too broke into the open. He then thought it might be a cougar or panther because of the snarl. He didn't turn around to find out. He made for the back door that was unlocked and at full speed dove through the door. The door crashed open at the force of his huge frame. He probably slammed it shut with his foot and quickly locked it. No sooner he had gotten to his feet and backed away from the door, perhaps three second time lapse, when something hit the door, the force of which shook the house. The center of the door bowed in and he heard the hinges creak under the stress, but thankfully, as he was their call later, it held solid. He quickly reached for his gun and like many hardy folk of his era, leapt at the window just next to the door and aimed his shotgun out at nothing. There was nothing there. Immediately, he went around the house to make sure all the doors and windows were locked. Of course, they were all wide open, but nothing got in that he could find. It didn't rain that night, so the next morning, before he went to town, he went to check out the tracks of the great beast that chased him. To his surprise and dismay, he found none. Nothing to verify his story that he didn't imagine it, only his word, which was significant since he grew up in an era where a man's word was totally his bond. He rarely told the story because he just figured it was a panther or maybe a bear. He did find it strange that between the time it took him to grab the shotgun and get to the window was less than a second and there was nothing there. He couldn't see anything racing off towards the forest in the decreasing light. What about footprints? Certainly. Something that knocks down trees and crashes into doors with such force should leave tracks. To this day, it remains unexplained. From the time I was 4 until I was about 16, my grandparents lived in a house on Cloverdale Road that had a poltergeist in it. I lived with them for the first 4 years and moved out with my mother, but even after we moved, I would spend weekends or holidays in my grandparents' house. The happenings were noticed by everyone in the family. My grandfather was the only one who never said anything was out of the ordinary. He's a staunch man of God and kept pictures of Jesus around, and he prayed daily to bless our house and everyone in it. The house had a sunroom that was added on the second floor. Over the front porch, this became my room. This wall between my bedroom and the master bedroom, where my mother's sleep was brick, and had two small windows on either side of the door. I had to walk through a room to get to the upstairs hall, where there was a door leading to the middle room, always dark because the only window was two feet from the house next door, and the back of the upstairs had a small kitchen over the top of the one on the first floor, and a bathroom at the very back over the top of my grandparents room on the first floor. The downstairs had a living and dining room combination that was curtained off. The front room was a bedroom, the middle of the dining room and the stairs to the basement went down at the doorway to the kitchen. Beyond was my grandparents' room, as I mentioned. My grandparents, my mother, my aunts, and myself all lived there all at once. My aunts were teenagers and experimenting with the occult and spirit invocations. I really think this had to do a lot with everything. At their age, they could have understood the consequences of what they were asking. You could clearly hear the footsteps in the middle room, even during the day and then find out later that my aunt wasn't home. So many things got moved around in Susan's middle room that she put a lock on her door, but it wasn't any of us. We heard walking, someone laying down heavily on the bed, drawers opening and closing, the closet opening and closing, not loud or frightening, just the normal noises Susan would make if she was there. Many times, when I was very young, I'd scamper up the stairs, convinced she was there, and wanting to play with her, when I got there, the door would be locked, and no one would answer me when I knocked. Once I even saw the light was on in her room, it was shining around the door. I called to her and tried to open it, but it went out and the noises stopped. My scalp would tingle with fear, and I'd run crying to my grandmother and tell what happened. Once, when I was about five or six, I got up to the bathroom in the middle of the night. My room was awash with streetlight lamp, but my mother's with no other windows, was very dark. I had to go slowly even though I was dying to go into the bathroom because I didn't want to crash into something and wake her up. When I got there, I was just flushing, 
and was suddenly possessed, no pun intended, with the most abject horror for no apparent reason. I screamed and screamed and screamed. I ran all the way to the bathroom past my mother, who was struggling to get up, into my room and under my blankets. I was trembling and pale and shaking. It woke up the whole house, and it took me hours to calm down and sleep with the light on. I never knew what had set me off, just blind panic. Our pots and pans could be heard falling out of the cupboards, and when you go check, everything would be in place except maybe one thing, and that would turn up days or weeks later. My mother saw a black shadow about two to three feet high at the foot of her bed when she'd wake up in the middle of the night. One day, it waited until she was awake, then slowly, deliberately came around the side of the bed and advanced towards her head. She prayed fervently while it just stayed there, then mysteriously it faded away, but it will always come back another night. She was the only one who saw anything, the rest of us just heard disturbances. I was playing with my toys one sunny day, in my room, I was about 7 at the time. I picked up a bunting bag, sort of like a baby sleeper, but like a gown sewed close at the bottom instead of two legs, and also the ends of the sleeves are sewn closed and it had a hood. It was made of flannel and had flowers on it. I loved putting my baby dolls in it. It fit like the ones that were about 12 inches high. I had a doll prepared to put in it and reach for the flannel bag on the floor next to me. Then I shrieked and jumped up, flinging it away from me. I could feel like there was something, felt like a gardener snake or two, writhing inside of it and making a buzzing noise like the world's biggest house fire be. I stared at it in horror as it laid on the floor and the writhing could be seen. Then the noise died down and as it did so, the shapes quit swirling and went flat. I was screaming for help. My mother and aunt came upstairs and I told them what happened. I was sobbing so hard they could barely understand me. They picked it up even though I screamed and begged them not to and looked inside. There was nothing. The only way out, if something was in there, was through the neck hole and it was lying face up a couple of feet from me, and I had not taken my eyes off it for anything. They searched the room and found nothing. They said I imagined it, and took me downstairs to have juice to drink. I sweared I never played with it ever again. I put that thing in the bottom of a box and left a pile of heavy toys on top of it. The house still stands, and when we all left, none of those things ever followed us. I wonder what else happened there over the last 20 years. My father died in Las Vegas in 1993, the youngest of his five children. I was the first one to make it out to Vegas for his funeral. He was cremated. I got there on a Wednesday, Thursday morning. One of my mother's friends came over to our house with some soda and other things for us. I ran out of the house to help her unload her car. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my father standing beside the house. He had his right hand on his hip and held his left hand in mid-air, as if he were going to take a pull off a cigarette. Ironic, because he died of lung cancer, or as if he wanted to wave at or beckon to me. It was only a few seconds, but a whole jumble of thoughts ran through my mind. He's going to say something to me. I don't want to hear it. So I looked away, and when I looked back, he was gone. I regret not stopping to hear what he wanted to say to me. My brother said he chose to say goodbye to me. This was the first time I've ever seen a ghost. I'm waiting to see my mother, who died in May 1998. A footnote, when I saw him, I noticed that my father was wearing his favorite khaki pants and golden white striped shirt. That afternoon, I went to my father's office to work on the program for the memorial service. His boss gave me a picture of my father. In it, he was wearing that golden white striped shirt. When I was growing up, I've had several experiences which led me to believe the house was haunted. The first, I was about 6 years old. I was laying in bed, just about to fall asleep, when I heard what I thought was laughing. I turned over to tell my sister to be quiet when I saw a black form floating beside my bed. My sister was sound asleep. This form had no legs that I could see. It did have a smile on what I call its face. The next encounter did not happen until I was 16. I was coming home late one night and came face to face with this thing. 
It was the same thing I saw when I was six, only this time, there was no smile. After an indiscernible amount of time, I ran to my room. I've had several encounters with this thing throughout my teen years and began calling it Paul. Don't ask me why, because I don't know myself. My sisters and brothers claim they have never saw it, but one brother says he has had haunting experiences such as floating in his room. My mother says she knows the house was haunted, but she refused to give any examples. I know this thing was not harmful because nothing ever harmful ever happened. I also came to feel that this thing was protective of us because I never felt alone or afraid in the house when I was alone. Whenever something was going to happen, we were given warning signs such as popping noises on the stove that we found out had a gas leak and uneasy feelings using the garbage disposal that checked out to have a barbed wire that an electrician said could have caused a fire. This is my story. Hope it wasn't too long. I know it sounds incredibly terrifying just by the details I've given, but that black face was just so mysterious, but I didn't know what to think because I believed that he was actually trying to help me and protect us from anything possible. I guess at this point, it really doesn't matter what it looked like, as long as it was trying to help us, right? Thanks again for reading. I really appreciate you listening to this story, and I hope you have a good day. I used to bicycle the four miles to and from work, along the main roads connecting to two towns in a part of southern Japan. Along the way, there were rice fields on both sides of the roads, shops of many kinds, a school or two, and quite a number of houses set back only about 10 or 15 feet from the sidewalk. One evening in winter, around 7.30, I was bicycling towards home and passed by several homes in a row along the left side of the road. One of them was a one-story wooden farmhouse that had a long, low facade with several square beam columns holding up the roof over the entranceway. As I neared this house, I noticed that there was a boy of perhaps 10 years old standing behind one of the columns, partially obscured by it. He was clearly wearing shorts. It is not unusual for boys to wear shorts all year long in relatively warm southern Japan, and a long sleeve t-shirt, and most notably, a red baseball cap. As I got nearer and passed in front of where the boy was standing, I spotted him again, this time just a few feet away from me, and I noticed that where his face should have been. There was just a blur, a somewhat dark flesh tone blur, but no visible features. This quite naturally shocked me, and just after I passed on my bicycle, I looked back over my shoulder at the place where he had been standing. He was no longer there though there clearly was not enough time for him to have moved so quickly that I wouldn't have seen him. I had chills during the rest of my way back home. The next day, I told the people in my office what I had seen the night before, and one of the older, upper 50s women told me that a stretch of the road was notorious for fatal car accidents, most involving children who dart into the street after a ball or some other toy. I suppose that to most readers this sounds like a fairly typical ghost sighting story, but it is the only one I have personally seen, what I can only conclude was a ghost, so I had quite a deep impact on me. Though I worked at that same job for more than a year after the sighting, and bicycled to and from work along the same road almost every day during that time, I never again saw the boy in the red cap. Victorville, California George Air Force Base is deactivated now. But back when I was assigned there in the 70s, I lived next door to a haunted house and base housing. My wife and I lived in what were known as worry housing units. These were small concrete blocks duplexes that were two bedrooms that had swamp coolers for cooling in summer and natural gas wall heaters for the winter. We moved into our unit and found it agreeable for just the two of us. While talking to the neighbors, we found out that our unit and the next three units had to have the heaters replaced. The unit next to ours had malfunction, and the woman living there was asphyxiated. The next family to move in had a small boy, and he would wake up screaming every night. His mother asked him what was wrong, and he finally told her that the white lady kept coming into his room and saying, I'm going to take you home with me. My wife had told her that I had experiences with that kind of thing, and volunteered me to go have a look. Naturally, I waited until it was full noon, before I went in to check out the house. Now at this time, we had a stupid cat, what other kind is there that will follow me around? So, in we go, 
Kitchen, okay. Dining room, okay. Living room, okay. Master bedroom, okay. Bathroom, okay. Kids room, uh-oh. No feeling cold or anything, but my eyes are drawn to the far corner of the room. I can't see anything there, but I know something is there. I glance down at the cat and it's looking in the same spot. Glance up, it has moved closer to me. Glance down, cat is fluffing up and backing down the hallway. I figure the cat has the right idea. Now, here's where I made a stupid mistake. I got in front of the cat. I hear the cat make a loud hiss and the next thing that happens is the cat went up my back and off the top of my head running. I don't stop to look behind me, remember what Satchel Paige said about that, and take off running. My wife said she heard the cat make a noise and then me saying oh crap, then a herd of elephants running out the door. Needless to say, I recommended our neighbor have the chaplain come out. A second episode after that really had the hair stand up, and still does to this day. I was coming home around 2am and noticed the master bedroom window was open and the light was on. I glanced over and there was the gal next door brushing her blonde hair and not wearing a stitch. Well, good neighbor that I am, I call out to her to close the blind at least. First word out of my mouth, lights off, blind closed, window shut. I don't to this day know how I got through the front patio gate or the front door. I woke up my wife and told her what I had seen. She said 1. Our neighbor's hair is brown. 2. They were in San Francisco. And 3. The woman who died in the house was a blonde. I went to Blackburn College in Carlinville, Illinois. Before I moved into my dorm room, people asked which dorm I was assigned. When I told them Stoddard, everyone told me to watch out for the ghost and I believe it was room 305. Blackburn is a very old school and Stoddard was one of the oldest dorms dating back to the 1800s. The supposed haunted room was the only single room, the rest were doubles. It was on the third floor as the third floor was all guys and the first two all girls. The story goes, a freshman hung himself in that room years ago. Or another one was that a boyfriend killed his girlfriend and then himself there. Anyways, you were supposed to be able to hear them walking around at night and see them in windows and such. My room was diagonal from this room. My only encounters there were sometimes in the middle of the night. If I walked down the hall to the bathroom, I could swear someone was outside the stall walking around, but there would be nothing there. Also, I would leave stuff in my room, and when I came back, it would be gone and then later returned to the same spot. I transferred schools the next semester for personal reasons, but the weird thing is, the guy who lived next door to me there always said how he could see the ghost, and then I got word that he tried hanging himself last semester. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. In 1992, I was a full-time student at Columbus State Community College earning an associate's degree in law enforcement. I had to earn a full-time salary as well, so I took a job as a security officer during third shift at American Electric Power Lab in Groveport. It was a facility set out in a rural area, and with the understanding that I would be the only one in the building during the graveyard shift, figured it would give me time to study. I will try to make this as short as possible. My first few weeks there were rather strange, is I kept seeing the presence of a shadowy figure of a man walking very fast out of the corner of my eye. I really did not consider it a haunting or ghost because I never saw the apparition head on, so I just went on about my business and really did not give it much thought. However, I became very uneasy and spooked during the midnight and early morning hours. One morning, at about 6 a.m., I happened to be looking in the direction of the same window blinds while I was sitting in the lobby area. The window separated the lobby and the work area. Just then, I saw the definite figure of a man walk by the blinds. I got up and, thinking it was an employee who had gotten in early, went to investigate the area. There was no one there at all. The cleaning crew then related the story in which they were seeing a ghost in the building. They described the same type of apparition to me. I never told them about my experience. While training new officers, 
I had someone who would stop in their tracks while I was showing them the building. I would ask them what was wrong, and they would be looking towards a room in the hallway and tell me something like, I thought I saw someone walk by. This happened more than once. I spoke with the guy who used to manage the security division, and he told me he had an officer leave in the middle of the night because he saw the shadowy figure of a man walking very quickly around the perimeter of the security fence. I told an employee at the building, whom I had gotten to know over the time I had worked there, about the sightings. Almost immediately he said, oh, that must be Roger. He was very serious. He said that Roger died about 8 years prior, but that he loved his job, and that was probably him. Indeed, there was a former employee named Roger that died 8 years ago. Without going on and on, I will just say that many other security officers had reported the same types of activity. I quit the job back in June of 1993. I worked there almost two years. I would like to contact some officers working there now and see if the haunting is still going on. It was a cold winter's day. The year was 1991, and I thought it was a very typical day. Matthew, the little boy that I care for, was taking an afternoon nap, as usual. I was cleaning up the kitchen then gathered up all Matt's dirty clothes and put up a wash. It was around 3.30 in the afternoon when I heard Matt screaming. I could hear his voice very clearly from the baby monitor that was on the kitchen counter. I called to him so that he wouldn't get scared as I walked upstairs to his bedroom. That's when it hit me first. On the way up to the staircase, I was chilled. I ran back down, got my sweater, then ran back upstairs to Matt's room. Well, that's where the coldness came from. Sure enough, as I opened the door, that's where all the cold air was coming from. It was freezing in the baby's room. I walked over to his bed, pulled the railing down, and held him in my arms. His hands were ice cold, and he was shaking and crying. In an effort to calm him down, I held him in my arms, and I tried rocking him back and forth. He finally had quieted down, so I began to change his clothes, and that's when I noticed my tape recorder on his dresser. I'd forgotten all about that. You see, Matt's family was relocating to another state soon, and I knew that I wanted something of Matt's to remember him by. So, that morning I brought my tape recorder with me to have a tape recording of him. Little did I know, that's not that was all on the tape. When I got home, I never did listen to the tape. It was Friday, so I thought to myself that I had the whole weekend to listen to it. On Sunday, I had some free time so I started to listen to the tape. In the beginning, I thought, well, I did it. I finally have Matthew's voice on tape and was so happy to know that I have something to remember and buy. As I began to listen, I heard our voices, Matt's, mine, and something that I couldn't make out. I kept backing up the tape because I heard something so strange that I couldn't even make out what I was hearing, but it sounded so eerie that it gave me the chills. What could this be? Did I have a faulty tape here or what? As I kept rewinding and listening, the more clearer it became. It was definitely a voice saying pull the gate up, but what kind of voice was it? It sounded ghostly, but how can this be? I heard nothing that particular day, only Matt and myself. There was no one else there, just the two of us. As I kept listening, I became more frightened. I heard the same voice saying I wish you were dead. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I never heard of anything like this before. I thought to myself, you're just imagining all of this. You're going crazy. But it was true. The tape doesn't lie. It had to be a ghost or something else. I had no other explanation. It just had to be. After a few hours, I decided to let my daughter listen to the tape. Now, my daughter is a very religious person. She has many religious friends and even knows a couple of Catholic priests personally. After she heard the tape, she told me that she would contact a priest right away. The next day, we called a Catholic priest that we both knew very well and made an appointment with him for the next night. Since the priest knew about the tape already, when we arrived there, we went right into his office. The three of us sat down and he listened to the tape right away. Well, it only took him one time to listen to it. He already knew what happened. He looked at me and he asked me if the family was Catholic and I answered yes. Then he asked if there was anything religious in the home. I said no, and then asked him why. Then he began to explain that the family had no protection in the home, 
It was at this time that I understood what he was talking about. He was very concerned for the baby's welfare. He said that what he heard on the tape was evil voices and other things that I didn't even hear. Certain sounds of doors slamming and some creaking floors. He told me the tape man's room again and if it happened again that I should tell the parents. But what should I have told them? The man's room was haunted or the whole house was haunted? I didn't know what to do. If I told the parents the whole story, would they think I was nuts? So, I decided to take this to a doctor friend of mine. He happens to be a psychiatrist and also dabbles a little into strange and unexplainable things. When I went to see the doctor, I told him the whole story thus far. Then he listened to the tape. His exact words were, the voice is not from this world. It's from another dimension that is not a human voice. Well, from then on until this day, from a priest to a doctor, this tape has been a mystery to me. So, I've decided to take my tape and my story to any parapsychologist or website that has to do with the paranormal and let the experts decide for themselves. What in the world happened to Matthew's room that cold winter day in 1991? I'm finally ready to hear what they have to say, aren't you? I lived in what I believed to be a haunted apartment for about a year. I cannot disclose the exact location due to the fact that the apartment is still rented to tenants. When I first moved in, everything seemed normal until I began doing some small renovations. My husband Eric began to pull up the carpet and we noticed odd gouges in the floorboard that would be our bedroom. At the time, we thought that maybe some previous tenants had damaged the floor while moving their furniture, so we proceeded to paint the floor and lay down the rug. After two months or so, my husband walked into the bedroom after taking a shower. I was on the bed reading when suddenly, Eric slipped on the area rug that covered the gouges. After assuring that he was okay and passing it off as having wet feet, we turned in for the night. The next morning we noticed what appeared to be stains seeping through the area rug. They appeared to be the same pattern as the gouges. I picked up the carpet and noticed a slick substance sticking to the back of the carpet. After much arguing as to what exactly the substance was, we decided to just throw it away. We never gave it a second thought. About three or four days later, I was in the kitchen having a cup of coffee with my friend Alec when suddenly the room temperature dropped considerably. I asked him to make sure all the windows were shut. As he walked into the living room, he glanced into my bedroom on the right and noticed the curtains were blowing. He went in to make sure the window was closed, which it was. About five minutes later, we both heard a loud bang coming from the bathroom, which was on the other side of the living room. It took Alec and I a good 15 minutes to get the courage up to check the bathroom. The first thing you see when entering the bathroom is the tub. I opened the curtain and noticed four tiles on the back wall that appeared to be pushed out. You have to understand the layout of my apartment to fully understand our fright. The apartment was a third floor attic in an old Victorian style house that was renovated into a small loft type apartment. When entering the apartment, you go up three flights of stairs, into the doorway, and up another two set of stairs into the living room. To the right is the bathroom, and a little beyond that is a crawl space in the wall that runs under the eaves of the house and behind the bathroom and bathtub. Alec and I bickered about who was going to go into the crawl space. Needless to say, we waited until Eric came home about two hours later. We told him what had happened and insisted that he go into the crawl space to investigate. When he got to the space behind the bathtub, he discovered a lot of debris, which included dark old stained ropes and large J hooks. I insisted that he just leave them alone and figure where the house was so old, they must have been left behind during renovation or construction. We had our landlord fix the tiles and continue with our daily lives, even though I was permanently left with a feeling of unease. For about six or seven months, nothing happened. On Christmas Eve of 1975, we had a tray set up in front of the crawl space door, which was approximately two inches wide by three and a half high. The door fell open, knocking over the tree and smashing all of my Christmas ornaments. Eric jumped out of bed and stopped suddenly. We both heard a strange sound coming from the living room. It seemed to be coming from the crawl space. At the same time, I saw a strange mist or fog hovering close to the ceiling in the living room. It was a very faint, almost like thin smoke. I pointed it out to Eric, but it vanished before he could see it. I still can't believe how calm I stayed throughout this whole episode. 
When Alec and his new wife Vanessa came by on Christmas morning, we told him the whole story. Vanessa was a very spiritual person and became instantly spooked before we even told her the story. Alec commented on how strange she was acting before she entered the apartment. She lost all the color in her face and seemed aloof. She mentioned that something didn't feel right about my apartment. I really started to feel like it was time to start looking for a new place to live. Eric had to leave the following week for a business trip to California. He would be gone for almost three months. I asked my girlfriend Samantha to stay with me for a while. I did not want to be alone. Samantha knew what had been happening and agreed reluctantly to stay on the sofa in the living room. The first month and a half was pretty much uneventful, so Sam and I began to look at new apartments. I started feeling confident and then nothing was going to happen. I was wrong. Samantha had to go back home for a few days so I was alone. I'd gone out with Alec and Vanessa on a Saturday night and came home at about 1am. I climbed into bed with a book. I must have fallen asleep while reading. Do you ever get that feeling that someone is near you? I woke up on my stomach and I could sense somebody walking around my bed. I laid still and waited for it to pass. I heard the floorboards creaking and I felt a cool breeze pass over me. I finally turned over and looked into the living room and saw the mist moving towards the crawlspace floor. The absolute fear that I felt paralyzed me. I could do nothing but stare and hope that nothing would happen. The strange noises started again. I can only describe the noise as a clang or knives being sharpened. I lost all of my composure. I ran out of my apartment wearing only my nightshirt and grabbed my car keys on the way out of the door. I drove to Alex and spent the night. I called Eric in LA and explained what happened and that I would not go back until he came home. I paid the rent. There was no way I was going to stay there alone. Eric came home on April 7th. I told him Alec and I would pick him up from the airport and then we would go to the apartment and get our belongings. I will never forget what we saw when we went back. It made me a true believer in the paranormal. I still don't know to this day what was haunting that apartment, but I truly believe it was evil. We walked into the apartment to discover the rug torn up, almost gouged up in the living room. All the tiles in the bathroom enclosure were punched out into the tub. The bedroom truly horrified the three of us. It appeared that something mauled the bed linens. The mirror that we had was smashed as well as my lamps. We grabbed what we could salvage and started to leave when we nosed the rope and J-hook through the kitchen table. I don't know if a person came in and did all the damage, but nothing explains the J-hook and the rope. My landlord insisted that no one had access to the apartment since we had moved in. We left that day and never looked back. I did some research on the house but found nothing significant that would explain any of the occurrences while we lived there. Eric and I now live in Vermont with our three kids. The house was renovated and turned into a retail store. We have not told them the story and I don't think we ever will. I've been tempted to write what happened to my family many times, but it seems far too unreal. We were not allowed to talk about this out of the house when I was a child, and my mother only told our house guests about our visitors when they experienced something in our house. Our childhood home was built in 1898. My parents bought the house in 1974 when I was only six months old. The house was very large and had been converted into a double. My grandmother moved into the upper level. Strange things began to happen shortly after my family moved in. My mother had her first experience one night after she sent my older sisters to bed. From her bedroom door, she could look out and see into the kitchen's hallway and into the bathroom. My family had only lived in the house less than a month when my mom saw a little blonde haired girl walk into the bathroom. All of my sisters have very dark brown hair and this was clearly a blonde haired child. My mother panicked and yelled to the little girl, but the door shut. My mom jumped out of bed. In her mind, she was thinking that this little girl was a neighbor's child that my sisters must have snuck in the house. When she opened the door, there was nobody inside the room. My mother nicknamed the little girl Jessie and I have no idea why. My mother had many experiences in the house and with the younger children, myself, my younger sister, and younger brother. When we were very small, it was as if we were playing with someone else. I don't remember this particular incident, but my mom did. But I do remember that in my oldest sister's bedroom in her closet, 
There was a paneled off section that led under a hallway steps to the second floor. I remember talking to someone that we called the lady under the stairs. I always thought that it was my mom or grandmother, but I later learned that that was not the case. When we told my mom about this, she would not let us play this game anymore. I do not remember being scared at all though. My younger sister and I would always go into our hallway and play with the lady on the stairs. I have very little recollection of this and at the time, I would have been about 4 years old and my sister would have been about 3. When we described the woman to my mother, she forbade us from being in the hallway alone. I never took the ghost stories to heart and was very carefree as a child. I always felt safe, however, I did finally have a bizarre experience that I could not explain or rationalize away. My grandmother had a stroke when I was 15 and my mother gave my older sister's bedroom to my grandmother since it was on the first level and safer for her. She had no control over what she was saying and was rapidly deteriorating. My parents did not lay any ground rules for us kids that summer as things were in havoc and my brother and I had stayed up all night watching Nick at night in the living room. I could see into my grandmother's room and we also kept an eye out for her should she use the bathroom or want something to drink. I was just starting to doze off when I thought I saw someone in my grandmother's room. It was a blonde haired girl who might have been 10 to 12. I have no idea the age. I thought I was just seeing things or that I was really wiped out and my mom's stories were starting to get to me. I walked out into our kitchen and my oldest sister was eating a sandwich and I told her what I saw. She laughed at me and told me I must have been dreaming. I thought maybe she was right because I just never believed what my mom had been saying about the girl she had claimed to see on several occasions. Now here's where I realized I was not a complete nutcase. I said before that the house was very big. Well, my grandmother started screaming and my sister and I ran into the room. My grandmother was up and headed for the front door. She was screaming about fire and the little girl. We could barely make out what she was talking about. But she kept repeating the little girl said I was going to hurt the baby and I have to go before I cause a fire. That was the most intelligible sentence that my grandma had said in over a month. My sister kept saying what little girl? And my grandmother said clear as day, the little blonde haired girl. My grandmother was 72 years old and short of hearing. She was also three rooms away when I literally whispered this to my sister. We woke up my mom because we did not know what to do. My grandmother ran out of the house and refused to come back in. She stood on her porch. My parents took her to the hospital and she was placed in the nursing home because even the mention of our house sent her into hysterics. The baby she was talking about is my younger brother who is the baby in the family. My mom decided to turn the house into a one family home again and had us kids, there were six of us, do the work. We did not mind as we wanted to help and it was a good way for us not to think about my grandmother all the time. My younger sister and I would be the only two sharing a room, but that was fine with me as we were very close and we were excited. Again I was up and could not sleep, so I went up to the room that would be ours. It had been my grandmother's and I was scraping wallpaper off the walls with a putty knife. We had started this project the night before and I was bored, so I went up to get some work done. I was scraping the walls and had been doing so for about a half an hour when I heard a funny noise sounding like the scraping noise I was making with the knife, but different. It's hard to explain. I thought someone was playing a trick on me, so I began to scrape the wall and very quickly I stopped. However, the sound that I heard continued and it was the sound of scraping, but it was coming from across the room. I don't know if whatever was in the room was mocking me or playing a game, but the scraping kept going on. Whoever or whatever did not care that I heard them. I screamed. I thought it was one of my older sisters. I ran down the front stairs and opened the door and the house was completely quiet. Everyone was sound asleep, snoring. I woke up everyone in the house. I was terrified and I never slept in that room. I would hear things in the house until I was 18 and moved out. As for our house restorations, my mother began working on the kitchen and back hallway that led to our attic. While doing so, she found where the house had burn marks and was scorched. My mother mentioned this to one of our neighbors, a woman who had lived on our street from the day she was born. In the early 1920s, our house had burnt very badly and had been rebuilt. At that time, it had been converted into a double. 
a little girl and her parents lost their lives in the fire. My other sisters had things happen to them too. One of my older sisters was looking out of the living room windows. Something grabbed her shoulder and called her name. One more thing, please don't think I'm nuts, but I have not had this happen to any house or apartment I've lived in since. And one thing I did notice was that whatever was in the house was not frightening to me in my youth, but only became frightening when each of us hit a certain age. Why? I have no idea. This was also something I thought that was weird. This little girl was never visible upstairs, and the woman only was spotted downstairs once. The neighbor who was alive when the house caught on fire remembered that the little girl's name was Jessica. My mom had been calling her that for years, and had never known what the little girl's real name was, but had just called her that because it seemed right. I've been reading the stories on your site for a while now and decided to share experience of my own. I'm afraid it's not particularly exciting or dramatic, but I feel it's a good example of the attitude you need to take when dealing with spirits. I've been told on more than one occasion by people who claim psychic abilities that there are spirits present in my house. This really comes as no huge shock as the core of the house is a farmhouse that is over 120 years old. Although I've never seen a ghost myself, I'm familiar with the sort of chilled feeling that people describe when they are in the presence of spirits. It is not truly the same feeling as normal reaction to temperature, but something that seems more internal and comes and goes independently of environmental changes. I've very commonly experienced this sensation, usually beginning before someone else remarks about their perception of something otherworldly. Several years ago, one summer morning, I'd come home in the early morning from working the night shift. I was getting undressed for bed and placed my bedroom door in a three-quarter closed position that I usually keep in to provide some cross ventilation. Let me explain that my bedroom is a rectangular room, approximately 10 foot wide by 16 feet long. There is a set of double windows on the far end of the room. My bed is crossways in front of the windows with the head on the longer wall. The door was on the other end of the room and due to irregularities from different additions to the house. There was an approximate 4 inch step down when entering the room from the hallway. At the time of this incident, there was no central air in the house, so the only cooling method was the open windows. As I was getting ready for bed, I saw the door swing shut rather firmly from the 3 quarter position. At first, I dismissed this as just being the breeze as I was feeling a slightly chilled feeling on what was a rather warm morning. Even though I didn't really notice much in the way of the air current, I was very tired and somewhat groggy and only wished to get to bed as soon as possible. I put my door back into the position I had it in and went back to getting ready for bed. Almost immediately, the door swung shut again very firmly. Even though I really did not notice the breeze, the door swung quite freely on its hinges and I did not think much of the fact that it kept shutting. I then took one of my work boots the common style most everyone is familiar with that laces up about 9 inches above the ankle and placed it with the toe section underneath the door and the heel towards the doorway and repositioned the door to the 3 quarter position I wanted it to be in. Moments later, the door drug the boot across the carpeted floor and closed as far as it could with the boot in the way. Now at that point, I realized that there was certainly no breeze present that could exert that amount of force and the chill. I was experiencing was not the normal environmental kind, nor was it in any way cold enough that morning for me to be experiencing a normal chill. Now, I'm not a person who likes to have a sleep interfered with, nor do I particularly like to have my plants of any kind thwarted. Besides, all of my reading and conversations regarding the supernatural and hauntings have always indicated that you have to assert your rights to control your domain when challenged by spirits. With this in mind, I grabbed up a heavy, approximately 12 pound Thor hammer I'd cast from aluminum years before in shop class and placed the head of it underneath the door, with the handle sticking up between the door and the doorway. Stepping back, I then witnessed the door drag this heavy hammer, approximately 12 pounds, across the floor the same way it had my boot, until again the door was as far shut as it could be without actually removing the hammer from underneath it. At that point. Becoming somewhat angry, I took the hammer out from underneath the door, placed the door into a two-thirds closed position, 
slightly more open than I really wanted, and waited. Within seconds, the door started to shut again. At this point, I pointed at the door and said loudly and firmly, no. The door stopped moving and stayed perfectly still. I stood there for a few moments longer watching the door and it did not move again. I then said thank you and went on to bed. I think it's important for people to understand that in most cases of encountering a spirit in your home, you simply have to assert your right to be the master of your home. I can't promise that it will always be the complete answer in all cases, but I believe it to be the best way to begin with dealing with a disagreement with a spirit in your home. Many years ago, my family and I lived in a lovely Queen Anne style home. We lived in it for 13 years, 11 of which we experienced paranormal phenomena. Two years after we moved in, we had our first of many odd occurrences. My daughter was in the kitchen and I was upstairs when I heard her call out that the upstairs toilet must have overflowed because water was running down the outside of the staircase. I ran to the top of the stairs in bare feet only to feel water on the surface of the carpeting. I looked over the top of the railing to assure that the toilet hadn't overflowed, and that was when I felt the wetness on my feet, but there were no water pipes in that part of the house. When I got down the stairs, I found water running in rivulets down the wooden molding. My daughter reached up to turn on the light under the stairway alcove, and as soon as she did, the water stopped. We had to wipe the trom down, and we never found any reason for that activity. Months later, while preparing for bed one night, I heard footsteps running down the attic stairs. The door crashed against the opposite wall, and then nothing. I was terrified thinking that someone was there. They would have to pass my room to get downstairs, but nothing happened. When we finally went to look, the door was against the wall. We even thought that maybe a ball had bounced down the stairs, sounding like footsteps, but there was nothing. Strangely. When we started to think our house had unseen guests, we were no longer frightened. As time passed, we had many more experiences. I heard a woman crying softly but pitifully. Two of my daughters saw images of old-fashioned children dressed in long white nightgowns and mob caps. A visitor to my house saw the same thing and asked me who the little girl was. On another occasion, my nephew was spending the night and thought he saw me standing at the top of the stairs in a long white old-fashioned nightgown and then supposedly, I went down the stairs and didn't come back. My nephew was 16 at the time, and we hadn't told him about the house. My husband thought we were all crazy because he didn't believe in this sort of thing. My daughter came home late one night and was just lying in bed, going over her evening, and looked up to see a male figure suspended over the bed, and as she watched the image dissolve from the bottom up, as if it were sand falling. There were other things that happened there, although nothing dangerous, and finally, we sold the house and moved on. It was several years after we moved from the house that we met a family that had lived there years before we did and had very similar things happen to them, but they said their experiences were very frightening and mean-spirited. I sometimes think our guests moved in with us because from time to time, we still get very strange sensations in our present Victorian home. This is my own personal ghost story. This happened when I was about 12 years old, so keep in mind that 12 years have passed, but as long as I live, I will never forget the details. Here goes. I was spending the night with a good friend of mine, in a house that was extremely haunted. Stephanie lived in one of those houses that just seemed to be the epicenter of paranormal activity. Her aunt walked the basement steps, an unknown spirit lived in the attic, and there was a tree out back that just looking at it scared me to death. I'm really not entirely sure why the tree scared me so much, but it rocked me to the bone. It was large and had an ominous presence. Stephanie called it the witch tree, but really had no actual reason for doing so. But nevertheless, the tree is not my focus in the story. It just gives a little background information. We went to sleep that night, and about 2 a.m., I woke up with a start. I thought it was just because Steph and I had talked about ghost stories until we fell asleep, but then I had the feeling that I was being watched. I looked up and saw this large pair of blue eyes hovering over me. I know this sounds silly, but I am dead serious. They just kept watching me. Maybe watching me is not the right word, 
They kept glaring at me, and all I could sense was evil. I felt so cold, and I couldn't wake Stephanie up. I thought I might have been dreaming, so I closed my eyes and laid there. I looked up every few minutes and the eyes were still there. I had no clue what to do to make them go away, so I just started praying to God, something I saw in a movie, and never opened my eyes that night again. I woke up in the morning and told Stephanie about them. She had never seen them before, but didn't doubt me. She of all people knew the history of her house. I went on with life as normal, forgetting about the eyes until about two months later. Stephanie came to me and said she talked with her little brother Aaron, who was eight. She said she didn't even mention the eyes to him, but one night they were talking about the house and he asked her if he had ever seen a large pair of blue eyes. She stopped dead in her tracks. Aaron said that to him the eyes were friendly and never glared at him. We just figured out that they saw me as a stranger and focused evil on me. I will never know for certain. All I know is that I never stayed in that house again. In addition to that story, my sister and I were out driving about 9 months ago. It was about 11 p.m. and we passed by Stephanie's old house. She no longer lived there, but I'm pretty sure that her father still did. I turned to Lauren, my sister, and said, look La, there's that creepy house. Now, this next part will sound so bizarre, but I swear it is true. All of a sudden, a light shot out from the house, which was completely dark and two other lights shot up from the other side of the road. We thought they might just be electrical charges. That was, of course, until they started chasing the car. We had to get the mail down the road until they disappeared. Do you have any idea what those lights might have been? Thank you for listening to my stories. Back in 1996, my Uncle Wayne passed away in a tragic auto accident on the interstate near Nina, Wisconsin, between Appleton and Oshkosh. He had been pulling a load of sod with a small pickup truck that he borrowed from a coworker. The truck must have been too small to carry the load because the truck flip killed my uncle instantly. Needless to say, my father flew out to Wisconsin from our home in Pensacola, Florida to attend the funeral of my youngest brother. My father is the oldest of seven children. The story I'm about to tell comes from the mouth of my father. The afternoon before the day of the funeral, my father took his mother and father to the funeral parlor to finalize their arrangements. On the way back to my grandparents' home, my grandmother noticed that her family ring was missing a stone. The stone that was missing was my uncle's Wayne's birthstone. They looked everywhere for the stone and could not find it. Everyone kept saying it was Wayne's way of saying a final goodbye to his mother. The next day, the day of the funeral, everyone left my grandparents' house to go to the funeral except my uncle Stan. Stan stayed behind to wait for that cousin that was running late. A few minutes later, Stan heard a car pull into the driveway. At the bottom of the driveway was a car that looked exactly like Wayne's, a green Spitfire. My uncle Stan thought how strange it was that their cousin had a car exactly like Wayne's. His car was still parked outside his old apartment at the time. He looked out the window again and saw a man sitting in the driver's seat with a beard. My Uncle Wayne had a beard when he died. My Uncle Stan opened the door to walk outside, thinking it was their cousin, who also has a beard. When he opened the door, the car reversed out of the driveway and quickly drove away. A few minutes later, their cousins pulled up in a totally different car. My Uncle Stan was so shocked that he told everyone at the funeral about what happened. Since this time, no one else had been visited by my Uncle Wayne. A year ago we bought an old Victorian house. The family matriarch had refused to let it be sold, although it was in a dismal condition. When she passed away, the family decided to sell, although it had been with them for 80 years. We began the serious process of renovation. But I was disturbed by the obvious presence of an old woman, dressed in pink, always in the same place, in the same room. I naturally assumed it was the family matriarch, Sophia. She was so unhappy and seemed displeased at the disturbance we were causing. So I called in a psychic friend of mine to help her move along. The psychic rang bells, chanted, burned, and we put lit candles in all the doorways and windows. 
the very next day, it appeared that Sophia had gracefully moved on. A year passed. We finished a renovation and were preparing to throw an open house party. The day before the party, a woman came into the house and announced that she had grown up there. She said she had been coming by to check on her progress, but had always been shy to come in. Something had drawn her courage up to come in on that day. We were very pleased and immediately invited her and her family to come to the open house the very next day. They all came. At one point, I couldn't resist and I asked this woman if there had ever been ghosts in the house. Oh yes, she replied. My great grandmother was so persistent, we had to call in a priest to exercise her. Feeling confident, I then told her about Sophia. The woman began to tremble and cry. She said that her mother, Sophia, had always worn pink, and the room and place I described would have been between the beds and the children's room. Rest in peace, Sophia. Years ago, before I was born, my father was sleeping at the head of the bed, I believe, and my mother was at the foot by the window as there was no air conditioning, and the light was out, room dark. Well, my mother said all of a sudden, she heard what she believed to be a woman at the head of the bed, jabbering away, could not understand her at all. My mother got terrified and pulled the cover up over her head, and when she did, this thing came right by her ear and just talked. She was unable to make out what the thing was saying. She jumped up and yelled and slept for a week with the ceiling light on. She asked and someone told her that they believed the house we used to live in had been moved from another location. Another true story. My mom used to walk me to grade school about six blocks from the house and she lost her house keys one day. Well, she traced her steps, even looked by the mailbox at the corner of her house, thinking that she laid them there. No keys. We lived upstairs, 16 feet up, and my dad was in front of the bedroom and my mom was in my room laying next to me and the strangest thing happened. All of a sudden, I had the most peaceful feeling. This is a feeling that's kind of hard to explain, but I'll do my best. So, someone I don't know, it could have been an angel or a dead relative, who knows, but it was right next to the bed on my side and said my name. I was not scared at all, but my mom heard it too and jumped up. I had so many questions such as who are you, what are you doing, and how do you know me? But at the moment, the phone rang. And Sandy, who lived around the corner, was walking home from church on a Sunday and said, I found your keys. They were by the mailbox. I know this writing is all over the place, and I'm so sorry if this was hard to understand, but I think you guys got the gist of it. These things I can't explain are occurrences of the afterlife, in my opinion. This story is just a collection of experiences I've had, and I don't know if they go together or make any sense at all. The first was when I was about eight, and me and some of my friends were out in my backyard telling ghost stories. All of a sudden, we heard a deep voice slowly calling our names. It seemed to come from behind a shed in the backyard, and we all ran away from it. We ran into the house and then calmed down, thinking it might have been my father, but then I realized my father was at work, and all of our neighbors were pretty up there in age, and I doubted they even knew our names. We were calming down in my room. When I looked out the window, and about 200 feet away, in an empty field, I saw the outline of what seemed to be a man, or was totally black, but it was in the middle of the day. I couldn't even speak. I finally yelled as if I was walking away, and I think when I yelled, it turned and looked back at me. I never saw it again, and even writing about this is bringing tears to my eyes. The other experiences I've had were in the same room in my grandma's house. When I was young, I used to sometimes go to my grandmother's and stay for a weekend or a night. One night, I was sleeping and I got up half asleep in some sort of confusion of hearing something in the hallway. I looked down the hall and there seemed to be a shadow of a tall man against the curtains with moonlight shining through them. I wasn't scared like the first time. I actually felt like this was a man watching over me and for some reason, I had a weird feeling it was my great grandfather. The other time was when I was about 16. I was actually living in that room because I moved out of my parents' house temporarily. It was a typical night. I laid down to go to sleep, 
but was having some trouble. I finally started to get drowsy, and I rolled over onto my other side. And then, out of nowhere, I hear my name whispered urgently into my ear. I even felt the air. I jumped up, and no one was there. I had the door closed, but my grandpa was somewhat of a jokester, so he thought maybe he was pulling a prank. So, I got up and looked down the hall, and I saw him and my grandma in bed watching TV. He may be a prankster, but I doubt he can run that fast. I'm 18 now, and I haven't seen or heard anything weird since, but I also don't spend very much time at my grandma's house anymore. I know that many of you may be skeptical about the appearances of ghosts, apparitions, etc. And so was I, until one year, when I went to spend the summer with my father in Grand Coley, Washington. I didn't ever think about ghosts until I had to babysit for our neighbors in an apartment complex that my father managed. I put the kids to bed. One was three, the other two, and there was also an infant child I was looking after. I put the three and two year olds in their beds for the night and the infant's crib was down in the living room with me. I just laid him in the crib when I heard a loud bang and then footsteps running across the three year old's room. Now, she had a tendency to not do as she was told, but she normally stayed in her bed at night. But when I heard the footsteps, I assumed it was one of her cries for attention. So, I made my way up the stairs, trying to be as quiet as possible so I could catch her in the act. When I got to her room, she was sound asleep in her crib, so I went back downstairs, thinking it was my imagination, but about 10 minutes later, I heard the same thing. When I went back upstairs, she was still in her crib, only this time, she was sitting straight up, talking to someone on her windowsill. When she saw I was in there, she turned around and lifted her sippy cup up and said, Kenny wants a cup too. I started feeling a little uncomfortable about this, so I called my dad from the upstairs phone. It's not what she said that made me do that though, it's what I saw. Now, the setup of the house has a light in the stairs hallway, so that the only shadow cast is at the bottom of the stairs. I was seeing shadows of a little, what looked to be a boy, at the top of the stairs, and I was the only one in the house besides the girl and the baby boy. The girls all have fairly long hair and the shadow had very short hair. This shadow kept on dancing in a ritualistic Indian manner. There are a lot of Indians in Cran Coley, and the people I babysat for are Indians. Anyway, my dad told me to get the kids and go outside, and he would meet me there. He was skeptical as he might be, but as soon as he stepped foot in the house, he heard what I was hearing. He checked things out, and when he and my stepmom got upstairs, she admittedly noticed something that made all of this a little scarier. You see, Roma, the lady I babysat for, was Catholic and hung crosses above each bedroom door. When I was up there, they were fine, but when they got up there, all the crosses were turned upside down. Now, what many don't know is that an upside down cross is a sign of the devil or his demons. Later, when she got home, she informed us that she had been trying to get rid of the spirit for years. She tried moving, but the ghost must have attached itself to something in the house, or maybe to even one of the children. So, she finally had a priest come bless her home. That only made it angrier than it already was, I guess, because about a year later, her new house caught on fire, killing the infants I once babysat, who we like to call puddles, and her newborn child. The police could not find the cause of the fire, but the only thing that survived were the crosses above each door. The two girls in Roma doorway crosses were fine, but the crosses above the infant's room were turned upside down once again. Perhaps the first time was a warning, or maybe he was just playing games with us. I'll never understand. The only thing I know is that I won't ever tamper with the other side again. I've not told anyone this before, due to the fact that it is hard to believe, and plus, it happened to me when I was young. I do not know if you would consider it a ghost encounter or not, but I'm going to tell you the happenings to me anyway. I live in West Virginia, and when I was 9 years old, my brother and I shared a room. We had two beds in the room, separated by a window in the middle of them. 
We had settled down for bed this particular night to go to sleep. I could not have been asleep long when I awoke to a rapping like sound at our window. I laid in my bed, not moving a muscle for some reason, and I just could not move. I tried my best to move and even scream my brother's name, but could not. And the weird thing is, what was going to happen had not even happened yet. While I was going through the state of mind, I guess I could hear knocking on the window from the outside. Whatever it was would knock twice in the window, wait a minute, and knock twice again. After this went on for a while, I was finally able to move on, and when I got up to look out the window to see what was knocking, all I could see were these two big red circular eyes looking right back at me. I was petrified. I went right back into the state where I could not move. It was like those eyes had me hypnotized. When I was finally able to move, I just laid back down. The whole night the knocking continued, two knocks at a time, and a few minutes later, the same thing. This went on for nights, and the same thing was there. Every night, when I would look out the window, there would be these two red hypnotizing eyes. This went on for about a week, and then all of a sudden, it just stopped, and it never happened again after that. When I got older, I started hearing stories about a creature in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. They called it the Mothman. And every time I would hear one of these stories, it would be described as having big red eyes. Then there was really no doubt in my mind that what was visiting me and my brother all these nights was in fact this creature. Because when I was nine, we lived in Bluefield, West Virginia. To this day, I have never forgotten those nights when I was visited by what I believe is that creature. A lot of weird things go on around our home. My grandparents' house is also a little strange. I've experienced many things numerous times at both my house and my grandparents' house. First of all, when I was six years old, I was awakened by a raspy humming sound. I sat up in my bed, wiped my eyes, and looked to the left of my bed. Sitting there in a rocking chair with a baby was a woman dressed in an old-fashioned type gown. She was also wearing a bonnet and had her face turned towards the baby. I thought it may have been my mom, so I whispered mom, and when the lady in the chair looked at me, her eyes glowed red, so I yelled louder for my mom to come to me, and when she came to the door, the woman disappeared, but this chair was still there, very faintly, and rocking slowly. I never told anyone except my mom about this, and when my younger cousin was six, she reported seeing the same exact thing to me. One winter when the electric was off, my cousin accompanied me as I went to take a shower in the old house. Because it was the only one with a gas water heater, I ran nothing but hot water into the bathtub and got in. The water wasn't scolding hot, but very warm. I heard whispering and asked my cousin if it was her. She said no. I heard it again, only louder this time. I became alarmed and listened more closely. This time it was very loud and very clear. The whispering was the Lord's Prayer. I was very scared and I couldn't make myself move. The water became very cold and the whispering grew louder. I told my grandparents and parents what happened and they shrugged it off. My grandparents reported hearing gospel music, preaching, the Lord's Prayer in the old house. My papa was going to take a nap one day and felt the bad move and saw an indentation as if someone were sitting beside him on the bed. Many other things happened, but these are only a few. If anyone is interested, I'll post more later. My story begins and then my belief was finally confirmed. On a trip that my wife and I took to the Jefferson Hotel in Jefferson, Texas in September 2003. This town is very unique and small and has a very historical feel to it. Every building has a historical marker dating back to the 1800s. The town has a sprawling history dating back to the 1800s when steamboat travel is very popular off the Mississippi River into the bayou and one of the main means of transportation at the time. This town has also the reputation of being one of the most haunted towns in Texas and the United States. We really did not know anything about Jefferson, but we were told through an acquaintance that the hotel in town had a haunted history. 
I really wanted to confirm my belief and acquire good evidence of the paranormal spirit world. I've always believed that ghosts are indeed spirits or entities of people who for some reason have not passed to the other side, that they are stuck in limbo between the physical dimension world that we live in and our physical state and the spiritual world that we pass on to. We traveled from San Antonio, Texas to the Jefferson Hotel, which is about a 440 mile trip. We arrived on a Friday afternoon and planned on staying three days and nights. We had booked three different rooms in the hotel that were rumored to be very haunted. All these rooms had recent paranormal activity in them. The hotel was very plain looking from the outside, but the inside was very exquisite due to the way they had decorated with many antique pieces of furniture spread around the hotel. All the rooms are decorated differently to where you feel like you're in another hotel. The hotel has I believe 23 rooms that you can stay in and about half of those are rumored to be haunted by spirits. I had heard a story that a psychic had once ventured into the hotel and said that there were seven spirits in the hotel. For our first night, we stayed in room six. The room was very quaint and had a queen size bed in it along with an antique tub that stood by itself in the bathroom. At first, Nothing happened, which dampened my hopes, but then at 11.30 p.m., things started to happen. However, they only happened to myself. We were lying in bed with the lights off and the television on. The television was located on a dresser at the foot of the bed facing us. I was lying on the side of the bed, closest to the one window in the room. There was enough distance between the bed and the wall for someone to walk. I had exposed my right arm resting along my side and slightly off to the side of the bed. Suddenly, something began to pull the hairs on my arm. I felt an electrical sensation, such as that when you acquire static electricity. I looked down in disbelief, but I could not see anything. I then nudged my wife and told her what was happening to me. She started to laugh, thinking that I was trying to scare her or something. Just then, while she was talking, I felt a small woman's or girl's hand and fingers drag itself all the way up my arm from the tip of my fingers to almost my shoulder. It felt like a woman because it was a small hand. This really got my attention. I then jumped out of bed, telling my wife what had just happened. She of course could not feel or see anything and thought I was making up the whole situation. I then had the feeling that someone was standing in the corner between the bed and the wall staring at us. I had the distinct feeling that the ghost was a woman or girl because it seemed to be small and unobtrusive. This lasted for about 5 minutes and then it stopped with me no longer having the feeling that the ghost was in the room with us. I remember it upset me that my wife was not encountering anything. Nothing else happened that night even though I had expected it too. The next morning we moved across the hall to room 12 which had a very grandiose kingside poster bed in it. The room was also quite larger than room 6. I really was waiting for the opportunity for something to happen so that I could look at researching it more. I have to admit that I had been slightly alarmed from my experience in room 6. Well, nothing happened in room 12, but something did later happen that night in the hallway just outside. I had become bored watching television with my wife and decided to go out into the hallway around 1am that night. I ended up sitting in an antique couch that is at the end of the hallway, pushed up against a door that goes out into the front balcony. The hotel was working on the balcony and I locked the door and pushed the couch up against it to block the door. The door had a glass pane that covered approximately the top half of the door, enabling a person to be able to stare outside into the main street or the buildings across the street. Well, the street was very dark and there was no activity at all in the street. It was very quiet at the time. I kept hearing noises in the hallway every time I looked down or away. It was strange that noises would happen only if I was not directly staring down at the hallway at the time. The hotel is very long, front to back, and narrower in width. At one point, I heard a noise down the hallway and looked down with nothing happening or being seen. Then I heard a noise outside and looked again to see nothing. I then heard the noise down the hallway again and turned to look. When I did this, Something then knocked the glass behind me with three taps suddenly. I admit that I jumped about three feet because it startled me so badly. When I turned around to look, there was nothing there. I walked back to the window and the door and looked out again. Again, I did not see anything at all. 
I then went to get my wife and told her to sit in the couch a few minutes to see if anything would happen. Of course, she came back in after 10 minutes and told me that nothing had happened to her. This again was very frustrating to me because I began to think that the spirits were only trying to communicate with me. Nothing else happened that night and we went to bed. The next day we moved into room 19 which is rumored to be one of the most haunted rooms in the hotel. The maids were in the hallway as I walked down to put our bags in the room. Room 19 sits in the upstairs hallway all the way to the rear on the left side of the hallway. The maids began to tell the story of room 19. They said that a blonde lady spirit haunts the room and that the bathroom is haunted. When a person goes into the bathroom, you are supposed to run the hot water in the bathtub in the sink at the same time and then close the door and turn out the light. The spirits are supposed to turn off the water sometimes and you are supposed to be able to see the words in the mirror when you go back in and turn on the light. As the maids were telling me the story in the hallway, a woman suddenly stepped out of one of the rooms adjacent to room 19. This woman began to tell me that her friend had stayed in room 19 the previous night and that they had brought a Ouija board with them. She told me that they had been trying to summon the spirits of the hotel. They had asked the board if there was a spirit that haunts the room and what the spirit's name was. She said that the board had told them that yes, there was a spirit and the spirit's name was Laura, which had spelled out. When the board had stopped, the woman's friend had been lying on her stomach on the bed watching the other two people on the floor do the board when something suddenly grabbed her exposed legs from behind and pinned her down to the bed for a few seconds. The woman had not been able to move and was terrified by this. Later that night, the woman had grabbed her pillow and blanket and went downstairs to spend the rest of the night with the desk clerk that was there all night. Apparently, other things happened to the woman in the room to make her want to do this from what the woman explained to me. This really got my attention and I could not wait to conduct our research of room 19. We also were the only guests in the hotel that night and the desk clerk went home around 9 p.m. My wife and I ended up doing the bathroom thing right away. When we first went into the bathroom, there was nothing in the mirror over the sink and the bathroom was very clean. I then turned on the hot water in the bathtub and sink, turn off the light and close the door. Well, the water never quit running and after about three or four minutes, I went back into the bathroom and turned on the light. My eyes were in amazement at the words that had suddenly appeared in the mirror. The mirror had been steamed up by the hot water, but the words were very clear in a sort of film on the mirror. The words read help Judy help and the word murder was written backwards in the mirror on the bottom. At first, I thought this was a joke and I had my wife come in and smear the film on the mirror with her fingernails to where it was literally smeared all over the mirror. I felt that if there was some kind of chemical in the mirror, that it would be smeared the next time we did the experiment. Again, I went through the process and again, the water never shut off or anything while we waited. When I went back in, I was truly amazed. The words had appeared in the mirror exactly as they appeared before without any distortion at all. This really freaked us out and I really had the feeling something paranormal was taking place there in that room. We had decided to stay up late into the night, since we would be alone in the hotel that night. We asked the desk clerk to unlock most of the rooms in the hotel so that we could walk into any of them should we hear or see something. The desk clerk did this and we followed around as she did this. When she got to room 6, the room we stayed in on our first date, she put the master key in the lock and unlocked the door. She then began to push on the door and it would not open or budge. I was standing about 15 feet behind her, watching her, and she pushed on the door and got a scared look on her face. She said, oh, oh no, not again. I then began to walk towards her and ask what was wrong. When I got up to her, the door suddenly opened. We all stared at the open door in disbelief. I then walked into the room, but I saw nothing or felt anything out of the normal. The desk clerk then left shortly after that. My wife and I decided around 1 a.m. to sit in a couch in the middle of the upstairs hallway and wait for things to happen. Of course, nothing did, since we were sitting there prepared for anything. I then got up and decided to go downstairs to the lobby. When I was in the lobby, I had the distinct impression of being watched by more than one person and I kept turning around to look, expecting someone to be standing there. I got this really weird feeling 
and I decided to go back upstairs. When I got upstairs, I decided to go into room 14, which has a bed rumored to be haunted in it. This is a queen size bed with an ornate, sculpture wood headboard that goes almost to the ceiling. The bed is actually kind of spooky the more you kind of look at it. I did not turn on the light when I went in because the hallway light was bright enough under the door for me to see. When I got into the room, I immediately got a chill from the room. Something then seemed to draw me to the bed. For some reason, I went and sat down on the edge of the bed. Nothing at first happened, but then the bed suddenly began going up and down as if someone were pushing on the mattress underneath me. It felt like the mattress were breathing as if a person were lying on the bed, breathing heavily. This really alarmed me because beds are not supposed to do this per the realm of science. I asked if my wife come in the room and sit on the bed. I remember my wife saying when she entered the room how cold it was. She did lie down on the bed and said that it was really cold on the bed, but she did not feel anything. She did not lie there that long. We both went back outside in the hallway. I had the feeling that spirits were around us, watching us, even though nothing else happened that night. The next morning, I got up around 9am before my wife did. I ended up sitting in the rocking chair in the room. I started to read a journal of other people's experiences in the room of the hotel. The hotel lends itself to patrons if you're interested in seeing what other people have seen. I decided to do the bathroom test one more time, for old times sake, to see if anything else would happen. I went in and did the same thing. At first, nothing happened, but then, when I sat back in the rocking chair, I could hear physically the water faucets turn off slowly on both the bathtub and sink. I then waited to see if I could hear anything else. There was this very eerie silence in the room, except for the breathing of my wife sleeping in bed. Suddenly, a woman's voice began to moan over and over the woods O, oh, which sounded like a broken record, repeating itself over and over. This did not sound sexual either, as some people may think in reading this. It actually sounded very sad, and it was not very fast. This sound, or voice, was kind of loud but it did not wake my wife. I was too startled at the time to wake my wife. My curiosity was in trying to figure out exactly where the sound was originating. I looked around the room in all directions and finally decided the noise was coming from behind the window shade by the window. I walked over and the noise did seem to get louder there. As I stood by the window, the sound seemed to be coming from behind the shade, between the shade and the closed window. The sun was shining outside, but since we had the shade pulled down, the room was kind of dark and gloomy with only one light on. I then reached for the shade and pulled it back. When I did this, the sun then entered the room. As this happened, the water faucet suddenly turned again and the water came back on in the bathroom. The woman's voice also suddenly stopped. I then walked over to the bathroom in disbelief at what just happened. I looked in the bathroom and it was very cold in there with the same steamy words in the mirror. I then went back to my wife and woke her up screaming and told her what just happened. Again, she looked at me in shock and disbelief. I was indeed very frustrated that I had not woken her up to hear what I had heard. It definitely would have gotten her attention. About a half hour later, we were putting our stuff together to leave. My wife was in the bathroom and I was putting my contact lenses in, using the mirror in the room. I remember having all sorts of problems trying to do this because something kept knocking the lens off my finger. My wife screamed look and I turned around. The light was swinging back and forth from the ceiling as if someone had grabbed it and swung it. My wife was so happy that she had finally experienced something. My wife had also asked the spirit earlier when we got into room 19 if it would swing the light at some time to acknowledge its presence in the room and that the female spirit knew we were there. Spirit had answered our request. My name is Jamie. It was late May and I was at my friend's, Anna's birthday party. It was a sleepover. Around five or six giggling girls showed up for a night of pizza and movies. Although we were all excited and jumpy from eating pizza and consuming vast amounts of pop and ice cream, I decided I would turn in as I was really tired and they were watching a movie I didn't really enjoy much. They were all in the TV room, 
just down the hall and to the right from where I had set my sleeping bag in the family room. The floor was hard and I was uncomfortable, but I tried my best to drift off. I was closest to the dining room, which was an extension to the family room and ended in a dead end. I'd stretched myself right in front of the entrance, so there was no possible way anyone could get into or out of the dining room without stepping over me. Also, once they had stepped past me, there was no way out again without stepping over me a second time. I sat up for a moment because I thought I heard someone breathing. I looked around the room, but it was empty. Across the hall, the basement door was slightly ajar, and I heard my friends laughing and talking in the TV room. I sighed and lay back down, finally able to close my eyes. I awoke only minutes later to a thud in the room. It sounded as though someone with heavy boots was deliberately stomping on the floor towards me. I assumed it was Anna or one of the other girls trying to scare me. I heard them stomp to the edge of my sleeping bag and step over me. Whoever it was, they were clumsy because they stepped on my arm and a few strands of my hair, causing me to wince in pain. I heard the boots stomp to the corner of the dead end dining room and stop. As I said before, there was no way a person could go into the dining room and then step back out without having to walk over me, and judging by the person's boots, they would make a lot of noise doing so. I opened my eyes and was startled. No one was in the dining room, behind the table or under the chairs. In fact, the whole living room area was empty and silent, except for my heavy breathing. At that, I picked up my pillow and bolted towards the TV room, where my friends had fallen fast asleep, the movie credits rolling by lighting the room a faint blue. I laid down, far as I could from the hallway, and after stealing a blanket from a sleeping Anna, fell asleep. I wrote previously about the place I work, and all the ghostly happenings there. Up until now, I've not seen a full apparition, only shadowy figures and strange sounds. The other night, myself, my assistant, I will call her Amy and a maintenance guy Robert were working in the area where most of the activity occurs. It was 11.30pm and we decided to take a smoke break. I need to explain the layout of the building for this to make sense. Our building is smoke free so we have to go outside to a smokehouse. In order to get there, there is a long tiled corridor about 50 feet long leading to the door. There are no fences or areas along the corridor. The three of us headed to the smokehouse and exited the heavy safety door. Amy was first, I was second, and Robert was last. Just as Robert came through the door, Amy turned and gave a startling scream. I turned, and right behind us was a woman. What made her appearance so shocking was we had not seen anyone walking behind us down the corridor, and there was no place for her to have come out of. Also, as she walked on the blacktop, there was a loud sharp clicking of her high heels. I fell back against the wall of the building and was speechless as she walked by. What scared me the most was one, her clothing. She dressed in all black, black skirt, shoes, coat, gloves, and a large 1940s style hat with a veil covering half her face. And two, where did she come from and why did she not acknowledge us? Amy had screamed and yet she did not turn her head look at us or acknowledge us at all. After she had walked by us to the parking lot, I told Robert to see if she got into a car. I ran after her, but within 10 seconds of us seeing her, she was gone. Needless to say, we were all pretty shaken up that night. The next day we scouted the building for a woman who matched that build and asked people if they knew of someone who wore that style of hat. Everyone said no. This is not the first supernatural occurrence in this building but it is the most intense to date. I should add that one of our old employees said our description of this woman sounds like the founder's wife. She died in 1957. I've posted to this website before and have something else I would like to share. It was 1986 and I was 18 years old when this occurred. My sister and I were on our way home from a Bruce Springsteen concert and I'd fallen asleep in the car. I had a very vivid dream that my boyfriend at the time was involved in a car accident. So vivid as a matter of fact that I dreamt that there were four people in the car. Him and his friend Sean and two girls that I did not know. 
I woke up and said out loud, Bobby's been in an accident. I didn't get the impression that it was fatal, but that they were hurt. My sister said that it was just a dream and to not be upset, but I knew in my heart that it wasn't. When I got home, it was pretty late, probably about 1.30 a.m. I went into my bedroom to get changed, all the while resisting the urge to call Bobby and confirm what I already knew. I felt that if it was indeed just a dream, it was too late to call though. As I was wrestling with this, my phone rang and it was Bobby telling me that he and Sean had been in a car accident. That in and of itself was strange, but he had also been cheating on me and there were two girls in the car with them. No one was hurt too badly, just as I had thought, but there were injuries. Just thought I'd share. Thanks for listening. Hi, my story is very personal as it was not a haunted house I lived in as a child, but a visit from my deceased granddad. Just to outline why I believe it came to me was that I was raised by both him and my grandmother in England from 9 days old till 10 years old. For all intents and purposes, they were my parents. I was 14 in 1976 and my granddad had been slowly going downhill from his battle with sclerosis of the liver. He had been in a hospital for a couple of months, and we knew he wouldn't be spending that Xmas with us. He died at 3.58 a.m. on October 7, 1976, with my grandmother by his bedside. She had all the monitors, IVs, tubes, pumps, and everything else that was keeping him alive removed, so that he may die with dignity in a side room, privately, without the impersonal ambience of intensive care. I was devastated about this loss and automatically went into a crying fit. This went on for about two weeks. I didn't eat, sleep much, stayed out of school, and in general became very ill and depressed. I vaguely recall the funeral but was very overcome with emotion. I was a 14 year old girl who had lost the most important man in my life and it was killing me. One day, I recall getting up to go to the bathroom and hearing my mom telling my dad that they should take me to a psychiatrist due to my emotional state. I went back to bed and cried, telling my granddad that I wish he was here, eventually crying myself to sleep. Now, most nights before going to bed, my dad would check up on me and in the half asleep, half awake state, I was aware of his visits. This particular night, I was turning over, but found that I was stuck on my bed, on my right side and totally unable to move. It was that dead weight type of feeling one gets with a tingling sensation, like when your leg falls asleep but this had no sensation, just weight. I was scared and this caused me to look across directly at my bedroom door. In the doorway, dimly lit by my nightlight, I saw the dark grey, not black figure of a heavy set man outlined but yet I could see through it, kind of. The left arm was outstretched towards me but I dare not to move. After what now seems roughly 30 seconds to a minute, the shape disappeared and I felt a sense of calm. I was hungry and fixed a cheese and pickle sandwich for myself. I went back to bed, but oddly enough, this incident didn't bother me really. I woke up the next day, showered, dressed, put a little makeup on to hide the bug eyes I had, and went downstairs. My mom was washing dishes and my dad was reading the paper and they both commented on my presence and more so, state of apparent well-being. I knew I guessed deep down that it was my granddad who had visited me, but although I had no proof or words to back it up from granddad, I still wanted to test my feeling. I asked my dad if he had come in my room, and he said no. He said, we didn't hear any noises, crying, etc., so we thought we would let you sleep in peace. I said, well, in that case, it was granddad who came to see me. With that remark, my mom threw the dish towel into the sink and said, that's it, we're taking her to a doctor. Fortunately, my dad stepped in and suggested they hear me out. He believed me, or at least looking back, pacified me, as it obviously made me feel better, so we went along with my visit from granddad's story. My mom didn't believe me, but it didn't matter, I believed it. This isn't the end, although I only had one visit, granddad did appear to my grandmother, ironically. When I called her up to tell her, she went very quiet and said that the very same night, he came to her too. She said she couldn't sleep and went to a study to sort papers approximately 4am, roughly the same hour he had died. 
I don't know what time my visit occurred. She said she felt someone was behind her. She was sitting at his desk, crying, when she felt a gentle touch on her shoulder. She said she brushed it off sharply as it scared her and she turned around. Nothing was there, but she said she felt something. She said she stopped crying and felt better. These were only the two incidents. No one else had a visit from Granddad, but we both know, Gran and I, that he came to visit us for comfort. We loved him more than anything, and he reciprocated us. My mom fell out with my grandparents, so the closeness was not between them. We both were hit the hardest and he knew it. He came to let us know to go on, I feel, without the suffering that we were both enduring since his death. My grandmother lived until 1995, ironically, dying on her 83rd birthday. My grandmother promised me that if she could, she would visit me after she died. She didn't. I lit two white candles in her apartment. After I had packed it all up and sat there in silence, awaiting her visit, nothing happened. But I know she's okay. She was buried, as per her wish, with her granddad, and they finally were together again. That made me happy. They had been married and in love since 1932, school sweethearts, survived wars and hard times, and now eternally peaceful. Love is very powerful, and although it's hit and miss amongst those whom I tell this to in regards to belief, I know what happened and why. I've seen two of these things, they're called green orbs. I've known people who have seen them, and I've seen videos of them on TV that people have filmed and say that they are ghosts. First time, I was at my grandparents' house, which they seem to think is haunted. They joke about it because they are very religious and have trouble incorporating their beliefs with their senses. I was going to bed and was having to share a bed with my grandfather, who was already long since asleep. I crawled into bed and laid there for a while, my eyes adjusting to the darkness. Eventually, my eyes focused on the brightest object in the room, what appeared to be a reflection. I stared at it for maybe 15 minutes before a realization hit me. It was the brightest thing in the room. I considered maybe there's something outside brighter that it's shining off of, but my grandparents live in the sticks and have only one light outside, and it's quite some ways from the house. I had originally thought that it was a reflection from the brass hinges on a door. After deducing that the light was of its own source, I investigated. I got out of bed and walked up to it. The closer I got, the more apparent it became that this was not a mere reflection. It didn't move much. It hovered there, like a green rip in space and time, waiting. I experimented a little by turning on the light. It stayed there for a split second. After the light came on, and then disappeared. I wasn't able to go back to sleep for a while. Second time I actually saw one, I was at my in-laws, lying in bed with my wife. It was near the ceiling above our heads. I woke my wife up and asked her if she saw it. She said she did, then went back to sleep. I watched it until it disappeared. After it was gone, I woke her back up and asked her if she could still see it. She said that she could not and went back to sleep. In between those times, I was at a known haunted house, unknown to us, but known to the occupants. We were staying the night, and while some of us were in the kitchen, two of my friends burst out of their rooms, asking for flashlights or candles. They refused to go to sleep without them. They told us of an object we originally thought was a glow-in-the-dark mini frisbee, only it didn't move like a frisbee. I don't know what these things are, but I would very much like to study them. I was around 10 or 11 years old, growing up in Georgia when this started to take place. I lived with my parents, two brothers and two sisters in a rather nice ranch style brick home. My father had built this home when I was around 4 or 5 years old and no one had ever passed away in it. My two brothers were 5 and 6 years older than I. One sister was 7 years older and the other sister was around 1 or 2 years old when this happened. This all started very suddenly. Me and my two brothers slept in one room, in custom made bunk beds that my father had built into the room. They were built in an upside down L shape, with the main bunks on the right and a single bed coming off the main bunks from the head of the beds going towards the left. 
My oldest brother slept in the single bed. My other brother slept in the bottom bunk, and I slept on the top bunk. There were two windows over the single bed that my oldest brother slept in, and during the summer, these were kept open so that the attic fan will pull cool air in. Sorry for so much detail. It helps one to understand the rest of the story. One night we had gone to bed, and around 2 3 in the morning, my oldest brother was jarred awake by a tremendous pounding on the other side of the brick wall, where he slept, outside. He woke both of us up very quietly, and we listened as the pounding went across the wall, as if someone was walking the length of the house and back, pounding on the brick wall as they went. Now, this wasn't like someone was pounding with their fists or even kicking the house. We probably couldn't have even heard someone who was hitting the wall with their fists or feet. No. This sounded as someone had a 15 or 20 pound rock or something very heavy and solid and was pounding the wall with it as they walked back and forth, with the impacts coming approximately 1 to 2 seconds apart. After some very frightening few minutes had passed, my older brother slipped into our father and mother's room and awakened our father, telling him about what was going on. My father, not pleased with being awake at this hour, didn't really believe him at first but quietly made his way to our room and where the pounding was still going on. As this was summer, he looked out the open window through the screen, but couldn't see anyone. He then proceeded to collect his 20 gauge pump shotgun, and slipped out the door on the opposite side of the house from the pounding, to try to sneak up on whoever was doing it. As daddy turned the corner of the house with the shotgun at the ready, the pounding suddenly stopped. Daddy had a flashlight of course, and there was nothing to hide behind for at least 30 to 40 feet, where a cornfield started. He searched around for a bit, but couldn't find anything and came back in. As soon as he came in the house, the pounding started again. He went out immediately. Whenever he turned the corner, it stopped again. This was repeated several times, always with the same results. These happenings then continued for the next two to three months, almost every night. My father did not find anything or anyone that could account for it. There are also no marks or any kind of evidence to show where the pounding was being done on the bricks. One night my brother that slept underneath me was having a dream about playing basketball in a tournament at school when the pounding started. As the pounding was going up and down the wall, he was dreaming that he had missed a shot and that the coach had called him to the sideline. He dreamed that the coach was mad at him and while asleep, he was moaning and making some kind of noise. My oldest brother who slept under the windows, was trying to listen to the pounding to figure out where it was at during that time, and when my other brother started moaning, he reached over and grabbed him by the hair of the head and started pulling his hair to try to shut him up. At this time in the dream, my other brother was dreaming that the coach had grabbed his hair and was pulling it for him, missing the shot. We had always laughed about this happening. Anyway, my father never did catch anyone or anything pounding on the wall, and we still wonder to this day what it could have been. If anyone out there has had anything similar happening with pounding on the walls and moving back and forth, I would appreciate hearing from them. This is really weird because it happened about two days ago. My house doesn't have any history of weird stuff or hauntings. That's what made it strange. I lived in this house for about six years now. I'm 17 and I've yet not experienced anything like this. It's not really a haunting, but I thought it was really weird. It was about 1 a.m., and I was in my room on the internet. Both my parents were asleep, and nobody else was in the house, other than me. My parents were in their room, which is all the way across the house, the living room, the kitchen, the family room, and a small hallway separate my room from theirs. The only lights that were on were the lights in my room, because I was on the computer, as I was looking through the website, I heard my name whispered in my ear, so I stopped and looked around to see who had whispered, but saw nobody. So then, I tried to get chills and decided to go to bed, so I turned off the computer, and this was now about 1.20am. As I was getting ready to go to bed, the phone started to ring, so I turned on the lights of the hallway to go to the living room. As I went to go see who it was in my caller ID, it read unavailable. So then I picked up the phone. When I picked up the phone, I said hello, but nobody answered. Again, I said hello, but again, nobody answered. 
I started to get pissed, but I tried to listen to see if I could hear anything. What I heard gave me chills. As I started to listen, I heard whispering that sounded like mumbling. I couldn't make out what was being said. It was like someone or something wanted to tell me something, but couldn't. It was really freaky. So I hung up the phone and I just sat on the couch looking around for anything unusual. When I finally got up to go back to my room, I got the worst feeling that somebody or something was watching me. As I got to my room, I went straight to sleep. The next morning felt like if nothing had happened. This is the house of many tenants. The house is well over 200 years old and has many tenants over the years. I was 18 when we first moved in. It was a four bedroom house with high ceilings, an attic and basement. My parents and nephew had the two downstairs bedrooms, which left me to the upstairs rooms. The first night we moved in, my friend and I were setting up the upstairs rooms as my bedroom. As we were standing in the hall by the bathroom, a little boy ran out of the other bedroom, ran down the hall towards us, peeked out around the corner and ran into the bathroom. We went into the bathroom and saw that no one was there. Let me explain, this couldn't have been my nephew because he wasn't even in there at the time and there was no other small boys in the house. Also, sometimes I've seen a man who dressed in what I can only call colonial walk up the stairs and walk into the attic. The weird thing is, I've never seen him walk up the old wooden stairs. Sometimes you could hear someone moving boxes and stuff around in the attic as if they were looking for something. All the people who had stayed in the house in the span of six years that had lived there would never sleep upstairs by themselves, and many reported the feeling as if someone was going to push them down the staircase as they stood at the top of the staircase. On more than one occasion, you could hear a woman crying, the toilet flushing, and door slamming. My older sister stayed with us for a short while. During her stay, she had the shower doors cave in on her, pinning her to the wall, and a fan cord lightly wrapped around her neck during her sleep, in which she had found the following morning. Foul smells and shadows were a constant reminder of the ghost's presences. I was glad when we moved from the house because I found it very unnerving and somewhat frightening. I don't think I've ever had a sound night's sleep. In 1996, my boyfriend Daniel was living in an old New Zealand city called Dundalin. This city has a lot of old houses and a lot of history. He lived with his previous girlfriend in one of a pair of old terrace flats, which were cold and didn't get much sun during the day, but it was cheap, an important consideration when you're a poor student. It was the couple's flatmates that first noticed something strange. She has to be something of an amateur mystic, reading auras and such like, and she claimed to sense more presence in the house. But the really scary stuff didn't start until Daniel went away for a couple of weeks and the two girls were in the house by themselves. They noticed the cats were frequently taking fright and chasing something which the girls could not see. It got worse and once the presence pushed one of the girls down the stairs from behind. Finally, as Daniel's girlfriend lay in bed one night, she felt something get into bed with her, a cold presence which touched her thigh. While Daniel was still away, the two girls had the place exercise and the incident stopped, but not for long. Shortly after Daniel's return, the strange occurrences started again, the cats freaking out and other weirdnesses. The flatmate moved out, leaving Daniel and his girlfriend to deal with it alone. In an attempt to exercise the ghost a second time, the couple burned incense around the house, especially near a certain doorway which seemed to be central to the occurrences. But as the two watched the circling smoke, they noticed it cut off, just disappeared into nowhere, a few inches away from the wall, as if the smoke were traveling through some kind of invisible doorway. In the end, they moved out, unable to handle the atmosphere of the house any longer. I don't know who moved in afterwards, nor what became of the ghost. This happened while I was visiting the city of Guadalajara. When I was about 11, I'd gone on vacation with my grandparents. They didn't have a phone installed at their house because it was only a vacation home, not where they lived. So, one morning, my grandmother and I left to the phone central where you can pay to make long distance phone calls. 
Anyway, while we were waiting, an old lady approached us and began conversing with my grandmother. She would put her hands on mine and my grandmother's, and we both would pull our hands from underneath hers because she was so cold. She also had a very beautiful necklace with the Virgin of Guadalupe on the side. The image itself looked so real, like if it could move. Well, she was asking us to go to a church not far from our house to donate some food for a church carnival to raise money to repair a huge hole that had taken part of the main aisle. So, we agree, and she asked us to ask for her by name. The old woman had also told my grandmother exactly what to prepare. So, when the day came that we had to go, we set off to the church, and once we arrived, we asked the priest for this woman. The priest went silent for a moment, and then said in a very low voice, She is no longer with us. I didn't understand until he asked us to go into the office where he could explain. This old woman had promised many years before to take a certain food to the carnival. She fell ill and never was able to attend because she had passed away. Interestingly enough, the priest had also stated that we were not the first one this had happened to. Interesting story, and I'm glad you guys were able to read it. Thanks for your time. I've always believed in ghosts, and now, I live in a hundred-year-old haunted building. I moved in with my boyfriend a year and a half ago, in July. The night I moved in, I had an experience that was a bit unnerving in the light of day. I received a call from a friend that evening, and she asked if I could take her kids to the airport in the morning. I said sure I will, and set my alarm to go off at 5am so I could go get her and get to the airport on time for her. Well. My alarm went off, but I was so tired from the move, I forgot why I was going off and fell back to sleep. An hour later, I felt the bed shaking as if someone were trying to get me up. I remember thinking what now, and then fell back to sleep, only to be woken up 20 minutes later by the phone ringing. My friend said she would get a ride from her sister. After the call, I looked over to the kitchen and saw a gray figure in the door that seemed to shake its head at me. I immediately knew he was what tried to wake me up, so I could keep my promise to my friend. He seemed to have the best intentions, and I didn't see him again after that. He seemed very friendly. We then moved down to the second floor, and I soon found out. We have a ghost here too. This one likes to pace up and down a short hallway between the door and the living room. He also paces along the southwest wall of the living room sometimes. I get the impression that he's a man in a brown pinstripe suit and bowler hat and has a mustache and deep set eyes. He stands about my height, around 5 foot 8 inches. When we first moved in, he would pace the hallway, coming further and further out into the living room and bedroom. It's a studio apartment. He seemed highly agitated. My boyfriend saw him more than me, and a few times he would arrive home from work and the top dead bolt would be locked. We never use that lock, as it is very difficult to open with the key from the outside. My boyfriend works graveyard at a 24-hour store, and I am alone here at night for four nights a week. One night, I noticed that he was coming further and further out into the living room, and he was giving off vibes that were not friendly. I've had enough of this now, and looked at the hallway and said, Listen, the year is 2001, not 1903, or whatever year you think it is. Times have changed, and it's okay for people to live together without being married, so lay off of it. I felt a feeling of surprise from the hallway, and have not had a problem from him since. I related this to the apartment manager, with whom we had become good friends with, and she said that she had seen him too, and I was right in my impressions of what he looks like, as that is who she had seen in her place when her son lived in the studio. She has also seen him in the hallway outside her apartment door. She said that there are several ghosts in the building, and she is not surprised to hear stories about them, as she has also had experiences with them when she first moved into the building before she was manager. It's an interesting place to say the least. The incidents that you're about to read happened to me when I was a college student several years ago. We had inherited an old apartment from my grandfather, and two years after his death, our family moved in. The fact is that it was okay in the beginning, 
Weird things started to happen soon after my dad transferred to another town, and my parents left both me and my sister in the apartment. During the day, we could hear noises coming from the ceiling, and we wondered what the neighbors upstairs were up to. We didn't give much thought to that until we started hearing them in the middle of the night. It sounded as someone was dragging chairs and tables around the apartment. We knew our neighbors upstairs. They were an old couple and had one son who occasionally paid them a visit. One night, the noise went so wild that we decided to run upstairs to complain about it. I rang the bell several times and banged at the door. No one answered it. Apparently, there was nobody home. This situation went on for months and we finally talked to our neighbors. The old lady was baffled and claimed she would never do such a thing. That was crazy. Anyone who came to our home would hear the noises. One morning, my maid was working in the kitchen when she heard someone open the living room door and walk along the hallway. She was scared to death, but she never thought it could be a ghost. She quickly took out a knife and searched the whole apartment for a burglar. Again, there was no one there. It was not uncommon to sense someone watching us or in the room. Just a presence. Once, I was writing a paper and I clearly felt someone behind me. As I turned around, I saw nobody. My sister was so afraid to stay alone in the apartment that she would wait for me downstairs. The most frightening thing was to come. We were sleeping in our bedrooms when we heard bangings inside my closet. They were so loud that I woke up and jumped out of my bed immediately, thinking the shelves inside had tumbled. When we opened the door, we saw nothing. The closet was in the corner of the room, and we didn't have neighbors next door. It couldn't have come from outside the apartment either. The noises were so real that we didn't doubt that they were there. When we sent someone around us, we didn't wonder if they were ghosts, because the whole thing was so real. The ghost idea only dawned on us on some time later, after the incidents. We are not ghost freaks. Well, after that last incident, I grabbed my mattress and slept in my sister's room. On the next day, I went to a church and brought some holy water with me, which I sprinkled all over the place. Things calmed down for a while. A year later, we moved out and we heard that the family who had bought it moved out one year later. Hi, my name is Lisa. About three years ago, I was in a rehab for about two months. It was up in Lafayette Hills, Pennsylvania. The place was an old 1800s huge mansion where the owner's daughter Eugenia was mentally ill. Back then, they did not know the things they do now, of course, and her wealthy father donated the house and its land to the people in the profession after his daughter hung herself in the main foyer from the grand staircase. The name of the rehab is Eugenia House, and it was, in every way, still her house. The house itself is now used as offices and meeting rooms, some of them original. In fact, most of the house is still original, except the actual rehab which was built off of the house. Anyway, being very into the paranormal, I was extremely interested in the history and to know firsthand if it was in fact haunted. Every time I could, I went in there, listened to the people who had worked there for years, and believed these stories. Some of them would not go in there after dark. Now, I was determined to know. One evening after dinner, me and my friend Brian sneaked off to investigate. It was totally empty as we walked up the main staircase. I was hit with this very cold air all around me. I was really scared, but went up anyway. As we got to the top, we went right into one of the offices. We walked in a little further, and I was so uneasy. As I turned to look at Brian, we both heard shuffling, like books moving around on one of the desks. Then it sounded like a large book fell very hard to the floor. As we turned to run out of the room, I was disoriented and did not know where to go, so I followed Brian. As we fled towards the main staircase, these very big double wooden doors at the top of the stairs that in my whole time there were never closed, and they were so big and heavy, don't know if I could close them without help, slammed shut right behind us. The stairs were very long. As we got to the bottom, we stopped and looked up, and as we did, the cold air hit us very hard, like a winter wind. It felt like it swirled around us on purpose, investigating us. It made us just stand there, in awe almost. Then, after a few minutes that felt like forever, 
we fled out the door. We told the believers in the group, who were amazed, and I'll never forget that. After that, I did not go back in at night, but in the courtyard where we all smoked, you could look into the front windows. One night, shortly after that, I was telling one of the counselors of my tale and peering in the window at the same time. As I spoke, one of the big overhead outside lights would flicker only when I mentioned Eugenia's name. At this point, the counselor was extremely convinced and started to tell me a few stories of his own that he never shared with anyone until me for fear of the staff would think he was being foolish, but neither of us were. Hello, my name is Rob, and a few years ago, I lived in St. John's, Michigan. While I was there, strange things would happen all centered around the very old school called Perrin Palmer. I think there was more than one ghost involved in these hauntings, and they weren't benign. It all started with hearing strange music near these old mobile units. It all came from a small group of them, and I could always hear it after school, and everyone else could too. No one was there at the time not even the janitor. So one day, my friend and I decided to investigate. When we looked inside one mobile unit, we saw a black cat with glowing red eyes. We ran and never looked back. About a year later, the school demolished and a new one was built. Whatever was haunting this school didn't like having its home destroyed. Oh yeah, did I mention the entire school used to hear a train whistle and no train has run in the town for a hundred years? There are no trains within 20 miles of the town. When we were first at Gateway North, the new school, we thought we could get rid of the ghost, but we didn't. At first, all it was was sightings of black cats around the premises of the school, but then more harmful things began to happen. One morning I woke up to deep scratches on my arm. It was like a cat had scathed my arm. Then, on a swing at school, a kid fell while in mid-swing. The kid was pushed. She didn't slip. Ten witnesses saw her fall, and it wasn't an accident. No kid pushed her. She sprained her arm. Two weeks later, another kid under the same circumstances broke his arm. Four more kids were pushed from the same swing, under the same circumstances. Balls were swerving to hit kids in the playground. I left the next year. I haven't been in contact with my friends since. I don't know if it's continuing. I hope not. The story is about my grandma Ruth that passed away in 2002. I loved her so much. Things have been happening up until this day ever since she passed. The strange occurrences that happened to me was that at the time I was living in Portsmouth, Virginia with my father. My grandma said that I could have her bed when she passed, so now I have it. This happened on a Sunday. Me and my other grandma was going to church. But at the last minute, decided not to go. I went back in my room and lay down on my grandma's bed. That's when I thought I heard someone call my name. I knew it sounded like my grandma, but I dismissed it kind of. When I didn't respond to her calling me, I heard her calling me again. That's when I looked up and she was sitting at the foot of my bed, dressed like she would always be, not how she was at the funeral. Now, in this part I don't understand why she said this. She asked if she wanted to fix me something to eat. I was so startled, I screamed and started to kick my feet like a child that was having a tantrum. With me doing that, she just started to fade off and disappeared. A lot of things happened to my mom, but she will have to write up here for herself. Other things that have happened to me, when I was about 10 years old, one night, I wasn't feeling good and I was lying in bed. I went to sleep, but when I woke up, I felt someone tucking me in. I thought it was my mom, so I turned over to see her, but it wasn't her. I just saw this large dark shadow at the end of my bed. I was so scared and just put the covers over my head. Now, this next thing that happened to me, I've been looking on all sorts of sites to see if anyone has ever had this happen to them. Whoever reads this, if this has happened to you, or you know someone that it did happen to, would you write it down to the site? 
I would gladly appreciate it. Here goes. When I was seven or eight, I was in bed at night, and all of a sudden, I felt like someone was in bed with me. I turned to my side, and I saw this man that looked like a troll. He had no color to him. He was just straight white. He was so scary to look at that I turned away and just stayed in bed. I was terrified to move. I didn't go to sleep. I could still feel him near. When light came into my room, from it being morning, I got the courage to look back to see if he was still in the bed, and he was gone. What was that? Growing up after that incident always had me putting teddy bears in the bed with me so that he wouldn't come back. But as I got a little bit older, I got braver, and I said to myself that if he ever did come back, I was going to get him. He hasn't come back. I'm 19 now. Well, that's all I want to write right now. Thank you for reading. I would like you to hear about my horrible encounter with a ghost or unseen being. We're on vacation in Oklahoma, visiting some relatives that I'd never met before. They lived in a thickly wooded area. That evening after supper, and the sun had started settling, my mother and I decided to go for a walk and enjoy the beautiful new scenery we were in. We had been hiking for 20 to 30 minutes, so we were several miles from the house. Suddenly, a breeze swept over us, and before us was a small pond. I looked over into the water and saw a bright face staring back at me. I know that it was not my reflection. I jumped back and turned around, and my mother was nowhere around. I began yelling and calling out to my mother, but got no response. I finally got back to my relative's house and ran in. I asked everyone if they had seen my mother and no one said they had seen her. This alerted my relatives because they had a hundred acres of wooded area and there were snakes and other dangerous animals and the sun had already set. Me, my uncle and his wife, and two of my older cousins headed into the dark woods, all carrying flashlights. We walked towards the pond and hoped she'd still be nearby. I looked up and behind two trees was a bright shining light I walked towards the light and looked behind the tree. There was the same person I had seen in the water, but he wasn't easy to see. It was almost like you could see right through him. I freaked out and screamed, yelling for my relatives to come see. When they arrived, they stopped and watched the ghost float away over the water and into the darkness. Everyone stood in shock of what they saw. After several hours, the woods became draped with heavy fog. We could hardly see what was in front of us. We decided to head back towards the house and call for help. We called the sheriff and he arrived with three other police. All night long, we spent looking and scanning the dark pond water. No sign of my mother. I was so worried. Oddly, no one mentioned to the police what we had seen earlier. I didn't know whether or not to say anything. I did not want to seem crazy to the police, but I wanted to do anything to find my mother. I asked my older cousin Charles if we should say anything about the sighting. He shook his head and said, come on, we didn't see anything, that was probably a firefly. I was totally confused. I knew I would seen a person's face in the water, and then again behind the trees. I knew that everyone else had seen it too. I finally said sheriff. I think there is someone or something in these woods. Then he asked me to explain what I had seen. At sunrise, the family decided to go back to the house and let the police continue their search. I was hesitant, but my family talked me into coming home with them. We walked into the house and I sat down at the table. My aunt made me hot chocolate and asked me if I was alright. I couldn't believe what I had seen and everyone else had seen, and no one was talking about it. I was confused, and started hoping that this was all a nightmare. I drew myself a bath, and climbed in. I cleared the vapor off the window, and just stared. I didn't even know what to do. I wanted to feel hopeful, 
but the demonic stare of the ghost haunted me. I didn't have a good feeling. I kept imagining horrible things happening to my mother. I cried and rubbed water over my face. I prayed that God would help us find her. Several days has passed, and no sign of my mother. A missing persons report was made. I was starting to lose all hope. I felt like I had lost the most important person in my life. I wanted to go look for her myself. The police refused to let anyone else into the woods. Late that night, I heard some footsteps. It kept coming closer. And then I saw a bright light at my door. The door slowly opened, and the same face was standing there. It scared me, and I screamed. It came at me fast and suddenly, and I felt a burning sensation over my body. And then it felt wet. I couldn't breathe. My throat felt like it was closing. I woke up in a hospital bed. My aunt was asleep in the chair next to me. I looked up at the end of the bed. I was so confused. I couldn't remember how I got there. My aunt awoke and told me that I passed out the night before and they couldn't wake me. They said I had bruises all over my body and hand marks on my throat like I had been strangled. Oh my god, it was the ghost from the pond. My aunt looked at me strangely and ran to hit the nurse button. She looked down at me and said, Honey, you have been through a lot of stress. You need to relax. We found your mother. She can't remember anything, but we found her lying next to you. She's here in the hospital too, only three rooms away. What? I want to see her now. I got up and ran to the hall, but was stopped by two nurses. You have to stay in bed, honey, they explained. I sat down and told them that I needed to see her. They began injecting me into the arm with a shot. I started to panic and asked my aunt what was wrong with me. And then I got very dizzy and relaxed. I woke up to a nurse bringing my dinner. She brought two sedatives and a glass of water. I asked her where my mother was, and they said the police were investigating her. Then she came into my room and slowly walked over to my bed. She put her hand on top of mine and asked me if I was feeling okay. I asked her if she was okay, and she told me she was fine. She just doesn't remember much. I asked her if she remembers her walk from the night we were out on a walk together. She said she did, but didn't remember what happened to her after that. I asked her if she saw the face in the pond. She said no, nothing at all. Still to this day, no one knows who or what happened the night of my mother's disappearance or her reappearance. No one knows what really happened. No. Don't laugh, but I believe that a ghost had taken her. I don't know why or what he did it for. It could have just been an evil ghost causing chaos. Police think there's someone behind it, like a kidnapper. And when he tried to return my mother, he saw me and panicked and tried to even kill me. The police had me describe the man's face that I saw. They have yet to find a person. I wish that I knew what really happened that night. It would answer so many questions for me. I wasn't going to share the story because I didn't think it was an actual ghost story. But I thought about it, and I guess it could be. And if not, it's still kind of a weird and interesting incident. When I graduated high school in 1998, I went up to Ohio to visit a friend who graduated a year ahead of me and went up there to go to college. I graduated on the 6th and left on the 8th and stayed there for 10 days. Well, about three nights before I came back, which would have been the night of the 15th, morning of the 16th, I had a dream. In this dream, I woke up in my bed back home and there was this man sitting on my bed. He had dark brown long hair and was clean shaven, wearing a white robe. I was kind of startled at first, and then it turned to curiosity. I asked who he was. He says something like, you know of me, but don't know me, and then goes on saying how we are alike, and that he would be the same, and just a bunch of stuff like that. 
I was still confused because he never said who he was. He was telling me not to worry, that everything will be okay, and just a bunch of stuff that I couldn't figure out. Well, to make a long story short, I just passed out the dream as a weird dream. That was until I got home. I told my mother about it, and she asked when was the dream, and I told her the night of the 15th. She had this weird look on her face, and then showed me this letter. It was dated June 16th, 1998, and it was a letter she wrote to a brother that was born before me, and died after he was born. I knew about him, but never knew the exact details like his birthday. She thinks that it was my older little brother coming to visit me on his birth and death day. And when I heard that, then it all started to make sense. This is my story. After all the stories I read, I wanted to tell my own. It was 1990. We moved from one small town in southeast Kansas to another. To tell you the layout of the house, so you know what I'm talking about. On the front of the house was a large screen and porch. That's where the front door was to the house. When you walked into that door, there were stairs that led up to the second story. That's where my story begins. When we first looked at the house, my sister, who was two years older than me, went upstairs to look at the bedrooms where we would sleep. As we walked through the second door, we saw someone go through the wall. That's where it all started. After we moved in, things started to happen. At night, my dad would hear someone open the front door and walk across the hardwood floor that had carpet on it. He would get up and look. The front door was still dead bolted. I would hear someone walk up and down the stairs all night long. I mainly slept with my sister after that. After about a month, my dad ended up in the hospital, so me and my sister were home alone for a while without her mother there. That's when strange things really started to happen. The entity would start scaring us. It would knock on the back door, open, and slam the cabinets closed. We walked across the upstairs floor, slamming doors. Our poor dog would not even go upstairs. It would sit at the foot and bark and whine. To make a long story short, after my dad got home from the hospital, the thing tried to smother my mom to death. My mom always slept on her stomach. It was from that moment that we decided to move. Someone bought the house and remodeled it. I wonder if they had the same problem as we did. My sister and her family lives in a place that appears to be built on a graveyard. There are stone markers all over her yard. Yesterday, I was over there and accidentally knocked over a large marker and attempted to write it. I could not budge it to get it back in its place, and yet when I visited today, the stone was more erect and there was no signs that had ever been otherwise. My sister also spoke of a lady that used to live there in the 1800s. The lady's name was Kathy, reported to me by my sister. Kathy told her that she was glad to have a family living once more in the house. My mother has reported feeling someone patting her on the back and no one actually being there. I personally have seen a white form in the house in a darker gray form speeding by the window. After bolting the door to the crawl space to the attic securely, the door opened by itself. That happened just yesterday. My brother-in-law reported that when he went into the attic via the crawl space in order to access the roofing, he was pushed down and fell out of the attic. About a month ago, while my sister and her husband were asleep in bed, a small air conditioner that was securely bolted into the window was thrown inward into the bedroom floor. My sister has also reported an instance in which Kathy told her of a hanging suicide that occurred in an old barn structure on the property. My sister was also told that there was an evil person buried on the property underneath a tree outside of her bedroom window. These are honest statements made by various people 
with no mental delusions or anything that will indicate a separation from reality state. You may believe me, or not, but the choice is yours. In late December of 2000, my boyfriend Ryan and his best friend Don moved into the house that Don had grown up in. Their apartment was too cramped during their band practices, and Don's father was willing to make the rent very reasonable. The house is down the street from a very large and very old cemetery and directly across from an old canal. The neighborhood is peaceful and charming most of the time. Before they moved in, they had to fix the house up quite a bit because the last residents had trashed it so badly. They had ripped up the carpet, splattered paint on the walls, and replaced all the blinds with wrapping paper. Naturally, they enlisted my help. As I drove to their new home for the first time, I experienced very unsettling feelings as I drove up and parked. The feelings pervaded the entire time I was in the house. I grew up in a haunted house and have had other experiences with the supernatural, most of them positive. I'm not one to be easily scared by the supernatural, nor do I think that because something frightens me, that is automatically evil. I decided to ignore the feelings because no one else seemed to be bothered. Ryan and Don settled comfortably into their new house, and Don was glad to be back in his childhood home. I became used to the strange sensations I would experience all around the house, even the overwhelming feeling of being watched when I go away in my car ceased to bother me. One night in February, I believe, I was leaving to go back to my house at around 3 a.m. As I fumbled for my keys to unlock my car door, I could feel someone behind me. Suddenly, I heard three loud, stomping footsteps. Thinking that it was possibly some live person intending to harm me, I whirled around and screamed as loudly as I could. There was no one there. Ryan, naturally, came running out of the house. I ran onto the porch and into Ryan's arms. I told him what happened and started sobbing uncontrollably. I was no longer frightened, but I felt an overwhelming sense of sadness. Whoever that is, I remember saying, is very confused. It's a man, and he needs help. I don't know that he realizes that he is dead. Ryan became very thoughtful for a moment. You know, we are surrounded by a cemetery, and people have drowned in the canal. Someone did just a few years ago but I don't know who it was. After that, Ryan and I went both back to my place to spend the night. Don had been visiting his mother. The next day, we told Don what happened. He confirmed that someone had drowned in the canal a few years before, but it was a young girl. I immediately ruled out the young girl. I knew this presence was very masculine. Don also remembered that a very nice man who had lived next door had died suddenly of a heart attack when Don was a child. That seemed like a more plausible candidate, but there was the long history of the canal to consider in the nearby cemetery. Don was dumbfounded by the entire situation. I lived here for the first 15 years of my life and nothing out of the ordinary happened. He reflected for a moment. Well, there was that one time when I had stayed home from school and felt someone looking at me, so I turned around and there was my sister. I said, hey, Bethany, and then remember that she had gone to school that morning and wasn't going to be home for about an hour. The apparition disappeared, and at the regular time, she came home. Well, said Ryan, and there was the Fonzie incident too. Fonzie is a very friendly, sweet-tempered cat that belonged to Don. Apparently, when Don and Ryan were working on the house before they had moved in, the cat was still at their apartment. They had both, on separate occasions, seen Fonzie walking around. I found both the accounts of these rather strange apparitions a bit puzzling. I know that sometimes apparitions of the living are seen, but it is usually when something pivotal is about to happen. Nothing interesting happened before or after these odd apparitions. I thought that perhaps some entity was somehow taking the forms of things that were familiar and loved so as to let them know of its presence without being threatening. Whatever it was, did not seem to me 
like it could have been caused by the same melancholy presence I felt. Over the next few months, nothing much happened. I brought two friends of mine, both of whom, who've had many experiences with the paranormal, over to the house. One of them didn't get any negative feelings or sad feelings from the area at all. Another, whom I've not told about the strange occurrences, was so put off the depressed feeling she got that she wanted to leave almost as soon as she arrived. One thing beyond sensing a spirit worth mentioning did occur in those several months. I was asleep on the couch in the living room while Ryan and Don's man practiced. All of a sudden, Kenny, the bass player, came running up the stairs. He woke me up. Hey, are you alright? He asked. Yeah. Why? I replied sleepily. Because we were sure we heard someone come in the front door. I told him I hadn't heard anything. He proceeded to check all around the house for the suspected intruder and never found anyone or anything. During the summer months, a few torrential downpours caused Ryan and Don's basement to flood, nearly destroying a significant portion of their band equipment. After that incident, they decided to move, yet again. I was staying at my own place, and Don was visiting his mother again. In the middle of the night, Ryan called me in a panic. I just had the strangest experience, he told me. I was asleep on the couch when I was awakened by a baby crying. I sat up and realized that the noise was coming from Don's room. I looked up and stared down the hall. All of a sudden, this white, somewhat blurred figure of a woman came walking out of my room and went into Don's room. Then I heard a woman shushing the baby. Ryan was frightened, but he realized that the strange event was not threatening in any way. We talked about it and agreed that it was most likely some sort of residual haunting. Later. Ryan told Don about the experience and found that Don had witnessed the same event. Ryan and Don had not lived in the house for a few months now. We never figured out exactly who the man outside the house was, or who the woman and the baby were, or what caused the strange apparitions of Bethany and Fonzie. I only wonder if these things still go on in the house, and if the current residents have the powers of observation to notice them. This happened in February 2000, during my junior year of high school. I was in my bed one night, just staring at the ceiling, waiting to fall asleep. That night, for some odd reason, I was lying on the opposite end of the bed. I remember seeing the yellow digital numbers on my TV say 1240 AM. I remember this detail because I know for sure that I was not sleeping. I was fully awake and conscious. Suddenly. I felt this eerie chill just start to permeate the room. So cold, so freezing, a wind that was coming from seemingly nowhere because my window was closed tight, as was my door. I had about three layers of blankets and sheets on me, but the cold just seemed to be going right under them. Immediately, just every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. People used the terms chills going down their spines figuratively, but the real thing is not the most pleasant sensation in the world. Then, I heard this male voice, very sinister in tone, start laughing. It just echoed and surrounded me. I was terror stricken at this point. I could feel my heart beating. I closed my eyes, praying to God frantically that whatever it was would leave. When the voice subsided, the room returned to normal temperature. I just bolted out of my room. I have no idea what it was that visited me that night. But several times after that, when I was in bed, I had this feeling that someone or something intangible was watching me. Since then, I've had several psychic and numerology readings, which indicate that I'm sensitive to the psychic and supernatural. I've had dreams throughout my life, which serves as a precursor of good tidings in the future, including my acceptance into the school I am attending today. I'm a college freshman when I visit home. I refuse to sleep without the hall light on. Call me chicken, but I don't think I'm quite ready to encounter what lies in the darkness again. For these purposes, let's just say my name is Amy. Where I come from, ghosts and the supernatural 
is kind of the way of life for my people. We welcome ghosts to our family members who have passed away with open arms, knowing they are here to watch over us. That's the mentality I've had all my life, but when the reality of it is faced, it's a different story. I have two unbelievable experiences to tell anyone who is interested enough to listen. Bear in mind, this is the first time I've told strangers about this. I should say my first ghost experience was when I lost my mom, when I was 16. My mom was the center of my universe, and when she died unexpectedly during childbirth, it was a shock to me for years to come. I'm 23 now. Two days after her death, I was sleeping in her bedroom, lying on her side of the bed. I had been crying myself to sleep, and I had this dream. At least I thought it was a dream, because the way it happened, it was as real as it could be. In my dream, or self-conscious state of mind, I was lying in the same position in which I had fallen asleep, when I saw mom come into the room and just stand there watching me sleep. I opened my eyes in the dream and she very gently kissed me on the cheek and told me not to cry. I tried to hold on to her so she won't go, but she left with me crying bitterly in my sleep. I woke up immediately after, smelling her perfume very strongly in the room. I knew then without a doubt, my mom visited me to say goodbye. I wasn't afraid just very sad because she's gone. My second and very terrifying ghost experience happened a couple years later when my grandfather became violently ill with severe heart problems. I was never close with my grandfather. I loved him, but he was very strict and unable to show any emotions to anyone, not even my grandma, but we all know he loves us in his own way. The hospital that he was admitted to was a little distance away from the house so we could actually take food over to him. We all went to visit him several times a day, but he was so sick, he couldn't even talk to us anymore. About a week or so after he's been admitted, the whole family went to the hospital to see him, but I remember staying home alone that day. We have a couch in the living room that sits across from the front door. I was napping on and off when I heard someone opening the front door. Since it was locked, I thought it had to be one of my family coming home. Imagine my surprise when I looked up and saw my grandfather walking in his carrying bag that we used to put his clothes in when we took him to the hospital. I said hi to him, but he didn't answer, just went straight to his room and closed the door. I didn't know what to think at this point, but I remember expecting my family to burst through the door any second, telling me they brought him home because he was feeling better. After about three minutes, I could hear him moving about in his room. So I went to knock on the door to ask him if he needed help with something, but no one even answered, though I could hear things moving. It didn't surprise me, because he could never talk much. About 15 minutes later, my aunt burst in the house screaming at the top of her voice that we've lost grandpa. I thought they meant they lost him when they were coming home, so I told her he's already here and he's in his room. She looked at me as if I was crazy and told me that grandpa died right around the time he walked into the house a while ago. I fainted when she said that, and up to this day, I can't believe that happened to me. I don't know what to make of it, but it sure scared me for a long, long time. We had just gotten done playing video games and decided to go to bed, myself and three others. One girl who would be my future goddaughter, her aunt, and their younger friend had enough electronic entertainment for one night. The younger girl had decided to sleep on the couch, leaving the rest of us to sleep on the floor since there wasn't enough beds in the bedroom to go around. Most everyone was just laying there, staring at something in the dark or randomly saying something here and there, getting ready to fall asleep. I stared straight at a digital clock. Suddenly, a figure had obstructed my view of the clock for a brief moment. It was then that I said, hey guys, did you see that? Soon after, I heard my goddaughter let out a loud scream. They both claimed to have seen a figure heading towards the kitchen, and we heard a loud clatter of pants hitting the ground. The thing disappeared, and we didn't see it again all night. Neither did my goddaughter. But here is my second story. The week I started college. I noticed a change in my dog. He was acting quite a bit funny, almost sick, 
Within that week, it was found that he had slipped a disc in his back and was later put to sleep. I was emotionally torn for a while, as I was, and still am, very much attached to that dog. After a few months, I decided that even though I really loved my previous dog, I still did want a companion around and got the dog I currently have. The morning after we had brought her home, I felt a weight on my chest. I felt like the size of a dog, about the same size as the one I had before. I thought it was the new dog, so I told her to get down. I heard her jump from my chest to the floor. It was then that I realized it wasn't the new dog, because my room's door was shut and there was no way she could have gotten in here. That, and the fact that she wasn't anywhere around. At first, I was a bit spooked, but then I thought, good, he's still here with me. The summer I turned 18 and headed off to college, my family moved to Martinsville, New Jersey. They built a brand new house on land that was once part of what my grandfather called Indian country. Whenever I would go home for break, I never slept very well in the house. I always had butterflies in my stomach and couldn't pass out until the wee hours of the night when my eyes just couldn't stay open anymore. One day, I was sitting in the family room watching TV. Above the TV, there was a 7x8 foot opening into the hallway upstairs. I caught someone out of the corner of my eye, walking by that opening and into my sister's bedroom. Immediately, I thought it was odd. The only other people who were in the house were my mother and grandfather, both of whom were to the left of me, in the kitchen. When I told them what happened, they just stood there, looking at each other. Finally, my grandmother spoke up. Apparently, both her and my mother had seen a figure walk by the doorways in the house on a number of occasions. According to my grandmother, the lights flickered every once in a while too. She was under the impression the house was haunted. That night, I was lying in bed, reading a book. It was about 4 a.m., and I was the only one up. I decided to brush my teeth before trying to get some sleep. I opened the door to my bedroom and was about to turn left to go to the bathroom when I felt the need to look down the hallway towards my mother's room. My mom usually kept the door closed, but that night, the door was open and there was a man standing in the opening. He was tall and skinny. The only man that was in the house was my stepfather, and he's short and plump. The figure was just standing there, looking at me. No, watching me. I immediately ran into the bathroom, my heart pounding. About 10 minutes later, I got the nerve to run back to my room and hide under the covers. Needless to say, I didn't sleep a wink. From that night on, I knew that the butterflies in my stomach were because I felt something watching me. Although it frightened me like I've never been frightened before, and even though I still get the shivers thinking about that night, I've always known this ghost was just a watcher. I didn't feel any evil or ill will from him, but I have no idea who he was. Like I said earlier, the land was considered Indian country, i.e. it was wooded, until they cleared it for the new development. So. It's possible the ghost was an American Indian, but for some reason, I feel that isn't right. That this man I saw was in fact white, and possibly a farmer from the early 1900s. Either way, the shadows and flickering of the lights continued until my family moved three years later. It's possible they even continue today, but I don't think anyone ever saw the man as clearly as I did that night. Thanks for reading. I've been reading through your website and found it very interesting, but I never thought that I had a story to relay until I read a story that sounded extremely like something happened to me a few years ago. I live in Toronto, Canada, and in 1991, my third child was just a baby and would wake up nightly around 2 a.m. for feeding. At the time, we lived in a condo, which we had lived in since 1988. We had some minor incidents, like things moving around and shadows seen out of the corner of one's eye, but nothing to speak of really. Just things that could be chalked up to imagination. On one particular night, my son wakened for his feeding. I sat in my rocking chair in the baby's room, feeding him. 
The nightlight was on, and I was wide awake, when all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a lion roar, or a tiger roar, loud and clear. I jumped up, turned on all the lights in the house, and was convinced that a tiger was in the closet, woke up my husband, and had him search through the entire apartment, including the balcony, which was six stories up. Of course, it would have been impossible for an animal to have gone into the apartment, but the roar had sounded so real, I had to be sure. After that, I tried to convince myself that it was my imagination, but I never forgot about it. I wonder if you know what this could be, and if there's any explanation for it. This just happened the night before last. For the past three days, my husband, my two little girls of preschool age, my mother-in-law and I had been camping at Beachside Campgrounds in Oregon, a beautiful place caught between Highway 101 and the beach itself, just north of Yahuts. Anyway, that night was our last night there, and somewhere in the middle of sleeping, my youngest daughter woke up crying, saying that she was scared. Not overly unusual for a preschooler, but after I tucked her back in, she dropped right back into a deep sleep, which for her is very unusual. She usually likes to snuggle and talk, and generally keep me up as long as she can. As I was trying to get back to sleep myself, I heard what I thought was my older daughter saying, Mommy, Mommy. I answered her, but had no response. I heard the voice again, this time more insistent, Mommy, Mommy, though always at a kind of a whisper. I got up and physically looked at my two girls, who were completely sound asleep, the kind of sleep that is past dreaming, which was very odd because, you remember, my youngest one had just woken up a short while before. Then, as I laid down for a second time, I heard the voice again, only it seemed to come from all the way around me and in a constant stream. Mommy, 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 and it wouldn't stop. It just kind of kept reverberating around my head and seemed to have no specific point of origin. My husband got up, not hearing a thing, mind you, to relieve himself and came back a few moments later. While he was gone, I said out loud, whoever you are, go away, we're trying to sleep. And the voice kind of faded away, but always saying mommy. I asked my husband if he'd heard or seen anything outside the tent when he was out there, but he said he hadn't. This gave me the creeps in a serious way. The voice didn't come back, and we were leaving the next morning anyway. That was yesterday. I told everyone about the voice the next morning, and they looked at me as if I had lobsters crawling out of my ears, but I still wonder if something happened at the campsite. I feel it was a small child who had gotten lost and never found its way back to its tent, and I feel it was a small boy, but I know nothing for certain. If anybody knows about any ghostly happenings at the beachside campgrounds in Oregon State, I'd surely like to hear back from you. I'm not quite sure where to start this story, but I'll try it this way. I'm able to feel the energy around me. I've always felt weird things, but for the last 10 years of my life, my abilities have increased. I was standing in the garage in the daytime, getting ready to leave for work. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man in a black and white suit. He was very tall, about six foot two, and his clothes were old-fashioned. He reminded me of an old western mortician. His hat was a black hat. I blinked my eyes to see if he would go away, but he just stood there. He reminded me of death. His form was solid, but yet not really. He was not transparent like the others I had seen. I put my purse in the car, and when I looked back, he was gone. I didn't get too close to him because I was terrified. But when I went to my Tai Chi class, I asked my Saifu about him. He asked, did you ask him what he wanted? I said no, because I thought he was death. I was not about to invite death into my house. A few months went by, and I was in the kitchen doing the dishes 
when a shadow went by the window. I thought it was Ted from next door for a moment, because he is tall. I thought I would greet him at the front door. Well, there was no one there, so I said out loud, very funny. The next day, I was in the garage going to work. Again, the man in the driveway. This time, I was sort of brave and stepped closer. I could not feel anything from him except a low vibration on the cool side. It was so weird. So I said, how can I help you? He just tipped his hat and then disappeared. When I went home for vacation, I'm from Indiana. My sister and I were going through my aunt's pictures. She has since passed away. She was 85. I came across this picture. All the hair on my neck stood up and I got the willies. My sister looked at me and said, Oh, is that your great great grandfather McNeely? He was a Quaker and he shooed horses. Since I had found out who he is, he has never come back. I was wondering, since he was solid, so to speak, could he have been out of place in time, more than appearing as a ghost? Thanks for letting me share this story. My friends think I'm weird. I see and send stuff. There's no way you can convince people of what you see. I don't even try anymore. When I see the ghost in the casino, for example, I just smile and keep on walking. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. Hi, this is a great site. I'd like to share my experiences of the paranormal with you. I've written them in before, and someone wrote back, telling me that it was possible that there could be explanation for what occurred. Right now I'm 18, but I remember the events as if they happened yesterday. I've only ever had to move house once, which was nearly two years ago. My parents and I used to live in East Anglia, UK, which has its fair share of haunted old homes but all that is totally unrelated. We had a semi-detached house. My dad told me I was about 30 years old. I always remembered an evil presence in the house, although I didn't notice it much back then. First experience I had was when I was about six, and it was late one night, after my parents had gone to sleep. Our neighbors were away on holiday at the time. I had the smallest room, which was situated above the garage, in the stairwell. I was just falling asleep when I heard a loud knocking noise, like someone rapping against a wall, and it was a rhythmic rapping. I ignored it, or at least tried to at first, but then a few seconds later, I heard it again. It was coming from downstairs, and every time it happened, it seemed to be moving up the stairs and eventually onto the landing. By this time, I was creeped out and turned my lamp on which flickered weirdly. Eventually the knocking was right inside my room, in the far corner, and I was surprised my mom or dad didn't hear it. I called out a few times for my mom, because I was too scared to get out of bed, and she came in. I asked her to stay with me and hear the noise for herself. She waited with me and heard it too, but naturally, she didn't believe me and told me it was probably the heating. Why would the heating make noises? which sounded as though they were coming from downstairs into my room. Another incident happened just after one of my brothers left for university. He was the last one to go. I was about 10 when this happened and I'd swapped rooms with him anyway. So I was now in the back room and was a lot bigger than the one I had before. This incident terrified me the most and I'll never forget it. I used to sleep with my feet out, the blanket at the bottom of the bed obviously, and I woke up after feeling cold fingers on my foot. Waking up groggily, I looked down to the end of my bed and was surprised to see a black shadow in the shape of a human figure. It was looking right my way. I could tell it didn't have any eyes or any human features, and eventually it turned swiftly and quietly left the room. My bedroom door had been shut, and it left my room without the door opening. You can understand now why I sleep with the covers right over my feet. I've had plenty more freaky experiences. They happen on school trips, and on two occasions, 
We stayed in very old, possibly haunted locations. I'll write them in another time. All that I have told you now is all very true. I wish I had looked into the history of our previous house, and I know before it was built, there was just old farmland. And other times, especially when I was alone, I got the feeling I wasn't exactly all alone, if you get what I mean. The presence didn't seem very friendly in itself. This happened about four years ago, while I was a senior in high school. A bunch of friends and I were looking for something to do, and ended up riding out to a very old cemetery in the rural area of our small town. The story goes that there was a young boy who was buried there decades ago, and he has often been seen playing on the grounds. We, being arrogant kids, did not believe a word of it, and just parked the car at the cemetery and stood around talking. Pretty soon, the five of us started to wander from tombstone to tombstone reading the names of those buried. I walked over to one that was under a small tree. I was busy reading it, and someone walked up beside me. I was sure it was my cousin, and did not even look at him. I just said, did you see this one, Robbie? Just then, my cousin Robbie said, are you talking to me? He was standing several yards away at the parked car. I could tell my peripheral vision that the figure on my left was still there. I did not look at it. I ran screaming to the car where my friends waited. I spooked them so badly that they all just jumped in the car and we sped away. I heard later that the tombstone under the tree belonged to the boy who is said to still haunt the cemetery. I may still be somewhat of a skeptic, but I will never, ever go back there. In May of 99, my favorite uncle, Brian, died of cancer. It was a big surprise. He had always seemed to be so fit and healthy for his age. He was 61. The day he died was strange for me. I had gone down to his house to see him and found his sister, my auntie Anne, standing at the door of his house, talking to one of his neighbors. My mom looked worried. She had a right to. That morning, he had been taken to work some hospital in North Wales, UK. He had been complaining that he had a pain in his back for months. Anyway, I didn't know what was going on until I walked closer to my mom and her sister, talking about what happened to my Uncle Brian. It was then when I could smell it. The terrible smell of death looming over the house. I've read and heard of people smelling when death is coming and had never believed it before. But I knew now that it was true. We visited the hospital, and I sat watching my limp, pale, uncle's body disintegrate into nothing. And that was a very sad day for me, and will always be embedded into my mind. As we all sat around his bed, my mother asked me what I wanted to do. In my heart of hearts, I wanted to stay by his side, but couldn't bring myself to watch him go. I decided to go home. As we arrived home, and I put my key in the front door. I could smell a faint smell of, well of something. I knew that it was the same smell I had smelled in Uncle Brian's. At that moment, I burst into tears. Just as I did, the telephone rang. It was Brian's son, Mike. Before anyone picked up the phone, I told him that he had died. Mom picked up the phone, and sure enough, my favorite uncle had died minutes before we entered our own house. That is no ghost story, but this is. My Uncle Brian used to stay with us all the time for the holidays, Christmas and Easter, and sometimes birthdays. We had a dartboard put up under my room in the dining room, especially for him. At night, when he was alive, we, or rather I, could hear the darts hitting the board with such force that it used to run right through the floor of my room. He used to stay up till late at night too, watching the telly and switching channels on cable TV. After he died, however, that all stopped. Christmas was as quiet as a mouse. There was no telly, no darts hitting the wall or the dartboard, nothing, just complete silence. That was, 
until New Year. As soon as it turned 2000, the noises started again. One night, I couldn't sleep and thought I heard someone moving about downstairs. I thought it was my dad who suffered seven heart attacks. I walked over to my door and opened it a little to listen to what was going on down there. As I listened, I felt a chill run up and down my spine. I could hear the telly. I felt curious, so I made my way down the stairs. As I got to the living room, I found myself staring at a telly that wasn't even on, that hadn't been on for hours. I shrugged and told myself that it was probably next door. But as I reached the top of the stairs, I heard what I thought was someone playing darts. I turned on my heel and walked downstairs, again curious to find out who was making these noises. I got to the games room and looked at the darts board. Its doors were closed and locked. No one could have played with that if they wanted to without whacking my father up for the key first. For the record, my uncle loved his tea. His cup was still hanging up on the mug tree. As I had gone back upstairs for the second time, I had seen it with my own eyes, hanging there, still and alone. I got to my room and went to sleep, finally. But I had only been asleep about 15 minutes when my older sister, Rebecca, was waking me up. She looked terrified. I asked her what was wrong, and she told me the following creepy tale. She was in her room, laying in her bed, ready to fall asleep, when she just happened to look at the bottom of her bed. That's when she saw him. My uncle Brian stood there in all his glory. He was holding his mug in his right hand and was staring at her. She couldn't move a muscle. It took her all her time to make it out of her room to my room. By this time, she was crying her eyes out. I don't know what it was that made me do the thing I did next, but I felt I had to check that this mug was still hanging up on the mug tree like it was about 25 minutes ago. With my sister holding onto my hand so tight, we made it to the kitchen. His mug was not there. I went into the living room and found a still warm cup sitting on the table, half full of steaming tea. To this day, he still plays darts and visits my sister's room. Maybe he wasn't meant to leave us as soon as he did. Back in 1990, I was 18 years old and staying with the host family in Veracruz, Mexico, as an exchange student. One day, I awoke to a lot of bustling and nervous chatter around the household. I kept hearing the word Baruja repeated over and over. Unfamiliar with that word, I inquired about its meaning, which was explained to mean witchcraft in Spanish. Apparently, someone found a cross, laid down a granulated salt in the backyard, which according to the native residents, was a clear sign of witchcraft. Being the consummate skeptic, I just nodded and secretly chuckled at the genuine worry that the superstition was creating. Later that evening, the day's excitement culminated into a sort of ghost story session in the kitchen area, where it was explained to me that witches and spirits have been known to travel in shadows or balls of light. Whatever happened to the broomstick, I belted as I laughed out loud. After a few more stories, I had heard enough and decided to show them just what I thought of their primitive beliefs. I ran out the back door and approached the cross of salt that started this whole charade as the group clamored after me. I stood above the cross and made a challenge. I said out loud, I challenge the spirits of hell to damn harm me. Anyway, they all thought I was taking a big risk, but I just laughed it off. Later that night, my host brother and I were dropping off friends with the family flatbed. As the last one jumped out from the rear, I turned my head and watched him enter his house. Before I turned my head back to a frontal view, the next image we saw both startled the both of us. Materializing from the upper window, there seemed to be an entity of some sort. It was an old lady, but a really disfigured looking old lady. You could see the detail in her face. 
but she had red glowing eyes at the same time. Besides the red glowing eyes, she had scars all over her face, and it looked like she was almost on fire at the same time. I don't even know how to describe it, but it looked very off-putting. The image of this witch lasted about 30 seconds before she dematerialized and she was no more. Naturally, we bailed out of that area without really processing what we had seen. After what I just witnessed, I knew I felt a sense of regret. It was then when I realized that I should never make demands or challenge Satan himself to come see me. So, I'm not sure entirely if that was Satan himself coming to see me, but I know that it was something serious and I didn't want to mess with it. Demonic, challenging the spirits to come see me, I guess that was a horrible idea. And now I'm no longer a skeptic. I'm a little bit more open-minded now, but I guess you can understand after dealing with that kind of thing. So what's the big takeaway from here? Obviously, you don't want to challenge the devil. You don't want to summon anyone because you never know what you may be conjuring up. I know this all sounds silly, but it's true. It happened, and I just wanted to tell my story. My first ghost story experience started happening to me about two days after my mom and stepdad bought this house. We have a childproof door to keep my little sister and the dogs from going downstairs. It only comes to about three feet high, and it can be opened from the other side. Since we had just moved in, it hadn't got any of the bedroom furniture into the house yet. I'd slept out on a cot in our living room, where you can see the childproof door that leads to the staircase. Anyway, as soon as I drifted off, I felt as though someone was watching me, and so I rolled over the face of the door, only to discover what seemed to be a solid shadow, with one arm over the door and head peering over at me. It soon disappeared, and since it was dark, I just convinced myself that my eyes were playing tricks on me, so I went back to sleep. But it kept happening and my mother soon started telling me she's seen it too, wherever she goes to get some water or go to the bathroom, and I hadn't told her I'd seen anything. We could both swear to God that there's someone there looking at us. Then after we finally got settled in, I started sleeping in my room instead of the living room. Since I can't sleep without a little light and my bedroom is in the basement, I have a dull green light in my walk-in closet which you can clearly see into from my bed. So one night, I had been reading my book, and over the top of my book, I saw a solid shadowy figure in the shape of a man just walk through my closet. I was so scared, I ran upstairs as fast as I could. My mom and stepdad came out and asked me what was wrong, and so I told them. They looked irritated and said that it was just my imagination and I should go back downstairs and get some sleep. So I did, until 1.30 in the morning. I woke up because I heard someone calling my name, and I thought maybe it was time to go to school. Then when I was fully awake, I realized school wouldn't start for another week, and that the voice was calling my name, and it was unfamiliar to me. So I froze in my bed, but I kept hearing my name, until it was like a whisper in my ear, and I felt something that was almost like a cold finger running down my back. I almost ran back upstairs to wake my parents again, but remember what the reaction had been the last time, and decided that maybe, if I just laid in bed, it would go away. Then the TV turned on to channel 60. At the time we didn't have cable, and on the TV was a televised ad about contacting the dead, that it shut off. I screamed and ran up the stairs as fast as I could and slept on the couch for the rest of the night. To this day I refuse to sleep downstairs, no matter how childish it may sound. Also, another thing that has happened to me for a long time, I was definitely afraid that the lights in my room would go off and my door would slam shut so I couldn't get out. And one night, when I went downstairs to get something, my door creaked and slowly started closing and then my lights flickered. I went upstairs as fast as I could and asked everyone if the lights had flickered upstairs. 
and they all responded no. Various other things still happened in my house. Like one time, when I was wrapping a Christmas present, I put down the tape and went to pick it up again, and it wasn't there. I asked my mother who was in the room with me if she had taken it, and she said no. We searched all over the house, and finally, we found it on the kitchen counter. CD players go on and off. The dogs bark and growl randomly like there's a stranger standing right in front of them. The cat's hair stands on end, and they hiss at nothing, and bolt into the other direction. And sometimes when I go downstairs to do the laundry or something, I got the sudden urge that I need to run quickly, or something terrible will happen. And believe me, I do. Hello, my name is Brittany. I'm not possible how my story will be accepted, but a few things that have happened to me are something to consider. There are three parts to my story. The first part is my parents' personal encounters. The second part is an encounter my parents and I both shared. And the third is my own personal encounters. Part one, the noisy spirit. When my parents first bought out the house, it was very small. Only a kitchen, dining room, and living room. Upstairs, there were two bedrooms and a bathroom. My parents had been inspecting every room one at a time to see exactly what they needed to fix up. My parents were upstairs in one of the bedrooms when they heard noises downstairs in the kitchen. When they got downstairs, according to their story to investigate, the cupboard doors were swinging back and forth wildly. They walked over to shut up and voices yelled at them to just leave immediately. They didn't listen. Five years later, I was born. By then, they had built on two family rooms, two porches, a laundry room, pantry, and they even built on a shop where they conducted their own business. They normally heard music playing and voices yelling at them, but they ignored it for whatever reason. In the second story, the attacks, when I was 10 years old, a lot of very dangerous attacks started happening. My dad started being ferociously attacked during the night by invisible forces. Now, my dad slept upstairs in his bedroom alone because the bed hurt my mom's back, so she always slept downstairs on the couch. My bedroom is directly beside theirs, so I could hear everything going on in there. Normally, my dad will wake up to feel as if he was being held down strangled, bit, scratched, cut with a knife, carried around the room, etc. When he would wake up in the morning, he would have bite marks in impossible places on his body, cuts, scratches, red bruises around his neck and wrists, and long deep gashes across his chest. Now, this didn't happen all the time, all in one night, but things happen frequently. I was really starting to get worried. My grandma and Aunt Phil taught me an Italian prayer to keep the evil away. I would pronounce it right now, but I'm not entirely sure if I even did it right, so I'll refrain from doing so right now. But the prayer is the prayer to the Virgin Mary, and its purpose is to keep all the evil out. They told me to say that three times every night, and it would keep the evil out. I said it three times in dedication to my father, and things slowly started to get better. It was still very scary, because I never expected the entities to be so violent. But in my third paranormal experience, these are my personal encounters. Well, now that I'm 16, certain things have happened to me. They aren't violent, or even frightening, more so reassuring. To explain it a bit, my bedroom door is the kind of door that unless you prop it open, it swings shut again, and fast. Two, well, for the past year and a couple months, I've noticed that there might be a spirit that is checking in on me. When I sleep, or late at night, my door will swing open, wide enough for a head to look in, to check in on me, to make sure I'm okay. I'll look because it creaks, and see nothing there. It will stay open at that width for two minutes, as if someone is checking in on me. Then it will slowly shut. The doorknob will turn, and it will close all the way. Like I said, 
It was reassuring because I felt as if someone, whoever it was, was checking in on me to make sure I'm okay and they're just trying to tell me they're here for me. I'm glad I have it. I look at it as my spirit guide. I'm pagan. Saw my website. You will understand my belief as spirit guides. I'm 19 years old, work in the computer industry in London, England. When I was around 10 or 11, I used to live in another part of the county called Dudley, West Midlands. Opposite our house was a pub called the Hangman's Tree. We found out later that this pub was where people in the late 18th century hung people for crimes, such as highway robbery, murder, etc. Anyways, my sister was about 7 or 8 but didn't like the dark, so she always used to call mom to take her to the toilet in the night. One night, my mom heard my sister go to the bathroom on her own. In the morning she said, well done, you went to the bathroom on your own last night. My sister replied, no I didn't mommy, the black man took me. My mom panicked at this point and thought someone must have gotten into the house. She said, what black man are you talking about? My sister said, He's my friend. He's a black mist, and he sits with me at night and tells me stories. We're all getting really scared now. My mom asked me how she knew it was a black man, because when he smiles, I can see his teeth. We were all really freaked out by this, but my sister didn't really seem all that bothered by it. So we decided, whatever it was, it was friendly. A couple of weeks later, I walked into my sister's room to check on her and found that the rocking chair in the corner of the room was rocking on its own and at a steady pace, and my sister was fast asleep. I don't know. It may be a comforting presence, but it definitely seems creepy to me. My name is Alex and I live in Colorado. I've always been in tune with the supernatural. My first experience that I can remember was at my grandmother's house, and I think I was about five years old. My grandfather had died long before I was born, and when my mother was about six months old, I remember him coming into my room and telling me good night, and that he loved me, and telling us a bedtime story of the three bears. I asked my grandmother who the man was, and she said no one was in the house but her, my mother, my brother and I. I told her the man's name, and she laughed, and said my mother probably told me to tell her this. I said my mother was asleep, and was about 20 feet from me, in another room, and I don't think she could have heard him. Granny said that was true, and she called my mother in, and said, hey Jackie, did you tell him about Pat? My mother said no, that she didn't remember him himself. My grandmother asked me to describe the man to her. I said he was about six feet tall and wiry with brown hair and blue eyes, and he could imitate different accents. He told me in an English accent that he loved me, and in a thick Irish accent goodnight. Then he told me the whole story of the three bears in a very English accent. He didn't seem like a ghost at all. He seemed completely real to me. She said I described my dead grandfather down to a T. I've never seen my grandfather's picture before, and my grandmother told me so. My grandmother is very open-minded, but the rest of my family is not. She got tears in her eyes, and she took me in her lap. She said, Patrick, do you know anything about your family history? I said no. She said, you hail from a long line of very powerful people. She said that our family was old and went all the way back to England, Ireland, and even Scotland. Back before the Christians and the Muslims and back into time memorial. She said every generation had a special ability and so did I. My grandmother gets dreams and they always come true. Two years before Mount St. Helens blew its top, she told us it was going to blow. She's like that. 
She told me her family practiced the old religion. I said, what, Christians? She said, no. She said, do a drink in Wicca. I was like, what's that? And she said she'd explain it to me when I was older. She told me to tell Pat she still loved him after all these years. The following night, however, I was not greeted by the same presence as before. The really crazy thing was, it was something entirely different. That's when this entirely black figure, completely blacked and shadowed, but you could still make out the outline of this figure, walked through the doorway. His presence was obvious. He was not here to make friends, and it was apparent that it was not my grandfather. Where's grandpa? Where's grandpa? I can remember shouting, but no noise was uttered by the black figure. Just then, he pointed to the window right next to me in my bedroom. I didn't want to look, so I didn't. In fact, I refused to look. So I think I remember shutting my eyes and covering the blankets over my head and just went on. I heard the door slam shut. The next morning, I woke up and went to greet my grandmother in her bedroom. Unfortunately, something was terribly wrong with my grandma. At the time, I didn't realize it, but she had passed away in her sleep. And to this day, I really wonder if that had anything to do with my incident the night before. Was it a coincidence? I'm not entirely sure, but it devastated me for years to come. You may criticize me and say that five-year-olds could not remember such a thing, but remember, I remembered it clearly because it was a traumatic event. My family has a history of abilities, and my grandma even talked to me about this before she passed away. I don't know, maybe it was grandpa, and he was secretly saying that he wanted grandma to be with him and that he missed her or something, but why did it feel so dark? Why was this present so dark? I can only conclude that now, as I think back to it, it had to be the death, the Grim Reaper himself, and there's no other explanation for it. One thing I still wonder to this day is that the Grim Reaper was pointing at the window remember from earlier in the story. I always wondered, what if I did in fact look out the window? I would have saw something bizarre. Maybe my grandma's soul being transported into a different dimension. Or maybe, just maybe, it was just all in my head. Whichever the case, it doesn't matter. It was terrifying. Well, here we go. I'm not sure if what I'm experiencing is an actual haunting, or if everything can be easily explained. I live in South Texas, not in the sticks. I'm 17 years old, and currently attend high school. I'll be graduating this year. Our house is very new, it is only 4 years old, and built by us, so nothing has happened in the house. However. We live directly on the banks of the San Antonio River. In fact, we are situated on a 75-foot cliff. On our property stands another house, where we also used to live while our house was being built. I never liked this house, and always felt very uneasy when staying there alone, or for that matter, with others in the house. I do not know exactly how old this house is, but I do know now then when they were adding new boards to the siding, they found old newspapers dating back to the late 30s and early 40s in the sides of the house. Now let me explain the layout of the older house. It has one bedroom and one kitchen. There is a living room, dining room, and an entertainment area for guests. The living room used to be my room. Between the bathroom and the bedroom, there lies a closet. The closet has two doors connecting both rooms together. I always felt as if something was watching me from everywhere in the house, but never really experienced anything. Now that we have moved into our new house, things have intensified. I always feel the eyes on me now, and sometimes I am forced to run downstairs because of the overwhelming sense of dread that occurs while I am upstairs alone. 
I hear my shower door open and close during the night, and when I'm downstairs watching TV, I can hear the water running in my bathroom. When school is in session, I usually get up around 5.30 to get ready, because I'm an academic editor for the yearbook, as well as class treasurer, so I usually have to be there early so I can get everything in order for the student body. Well, once I was taking a shower, when I felt something hit the back of my leg with extreme force, I turned to rub my leg and searched for the culprit, thinking maybe I'd accidentally knocked over a bottle of shampoo, yet directly behind me was a penny. I have no idea where that could have come from. I haven't told anyone, as I think no one would believe me, and I'm more than happy to keep this to myself, except about two weeks ago, I had a dream that disturbed me greatly, and I feel someone needs to know. I had a dream that I lived in the old house in my land, and I was dressed in old style, late 30s clothing, and I was washing dishes. All of a sudden, a girl came running into the kitchen and kissed me, telling me she was on her way to an ice cream social in town, and that her boyfriend, she gave me a name, but I can't remember now, would be picking her up and taking her. She appeared to be my age now, and I'm supposing I was her mother, because I told her to take care and to wait to say goodbye to her father, something I would never say. Anyway, another girl appeared from the back, and I was now outside, standing on the porch drying my hands and waving at a man pulling up in an old style car like you see in mafia movies from a long time ago. I kissed him, and he appeared to be my husband. He was explaining to me about his recent business venture. When I suddenly realized who I was, I took the man by the arms and began to shake him uncontrollably, telling him he was crazy, because in a few months, the Great Depression would fall, and we would all starve to death. I then told him that we should save our money and move to Florida. He took a hold of me and told me that the heat must have gotten to me kissed our two daughters goodbye, and took me into the house. Only we went into the bedroom, and continued to walk through a second door, and into a second bedroom, that the house does not have today. And he laid me down on a cot. He told me to get my rest, and he kissed me on my forehead. And when I closed my eyes, I woke up in my room. It was the strangest dream I ever had, and as a result, I have not been able to sleep for days. I usually go to bed at 10, but lately I've been drifting off at 2 or 3 in the morning, and I usually dream every time, except now I don't or do not remember when I wake up. I still feel like I am being watched, and I have no idea what is going on. If you or anyone can shed some light on my situation, please email me. I would greatly appreciate it. I know this sounds weird. But it's very scary. I wonder if the dream has anything to do with the situation in my house. Thank you. First off, I want to say that I've been brought up with stories of ghosts and haunted houses. I live in the South, Louisiana to be exact, and tales of the supernatural are nothing new to this area. I have many stories I can share, but the better ones all include my grandma's house. The house is located in a small town called Sword, and my mom would tell me stories of when she was a kid growing up with a ghost that lived there in the house with her and her siblings. The ghost does not have a name, she is only known as the White Lady since she wears a white dress. My mom told me stories of seeing this White Lady many times as a child, but she never was scared of the White Lady. She told me she felt as if the ghost was watching over her and her sisters and that they never felt threatened. She told me she would see the ghost at night, walking in the hallway or on the staircase. Other times she just felt the presence of the ghost. She would be in her room after school doing homework and she knew someone was in the room watching her. When I was a kid, going to grandma's was always something special because I would look for this ghost. I remember very well the first time I saw the white lady. I was 14 and my friend Chad was with me in my grandma's. We had just gotten home from school and I had the key to grandma's because that's where I went after school until my mom picked me up when she got off work. Grandma was not there, 
So Chad and I made ourselves at home. He knew of the stories about the house and was very skeptical. We made some snacks and went into the den to sit and watch TV. The staircase is in full view from the den and as we watched TV, I felt a presence. Chad felt it too. He claimed it got really cold. I thought it was a draft, so we went into the hallway and checked to see if any windows were open. As we were going to the living room, my eye caught something. I stopped and grabbed Chad's arm. There, at the bottom of the staircase, was a figure of a woman. At that moment, she looked at us and that cold chill went right through me. She proceeded to go up the stairs. I watched her details. Her hand was on the banister, but you could see right through it. She was transparent all the way through her figure, and she looked up as she walked, as if looking for something. Chad and I were literally paralyzed. We watched her, not knowing what was going to happen. For a second there, the figure paused, glanced back at us, and then continued walking up, but she never made it to the top. She vanished on the fourth step just before the landing. When she disappeared, Chad ran up the steps. I guess he wanted to catch her? Idiot. He said the spot where she disappeared was so cold. At that point, I wanted to get out of the house. We both grabbed our book bags and ran outside and stayed out on the front porch until my mom came. We told her what happened and she told us not to be scared. This being our first time seeing the spirit, hell yeah we were scared. But mom came in the house with us and we felt better with her there. The second time I saw the white lady was Thanksgiving, 1997. I had not been to grandma's much before then. Things at my house got complicated and I had to take care of things so there was not much time left for visits. But then Thanksgiving did roll around and all of my family came to grandma's. My mom has 10 siblings, so it was quite the event. Grandma has a huge dining room table that seats 24 in the main room of her house. We were all sitting down at dinner, having a good time. I was between my uncle Kevin and my cousin Joseph. We call him Shacks. People were coming and going through the doors that led to the kitchen and clean out of nowhere. I looked up and I saw a lady wearing white come in from the door on the right and walk from there to the left side of the room, then disappear into the wall. I jumped up. I was startled. She had passed right by everyone and right through my Uncle Patrick who was standing by the wine cart. He didn't even flinch. I looked over to my mom. She saw her too, but she put her finger on her mouth, mentioning me to keep quiet. I didn't say anything, but Shags was nudging me under the table. I turned to him. And he whispered to me, did you see that? I told him yes. After dinner, I was helping grandma with the dishes and I told her what I saw. She saw her too, but she said it did not surprise her at all. The white lady likes to show up when there are a lot of people at the dinner table. All she does is walk from one side of the room to the other, then disappear into the wall. But not everyone sees her. That's why I find odd. I told her how she just walked through Pat and he didn't notice anything. Weird. A number of days later, I found out that only four other people saw her that day in the dining room. My aunt Jen, my cousin Brad, his girlfriend Ashley, and my aunt's husband Mark. Grandma told me that they phoned her and told her about the white lady. I haven't seen the white lady since that Thanksgiving day. Grandma says she's still around. She had company over this past September. Some friends had come from Florida and stayed the night there. They witnessed a white lady on the staircase disappearing, but something else occurred. Grandma and others are now hearing footsteps and laughter in the upstairs bedroom that is used as a drawing room. I'll have to do some investigating on that one. Thanks for reading. When I was about 13, my father was a professor at a college in California. The campus was built during the 1600s and was originally a Catholic boys home. There are catacombs where the boys would hide when people came to persecute them. The story goes that one particular night, a well-known Christian hater came to kill the boys. They all went down into the tunnels. 
One eight-year-old boy got lost and was so scared he hung himself. His body was never recovered. Anyway, back to my personal story. We lived on campus and my father was also a night guard. He had a tendency to get preoccupied with different things and he often didn't get home until an hour after his shift was over. On one particular night he was later than usual. My mother sent me to go check on where he was. The other guard said he was still on the rounds, so I rode my bike around looking for him. I saw a light on in the library, so I parked my bike and went in. The staircase to the aforementioned tunnels, or catacombs, is in the back of the library, off to the left, and there's a cemetery under the staircase. I looked all through the library, and suddenly, the light turned off. A little boy, about eight years old, came running through the door of the staircase, right where another certain eight-year-old's body was rumored to be. Needless to say, I hauled out of there, and I have not gone back in the library since. The first thing I must explain is that I lived in a place where there was a horrible fire in the late 1800s. Across from my house was a cemetery where all of the 800 people that perished in that fire were buried. My best friend had come over and we were wanting to be alone, so we scampered up to our room. Shortly after that, we began to hear strange noises, like footsteps running up and down our spiral staircase. We yelled to my sister to stop bothering us, but she was nowhere in sight. We closed the door and backed up our trunks against it. While we sat there, a pattern knocking sound began on the wall. An eerie feeling came over us and we no longer felt safe there. We rushed out of the door and the room was filled with blue smoke. I never ventured up there alone again. It's strange that everything weird that ever happened happened in my bedroom because there was another night I remember vividly. The night I saw a figure dressed in a red and blue checkered smock standing there. She smiled and waved, but then, when I went to touch her, she disappeared. Thank you for letting me share my experience. My friend would love you for it. It's important to be able to share these experiences. I don't think their ghosts were unfriendly, but they sure scared the living daylights out of me. Thanks for reading. This is a story that my mom told me about when my grandma worked as a maid for a rich family in England. The house she worked in was haunted and some really weird things happened there. The most interesting was whenever someone cooked bread in the oven, it would come out smeared with blood. So after that happened several times, they blocked off the kitchen with a wall. Another neat thing happening occurred there when my grandma woke up in the middle of the night and heard the table being set but then she found out that no one was up and it was the middle of the night. To make things even more creepier, whenever she was cleaning the third floor and she knew that no one was up there with her, she got the strangest feeling she wasn't alone. One night, a thunderstorm was so loud it woke her up, yet her room was the only one that had the thunder that could be heard. Another night she woke up and her bed was rocking. In the morning, she asked the people who owned the house about it and they said that her room was once the room of a young boy who became very sick and every night his mother would rock him to sleep. Interesting story and thank you for reading. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was about 15. For the last month or so, when we talked on the telephone, my friend had been telling me that during the middle of the night when he was in bed, he could hear rocks bouncing off the roof, and this would go on for hours every single night. His parents also heard this and would go outside during the middle in the dark night to find nothing. Needless to say, it kept happening night after night. As time went by, the events got worse. Mr. Knock Knock, as they called him, started knocking on the door in the middle of the night and also during the day, which of course, when they would go to look, Nobody was there. At this point, I didn't know if I believed him or not. One time, when I was talking to him on the telephone, I heard a really big boom and he told me, Oh my god, Mr. Knock Knock just knocked the door open. Of course, he went and looked but, as always, nobody was there. This got me excited. 
I said to him I want to stay over and hear Mr. Knock Knock. Now, I don't know if it was that night, but I did stay over. It was late in the afternoon, and we were in the kitchen, and I made the remark that I wanted to hear Mr. Knock Knock. Right after I said that, boom, on the door. We went outside and found nothing. Finally, they had the police install cameras around the whole house, mostly in the trees, but they never recorded anything. They say that a man many years before hung himself in the shed. The same events went on for a period of time, then they just stopped. I think it was the man who hung himself many years ago. I know it was some spirit, but what it wanted, I don't know. I hope you all enjoyed the story though. Thanks for reading. The following incident is significant because it put me on the path where I am today and it will be important to know when I submit my other stories. On Saturday, Halloween Day, 1992, my friend Debbie and I decided to go to a neighborhooding park in St. Louis, bordering on South Grand and Arsenal for those who hail from there. We'd stop at our favorite donut shop, then went to a little lake we knew of to sit and gossip. There happened to be a wedding photo group there at the same time, so we sat on a bench nearby and critiqued the dresses, etc. I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings, and Debbie and I chattered for about 15 minutes before she got an odd look on her face and whispered to me, What is this? A rumble? I cautiously glanced around and saw several youths drawing up to the lake on various sides. Debbie said, I think it's time we leave. Walk slowly and don't look back at them. We got up and began walking to my car. Some 300 yards off, we got about halfway there when we heard a pop, pop, pop. Being a city girl, it didn't register in my brain what it was at the moment. It sounded like firecrackers. Needless to say, that's not what it was. Get down, she screamed. Before I could react, Debbie had thrown me down on the ground as she was going down herself. I know we were both praying as this occurred. Suddenly, the shooting got louder and we both realized that there was a gunman firing about three feet behind me over our heads. The way we were lying on the ground, Debbie could see behind me and I could see behind her. She told me not to look so I just kept my head down. We heard clicking and cursing. The guy's gun jammed. He ran off. As suddenly as it began, it was over, and all the gang members were running their separate ways. Badly shaken but not hurt, we took off running to my car, jumping in and flooring it to her house a few blocks away. When we were safely inside and slightly more calm than we had been, Debbie said, I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. I was warned about this and I didn't listen. I asked what she meant. She said her father appeared to her in a dream the night before. I don't remember the details exactly, but it was in the kitchen with the back door open. In the dream, he was warning her about some danger and wanted her to be careful. Debbie's father died when she was a teenager. At the time of the occurrence, she was in her late 20s. A weird, though not really scary closure. At the time of this occurrence, Debbie and I worked together at a local newspaper and our office was based in the basement of City Hall, sharing a room with the office attached to a recorder of deeds. Four ladies worked for the city there and we knew them pretty well. On Monday morning, one of them described how her daughter had come to her on a previous Saturday afternoon and told her of the horrific shootout that occurred at her friend's wedding party in the park near the lake. No one was hurt but the limo took two slugs in the door and fender. Prior to the shooting, both Deb and I would have long discussions about the afterlife, ghosts, and etc. And we are both believers in the power of the mind and spirit. But this experience set me on a path of dealing with spirits that I still encounter today. These will be submitted for your approval at a later date. Back in 1986, when my daughter was three years old, she was playing in her bedroom and I was watching all my children on television, when all of a sudden, she came out of her room asking me to tell the man to leave her alone. 
startled because she and I were the only ones in the house at the time. I said, what man? She said, the man in my room. He keeps talking to me. So I got up and went into the room and looked for this man. In fact, I decided to look all over the house for this man and could not even find him. I then made sure all the doors and windows were locked and I told my daughter that there is no man in the house. So she went back to play. About 10 minutes later, she came back into the living room and announced, tell the man to leave me alone. This time I freaked out and told her, Dana, there's no man in the house. I looked everywhere for him. I do not see anyone here. And she replied to me, he's right here. I asked where, and she pointed to the hallway and she acted like she was holding someone's hand. I asked, what are you doing? She replied, he just wants to say hi to you. Incredulous and open mouthed, I asked, me? What happened next sent chills down my spine. My three-year-old daughter walked with this man to the wall as if she was still holding his hand. I asked her, what does this man want from you? She said, he says he loves you. I asked her for the man's name and she simply replied, monk. Almost in shock, I got out, what did you say? She looked up at this man and said, as if to the air, what did you say your name was? And then she once again looked back at me and said, Monk. I asked her several times if the man's name was Monk and every time she said yes. But then I was freaking out because my grandfather's nickname was Monk. Still not believing, I told her this isn't funny and she said, he just wanted me to tell you he loves you and he wanted to say hi. I asked her to describe him and then he described my grandfather to a T. You see, my grandfather died in 1969 in Illinois when I was four years old. It was so long ago, there is no way my three-year-old could possibly have known this. He couldn't have even seen what he looked like because he did not have any pictures of him until 1991. That was the only time my child had an encounter. But what encounter it was, and I'm left to scratch my head thinking, if it was actually my grandpa or not. I'd like to think it was, but at the time, it was so terrifying not knowing who this person was at the moment. Wasn't it an intruder? Was it someone else? But no, it was my grandfather checking in on me to see if I was okay. What a man he was. A former associate and friend told me this once. Her parents once lived in Lee Master a little hollow in Buchanan County. While they lived there, they could hear a baby crying outside. When they went out on the porch, it would stop. But as soon as they went back in, it would start again. This went on for a long time until one day, a bunch of young boys were digging in the dirt, playing with their trucks and such when they happened upon an old buried jar. After further inspection by the children and my friend's father, they found it contained the remains of a baby submerged in alcohol to keep it in good condition. Turns out, a young girl had once lived in the area and had a miscarriage. Instead of having a proper funeral, she put it in the alcohol and buried it afterwards. After the discovery by the children, the crying stopped, the baby found peace, and all was quiet again. Thanks for the short read. I was 10 years old at the time now 27, and my mother, sister, who was 8 at the time, and I had just moved into a basement level apartment. The place was very dark and gloomy, as most basements are, I imagine. It had only two bedrooms, a small eating kitchen that adjoined the living area, a small hallway that led to the bedrooms and bath. I can still remember the fact that it only had three windows and one set of sliding glass doors in the dining area that allowed any natural light in. One window was in the living room, one in the room that my sister and I shared, and one small window in our mom's room. Like I said, very dark and gloomy. We had only lived there a few weeks when at first, only my sister was noticing weird things. Since our mother worked full time, and I was bused across town to a different school than my sister, she would arrive at the apartment first in the afternoons. She would later tell me about the noises she heard 
and the strange shadow she saw darting around the corner of her eyes. I clearly remember one afternoon when I arrived home, which was about an hour after she did, only to discover my sister huddled up on the top of the steps that led down to our front door. She had her arms wrapped around her drawn up legs, her head lowered to her knees, and she was shaking and rocking back and forth. It was obvious that she was terrified. I asked her what was wrong, and all she did was point down the stairs. Curiously, I walked down and started towards our door. I noticed absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. I marched back up the steps to ask her what was wrong with her. Finally, she related this to me. When she came home from school, she walked down to our door, only to find it standing wide open. She knew I wasn't home yet, and neither was her mom. She would have seen her car out front. She walked slowly to the open doorway and peered into the living room, at which time she says the chairs in the dining room table all flew away from it simultaneously, and what sounded like all the kitchen cabinets and drawers slammed shut, their contents rattling from the force. She said she saw the chairs move, but nobody was in the apartment. She then said she was so scared that she dropped her books, let the door standing wide open, and ran up the stairs and sat there until I arrived. I explained that she must have imagined it all, as the door was closed and I saw no books in the hallway. She swore it happened exactly like she said, but I was still skeptical. So me, being the older, wiser, and therefore fearless one, I pressured her into going back down there with me. I mean, we had to go in sooner or later, right? I unlocked the door and slowly opened it, while my sister hid behind me, clinging to me like a cheap sweater. Lo and behold, gasp, everything was as it should be, with the exception of my sister's school books, all piled neatly on the coffee table. The chairs were where they should be, and nothing was amiss in the kitchen. Needless to say, I didn't believe a word my sister told me. That was until I saw the shadow man. A few weeks after finding my sister cowering on the steps, I bought a Walkman radio and some cassettes. We're talking early 80s here, to go with it. That night, I decided to listen to my Walkman after my sister and mom went to bed. I believe it was around 11pm when I started getting the distinct feeling that I was being watched from the open doorway to our room. I don't know why, but I was instantly afraid. I just knew it wasn't my mom. So, since I was lying on my back, all I had to do was turn my head in the direction of the doorway and find out if anyone was there or not. I turned the Walkman off and waited, lying stiff as a board and holding my breath, just waiting to hear anything unusual. I was still getting the impression that someone was in the doorway staring at me, but I was too terrified to look. I just knew that I wouldn't like seeing who was there, and now I was certain that there was somebody there. Finally, I got the nerve to slowly turn my head towards the door. To my absolute horror, there was a man standing there. I had never been so scared in all my life. I didn't dare to move or make a sound, or even breathe for that matter. I just kept my eyes glued to the doorway. That's when I noticed that I could see right through it. Before I could really panic, it occurred to me that it must be a shadow of someone that was standing out at street level. I rationalized that the street lights were casting the shadow into the hallway through the window that was in our room. I was starting to calm myself down and decided to prove my theory by turning around and looking at the window that was behind me. As soon as I did, panic assailed me all over again. There was no shadow on the sheer curtains nothing but the soft glow of the street light in the parking lot. I immediately looked back to the doorway, hoping and praying desperately that the figure would be gone. It was still there, only now it appeared darker, but I could still make out the thermostat for the heating and the air on the wall through it. It also seemed to be projecting a seriously negative feeling. I don't understand why I felt that, but I did, and I was definitely terrified. It made no movement whatsoever, and I was able to really look at it. It appeared to be a man wearing a long trench coat and a fedora-style hat. It reminded me of a Dick Tracy kind of character, if you know what I mean. All this was in outline with no other distinguishing features. No face, hands, or feet for that matter. 
and it seemed to hover in one spot. I didn't know what to do at this point, and it seemed an eternity had passed since I noticed its presence. It occurred to me then that I didn't hear my sister snoring, which was a usual thing for her to be doing, hence the reason I had bought the Walkman. I figured she had to be awake, so I whispered her name. Imagine my disbelief when she responded, and I could tell she was terrified too. I couldn't blame her one bit. After all, the foot of her bed was only three feet from the doorway and it. I whispered to her, do you see it? Yes, she hissed and then started whimpering. We have to get out of here. On the count of three, we run as fast as we can to mom's room. So much for me being the fearless one. She didn't want to, but I wasn't staying, that was for sure. Our escape would mean running through the thing, but at that point, I didn't see any other options. I counted the three, bounded off the bed, grabbed my sister from her bed, and we were both screaming and running hellbent for leather from my mom's room down the hall. We jumped into the bed with her. She was already sitting up, having heard us screaming. I don't recall what she said, or what we even told her. It seems I just passed out from the fright. My mom didn't ask us about what had happened the next day, and my sister, nor myself, brought it up then. Maybe my mom didn't need to ask. Who knows? We never saw the Shadow Man after that, thank God. As it happened, we moved out shortly thereafter. I don't think it was a coincidence either. Arlie's wasn't up until six more months. I didn't complain, and neither did my sister. We never spoke of it until I brought it up to her during a phone conversation in 1996 when I was telling her about my new haunted house. I'll send some of those stories later. We were both surprised that the other remembered the incident so clearly. After all those years, the details of that night were still very clear to the both of us. This was my very first ghostly encounter. I hope you enjoyed it. It's exactly how I remember it. And of course, I could never forget the Shadow Man. This event happened while I was back in Pine Ridge, visiting family. In Pine Ridge, there is no rhyme or reason to where cemeteries are placed. There are numerous little cemeteries on hilltops and mixed in with the various homes. Then there is a main cemetery behind Red Cloud School where lots of weird stuff happens there as well. I don't go back to visit very often, and because of this, I'm not nearly as superstitious as the locals when it comes to hanging around cemeteries. One of the superstitions which I found out the hard way is the real deal, is to never go around a graveyard at dusk and be careful who you talk to or see in the cemetery. By my cousin's house is a cemetery within walking distance on a small hill that looks over the street that she lives on. I don't actually know anybody buried in the cemetery since all of my family is buried in either Red Cloud Cemetery or St. Anne Cemetery. At the time of this story, my cousins both had small daughters and they would come by and visit often. My cousin had mentioned that he had gone up to the cemetery on the hill one evening to clean the area up a little and while he was there, he saw an old woman dressed in black standing by an older grave crying. He didn't recognize her and walked up closer to see if she was alright. He approached her and when she turned around, she only had eyes but no face. My cousin was very scared and hightailed it out of there. What he didn't realize was he brought a visitor back with him. After this happened, my aunt started hearing things in the house and small objects would be moved around. They figured someone had come down from the cemetery. My aunt is a kind of new ager, so she didn't find this to be upsetting, she just accepted it. While I was there one day during broad daylight, I was sitting in the living room and I saw a little girl walking down the hall and she walked into the bedroom. I'd been there only a couple of days, so I thought it was one of my two cousins little daughters. I wondered if my cousins had pulled up and she had come into the house, so I called out and then got up and looked. Nobody was there. I went to my aunt and asked if my cousins and their kids were there. She said no. I then told her, well some kid just walked down the hallway. Turns out, it was the little dead girl from the graveyard. 
I was really freaked out because after that, she started making her presence more known. For instance, I would wake up in the middle of the night and the bedroom light would be on, the door would be open, I would shut it and it would open up back again. Weird stuff like that. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well until I left. This story happened when I was 18 years old. My friend Chris had just moved to Reno, Nevada, about 30 miles north of Carson City, into her first apartment. This apartment was a regular run-of-the-mill one-bedroom apartment, nothing special, and within the budget of someone just getting out of high school. When Chris was moving in with the help of a boyfriend and some other friends, there was still some junk in the apartment from the previous tenant. You know when you first move into a place, there are little scraps of paper, pins, buttons, etc. Especially in the closets and stuff? Well, while they were cleaning up, they found a driver's license. It was a guy's license, and he was over 21. We all know where this is headed, right? Anyway, Chris's then boyfriend, who was under 21, figured this was a real lucky find. He could use it to go out and get into the clubs and go drinking in the casinos. We all had false IDs back then, but having an unaltered license was the best. Chris got moved into the apartment, and initially, everything was going great. But then she started to notice some odd things happening in and around her apartment. For starters, whenever she would come home, the light in the walk-in closet would be on. At first, she just thought that she had left it on when she was getting dressed. But after a few more times, when she was sure that she had turned it off, and then it was on, she started getting a little freaked out about it. After this had gone on a while, the window in her bedroom would also be found open. She even went so far as to lock and nail it shut. Sure enough, she got back from work, and it was open. Small things also began to be misplaced, and then show up somewhere else in the apartment. Finally, one night Chris, her boyfriend, and a group of friends went out to a club called the Premier Club in Reno. When they were standing at the door, waiting to get in, the bouncer was, of course, doing the prequisite ID checks. When the bouncer got to Chris's boyfriend, who had used this ID already numerous times before, he took a look, stopped, and then got really angry. He kept saying over and over, this isn't you, this is not you. And of course, Chris's boyfriend started to sweat the load, because he thought for sure he had somehow been found out. He tried to bluff, saying yes it was him, but the bouncer only stared back at him and said, I know this guy, and repeated, this isn't you. As it turns out, the young man who the ID did belong to was the one that was found in Chris's closet. Not long before, he had hung himself in that same very closet and was found dead there. Needless to say, Chris moved out of the apartment pronto. Anyone who has ever served in the Navy has certainly heard a ghost story or two. Although deaths in peacetime on board naval ships is rare, it does occasionally happen, usually due to mishaps or suicide, and, although rare, murders occur as well. This particular ship was a destroyer, and this destroyer was haze gray and underway most times. When a ship is underway, one must perform their usual duties plus collateral duties, and stand various watches. The watches that can be the longest are when you are standing out on the ship, somewhere at night in the middle of the ocean. There had been various rumors aboard this particular ship that people saw someone walking around the ship in places that they didn't belong and when challenged would simply disappear. One night, a friend of mine had the watch. It was around 1am or so, and he was standing out by the fantail after having walked around and was having a smoke. He was of course still looking around, but in the middle of the night, there isn't anyone to see. Suddenly, he saw a shape that was darker than the rest of the dark, standing silhouetted by the tower area of the ship. This was an area that a person wouldn't have any business being in at that time of night. So my friend D yelled out, Hey, you up there! He expected for someone to yell back down. 
Instead, the person ran straight up the side of the tower and onto the radar equipment. There is no way that a real person could have done this. It had the outline of a man and was the same size as a shipmate would be. Once he reached the top of the tower, he just vanished. My friend D came back down after his watch and started talking about the weird crap he just saw. And of course, that's when the other stories started rolling in. Turns out, at times, sound-powered phones through the ship would ring even if they weren't in use at the time. Even the phones on board the ship, which are usually out of service when the ship is underway, would ring. If someone picked the phone up, they would just hear static and silence. Other men reported that they had seen a man walking around corners and disappearing from the passageways before anyone could catch up with them. Others had also seen the sailor out on various parts of the ship at night. But did someone die on board? Chances are, somewhere along the line someone has. But who was this? No one ever did find out. The first story I told you about my house in Spur was the first time that anything strange had ever happened there, but it sure wasn't the last. First, I think I should give you a little background information. When I lived in Spur, I was married to a guy named Gary. He died of a major heart attack in November of 1991. I lived in the house until June of 1992. During those eight months, my house became what I would like to call very lively. This story isn't really scary, but it does prove that not all ghosts have to be terrifying. When my husband died, I was devastated. For the first time in my life, I wasn't sure if I could go on or if I even wanted to. I cried constantly. Everything I saw or heard always seemed to remind me of him. About two weeks after he died, I sent my daughter Trina to my mother's house for the night. I hadn't been alone even once since Gary's death and I felt that I needed the time alone. I knew I would most likely spend most of the evening crying again and I knew my poor daughter needed a break from my crying. I had to get my grief under control for my daughter's sake and I hoped that by being alone I might be able to come to terms with my feelings and so on. I watched TV for a while, cleaned the house and ate a small luncheon for supper. It had been three hours and I still didn't cry. I was proud of myself for that. I started to get tired, so I turned off all the lights and laid on the couch. I tried hard to resist it, but the tears came anyways. I was crying harder then than ever before. It hurt so bad that I began to imagine a way to make it stop hurting. I thought if I could go to sleep and never wake up, I could be with him again. Suddenly. A cool breeze, not a cold one, just a cool one, seemed to drift across my face and with it came the scent of Gary's favorite cologne. I sat up on the couch and scanned the room, thinking that it was going to appear and all of this had just been a terrible nightmare. I saw nothing, but I could smell his cologne even stronger. My heart began to race and I knew that it was there with me. Then I noticed that it felt like somebody had just sat down next to me because the couch springs seemed to groan a little and I knew it wasn't me because I hadn't moved. The funny thing was, I wasn't scared. For the first time since his death, I felt safe and I knew I would be okay. I leaned back against the couch and just let what I knew was Gary comfort me with his presence. I cried and I told him how much I loved him and missed him. I remember thinking how wonderful it would be to be in his arms once more. Incredibly enough, I felt what seemed like someone putting their arms around me very gently. I can remember feeling so happy and contented. I closed my eyes and fell asleep in my husband's arms. When I awoke the next morning, I faced the day with new hope and a happiness inside that I hadn't felt in a long time. I knew he wanted me to go on for my daughter's sake. I remember telling him that I would survive for our child. I finally felt like I could let him go and I told him that before I went to pick up Trina. The only thing was, Gary never really left. Many other things happened that I knew was him, but I didn't mind. It was comforting to know that he was always there with me. 
Not all the things that happened in the house were good though. Some were downright mean and cruel. I know that Carrie would never be so mean and cruel, so I can only assume that there was another presence there in my house. But that's another story. As a child, I had a very creative mind and have grown up to be a fairly competent artist. However, even an endless imagination couldn't have prepared me for the encounters I had at 8 years old and the events had been burned into my mind. It was 1974 and my family had just moved from Quantico, Virginia. My dad was a marine officer to Camp Pendleton Marine Corps based in California into a two-story duplex. Just about the time it got settled in, my paternal grandfather was murdered. A few months later, my mom's parents visited. Since we had a big family, a few of us kids were delighted to give up our beds for visiting family. Pappy got my bed, and I was relocated to my brother's bunk bed. Mark and I didn't get along, so I slept on the bottom with Daniel, with my head at the foot of the bed. At about 4 a.m., the first night, something awakened me. I didn't think anything about it and started to sleep again. However, I felt as if someone was watching me. Then I could hear very heavy breathing and felt a downward draft on my face. Scared out of my mind, I squinted my eyes and saw a hulking black figure, looking like the Grim Reaper without bones, hovering over me as if staring into my eyes. I tried to ignore it, but it wouldn't go away. I even snored, but it still didn't leave. Thinking that a little movement might disrupt the nightmare, I moved towards the center of the bed, but I didn't wake up, and the tormentor continued to breathe on my face, moving around the bed and laying down beside me. Immediately, I leapt from the bed and screamed at the top of my lungs, It's got me! It's got me! Everyone in the family came running to see what had happened, commenting that a dark figure had disappeared in the hallway to the bedroom. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night. What's worse, that black fiend and his lot continued to haunt me, the family, and the neighbors for years. I resorted to sleeping with an adult very close by as often as I was allowed. Otherwise, encounters like the following were a nightly ritual. If I ever turned my head from the hallway light, which was left on for my security, the fiend shadow would appear and he would start panting like he'd just run a 26 mile race. Sometimes he'd hide behind the door or in a closet. Sometimes the whole family would hear chains dragging across the floor or glass breaking downstairs. One night it sounded as if plungers were being walked up and down the stairs. By this time, I had mustered enough courage to investigate the sounds and saw nothing in the stairwell. Perhaps the scariest moment was the night I heard the hideous, angry laughter. As usual, something had awakened me and I sat there wondering what to expect. Suddenly, I heard a commotion from downstairs, followed by laughter that could have come from the movie Sybil or The Exorcist. First it was one voice, then it was two as if they were running around the first floor. Then they stopped. Suddenly, the first one started again, and I could hear it coming from up the stairs. It entered the hallway, ran to the bedroom, and brushed up against me, passing into the wall. Then the second voice started, but I didn't lie in bed waiting for it. I ran straight to my parents' room. Another time, one of our cousins came to visit, and it was decided that he and I would share a bed. Sometime that night, I was awakened to see the outline of a goat's head on my mom's wardrobe. It was kept in my room with a bright ring in its nose and spiraling, fiery horns. As I screamed, it went away. Finally, one night, I'd had enough of the crap from whatever was haunting me. He had decided to inhabit the corner behind my bedroom door just staring and breathing towards me. I sat up and said, in the name of Jesus, leave me alone. Guess what? It stopped. I've never seen that thing again. And every day, I thank God for the relief. However, all the haunting hadn't stopped. As recently as 1988, 
I've been harassed by a paranormal phenomenon. Even though we moved across the country, at times, I would wake up being dragged by my feet off the bed. I also asked my parents if they had noticed my old bunk bed, the one from California, would sometimes shake and squeak as if a couple were going at it. My dad confided that, when I was young, the bed would often make lots of noise, sometimes when I was asleep on it, which would explain why I was often awake in the middle of the night. He bolted out of his room, swearing someone was harming one of his boys, only to find us all sleeping soundly. He also said the neighbors in California, the Martins, shared similar experiences to what I'd had. The past 11 years have been pretty uneventful, paranormally, and I hope it stays that way. A few nights before the big production at my high school, the director was staying after school to work on the set's final touches. She was alone on stage when suddenly a single long blonde hair fell from above. She thought to herself, hmm, must have been Stephanie's. Yeah, it must have stuck in the light fixture when she was working on it. Still, Miss Holton couldn't shake the somewhat eerie feeling that crept around her neck. She'd had this feeling ever since the beginning of rehearsals. The next day, Miss Holton went to visit a friend in hers in the school. Elizabeth, I had the strangest thing happen last night. I was staying after, and when I was on stage, when this long piece of hair from the ceiling fell. Was it long blonde? Asked Elizabeth. Yes, why? It must have been Julie's, Elizabeth said in an eerie tone. Who's Julie? You mean you haven't heard of Julie before? Back in 1974, the drama department decided to put Romeo and Juliet for the spring production. Julie was a tall, beautiful blonde senior who was talented in every way. She was determined to get the part of Juliet. Auditions came around. And sadly, Julie didn't make the cut. She was outraged. She told the director if he didn't give her the part, she would die. Simply die. If I don't get the part, Julie told him, I'll kill myself. Of course, no one took her seriously. And a few months later, Romeo and Juliet opened up. The first night, Julie was there, sitting directly in the middle of the house, staring angrily at Juliet. She didn't laugh or cry. When the play was over, she got up and left. Juliet went to the house manager and told him, My God, Julie was giving me the creeps. She just kept staring at me. Her friend comforted her and told her not to worry about it. No, she's just jealous, that's all. She won't come back the next night. But Julie came back again. She sat in the center of the house, neither laughing or crying, just glaring at Juliet. Once again, Juliet went to the house manager and told him, She was here again, Jared. She just kept staring at me. Now, I mean it. If she comes tomorrow, give her a different seat. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, sure I will, whatever you say. Sunday was the final night, and sure enough, Julie showed up. Somehow, she got the same seat and glared at poor Juliet. When the show was over, she got up and left. The house closed, and the teachers began to knock down the set. They left a ladder center stage and a rope hanging from one of the pipes. Sometime in the middle of the night... Julie broke into the theater and climbed the ladder. She hitched a rope around her neck and hung herself. On Monday morning, she was found by a teacher. She was dead and bloated. And that is Julie's story. Elizabeth completed the story and asked, What play were you originally going to do anyway? Miss Holton gulped. Romeo and Juliet. Julie has haunted our theater since the night of her untimely death. Sometimes she makes props disappear. Other times she makes the noise of a chair being thrown down. Of course, no one will find the invisible person whose pranks, or are they warnings, scare them. Her footsteps simply ring in the empty halls. One thing is for certain though, 
we know Julie had come to visit. It all started when I was about eight years old. My family and I moved into a rented house in Haltom City, Fort Worth, Texas. This house was not really all that old, maybe built in the 50s, that's a guess. Anyway, moving in, I was outside in the front yard playing and two neighbor boys came out and started talking to me. Eventually, I went to the house to visit and got to know these prospective new friends. While inside, I was standing in a particular spot in their kitchen when one of the boys looked at the other and then at me and says, I wouldn't stay in there if I were you. Curious, I asked, why not? And the boy replied, because there was a ghost in that very spot one time. Needless to say, I jumped right off that spot and went outside. Then I was curious. I started asking these guys about their ghost and they told me that their aunt and little cousin had come to visit them and while they were in the kitchen talking and catching up, the little boy was running around in the house playing. A little bit later, the little boy walked into the kitchen and stood next to his mom. His mom noticing him out of the corner of her eye went to place her hand on his shoulder and her hand passed right through him. She jumped back aghast and looked at the little boy. The kid just looked up at her and then all the other adults in the kitchen one by one then vanished and about that time the little boy came running down the hall screaming like something was chasing him. As a kid that story frightened me quite a bit but then they proceeded to tell me that they would be sitting watching TV and the channel would change or the volume would go up full blast all of a sudden and sometimes their front door will swing wide open with the deadbolt still poking out as if it passed right through the door or something. The boys I was chatting with had an older sister. She was about 17 or 18 years old and one night she was asleep and she distinctly felt someone grab her by her arms firmly and lift her into the air and start banging her into the window like it was trying to toss her out. Of course, she woke up terrified and started screaming at the top of her lungs. When her parents burst into her room and turned the light on, it dropped her and disappeared. It was never visible, but left right then. The next day, I saw the bruise marks on her arms that were shaped like someone with large hands had been squeezing them very hard. At the time, I was too scared to ever go into the house, but at the same time, I felt like they may be pulling my leg and making up these stories. That is, until one day, my parents were outside talking to these boys' parents and they told my folks the same stories that they told me. To top it off, they said to my parents, some very strange things have happened in your house too, but we'd rather not talk about that. And they never told my folks what happened in our house. I'll send in another story soon. I don't know why but I've always had experiences ever since I can remember. The experiences have been from ghostly encounters too. Well, I'd rather let you decide what the others are. I guess the reason why I draw these things towards me and others around me is that my awareness is higher than most people or that I'm just lucky. All my life, I felt things that I cannot explain. I'll visit a new place with my family or go on a school field trip and things will happen, or they just happen at my home. I've had very pleasant experiences, and then there were the scariest kinds. I'll tell you a few of the scary ones. Massachusetts is a very old state, with a lot of very old homes, and that's why haunted tales are not unusual. But no matter how many experiences people have or tell, no one seems to believe them. I will say that all of my stories are true, Believe them or not, that's your choice. By the summer before my 8th grade in junior high, my family, mom, grandmother and myself moved into a new house. Ever since I can remember, things would move around on my bedroom dresser. I have crystal vases, boxes, etc. I would go downstairs and realize that I forgot something and all the things on my dresser would have been moved completely to the other side of the dresser. 
Since I was the only child at the time, my grandmother was downstairs and my mother would be at work. I knew it was a ghost. However, it wasn't threatening, so I didn't think about it too much. I just let it do what it wanted to. About three years later, I experienced something very scary. I had a friend from school sleep over my house, and that evening, I saw someone in my room. I awoke from sleeping. I was on the floor in a sleeping bag, and my friend was in my bed. I thought my grandmother was in my room. I saw a figure pacing back and forth in front of my bed. Again, I thought it was my grandmother, so I called out to her. I thought she was just checking to make sure we had enough blankets, etc. But when it finally turned to look at me, I realized it wasn't her. It was a medium-sized man, dressed in black, with a long black cape and a hood over his head, and the whitest face I had ever seen. And one more thing, I swear that he had a mark on his face in black, similar to the letter Z. After I saw this, I turned to my friend and started yelling at my friend to wake up. When she finally did, I told her to look, and of course he wasn't there. She told me that I was imagining it and to go back to sleep. The next morning, we both went downstairs and I told my family what I had seen. They all laughed at me, but I was serious and my mother told me she believed me. About a week later, I was on the phone with another friend of mine, Shelly. We were talking about what we had been up to. She told me that last weekend, she and some of our friends went out at the end of the evening for a drive to a nearby cemetery. She said the three of them got out to walk around the graveyard, but she stayed behind in the car to wait. She said that when she was waiting for the others to come back, she saw this man coming towards the car at her. She then proceeded to tell me that she was never so scared in her life. She started to freak out. She quickly leaned over all of the seats of the car to make sure the car door was locked. And when she looked up, the man was still walking towards her in the car. She then described the man to me on the phone. And she described him to the T as the man that I saw in my room that same weekend. I was speechless on the phone and just listened to her story. I didn't tell her about my visit from the man who I called the Z-Man. About a month passed after that and I finally told her my story. She was shocked and thought I was making it up. I told her I wanted to tell her that night she called me, but I was so scared that I just couldn't. Two months passed towards the end of the summer. Shelly and I and some of our friends went to the drive-in theater. She and I had to go to the restroom. As we waited in line, we turned to look on the wall and saw, written black, was the Z-Man is coming. We then both looked at each other and ran out of there as fast as we could. All I know is that it was evil, and I didn't want to find out if he or it was coming again or not. I haven't saw this man since 1989, or at least not that I can remember, but nor do I want to. Then again, I live in Florida now, and maybe that could be a reason why he hasn't made an appearance. Thanks for reading. It all happened when I was at my old house, which was a rather smallish farmhouse. There I lived with my mother, father, and 17-year-old brother. I was always a little suspicious, but not greatly into anything like ghosts in any big way or manner. Little things would always happen around the house, things like books falling off shelves, vases, etc. But no one really took any particular notice. Everyone else in my family simply blamed it on the old house's feeble foundation. But me being a little sus, I always came to the same conclusion, that it had to be a ghost and that the house was truly and purely haunted. Especially since someone died in the old place about 10 years before we moved in. And well, that would give you the creeps, right? Well, it did a righteous turn for me, I assure you. I'm not quite sure how the person died. No one ever talked about it. Anyway, my brother used to love attempting to scare me. He would jump out at me all the time and go running past my door and screaming boo. Stupid, immature things like that. But one day, I was in my room, lying on my bed, just glancing at my door that was wide open. 
My brother was in his bedroom, right next to mine. I could tell this because his music was turned right up. My father was at work and my mother was, well, I didn't have a clue as to where she was. I thought she was in the kitchen. So, I was staring at my door in the middle of the day when suddenly a shadow whisked past my door. It appeared about the half the size of a human being and seemed to almost float. I thought it was just my brother playing tricks on me, as if he had just ran past my door and was squatting to make himself look short. So I called out to him, very funny ads, very funny. I looked at the door again, and once again, the thing ran past my door in the opposite direction, heading towards my parents' room to the back of the house. This time, I was freaked, but I still believed, or wanted to believe, that it was my brother fooling around. So I ran into his room to find it unbelievably empty. So I ran back into my room and looked out my window, and there, out the front of our five acre block was my mother and brother doing some gardening. I ran out the front and accused my brother of being stupid and he had no idea whatsoever what was going on. My mother became suspicious and we all went back into the house together. We searched the house from front to back, finding absolutely nothing to blame. Strange things kept happening around the house. We soon moved, thank God. Now that we've moved house into town, we only just found out that one of the houses around the corner where we used to live was also supposed to be haunted. Apparently, once a whole bookshelf fell over, almost crushing the owner of the house for no apparent reason. The world is weird, but we definitely are not alone. When my husband and I were first married some 29 years ago, he took me to Columbus, Ohio to meet his family. His mother lived on West 2nd Avenue and his sister and her family lived across the street from her. Tootie, my husband's sister, was a nice friendly person and we got along great from day one. She and her family lived in a big old house that, like many other old houses, had been divided into two apartments, one upstairs and one down. Tootie and her family lived in the downstairs apartment. My husband and I were staying with his mother but we visited Tootie and her family every day. Several times during the visits, I heard the front door open. The two apartments shared a common front door and foyer, then each had their own individual doors to the apartments, footsteps going up the stairs to the other apartment, and then what sounded like people moving around up there. I found nothing strange about this, as I was not familiar with the house or its occupants. Then one night, Tootie, her three children and I were alone in her apartment. She was in the kitchen fixing supper while I kept an eye on the kids who were watching TV in the living room. Again, I heard the outside door open, someone going up the stairs and the door to the other apartment open and close. About that time, Tootie called the kids and me to supper. During the course of conversation over supper, I asked her who lived in the upstairs apartment. No one, she said. That apartment has been empty since we moved here three years ago. I felt the blood draining from my face because I knew that someone had been going up there all week and was, in fact, up there at the moment we were talking. My first thought was that someone was up to no good and that they were using the empty apartment as a base. Tootie was looking at me strangely. Someone is up there, I said. I heard them go up there a while ago. That's impossible, Tootie replied. The only other person with the key to that apartment besides myself the landlord had given her a key so she could check on the other apartment from time to time. Is the landlord, and he's out of town this week. At that moment, we all heard heavy footsteps plodding down the hallway upstairs. The hallway led down a block flight of stairs, which ended at a door, which was kept locked at all times, that opened into Tootie's apartment. The footsteps were headed for that door. Badly frightened, we all jumped up from the table. Call the police, I screamed. I'll call Ted's, her husband's brother, she said. He lives just two houses down the street and can get here before the police. Tootie's brother-in-law and a friend that happened to be visiting him arrived within minutes of her frantic call. Tootie gave them the key to the apartment and they just went upstairs with flashlights. There was no electricity on in the upstairs apartment to check things out. 
Tootie, the kids and I, sat huddled in the kitchen, expecting the man to yell call the police at any moment, but nothing happened. Then, we heard footsteps coming down the stairs to the door that led into the kitchen. There they stopped. We thought it was Tootie's brother-in-law and his friend, and Tootie called out to him. There was no answer. A few minutes later, Tootie's brother-in-law and his friend came down the stairs via the door in the kitchen and called for Tootie to let them in. They had seen or heard nothing, they said, and had been through the whole apartment. They probably thought we were two hysterical women who had spooked each other, but we knew what we had heard. Tootie said that after that night, the footsteps and banging doors in the upstairs apartment got so bad that she eventually moved out, even though her apartment was a really nice place. She moved across the street to the house where her mother had lived and stayed there for the next 10 years. People moved in and out of the downstairs apartment in her old house at an alarming rate and no one ever stayed long. Strangely enough, no one ever rented the upstairs apartment, even though it was a nice place. About 10 years after this incident, a strange odor started permeating the air on West 2nd Avenue. It smelled like something dead. Everyone up and down the street assumed that some large animal, a dog maybe, had crawled into the basement of a house and died. Eventually, they decided the odor was coming from the house that Tootie had lived in. The police were called to investigate, and they found the body of Tootie's former landlord, you guessed it, in the upstairs apartment. One has to wonder if the entity that haunted the place had anything to do with the old man's death. I certainly hope not. I hope he died a peaceful death, but the police said a pure look of terror was frozen on his face when they found his decomposing body in that awful apartment. Thanks for reading. Last year in the month of June, my twin sister Kelly decided that she didn't want to be on this earth anymore. We were both 20 years old, and I knew at that time she was going through a depressed state. Being her closest sister, I could sense her depression first off before anyone, but just thought it was friends, or maybe that she wasn't feeling well. Her mood swings were affecting mom and dad, and they were concerned if she was sick or worried about anything that she could tell them, but she didn't let anyone know her reasons for being moody. Two months before she died, she started writing in a journal. It wasn't a daily journal, but she entered things in it that were occurring in her life, or about how she was feeling. One of her entries captured my attention. She wrote about a 22-year-old man by the name of David and his visits to her. At first, I thought it was someone she was seeing that none of us knew about. But as I read on, she mentioned that David was a ghost, but he didn't scare her. She went on about how she came to visit her when she was alone in her room and when she was asleep. His presence was always willed because he would touch her lightly on her hair or on her shoulder and it would be a very cold feeling. Kelly went on to say that this only happened in her room. At first when I read the story, I was a little frightened that this was happening in our house, but then Kelly wrote that David was a gentle spirit that kept her company and she became very attached to him after some time. Then her depression set in. She didn't want to live anymore and go through the hassles of being an adult with all the responsibilities involved. I always knew she wanted life to be handed to her on a silver platter and that she was never one to be realistic. She just ignored the important things in life and went on. She entered into her journal that life was boring and that she didn't have the same direction or goals that I had. We were identical twins but had totally different personalities. I cried when I read that because I would have always tried to help her if she was sad. I wish I had been a better sister to her during her depressed time and I get mad at myself for not being persistent enough to have helped her. Kelly's last entry was two weeks before she died, and it said that life with David would be more happier for her. She would plan her departure to be with David soon, and she hoped that everyone would understand what she was going through and that this is what she wanted to do. I've never understood why she killed herself, and neither has anyone else. The reason why she died is just too bizarre to understand. On December 10th, at about 11 p.m., I was closing all the windows and locking the doors in our house before I went to bed. Mom and Dad had gone away for a couple of days for a break from work, and Mom still had not gotten over Kelly's death, 
So I was the only one at home as I was securing the house when I heard the sounds of someone running up the stairs in laughter. My heart started pounding as I knew no one was in the house except for me. I wasn't sure what to do, so I grabbed one of mom's kitchen knives and started up the stairs. Then the running footsteps vanished into Kelly's old room and the laughter continued. Now my stomach was churning and I was scared to even look. I just thought to myself that this can't be happening and gripped the knife tightly as I neared the entrance of the room. As I edged closer, I heard the sounds of two people but could understand what they were saying. I could only hear the voice of a male and a female. I asked who was there but no one replied so I stormed into Kelly's bedroom. It was empty. I opened the wardrobe door to see if anyone was hiding in there and that was also empty. But oddly, her bedroom window was open and a cool breeze was entering the room. As I turned around, I was startled to see a hazy figure standing at the bedroom doorway. My heart felt like it was going to be ripped out as it was beating so fast. I stood in shock and stared in amazement. Even though I felt silly for asking, I asked if she was Kelly. I could tell by the shape of the figure that it was a female and then she started to come towards me. I backed off a bit and then she became familiar with me. She was wearing faded blue jeans and a blue top. Tears were streaming down my face. These were the same clothes Kelly had worn when she had hung herself. Even though her face was not clear to me, I knew that she was smiling. She blew me a kiss and walked out of the room and into the hallway. I ran after her but she had disappeared quicker than a blink of an eye. After that experience, I've always had a feeling that Kelly is watching me. It's a scary memory I have of her visit, but I do feel comforted that she is not sad. I miss her deeply and have not seen her spirit since. I hope she is finally at rest. Before I moved to Las Vegas, I used to visit a lot. My family and I enjoyed staying at the various hotels. About three years ago, we stayed at one of the original older hotel casinos on the Strip in Las Vegas. At the time this hotel casino was experiencing difficulties with the union. Our room was 179. When we got to the door, I put in the key card. The little green light went on and I tried to open the door. It was impossible to open. It took me and my dad to open it. At the time, we thought it was some kind of vacuum or the hinges on the door needed to be fixed. Of course, five minutes later, we forgot all about it. A few minutes after I put my clothes in the drawers, I searched around the room to check for any dropped casino chips from past guests. To my dismay, I found nothing. After that, I looked for the Bible in the room. There was none. Now that was odd. They are always in hotel rooms. Someone must have taken it. Later that day, we all went out to the strip. My mom got tired around 11 o'clock, so she went back to the room. Me and my dad stayed out till 1 o'clock in the morning. When we got back, I was really tired. I slept on the couch and my parents slept on the bed. We had a suite. The next morning, my dad was almost crying. He said that he had seen a ghost. I thought he was joking because he had always said that there was no such things. He said he saw it around 4.45 in the morning. According to him, he felt something at the foot of the bed. He turned over, sat up, and opened his eyes. Standing before him was a woman dressed in a white dress. He said it looked like something from the 40s or 50s. The lady had her arms folded across her chest. He could see all the wrinkles in her dress. She just stood there and didn't make a sound, but he did not see a face or hands, just whiteness. When he saw her, he yelled at my mom to wake up. My mom didn't wake up right away. He shook her a few times to wake up. When she did, my dad looked at the woman at the foot of the bed. Then, she just dissipated from the outside in. They didn't want to wake me until 8 a.m. They said they didn't want to keep me awake. I really don't know what to think. So, being the smart ass that I am, I lit a match and said, Ghost, you are no longer welcome here. Get out of your room. But then I said, oh, never mind. You can just stay over in that corner if you don't bother us. My parents were apprehensive about staying another night. I convinced them that we should stay another night because I thought it would be cool and so they agreed. That night, I fell asleep around 1230. At about 4 in the morning, 
I felt something in the room. I was afraid to look. I put my head in my blankets for about 15 minutes. I was breathing pretty hard. I decided to stick my head out of the blankets, and when I did, I was scared out of my pajamas. There, in the corner that I told the ghost to go, was the ghost, white dress and all. Immediately, I put my head under the covers. Tears were coming down my face. I hoped to God that the ghost didn't come over to me. I stayed awake and didn't move until I heard my parents were awake. When I had told them what had happened, they decided that we would never return to this hotel ever again. We packed up all of our stuff and headed out, and when we got to the door, the maid was there. My dad asked her, what was that we saw in the room? The maid's eyes got big, and she asked us if we had seen the ghost. We all answered yes in unison. She said that she would not clean the room, handed off the towels to us, and ran off crying. When we checked out, we didn't ask anyone about the ghost because we didn't want to cause a scene. When we got home, I told all my friends about it. They all said cool. I don't think it was cool at all. At work, my dad asked if anybody knew any ghost stories about the place we had stayed at. One of his coworker girlfriends who had been a cocktail waitress there and said that in the 50s a country western singer had stayed there. He was cheating on his wife with his mistress. His wife visited him while he was in bed with the mistress and shot her, the mistress. That's all of the story I heard. The mistress of the man may or may not be the ghost in room 179, but all I know is that there is a ghost in that room and I'll never go there ever again. My teen years were turbulent and not very pleasant. I won't go into too much detail, but a little background is necessary in order to fully explain the story I have to tell. My family, being military, traveled often. This made us very dependent on one another. However, in 1985, my father retired to a small, miserable town called Lebanon in the cornfields of Illinois. Being a small town, it was chock full of every small town cliche imaginable. My sister, being two years older than I, found the prospect of not being uprooted suddenly very pleasing and made many friends very easily. I, on the other hand, couldn't stay in the bumpkins we lived among and quickly became the town outcast. My father, hating retirement, found a local job and was gone from the house a lot. My mother and I were never close and she soon became lost in my sister's popularity and forgot about me. None of this bothered me after all, I knew one day I would leave. Nonetheless, I found myself alone a lot. Our house was a clone of the typical 1950s two-story white house. We even had the white picket fence in the backyard. There had only been one previous owner of our abode, a nice old couple that had retired to Florida. They did not smoke, and no one in my family did at that time. However, shortly after moving in, we would smell cigarette smoke in various areas of the house. It was so strong, it would make one's eyes water. Then it would be gone. My father was never a believer, still isn't, so this was easily dismissed by him. However, my mother soon named the smoke the work of Fred. Once Fred became named, he made himself very believable. The footsteps, the lights, so on were all par for the cause. However, Fred's favorite activity would be rearranging the food in the fridge. We would come to breakfast in the morning and all the food would be alphabetized or arranged according to color, size, so on. Once he even crammed all the food onto one shelf, my mother yelled, Oh Fred, don't you ever do that again, now clean this up. The next time the door was opened, it was cleaned, although my father would say it was a half ass effort. But it was when I was alone that I could feel Fred more closely. He would be there so strongly, I would talk to him out loud, never getting an answer but feeling better. In our basement was a makeshift hobby room the previous owner had constructed. We kept our tools in this room as well as our empty luggage. When I would enter this room, I would feel like I was intruding. It always felt cold, and as soon as I found what I was looking for, the feeling to get out would be even stronger. Nothing bad ever happened, just the urgency to get out. I asked Fred if he wanted me to stay out of his room. The lights began to flicker, and I took that as a yes. I moved the tools and luggage and never went in there again. 
This continued for three years until one day, I was viciously attacked. Gotta love those small towns. Once I returned home and slept in my bed again, I felt someone sit down next to me. I thought it was my sister, but when I looked, I saw only a butt print, no body. I cried and talked to Fred all night about what had happened, and from that point on, he slept with me every night. I could sometimes feel him sit next to me on the couch or on the front porch swing. He was very comforting. I graduated from high school in 1990 and got the hell out of Dodge. The last night I was to sleep at home, I told Fred I was leaving. I heard a very heavy sigh explode next to me. I promised I would visit, and I did. Each time I would visit, he would sit next to me and I would fill him in on my life. Then in 1995, my parents moved to Alabama and sold the house. On the last day that I would ever be in the house, I had to say goodbye to Fred. I went into my now empty room and told Fred the news. I heard the sigh again, then footsteps as he walked away from me, down the stairs and then into the basement. I cried all the way home. Someone else lives in the house now. I drove by it yesterday, the first time in almost four years. It looked well taken care of. I wonder if Fred is still there, if he likes the new people. I wonder if they like him. I miss him, my friend, and think of him often. I lived in Savannah, Georgia for almost three years. It is the most haunted city in the US. I feel, and I have several stories to prove it, perhaps some other time. Thank you for letting me tell my story. About 40 years back. I became interested in tracing my family's ancestors. This is how I discovered the Tilly Bend Settlement. Situated in the Appalachian Mountains, it really is a beautiful place. The Dakota River flows down from the high mountains, winding its way into the Blue Ridge Lake. Tilly Bend Settlement is nestled back in these same mountains. One must cross the Dakota River and travel down a one-lane dirt road that takes you deep into the forest. As you drive along, one begins to notice, windows rolled down, how quiet the deep woods become. This was my first impression of this area 40 years ago. This place has been lost in time because it looks like the same now as then, with the exception of the renovation of Tilly Bent Church. I've been here many times many, many times over the last 40 years. I suppose you could say I'm drawn to the mystery of this place. I will only share a small portion of my research. However, you need to understand this. Tilly Bend Church sits right in the middle of this haunting. This church is not part of the haunting. This church is the house of God, and services are held here on a regular basis and demands the respect as being the house of God. In 1756, the Creek Indians lived in this area and got along quite well with this white folk that came to this area from North Carolina. There are census records showing that the white men intermarried with the Creek women. The Cherokee did not get along with the Creeks and forced them out of the area. The intermarried Creeks did not leave and neither did their customs. In 1820, the Stanleys had formed a settlement over the mountain in a place known then as Stanley Gap. This being told, I can now share with you what I know is fact. Searching for my great-great-grandmother's grave, I ended up in Tilly Road Cemetery. At this time, the church only had services on decoration once a year. The church building was very old, but still in fair condition for its age. There were no glass windows, only wooded shutters, and that was common in the days before air conditioning. The doors to this church is what I remember most about this old country church. There was in both of the old doors what appeared to be like someone had shot the doors with a rifle of some sort. My first impression was that someone had done this out of pure meanness. I then proceeded to walk around the side of the church and walked up and peered through one of the cracks between the shutters. Of course, with the shutters closed, 
and there being no windows, the inside was dark. I could, however, make out the old homemade church pews and the pulpit. I also noticed a high ceiling with the rafters showing. Yes, I thought this church is old, and the welcome sign out in front of the church stated the church was established in 1858. After I looked the old church over, I then headed up the hill to the cemetery. I noticed there were a lot of field stones marking the graves, which is not unusual for very old graveyards. Right in the center is a very old and large oak tree, the only tree that is in the graveyard. I started looking around at the grave markers for my great-great-grandmother's grave. Well, to my surprise, her grave was also in the center of the graveyard, and her grave was the only one under the oak tree. The name on her marker is Elizabeth, so I'm looking around at this graveyard, thinking it looked as if no one wanted to be buried anywhere near her grave. I then wrote the information for her marker down, and that is when I noticed the head of her grave was facing west, which is very odd, because all the people here bury the dead facing to the east, because the Lord will return in the eastern sky. I finished getting the information and I caught a glimpse of someone out of the corner of my eye. I did not hear a car come down the dirt road, and there were no houses close by. I turned very quick to see who it was, and there was no one. I laughed at myself thinking, yeah, I'm jumping at my own shadow. You see, I don't believe in ghosts, but I did believe in mean people. As I started back down the hill, I noticed another grave. It was called Mary. The birthday was the same as Elizabeth. They both died on October 26th. Elizabeth died 1905. Mary died 1906. I thought, boy, somebody messed up on the dates. I reached my car at the foot of the hill, and as I got in, I looked back up towards the cemetery, and at the tree, I saw what appeared to be a woman. Her dress was long and black. She had on a hat that I can only describe as a granny bonnet. I thought you have got to be kidding. Then it looked as if she stepped back behind the tree. I was curious, so I went about halfway back up the hill and shouted hello. Of course, no answer. So I walked all the way back to the tree and there was no one there. I hurried back to the car and left. A couple of weeks later, my grandfather asked me if I had went to his great-grandmother's grave. I told him I had, and asked why her grave was facing to the west. My grandfather said, well, she was a witch. I laughed, and I said, really, Grandpa, why is her grave turned around? He went on to tell me this. She was Greek, and also a witch doctor for the Creek Indians. The whole settlement was afraid of her. Now she had a daughter to marry, a Tilly, and another daughter to marry, a Stanley. There had been a family feud between the Tillys and the Stanleys, so the two sisters became enemies because of their husband. The feud escalated, and on Sunday morning, the Stanleys went to Tilly Church and started shooting through the doors of the church, killing the preacher, he was a Tilly, and several others in the church, including the one sister who married a Tilly. Now, the Tillys didn't let this go, and one night, they went to Stanley Gap and killed some of the men while they were asleep. Now the sister that married a Stanley, her husband was killed that night. A few months later, she died having a baby. Elizabeth Bradley vowed revenge on both the Tillys and the Stanleys for the death of her two daughters. After that, every baby born to the Tillys and Stanleys died at birth. I said, come to think of it, there was a lot of little baby graves, rows of them. My grandpa said, well, after a year of this, the Tillys went to Elizabeth Bradley's house and got her. She was then taken to the center of Tilly Graveyard and hung from the old tree. They cut her down 
and buried her right where she fell. Right before they hung her, she told them she would come back. Now, after a few months, the little baby started dying, all at birth. People in the Tilly settlement started claiming the witch had come back and had taken up residence in a very old and mean woman. Elizabeth Bradley's sister-in-law, Mary. So on the anniversary of Elizabeth Bradley's hanging, the men went and got Mary Tilly Bradley. They hung her from the same tree. They would not bury her facing west because she was, after all, not at fault because the witch came back through her and she was a Tilly. I said, Grandpa, that didn't really happen. He said, you saw the graves. And I'm telling you it did happen, and the older folks here will tell you that it's true. He said, and I'll tell you something else that's true. I saw one of them witches one time, when I was a small boy. My grandpa went on to say that when he was about nine years old, he went to decoration at Tilly, and he described the same very woman that I had seen. This happened 40 years ago my grandpa has been long gone for many years now. I've seen a tintype, old picture of Elizabeth Bradley, and I've also seen Elizabeth Bradley at Tillybent. I've kept a record, and I've seen her eight times in the last 40 years. There has been two occasions that I heard a little baby crying as I walk up the hill. Of course, it quits when I get to the tree. Strange how one would think you could only see a ghost at night. I've only seen her in the daytime. Of course, I don't go there at night, and I never will. I've always believed in paranormal things. I've had many encounters with ghosts, and it's never really bothered me. My daughter was born in 2006. Around the time she was one and a half, we moved into a nice older house. The first night in our new house, we were camping out downstairs because our beds hadn't been unloaded from the truck yet. Around 2 a.m., I was woke up because you could hear the sounds of someone walking around in a room above the kitchen. I just blew it off as an older building and such. I walked upstairs. When I continued to find her closet doors open and things scattered around her room like someone had been in the boxes. Again, I just blew it off as my kid brother playing a trick before he left. The next morning we were setting up her room and I noticed her sitting there acting like she was playing with someone. It sort of gave me chills because she was actually talking to someone. I just ignored it, but later she started mentioning the man. Three days into living there is when things started happening. Her room has never been warm. I can turn the heater up to 75 degrees. I've bought a space heater. The landlords have came and checked the windows and insulation. Everything's normal. Her closet doors open at random times by themselves. Now at almost three, she still talks about the man in her room. He's informed me that the man tells her she can do things, be bad, and do things after she's told no. She still sits around and talks to no one. We live 14 months with just little things happening all around 2 a.m. Her bedroom door slams shut and he hears stomping down the stairs. The laundry room doors open and slam shut. The water in the bathtub turns on by itself. But lately, things have become more aggressive and frequent. I decided to decorate her room. I put new curtains up, her new blankets on her bed, and hung clothes in the closet. I walked downstairs, leaving all the lights on, but shutting the closet doors. I was downstairs maybe five minutes. As I entered the hallway, I noticed her door closed, nothing new. But I opened it, and there was this rush of cold air. Again, nothing new. The light was off, and you could feel someone in the room. 
It was an angry sort of feeling, like someone was glaring at me. I ignored it and turned the light on. The curtains I'd just hung had been ripped off the rod and lay in the middle of her room. Her new blankets and sheets were off her bed, and her closet doors again wide open. My daughter refuses to sleep in her room now, saying the man scares her, that he yells at her. I've placed crosses and went as far as to have my house blessed, and nothing. In the last two months, I've been woken up to someone screaming in my ear. The sound of my front door opening and slamming shut, and my bathroom shower turning on, all in the 2 a.m. hour, and on nights my daughter's at grandma's house. There are some stories that my family and friends have passed on, and I think you might find them quite interesting. I'm a great fan of your website. I have some stories that I've heard from family. Here's one that my grandpa encountered. His father had recently died in 1993, and the night of his funeral, he was awoke by something. He didn't know what it was, he was just awoken by whatever it was. He looked over, and his father was standing there, saying, I'm okay, please do not worry. My grandpa got a drink of water, and his father left. He went right through the door. Then, I have one from family friends. This was when friends Steve and Rita had moved into a new house. They had seen several apparitions that they have not really explained, but really just blobs. Then, here comes the scary part. Here are two stories that I've also inquired from the same person. Rita and her husband and two friends were in the family room in the middle of the day, talking, and all four of them saw a shadow jump from the balcony slide across the family room and go under the couch. Steps have also creaked and toilets have flushed for no apparent reason. This was also a new house with no history of violence in the property. Now for the second story. A couple of nights later, Rita was sleeping and woke up to feeling like someone was sitting on top of her trying to choke her. Steve woke up to Rita's screams and flipped the lights on. She told him there was a man with a plaid shirt in the room trying to choke her. No one was in the room. She got up out of bed and went to the dresser, looked in the mirror, and he was behind her. A lumberjack looking man in a plaid shirt standing right behind her. This also might sound kind of weird, but my mother Bernadette lived in a new neighborhood when she was little. Outside of the development was a field with a very small house, almost a shed. Whenever my mom took a walk with her grandma, a little girl would come running out of the house and shed and talk with them. She was always dressed old fashioned with a dress on. She resembled a little girl like Shirley Temple. She said her name was Judy. My mom saw her several times. Her grandma also did too. Years later when she mentioned Judy to her mother, her mother said that nobody had ever lived in that house. It was used for storage, a shed, and said my mother was making it up and that it was a story. We have never figured out if it was a ghost or not. My great grandmother remembered her too. As a side note, I've passed this particular field many times and have seen the shed, but have not had any strange things happen to me when passing the area. Like my grandmother has said, no one has ever lived in that shed, so I don't know. My name is Rodney, and I would like to share a story with you that happened to me and a friend of mine. First, I'll give you some background. It's the early 70s in Inan, Ohio. My friend Mike and I were very close because both of our parents had gotten divorced around the same time we were in our early teens. We shared similar interest in magic and trickery in the occult. 
we use to save our money and either buy magic tricks from magazines or make magic tricks from plants that we would buy for our act. We appeared on a local after school show for kids a couple of times and in doing so we got to meet a local famous person named Dr. Creep. He had a Saturday night show where he would host and show scary movies and he also did magic. Dr. Creep was really knowledgeable and had a lot of contacts. He told us of a local magic shop in Dayton and gave us directions. We couldn't drive at the time but I would beg my older sisters to take us there. Discovering that magic store opened us up to a whole vast world of new tricks and illusions. The shop also sold paraphernalia for smoking and it had a lot of what we now refer to as goth type of clothing and jewelry. Well, as we were getting a bit older, the movie The Exorcist came out and we thought that what a neat idea it was to put some drama and stage production into the act to make it more of a show. We both attended a vocational school, so there were a lot of talented people there, and we found a couple of girls that liked to dance. We added dancing demon girls to the beginning of the show using black lights, dark jumpsuits to conceal the girls under the sheets. The music was Mike's Oldfield's Hearst Trench. I think that was the title. The stage was very barren when the show started, only a small table with dimly lit candle and the dancing girls could be seen. The dancing girls dance ended with the meeting in front of the table and big flash exploded and as the lights slowly illuminated they would reveal a transformation in the whole look of the stage. There was now a 10 by 12 painted dragon silk tapestry hanging beyond the table and two silk banners of Belizebuth artistically lit with airy lighting and I would be standing where the dancing girls had disappeared in my cape. Most of our tricks and illusions were dark in nature. My friend Mike moved to Houston a year before we graduated high school. He got a job at the Galleria Mall in the fun shop. After I graduated, I moved to Houston and stayed with Mike at his mother's house. I also got a job at the fun shop. Eventually, we pretty much ran the place and again, we found a lot of new outlets for magic and the occult. Eventually, we moved into an apartment together as roommates. Our interest in the occult grew, but only out of curiosity and it gave us an air of mystery to other people. As we made more friends and our reputations as being a little different spread, we decided to really mess with people. Mike's bedroom had a huge closet and being young, he didn't have a lot to put in there. We decided to dress it up and make it look like a devil worship after with the banners we had and with the skull shaped candles and the magic tricks. Our plans were when our friends would come over, we would show them that and they would freak out. The very night we did this at about 12, I awoke to a pounding on a wall between Mike's room and my room. I sat up and yelled, what are you doing over there? The pounding continued unrelentingly. I got out of bed and went over to the wall and yelled, knock it off, I'm trying to sleep. The knocking got louder and didn't show any signs of stopping, so I went over to Mike's bedroom door and knocked and said, Mike, stop it. The pounding continued, so I opened the door to see Mike sitting up in his bed, looking at the closet. My eyes went across the room towards the closet, and as my vision passed his dresser, I saw the door slowly closing. I asked Mike what he was doing banging on my wall. He said it wasn't coming from the wall between our rooms, it was coming from the closet. I continued looking onto the closet. As I saw the door, it was breathing and jostling as if someone was trying to get out. Then it stopped suddenly. We were scared witless. We gathered up enough courage to both walk over and we pulled open the door with ease. The closet was freezing 
he looked around and saw no one or anything. The apartment we lived in was brand new. No one lived next door. Our neighbor downstairs was gone for the weekend. We asked the people behind us the next day why they were banging on the walls, and they said that they had it and that they didn't hear anything the night before. We immediately started ripping all the decorations down. I'm still very much fascinated with the paranormal, but I will not invite it in. I have another story I will share with you later, but as for now, I hope you enjoyed what I gave you. My parents own a lake house in northern Indiana, and we used to have a neighbor named Mr. Campbell. Sadly, Mr. Campbell was quite old and depressed, and one day, he left a note and enough food and water to last his dogs at least a week. He said his body could be found in the lake. I couldn't remember if it was ever found, though. This story has many parts, all leading to the same conclusion. Mr. Campbell's ghost haunts this property, but he seems to be quite calm and docile. The first instance, well, a rich man, Richard, bought his property, tore the home down, and built a $2.5 million house. Richard was extremely nice and was always coming over for dinner. One day, he told us that he thought his house was haunted. He had an entertainment system installed that requires him to climb a ladder to fully turn it on or off. For that reason, he always left it on and left the ladder in the garage. One day he had guests over and was going to put on the Indy 500, but the system was powered down. He said he watched TV the night before and no one had been in the house. At first he just assumed it was a power outage or something. He got the ladder and turned on the system. However, all of the settings were messed up. The volume was turned down very low, and the radio was on and set to a 50s station. The TV was off because of the radio. When he turned on the TV, it was tuned static rather than the Discovery Channel Richard had been watching the night before. He said he played it off as an accident to his guests, that it kind of spooked him. Later, after this happened, again Richard assumed Mr. Campbell wanted to listen to music, but didn't want to disturb anyone, because no one had heard the music. Richard also had a roommate named James. The thought is that they were lovers, but no one really asked. Richard would travel to Chicago a lot, and James would be home alone. One night, my sister and I were watching TV in our room and saw lights shining outside and heard men talking. We looked out our window and saw about three police cars and about six policemen walking all over the house, looking at windows and knocking on the door. We went outside with our dad to see what was going on and the police asked if we had heard or seen anything suspicious. We said no. Why? They told us someone had called 911 from the house, but only breathed into the phone for a couple minutes and then hung up. We told the police that Richard was gone, and usually when he was gone, James would visit his mother down the street. My dad called James' cell, and he was at his mom's for a dinner and a movie. He said he was planning on leaving soon anyways, and came to talk to the police. James let him in, and they searched the whole house, but no one was there. However, in the kitchen, a burner was left on high. James said he made pasta to bring to his mom's and must have forgotten to turn off the burner. After the police left, James said he sometimes got a strange feeling in the house, like he wasn't alone when he knew he was, but that he never got scared. It was more like being watched over than stopped. My sister and her friend were sitting on our screened in porch one Friday night after we got to the lake house late. They saw a man walk from the pier to Richard's house, and my sister called out 
Hi, Richard or James, whoever it is. But the figure didn't stop or reply. He just walked up to the house and disappeared. The girl said a light never came on and he never heard a door open. The next day, Richard was doing yard work and my sister mentioned the night before and jokingly accused him of ignoring her. He told her he had not been home last night and that he had just gotten back from Chicago early that morning. He also said that James was in North Carolina for the week for his sister's wedding. My sister and her friends were confused because they had both seen the man and they were worried they had seen a robber. Richard asked if the outdoor lights turned on and they said no. Why? He said he has motion detector lights so if there was a person by the house, the floodlight should have come on and his alarm didn't register entry last night. The next incident, Richard had to move to Chicago. It had gotten to be too much for him to constantly be driving back and forth. So he bought a flat in Chicago and put the house up for sale. James left too. The new owners were really quite annoying and full of themselves. So no one ever told him about the possible haunting or the house's past. One day Janet came over and asked us if the house had a story. I asked why. She said she had been in the shower when she saw an old man staring at her. She screamed and he just disappeared. We told her about Mr. Campbell and everything and she sort of freaked out. They tried to sell the house but couldn't. She still says the old man watches her every now and then. The housekeeper says she has never seen the old man while she was showering, but that she thought she saw him one day while she was cleaning. He was in the entertainment room, listening to music. She also said that the five dogs will stare at all the same spot for several minutes on end, tails wagging, as if they were being talked to. We still talk to Richard and he has told us many stories about the house, rearranged pantries, the entertainment system being changed multiple times, and other various things. We think Mr. Campbell haunts the home because he can't move on. My mom says my experience must have been Mr. Campbell trying to get away from Janet for a while. That incident was before the shower, but Janet was already in the home with her husband. We still hear the beeping every once in a while, and we all just say, Hi, Mr. Campbell, you can visit as long as you like. The dog stopped staring and following him after about the tenth time. They'll look up just after the beeping and just before we hear him leave. I'm a bit of a baby, so I still get creeped out when I'm alone at night, even though I know he has never done any harm. My parents were the last people I think would believe it, but with so many incidents, we think he is there living out his days watching others. Maybe he regretted saying goodbye prematurely, and because of this, this is what keeps him from going to the other side. I was visiting my mother and some friends in Florida, and stayed with my mother while vacationing to cook costs of course. She works nights at the local hospital, so I'm there alone from 7 p.m. until 7 a.m. when she works. It was a Friday evening, and my mom had just left for work. I was hungry, so I went out to grab a bite to eat. I got back to the house around 8 and called my friend, who was supposed to come over to keep me company, but he was running a little late. So... I decided to keep myself entertained as I waited. I was in my room listening to music and stuffing my face when I heard what sounded like church bells. Now, these bells would have had to be kind of loud because I listened to my music on blast. I turned down my radio to hear the sound more clearly, all the while thinking to myself, there are no churches in the area that I know of which made this all the more strange. As I listened, I heard the sound fade off into the distance 
as if traveling away. I sat for a couple of minutes and turned my music back up and continued eating. About 15 minutes later, I heard something like someone trying to get in through the back door. My mom's house is a little older. I'd say about 40 to 50 years old. For someone to pry open the back door would not be a difficult task. So naturally, I ran to the back door to see what was going on. Once there, I saw that no one was there, but the glass in the door near the knob was fogged up like cold water would do in a glass cup. Thinking that was a little strange, I grabbed the handle to open the door, and I looked to scream bloody murder. The handle on the door was sub-zero cold, and it really caught me by surprise, just from how incredibly cold it was. I stepped out into the porch, turned on the light, looked around a bit for anything suspicious, and when I saw nothing, I reluctantly went back inside. Uncerned, I kept my music to a minimum, just in case anything else happened, as it surely it did. About an hour later, I got a call from my friend. Now this is strange. He lives about five minutes from my house driving and about 20 minutes walking. Apparently, he came over to the house and rang the doorbell, heard my music playing, and figured that when I didn't answer, I was in the bathroom or something. He called my phone, but it kept getting cut off after the first ring. So he decided to go back home and come back since it's not far at all. He claims that as he was backing out of my driveway, he saw the front door open. He rolled down the window to see if it was me. He said as soon as he got the window all the way down, the front door violently slammed shut so hard that my friend thought for sure that the front window should have shattered. I heard none of this. Around the time that he came over was coincidentally the same time. I heard the strange bells, so I was a little spooked and told him to come over, so he said give him about 15 minutes and he would be over. Well, a lot can happen in 15 minutes. I got off the phone with him and went to the bathroom to freshen up a bit. I washed my hands and face and dried them. I was heading back to my room when I heard a faint sound in the living room. I was a little apprehensive to see what was making the sound and started thinking that perhaps I wasn't alone in my mother's house. From my bathroom to the living room, there is a long hallway. As I walked the hallway, I sensed a presence and it felt like a large presence, however that feels. Upon entering the living room, I looked up and saw what looked like a clergyman I could see him clear as anything. My reaction wasn't what one would expect. Looking back on the incident, it seems unusual to me as well. I began to cry, almost uncontrollably, and I still have no reason as to why. That's when I heard a knock at my door. My friend had arrived, and as I stood there, I saw the apparition seem to fade to nothing as he continued to knock and rang the doorbell. I opened the door to my friend, who seemed a little shaken himself. He asked me why I'd been crying and unsure on what to tell him. I simply said that I saw something sad on TV. He asked if anyone else was in the house because he saw someone leave out the back door. I told him it was my neighbor. I've had many things happen to me, Dreams and visions have been a part of my life for as far back as I can remember, but none of them compared to this incident. Weird, huh? I was only about three years old when I first started seeing things in my old house. It started with the noises in the attic. I would hear a rocking chair rocking in the attic directly above my bed. However, 
that portion of the attic had nothing in it at all. The floor wouldn't even have supported the weight. My old house was a 1950s home. The basement still had an old coal room. However, the coal chute was sealed shut to prevent breaking in. The coal room was directly below my bedroom, and it was the only part of the house no one ever went into. I can only ever recall even seeing the door open once. It was an empty, depressing kind of room. In addition to the noises above, I would sometimes hear footsteps in that old room below me, or footsteps on the basement stairs. The first time I ever saw anything was, as I said, when I was around three years old. I woke up from my sleep in the middle of the night to see a young girl standing by my bed. She had brown hair and green eyes and wore a 19th century style green nightgown. She looked to be about eight years old. She frightened me at first, but I didn't get malicious feelings from her. And gradually, I accepted her. She appeared to me often throughout my childhood, and even now, I see her occasionally. The other ghost I saw was much scarier. I wasn't the first one to see him. My younger brother was. He was a tall man who held a knife in one hand and wore black. My brother began seeing him when he was about five years old. The man would appear in his closet, began to walk towards him, and then my brother in his fear would scream, and the man would disappear when my parents came running. I have never told anyone about my experiences with ghosts, for I was afraid I would be called crazy. My brother told us all about what he saw. He saw the man a total of four times, once in each of our bedrooms and twice in mine. I saw the man twice, but I didn't begin seeing him until I was much older, around nine years old. I always got a fairly bad feeling from the man, and Victoria, the name I gave the little girl, would always disappear before he appeared. I got the sense that she was scared of him for some reason. In addition to this, when my great grandma passed away, I inherited her jewelry box. The first night I had it, I'd left it sitting open on my bedroom floor. When I went to bed, I was around six years old. I was lying awake in bed when suddenly, the movie in my VCR fell out of the VCR and onto the floor. A few minutes later, my TV turned on. There was no one else in the room at the time. As I got up to turn it off, it turned itself off. A few nights later, I'd once again been playing with the jewelry in the jewelry box. I awoke to find my basketball bouncing itself repeatedly against my dresser sideways. There was no one else in my room at the time, and it kept it up for over a minute. After that, I became frightened and stowed the box away in the back of my closet. To this day, I will not open it, even though I'm now 16. The scariest thing of all happened when I was 11. I awoke in the middle of the night, unable to move the lower half of my legs. Terrified, I sat up to see a strange black shadow sitting on my feet. It was blurry. That may have been partly because my glasses were sitting on my bedside table. At first I thought it was my black cat, but quickly realized that it was much too big. It was transparent. It was about half the size of a small child. But the thing itself isn't what scared me. It's the feeling that I got from it. I felt terrified, like I've never felt before in my life, as if the strange shadow was pure evil. I struggled to move my legs, and then ran into my parents' room and woke them up. It's the only time I've ever told them of my paranormal happenings. My dad came into my room and turned my light on, 
But of course, the thing was gone. He insisted I was dreaming and tried to get me to go back to sleep, but I slept on the floor for a week straight after that. I've since moved into a new house. My grandma died here, and we moved in afterwards. Because she left it and everything else of hers to us, I don't have as many experiences here. But there is one that really stands out in my mind. I awoke in the middle of the night, and I could feel someone laying against my back. Their knees curled under mine, and their arm around me. I freaked out and literally jumped onto my floorboard and flicked my light on, but nothing was there. My mom was woke up from the commotion, and I told her about it. She told me it was my grandma, who was keeping me safe as I slept. And then a few days later, we drove to the cemetery, where my grandma is buried. We took my grandma's dog with us. Once we got to my grandma's grave, the dog went crazy. She began to bark and whine, and paw the windows frantically. We thought it must have been a squirrel or something, but there were no animals in sight, not even a bird. My mom thinks that the dog saw something we couldn't, and I have to say I agree. I've had many experiences, and these are just the ones I was reminded of by reading other stories on your website. I wrote a lot. I tried to narrow it down a bit. I've tried seances and things with my very good friend, who has similar experiences to mine, and we've been successful at this. It really shocks me sometimes, because we'll both get an image in our head, or see something, and we can finish each other's sentences. That's how precisely we see things. I definitely believe in the paranormal, and I hope to show other people the truth. I lived in this area for over 30 years. Robinson Woods is the home of the Chief Chichi Pinque, as it is spelled on the sign, in the site of his burial marker. He was the last chief of the Potawatomi Indians, and he was related to the Robinson family. He died in 1953. There have been numerous ghost hunting expeditions conducted here with reports of drums and shadowy forms of an Indian in pictures in the woods surrounding the memorial marker. These woods are connected to Catherine Woods, west of East River Road, south of the Kennedy Expressway. There's a trail that leads from behind the Chief's memorial marker, going to a small branch of the Dace Plains River. It is along this river that John Wayne Gacy buried several of his victims. Additionally, there have been numerous bodies found here over the years. In the late 1950s, two brothers went missing and were killed, and their bodies were discovered here. The area of these woods, more towards the Catherine Woods side, just south of the expressway, is where the American Airlines flight went down killing all on board. On the east side of the East River Road, there used to be a horseback riding stable called Happy Day Stables, which was the site of many illicit doings. John Wayne Gacy was known to be friends with one of the stable hands that worked there in the 50s and 60s, and he was a frequent visitor there. This stable hand is the one who was responsible for killing the two brothers in the late 1950s and it's local legend that Gacy participated in the murders. Of course, both Gacy and the other man died without ever revealing the truth of this. These woods have been the site of more phenomena than can be counted. Generations of kids have gone there to dare each other to face their fears. I personally experienced the drums in the woods, the face of an Indian behind the marker, felt overwhelming fear, anger and sadness, and evil along the river behind the trail, and horrifying fear around the airplane crash site. That's my story, and many others, in the rumors surrounding this area.
when I was around seven or eight years old, I lived in Norwalk, California with my mom and my soon to be stepfather in a two bedroom apartment. There are two things I remember most about living in that apartment. One was the beautiful princess Kenobi bed I slept in, and the other was the floating woman's head I would see coming into my bedroom from the hallway. I have and will never forget that image. It looked like an older woman with long, coarse gray messed up hair with some kind of hat. The first thing I think of when I remember her face was she looked like a witch, pointy nose, moles on her face. From the moment I started seeing her float in, she just stared directly at me, went around the poles of my bed, and coming right at me. I would always put the covers over my head knowing she was right on top of me and shut my eyes hard and pull my fingers in my ears until I felt ready to look again. I've always believed and been interested in paranormal and ghost stories. After my grandmother died, I felt her hand on my shoulder in my then boyfriend's house. I turned around, nobody was there, but for some reason I knew it was her and I didn't feel scared. I felt she was letting me know she's okay and with me. Lately, my sister and I have been looking at paranormal sites and researching videos and pictures of ghosts, paranormal stories. Your site is my favorite right now. A few years back, I was at the White Horse Bar in Maloa and was doing a gig. When I was done, I left the back room and walked through the kitchen area, passed by a guy in a white outfit who was preparing food, or so I thought. I put my stuff out of my vehicle, came back in, and was going to get a bite to eat. I asked for a menu, and a barmaid gave me one. I ordered food and the barmaid headed back to make me my food. After a while, she came back with my food. Her and I talked, and we started dating shortly after that. Well, a week or so later, I met the whole crew, three girls, and the owner. I asked where the chef was, and the owner told me they're right here. I laughed and said, what about the guy? They all gave me a funny look, and said there is no guy. I had explained the guy I had seen a week back that appeared to be a cook dressed in white clothing that's similar to a chef and was facing the kitchen stove that I walked by. They all gave me a weird look and from there the owner talked about seeing shadows going across the back room area late at night and no one was there. He told me the owner prior said a ghostly head was said to appear down from above the bar one time in the past. There was a time that I had to change the light bulb and it had to be replaced. The old one was loose and burned out. I tightened the new one in place and tightened down the fixture. And we were sitting down my girl at the time. And the owner and another of the bar ladies and I joked. The ghost will probably be here to flicker the lights, and the light will burn out. The crazy thing is, a couple seconds after that, the light flickered and went out. The owner got another light bulb, and I took the fixture and closure off to find the bulb loose, but still good. One of the bard's maids researched the property and told us the place a long time ago, back in the past, was a feed store and that a guy in his teens got crushed to death from fallen feed sacks. I was born in Singapore in 1951 to British and Australian parents. We lived in various cities in Malaysia during the 1950s, 60s and 70s. In 1957, we arrived in Kuala Lumpur where we stayed until mid-1975. We moved into a company-owned house at Freeman Road, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. 
the history of the house is as follows. It and the house next door, number 17, were built just before World War II by the late Dato Gunlay Take, a then well-known architect who became an early Malaysian High Commissioner to either Australia or Canada. He built them for his daughters. During World War II, the two houses, along with the large semi-detached house immediately behind, on what was then known as Gulf View Road, were taken over by the Japanese Army secret police and known as the Kenta Pai, equivalent of the Nazi Gestapo. The two houses behind were used as Kampai Thai offices, and the three in jail in Freeman became senior military officers' brothels. The women in the brothels were both Asian and European, the latter being drawn from a pool of captured civilians and military nurses. Comfort women was the term used by the Japanese. Male military POWs were used as gardeners and cooks, etc. These staff, if they fell from favor, were executed, and some were obviously buried in the ground surrounding the houses. As some years later, we did find scattered human remains when excavating the gardens for our new orchid beds. On the advice of our doctor, who identified them as human in origin, we quietly reburied the remains. He said that if word got out as to what we had found, we would never get any Malay or Chinese domestic staff to work for us. After the war, the houses were returned to their owners who, knowing what the Japanese had used them for, promptly put them up for sale. They were all bought by large companies at bargain prices who used them to house senior expatriate staff. Gunlay Take was no different and in 1947, sold his two houses to the company my father worked for. The two company houses were three bedroom houses of two stories, double brick construction. There was also a long narrow room forming a roof over the carport at the front door. This room was to play a significant role in what we were to experience over the following 10 years. In our house, this room was turned into a large walk-in linen press and storage area. To enter it, one would take one step down. When we moved into the house in early 1957, the first thing my mother noticed was that this room was extremely cold, as if it was air-conditioned. In tropical Malaysia, a non-air-conditioned room this cold is not even practical. Our dogs would never go into this room, and when passing the entrance to that room, always hurried past with tails between their legs. Nobody would really stay in that room for very long. It had a very uncomfortable atmosphere. However, sometimes after running around and playing and getting very hot, I would go and sit on the step at the entrance to the room to cool off. I was five years old and knew nothing about ghosts at this time. The main bedroom on the extreme right hand side of the upstairs part of the house, as one faced out towards the main road, had its own full bathroom and the other two, also upstairs, shared a bathroom via separate doors leading from the bedrooms to the bathroom. These latter two were adjoining each other. One was on the extreme left hand side of the house, and the other at the back with the windows looking out over the back lawn. This eventually became my room. All the doors were heavy solid with solid brass latches. Windows were hinged teak framed and had a bamboo awning type blind that rolled down over the window to give shade from the sun. Downstairs was a separate formal dining room, lounge room, kitchen, toilet, and downstairs storage room, as well as a storage area under the staircase. The lounge room opened up onto a rear veranda area. Remember, the temperature was over 85 degrees Fahrenheit plus all year round. As per usual, European expatriate practices of the times in India Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong expats had domestic servants to look after the household chores. 
all expat houses built prior to the early 1960s had separate servants' quarters on the property. This house had a three-owned building with shared kitchen and bathroom, and it had a car garage building sited at the rear of the property, about 20 meters from the main house. About three months after we moved in, funny things started to happen. The first incident was the appearance of a white cat. Interestingly enough, it always followed the last person who went into my parents' bedroom at night, the bedroom at the right-hand side of the house. This cat made no sound, but appeared from nowhere and scuttled into the room as the door was opened. This bedroom was air-conditioned. A thorough search of the room failed to find the cat, but next night, there it was, entering again. At the time, we had no cats. This cat was seen every night until my parents moved to the middle bedroom, which was nearer to the room that my younger sister and I shared. Their old bedroom was then turned into a guest room. Over the years, visiting guests who stayed overnight with us also saw this cat. One evening, about dusk, my mother, looking through the lounge window, witnessed a woman with long red hair, wearing a sort of white nightgown standing near the front gate. She thought that this was unusual and walked out the front door to go talk to the woman. As she walked across the lawn, the woman walked away and went behind the hedge, which formed our front fence. When my mother got to the gate, she looked in the direction that the woman had walked and saw nothing. Three nights later, my father saw the same woman walk into the entrance of the servants' quarters. He followed her, but found no sign of her when he entered the building. She was never actually seen in our house, only on the front and back lawn and in the servants' quarters, but she was regularly seen in the house next door, number 13, and also in one of the houses behind. The occupants of both these latter houses often saw her sitting on the edge of the bed brushing her hair, but there was never a reflection in the mirror. When spoken to, she would turn her head, smile, and slowly fade from view. We also saw an emaciated man in a military uniform. He was seen in her house, both upstairs and downstairs, as well as outside. One evening, my mother saw what appeared to be a body lying under a shroud in the front garden. About eight years later, I also saw this figure, for lack of a better word, on the back lawn at first light one morning, and again at about 3 a.m. on another morning. From time to time, we would also see an old Chinese woman in the lounge room. She was wearing a white starched linen top with black pajama pants, cut in a traditional Chinese style. This used to be the standard Chinese domestic staff uniform in the immediate pre- and post-World War II era. We referred to them as black and whites. By the 1960s, the next generation of Chinese female domestic staff had abandoned this tradition for more colorful pajama suit type clothing. One would look up from reading a paper or a book and see this old woman standing in front of you smiling. She would then fade quickly from view. She was only seen in the lounge, in broad daylight, but never when there were a lot of people around. One evening when in my mid-teens, I arrived home from visiting a friend. As I walked down the drive, I noticed that the lounge room was lit up, and a man with shiny, neatly combed black hair and wearing a khaki uniform was sitting in a chair with his back to the window and reading what appeared to be a newspaper. I got the impression that he was Asian and thought he was a friend of my father come to visit. Later, I recollected that the furniture in the room was different to what we had in there. When I entered, I found the whole house, including the lounge, to be in darkness, the rest of the family having gone out and the servants retired for the night. Thinking back, I think this man was probably a Japanese military officer. I only experienced this once, and my parents never did.
Occasionally, we would also hear a woman's voice calling out in terror. We couldn't figure out what she was saying, because she was saying it in Japanese. It was then that my parents realized that what we had seen and experienced were most likely the spirits of those who suffered there. After finding this out, we began to suspect that the cold room I described earlier in this narrative may have been used as a place for the ill treatment and execution of prisoners. My father learned that after the war, health authorities advised that the original septic tank was too close to the house and a new one had to be installed. While digging the new pit, workers had dug up human remains. We left the house in 1967 to move to a new house nearby. The next occupant, also working for the same company, also experienced funny things, but didn't actually see anything strange. This family's dog on several occasions also dug up human bones from the gardens. In the interest of preserving the local peace, they also quietly reburied the remains and said nothing. I didn't find out about what they experienced until many years after they had left Malaysia and returned to England. The company sold the houses in the mid-1970s after my family had left Malaysia. The houses at 15 and 17 were torn down, and a large mansion was built across the boundaries of both properties. However, this was demolished after a few years, and since then, the two blocks have remained vacant. In 2008, they are still vacant. This is a prime land in an inner suburban area, but the land is still vacant. The house at number 13 is still standing, but is abandoned and half the roof is collapsed. We wonder just what was found when the site was excavated for the new building. Also, the reason why the new mansion was also demolished and the blocks left vacant, maybe the souls of those poor victims still occupy the site and are not at rest and reappeared in the new building. I was shocked to see that in Lovejoy, Georgia, there were apparitions. I too had an experience, but didn't think much about it, especially after everybody looked at us. My mother-in-law also saw it, as if we were crazy. We used to live in a new apartment complex. One day, I was sitting on the counter eating lunch, and my mother-in-law was in the living room. As she came towards me to get to the kitchen, we both saw a man going towards the room at the end of the hall. Our first instinct was that one had broken into the apartment. We did get a chill, but at the same time, we didn't seem it was a big deal. We just figured it was the fact that we had gotten scared. I grabbed the phone, and we walked towards the hallway. When we looked, we saw nobody. We thought they had gone into the bathroom or the laundry room. When we saw nobody, we looked in the closet of the room, but again, didn't see anybody. After we came to our senses, we realized that nobody could have entered, because we would have heard the door, and the alarm would have went off anyway. Two guys that slept in that room told us afterwards that they would have trouble sleeping for a long time. On occasion, they would hear the water running, but they thought it was the other one. After sharing these experiences, we have come to the conclusion that this was in fact paranormal. We called the leasing office and asked them if anything had happened in that apartment, or if they knew of anything of this nature in that area. They obviously thought we were crazy, and replied that they didn't know anything. Now that I have found this, I feel relieved that now thanks to this, my family believes us. I'm of course referring to your site. Thank you for letting me share my story. There's a lot of things in my life I've seen over the years, but nothing has disturbed me quite like this. It was the weekend of break for myself and my mom, and we decided to go up to Oklahoma City to see my cousins. Everything was great. 
I got to see some relatives, and nothing seemed quite out of the normal. That is as far as normal went that night. While taking the four-hour drive back, I noticed that the moon was very huge and blood red. Of course, I didn't know about the eclipse that day, so it was cool to watch as we drove to Ferris, which is a tiny town between Lane and Antlers. I remember that my mother pulled into the Veterans Bridge in Aloka when a couple miles down the road, I happened to look up and an elderly couple was standing on the side of the road, staring across as if watching something. It reminded me of the Grant Wood painting of the farmer. I remember looking at a clock a moment before and saw it was midnight. The moon was still out and still red. What makes it even worse for myself is that my mother also caught a glimpse of them. I turned around shocked, and I felt like if I turned around, they would be flying behind us screaming. I've passed by several times since then, and every time, I get a shiver up my spine, remembering what happened that night. I still get teased a bit about it, even to this day even though my mom was pretty spooked out herself. My dog and I have been traveling the mountains of upstate New York and Pennsylvania for 17 years. So when he left me last February 2007, I brought him to his favorite spot. There was still snow on the ground, and tracking through the woods at this time was very difficult. I tried to break ground with the pick that I carried, but the ground would not permit me. I found a nice spot and laid him under some brush beneath some trees. I told Dylan I would be back. Three weeks passed before I was able to get back to him. When I was driving up the dirt road, all I could think about was how I was going to find him. Being where I'd laid him down, I thought I'd find him in pieces was getting sick to my stomach. He was my boy, and this had to be done. When I reached him, it was just like I had laid him down. Thought this was weird. He wasn't even stiff. It was like he was waiting for me to come back. It was nice being with him, even though he had passed. The rest of the afternoon off and on, I dug his grave, going very deep so the wild animals couldn't dig him up. I took off my coat and wrapped it around him and laid him in the grave. Dusk was setting in, and all of a sudden, I heard children moving all around me, laughing and giggling. I knew this wasn't natural for children to be where we were, for the closest house was at least 10 miles away. I still dismissed this in my mind, as the circle we were using around me kept getting smaller. I would stop every now and then and listen, but I would hear no breaking branches, which should have been happening. Thank God I already had a cross I made, for night was now upon me. When I was tracking up the mountain towards my car, the spirits were in a horseshoe behind me. Every now and then, I would turn around to keep them behind me, but this still didn't stop the giggling never heard this type of laughter before. When I made the clearing where my car was, the noise finally stopped. I popped the trunk open to put the pick and the shovel in. Then, I leaned over the hood of my car. There stood five solid white entities at the edge of the woods. They were not children. For the past 11 months, I've been visiting his graves to make sure his resting place is kept up and comfortable. Once, I saw a dark figure that drifted across the opening. Another time, this figure was floating seven yards from me. I even heard bullfrogs croaking. I'm an educated man. I'm not crazy. Can't talk to anyone about this without people thinking I'm weird or mentally disturbed. Either way. This was a tale that I thought you'd enjoy. It's a hundred percent real. I swear my life on it. I know I may only have my word, but it's the best I can do. 
I've worked at St. Francis Hospital in Peoria, Illinois for over 20 years. I've seen some of the nun ghosts on the seventh floor where the laboratory was when I worked there. The morgue was also on that floor. I was working third shift one night. At times, we took the back elevator, the service elevator, to the floors to draw labs when needed. As I was walking down the hall to the elevator, I saw a nun getting onto the elevator. I yelled out to her, Please hold the elevator, sister. The door started closing. Thinking she did not hear me, I hit the down button as it closed. The door opened, but there was no one on the elevator. There was nowhere else she could have gone, for it was a dead-end hallway. To take the stairs, she would have had to walk past me. This was a strange night, and it took place many years ago. Another moment, it was fairly late, and I was again on my way to the elevator. This time, I made it inside alone, and as the elevator was closing, I saw a man in a white lab coat standing all the way at the end of the hallway. At the time, the hallway was pretty dark, but there was just enough light that you could see down it. I knew for a fact that there was absolutely no one else on the floor at the time. The image of the man in the lab coat and also the nun will always be engraved in my mind. This hospital has always had a reputation for having had ghostly visitations from previous employees who used to work there. Some of my co-workers have experienced this as well. When I was describing what I had seen to a current co-worker, she was a bit startled from the revelation. That's because one night, she had taken the elevator to the morgue, and when she got down to it, she could have sworn that she saw a figure or dark shadow in a praying position, kneeled over. She said the figure was an outline of a person, no distinct features, almost cloud-like, but could definitely tell it was made to be some sort of person. My theory is that the nun appeared once again to help with the newly deceased transition to the other side. I'd also like to think that the man in the lab coat was a former employee of this hospital. Either way, there's quite a bit of haunted history here and I'm not sure how to deal with it at times. Since I'm fairly used to creepy happenings, it no longer frightens me like it used to, but there's always a bit of excitement in telling these tales to those who haven't heard them before. I believe there is a portal to the other side that humans have access to, and eventually, we'll transport ourselves to this world. As for now, we're just getting a glimpse of the afterlife. This is an authentic story, and it happened to me. I've already posted this on allaboutghosts.com, but I've not heard anything about this place other than my story. Maybe someone out there has had a similar experience, or even paranormal things happen at this place. What made me want to add my story here is when I read the story about Tacoma, Point Defiance Park, Five Mile Drive. This story grabbed me and was almost disturbing to me because it is so closely related to mine about a little girl. However, this was no ordinary looking girl. She was looking real, of course, except she had no eyes and was smiling and then all of a sudden she disappeared. I was searching here to see if there was anything from my spot at Eagle Falls. When I went to this favorite swimming hole of mine on the Sokoa River, this is a very beautiful swimming hole, almost lagoon-like, where the river flows with falls into a pool of deep colorful water and under the water on the side of the walls there are huge giant flat rocks that drop off down where you cannot see the bottom. 
The rocks above have been carved into the star-like settings that have become flat, and then go down into where the river wall is. Across the river, which is only about 50 feet or so, there are rocks where people can climb to. There is a rope swing tied to a tree on the side also. It's a popular spot for people to swim in the summer. I really like this place for swimming and floating on my raft of flippers, so I can move faster to swim up the currents to the falls better and ride the river down. This brings me to my story. I was headed towards the place where I was going to do just that and noticed there were two people to the right of me, a man and a woman, one sitting next to the rope swing and the other climbing up the rocks. And to the left of me, there was this little girl, about six or seven years old, and standing about three feet away from me, on the edge of the rock by the water with her head turned slightly, and just smiling at me. I am swimming still almost to passing her, and notice she's still smiling, so I smiled. I waved to her and said hi. She still smiles at me, but says nothing back. I looked at her again, this time into her eyes. We locked eyes for a second, and that is when I noticed her eyes were very dark, to the point where I couldn't see her eye color. They only looked like black holes, almost hollow-like. Everything about this girl seemed normal, except for her eyes. She had a cute little swimsuit that was lime green, with little white flowers on it, and a little ruffle around the waist. She was tan, and had golden blonde shiny hair that came down past her shoulders, and also had bare feet. She was alone. There was nobody above her or next to her. I was thinking that maybe she was standing there watching her mother swing from the rope swing or something, but as I swam a little bit past her, I suddenly turned to look back because I feared her being too close to the edge and wanted to let her to know to step back. But as I turned to do this, she was gone. Now, I was wondering how she could climb the rocks that quickly and how she could be completely out of sight when I only turned for a second, then looked back. Surely I would have noticed her walking away, at least if she did climb the rocks, or even if she had fallen in, I would have heard the sound of water splashing. I was only a few feet away from where she was standing, and I quickly went to the area where I saw her, and nothing. I looked above and further back where some people were sitting by some trees and looked down along the banks where other people were sitting and with kids and no one looked like her or had blonde golden hair or the same bathing suit on. At this point of feeling very confused, I felt a cold chill come over me and my hairs and my arms were standing up. I felt a sadness and chilling feeling and had a vision of the same girl falling into the water and drowning. I even felt some pain and a little bit of anger type emotions right there where she stood while I was still trying to see if I could find her. I thought, where are her parents? Why is she all alone? So I swam back up to my spot by the river and told a friend I was with what happened and I pointed to the rock she was on. He said it sounded and even looked like I saw a ghost from the way I was acting. I asked him if he would go back with me to look for her, and he said no way, that is way too creepy, I don't want to go over there with you. I'm thinking about how this situation is so crazy, and the fact that it's daylight even. I'm going back to see if I can see her, I said, determined to find her. I swam back to the spot where it happened and looked all over the area where people were sitting and still no little girl in a green bathing suit. I started looking in the water to see if I could see anything from down there, nothing. And the girl across the river that I thought was her mother was not. She was with the guy on the rock still. Then again, I get the chill and I'm feeling sad 
and start becoming afraid of the spot and even swam away from it again, thinking this doesn't make any sense, then wondering if I'm the only one who saw her. Did the people across the river even see her? This is a wide visible area where you can see everyone around you. Am I losing it? Then I remember those eyes she had were actually hollow. The smile she made and just kept smiling at me. How she didn't even move from the time I swam towards her, stopped, made eye contact, and said hi, then kept swimming, only a few feet further, then turned around to say she was close to the edge, or, where is your mother? Somebody should be with you. I truly believe what I saw was an entity of some sort, and perhaps this little girl might have fell into the river and drowned, right where she was standing. I've heard some stories from here of people dying at the spot by swinging from the rope swings and jumping from the high cliffs, which happened right across from where she was. I also believe I wouldn't be so disturbed by this if it all seemed normal, but it didn't, and for some reason, she didn't seem to fit in. I wrote to ease my mind, and maybe to just get it out somehow. If anything at all, I will probably never know why she picked me to see her, but I will never forget what she looked like, or how she stared at me and smiled for so long. Maybe she was looking out for some people swimming in the river. Who knows? Well, this is the end of my story. Up until I was around 10, my mom, sister, and dad and I lived in a house called Filder's Green, which was in Lanark, Cornwall. The house must have been around 50 years old and was originally two cottages joined together, meaning it was fairly big. To begin, the only things that would happen would be the odd cold spot, and often, I felt like I was being watched. Another time, my mom went to use the downstairs bathroom, leaving my dad in the kitchen, when she heard a man cough loudly outside the door. Think he was my dad using the study, she shouted something, only to hear no reply. She left the bathroom. There was no one outside, or even in the study. When she went back to the kitchen, my dad was at the same place. She asked him if he had followed her to the bathroom, which incidentally wasn't near the kitchen, and he said he hadn't moved. There was no one else in the house at the time, apart from me and my sister and we were in bed. Another thing that happened was when my mom, my dad, and my dad's friend were sat in the kitchen late one night, when they suddenly heard an almighty crash from my bedroom upstairs. My mom said it sounded like a full-grown adult being thrown to the floor, thinking maybe my wardrobe had toppled over or had fallen out of bed. They ran upstairs and found me fast asleep, with nothing out of place. Later on, they even got someone to check the chimney in my room to see if a stone had fallen down it, but they found nothing. To this day, we don't know what the crash was, or indeed, who made it. The most unexplained incident, however, was the sound of a singing lady. My mom and dad were asleep in bed, and they were woken by a tuneless humming outside their bedroom door. There was no way it would have been me or my sister, as we were only young, and it was quite clearly the sound of a woman. The sound came along the corridor from my room and gradually disappeared downstairs. Another time, my mom, sister, and I were inside my mom and dad's bedroom helping my mom fold up some laundry. My dad was outside mowing the lawn, and we could see him from the room. After we had finished, we went to open the bedroom door, which was shut. We couldn't get out. The door had no lock on it and wasn't jammed. 
There was no draft in the room, as it was an airless summer's day. It felt like someone was standing outside, holding onto the handle to prevent us from leaving. My mom, who was obviously stronger than me and my sister, tried the door too, but there was no luck. In the end, we had to shout outside to my dad to come and let us out. He opened the door easily, and there was no sign of it ever being stuck. We left that house when my parents separated, and I found out from someone that knew the current inhabitants that they too were experiencing strange things, such as their child's toys being turned and turned off during that night. My friends and I went to Cypress Valley Cemetery in Villanoa, Arkansas. We come to your site and have tried out some of the places and have gotten good responses. We parked our car out front and went into the gates around 3 in the morning. There were four of us, there were two guys, and then my best friends and I who are girls. The guys went in first and we followed them soon after. Immediately entering, we all had a very strange feeling come over us. My best friend and I decided to go back to the car and let the guys walk around and explore some more. We were alone in the car for nearly 20 minutes with the windows rolled down because we were smoking when we started hearing screams from the distance. They sounded like they were coming from a woman. We saw no one else there. Then a few minutes later, my best friend saw the outline of two men walking on one end of the cemetery. She assumed it was our guys, so she called their cells, which when they answered, the lights from the phone showed us that they were on the complete opposite end. There is no way that they could have made it over there that quick. When we finally decided to leave, they got in the car and we sat for a minute. We had the windows rolled down but it was about 68 degrees outside, so it wasn't cold at all. We all felt as if the air conditioning was blasting on us, but there was no source of air. It was very strange. Strange things kept happening to us later the next day. We go ghost hunting almost every weekend, and have been to many places, and this one was by far the scariest place. It just felt very uneasy, very dark. Just thought I'd let you know. Here is one of my stories of paranormal activity. From being very young, my brother and I had always experienced things we knew were not normal. But of course, our grandparents, whom we had lived with since we can remember, brushed it off as childish imagination. As we were growing up, we saw less and less unusual happenings. It all began when I was 15 years old. My brother at the time was 17, and our grandfather passed away. My entire family reported seeing him the night after he passed away. Now, my family has its skeptics and its believers, and every one of them reported seeing him laughing and looking much younger and healthier than they'd ever remembered. He smiled at them all and said goodbye. Now, my brother and I had not seen this apparition, so we brushed it off as their subconscious, projecting an image they all wanted to see. Of course we were believers, but we thought if anyone would have seen him, it would have been us, for we had been there for him when nobody else had ever been. Well, our thoughts came to reality one night, around five months after his passing, and this supposed collective haunting. My brother and I were up in his room playing on the PC. My grandmother was out, and my little sister in bed. Now my grandfather, or daddy, as was his nickname, always enjoyed his music and always had it on extremely loud. 
We were laughing at something on the internet when John Lennon, imagine, began playing very loudly downstairs. Well, at first, we thought it was a cruel joke by our neighbors. This particular song had been his first choice for his cremation, and so I, being the braver of us, stormed downstairs to find it was indeed coming from the office room that was my grandfather's. I walked into his old room to find it was freezing, and there were no windows or doors open, and the CD player was not on, and the music was still going. Then, there was a knock on the back door. Usually our neighbors used our back door, and the music stopped. My brother was now downstairs with me, and we thought it must have been our neighbors there to complain, and the noise so, he unblocked and opened the door. Opposite the door was an outside toilet, and as my brother opened the door he froze. His face paled, and I could tell there was something wrong. I looked outside to see nothing, but incredibly shaken by the music, I slammed and locked the door, turned every light on in the house, bar my sisters, as she was seemingly sound asleep, and sat downstairs waiting for my grandmother. To this day, my brother will not tell me what he saw outside, but I doubt it was the friendly spirit of my grandfather coming to say goodbye. The reason I believe this is because the morning after, my little sister said, Do you believe in ghosts? I didn't react and merely asked why. She then replied that the night before daddy had been in her room, when she was crying about his passing, telling her the shush that everything was okay and he was happy. Also, my neighbors, who were really quick to complain, never mentioned any loud music coming from our house. So I really want to know why only us heard this music, and more importantly, who had been outside when my brother had opened the door. There is a two-story house right in the center of town that I lived in, in 1958 or 1959. It is known as the Old Van Delzim House. Both my cousin and I experienced odd things in that house. There were many times that we would hear footsteps, such as a man wearing boots, walking from the upstairs front bedroom towards the back bedroom to the left of the stairs. My cousin also said that she saw an old apparition in the backyard. I went to see the psychic Carol Pete this week and showed her a picture of the house. She said she felt it was a soldier from the Civil War era. Also, she said that many horrible things happened on the property. No one ever died in the house, so it is connected with the land it sits on. We stayed there only about two or three months and moved to another location in the same town. I also found out that I am a psychic medium, have had many unexplained things happen through the years. This soldier is not threatening, he does not know he is dead, wish the house was mine so I could try to help him. All this has been burned in my memory for nearly 50 years. Hi, my name is David, I'm a French student, and I wanted to share some eerie things that happened to me and to some of my friends with you readers. My grandfather died last year. He was a total atheist, and believed that supernatural is just some bullcrap, and that people who got interested in it were pitiful fools. What's more, he was a convinced internationalist communist and often led some speeches against God and the church. I was the contrary of my grandfather, a conservative Christian loving God and fatherland, so the situation often led to arguments between my grandfather and me, as we were obviously on a different wavelength, but it didn't matter. He was my grandfather, I was his grandson, he loved me, and I loved him as well, and we would often laugh together. Well, as a Christian believer, 
I believe and still believe in hell, and I feared that my grandfather would go there after his death because of his resolute anti-God feelings. So I said a lot of rosaries so that God would put him on the right way. One day, as I went back from the university, I got a phone call from my mother. She told me that my grandfather had been sent to the hospital in order to cure a little pain in the knee. But when the doctors started to inspect his general state of health, they found out that my grandfather had a generalized cancer and that is why I felt so tired. I got so upset hearing that, that I rushed to the church and put a candle to the Holy Virgin so that she would get the forgiveness to my godless, communist grandfather. I went to visit my grandfather in the hospital where he was sadly ending his life and I could notice no changes in his mind and moral and his calvary in the hospital bed lasted for months. Here's the moment when my story becomes interesting. In my prayers, I would always ask the Holy Virgin to save him and let me know by a sign that she had taken him to the right place, near the God and far from hell. It was an ordinary night. I was reading in my bed with my bed light and listening to the outside noises as usual, and I closed my eyes to sleep afterwards. Oh God, I can never forget what I lived this night. It was about 5 a.m. because it happened just a moment before I woke up. I had a very powerful dream and it looked so real that it is still sculpted in my memory. I dreamt about a giant curtain of red velvet with a portrait of my grandfather hanging on it. I looked at this picture and my eyes looked leftwards and saw that the curtains were open like on a theater. Behind these velvet curtains, I could see the sky filled with orange clouds lit like on a wonderful sunset or dawn, I don't know. And suddenly, I saw a boy kneeling in the darkness in front of the scene and I recognized myself. I can't figure out why, but I know that the boy in this dream kneeling was me in person. A short moment after, a young woman went out from behind the curtain from the lit side. She had a blue dress and a blue veil. Both were blue, one dark, the other clear. She looked like Raphael's Holy Virgin in the painting. I remember her peaceful face that made me feel peaceful and tranquil. The lady sat in front of the kneeling boy, me, and started talking to him. I would see the lady's lips moving, but no sounds coming from her mouth. But I distinctly remember her beautiful eyebrows. After talking, she showed me something behind her. It was a ladder, a beautiful multicolor ladder the one in the orange clouds. The ladder went through a hole in the clouds and this hole had incredibly powerful light coming right from it and it thrilled rays of light. It was noisy like a storm, though not frightening at all, not at the contrary. My dream stopped with this vision of delight. I had forgotten the dream on the following morning and went downstairs for the coffee. My mother was standing in the kitchen and her eyes were painful. As I held my cup, she told me that my sister called from the hospital and that my grandfather passed away. I was waiting for this event with pain, but I got psychologically ready. Anyway, tears began to go out from my eyes and I began to cry and go in the garden to think. And as I was walking through the trees in my garden, I suddenly remember that strange dream of the night. And I was thinking that it was the sign I was waiting for and that I beseeched the Blessed Virgin to send me. I was so grateful. I went to the church and told the Holy Virgin thank you. But I wasn't expecting such an intervention. But another prayer of mine had been made. However, if you're thinking that this story is going to be about light and positivity, you thought wrong. 
Thus one day, a few days before the funeral, I was visited by a spirit with horns. That's right, I was lying in my bed asleep when the door slightly opened a little bit and I was greeted by this creature, this horn figure. It was definitely a black mass, but it was just standing there as I was trying to regain consciousness in the middle of the night. It stared at me with its red glowing eyes. That's all I remember, the dark outline of this dark mass and the horns protruding out of its head. It was there for about 40 seconds and I'll never forget the sight and then just slowly disappeared. I have no idea what connection this is to my grandfather or even if it means something, but it definitely rattled me to my core. I started to get a lot less sleep, and on days that I would get sleep, I would have these terrible nightmares of the same horned figure. In one of those dreams, the horned figure would be seen off into the distance with again those glowing red eyes, and there would be candles scattered about, with the only source of light coming from the candles. They were all lined up row by row and in a line that eventually led to this horned figure. I remember waking up instantly after that dream and crying profusely. I yelled out to my grandfather. I said, please save me from these nightmares. I'm sick of these nightmares. Fast forward a few days after the funeral and the most spectacular thing happened. Though it was a little unsettling, not even going to lie, and I feel like this was truly confirmation that God was answering my prayers. We have this massive full body mirror that rests in the living room. This is where I saw my grandfather in the mirror, standing right behind me. It happened so fast, and it disappeared so quickly, that I had to regain my composure and not freak myself out too much because I knew deep down inside that my grandfather was here to tell me it was okay and that I shouldn't fear evil. Was it a possibility that I was so distraught over losing my grandfather that I thought I was losing my mind in the process and I was just imagining everything that I was seeing? I don't know. I can see why people would think that after this story, but what I do know is that I contacted my grandfather and maybe some unruly spirits, maybe deep below the surface that we can't always reach. And it's really terrifying, but also comforting to know that my grandfather has my back, even in the afterlife. One early morning I had been sitting in my family room, reading the newspaper. It was a very quiet morning, and I was all alone. The sun was coming through a bedroom window off the family room and shining down the hallway. It was one of those extremely bright sunrises, the kind where you can see dust particles floating through the air. I glanced up as I was turning the newspaper page. I then saw in the sun rays the outline of what looked like a man. It had a light black to gray color. It had no details, just the outline of its body. It was about three feet off the floor and had no legs from around the knees down. I could see the arms. It had no hands either. I just remember telling myself, wow, it's a ghost, and I took it all in. I told myself not to turn my head or blink. The ghost appeared to be looking into the bedroom. It turned its head slightly to the right. At that point, I had to blink. My eyes were drying out. When I did that, it was gone. I then got up and put my hands through the spot where it was. I guess I wanted to see if it would be cooler or something, but it was the same temp. I just stood there in amazement of how cool that was. I also needed to add 
It was no one's shadow, and it's hard to describe, but it was not a shadow. I could see the dust particles going through the figure, and the figure was in the middle of the hallway. It was three-dimensional. It actually looked like a hologram. I really love those rare ghost encounters. My parents bought a house in Newborn, North Carolina in 1970. It was a brand new home in a new neighborhood. I lived in this house with my parents and younger sister until I went to college in 1994. The house was a three bedroom, two full bath ranch with a carport. Before I was born, my father enclosed the carport and turned it into a large den. The original steps, carport door frame, and window frame remained and led up into our kitchen. It was an interesting layout because you could look through the open window frame from the kitchen and see into the sunken den or vice versa. The bedrooms were on a long hallway at the back of the house. The hallway could be reached by two doorways, the kitchen and living room, actually one big circle. The first bedroom in the hall faced the street. The bathroom was next, another bedroom, and then my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. The room next to my parents' room was mine until my little sister was born. I was five years old. I was moved down to the first bedroom. This room gave me the creeps. The closet door would slide open a bit on its own, which my parents said was probably a draft from the heat or air conditioning. However, after someone broke into my bedroom window while I slept and stole a few things from my room, I never stayed in there again, usually sneaking into my little sister's room and sleeping with her or sleeping on my parents' bedroom floor. I constantly slept with the bathroom light on and a bright nightlight or a lamp. I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear odd noises that made me feel paralyzed and cold all over. One would think these irrational fears would subside with age, but they seemed to intensify over the years. One reoccurring incident that still bugs me occurred in the kitchen, den area. Whenever I would be sitting on the couch watching TV, I would see the silhouette of a person walk by the window frame from the old carport. I would assume it was my mom or dad because the shape was tall. What would scare me to death was the fact that no one would appear at the door leading to the steps after I would see the shape walk by. Many times I would call out to my parents, thinking it was one of them, but no one would answer. And then, I would walk up the steps and look into the kitchen. There was never anyone there. Most times, this would happen when I was home alone. On numerous occasions, my parents would come home to find me sitting on the front porch steps or sitting in my car with the doors locked. This went on for years, and I was very excited when I moved out to go to college. Years later, I went to visit my little sister and stayed with her in her college dorm room. We were telling ghost stories with some of her friends when I told her my accounts of the shadow. I was in mid-sentence when my sister finished my thought and described the incident in perfect detail. I had never told my sister about this because she was much younger and I didn't want to scare her. Needless to say, we were both shocked and had goosebumps. We compared stories and it seems we had very similar experiences in that house. My parents eventually built a new house about 10 miles away and sold that house. I wonder to this day if the new owners have ever experienced any of the oddities that my sister and I did. I'm 28 years old now. The paranormal has always interested me, but only recently have I started to research it. 
I've come to believe now that some things I've experienced as a child were probably more than nightmares. I believe my encounters were that of the paranormal, edited with a touch of child's imagination. Contrary to what you might believe, I think my touch of a child's imagination is what scared me the most. I decided to share with you those experiences that could be considered nightmares for your entertainment, but also those that I truly believe are paranormal. At the age of five to seven, I can't recall for sure. One night, I was lying in my bed, asleep. I felt something moving at the bottom of my bed, and the next thing you know, I felt like I was being dragged out of my bed. My covers had tightly wrapped themselves around my legs, so tight that I couldn't move them. I yelled, my bed is eating me, help, mommy, daddy, help. By the time it stopped and parents got into the room, half my body was hanging off the side of my bed while the other half was hanging on for dear life. You know what my parents' response was? That's what happens when you don't fix your bed every day. Your bed eats you. No, really, I still never fix my bed after that. I disproved that theory fast. It never happened again. I look back now and realize that whatever it was in that house had a weird and somewhat morbid sense of humor. Check it out. Several other times, I would wake up from a rather deep sleep, turn over, and open my eyes as if something told me, wake up Steph. Sure enough, I would open my eyes and one of two things would be sleeping next to me. A. Bo Duke. He was like a hero to me at the time. Or B. An orange mummified witch with a cone-shaped hat and empty eye sockets. Now. You would think waking up next to Bo Duke saying hi Steph would be cool as all heck, but no. I would freak out, jump so high I would fall off my bed, and thump, and run to my mom's room screaming, Bo Duke is in my bed, help. It was way more dramatic when I saw the witch. Now, here's what really makes me think it was actually a spirit playing games with me. As I got older, about 10 years old I would say, the occurrences were not so graphical. I would still hear a voice say wake up stuff. I would open my eyes and see a pitch black silhouette of a man standing in the far corner of my room, about 6 feet tall. I would blink my eyes a few times, he was still there. I would pull the cover over my head and then peep out. He was still there. Of course, I then freaked out and ran to mommy's room screaming, the boogeyman is here to get me. Help mommy, the boogeyman is here. This would happen several times a month, for a good year or so it seemed. The last occurrence was years later, when what believed to be the same silhouette mentioned above ran across my room. First, I saw a blur run down the hall to my left and stop at the middle of the wall near the footboard of my bed. It took a moment for it to take shape, but it was definitely the silhouette of a human. I started to dart, and the moment I moved, it darted towards the other wall and vanished. I freaked out and flew to my dad and told him that there was someone in my room. Years later, when I was old enough to understand, my dad told me of the ghost of an old lady that dwelled in the house. She was a nice, but sometimes grumpy old gal. However, that doesn't explain the man that was in my room. I still can't figure out if the Bo Duke, which thing was truly a nightmare, or a spirit messing with my head using the touch of a child's imagination. I've been to Gibbs Bridge twice, and we have seen something every time. 
the first time the signs kept changing. There will be a lot of writing on the signs, or not, every time we came around. I looked back and thought that someone was messing around with us, and I saw a figure standing alongside of the road, ran by the guardrail, and disappeared. Then, I kept seeing something black out of the corner of my eye. My cousin was with me, and she started the scream and me and her both heard moaning over her screaming. Then, it was me and my sister and her friend. The signs again kept changing, but only a few, not at all like last time. We took pictures and got orbs. Then, we saw a figure again by the sign and disappeared. We went all the way down the street and turned around and saw a big bright light. I told my sister it was probably a car, so flash your lights to let them know that you are coming. She did that, and the light was gone. It kind of looked like a motorcycle light with handlebars. I know the whole story about it. Then, we turned around again, and saw it again. It was not the street light at all, because we turned around going back to the bridge about 10 to 15 times. And only showed up about three times. The weirdest part of that night was we left, and my sister's phone was in the center council. Nobody was touching it. Somebody that we know called us and wondered why we called. Nobody did it. It was in the center council the whole time. My sister looked down and saw her phone hanging up, and they said we left a message. It was all three of us talking, and it was muffled. Tell me what you think, and go out there some time again. Thanks for reading my story. Back in the early 90s, a wealthy family who lived in Corona owned two homes. One large home they owned was on the south side of Corona, overlooking the 15 freeway. The other home, used later as an office, was the old in-town district on Corona's famous Grand Avenue. As the story goes, before the husband and wife met and got married, the husband lived in the large house on Grand Avenue. The house once been a funeral parlor, and almost nightly, the husband would hear talking and other noise coming from the room next to him. He would check the room only to find it silent and nothing out of place. After he met his wife, they purchased the large house on the south side and turned the Grand Avenue mansion into an office. One of the children of the family went to my school, and he claimed that their family had experienced all kinds of strange phenomena in the old mansion. One instance, a soda can was completely knocked off of a nightstand right next to a bed that he was sleeping on, and constantly, they would hear footsteps upstairs. And the mother once said she was in the bathroom, and the door suddenly flew open. All of the windows were closed, eliminating any chance of a drift. Another night, the family drove past a mansion, as they often would, to make sure it was secure. Remember, nobody lived there at this time. It was only used as an office. As they drove past the house, they noticed every single light in the house was turned on. They went in, turned out the lights, and left. They checked with everyone who had a key to the house, and everyone assured them they had not turned on the lights. It is claimed that the atmospheric pressure in the backyard is different from the rest of the area. These stories were all interesting to me, but I still had some skepticism, until, one year, the family was going to go on vacation to visit relatives in Texas, and they asked my mother and me if we would watch the mansion for them while they were gone. Keep in mind, neither my mother nor I knew anything about the house, including the strange phenomena. So Monday morning, we got to the house and settled in. My mother, a school teacher at the time, 
was grading some homework assignments, and I, only about five at the time, was fast asleep on the couch. My mother got thirsty, so she stacked the homework assignments in a pile, went to the kitchen for some water, came back, only to find the paper strewn all over the table and on the floor. I was still fast asleep, and there were no open windows. Later on that day, she was in the kitchen again, and she heard me crying in the other room. She ran in to see what was wrong, but again, I was fast asleep. I did not appear to be restless, as if crying in my sleep. Later on that week, we both occasionally would hear footsteps walking around upstairs. It is a very old house, as you can see from the attached photo, so naturally, the floors are very creaky. These were definitely solid footsteps. We constantly went upstairs after hearing the steps, only to find the place empty. After the family returned from their vacation, my mother had mentioned to them the phenomena we experienced. They laughed and explained to us that it happens all of the time. They described the entity as a friendly ghost who likes to play pranks on people, hence the bathroom door flying open. The family eventually moved to Texas and sold the mansion to somebody else. I never return to ask the new owners if they have experienced anything. Perhaps somebody around this area might want to. My name is Prenta. I lived in Hamtramck, a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, in a two-story flat on Crailing Street. The apartment itself has a long and bloody history of violence and death. Not only did I experience multiple ghostly apparitions, such as a man in a long beard that resembled Abraham Lincoln, a demonic possession, as well as poltergeist activity. The demonic possession was incredibly startling. It wasn't something that occurred inexplicably. I had a boyfriend who was connected to negative energies, and an evil spirit named Harold latched onto him. My boyfriend had never been once an aggressive or temperamental person. However, after staying together in that apartment for a lengthy period of time, our relationship began to sour. He would often talk in his sleep, which was something he had never done in the seven years previous, and we had lived together for a long time. One night, he was sleeping right next to me. For some reason, I remember I had a difficult time trying to rest, so I was tossing and turning in bed. My boyfriend was dead asleep. Not a second later, he starts whispering. He keeps repeating, Harold's here. Harold wants to play. Although it scared me half to death, what he said after that truly shook me to my core. He uttered some unnerving words something about how he was going to take care of my suffering soul. At that point, I couldn't take it anymore, and I woke my boyfriend up. He was in a pure state of delirium. I told him he was talking in his sleep, and when I told him what he said, he looked at me as if he were terrified. That's because he said he had a dream about a man named Harold. My boyfriend told me that in his dream, he was in the Mafia, and Harold was his mob boss. He wore a pure white suit and looked like a traditional mobster from the 1920s. Well, a couple days later, I was cleaning my apartment when I discovered a secret room that I never noticed before. It was basically a walk-in closet. The room was empty except for a small cabinet with a drawer. I opened the drawer and in it was an old newspaper from the 1930s. I kid you not, in this newspaper was an obituary about a man named Harold. The obituary didn't say he was part of the Mafia, but he was a World War I veteran. 
I believe that Harold used to live in this apartment. My boyfriend told me that Harold appeared once while he was in the shower, and I was away at work. I often worked a night shift at a hospital, so I'm often away at night. He heard a crash coming from the kitchen that startled him. When he went to investigate, the dishes that were on the countertop somehow fell to the floor. He then returned to the bathroom to brush his teeth. When he saw the face of a young man staring back at him in the mirror for a second, right behind him, it was so quick, but long enough to notice. He then had an idea to photograph the bathroom, a picture directly facing the mirror, and then the bathroom itself while standing from the door frame. What he saw was incredible. It was an orb, clear as day, appearing right in the mirror. Either way, I was convinced that later on, my boyfriend was possessed by Harold. He became a shell of his former, laid back and friendly self. He transformed into a vicious, aggressive, and easily agitated person. We eventually had to have a priest come over to bless the apartment and to perform a prayer on my boyfriend to release the spirit who could be inside of him. After we moved out of the house, the feeling of intense rage and negative energy seemed to subside almost entirely. He stopped talking in his sleep. He was more easygoing, and he started to become the man I fell in love with years ago. Still, there was one experience that I had while in that apartment that I'll never forget as long as I'll live. It was the evening and I was starting to settle down on my first night off from the hospital in days. I walked to my bedroom to change. In the bedroom, there is this huge mirror that I often use. As I was walking through the bedroom, I was looking at myself in the mirror. That's when I saw a woman dressed all in black with a scarf. It must have been some kind of babushka woman. I instantly closed my eyes out of pure fright. And as I opened them back up again, I returned to look back at the mirror, only to see that this woman had disappeared. I only saw myself. All of these events are 100% true. I know sometimes when people tell these types of stories, they are often met with a high degree of skepticism. I should mention though, that I have high integrity, and I think it is foolish to tell pointless lies just for attention, or to have a good story. The possession, Harold, the poltergeist activity, and the babushka woman were all signs that something awful wouldn't leave that apartment. At this point, I'm just thankful that I don't have to experience that ever again, and that my boyfriend isn't being used as a vehicle for paranormal entities. I would say this is a story of a haunted house, but it isn't, until about 10 years ago. It was just a haunted house in my book. I met my husband over 30 years ago. He told me about a house that he used to live in that had some very strange things happening in it. It was local, but he never wanted to go anywhere near it. He said that it was very old and had been built by a young person had some of the wood and granite that made the fireplace sent from Ireland. Anyway, the story is that when he married his wife, she came with her mother, a real shrew. She harped at him and distressed his wife to the point where he went mad and killed them both, then ran screaming that the demons of the house had made him do it. My husband's family moved into the house in the early 60s. During the years they lived there, they heard doors closing and footsteps on the stairs, as well as the smell of coffee and frying bacon in the middle of the night. His mother was quite a gardener, but could never get flowers to grow in the yard. He said the whole family was quite uncomfortable in the home and eventually moved. We had been together for a few years, 
when we heard that the property had been sold for a mini storage lot. We were talking about it with my sister and some friends. When my husband told the story, the friends asked to see the house. I'd never seen it to this point, and I'll admit, was more than a little bit curious. We finally talked him into going, and away we went. When we turned onto the street, we got a really creepy feeling, but when we pulled up to the house, I was absolutely terrified. There was not a living blade of grass or anything else on that lot. We live in Washington State, and this was March. The house was dark and very ominous. I refused to get out of the car, so did my sister. The guys, three of them including my husband, took a flashlight and headed around to the back of the house to see what they could see. After a few minutes, we saw a flash of light on the second floor. A few minutes later, we saw the front door open, but nobody came out. After a few minutes more, they returned to the car. We commented on the fact that we had seen the light, and they told us that they had never turned it on. Then we asked them why they didn't come out the front door. They told us it was locked, and that they tried it before going around back. I was always skeptical about the stories connected with the house. But after they tore the house down, the mini storage was plagued by problems and eventually went out of business. The property sits abandoned and barren, still nothing lives there, and it's still as creepy as it was years ago. I've got a story to add to your website. I've gone back and forth about someone having come check it out, just not sure I'm ready for it, but here goes my story. My husband and I moved into a new house built on a minor Civil War battlefield. We know there was another house in the vicinity. There was also a tree that was referred to as the Hanging Tree, not far from our backyard, on which about Union soldiers were hung. Soon after moving in, we noticed odd shadows and white lights that seemed to move across rooms with no apparent source. We tried to account for them by cars passing on the road, but never could pinpoint anything. One evening, we were watching TV when a shape ran past a door to what eventually would be our deck. The door was a good four feet off the ground, but the person running past ran level with the door itself. My husband and I ran for the door, flung it open, and my husband jumped down and ran in the same direction. At that time, we were the only house on the end of the street, and being a very small town, it's very quiet at night, and sounds carry for quite a distance. We didn't hear anyone running, nor did we see anyone. We were spooked, but figured it was a kid, and our eyes played tricks on us. Not long after that, my husband jumped off the couch and ran for the door again because he said someone was standing there looking in. Again, level with the door and no deck. There was no one we could see when we went outside. Some months later, I was up around midnight cleaning the kitchen. My husband had gone to bed and shut the bedroom door. The bedroom was at the top of the steps and the door in plain sight. I was watching TV across the great room when I saw out of the corner of my eye a man leaning around the corner of the hallway wall and smiling at me. As I turned my head, I was ready to yell at my husband for sneaking up on me when I realized the man's hair was long and blondish and my husband's is dark brown in short. I also realized the man was wearing a white t-shirt with full sleeves, nothing my husband owned. I couldn't see anything from the waist down. While I stood there staring, he simply vanished. I immediately ran to the hall 
and noticed that the bedroom door was still shut, and if anyone had gone out the front door, I would have heard it. There was nothing, no sign of anyone. When my husband got up for work, I told him what happened. He said it was my imagination. I didn't think so, but we left it at that. However, I started turning on the lights when he left the house for work, since he left at 3 a.m. A few weeks later, though, my husband was in the front room at the computer. To the left is a table with an antique mirror hanging over it. My husband saw movement in the mirror, in turn thinking it was one of our cats on the table. Instead, he saw a man's shoulder and arm, wearing a white shirt, walk past in the mirror. My husband simply got up and walked outside until I got home. During this time, my son, who knows no fear, would never stay downstairs at night by himself. He said he was creeped out, like someone was watching him from outside the door. My daughter, a typical teenager at the time who kept to her room, would often come downstairs to hug me and sit close to me. When I'd ask her if something was wrong, she told me that sometimes she felt someone was sitting on her bed and that she saw things move out of the corner of her eye. The strange thing is that my husband and I never told the kids what we saw until they were 18 and 90. There was a time when activity seemed to stop after my husband, getting the idea from my friends, stood in the center of the house and asked whoever was there to not show themselves to him. He was left alone after that. However, recently, we've been experiencing marital problems and my husband moved into another bedroom. I'm now hearing footsteps in my room and I'm constantly woken up by what feels like someone sitting on my bed. I'll roll over, but there won't be anyone there. One night was unusually bad and I had to get up earlier than normal the next day for a class. Around 10 p.m., I said out loud that I needed to sleep, and he wasn't letting me. If he wanted to bother someone, to please go harass my husband. Strangely enough, it got quiet, and I fell asleep, only to be woken at 11 p.m. by my husband, who was in the bathroom, frantically looking for someone to stop an area on his leg from hurting. He has psoriasis, but this particular time, he said it felt like someone was poking him with needles. The area was deep red and gave off heat. A very odd coincidence to say the least. We've also had things go missing. A tablecloth, a 15th century style costume, and various little things that turn up in different areas. We have yet to track down the tablecloth or the costume. I did tell the ghost not to hurt my husband. My uncle and aunt now live in a house near the bank in Auburn town. When I was a little girl, my best friend Stephen and his family lived there. They bought the house and were told that the previous owner, an elderly lady, still haunted the house. They put little faith in the story and never let it bother them. I remember playing in Stephen's room and smelling an old lady smell, like medicine and Lilyic perfume. We never felt threatened by a presence at all. The smell would usually fade away just as quickly as we smelled it, However, one night, after the family had gone to bed, Stephen's mother was awakened by the sound of toys making noise in Stephen's room. Stephen had one problem. He was highly susceptible to nosebleeds. The slightest bump would set off a massive flow of blood. Stephen's mother thought it was strange that he was awake and playing with so many noisy toys at once in the middle of the night. Also, the rocking chair in his room where she would often read him bedtime stories was rocking so hard 
that I was banging against the wall. She ran down the hall to his room, and when she opened the door, the toys went silent. The rocking chair slowed down. She looked at Stephen in his bed and saw that his nose was bleeding very badly, and it was going down his throat. He might have drowned in his own blood if the very sweet lady's ghost had not raised such a racket that night. My grandmother Emily was a hard-working wife and mother, and during the Great Depression, she held her family together, even when her husband, Grandma William, died suddenly. He left her widowed with several children to raise. She was a down-to-earth person and a practicing Catholic, so was not given to superstitions, but nevertheless had some encounters with the otherworldly. One time, for example, she was on her way to visit one of her brothers, an elevator repairman. On the way there, getting off the train, she had a sudden premonition of his death. She got a hold of herself and rushed to where she was supposed to meet him. It didn't take long for her to arrive at his workplace, an elevator station, where he had to do a repair job. She saw a noisy crowd assembled there, and she inquired, what was happening? She was told that a repairman had been killed in an accident. It was her brother, the very one whom she had gone to meet and about whom she recently had a deathly premonition about. I explained this as a prelude to our ghost story. Among her other siblings, she had a brother who was a decent man and a barber by profession. Unfortunately, they had a disagreement which escalated into a parting of ways. He uncharitably held a grudge against her all the while. Time passed, and one night, while she was asleep and her husband were asleep in bed, she was suddenly awakened out of a sound sleep and noticed a person kneeling near the side of the bed. It was her estranged brother, garbed in his brother's smock and weeping bitterly. He was apparently suffering. She was startled and confused and didn't know how he got in her house and bedroom in the middle of the night and why he suddenly showed up after choosing to cut himself off because of a silly grudge against her. She began to speak to him and ask him what was wrong, but he interrupted his sobs to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And with that, he completely vanished. She was amazed and woke up her husband, relaying to him what had just occurred. As they lay there discussing it, the telephone rang. Her husband answered, and it was for her. When she got on the phone, she was informed that sadly, there had been a death in the family that very night. It was her estranged brother, the barber. They understood this ethereal visit from beyond the grave to be the soul of the departed brother and that he was given the grace to appear from his purgatory to his sister in order to make up for his uncharitable bearing of a grudge. A requiem mass was offered for him and they prayed for his soul. He never appeared again. I come from a long line of psychics, and I must have been about seven when during an afternoon nap, I woke up after a very frightening dream. At the time, we were living in Mount Butler in Hong Kong Island, and mom's family lived in Capiz in the Philippines. I ran out of my bedroom into a room full of family and friends to tell my mom about it. I saw this Filipino man in a wooden box, dressed in a cream shirt and brown trousers, and lots of her family were around him crying. As a young child, I'd never seen a dead person before, and was distraught by the experience. My family consoled me and told me not to worry, but it brought to their attention that I too had the gift. It was only a few years later that I was told that the person I saw was my uncle, 
who had been shot by the local militia in my mom's village in the Philippines. And it surmises that the clothes I saw him in were the clothes he was buried in. So it turns out that I had a psychic snapshot of the actual Filipino funeral rites, whereby the body is kept in the family house for a period of weeks so grieving people can pay their respects to him. This brother of my mom's, she had been having prophetic dreams around the time, warning him to leave town because something bad was going to happen to him. He didn't believe her and was shot by the local militia after a dispute. It is Filipino superstition that during this period that the body was stored in the family house, the spirit visits the family on the third, fifth, and seventh day after their death. This, as it turns out, was during this time that we both had these visitations. Mom was in the kitchen washing dishes when she heard who she thought was daddy coming back from work. That's when she saw a man from the corner of her eye standing in the doorway wearing a light shirt and brown trousers. So she chatted to daddy for about five minutes about his day and what he had been up to when it occurred to her that he didn't answer her back once. She turned around to ask him a question and then she realized that there was no one in the doorway at all. It was at this point she was a little bit spooked as she remembered my description of Uncle Fred in his coffin and hurriedly went to check on Daddy. He had come in when she had heard him come in, but had just fallen asleep on the bed, fully clothed and knit wearing brown trousers and a white shirt. So it was her brother's way of saying goodbye and I guess to say sorry for not having listened to her when she warned him. A few years later, it was 1987, around about the time that Edward Yule, Hong Kong's governor at the time, passed away. We were still living in the same flat in Mount Butler, but my sister and I had moved from the room we were in, as that had been converted into mom's nursery, where she looked after preschool children during the daytime. We were now in the room where I would have my bedroom, until we moved over to the new territories. I must have been about nine, so my sister would have been four. We shared a bunk bed, and her being smaller stayed on the lower bunk. I awoke to pitch black, and the sound of flip-flops walking up and down our corridor. I thought, this is strange, as it is custom to remove your shoes at the front door and to wear slippers around the house. As I heard these flip-flops getting closer and closer to my door, sheer terror took over. I whispered to my sister, Chris, can you hear that? No one answered back, so I was trapped on the top bunk with nowhere to go, with this noise coming closer and closer. I hid my head under my blanket, like most kids do, wishing it to go away. I said this time, more incessantly, Chris, can you hear that? And something hissed back at me, yes. That did not sound like my sister at all. At this point, I was terrified. I tried to gather all my strength to get out of the bed, but I was too scared. After what felt like a millennia, I eventually gathered enough courage to jump off the top of my bed, ensuring by no means that I touched the lower bunk and charged into my parents' room across the corridor from our room. I was so embarrassed being so old and being scared, I didn't actually get into their bed, but spent the rest of the night curled up in a ball at the foot of their bed. It turns out that my sister wasn't in our room at all that night. My question was, what was that in the corridor? 
and in the bunk bed with me. The strange pink light around this time of the strange occurrences with the flip-flops. We were still living in flats in Mount Butler. My daddy, a complete atheist, had an experience of his own. Daddy does not believe in the supernatural, and if God actually spoke to him, he still wouldn't believe it. He was lying in bed one night, when he woke up for no reason, to this pink sphere to appear on the wall opposite their bed. It seemed to come out of the wall and sit there and go back into the wall again. He was puzzled by this and went to investigate. He checked out where the possible light source could be coming from. The curtains. No. We were on third floor, so it could have been vehicle lights. He went into the bathroom. All lights were off and couldn't have come from there either. He got back into bed and tried to wake mom up to show her. She was having none of it and kept her head under the sheets. Well, the sphere appeared again and came out of the wall, suspended somehow, then sunk back in and disappeared. He never did figure out what that was or where it came from. Running Ghost when he was working in the Royal Hong Kong Police, he had another experience. At this point, he was the superintendent and managed a section of the traffic police. They were doing their rounds when a speed camera on the road flashed for no reason. They went to investigate and it flashed again with no cars in the near vicinity. They thought nothing more of it until the pictures were developed, and on one of the photos, there is a distinct picture of a person, blurred apparently running very fast, so fast, it set off a speed camera. The Ghost Dog When we were living in Mount Butler, I had one other experience that reaffirmed my belief in the supernatural, and two other people I was with experienced it also. I must have been about 14 when my sister and my best friend at the time decided to go for a walk in the countryside. So where we lived was surrounded by Hong Kong countryside, which was perfect for me as I was a tomboy and spent as much of my time as possible out and about exploring and climbing trees. Just before I started university in the UK, I was visiting some friends in Cardiff. I was feeling very odd that night, and as we are heading out into town, a premonition hit me. I turned around to my friend and said, something very big is going to happen tonight. He just looked at me like I was stark raving mad, so I dropped it. So when we went out and had a lark and came back, thinking nothing more of it. Imagine our surprise when we woke up in the morning and splashed all over the news was coverage on Diana's death. This of course being the famous Princess Diana of Wales who died tragically in a car accident. But I predicted it the day before. At least I feel like I did. Could be a coincidence, but I don't think so. Udalexer Cemetery Experience So, I started uni in Derby in the Midlands, and where I was living was student digs on Udalexer New Road. I was heavily into my goth influence back then. Not so much now, but I still love old cemeteries and dramatic clothing. There was this beautiful one on our road that I used to visit regularly and read and draw with many beautiful statues and old, old gravestones. One day, my ex-boyfriend and I went to visit it as it was a lovely day turning to evening. 
So I wandered around looking at all the gravestones and the statues, trying to find the oldest tombstone we could find. It must have been coming up to winter time as the sun set quickly, and we realized in a panic that the gate had been closed, so we were locked in, and I had to find another way out. So we walked along the perimeter, looking for a likely tree to help us over the wall, when the sun just disappeared, and we were pitched into almost complete darkness. Then, for no reason at all, the mist appeared over the headstones, so it was hard to avoid the graves themselves. So it suddenly looked just like a horror movie set, trying to avoid broken tombstones and holes in graves and that danged mist in the dark. By this point, I was pretty panicked, frantically trying to get out with this feeling of overwhelming dread descending over me and all cells in my body telling me to leave right now. We eventually scrambled over a wall into the student bar, and that feeling just lifted, just like that. It's only a few months ago that I was looking online about Ghost and Derby, that I found out that the very cemetery is haunted. Brilliant. My dreams. I thought that was the end of my experiences, but looking at the dream section. I've remembered some more I want to share with you. I've always had very vivid dreams, some not necessarily all coming true, but all seem to have symbolic importance in the coming days, weeks, or even sometimes years. I more often than not have deja vu experiences, even if I haven't ever A, done this before, or B, seen places or people before, or see, really ever thought about these things when I am conscious. I haven't really wanted to tell people about them, as most people, I worry that most people think I'm quite mad. Haunted house. So this also happened just before I finished university in Derby, I think. It was just before my ex-boyfriend and I broke up. The importance of this dream is one that I've been able to break it down and understand it in its composite parts. So both of us were walking around this dark woods, and I was taking all that I had learned from watching horror movies into mind, and was very careful of not wandering off my own, made sure I had a weapon in hand in case anything happened. We eventually came to this clearing where this ominous house stood at the end of this garden. However, I needed the bathroom, and even though we knew it was a haunted house, I was not one of those people who would go to the loo in a haunted forest. So we walked in, and there were people there. Thankfully, none looking like psychopaths or zombies. Strangely enough, they were people we knew too. There was a feeling of dreaded sadness throughout the house though, and refused to go anywhere by myself. We are directed to the bathroom, which was at the end of this corridor. He decided to sit and chat with people whilst I did my business. So, I started walking, but the corridor was like the one from the poltergeist. It just kept getting further and further away until I had to break into a run, desperately needing to go, and leave this house as soon as possible. I eventually made it, and threw the door open, and did what I needed to do. Then I woke up, and realized that I still needed to go, so I ran for the loo. Luckily, I had the foresight to write this dream down once I had gotten back to bed, and knew that we were doomed. The haunted house was a reflection of our relationship, being hounded by our mutual bad doings, and that the end was near. It was just a matter of time, and so it was. Finally, 
Before I finish another of my epic storytelling sessions, I have one more prophetic experience to share with you, but not one from my dreams. It has to do with my pet dog, Sophie. Her name was Sophie. She was lovely, with her white and black patch over her eye and black patch in her back. She was only six months older than me and had been with her family for 16 years. She was the loveliest, sweetest dog in the world, apart from having a penchant for biting socks, eating tissues and rubber bands, and attacking the hoover. She was suffering from basically her insides giving in. She had serious kidney problems, and she couldn't walk very well because of arthritis in her back legs. And because she couldn't help herself anymore, she was kept outside. So one evening, when her parents were out, my sister and I were playing with her in the garden, and I had this weird feeling come over me. I seemed to be able to predict death unfortunately amongst other things. I turned to my sister, but when I saw the shadow fall on her Sophie that looked like a cross, it was like it was a sign saying she was going to die tomorrow. So that's what I told my sister, and she kind of brushed it off. She didn't believe me, being much younger than me. But sure enough, after a hard day at school, I was only 14 or so at the time, we came back, and our parents were in pieces. And that's when I knew it had happened. They had to take her down to the vet and have her put down, as it was too cruel to keep her suffering like that. I've never seen my daddy in pieces like that, but because I was strengthened by my foreknowledge, I supported him in his time of need. My poor cat was distraught, as she basically brought him up from when we adopted him as a very small kitten. On a happier note, I had a dream after this terrible day. I was watching my crazy dog run from the front of the house, in and up the stairs with much zest and energy like she would have had as a younger dog, running up to our level of the house, looking like she was having the time of her life, back and forth, giving little yips of happiness, grinning in her quintessentially silly Sophie way. As because of her health problems and her incontinence, she was not allowed in except for very cold weather. I think this was her way of saying that she was free and happy at last, and I knew she was in peace. She still does come and visit us occasionally, when we walk by the front of the house, and you can, still after all these years, smell her, and we know she's still looking out for us. I keep meaning to write a dream diary, I'll do that this year as these dreams seem to be too important to miss. My husband and myself and my brother were all watching our mother's house while she was out of town on vacation. We had been there for a few days and all happened to be on this particular evening and night. Well, we had finished dinner and we were all just hanging out in the living room watching TV. My brother said he was just going to sleep on the couch, and my husband and I said goodnight and went to bed in my mother's bedroom because that's where we had been sleeping. We kissed goodnight like usual and turned off the bedside lamp. I myself just can't close my eyes and go right off to sleep, so I was just laying there, looking off into the darkness and trying to wind down. Suddenly. I noticed a very, I mean very dark black mass, right by the bedroom door. I blinked my eyes a few times, trying to make them adjust to the dark better, but realized they already had, because I could make out the mass that was so much darker than the dark. I began to feel afraid when I saw it moving. 
I laid there and watched it approach the bed over our bodies. It looked larger than it had by the door. I began to nudge my husband, but I decided to lay there a little bit longer to see if it continued to move or even get larger. I laid there and marveled at its darkness and its extremely dark color as opposed to the regular darkness. It was pitch black and just floated there above us. Unbelievably, I fell asleep. The next day at lunch, my brother said, hey, last night I saw the weirdest thing when I was trying to fall asleep. A large black mass was hovering above my head and scared me half to death. I stuck my hand in it and it was freezing cold. Before I had a chance to speak, my husband said, me too. I thought I was seeing things. I spoke up and I said I saw it as well and was frightened by it. They both said, wow, I wonder what it was. I had read somewhere that these could possibly be evil. Needless to say, we didn't spend the night there again. I'm a nurse and run our family's assisted living, and recently, we had some strange things happen in our care home. I understand with caring for the elderly that sometimes strange things occur in doing this for almost a decade. Recently, I had a resident that started to decline at the age of 93. One night, after helping her get into bed, she asked me if Bernie, her husband, who died 10 years before, knew where she was. I reassured her that he did. It caught me off guard since her mind was intact and she was not forgetful. A week went by and again, I assisted the woman into bed. She says to me, I hear Bernie in the hallway. Can you tell him that I'm in here? I told her to call for him and he would come in. She refused and asked me to. So I went out to the empty hallway and said, Bernie, he is in here if you would like to visit with her. As a nurse, sometimes you do things out of the better judgment for yourself as long as it helps your patient. Later that night, I heard the elderly lady talking to no one quietly. I've had some odd things happen in my personal life through the years since childhood, but that is another story. I was once told by an elder Japanese woman not to talk to the dead or invite them into my home. Another week goes by and my resident took a drastic turn for the worst by refusing to eat or drinking fluids. After a week's stay in the hospital, she returned on comfort cares in hospice. The end was near and we knew it. However, while she was in the hospital, I received a frantic call from one of her nursing assistants asking if I would please come back to work because she was really scared. When I got to work, all the lights in the house were on and she was sitting on the couch with her back up against the wall. When I asked what was wrong, she told me wide-eyed and pale that she had seen a mist down at the end of the hallway and was hearing weird popping noises coming from the residence room that was in the hospital. After checking the entire house and silently saying the Lord's Prayer, the house felt calm. He spent her last days being pampered and showed care and compassion from staff and family. Many of the staff came in on our days off to sit with her, including myself. The last couple days of her life she was sedated for pain and hallucinations. When no one was in her room, and she didn't know we were checking in on her. She was reaching up towards the ceiling and mumbling. The day before she died, we had XM music playing on our TV. 
A couple of the nursing assistants were performing for their evening cares when the TV changed to CNN for 30 seconds and turned back to the music by itself. The TV remote was on top of the TV. Since our favorite lady passed away, things have stopped for the most part. My mother passed away June 5th. 2007. Me and my husband were in New Jersey at the time, waiting to get unloaded. We drove an 18 wheeler for a living. My sister had called me the day before and told me that my mom was in a coma and the home health care people said she only had about 24 hours to live and that I needed to come home. So I called her dispatcher and said we needed to be routed back to the Chattanooga terminal so that I could see my mom before she passed. He said no problem. After you and your husband have put tires on, go pick up that load and head for Chattanooga. Well, while they were putting tires on our trailer, we decided to get some sleep. The cell phone rang and it was my sister. She told me that mom had come out of it and was sitting up and laughing and talking to everybody and that she was okay. So I called my dispatcher and said we don't have to go home. We can do one more load out here. So it was late that night when they finally got the tires on the trailer and we decided to just stay there in the parking lot till morning so we could get some much needed sleep. We get up that morning and pull out. As we're heading down the highway, my cell rings and it's my sister. She's crying. She tells me that mom passed away that morning early. So to make it a little shorter, our dispatcher gets us home 36 hours later. Now at this time, we are at my mother's house and she has already been picked up by the funeral home before we got there. Later that day, my husband's cell phone rings while we are nowhere near it to answer it. So when we do pick it up to see if our dispatcher is called, it shows we have one voicemail and no number. So my husband listens to the voicemail and it's my mother the day after she died. The message said, Connie, this is your mother. Call me. We decided to check if it was a delayed message, but it wasn't. I even took it to the cell phone company, and they said it was June 6th at 1.25 in the afternoon. My mom died June 5th, 2007, at the times between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. It has really bothered me that we missed the call, even though she was already dead. She might have been trying to say goodbye to us. A few nights ago, a friend and I took a drive up Angeles Crest Highway. It was a clear night and it wasn't too cold. As we entered the parking lot, we noticed there were no other cars there. As I made a U-turn in the lot to face the small building, there we saw a man walking. What got my attention was the fact that my headlights shined bright on the building, yet we only saw the person from the waist down. The rest of his body was a shadow. The man was walking around as if he were looking for something. It appeared he had a flashlight in his hand, the way he was moving, but there was no light coming from it. The closer we got to him, the smaller the image got. When I shined my brights on him, it looked like he went down a small hallway. Even then, we could not see his upper body. We went back the next day to see if we could find anything. One thing we did notice was the hall we saw the figure walk through was now a wall. Not a wall that was just put up, but one that looked like it was part of the structure since it was built. Three separate spirits are said to walk the halls of the soon-to-be-abandoned Middle Tennessee Medical Hospital in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. 
as a new more modern hospital is being built right across the city. In the older section of the third floor, one room is said to be haunted by the ghost of a mental patient who jumped out of a window in the 1960s in the psychiatric ward. 30 years later, in that section, administrative offices were constructed and employees reported sharing running down the hall of someone with bare feet in a light outside the room where the man was said to have jumped turns on and off periodically on some nights. The switch that turns that light on can be found only inside the room, which was not even in use at the time. When the lights were checked by maintenance, they seemed fine. Later, some orderlies enjoying lunch on that same floor reported seeing an IV stem being rolled up the same hallway. They left their food there and didn't return. In what was the pediatric area, the ghost of a red-haired girl in her early teens in a white hospital gown has been spotted at one point by a nurse who also had long dark red hair when the room was used for pharmaceutical storage. She claimed to see the spectral image of the girl staring at her through the glass observation window of the room. The nurse was also a redhead. Finally, the third spirit has been chronicled by the hospital's own sad history and has been spotted in a newer section. A young nurse who had just started was leaving for the night to go out with friends. As she hurried down the stairwell, she dropped her purse over the guardrail a lunch too far and fell down the center of the stairwell, landing on her head. She died three days later due to massive brain drama. Ironically, one of the hospital's employees who had the task of cleaning up the bloodstains was the son of the woman who had seen the red-haired girl's ghost as her family worked in the hospital. It is sad that sometimes you can see the girl repeat her fatal fall. I have many stories to share with you, but I'm going to start at the beginning. I grew up in Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. From the time I was a very young child, I knew that something was not right in our house. Our house was the last house in a dead end street that faced the marsh. In the winter, you could see Highway 35. The surrounding woods were equally as disturbing. I was the only girl in our neighborhood. All my friends were guys. They were like brothers to me. I was a tough kid and I did not scare easily. However, being alone in our house and going to sleep at night frightened me to death. My father died when I was a baby and it was just my mother, brother, and myself. There was quite a difference in age between my brother and I. For years, I kept my experiences to myself because I thought it was my imagination, and I also thought that if I told my mother and brother that they would think I was crazy too. It took me a long time to realize that I wasn't crazy. It was not my imagination. And the hard part was that I was a gifted child whose family could not relate to me on that particular level. These are my experiences while I live there. My mother and father bought the house in 1962 and I was born in 1963. We owned the house right up until 2005. To this day, the events are burned into my memory. From the time I was about five years old, there hardly was a time that the house was at peace. I would lay awake in bed at night and watch orbs dance across the walls and ceiling. Then, I could feel someone sit on the corner of my bed. It was not a faint feeling either. In retrospect as an adult, you could actually see the corner of the bed being pressed down. My heart would pound in my chest so loudly that I couldn't hear anyone else, and I could feel every hair stand up on my entire body. I would pull the covers and pillows over me in such a way that only my eyes and nose would stick out. 
even in the summer, with no air conditioning. Shadows were commonplace everywhere in the house. You could smell flowers in the middle of the winter as well. Then, just as I would start to fall asleep, I would be jolted awake because something pulled the covers of me so violently that they were on the floor at the foot of the bed. That would send me screaming out of my room to my mother. There wasn't a time that you didn't feel as though you were being watched or that you didn't feel that something was following you from room to room. If you came home and put your car keys down, turn your back for two seconds, they were gone. And then after searching the entire house, they would suddenly reappear where you originally put them in the first place. And you were the only one home the entire time. When I was in high school, I would come home and shower because I played sports. I always locked the bathroom door. Every time I would pull the curtain back when I was finished, the door would be wide open. Once again, no one was home and our interior doors had no keys. Until now, I've been very vague with you about my experiences, but now I will tell you in detail my most frightening experience. I was engaged to Mitch. We were just both out of high school. My mom was out, and so was my brother. Mitch and I decided to go to my house watch TV and eat some pizza. From the time we entered the house, I could feel that something was really wrong, really out of sync. The air seemed electrically charged. It was as though us being there had interrupted some unseen gathering. I ignored it, even though I was goose flesh from head to toe. Even with all the lights on, my mother's house always seemed dark. Mitch was sitting in the room watching television, and I went into the kitchen to heat some frozen pizza. We were having a conversation as I did so. My back was to the living room as we were talking and I was placing the pizza on the baking sheet. I heard what I thought was Mitch leave the living room and walk into the kitchen. I became aware that he was standing directly behind me as I was still talking. I turned around to ask him something, but to my shock, it was not Mitch standing there. I felt all the blood drain from my face. My knees went to jello and I gasped and screamed at the same time. Standing face to face with me was a huge black solid apparition. I could make out a head and shoulders, but the rest became more see-through as I went towards the knees and feet area. It felt like slow motion. I think that when I turned around and screamed, I scared it as much as it scared me. As I stood there screaming, the black figure literally whooshed through the kitchen wall. Mitch ran into the kitchen. I was shaking and white as a ghost. It took me a while to collect myself. I shut the oven off and we left and went to the local pizza place where I told them what happened. We didn't spend much time at my mother's house after that. This is just one story out of countless stories that I'll be glad to share with you. I'm now 46 years old. My entire life has been one foot in this world and the other in the spirit world. Years ago, I'd contacted Sylvia Brown, who told me that my mother's house had many spirits in it, but two stood out. There's the ghost of a baby and its mother. She also said, that I was a medium and a psychic, and she was right. This is what I now do. I'm no longer afraid. It gives me pleasure to be able to connect with grieving spirits with the departed loved ones. I consider this wonderful gift that I will not trade for anything. Thank you for listening. All of my life I had reoccurring experiences of the paranormal, starting at age 7, as far as I can remember, when my father died. 
I used to believe the experiences were dreams or imagination until recently. I was telling my fiance of my experiences, voices, mists, noises, marks my body, being touched, shirt tugged on, hair pulled, etc. His suggestion was that maybe I am a sensitive. So I started thinking about this possibility and decided to explore it further. My fiance and I previously tried going to paranormal meetings which would go on ghost hunts. There was one in particular that appealed to me, and we signed up. The building the group was going to was in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, at an old building that was previously the Elka Club, built in 1914. This information was given to us by the leader of the hunt. When we arrived, we went into a room to get the speech about which rooms to be careful of. They would be marked by the yellow tape. Nothing else was told to us about the history of this building. But as I stood there, a name entered my mind, and it kept repeating itself. Sarah, 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 over and over again. Well, as the group entered the basement, we divided into small groups of two or three. My fiance and I were in a small room, in the back, and I felt nothing, so we decided to head out into the main part of the basement. And just as we stepped out of the room, a man that was on tour with us, who has been there before, said, Sarah, if you are here with us, give us a sign. I was flabbergasted. I looked at my fiancé and explained the other shock on my face, and we continued in to other parts of the area. I had entered a room just of the entrance of the basement and instantly was bombarded with intense sadness, so much so that I got tears in my eyes. I informed the group leader, and they took pictures around me, but by this time, I already knew that what they were searching for in the building wasn't correct. I knew that what I was feeling was the past, and the child Sarah intended on proving just that to me. She, in what I would call it, attached herself to me. She started flashing images in my mind about what the building was before the Elks had been built there. It was her home. It was a beautiful Victorian with a large porch, parlors, a library, you name it, she showed me. She told me that she was sad because of the remodeling that was about to happen in the building. She got her point across by telling me certain rooms did not belong. I also picked up a persistent man in a room on the first floor. I was flashed an image of a podium and people sitting and listening intently to this man. In the ballroom, I was given images of people dancing, only black shadows of such. And at last, the third floor, I approached the end of the main hall and was shoved by something not seen. I took a moment and continued on into a grand circular room with benches attached to the circular walls and had the feeling of being watched. And I kept saying, this feels like judge and jury. It was like you were being persecuted, watched, and the spirits were getting angry. So I wanted to step out of the room for a moment, and I took a step forward towards the door and received a sharp blow to my middle back on the left-hand side. I went out of the room and was telling the crew about the incident and decided to give it another try. And as I entered, I again got another blow to the right side of my back. At that point, I wanted out of there for good, so the group agreed to leave the third floor. And as I entered the hallway again, I got pushed in the same spot as the first time, which happened to be in front of a very large window. 
The interesting part was, I said before, I knew nothing of the place, but when we were leaving, I told the owner all the stuff Sarah had told me. I told her of the man in the room that in my mind, I'd seen the podium. I told of getting pushed and hit in the back. Well, she surprised me, not only, but many in the group as well. Come to find out that this is where Sarah's home was. The rooms I was seeing were the rooms in her home. The man at the podium would have been the black preacher that occupied that room after the elk club closed down. That night, I came home exhausted. I fell asleep in dreamt of Sarah. In the dream, she told me her last name, so I searched for her on the internet. I then found something more shocking. Not only did I find her, the year she was born, but I also found the names of her parents. Well, I'd spoken with someone that has been to the club and knows things about it, but they never knew her parents' names, which happened to be the same names I came across. And as far as the room on the third floor, the owner informed me that this room was the judging room for the elk members and where they would hold their remembrances to the dead brothers. The interesting thing was, the women were not allowed in this room. And there was also an EVP that picked up stating, you are being judged. So needless to say, I'm no longer doubting my ability and I'm more open to my experiences, which have been many since that night. Growing up in rural Michigan, I had several what the heck was that experiences. Most were minor. A moving shadow or an uneasy feeling, but one stands out. I was 8 to 10 years old in the mid 80s, and my family had just returned from a vacation. When we got out of the car, my dad headed to the mailbox, my mom to her garden, and I lugged my suitcase inside the house. All of the windows were shut and I pulled the garage door closed behind me. Walking through the house, I passed the bay window from which I could see my dad still on the road and my mom picking some vegetables. The house was silent except for my footsteps on the carpet. I walked into my room and put my suitcase down in the corner. I heard a male voice laughing behind me, maybe in the doorway eight feet away. It was a hearty laugh, loud and clear. I spun around and there wasn't anyone in the doorway. I ran back to the garage, through the door and outside. My father was just grabbing his suitcase from the car and my mother was pulling weeds. I wasn't scared when I heard the voice, but not having a tangible body to put it with did unnerve me a bit. Following the event, I was able to forget and had no issues in the rest of the house. It was only after I got older and interested in the paranormal did I realize that I must have had a run in with something. About two years ago, I bought a 126 year old, 8,000 square foot mansion in Missouri, just outside of Kansas City where I grew up. My mother had owned and lived in the house for the previous 15 years, slowly maintaining it. She had done a great job maintaining its mid 1800s character, slowly bringing the woodwork back to life, adding insulation and replacing all the plumbing and wiring. I mention this because I've heard that a disturbance in the environment can cause spectral activity to begin. I'd seen the house only once as I live over 2000 miles away, but I fell in love with it immediately. The first night I stayed over, I woke in the middle of the night to huge blobs, about a dozen 
from golf ball to basketball size, floating around the room I was sleeping in. This is the one and only time I've ever experienced anything like that. I closed my eyes, said a prayer, and fell back to sleep in time. I said nothing to my mother the next day until she asked me, Well, did you see the blobs? One of the workers stayed down there the other night and said he wouldn't stay in the house after dark because of the blobs floating around him. She had not seen them and still hasn't. However, the previous owner told my mother a few years later that he loved what she had done to the front room, but he could never stay in there while the house was his because of the blobs. During the summer of 2007, I went back to see my family. I stayed downstairs again and had several things happen. It is important to note that I've never felt in danger, only uncomfortable. My mom and her boyfriend went upstairs to go to bed. I stayed downstairs in the first floor master suite. For the next 45 minutes, the heavy footsteps above my head were attributed to the two of them settling in for the night. Finally, I decided I would go up and find out what was going on. The entire upstairs was dark and still. They were both long in bed. I returned to my bedroom to hear the continued walking above me. So, I went out on the living room to sleep on the couch. The walking continued above me, although there is only one attic above that living room. I could also hear a distant, quiet talk between a man and a woman, but I couldn't make out what they were saying, and it seemed to always be somewhere else where I was. The next morning, I decided maybe I would have a chat with myself out loud, and if anyone else heard it, then maybe it would be for the better. I sat on the end of the bed. It was now daylight, so I felt comfortable to be in the bedroom again, and said that I was the new owner, and the son of the woman they probably knew very well by now. I really liked the house and hoped to continue my mother's good work, but for now, I lived elsewhere. I also mentioned something that I don't suggest, but in this situation, I felt comfortable in doing so. I told them that they seemed to have been there a long time, and so long as they agreed to stay out of the bathroom while I was in there, we could get along just fine together. The following night was as quiet as it could be. I think their interest in me was satisfied. This past summer, 2008, was my third visit back. Absolutely nothing happened. I was ready, and nothing. Hey, that's fine with me. But one side note, my mother sat down to look at an album she had kept for all these years she had been doing the refurbishing. She was showing me the huge change in the house, from walls being ripped out and then rebuilt, and so on, and well over half of the pictures. There were huge light anomalies. There were smears, blobs, and strange twists of the image. I mentioned this to my mother, who looked right at me and said, You know, I haven't taken a decent picture since I've lived in this house. I've owned one crappy camera after another. All the pictures look like this. I have to throw most of them away because they are no good. I just smiled. Right, Mom. Every digital and disposable camera she has ever had in the past 15 years has had the same problem. I grew up with a mom who is wicked, and she is very psychic. She has told me accurately if a lover and I will break up, when, if I will meet someone new, and accurate descriptions of people I will meet. My mother told my roommate 
that the child she was having would be a girl, and she was correct. My mom, to my amazement, is the real deal. On Halloween, our house is the most popular because the altar my mother sets up outside is very real. It's very fun, and I grew up with the easygoing view of the paranormal. I do tend to be very logical. And I believe in a paranormal experience if it does not seem like someone is BSing me. I keep my mind open. My mother does have headaches if she is around haunted houses. She has migraines that will make her sick for days after being in one. She's had this happen to her several times in her life, including once when I was a kid a few years ago. When I was 23, I started having heart palpitations and tachycardia. At one point, my heart rate went up to 181. I spent night after night in the emergency room and I was recommended to a cardiologist. I went through that for several months before finally someone realized it was a sedative that I took that helped me sleep. The doctors took me off the sleep medication and I soon found out that I had become dependent on sleep aids. At the same time, I had to get on a Greyhound bus for a two day trip to move back with my parents because of the health problems. If you've ever traveled on a Greyhound, you know it's really hard to sleep on it. I was sleep deprived. I was told that I was sleeping, but I didn't realize it. I wasn't sleeping through the night. I was exhausted. I was depressed, and I developed a phobia of the sound of a beating heart, heart medication commercials, etc. In short, my mental health was suffering. I had to make the choice to go into a psychiatric ward because it took a month to get an appointment with a psychiatrist. I didn't want to wait that long. The ward was in a regular city hospital. All the patients were quiet and were there to heal. Nobody was dangerous. There were patients with bipolar and other types of mental illness, and nobody was dangerous. There are different levels of hospitals. This was a ward for anybody going through emotional difficulties. I started to sleep the first two days I was there. I was not dangerous, but they did have to give me something to sleep. I was having dreams in which in my bathroom, patients had bathrooms in their rooms. I could hear a woman crying and throwing up all night. It was horrible and nightmarish. I could never see her because in the dream, I was laying in bed. How can I describe this? Even though I was asleep and dreaming, it felt like I was aware of everything going on. It never sounded quiet. It sounded like patients were throwing fits and that someone would go by my room and rap on the wall with a walker and that poor woman threw up and cried. She sounded miserable. The ward was actually always quiet. Nobody threw fits at night. My mom had taught me how to interpret dreams. I figured mine showed my anxieties. I'd been through hell. I wanted to sleep and I never gave one thought to the idea that the place was haunted or had residual hauntings. I had greater concerns at the time. However, my mom came to pick me up and she refused to enter the ward. I didn't think anything of that either. We were driving home and she asked me how I had slept and if I did at all. I told her about the nightmares and how it was completely loud and I was still very exhausted. My mother was shocked, and it showed on her face. She said, Sarah, 
those were not just dreams. This psychiatric ward used to be a cancer ward. I was getting a migraine because there are patients who have not moved on. Wow, that shocked me. I never heard doctors mention that it had been a cancer ward. The idea was never put into my head. Like I said, I wanted to sleep again and to feel happy. I was concerned for my health. I believe my mom. She's usually incredibly accurate about these kinds of things. I honestly have gotten tired of finding out if me and a potential lover are not going to work out. She's that accurate. However, I could not tell you if that ward was the former cancer ward. I simply don't know because none of the doctors ever mentioned it. I was sleep deprived and going through hell at the time. My emotional state could have been reflected in my dreams. However, if I've learned anything about the paranormal is that it can be a very small world. The hospital in question is in Iowa. It is a regular city hospital with an emergency room, surgery room, etc. It is not a psychiatric hospital only. If a former nurse ever writes you, or even a former patient, I'm here to tell you that there may have been something to their experience. The ward in question is still open. This was a few years ago that I was there. This is just a quirky experience that I wanted to share. My story has been going on for a couple of years now. When I was nine, we moved into our house. It's a nice little place, backed by a large ditch. Behind the ditch is a large forest that I used to play in. The house itself is unremarkable. It's three bedrooms. The master bedroom is the first room you come to when you open the front door straight in. Right, there's a door to the garage, and to the left is the room we use as our living room. To the right of that is the dining room, with the entry into the kitchen. From the left of the living room is the hallway, with the bedrooms and the bathroom. From the time when I first moved in, I've never liked the bedroom at the end of the hall. It has a window that looks out into the front yard. The room I shared with my sister has a window that looks out into the backyard. I'm not sure what it is about the room, but it's a creepy feeling. I was around 11 when my older sister moved out. By that time, it had been a while since I'd gotten any creepy feelings in the second bedroom. I was pleased with the idea of having my own room. I moved my bed in there, got everything set up, and prepared for the grown-up life that I wanted. The first couple days were okay. I had strange nightmares about something coming in from the ditch, something I couldn't explain. Finally, after about a month after I had been sleeping in the room, I woke up suddenly from one of those dreams. I laid there for a while, not really sure of what woke me up. Then, I realized that the music box my grandma had given me a year ago, it was on. The music box was shaped like a carousel horse and had a switch on the bottom of it that turned the music on. I sat up and took it down from the shelf above my head and turned the switch off. I figured that maybe my cat went up on the shelf and brushed against it. I laid back down to go to sleep. It was lying there that I first saw him. I don't know what made me look up into the doorway of my bedroom. At the time, I slept with the door open, but I did, and standing there was a man, clear as day. For a moment, 
I was sure that someone must have broken into the house. The light coming off the nightlight near the door, I saw that his mouth was moving quickly and no sound was coming out. It was almost like he was screaming at me. He took a step forward and vanished. I slept in the living room that night. I finally got the nerve to sleep in my room again. After about a week of sleeping on the sofa, in that night, I had the same creepy nightmares and woke up to find a child sheep sitting on the end of my bed, staring at me. It vanished when I turned the light on. I ended up spending the next year sleeping on the floor in my sister's room because my mom wouldn't let me move my stuff in with her. I also couldn't change my room without getting the feeling of being watched. I would glance at the mirror, it's the type that sits in the dresser, and see a face staring at me, one that wasn't my own. My older sister finally moved back home, and I ended up back in the other bedroom with my sister. I thought that would make it go away, but I would sometimes see the man standing in the doorway late at night. He'd stand there staring at me, mouth moving forming words I didn't understand. Three years ago, some major changes happened. My oldest sister broke up with her husband, lost her house, and had to move in with my mom and dad, along with her two kids. My youngest oldest sister had her boyfriend living in the house with her. The living arrangements were this. My two oldest sisters slept in one room, along with my youngest nephew, belonging to the first sister I talked about. My oldest sister's kids slept in the second bedroom with me, and my sister and her boyfriend had the living room. It was weird at first, but we all got used to it. The weird things had calmed down since I moved to the other bedroom, but it picked up again when my sister moved in. I was trying to get some sleep. It was around one in the morning, and I saw the child shape again, but this time, it was sitting at the end of my niece's bed. I sat up, but before I could say anything, my niece woke up screaming. She said it was a nightmare, and I had a feeling it was probably the same one I had when I was younger. They moved out last year, and things calmed down for the most part, until my youngest oldest sister moved away. I now had a bedroom all to myself. I was trying once again to get some sleep. I've always had trouble sleeping in this house, and I looked at my doorway, and the man was standing there, but this time I could hear him whispering. It was gibberish. I turned over and pulled the pillow over my head, but the room got so cold, I ended up turning my TV on and closing my bedroom door. Another time, I was messing around with a couple of the other teenagers in the area. We were crossing the ditch and going over to the woods behind the houses. The way we crossed, is there's an area with two large pipes that stick out in the water. Surrounding the pipes are these rocky things that you can slide down, but also grip with your hands. They're kind of smooth and hard to hold when wet. We were coming back. The others had crossed just fine. I was the last one over. The first thing that happened that was really odd was my hand slipped and I started sliding down. I felt as if someone had grabbed my arm and stopped me before I reached the water. I was about to step down into the water to get across when I heard someone yell my name and say very loudly in my ear to stop. I looked down and there was a snake in the water right where I was about to put my foot. 
my friend came back across and got rid of the snake. I got home okay. When I went to take a shower later that night, I looked at my arm and I had a hard handprint bruise on my arm. I don't know if it was one of the ghosts from the house, but something stopped me from falling and from getting bitten by the snake. So, I guess even if the ghosts scare me, they're looking out for me too. Bonito City, a rather grand name for the cluster of log buildings that housed a saloon, post office, schoolhouse, church, general store, a hotel called the Mayberry House, and a number of comfortable residences. Set amid lofty peaks 12 miles northwest of Rizzuto, apple orchards and livestock of the Benito settlers flourished in the 7,000 foot meadows at the edge of the forests. Trout fishing was excellent in the Bonito River. God was in his heaven, and all was right with the world, or so it seemed, when two events took place that would cause the serene and pleasant community to literally disappear. The centerpiece of Bonito City was the two-story log hotel called the Mayberry House, operated by Mr. and Mrs. John Mayberry. They had three children, John, Eddie, and Nellie. On the night of May 5th, 1885, the Mayberry House leaped into the record books with one of New Mexico's most bizarre crimes. Earlier that evening, a number of miners ate supper there and left. Only two guests had rooms, Dr. R. E. Flynn from Ohio and a youth named Martin Nelson seemed to be pleasant in inoffensive rumors. All were in bed by 10 o'clock. About 1 o'clock in the morning, Nelson arose and knocked on the bedroom door of the two Mayberry boys. John awakened and opened the door, at which point Nelson fired two rifle shots, killing him instantly then turned on the seven-year-old boy, Eddie, who was screaming in bed. Nelson killed him with a single blast. Dr. Flynn, hearing the shooting, rushed from his room and was shot through the head. John Mayberry, after hearing the screams, was making his way up the dark stairs from the first floor when a shot through the heart dropped him on the landing. Blood was everywhere. Mayberry's daughter, Nellie, appeared and was shot through the side and left for dead. She later recovered. Miss Mayberry ran upstairs where Nelson shot her in the chest, but failed to kill her. She stumbled downstairs with blood streaming all the way to her feet, leaving bloody footprints visible on the stairs, even years later. She fled to the nearest cabin for help, but Nelson followed, executed her, and threw her body into her irrigation ditch. Nelson, the saloon keeper, no relation to Martin Nelson, appeared on the scene, grappled with the youth, who was no match for the murderer. Martin Nelson shot him to death and left his body bleeding in the sandy street. The next victim was a storekeeper, Herman Beck, who came out to learn the cause of the gunshots. Nelson killed him with one bullet. Bonito's terrified citizens locked themselves in their homes until morning, while Nelson roamed at large, finally climbing up a nearby mountain. Next morning, it's Charlie Berry, Rudolph Schultz, and Don Campbell were standing in the street discussing the murders. They sighted Nelson returning down the mountain. He saw the man, brought up his rifle to fire, but was an instant too late. Barry failed him with a bullet through the heart. Nelson's last shot went harmlessly into the air as he fell. 
total fatalities were eight killed, including the murderer, and one wounded. It was years before the people of Bonito City recovered from the shock, and for 15 years, nobody set foot in the log hotel. Folks said it was haunted, told stories of shrieks and groans in the dead of night, of seeing lights flicker from room to room, or hearing muffled shots. Those who peeped through the dusty windows could see the bloody footprints left by Miss Mayberry's feet. The murderer was buried at Bonito, with his head pointed down. Folklore say that this custom was to prevent the buried persons from walking as a ghost. The victims were also buried in Bonito, side by side of each other, and a reasonable distance away from the murderer Martin Nelson. Gradually, Bonito City died. The final blow came when the railroad arrived in the desert below, and took a business-like approach to acquiring water rights in the Bonito Valley, and later on, buying out the land in which the remaining residents of Bonito City lived. In 1930, Bonito Dam was built by the Southern Pacific Railroad. The remains of the victims were moved to Angus Cemetery, a large stone marks their resting place, and as for Benito City, it is presently resting under 75 feet of water that is now known as Bonito Lake. Since then, Bonito City has become an old memory and a murder mystery of the past. Some people have claimed that during a well moonlit night, they can see the top of the church steeple shining below the screen resting water of the night. Is it really the church steeple being seen 75 feet below the water surface? Or is it a haunting image reminding us of the presence of the city below? You decide. In early November 2006, I went over to visit my grandparents' house and my grandpa wasn't feeling well. He eventually went to visit the hospital. I thought he would just get out in a day or so because he survived a heart attack before. For the first few days I wasn't worried at all. But after a week in the hospital, I was getting a little worried. About two weeks later, he passed away. I was absolutely devastated. Before his funeral, his brother and sister came down to visit. While they were sleeping in my grandparents' house, this is two days after he had died. My uncle was leaving. He looked back to see if things were alright, and saw a rather tall figure, wearing a hat, walking in a room. At first he thought it was my grandpa's brother Robert, but he was fast asleep in a different story of the house. He went looking in the room, and the ghostly figure was gone. We all think the figure was our grandpa. He was about 6'1", and always wore a hat. Every time my grandma went to go get food, or to pick up my little cousins, we would get a feeling someone was watching me, but in a good way. In early December, I was decorating the Christmas tree, and I saw a face peek out at the top of the stairs at me. It looked exactly like my grandpa a few years before he died. It kind of feels like a little bit of him falls every one of us. All of these accounts have happened in Lake Hefazio, Arizona, each in a different house. My mother and I were driving around town, looking for a house to rent, when we found a large house in Bayou Drive. This house was an old bluish color, with vines creeping up the outer walls and into the fireplace, with a large overhang on the front porch. As soon as we started walking up the driveway, 
A very strong feeling of dread started to creep through my body. I really liked the house, so I ignored the feeling and continued into the backyard. As I entered the backyard, I remembered a dream many months before. The exact backyard was in my dream and the images of death and demons filled my mind. My mother had the same feeling, so we left without another word, deciding that a door had opened and a demon was dwelling inside the house. We moved into a different house where everything felt normal at first. We lived there for seven years. I soon felt eyes watching me in the shower, which then led gusts of freezing angry wind rushing past my face and arms. Later I learned my mother was going through the same events, only she experienced only one of the gusts of wind. When we started talking about moving out of the house, things got worse. My mom once felt a figure sit down on the bed beside her and saw the indentation of the person on the bed. There were no dogs in the room, and the entire house was asleep. I saw blinds move with nothing in the room, and a shadowy figure walk across the kitchen. I was cleaning out a house, just about to move into it, when I repeatedly saw a figure of a little girl out of the corner of my eye. I could sometimes hear her talking softly to no one in particular. Later investigation proved that a little girl had drowned in the pool years before. I've had a lot of things happen to me in my life, from seeing eyes in the corner of my room to being slapped by something I couldn't see, so I'm very open to anything and everything that someone would think was weird or crazy. My mom, however, is not, so for her to tell me about what happened to her, I know it's true. I'm 28 now, and this happened a few years before I was born. My mom was an FHA teacher for 15 years, so she went to FHA meetings a lot. One night she was at a get-together for school, and it was getting light. And as she was getting ready to go, one of her friend's cars wouldn't start, so my mom said she would take her home. As they were driving, her friend and her were talking, not even thinking about how far out in the middle of nowhere they were. Finally, they got to her house, and my mom dropped her off and started home. It was a very calm night and very dark almost eerily calm. As she was driving down the road, she started to feel uneasy, so she tried to blow it off until she turned down back road to the highway. I can't think of the name of the road right now, but I do know there was quite a few fatal accidents on that road because of how windy it is. So, as she was driving, she looked over and saw this thing running right beside her. It was as big as a cow, and its eyes glowed green. She got so scared, she stepped on the gas and was going 85 miles per hour. And the thing then disappeared. It was almost as if it was there like a flash, and it was gone. She never found out what it was, nor did she ever go down that road again. But she figured it might have been a banshee or something after a long look at things. She has only had two things ever happen to her in her life that she definitely couldn't explain, and that was certainly one of them. The other was when she went to bed one night, when she was a teen. She just got into bed and looked over at her closet, and there was something that looked like a man floating with a glow around it coming at her. She ran and told her mom, and her mom told her it was nothing. So she went back to bed, and she saw it again, and ran out and slept on the couch 
for the rest of the night. I'm a clairvoyant, and I'm used to not being alone. The last house I lived in had a number of distinctive entities, and will only share a couple of my experiences with you now. There was a young girl, probably around four or five, who was very prevalent around the time my son was three. One night, I had a contact dream. Usually my dreams are surreal and nonsense, but when I contact someone, they're usually set in whatever house I am in, and are more out of body experiences. I walked to the end of my hall, and looked through the dining room into the kitchen, and there was a small girl with waist-length dark brown, not black, wavy hair. She had a flowered white nightgown on, and she was pushing buttons on the microwave. When I asked her why she was here, she quickly, and I mean quickly, like Japanese horror across the room in a blink quickly, came up to me. I crouched down, but I couldn't see her face, and somehow, I knew she had been badly injured. Think gunshot wounds to the eyes and cheek, so I didn't want to see her face. I explained to her that she needed to move on, and go into the light where her family was waiting, and then I walked back to my room, with her following behind me. I woke up, then went back to sleep, and a while later my son woke me up, half ways anyway, enough to answer him and kind of remember, and he asked me to tell the girl that she was not his sister and to leave him alone. I told him to lay down in my bed and explain to her she was about three feet away, that I'm not her mother, and that she needed to move on, that it wasn't her house anymore. I thought that part was a dream when I woke up, until I realized my son was asleep beside me. The other very noticeable energy in my house was that of a woman who was very straight-laced and controlling. She would often sit on a window seat in my bedroom at night. My husband, who was a very skeptical man, would sit up in his sleep staring with closed eyes towards her and ask over and over, who is that? Who the heck is that? Until I would tell him it's okay. Then he would lay back down. Well, this house was in Oklahoma, and every time there was a tornado weather outside, she would panic and really become agitated and very distracting to those who could sense her. So I'd have to calm her down and watch the storm. When my alarm clock didn't go off, she would bang loudly on the window in time for you to get to work, the only nice thing she would do. But when we were moving out, she really flipped, stirring up whatever else was there, so in the middle of the night, I would hear floor shakings and bangs from completely empty rooms. Tape would be peeled off boxes and placed across the room would be removed from boxes overnight and put in different rooms, like books stacked in the middle of the kitchen after they were packed, and sounds of the TV coming on after it had been unplugged and wrapped in protective sheeting. All in all, it was not a very fun move, especially when I was alone the last four weeks of packing, and she kept opening the valve on my air mattress at 2 a.m. My new house is nice, but I keep hearing a little boy talk to me from a corner of my bedroom. Oh well, I guess. I'm 25 now, and have had strange experiences which, though I'm very analytical and skeptical, can't seem to find out how, or why, or what these things were. I will tell each encounter as simply and as accurately as I can. I used to live in Stockton, and my house was built around 1910 to 1912. 
I was an only child, and my parents were very busy doing their own things. I may have had an overactive imagination, but I don't believe so, because what I saw was too clear and not fake and reinterpreted by my brain. The sliding redwood doors that separated our living room from the dining room began to shake before my eyes as if it was locked and someone wanted in. I got up and walked around to the other side, thinking it was my cat, but I didn't see her paw, and she never shook the doors, just nudged them apart. I walked around to the other side of the doors to the kitchen. All the lights were off, and I saw no one. I felt very scared suddenly, and went to bed, closing my door. Another time I was laying in bed, and my mother was on her hands and knees sniffing the floor. A bathroom connected our rooms, and I assumed she had begun sniffing in the bathroom. I asked her what she was doing, and she replied, your father and I smelled rotten blood. I can't remember what happened first, but I saw a clear apparition in my living room as I tied my shoes. A man dressed in black with a top hat and coattails had a cane with a black long beard, walked briskly through the living room, and disappeared. I had a dream that I pulled the back out of the apartments in my parents' bedroom and saw bloodstains. I don't know if she was moving them. She denies it still to this day. But I know I wasn't moving them because I was determined to find the truth. The board told this story. A married couple named Mark and Melissa Twain live in the house with a woman's sister. One day, in jealous outrage, she killed them both in the room with a shotgun. I thought it was very fishy the wife had my name, and the husband's name was Mark Twain. But like I said, my cousin says she didn't make the Ouija tell the story. I was under the house one day, bored and playing around, when I found a small handful of large blast bullet casings. Not as large as a shotgun gasing bullet, I don't think. Other things have happened. I heard a knock on my door late at night. One huge knock, but I was too scared to open it. I told my father in the morning and he got very angry and shouted at me that I was too stupid. I don't know why that angered him. I surmised the knock was from my dog changing lying positions on the porch. Once a baby bottle just sitting on the counter just seemed to be thrown in the floor. My father said it was because I stomped into the kitchen, perhaps. But the powerful way it fell, I doubted it. I was never able to tear my parents' carpet or find any information on the house that could point me in any direction. Though I did get all the paperwork on who owned the house, and no name Twain ever owned the house. My aunt, who claims to be a psychic, came over to the house and said that several ghosts live here. But that was something I didn't hear myself. Another family member told me that. The house, which was always a bit odd, had a stained glass window on the front, not very large. It was of a cross. Later in life, I was in high school, living with a friend. I was trying to go to sleep and heard someone say my name very clearly right next to my ear. I got up and asked my friend what he wanted. He was in my grandmother's room, which they shared. I didn't call you, he said. The voice didn't sound like his voice. It had a lisp, as was very girlish sounding. We went to the house in the Delta, abandoned and run down, as well as vandalized. I walked ahead of everyone, always ready to take on whatever. As I walked past a bush, these birds just exploded from it. Before, I heard no burn song, and they surprised. 
The house was elevated with a basement that had openings for water to flow through. Everything was pretty much ruined. A door opened nowhere, as the staircase had been brought down. It felt like a cemetery, not in a morbid sense, and just so quiet and hollow. We went to the basement, where trash was everywhere. On the door which had been removed then, placed back up, was a crude black painting of a devil or satyr. Being mischievous, I took a wooden bed frame topper. It was painted brown with a carved flower on each side, and it was painted red as well. After I took it home, that's when I heard the voice. My room was cold, and I saw something in the garage, and I had a really weird nightmare. The kitchen was being renovated, so we had to wash and get dishes in the garage. I went out to get a cup and felt very nervous in there. As I was walking to leave, I heard a loud boom in the wall to my right. I looked, not too long, but long enough, and this will be a very hard to explain situation and sound crazy. But this energy waved and glistened in the shape of something human turned its head and looked at me. I ran out, scared for my life. I'd never been so scared. I took the bed knob back and nothing happened like that again. The site has long since been destroyed. I'm not sure what any of this means, but I do know one thing for sure. I experienced it. Both of these accounts took place within the same week of each other, happening to my brother and I when we were on vacation in London. The Hyde Park Ghost. I was on vacation with my family in London for Thanksgiving, 2001. About 10 in the morning on Thanksgiving Day, we decided to go for a walk around London, starting with Hyde Park which was about three blocks from the hotel. The park was beautiful against the autumn sky, and both my brother and I found it strange how time seemed to skip as the park just lay kitty corner from a highly modernized tourist strip. As we waited on the corner for our parents to catch up, I turned to see a great black carriage standing behind us, pulled by a glamorous looking brown and white Clydesdale. I talked on my older brother's jacket and pointed, and we watched it for a while, thinking it was the coolest thing we'd ever seen. Others in the park didn't take much notice of them at all, walking by in a hurry to get wherever they were going, or that's what we figured. My brother, having his camera with him, took a picture of the carriage and the driver, a slightly portly man with a contented smile in a formal air. He looked at us as my brother snapped a picture, and I felt an unexplainable tingling. Shrugging it off as the autumn weather, I continued to watch the driver. Our parents called our names, and we turned back to look at them, agreeing that we should all go for a ride in the carriage. My mom asked what we were looking at, and I turned back and pointed. What happened next is the strangest thing I've ever experienced. There was no carriage standing on the corner with us. My brother just looked as puzzled, and we continued the search about the corner, thinking it must have driven off after we turned to look at my parents. The carriage, driver, and horse were nowhere in sight. I found it odd also that we had not heard them drive off, as one would think a horse walking on stone could not be terribly quiet. A week or so later, we got the film developed. My brother and I searched through the pictures at least three times, trying desperately to find the one he had taken off the carriage, but though all the exposures from his camera were present, 
We could not find the one of the gleaming black carriage, Mary Driver, and the magic Clandestale. We did, however, find a startling shot of the corner it had been on, with the little glowing orb just right center. My brother and I prickled. The real start, however, did not come until about two days after that, when I was reading a book about the ghost of London I would picked up at the Tower of London for some light reading. I felt the same familiar prickle as I read about a popular ghost in Hyde Park, that of a man driving a gleaming black carriage pulled by a huge brown in white Clydesdale. The Shadow in the Chapel a few days after walking in Hyde Park, my brother and I were wandering quietly through Westminster Abbey, enjoying the sights. We walked into the chapel that was open and sat for a moment, waiting for our parents to catch up. While we were there, he said he smelled something burning. I sniffed the air, recognizing the strong smell of incense. We looked around not seeing anyone else in the chapel. My brother poked his head out the door and he looked around, informing me that no one was there and no one was burning anything nearby. Thinking this was strange, but not terribly creepy, we hung around in the chapel a while longer, chatting quietly. Our conversation was broken, however, when we heard someone chanting from the front of the chapel, we jumped, thinking we were alone. I looked up towards the front, certain we had been alone. The chanting continued in a foreign language I didn't understand. My brother, a Latin student, said later the chanting was a prayer or something. We stood there, watching the front of the chapel, looking around for anyone who might be chanting. I nearly fell over when I saw someone flicker to my left, a figure wearing a dark robe and moving slowly walked in front of us at the head of the chapel. I remember taking a sharp step backward and falling into my brother when after a moment's reflection, the being looked up and straight ahead. We couldn't see its face as its profile was towards us, covered by the robe's hood. That didn't matter, however, as in an instant, the being was gone. There was no more chanting, no smell of incest, nothing about me being supported by my pale and terrified looking brother. We didn't know what to think, neither of us thinking too much of ghosts before. But neither of us could really explain it. One minute, someone standing right in front of us, and the next minute, it was gone. Completely and utterly gone. Not a trace of it. First story. I was 11 when this happened. I was spending the night at my best friend's house. It was a pretty Victorian house. It still had the original barn. It was in the back. But anyway, one night we were staying up well past our bedtime, down in the living room, watching TV and talking. Well, our room, which we were supposed to be in, was directly over the living room. Well, we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, we heard what sounded like something being dragged the length of our bedroom. It was something heavy. We were so scared, so we stopped talking and muted the TV to listen. It sounded almost like a dead body. All you could hear was thump, thump, slide, thump. It was freaky. We checked on everyone, and everyone was asleep. In my second story, this is my fiancé's story. He's in Germany right now. He would probably be mad at me for telling this, but I have to because it scared me. Anyway, he's not the type of guy to get scared very easily. 
He doesn't believe in ghosts. We live in a town called Tacoma. It's south of Seattle. Anyway, a poor town of Tacoma is Lakewood. In this town is an old insane asylum that was torn down about, guessing, 30 years ago. And then rebuilt across the street. Go figure. It's called Western State. My fiancé and a couple of his friends went to the hospital for the fun of it. The ruins are still there. They were down in the basement, which also happens to be the boiler room. They were walking down there and came around a corner and saw a bunch of bugs and such. They figured a bum was staying down there. As they turned to leave, Dave is a pretty small guy, so he got pushed to the back. As he was about to leave himself out of the window, he felt someone tap him on his shoulder and heard someone whisper something to him. He figured it was the bum, so he turned around, but there was nothing there. He freaked out because it was a split second that he'd heard something and felt the tap. So he started screaming for his friends to come and get him. His friends had to pull him out of the window because he was freaking out the whole time. A third story. I was sleeping one time in my bedroom and it was like three o'clock in the morning and I suddenly woke up because I had the feeling that someone was in the room with me. I had my own room at the time and it was pitch black in my room, but I looked in the corner where my door was and I could just barely make out the outline of a man. He was just standing there and watching me. I couldn't breathe or think. I just stayed there for about two minutes, trying to figure out what to do. I finally got the balls to reach over and yank on the lamp. When I did, nothing was there. Fourth story. Me and my sister were at my grandma's visiting. And recently, my uncle had passed away in the house. He had gone missing for about two weeks. My grandma didn't think anything of it, because he did that sometimes. She went in his room looking for something, and there he was, lying on his bed, half decomposed. She said it took forever to get the smell out. On my grandma's TV was a plastic face, with a flake flower in it. The TV was off and my grandma was at work. So me and my two sisters was sitting around and talking. I believe we were talking about my uncle when all of a sudden the vase went flying off the TV. When I say flew, I mean flew. It flew like five feet. We all stopped and decided to go to bed. Fifth story, I was spending the night at my best friend's house. I was like 15 or something. My godmother had just told us to go to bed. We were just getting ready for bed when I hear my godmother yelling at me to get my butt in bed. I came out of my best friend's room and said we were. She then proceeded to tell me that she had seen me in the reflection in the window walked by from the stairs to the kitchen, but the room we were in was right next to where she was. Freaky. The sixth and final story. I was babysitting my nephew one night. I was sitting on, listening to music and relaxing, when I heard my sister laugh, thinking that was weird because I hadn't heard them come home. I got up to check. There was no one there. I know my sister's laugh. About 30 minutes later, I heard my sister cough. Again, I got up to check. Nothing. I don't know much about this house. I've only been here about eight months. It's my brother-in-law's house. This house is kind of weird though. When all sounds have died down, you can hear clicking. And sometimes, even what kind of sounds like walking sounds, 
I sleep with my door open, so I'd hear if my sister had opened her door. But they're like soft walking sounds. Odd. Anyway, I have tons more stories. I'm a very strong believer in ghosts. So if you want to hear more stories, just email me and let me know. I was reading your site around Halloween and noticed Green Man and instantly knew what the reference was. I had heard this story dozens of times by my dad who visited Raymond. Then I realized the legend was not correct. The legend states that late at night, you could witness a ghost wandering around the tunnels and bridges around town. There have been numerous reports over the years of a man with a green face walking after hours. He is known as the Green Man. This is because when people have seen this figure, the apparition has a terrifying green face as he floats by the local tunnels and bridges of the area. The real version is extremely depressing, but the real version in the least. The horrible accident occurred in Evans City. Raymond, unsure of the last name, and his older brother were flying a kite near some electric wires next to a tree. The kite got stuck, and Raymond followed his brother up the tree to retrieve it. When Raymond's brother grabbed the kite, both brothers got electrocuted. Raymond's brother was killed, and Raymond was severely burned. He was extremely disfigured, and it was extremely hard for him to walk because of the accident. The residents of Evans City collected nearly 30000 for the boy for his care. His older sister and her boyfriend ran off with the money, leaving Raymond without the money he needed to get well. From then on, the townspeople took him under their wing and took care of him the best they could, but without the funds to do it. My dad's grandmother, who lived in Suiki, told my dad and his brothers and sisters the story of the Green Man when they went to visit her. Raymond, now an adult, walks down the road to and from the tunnel every night. The sun would hurt his eyes, since it only had a thin sheath of skin to cover them, so he did not go out in the daylight. He could barely walk but did so every night regardless. People from all over came to bring him money, gum and cigarettes, even while he was on his nightly walks to the tunnel and back home. The green man came from the color his skin looked when the headlights would hit him. He had been charred so badly, he was gray, so the headlights actually made him look a greenish gray color. Unfortunately, my dad couldn't confirm this because he is colorblind. Raymond had a hole for a mouth, no nose except for a hole, and holes for ears. My great grandpa, my uncle Carl, then a teen, got out and handed Raymond a pack of Lucky Strikes and a pack of gum. Raymond talked to them for a bit, though you could barely understand what Raymond was saying. Behind my great grandma's car were many more cars, waiting to see Raymond, as there were more every night. At this point, Raymond was a bit of a celebrity. Raymond was watched by the town and the police, and he never had any trouble with the visitors. My family left, and the next car pulled up to visit. My dad recalls hearing of Raymond's passing some years later. Must have been about 1985. The interesting aspect of the story is that years after Raymond's demise, I've had friends who have passed by the tunnels and have noticed gray mists, orbs, and other strange phenomena. Where that they witnessed phenomena near the very same tunnels that Raymond used to frequent. One of my friends is a non-believer and a true skeptic of the paranormal, and he had experience where he saw the green man years after his death. Just like the story, 
He shined his headlights as he was driving through the tunnel and nearly wrecked his car. He thought that he had saw a man wandering around who appeared to have a green face. He appeared so quickly that my friend had little time to react. His car came to a complete halt, but there was nobody in sight. Whether Raymond haunts the road and tunnel, I don't know. However, I'd like to believe that the legend is now true. After the experiences that my friends have had, a little ironic, but fascinating, nevertheless. These experiences all occurred at my grandmother's house, which is called Gwimmick Manor. Although the house isn't very big, it's around 200 years old. All my dad's family have lived there, and my grandmother now lives there alone. There have been many different events, things such as footsteps, dogs barking at something unseen, and the shower being turned on and off, or just a few minor things. One time, my uncle fell asleep in the kitchen at night, and the door he was sleeping next to was flung open, waking him up, even though there was no draft, and it was an airless night. The same uncle also had experiences as a young child. When he was younger, he would hear footsteps from outside his window late at night, as though someone was walking hurriedly over gravel. At the same time, he would see two big black dogs sitting by his bed. Another time my grandma was walking upstairs with some laundry, when she dropped something and bent down to pick it up. As she was retrieving it, she saw a pair of shoes on the steps in front of her, as real as a human's. She looked up and saw a long skirt and the start of a shirt, and then the figure disappeared. My grandma swears to this day that the story is true, and says although she didn't feel threatened, she certainly wonders who this woman is. There was no one else in the house at the time, and the stairs are curved, so if someone had walked down them, you would have seen. Most recently, my sister and I were in the corridor opposite the dining room, which is locked when it's not in use. There is a key on the outside of the door. We were standing there talking when the key started to move as if someone was trying to get out from inside. We thought maybe someone was in there at first, but then we remembered that the key had been moving from our side of the door. Most recently, we were sitting on the lawn whilst my dad and uncle played badminton on the court behind us. The garden is raised almost on a hilltop with steps leading up to it, so the grass we were sitting on was in line with the upstairs bedroom window, if that makes sense. We were facing the window, talking and looking in at my grandmother's two dogs who could have been sitting on her bed. My grandma had gone out shopping and had left her dog shut in her bedroom. First, we saw one of the dogs start barking urgently at something in the far corner, which was out of sight from us. This continued, and the dog then jumped onto the bed again and started barking directly at us. We thought this was strange, but what happened next couldn't be explained. A white mist, almost in the form of a hand, passed over the dog's head as though it were stroking her. She then stopped barking. We both looked at each other in horror, knowing that we both had seen the same thing. There was no sunlight that could have reflected through the windows, and I honestly can't think of another explanation for the hand we had seen. I still feel scared when I go into the house. January 1999 I'd been working for an American company in Evesham in the UK. The company was based in a small industrial state called Briar Close and East. 
on the edge of this estate is a small pub called the Oddfellow Arms. We all used to go to this pub now and then for a quick pint of a lunchtime. I personally used to have a pint, perhaps once or twice a week there. Anyway, as you go in on a fairly regular basis, you tend to get to know some of the locals. There was one couple in particular that the story is about. They were an old couple. He was an ex-counselor and had to use a frame to walk with. He was always with his wife. He used to drive him everywhere. Obviously, he couldn't get anywhere without her assistance. It was just after the Christmas break, first week back at work in January. I decided to go for a sandwich and a drink at the pub. Funny thing was, I noticed that this chap was on his own sat in the corner. He tipped his glass to me as usual, to acknowledge me. I thought no more about it. Later that day, I spoke to my warehouse manager. He frequented the pub on a more frequent basis and knew all the regulars by name. So, I mentioned to him how odd it was that the old guy was on his own. Astonished, he replied that's impossible. The old guy had died over Christmas. I have never forgotten this. And some people, including my wife, have told me I must be mistaken, but I know what I saw, and I know when I saw him. For all those people who know the Oddfell's Arms Evesham, perhaps some of you may remember this chap and his wife that frequented the pub, or maybe someone else had seen him too. I'm recently going to a neighboring school by this house and have visited it frequently. I never get a safe feeling while in there. And recently, we found a mutilated animal, not like it was feasted on, but just torn apart and left in front of the house, maybe for some sort of omen or a warning. The body was ripped to shreds and its skin on the hands were ripped off to showing its appendages. Later, we found the skull of the animal adjacent to it, and we noticed the jaw was removed, but the skull itself was in a very clean fashion. No blood or guts or any kind of fluids, not even dirt marks. The skull almost looked like it had been washed. That not being the strangest thing, I have a friend of mine who is a female who is as well as extremely interested in the paranormal and she has recently gone to the house and the first encounter dealt with her and her best friend going into the house and just walking around. The problem was that they did not even get to enter into the house. Right before stepping on the yard, the house is surrounded by large bushes. They heard a sound coming from one. Other times that I've been with her, we swore we heard footsteps beside us in the bushes, as if being watched. Her best friend saw a shadow and became very frightened and began to flee. My friend was not as scared and refused, and her being the determined person that she is, continued to go forth. The sound was continuing this whole time. Her friend left sprinting, and so just to be a good friend, she decided to go catch up. She was not running so fast, and in her light jog, she turned around and noticed a woman with bright blonde hair, this being the only thing sticking out, chasing after them, and even got off the yard and continued in the pursuit. When seeing this, my friend began to run even faster and eventually ran to the church where they parked their car. She called me while this was happening, I guess to help us believe, and also, she knew I was very interested, and I could hear the fear in her voice. When she returned, she told us the story, and one of the girls who was a local asked about what she had saw, and when she said the thing chasing them had long blonde hair, the local freaked 
and admitted that the woman who was murdered did in fact have long blonde hair. This scared and excited all of us because my friend who was chased had no idea how the woman looked or anything of that sort. Not being enough for us, we decided to go back with another group of kids who swore they know much about demons. We weren't allowed to go on because the demon group refused to get on because they swore they could just feel the evil. Well, they went back and we ended up going another day with other friends. We just heard small sounds and footsteps. Other friends' stories deal with the chair in the living room that has two missing legs would be dragged across the living room. But one day, my friend, being the brave girl that she is, went into the house by herself one night. And she was walking around and really did not notice anything. She made a comment expressing how upset she was that nothing was happening. And a few minutes later, she heard a high-pitched shriek, and right then she was pushed, what she guessed to be about four feet, and pinned to the wall. She stumbled out of the house, and when she got home, her best friend noticed the scratches on her forehead. She still has them right now. This incident is very recent. That same night, her friend later called me saying that she had fallen asleep and was not responding and that she was breathing normally, but her body was extremely cold. We haven't gone back yet, but we notice that activity is much higher when fewer numbers are around. I look forward to giving you updates. Also, I'm from McAllen, Texas, and there's a building in that area that is rumored to be haunted. There's this building, and it is extremely haunted on the third floor. I'll go ahead and check that out as well, and I'll give you an update as soon as possible. My name is Andrew Pierce, and I'm a local ghost hunter here in Warwick, Rhode Island. Having experience in paranormal investigation helps every time I tell my story, because living with ghosts and experiencing ghosts are two different things for me. I moved into my home 15 years ago at the age of 6. The first night in my new house, I slept in what is now my mother's room. And before waking that night, I had nightmares of bloody murder, massacres, and deadly beatings. At the time, I was just scared. But now, after researching, I've come to the conclusion that this was a ghostly encounter. Between the ages of 7 and 10, I suffered four experiences in my dreams, where strange people would walk around in my house. The only problem is that... They weren't living, and in each of these dreams, they were foreshadowings of what are now actual hauntings. The area with the most activity is my basement, which has been finished and where several phenomena have occurred. The first came when I was 12. I was headed upstairs from my computer room when I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. When I turned around, it was a little girl huddled in the corner and looking at me. She was dressed in 18th century garb and looked like she had just left church or some sort of social gathering. She has never been seen again, but she has been felt throughout the house and even experienced once by someone who had never been in my house before. This occurred when a friend of mine was sleeping downstairs, waiting for us to get back from her on to CVS. She was asleep on the couch when a ghostly arm or hand touched her arm and then proceeded to knock over a couple of items on the table. When she had informed me of this, I knew it was the girl. Another haunting would be in my mother's room, where, if you are alone upstairs and my dog is not around, a growling sound comes from her room. It is entirely inexplicable. But I have a feeling an angry ghost lives in there, but cannot gather enough energy to support anything other than making sounds and haunting dreams. 
Shortly after my neighbor died, he built the house for his children and loved my family very much. Most of the hauntings disappeared, and a sense of comfortability ran through the house. Everything was at normal temperature, and there was no more dreaded sense of being followed or even watched. This has comforted me greatly, but it only lasted for a short time. Since that time, several newer and less aggressive ghosts have entered the house, and they are seemingly very friendly with my dog. Where he used to bark at them, he is now okay with them, and can even be seen playing with them. This was witnessed when I saw him playing with his ball alone, but then noticed that the ball was rolling to him on its own. He would bring it back, and it would only roll once more. Also, this same ghost apparently hates breakfast, because it disturbed us one time, by knocking over a bunch of papers in the counter, and spinning the trash can lid violently. No explainable cause was determined, as it was the middle of winter, and no windows were open, and we don't have a fan in our kitchen area. Another ghost prefers to walk around the foyer and up and down the stairs, but never seems to go past the hallways. That's really all that happens, but I wanted to report these, since they are the only real, vivid ghost experiences I could ever recall. Thank you. We bought a house in Yucca Valley in 1988, built during World War II, from what we were told, two bomb shelters. House added on to the years to come. Interesting old place, but nothing special other than the fact we thought we could turn it into our dream house. Two-story, white picket fence, etc. A couple weeks after moving in, my husband and I were in the kitchen, talking, when I thought I saw something, a fog, an image of a lady going through the dining room, not saying a word, thinking my husband would think I was nuts. He said to me, did you see that? My husband and I choose to sleep in the downstairs bedroom, and the girls upstairs at that point. We were in a king-sized waterbed, framed firmly on the floor so it's not logically possible for something to be placed underneath it. After we began renovating the upstairs, we moved our bed up there, and the girls had the downstairs to sleep. Full-size beds, sitting on regular bed frames. There was nothing on the floor when we moved our bed out. A few weeks later, one of my daughters informed us that something was under her bed. My husband investigated and found a black and white photo as well as some silk scarves. We called the former owner to ask if he knew who or what it might be. He came to look, said the photo was of his dead wife and the scarves had belonged to her. A few months later, my husband found a painted portrait of a young man in his workshop. Again, called the former owner. He said it was of his dead son. A year or so later, one of my daughters saw the same image, the fog, image of a lady. He or she never caused us any harm, except for the fact that money we hid in one place or another had disappeared. After living there a while, we met the neighbors. They informed us. Former owner's wife had died from cancer in the bedroom photo, and scarves were found. His son, Porter Fount, had offed himself at the Yucca Valley Inn. Ashes had been spread on the property, according to them, the neighbors, but these facts were not disclosed to us at the time that we bought the house. After living there some 19 to 20 years, we decided to move, not because of spirits, just now that the kids have grown up and moved out on their own and wanted to downsize. I used to live at the House of a Thousand Stairs in Redlands, California. 
I lived there for about 10 years off and on with my godparents. They lived there full time. I came on the weekends and during the summer. This place is very active at night. My god sister and I would see the spirits of ghostly nuns walking down the stairs. They would stop to ring the bells in the bell towers and then evaporate into a mist. After a while, we removed the bell that connected to the stairs. There were other spirits as well. Some were pleasant, while other spirits we believed were demons. I think the scariest experience we had was one night, when I was sleeping in one of the rooms. I woke up to seeing multiple green lights floating aimlessly around me before disappearing. They had to have been orbs. I remember there was a closet which was slightly open. When I looked at the closet, I noticed the head of a figure peeking out with red eyes. If you've seen the famous Amityville horror picture, that's how it looked to me, except with red eyes of course. There are tunnels that run under the property, and rooms as well, all made out of dirt. Some of the room's doors have been covered over with dirt and rocks, so that you cannot get in. If you stay down there at night, you will see nuns going in and out of these rooms that have been covered over. I'm not sure what the nuns did in this house, but there are many restless spirits here. I also believe this place draws mentally unstable people to it. While we lived there, on multiple occasions, we had to call the police because people would break into the property, knocking at our door, telling us the spirits told them to come here. There are so many stories I could tell you, but it's a very unusual place after a while. My god sister and I would sleep in the game room next to our parents room because we were too scared to stay in our room. That's about all I'm willing to share for now, but I hope you enjoyed these stories. I know that most high schools claim to be haunted, but my old alma mater has everything from restless Indian spirits, students that died on campus as well as the spirits of some priest that passed away at the campus. Its name is Bishop Almy High School. It's located immediately next to the San Fernando Mission, San Fernando Mission Cemetery, and is directly across the street from Eden Memorial Park, a cemetery for Jewish believers. To make this easier, I will list the different stories I've heard and my own limited encounters. 1. Our school's built on what used to be an old orange grove. It was also used as a burial ground for Native Americans who built the mission. Several different faculty members have heard the sounds of an old woman crying right inside our alumni hall, and one claiming to have seen her pacing back and forth. I myself went there late with three friends one night in an attempt to see if we could prove anything for ourselves. We heard the same crying noises and saw a brief glimpse of a black silhouette through the all glass walls of the building. Other faculty members have claimed to see an Indian chief in full ceremonial garb near the school's chapel and the hallways behind it. Three. Members of the water pole, swimming team, and marching band have heard a young boy crying from the old archives located underneath the buildings on the west side of campus. The water polo and swimming teams used to use the old showers that were built for the priests when the school was a seminary and the band used to store its equipment in spare rooms down there. One story of an eyewitness who saw the spirit is one of the creepiest our school has. A few of the girls on the swim team went down to the showers after practice and found all the shower heads on and a little boy standing in the middle of the room. The boy didn't respond to any attempts at conversation 
The girls left to get a coach to try and get the boy the talk. When they got back, all of the shower heads were off, and the boy was nowhere to be found. This part of the school is directly next to the graveyard. Only a chain link fence separates the two properties. Our pool is technically rented space from the graveyard. In the new school archives, located on the second floor of the building over the old archives, there have been reported sightings of a priest in his uniform, reading or filing books. This same hallway, nicknamed the Forbidden Hallway by students, because it has all the permanent records in school's computer's mainframes and is off limits to any student without permission, was once the dorm rooms for the young priests in training when the site still served at the cemetery. A lot of men of God passed on at this location. Five. The hallway behind the school's chapel has had several sightings. The Indian chief, the little boy, and shadowy silhouette have all been seen here. The boys' bathroom is a hot spot for strange happenings, late at night. I would be there late for extracurriculars or what have you, and one night when I was there, the door to this bathroom closed and opened twice. No one else was there to do this, trying to test the spirit. I said, is someone here? And the stall door I was in flung open. It didn't feel like a bad spirit but it was definitely wanting to make itself known. There are plenty of other stories at the school from all different sources. Those are just the ones I've heard the most in my own little two encounters. I really hope this haunting hotspot gets a slot on this website, because I don't think spirits are going anywhere. Yes, great website. When I was a little girl about four or five years old, I remember this clearly as if it happened yesterday. I did something bad to be sent to my room as a punishment. I was laying in bed, not sleeping mind you, just laying there, looking up the ceiling. As you may have guessed, I was bored out of my skull. Anyway, a few moments later, I looked at the head of my bed and saw two white heads, round shaped with red eyes, no teeth or any body for that matter. They just kept staring at me. I screamed as loud as I could and my mother came running into the room. As soon as she did, the image or ghostly figure or whatever it was had vanished. This house that this happened in was known to be haunted. I'm not sure by what. I asked my mother years afterwards if she had any odd experience in that house. After I told her what happened, she said yeah. When she was down in the basement doing laundry, she heard someone call her name. No one was in the house at the time. I'm not sure where I was or my brother were at the time, but I know we didn't call her. We call her mommy, not by her first name, as this thing did. She answered it. Now as I recall, if something unknown calls out your name and you answer it, isn't that an invite? This house is located in Vermont on West Road in Burlington. I forget the number of the house. My mother said I was a gifted child, gifted, meaning able to sense things as well as sometimes able to predict the future, which I've had in the past. It's not something that happens to me all of the time. Just once in a blue moon, I'd get visions in my dreams that had come as warning signs. For example, my brother was going on spring break during the days of his high school years, driving his Jeep over to coastal beaches in Florida. I recall having a dream of him doing this, and his jeep caught fire while he was driving down the road. 
odd how this dream came about. I told my brother not to go. He thought I was crazy, of course, and he didn't believe in that sort of thing, nor does my husband. Anyway, my brother called me up one day and said that his Jeep caught fire. He had a flat tire and parked on the side of the road. He wasn't going to spring break. He was just heading over to a friend's house when this happened. Come to find out, some punk started the fire to his Jeep. In 1977, my friend and I were driving on Old Pleasanton Road during the night. We were heading south when we came upon a woman wearing a black wedding dress. All she was doing was standing there, not moving an inch. We decided to pull over to see if she needed assistance, but didn't go too close, in case it could have been an ambush. No response from the woman. We didn't see that she had a vehicle anywhere around. It was beyond sketch, so we ended up not helping the woman out and continued to drive down the road. As we were driving down the road, we could have sworn we saw the lady through my rear view mirror. She was following us. The only difference was, she was not walking. She was floating towards us. This was after we had driven a mile from where we originally saw her, and there was no way she could have caught up with us in time. Within seconds, the lady disappeared and she was nowhere in sight. We had to stop the car on the side of the road to gather ourselves, because it almost felt like something out of a movie. When I got home, I told my grandma what happened to us, and she was stunned just like I was. A week after this incident, around the same time period, I received a phone call that my friend was found murdered with a knife through his heart, at the same location where we spotted the lady a week ago. My grandma told me that it could have been death coming for him. I still tremble at the thought of reliving all that happened in that dark night in 1977. Great Aunt Amy lived in a small two-room shack in the middle of a very remote wooded area in northern Michigan, next to her brother and his wife. I remember her writing to me in the mid-60s and telling me they had a road name and a sign now. My younger sister and I loved going there to visit. We would walk in the woods and explore an old cabin and trailer in the woods north of them. They lived very primitively an outhouse with magazines for toilet paper, and slaughtered their own pigs and cows. There was a great green apple tree down the road, and we always stopped to get our pickings before heading home. One time, we heard a weird noise, and my mother told us to hurry up and get in the car. We had to get going. It was a bear calling for a cub, and we were downwind. Mom feared we may have been between the mother bear and her cub. Whenever we went to visit, we went to see the uncle and his wife first, then great aunt Amy. Although we would see her peering over the tiered kitchen curtain when we arrived, great aunt Amy was very short and stout, and you could just see the top of her head from the eyes up over the lower curtain and I'm sure she was on her tiptoes at that, but she was always so surprised to see us, and just happened to have cookies or rolls just out of the oven. The day of her funeral, the late 1970s, my sister Kathy and I got out of the back seat of the car on opposite sides. I looked at Great Aunt Amy's cabin, and then looked over the top of the car at my sister. I knew she saw her too. Great Aunt Amy's little head, eyes peering up over the curtain, as she always did when we came to visit. 
I could almost smell those rolls baking that she just happened to be making. Recently, my sister and I took a random trip to the area and went by to see the little old cabin again. But this time, it was gone. A new home stood just to the east of its location. I was very disappointed. My sister turned to me and said that's alright. She's still there. Can you feel her? I could. My father remarried three years ago, and when we moved into his wife's house, I began experiencing paranormal things. I've experienced things ever since I was a child. My mom and siblings were always sensitive to the paranormal. My siblings were pretty used to it, but I'd never seen anything significant until we moved into our new home. It started slowly. I couldn't sleep well at night and had been hearing bangs. I dismissed it all at first as being in new surroundings, but it continued. My sister moved in and we began sharing stories about things we had heard in the house. They were matching up pretty well. One night I was laying in bed and I heard hand slams against my window and slide down it. I freaked out because my window had a screen on it. So I went into my sister's room to sleep with her and kept hearing banging from my room. There was no one in there. I slept in my sister's room a couple of times before I could sleep in my room again. I began seeing black masses for brief moments after a while and my sister had one in her room that was about eight feet tall and human shaped. We began doing all that we knew, which was praying. After a few years of this, I got a little used to it, but couldn't wander the halls at night without being terrified. One night, I was playing on the computer and heard a very loud bang like a door slamming, so I went to my room. I shut my door and leaned against it and heard running up and down the hallway. Things like this began happening on a regular basis. And at the time, I felt like my sister was the only one I could talk to. Then one day, something on a different level happened. I was in bed at night, and I had a bunch of glass carousels on my dresser. I'm a firm believer in 3am being the witching hour, and at that time, all my carousels went off playing music, and a couple fell off the dresser. Once again, I played and slept with the lights on. I had one final major experience before I moved out. My dad's room stayed locked during the day, so when we heard scratching on the walls, it sounded like something was scratching the walls and the ceiling. I ran to the bedroom door and it stopped, but could see a shadow moving around under the door. The scratching then continued, so I went outside. I moved and don't experience things like that anymore, but sometimes hear noises in my apartment. I just ignore it because I know my family and I are skeptical to these kinds of things. Just keep my faith and know that I know it's human in my apartment, my dad's house, I'm not so sure. This happened to my mother's uncle in the 50s. Her aunt and uncle were coming back to San Antonio, Texas on Highway 87 when their car broke down during the night. Uncle Steve went walking during the midnight hour to get help before he told my aunt to lock all the doors. She did just that. About 3 a.m., three men in a car stopped to help her. They told her that they would help her, but she told them that her husband had gone to get help and he might be coming back. So, the men told her that they will leave 
and they were going to leave her some food in a brown paper bag, which they left on the hood of her car. Hours after she thought about the food in the bag, but she was too scared to get out of the car. Soon, a highway trooper arrived. She told them that her car broke, and her husband had gone, and never returned. The trooper asked her if she had seen a few gentlemen in a 57 Chevy. She told him about the three men that stopped, and before he left, he asked her about the bag on the hood of the car. She told him that the men left her some food, in case she would get hungry. The officer grabbed the bag and peeked in it, and out of the bag, her husband's head came out. She has not been the same ever since then. I live in a small town in Kansas. I've lived in several houses in this town, and in just about each house have had strange experiences. The first I can recall was in a small farmhouse in the country. My sister and I shared a room and had bunk beds. The head of the bed was the opposite of how most people would set a room up. The head of the bed was by the window and the foot of the bed was flush to the wall. I was in the bottom bunk and my sister in the top bunk. I recall waking up one night and looking out the window to the shed that was across from me. In the top window, the second floor, I noticed a black human figure, no discernible facial features. It had a pale yellow light glowing around it just purely out of fear and not wanting to experience this alone, I asked my sister, who was supposedly asleep on the top bunk, if she was seeing what I was seeing, not expecting to hear her to really answer me, and she said yes. We still joke about our psychic connection. When I was in high school and living in a small town as I do, my friends and I would drive around the countryside mostly because we heard that there was some scary haunted place outside of town and we always liked to investigate but one night i was sitting in the front seat of my friend's car and noticed that there was a small boy running in the road ahead of us it was rather late at night at least sometime after midnight a very strange hour for young boys to be running out in the country I noticed that he had on a red and green striped shirt and brown pants. What was really creepy though was the way he just kept looking back at us, almost begging to be hit. I could only see this boy at the middle point of the curve in the road. Just as we were rounding the last corner, he would disappear. It would only last several seconds. I questioned whether or not I was losing my mind, or if I really saw it, because no one else did. Another story I have was when I bought the house I live in now, still the same town. I'd fallen asleep on the floor in my living room. My dog was sleeping next to me. I'm not even sure what exactly woke me up, but when I looked towards my bedroom, I could see a small girl in a white nightgown. She had blonde hair, and next to her was a white cat. I could see through them. They had a mist around them. And again, just as it registered what I was seeing, they vanished. A few months later, I was in my room, standing on the edge of my bed, which is right next to the bedroom door. I was reaching for the light fixture to change a light bulb, with my arms extended. I noticed a man, dark short hair, and in his thirties, he had dark rimmed glasses, and he walked past me through the living room, into my room. As soon as he got past my arm, so he would be standing right in front of me, he disappeared. I've also noticed small dark figures, a possible dog like roaming around me when I was walking in my house at night. 
I always tried to jump over them, thinking that it was my dog, but she was in another room when this happened. In 1978, my parents purchased a relatively new house in Niceville, Florida. The land the house had been built on had previously been a swamp that was drained to make way for the housing subdivision. Nothing bad had ever happened in the house, yet, after living in the house for a short time, we all began to notice odd things. It started the night I broke up with my fiancé. My parents had got out for the evening, and I was in my bedroom crying. Suddenly, I realized I was not alone. I looked up, and I saw a woman dressed in the turn of the century clothing. She had a look of extreme empathy on her face. I did a double take. Never take your eyes off of them, I've learned, and my visitor was gone. My brother brought her engagement ring into my room so that I could take it to work the next day and have it sized. When I woke up from my nap, I got the ring off the dresser and noticed that it wasn't quite right. I got on my lupe and discovered that the ring had been squashed. I took the ring to my parents and showed it to them. Dad examined the ring. As a scientist, he was a little more observant than I was. He pointed out that the ring appeared to have been squashed from the right beside the head that held the diamond, as if it had been sitting on the rear shank of the ring, and an incredible force put on it that literally broke the head from the shank without leaving a single scratch or gouge mark. That kind of spooked me since I had been sleeping with the ring on the nightstand next to my head, and it had been fine prior to being placed by my bed. However, events would soon unfold that made us all realize that the house was indeed haunted by the lady, but she was a friendly ghost, provided you were nice to her family. After having moved to the house, my mom was in a terrible car accident, which almost killed her. She was in the hospital for over six weeks, and even after she got out, she was in and out of the hospital repeatedly. By this time I was married and out of the house, but my middle sister's kids would stay over while my sister worked nights. My niece slept in my old room, which seemed to soon become the epicenter for activity perhaps because of the pre-adolescent age. It started with her being awakened by the feeling that someone was sitting on the bed. She turned on the light and saw depression in the bed, as if someone were sitting there. As she watched, the depression slowly lifted out, as if the person sitting there had stood up. She was too frightened to sleep in the room. After that, so her brother slept there for her. He was awakened every night by the sound of a dresser drawer being pulled out and rattled. At first he thought it was Granny, but then he turned the light on and there was no one there. The final straw for my sister's kids came when they were sleeping over one night. Mom had just been released from the hospital yet again and was sitting up in the den. Dad had gone to bed. Suddenly, Dad was awakened by the sound of the smoke alarms going off. He ran into the den and found Mom passed out. She had been in incredible pain since her accident and had begun stashing pills for a grand escape. That night, she had gotten so depressed that she ended up taking all the pills that she had been hoarding. There was no evidence of smoke in the house, not even mom's usual cigarette smoke. By this time, 
The smoke alarms had stopped blaring their alarms, but Dad stood there, surveying the scene and thinking about how much pain Mom was in and how horrible her life had been since the accident and even going as far as to whether it was even right for him to decide that Mom was not entitled to escape the horror her life had become. Then the smoke alarms went off again. Dad figured somebody was trying to tell him something, and he called 911. The next day after we had all been to the hospital to make sure that Mom was going to be okay, we all gathered at my parents' house. I asked Dad why he had called the paramedics. I felt like the doctors who had saved my mom's life after the accident had not taken into consideration the lack of quality of life she would have, and I felt like mom was entitled to a reprieve from the constant torment she was in. Dad looked at me kind of funny and explained about the smoke detectors. Then he said that when he had gotten home later that night, he had torn each of the smoke detectors apart, and there was nothing wrong with any of them, nor was there any reason they should have gone off in the first place. Once Dad told us this, we all sat there with odd looks on our faces and started talking about the lady. By this time, I had seen her twice. My older sister had seen her once, and my skeptical scientist dad even admitted to having seen her. We began comparing notes and found us finishing each other's stories and descriptions. We had all seen the same lady dressed in the same clothing, and none of us had mentioned it to the others for fear of being ridiculed. As time went by, the lady continued to watch over her family. After my dad's death in 1998, my then husband and I were in the den of the house after we had cleaned out the possessions and cleaned the house up. I'd left a book on the counter and X went back to get it. Our marriage was on the rocks and he was becoming increasingly abusive to me, something that the lady didn't seem to care for. He had always laughed at our family ghost stories, up till the day. But when he went back in the house to get my book, he came out of the house shaking and white. He had felt a cold hand brush across his face. Then, when he didn't leave fast enough, he felt the same cold hand pushing him in the back, propelling him to the door. The lady was trying to tell him that. She did not appreciate the way she was treating one of her kids, nor was he welcome in her home. After that, the lady began dropping by my house. I always knew she was around because the stove timer would go off for no reason and the dresser drawers would rattle. After I left the abusive hobby and moved to the Midwest, the lady would come by and visit me there from time to time, always setting off the timer on the stove, rattling drawers, playing tricks with the blinds, anything she could do to let me know she was keeping an eye out for me. I realized that this is unusual for ghosts to leave their primary residence and to actually follow people from home to home, but I talked to some friends who all felt like the lady was probably a female ancestor who had died in childbirth, so she felt responsible for looking out for her family. After going through the family archives, we found a photo of my great-grandmother. She had died of appendicitis when she was pregnant. The baby also died. The woman in the photo looked like the lady. My sister is now living in the house. When she first moved in, she put some pots in the cabinet, then went to the bathroom for a minute. When she came back out, the pots were sitting on the floor. Earrings and rings that had been lost for years, some in different houses that we lived in, suddenly appeared on the cabinet or in my sister's jewelry box. 
Unseen hands frequently pull back the curtains to look outside. And my sister's dog loves to romp and play with the unseen visitor. I could go on and on about all the poltergeist activity. Some that seemed to be coming from the lady. Others that seemed to be coming from my deceased dad. From fax machines that go off when they aren't plugged in. My deceased dad's voice calling me to wake me up when the gas fireplace developed a leak. Even luggage being set on its end. Weird stuff just follows my sister and I around. Just two nights ago, while laying in bed, I was awakened by the bed shaking. I sat up and looked around and found my husband sound asleep and the door securely closed against kitty visitors. I laid back down and snuggled up to my hobby, thinking that he just had a chronic jerk that shook the bed when it suddenly hit again. The whole bed kind of went whop as if a 20 pound weight had been dropped on it. This time, I knew that there were no cats in the room and since I had been snuggled up to my hobby, I knew he had not jerked in his sleep. It's nice having your own guardian spirit to watch over you, but it can really interfere with your sleeping. I know that some people think that we're all nuts, or engaging in what shrinks call magical thinking, but every time I start to question my own sanity, I get another visit. It should be interesting when we move to my dad's hometown this spring. I imagine the visits will become a regular thing. Growing up in rural northern Wisconsin, there were few opportunities for earning cash, aside from service positions and agricultural work. Coming from a farm family myself, as a youth, I would hire myself out to farmers to help with the work on their respective farms, mostly crops and dairy cattle. If you never have this experience, it may come as a surprise that these farms are usually isolated and could be quite unfriendly, creepy, and sometimes dangerous. Physical injuries like losing an eye or a limb or even a life were not uncommon. This is the setting for my story. One January, I was a hired boy at a dairy farm owned by an elderly couple with whom I was acquainted with through a parish church. The farmer's house was heated by a wood furnace in the basement where I was lodged and among my other jobs. I had to bring in the wood and tend the fire. One day, while carrying wood down the steps, I felt pushed, which caused me to slip and fall down the stairs, landing on the concrete floor, which knocked me out temporarily. I must have been out only a minute or two, as I awoke in pain and found the wood scattered all over. The farmer was very stern, and I feared how you would react to a mess and me not being busy with the work to which I had been assigned. When he did see me, he asked where I'd been and what I'd been doing, and so I explained it to him. As I suspected, he was cross with me. Later that night, over supper, he told me a story which made me rethink my staying there. He related that some time ago, his wife, Although a Catholic like me had been dabbling in the occult, things like divination, astrology, cards, etc. Odd things began happening around the farm, and it was no longer prospering. He told me that the last straw had been when he awoke to find her levitating above their bed in the middle of the night. They decided to call the parish priest. The priest whom I will call Father X in this story was a mature, spiritual, and virtuous man whom I knew and respected. 
His brother was likewise a priest and an exorcist. The couple explained what was happening on their farm and house. Father X had to get rid of the occult books and the paraphernalia. And after hearing their confession and absolving them, offered to bless and cleanse the house with a kind of minor exorcism. Before getting out his handbook of rituals and his stolen holy water, he had them close and lock the doors and windows for some reason. He went through the residence, leading the couple in prayers and reciting the house blessing and minor prayers of exorcism. All the while, sprinkling each room with holy water. When they reached the last room, which was the kitchen, Father X was finishing the prayers, and after everyone said Amen, the kitchen door, which led outside, unlocked by itself, opened and then slammed shut. Father X then explained that this is why he had locked the doors previously to make sure that by the door opening and closing by invisible force, he could tell by that sign that the spirit had really left. The farmer went on to explain that he liked the instruction that Father X had left him with, namely, that the devil is like a dog on a leash. The demons are all restrained by the power of God, he said, chained, as it were, and they cannot really hurt you directly unless you come within their reach. Occult practices, blasphemies, and even grave sins can put people in places within the perimeter of the influence of evil spirits, and so if you want to avoid being harmed by them, don't come near them any more than you would approach a vicious dog that has been chained. I asked the farmer if the basin where I was lodging was also blessed. The farmer thought for a moment and said he did not recall that it was. The door to the basement was right outside of the kitchen door. After the experience with my fall that day, and the story that the farmer told me about what had transpired, I determined that I would not stay there another week. I left and didn't return. I didn't explain why except to say that I wanted to be closer to the parish church and I wanted to go to daily mass. I did not have my own transportation at that time, except my bicycle. The farmer was unhappy that I left, as I was hardworking and well behaved, but for me, there were plenty of other farms where I could work that did not have such problems. Throughout my life, I had seen and experienced a few things that I can only describe as supernatural. Everything I'm about to tell you about actually happened, and I will describe each experience as I remember them. The first thing I can remember happened whenever I was only a young boy, growing up outside a village in Northern Ireland called Besbrook. It was during the winter because we had a heavy snowfall the previous night, and I was outside playing with my two brothers. After a while, I went inside to warm up because my hands were frozen. My mother told me to take off my boots so that I wouldn't tramp snow all over the house. I sat down at the table with a bowl of soup in front of me, and it was then that I noticed something out of the corner of my eye in the hall leading from the kitchen to the living room. I turned to see what it was, and what I saw absolutely terrified me. I saw the figure of a woman walking down the hall towards the kitchen. I just got up and ran out the door without putting on my boots and jacket into the snow and refused to come back inside, even though my mother insisted that there was no woman in the house. Over the next number of years, nothing happened except what sounded like somebody walking around the house, even when the rest of the household was in bed or away. Everyone heard the noises 
but chose to ignore them. Then one Saturday morning while I was still in bed, I was shooken awake and told to get up and come down to breakfast. Whenever I opened my eyes, there was no one in the room, so I assumed that they had already gone downstairs. While I was getting dressed, a voice was calling from downstairs for me to hurry up. When I did get down to the kitchen, there was no one around. Everyone else was still in bed. A few days after, my youngest brother claims to have saw a young boy standing in my parents' bedroom who just stood there looking at him. Shortly after this, someone unknown tacked my brother in his bed, leaving him with a black eye. The next few years were quiet except for the noises. Nothing else that I know of has happened in that house except for the noises, but I did tell you that I lived outside a village. The best way to get to the village is through a wooded area, and this place is a very strange place. I could distinctly remember a moment when I had to walk through these woods to get to the village, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I saw a circle of people in white robes just standing in a circle and holding hands. I was so scared about what was happening that I ran the other direction and no longer wanted to run through those woods ever again. I actually had a friend of mine who was walking through the woods and he swears to this day that he saw a woman just flying from the distance from one side to the other looked like a witch, but she was floating, had really dark black hair, and it just looked like she faded out. These are the only things I've seen in my life, and with that last story, my friend has seen, but I've heard other stories by people I know. The shop at the bottom of the road is said to be haunted by the ghosts of the seven British people killed there in the 80s whenever the original patrol station was blown up. I mentioned earlier, I'm from Northern Ireland. There is a high viaduct in the area, which is used as a railway line. 18 people died constructing it, one for each arch, and numerous others have off themselves off of it. The stories are that at times, you can see these people and they all look sad. There is also the blood on one wall in a friend's house, and no matter how many times it is painted over, the blood still comes through. All this is true, and has happened within a square mile of where I live. My friend from Arizona and I made our first trip to the Queen Mary together. We happened to run into a paranormal researcher when we were on a tour and decided to stay the night. We rented a room with two beds so the researcher could stay with us and show us around the old boat in the middle of the night when the most activity had been reported. We attempted to fall asleep around 11 p.m. I managed to sleep quite easily and wasn't scared about sleeping in one of the reported haunted rooms. About five minutes after I fell asleep, my friend wakes me up. The first thing I remember was hearing a staticky voice and thought it was a radio. It wasn't until she asked me if I heard the voice. That was when I realized there was no radio anywhere in my room. My instant reaction was to turn on the light and look around the room. I reached up and tried turning on the light and nothing happened. We were really freaking out now. The light had just been on. My friend finally turned her light on and we laid there in bed for a few more minutes and I decided to try the light again and this time it turned on no problem. We tried to fall asleep again because we wanted to wander around the ship at 3am to avoid security guards. 
As soon as we turn off the lights and lay down, I saw my blanket pushed down and felt something on my arm. My friend also reported feeling things brush against her arm. As tired as we were, we just decided to ignore it all and go to sleep. Three o'clock rolled around and we went to the pool room. Reported to be the most paranormally active area on board. We took several pictures and the researcher and my friend called out to the known ghosts. I didn't want to because I really felt like I was intruding. I felt sad and angry feelings throughout the whole area. I was looking around when we all heard a man moaning. My friend and I booked it back up the stairs and stood against the wall. After a few minutes, we joined the researcher again and he continued to call out to a little girl named Jackie. I wasn't paying attention at the time, but I heard my friend gasp and I looked over and she asked me if I heard that. I missed it. The researcher heard it too. It was the voice of the little girl. She was singing for them. I will never forget my experiences at the Queen Mary and actually plan on going back soon. I came aboard not believing and left a member of a paranormal research group. My girlfriend Liz and I haven't been together for very long, but we share a passion for ghosts and hauntings. On our second date, we went to a couple sites in our county that are supposed to be haunted. The scariest one has to be the Jericho Covered Bridge, located in either Falston or Jarrettsville, depending on who you ask. As Liz and I drove up to the bridge, a heavy fog rolled in, almost like the ones you see in the old movies, set in places like London. This was weird, because Liz and I have been driving around the county for the last two hours, and we had only encountered fog in this one place. Maryland was a neutral state during the Civil War, but racism ran deep here. The Jericho Covered Bridge is a grim reminder of that. It is a well-known local legend that runaway slaves were hung from the rafters of the bridge and sometimes left there for days. As we drove over the bridge, we both felt a chill and a sense of terror in the air. Like the bridge had been in fact the scene of unspeakable horror. Neither one of us really wanted to leave the safety of the vehicle to take the pictures we were so willing to take just a few minutes prior. Eventually though, we did take the pictures, and when we got them developed, we found only two pictures had turned out. In the first one, you can see some kind of disturbance in the air towards the rafters, and in the second one, we can definitely see an orb in the area where just a minute before the unidentified disturbance had manifested itself. A couple of months ago, I was living in a house with similar history as the Hanging Bridge. It was a super old Victorian style home, very big, wide and spacious, multiple rooms. A few things happened that I thought was very spooky. The first incident happened when I was sleeping with my girlfriend in bed. In one of the rooms upstairs, we had an old music box that was in the dining room. It came with the house. I was awoken by the sounds of the music box playing by itself and could see that the door was slightly opened. Needing answers, I hopped out of bed to investigate, not understanding how the music box could play by itself. Needless to say, I made a gigantic mistake. As I opened the door and faced the stairs, I saw a dark shadow move directly up the stairs and then disappear. I froze for a second, almost chickened out, but decided to go downstairs anyway. To my surprise, there was nothing there and all was silent. The music box had stopped playing. Another time, 
I was standing in the kitchen with one of my friends, and we were the only two people in the house at this time. We decided to use a spirit box and play with the Ouija board to conduct a session. I was fairly convinced that there was a spirit that needed guidance and was lost. We asked the spirit box multiple questions, but at first, no response was given to us. After nearly an hour, being frustrated, we nearly gave up. That was until we asked the spirit to give us a sign that they were still there. My back started to hurt, like some kind of pressure was being applied to it. I said to the ghost, is that you on my back? Now get this, the spirit box sounded like it said death on the bridge. This immediately startled us, knowing that down the road was the hanging bridge. We tried asking it follow up questions after that, but the spirit didn't say anything. And just like that, the pressure on my back disappeared. I was starting to think that the ghost was trying to tell us that they were one of the ghosts that tragically passed on the bridge. The last incident happened in the kitchen. The kitchen door was slightly opened, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a girl's whisper in my ear. As I looked towards the door, I saw a lady, I think, who walked past the door. At first I thought it was my friend Laura, who always used to wear jeans. So, I popped my head around the corner to try and scare her, but there was no one there. I wasn't scared, because it was in the middle of the day. I actually found the experience quite exciting, but also unexplainable. To this day, I've always thought these incidents were all related to the hanging bridge. The Job Corps in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was a student there in 1973. Since then, there has been a lot of renovation on the buildings, but when I was attending the Job Corps, it was pretty much the same as it was when it was an orphanage. One night actually at 2am in the morning, when I came back to the dorms after babysitting, I had to walk across the campus to get to my room at the far end of the campus. While walking down to my room, all was very quiet in the dorms. Out of nowhere, I hear what sounded like children laughter in the distance. It was very faint, but I could definitely hear something. Yet, through the faintness of the sound, you could still hear shouts of glee and anger as little children would do on a playground, if that makes sense. This happened behind the little chapel that was there, but the sounds came right there from behind the old chapel. And while I looked and squinted, I didn't see anybody there. I thought to myself at the time, why would parents allow their children to play so late outside? It was cold and it was dark. Meanwhile, my hair was standing on end and I tested the wind to see if the noise was carried from another place. Noises can carry long distances. There was no wind at all. At the time, I didn't know that the job corps used to be an orphanage until the next morning, when I was talking to my friend about hearing those children. This service worker told me that she used to work there as a service worker for the orphanage. She told me the voices I heard were probably the little children that died of broken hearts while she had worked there. Her face went pale as she told me that the children she thought were treated cruelly. There are two versions of this legend that I know. It's called the Devil's Footprint. The first is about a construction worker that was aggravated with a boulder that would not budge. The man stepped on the boulder and said, I will give my soul to the devil, this boulder will move. By the next day, the boulder had moved and there was an imprint of a human foot and a hoof print of the devil. 
the man was never seen again. The other version is about a farmer that was having a terrible harvest. He then said, I will give my soul to the devil if I had a bountiful harvest. Indeed, the farmer's harvest was bountiful, and he made plenty of money. The farmer was quite pleased with himself until the day the devil came to collect. The farmer refused to give the devil what he wanted, and a chase ensued. They ran all around the farmer's land, and the chase ended when they reached a cliff. I believe the footprints happened when they had their final fight at that cliff edge. I've heard many stories about the devil's footprint being haunted. My fiancé told me about a occurrence that happened when he was there with his brothers when he was about 13. He said that his brother was contacted by a ghost, according to him, and his brother swears to this very day. He was standing in front of the church doors, and being a rebellious young man that he was, he attempted to kick the doors open. At the moment his foot hit the door, it swung open and knocked him off the steps. Now, you may be thinking, that there was probably someone on the other side of the door playing a prank. But keep this in mind, the doors open inward, not outward. I also know someone that was there very late at night, and she swears that she saw hooded men walking in the edge of the woods. I myself had an experience of sorts. One night, a friend and I decided to go find the place. We drove and drove, and we couldn't find it. When my friend was so sure she had driven too far, she turned back. We figured we'd better wait until daylight to look for it, so we turned on the road that we thought would take us home. And what did we see? The old cemetery, and that unmistakable white church. Of course, we freaked out. My friend swerved and barely escaped going off the road. By this time, we were both feeling a little unsettling feeling in our chests. Now whether this was due to some unwelcome presence or fear, I'm not certain. I'm assuming the latter. However, needless to say, we didn't stop there that night. My name is Bobby and I was checking out your website, and I decided I should send in my own story. We live in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. This event happened on Monday, August 15th, 2005. One day, my brother named Vince was on the computer at about 4 o'clock when he heard a scream. He ran upstairs to find me and my older brother named Sam. Vince asked what was wrong, and we asked him what he was talking about, and he said he heard a woman scream, and we said nobody screamed. We were also the only ones in the house. We got scared, but eventually thought that Vince was probably hearing things, and forgot about it. But a week later, me and Sam saw this website, and decided to check if something was haunting our house. We checked everywhere, but found nothing. But just as we were about to give up, Sam said to me that we never checked the attic. This was the first time that anyone was up there in the attic in a very long time. We got to the attic door and opened up the hatch, and a ladder came unfolded from the top of the door. We started climbing up the ladder and got to the attic, and it was all dark. I felt the wall right behind me and found a light switch. I flipped the switch and a dim light turned on. There was this old rocking chair rocking back and forth, the one that my grandmother used to have before she died. We totally forgot that we had gotten it and threw it up in the attic. Either way, we were freaked out. After about two seconds, we heard a scream so loud that it knocked me backward against Sam. We climbed as fast as we could down the ladder and shut the attic door. 
We were so scared that we didn't tell anyone except Vince about what happened. We checked the time and it was exactly 4.06. We now know that Vince heard the scream from the attic a week earlier. All we know about the people that lived here before us is that they were the Andersons and that they were an old couple that lived here and raised their kids here. I don't think it was my grandma's spirit because she was always a gentle soul and wouldn't scare us like that. Anyway, after all the kids moved out and Miss Anderson died, a short while after that, he sold his house to us about four years ago. I believe Miss Anderson was the one who screamed. I guess she was mad that we stole her house from her. When I was a freshman in high school, my parents moved us from the city in central New York to a big, empty house in the country. Little did we know that the house is haunted. So many things happened there that even my skeptical dad began to believe that we were sharing the house with someone or something else. My best ghost encounter occurred in the middle of the day. I walked into the bathroom and saw from the corner of my eye someone that I thought was my youngest sister. I said, hey, Lori, but she didn't answer me. Annoyed, I turned to find out what her problem was, only to realize that it wasn't her at the sink. An old woman with gray hair up in a bun, a pink flower dress, and a white apron was drying her hands. She turned to look at me, and then she disappeared. We weren't often frightened of the ghosts and missed them when things seemed to be quiet for too long. We would lament that they didn't like us anymore. One day, I was in the house, and I went into the shower. All of a sudden, there was a huge noise. I thought a plane hit the house, or at least there was a terrible car accident outside. I jumped out, grabbed my rope, and went to investigate. I found nothing out of order at all, so I got back into the shower. Not two minutes later, I heard that huge noise again. I jumped out, shaking this time, and checked everywhere, but again, there was nothing to find. I decided to skip my shower. I had a ghostly nightmare about this house before even moving in. My family moved into the house, and from day one, things were creepy. People before had moved out in a hurry, and their family broke apart almost instantly in four months. They all spread to four different places. When we moved in, we all got terribly sick within the first month. My mom had a life-threatening experience. My sister ran away. All the pets in the house died mysteriously with no known cause of death. My parents divorced. All of this happened in only four months. I walked into the house after school one day and I heard my name being called. I knew no one was home because none of the cars were in the driveway. The voice calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, and I looked all around for her, even though I knew that she was presently in the hospital. Within the next few days, in a few more creepy paranormal events, all four of us left in just as much of a hurry as the one before us, leaving most of our personal belongings. We all split, each of us in a different car, to different places away from each other and away from the house. I will never go back to see it, nor would I wish the haunting of the house on anyone else. Hello, I lived at this house from 97 to 99. It was in Atlanta. My family and many of my friends were witnesses to the occurrences, voices, electronics malfunctioning, dark figures. It happened day and night, but mostly at night. 
It is an older white home near the river, and for a while, we had a rat problem. The plumbers had left a hole under the bathroom sink. The rats, who were fond of shiny objects, left two human molars, complete with silver fillings, on the bathroom floor on two separate occasions. The back of the home had a foul odor off and on, and the crawl space had been cemented over. I'm an investigator for the state, not a hysteric. But the place made a believer out of me, my family, and half a dozen friends. My then four-year-old son complained of the man in the mirror with a string around his neck. Voices were male and female, also a small child. I have often felt the crawl space needed to be examined, just never could figure out a way to ask the officials to do such. I truly think that there is a body or bodies under that house. Myself and a girlfriend watched as a man-shaped shadow moved across the dining room wall into the kitchen where the light turned on. Well, we're checking out if you can get the new owner's permission. So when I was about 17, my family had just moved back to Canada from living in the USA. It was a bit sudden, and being a family of six, it was a little bit of a scramble to find a place to house all of us before the snow hit. So my mom and dad decided to live in an old house that my grandpa had on his property just for the duration of the approaching winter ahead. The house was my great uncle's, and my grandpa skidded from my brother's property to his place. Now my grandpa has two quarter sections, and this house is tucked way back away from the main house, so the powers ran from the main house, and with it being so far away, there is no running water. This house is old, so to add to the running water, there also is in heat, only a wood stove just to give you an idea of where we were living in. Me, being a 17 year old, I often stayed in town and didn't stay there very often. I specifically remember the first time it happened. I was in my bed. I was the only one who would stay downstairs with the wood stove. Everyone wanted to sleep upstairs since it was warmer. So I was just starting to fall asleep and I started to feel the room get really heavy. I remember the feeling of not being alone. The doorway didn't have a door on it. It only had a beaded curtain, and I could feel it standing there. I then remember having the feeling of total fear rush over me and frozen to my core with it. Then, it moved closer, and I felt the bed move, and someone crawl right beside me. Not in a way that was super noticeable, but in a sneaky, slow, sloth-moving type of way. I specifically remember wanting to vomit with fear. Then, I felt it. The feeling of an unshaven face rub against mine. I scrambled out of bed, holding my blanket, and ran up the stairs to my parents' room. I was so out of my mind with fear that I couldn't even scream. I slept on the floor with my dad's side of the bed. The next morning, mom was wondering why her 17-year-old daughter was curled up at the foot of her bed, and I told her what happened. Later that morning, we walked over to my grandpa's house to have breakfast and go chat. My mom brought up my wild story. My grandpa and grandma silently listened as my mom was laughing at the last bit of the story, my grandparents got really serious and turned to each other. Apparently, this has been an issue in the old house and they didn't want to tell us, hoping we didn't acknowledge it, then it wouldn't bother us. I can honestly say it didn't feel angry or upset, it just wanted to cuddle. I didn't stay there much after that. I moved in with a cousin in town. 
Ghost stories are the most popular types of stories to talk about in the curious world that we live in. Some of us are skeptics, while others truly believe that the supernatural world is real. I truly believe that entities are real, and this is a true story involving my cousin. He didn't see a ghost, but he felt their presence and is now fully convinced that we are visited by spirits, even though this event happened years ago, and at the time, he was truly skeptical. My cousin is a doctor, and he lives in the USA. A few years ago, he went out of the United States to Vietnam on business. He ended up visiting Hanoi, Vietnam, which is Vietnam's capital city, and stayed in a hotel with his wife at the time. Immediately after entering the hotel, they were both surprised to see a woman sprinting out of her hotel room and screaming bloody murder. It was such a shock to us at the time, it immediately gave them bad vibes about the property. Nobody knew what happened to her. And for a while, she refused to speak to any of the staff about why she felt so horrified or what happened. She looked sickly and pale, as if she had just seen something grisly. She was breathing heavily and hyperventilating. My cousin, out of curiosity, came up to the front desk and asked what happened. The staff said they weren't sure exactly what had happened, but my cousin mentioned that he was a doctor, and if they needed assistance, he would be happy to help. After a few minutes had passed, she collected herself. My cousin approached her and had a little chat. She swears that she wasn't just having a wild episode of hallucinations, and insisted what she witnessed was real. It was early morning, and the sun was barely starting to shine through the windows. The room was still dim, and the light was off. The woman had just woken up from her sleep, again, still dark, but light enough to see the room. The hotel room she was staying in was massive, and she was in the kitchen making tea. From the kitchen, you can see into the living room. That's when she saw a man standing right next to the bed. It was the ghost of former president, Nuko Dim Dam. He was president of South Vietnam in the early 1960s, who passed away in a very terrible way. She also said that the night before, she saw a former Vietnam soldier staring at her from the window during the evening. My cousin, being a practical person, kind of dismissed it and advised her to just go home, take some medicine, and relax the rest of the night. Even after she had just calmed down a little, it was obvious she was still visibly shaken by this whole ordeal. My cousin and wife didn't take the room. But there was another couple that checked into the same room. When my cousin woke, he went down to the hotel lobby and noticed just outside the main entrance was an ambulance and a stretcher pulling two bodies into it. He asked the front desk attendant what happened. They said that the couple that checked in mysteriously passed away in their sleep and nobody knew the cause. They suspected it was a heart attack. At this point, my cousin was starting to act a little apprehensive about staying the rest of the week there, but he continued to sleep at this hotel. His mind never let him believe that it was related to the last incident with the previous lady or tied to the paranormal. Until a couple nights later, all was silent. My cousin was a few doors down from the cursed room 
at the hotel. This is where it gets freaky. It was late at night, and my cousin was reading a Vietnamese book when the power started to go off and on. He looked out into the hallway to see if there was anything going on, and all seemed okay. He thought that maybe there was a problem with the electricity, so he called the front desk from his room. What he heard over the phone started to finally freak him out. He said that when he picked up the phone, all he could hear was heavy breathing and someone hung up. Concerned, my cousin rushed to the desk. A woman was standing right there. He asked her why she didn't say anything over the phone after he had called. The woman said that he didn't make a call. My cousin insisted that he did, that he heard heavy breathing, and that someone else was on the other line, but the woman refused to accept his story. He also said that the lights flickered, and the woman began to grow pale. She urged him to bless his room, because there is something evil, and it's disturbing the room. My cousin refused saying that it was just a coincidence. Finally, a few minutes later, his wife screams. My cousin rushes to the room and asks her what happened. She tells him that she was walking out of her room when she heard voices talking as if the chatter were coming from inside the hotel room where the couple had passed away. The doctor then demanded the staff open the room, but to their surprise, nobody was there. The staff even claimed that when they went into the room, the bathroom door was open and a dark shadow moved out of the bathroom and then disappeared. My cousin still dismissed everything. He said that things were just chaotic because of the first lady that stayed in the room and everyone was on edge because of the death of the couple in the same room. He admitted it still creeped him out, but chalked it up to merely a very scary coincidence. However, if it were a coincidence, then how can anyone explain what happened in that room? It seemed to be the only room having issues, aside from the one my cousin was staying in, where he heard the voice over the phone. Either way, this was a pretty insane experience, and I don't know how I would have reacted if I was the one who was there instead of my cousin. I don't remember the year that this happened, nor the age that I was. I still remember it though, as if it were yesterday. So. My aunt just got a new computer. She was never a technology ace or anything, so she had no idea how to get it started. When all else fails, call my mother. My mom was a whiz at computers, so my aunt asked her to come over and hook up the darn thing. My mother, being the lovely lady that she is, agreed to do it within the week. It was actually that weekend that she decided to do it. So, mom decides she wants to go over my aunt's house, kind of late for some reason. I was very young and couldn't stay by myself, so she took me along since calling a babysitter at the last minute would be very rude. We finally got there. I look up at the house, admiring its large size. I did think it looked pretty scary though. We struggled getting inside because my mom couldn't see the keys. As soon as we did get inside, I was frightened. All of the lights were off and nobody was there, or so I thought. My mom wanted to get started with her work since it was maybe 9 o'clock already. She told me to stay upstairs and watch TV while she was in the basement, hooking up the computer. 
After a while of whining and staying upstairs all alone in the large house, I totally agreed. My mother stayed with me for about five minutes, showing me how to work the TV. I begged and pleaded for her not to go, but it was her duty as a sister to fix the computer. She finally went downstairs, and I was left alone in the huge living room. I decided to turn on the cartoons, thinking it would cheer me up a little. I finally started to calm down and even laughed at the silliness of the cartoons. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the loud noises in the kitchen. Apparently, my mom didn't hear it, and to me, she was God, so anything she said went. After she said nothing, I proceeded to ignore the noise, but then it happened again. I ignored it. It happened again. I ignored it again. It happened once more. By that time, I was so annoyed at the noise because it was disturbing my cartoons. I was so mad, I forgot my rule about my mom, and I jumped up from the couch, turned around, and almost yelled, shut up. When I saw this mist in the kitchen, it seemed like it was in the shape of an elderly woman with a long white dress and long white hair. I was so shocked, I couldn't scream, so I ran as fast as my little legs could carry me downstairs into the basement and into my precious mother's arms. I didn't tell her what happened, as I was still in shock, awe, and amazement at the creature that had stood before me. I only explained about the noises, she said she was hearing little noises not loud noises, around where she was. I stayed down there with her because she said I could, especially when she saw my little white face. As I was sitting on the couch, playing with numerous toys that were scattered about, I heard a soft bark. Then I heard a whimper, and then another soft bark. I knew it was coming from the room that held the water tank and such. I thought about the dog, Oreo, it must have been him, but then I remembered he died about a couple months before. My aunt and uncle at the time owned no animals, not even a bird, and it was way too late for someone to let their dog out. Besides, I don't think I would have hurt a dog, as I don't believe anyone in the community even owned one. What frightened me the most was that poor little Oreo, a dog that had been banished to live outside for no reason and was never fed, died on the ground right above where I had heard the noise. I told my mom about this. She said that she heard nothing. I told her to hurry up with the computer, which she did because she was hearing things too. We both ran up the steps and out the door. After we looked, we ran to the car and got in. I was scared because the car was not starting up. Then all of a sudden, it did. I was so happy to be out of there. My cousin had heard noises such as the one I had heard in the kitchen, except they were outside of the room. Also, my other cousin claims that he heard a noise in the oven like something was in it. He opened the oven, and nothing was there, but he swears to this day, he did hear something. Now, I mentioned in the title of this story that this was a traveling ghost. I say this because most, if not all, of that family's houses have had some sort of scariness to them. My cousin's current residence is just as haunted. Doors will open and close by themselves. One time, we were watching a movie. It was over, and I wanted to turn the lights on. When I turned them on, I heard a strange buzzing sound in the laundry room. It sounded like when the dryer is done trying clothes, only it was a steady, non-pausing sound. I walked over to the doors 
and started to pull my ear up to make sure the sound was coming from that room. As I did so, all of the lights went off and the DVD player suddenly turned on much louder than we had it on. But the thing was, the DVD player had been turned off the whole time. When everything came on, I jumped five feet into the air onto my poor cousin, where I proceeded to scratch her neck, holding on for dear life. I don't remember ever watching a movie down there ever again. Later, we asked his mom if she was doing laundry. She asked why, and we told her about the sound. She said she didn't even think about doing a load of laundry. To this day, I'm still scared to stay over my cousin's house. When my sister and I were young, we lived in a newer duplex in California. It was a small place with only two bedrooms, so my sister and I had to share a room. We had our beds on opposite walls, but they both faced the hall. On one side to the hall was my parents' bedroom, on the other was the bathroom, and in the middle of the ceiling was a big square fluorescent light. I think that's where it lived. I can't exactly remember when it started. All I remember is waking up in the middle of the night and seeing what I remember as the electricity man. It seemed to come out of the light, which my parents left on to help us sleep. It looked like a person, but seemed to be made from the light. This happened several times over the next few years we lived in the duplex. I never told anyone about what happened until about 15 years later. My sister and I had come to visit my parents. We were all sitting in the living room talking about our childhood when my sister had asked if I would remembered anything strange about the duplex. I asked what she meant by strange. She asked if I had ever seen anyone in the wall. I then told her about my experience with the electric man. Turns out, she saw the same thing. This is an old story, but was shut on my mind for years and years. It was 1964-65. I was four or five years old. Our family, because of my mother's recurrent mental illness, bounced around from apartment to apartment, from shelter to shelter, with or without one or both of our parents in tow. There were four of us, but I do not recall if any of my siblings were with me when this happened. It might have been at a foster parent's house. I just don't know. I remember sitting on the side of a small cot in the waning light of a Chicago winter, there was an odd, really dark shadow on the wall to the left of me. It was the size of a small man, and I stared, and I stared in disbelief, because it had a hat on, and was in profile. The outline of the lips, the nose, the forehead was perfect. I was a pro at discerning what was real. And what was not real even at that age because of my mother's problem. And I tell you, I knew that what I was seeing was real, that I was not asleep, and that no shadow could have occurred that so accidentally duplicated the perfection of the human figure that I saw before my eyes. We stared at each other for a very long time, the figure never moving. I never told a soul as I didn't want to be thrown in a loony bin too. This is the first of many encounters of the years. My mother had the gift. My sister really has it, much more than I. About 18 years ago, I was in the Jacksonville Cemetery with my husband and three-year-old son. We were reading headstones. I believe it was in June 
or July, the sun was out and there was not a cloud in the sky. As we were walking through the headstones, we saw a woman walk through the trees. Both my husband and I saw her. We thought there was something odd about her, but couldn't figure out what exactly though. We were walking towards her, and she was probably about 80 yards away. She was walking away from us and stepped behind a tree. Then, we didn't see her again. I said to my husband, where did that woman go? He said, she stepped behind the tree. We continued to walk towards the spot where we saw her. All of a sudden, rain poured down on our heads. We both looked up into the blue sky and water continued to drench us. We ran back towards the car and it was like the rain just disappeared. We got back to our car and we were all soaking wet. The sky was still blue. We left right away. Hello. My name is Wanda. I've experienced a few things in my lifetime. This one recently, not scary or anything, but just strange. I lost a pet two years ago when he was still a puppy. Bernie got hit by a car and died all alone in the road while at my mother's care. I came home from work and we buried him. My brother and I loved him so much, I painted a stone on his grave that I'd done one year. Well, like I said, that was two years ago, and twice recently, I've experienced the oddest sensations. Both times I was laying in my bed trying to fall asleep, when I felt something, like little feet walking on my leg, and settling in down around my knee area, like a cat curling up, or a small dog. It felt so real, but I tried to explain it away, thinking maybe my circulation was doing something weird in my leg. Then a couple weeks later, it happened again. It walked up my leg and curled up on my knee area. This time, I had no delusions. I was sure it was Bernie who came back to lay down and be with me. Since then, I shared my experience with a girlfriend and she claims that when she spent the night here on my couch, she felt the same thing. We even got a ghost picture. My sister's dog was here, and my friend Yuri took a picture with her disc camera of the dog, and there's a big white circular mass over the dog with what looks to be a foot appearing or taking shape rather. I've no doubt it's Bernie, and he's been playing with that dog even as spirit. Sign me up as a believer. Yours truly. I'd like to start out by saying that, while I am interested in the paranormal, I tend to be pretty skeptical and prefer to think things out rationally before dismissing every little thing as ghosts or the like. This experience, however, has no logical explanation I can think of. I'm pretty new here as well, and I apologize in advance if I'm not doing this right. So yeah, here we go. I was 17 and it was mid-October, nearing Halloween. My family and I had gone to a really small, fairly rural town to meet a group of family friends for dinner and catching up for old time's sake, as my siblings and I had grown up with the children of the other families. After dinner, the parents stayed at the bar drinking and those of us that weren't of legal drinking age were starting to get a little bored. That's when one of my friends brought up the cemetery. Apparently, there's a cemetery in this town that's said to be haunted. I think some ghost hunter or paranormal type show did an episode about it or something, but the legends are said to have been around since before that. The story goes that a group of teenage boys wandered into the graveyard one Halloween night with the intention of causing trouble and maybe stirring up some spooky ghost action in celebration of Halloween. After dicking around for a while with no unexplained phenomena, they decided to sit on top of this mausoleum, 
which is basically just a big tomb built up around a coffin instead of actually burying it in the ground. They were about to call it quits and head home when all of a sudden, unseen hands seemed to push one of the boys off the top of the tomb and onto the ground. All the boys are obviously scared shitless and hightail it out of there. All of them describe feeling an eerie, ominous energy following them around for weeks after the incident. There have also been numerous reports of orbs, headstones inexplicably moving or disappearing, ghostly apparitions, inscriptions being changed, flashes of lights, strange noises, the whole works. We arrived at the cemetery well after dark and one of my girlfriends, we'll call her Emma and I, were the only two brave enough to go in. We hopped out of the car, careful to be as inconspicuous as we could since we didn't want the police showing up and ruining our ghost hunting experience, and headed towards the entrance. It was chilly and a bit windy, as autumn in Wisconsin tends to be. We gripped each other's hands and started down the gravel path. As soon as we passed the fence that surrounded the plot of land, everything seemed to get very still and quiet. We couldn't even hear the wind anymore which was strange as it had definitely been breezy as we got out of the car. It was so silent that even whispering and our steps in the gravel seemed, pun absolutely intended, loud enough to wake the dead. Though there were no lights in or near the cemetery, there was enough moonlight filtering through the clouds to allow us to see pretty well. We soon realized we had no idea where the fabled haunted mausoleum was, but we kept walking anyway. We made a random left turn and, lo and behold, there it was, about 30 yards in front of us. Pretty good luck, right? As we approached, I began to feel almost an electric sort of energy in my fingers and hands, but I wrote this off as just nerves or something due to breaking the law. We reached the tomb and this thing is huge. It was twice my height and at least made of weathered grey stone with moss scrolling sparsely on it. We stare for a moment and Emma whispers, you should touch it. Being the badass ghost hunter I am, I oblige. There is nothing really remarkable about the cool roughness of the stone, so I decide to take it a step further and hop up to sit on the lip of the curved top of the thing. Again, nothing happens, so I jokingly whisper shout, if there's anyone here, any spirits or anything, come on out. After listening in silence for a second, I think, fuck it and make my way to the very top where that kid is rumored to have been pushed off by ghostly hands. I have Emma snap a photo or two before climbing back down. Slightly disappointed by the lack of spooky encounters, we agree to head out and are about to do just that when we see a pair of headlights slowly creeping down the road that borders one side of the graveyard. We immediately assume someone noticed us and called the cops. So we crouch down behind some bushes with the mausoleum directly to our left to hide. Both of us are completely silent except our breathing as we watch the vehicle slowly make its way down the street. I'm watching its taillights turn the corner when I hear a low, creepy, menacing laugh coming from my back right. It sounded so strange, like it was a few feet away but also right in my ear. I'm freaked out and I'm about to chalk it up to some kind of adrenaline induced hallucination when Emma, who is standing to my left, whispers, Hey, did you hear that? My blood ran cold as I slowly nod a silent, yes I did. I cautiously turn my head to the direction I heard it come from and, I shit you not, see a dark figure stand up from one of the headstones not ten feet away from us. I scream bloody murder and somehow end up on the ground as the next thing I know, Emma is pulling at my arm shouting, we have to run, we have to get out of here, come on, we have to go. I let her pull me to my feet and led me blindly by the hand. We're full out sprinting, tripping over gravestones and plants and who knows what else in the dark and we can't even find the exit in our panic. We finally reach a gap in the fence and I can feel tears streaming down my face as I run for my life down the middle of the road, not even paying attention to the oncoming headlights until I nearly run into them. Luckily, it was the car containing the rest of our friends, and we rip the door open and throw ourselves inside screaming, go go, please just drive, before we even bothered to sit in an actual seat or shut the door. I can't remember who was driving, 
but I think our panic and terror shook them enough that they did what was asked of them and sped away back to the bar. They kept asking us what happened and if we were okay, but we couldn't calm down enough to answer until we were back inside the bar and sat down. Still shaking and out of breath, we recounted our story to all of them, drunk parents included. I think a lot of them were pretty skeptical, and honestly, I would have been too if I hadn't experienced it myself. In the weeks that followed, I felt that same eerie energy the boys in the legend described hanging over my head. Personally, I attributed more the paranoia after being scared out of my mind by something I couldn't actually see than some kind of curse, but it made me uneasy nonetheless. It's been a few years since this happened, and I still cannot think of a single logical explanation for what happened that night. While I have no idea how credible anyone else's reported experience with this place are, I know we were without a doubt the only people in that graveyard, or even on the streets for that matter, and we would have heard someone trying to sneak up on us. This sound of that laugh was so unnatural too. I can't get it out of my head, even now. I've never even been more scared than what I was that night. And I know now that people mean when they talk about not being able to fully believe in the paranormal until you've experienced it firsthand. Anyway, just thought I'd share this experience with you guys, as it was my first and most memorable ghost experience. This could have not happened at a better time. The year was 2009 about a week before Halloween. My sisters and I got a call that our grandmother's health had taken a turn for the worst and that the doctors were calling the family in. My grandmother was in the LaGrange hospital and we were in Nunan. It would take us 30 to 45 minutes to get there. Each of us four girls took off from work and we all met at my house where we would ride together to the hospital. Being in such a hurry, Neither of us took the time to use the bathroom, so by the time we got to the hospital, me and my baby sister were about to burst. We got parked and Kelly, my baby sister, and I ran into the hospital looking for a bathroom. The entrance that we took, we had to walk through double doors and turn slightly to our right then slightly to our left before heading down a long corridor. The corridor led us to a gift shop that sat on the right. Just before the gift shop, there were two small bathrooms, one for men and one for women, to the left of the hall. My sister and I were racing to the bathrooms when we saw an elderly woman in front of us. She was about 25 feet away from us. She was stooped over a tad and wore an old outdated black coat and an old black hat with a flower attached to the side of the hat. It was not cold enough outside to wear a coat. The old woman entered the bathroom and my sister and I raced in after her. The bathroom was so small that it only had two stalls and one sink and three people would be considered a crowd. My sister beat me to the second stall after she saw the old woman enter the first stall and heard her lock the stall. My sister and I were laughing at each other and we were talking to each other while my sister was in the stall. I was play fussing at her for beating me to the only available stall. So here I was standing outside the first stall waiting for the old woman to come out. All of a sudden, the door to the first stall slowly creeped open, and I stepped to the side so that the old woman could get out. Told you the bathroom was very small. After a few seconds, no one came out, and I peeked around and pushed the door open a little bit more. I was scared that I may find the poor old lady sitting on the toilet, and she had let the door come open on her or something, and we would both have an awkward moment. I looked into the stall, and no one is there. My sister was still in the second stall, and I said, Kelly, wasn't that old woman in this other stall? My sister replied with a yes and why. I said, Kelly, she's not here. Kelly asked, what do you mean she's not in there? I saw her go in, and I replied with, well, she has either gone down the toilet or she has disappeared. I remember Kelly asking me, did I see her go out? And I said, uh, Kelly, she would have had to bump into me to get out, and no, she did not go past me. The conversation went on like this for a few more seconds, ending with my sister coming out of the second stall, fast as lighting, with her pants half buttoned. 
Flying towards the door, she turned to me and asked if I was coming, and I responded that I had business to take care of. Of course, my sister left me there alone while I took care of business in the first stall. I was either feeling brave or stupid that day. <laughs> After I came out of the bathroom, my sister was waiting by the gift shop. We knew we just had a ghostly encounter. Retelling the story to the rest of our family members had them thinking we were off our rocker. I retold the story again to the nurse who was assigned to my grandmother and she confirmed that there had been several ghost sightings in the hospital. One day, I had an appointment at Clark at noon. I finished the meeting with my client early, and being near Orchard Road, I went shopping. By the evening, I got ready to go back to the flat. The same flat which is in my story, an invisible housemate. I was filled with dread due to the previous experiences there, and as I boarded the train for NS from Orchard Station, my friend Louise called me on my cell phone. We talked for a while and she invited me over for a movie and dinner at her house. As we were longtime childhood friends, I was delighted to spend some time with her. And with that, I changed the train. Earlier, I was going in the opposite direction in the NS line, and now I boarded the train to Semabweg on the same NS line. I reached Toapeo station and loads of people rushed to catch a seat. While the train started, I could see from the window a middle-aged woman standing at the platform just looking inside the compartment. She was wearing a kimba, kind of a bluish grayish white clothing. She had unkept but jet black hair. I kept on staring at her because she looked pale white as if she had severe anemia. I think her face looked almost the same as her blouse. I kept staring at her as I thought it was a very unusual for any woman to be so pale. And then the train sped away and I got back to playing subway surf on my cell phone. I was distracted by the people getting up to get out at Bishan Station. As the train halted, I saw the same woman on the platform. I got shocked as I clearly saw her on Toa Peo platform and she was here again at Bishan at the speed of the train. It was highly unlikely that she reached Bishan station so fast and I kept looking at her. But she just stood on the platform without fidgeting when people passed her by. The train doors closed and she didn't board the train again. And I wondered why she traveled from Toa Peo to Bishan without any intention to board the train and just stand at the platform. I kept staring at her. She was still standing at the platform from the window and the train started in full swing. I again went back to another game of subway surf when the lady sitting right next to me elbowed me while opening her purse. I looked at her and she apologized, but that's when I looked towards the right side of the compartment, and to my surprise, the pale woman was standing inside the compartment, near the door. Now, at this moment, I still can't explain to myself how that woman defied the laws of physics as last time I saw her, she was outside on the platform. The train doors are obviously closed shut before the train starts to speed away. Then how on earth is it possible for her to board the train? And she was clearly standing outside on the platform and no way in the train. And I could see her outside except when she disappeared from my view from the window's edge while I sat there in total shock rethinking what I am seeing. I still kept staring at her. The passengers near her seemed indifferent about her presence, and she had the same expression throughout the time she was standing there, and her hair, which seemed unkempt from the front, was nicely tied in a loose hanging bun, which came until the center of her shoulder blades at the back. But from the thickness of her hair bun, 
It seemed like she had long hair. Except for when she caught me staring at her, she moved her head to left to look at me. Her movement seemed as if someone was turning a puppet's head on its neck. At that time, when our eyes interlocked, I felt the dread that I have never ever felt in my entire existence. Her eyes color were the lightest shades of gray. It was like the meanest of all the eyes I had ever come in contact with. I was filled with the emotions of grief or something on the lines of envy. I lowered my eyes and fixed it on my cell phone and tried to refocus my mind. But I kept looking at her dress's bottom, and then another electric shock ran through my body. I couldn't even see her feet. Normally, someone who's wearing a kabaya, you can see their feet. But it seemed she didn't have any feet at all. And then, the train halted at Angmo Kyo Station. I managed to look up to find out whether the incoming passengers can see her or not. And as I looked up, she already left. She was gone. It looked like a nanosecond for her to disappear, even before the train doors had opened. At that moment, realizing that it's impossible to get out without the train doors opening, and that she vanished in the moment, I rolled my eyes up to look at her. I just froze in terror. I looked around to see if anyone else also saw that or not but nobody seemed to be influenced by the woman or maybe they couldn't see her at this point i was horribly scared this was the second incident for me in which something in this case someone vanished in thin air though i didn't see her vanish but she was there at one moment and like a microsecond later she wasn't there it wasn't even humanly possible to get out of the train or get into the train in that moment. So I, I put on my headphones and music and closed my eyes shut so as to not see anything else. I got out at Semabwag Station. At first, she joked that I rode with a Pontenac, and I gave her a smack on her arm. A Pontenac is a bloodthirsty ghost of a woman and quite popular ghost in Southeast Asia. But after calming me down and realizing that I was actually frightened to my core, she told me that the pale woman could be the white ghost of Angmo Kayo MRT station. And when I checked it on the internet, I found out that almost all the stations I crossed today on my way to Semabwag are supposedly haunted. And yes, white woman is one of them. It was rather amusing as how can ghosts haunt a train and station for that matter, but it was written that white ghosts targets lonely people. But I was in a filled compartment, so why did I only see her? Paranormal is a part of everyone's life, but not everyone noticed it. My first encounter was around 18 years ago when I was 10. It was Christmas morning when I lost my father. It was a devastating loss for all of us. Since then, I don't want to celebrate Christmas. Anyway, let's get to the point. The day after the funeral, I was sitting in my room. I was bummed. I didn't want to accept the truth. And then it happened. I heard my father's voice calling my name not once, not twice, but three times. I couldn't believe my ears and I raced out of my room into the kitchen. My eyes were starting to water because I didn't see him. I started to cry and headed back into my room. Then I realized that it was very bright winter's day. I mean, it was freaking December 26, and then I saw him. My dad was standing before me, smiling, surrounded by that light. I stared at him for what seemed to be hours. Then suddenly, light started to flicker, and I heard him talking directly to me. He said to me, I'm sorry, be good. I have to go now, goodbye. And then he disappeared with the light. That was the last memory I had of him. The next experience was four years ago when I was in my neighbor's neighbor's house. My neighbor, let's call her Z, 
lived with their father, let's call him A, who by the way was a creepy guy. However, Z was gifted, she could see the future through cards. I was stunned when she told me things known only by me. I went there often times, but every time I took even the slightest look to A, my head started to hurt like hell. When I shared that to Z, she told me that I was sensitive. Every time, when I get a headache, I was in a way cleansing the negative energy. I shook it off because that couldn't be true. After the seance, you know the cards. She told me that I have a big hole in my heart, a hole full of pain and sorrow. She started to cry and told me that soon, very soon, I will lose someone very close to me and I needed to be strong at that moment. After that, I stopped going there and a week later, she died, leaving behind her awful father. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but he was evil. I can't explain how I know. I just do. 10 days after Z's death, A got ill and died. I know my stories aren't as exciting as the others, but they are true. Just letting you know that the person who I was supposed to lose was my mother who died a year after Z and A. You may say it's a coincidence, but it's not. Every time I pass Z's house, I get the same headache, and I get the feeling that someone is watching me through the second floor windows where A lived. I'm 28 now, and I still get that feeling. About 20 years ago, when we lived in Navy housing on Oahu, Hawaii, my daughter and I experienced something that still haunts me. Honestly, I'm not sure what it was, in that I'm not sure if it was a ghost. At the time, we, my husband, our two daughters and I were living in Navy housing. I never believed in ghosts or the supernatural, and we didn't entertain such stories or thoughts in our home. It was a summer sunny day. My husband was at work, my oldest daughter was out surfing with her friend, and my youngest was at home with me. We had just finished lunch and decided to watch some TV. The TV room was just off the living room, dining room, and filled with windows and two doors, one to the kitchen and one to the backyard. There was a wall composed of two large sliding doors that separated the living and dining room from the TV room. Against that makeshift sliding door wall was a love seat that my daughter was sitting on. I was sitting on a chair opposite the love seat. The TV was to the side of us on a low bookcase below a bank of windows. While sitting there watching TV, something shimmery, a staticky, sparkly, flashing sort of mass passed between us and the TV. It had entered from the living room into the TV room and then moved across the room and out the back door. Within seconds of seeing it, we turned to look at each other. She then jumped into my lap and we sat hugging each other tightly for a bit before either of us could speak. I knew by her actions and the panic on her face, she had seen what I had. With fear in her voice, she asked me, what was that? I had no idea what it was, but I tried to reason it away. Staying as calm as I could, I told her it was probably the sun reflecting off a car passing the house. With a trembling soft voice, almost a whisper, she replied, but all the blinds are down. Not wanting to give in to the panic, I told her that the shades don't fit the window so tightly that light can't find its way in between window frame and shade. I then changed the subject to picking up my oldest daughter and going for shaved ice, a Hawaiian snow cone, but better. Other than telling family and friends for the next few weeks, we didn't and haven't talked about it since. We put it behind us. Fast forward two years later. My husband, reassigned back to Rhode Island, had moved back to the mainland to open our old home and get it ready while the girls and I were still in Hawaii. The girls still had a few months of school to finish, so he went ahead without us. The last few days on the island, I spent alone cleaning our base housing. All our household belongings had been moved out the day before, and we were on our way back to Rhode Island. While I cleaned the house, 
readying it for inspection. My girls enjoyed their last few days with friends on the beach. I had cleaned the kitchen and laundry the day before and was now cleaning the bedrooms, bathrooms, and on into the living room and dining room. The whole house was floored with floor covering, which I had to sweep and mop spotless. I was mopping the living room and dining room area. The only thought in my mind was how warm it was now that the air conditioner was gone. Then, out of nowhere, appeared that same shimmering, sparkling, wild flashing mass. It crossed the room right in front of me. Being all alone and startled by what I was seeing, I packed up and left. I still hadn't mopped the TV room, nor finished the living or dining room. I didn't care. I was out of there. I grabbed my cleaning supplies, my purse, and locked the door. I left the mop and bucket with the curbside trash and got in the car and didn't look back. I have never ever seen anything like this before or after Hawaii. I have also since become more open-minded to ghosts. Once back in Rhode Island, I started watching the many supernatural and ghost hunting shows that had since started appearing on TV, and although I am open-minded now, I haven't seen any real proof. I say that because I am still not sure what I saw in Hawaii. I still feel like there might have been a logical explanation. I'm still waiting to come across someone, somewhere, who has experienced the same thing. Someone who can tell me what it was that my daughter and I saw. I'm an amateur UFO researcher. I say amateur, but I think some might consider me an expert in the field. Anyway, I'm writing here to record what's already occurred. I'm too afraid to post on the forums I usually frequent when discussing my findings because I really don't need the extra attention right now. I'm afraid that something is going to happen and I have to document it somewhere. So here it is and I hope you enjoy my story. I know what you're all thinking, no doubt. I'm probably some nut job that sees airplanes flying at night and thinks they're aliens and I can respect that train of thought. My purpose here isn't to get people to believe, it's purely selfish. Now. I'm not really in fear for my life. Well, I am, but that's not why I'm writing this. It's my research I'm concerned about. All my years looking into extraterrestrial life, I've had a number of experiences, some more notable than others. I've seen orbs in the sky maneuver in ways aircrafts never could, and I've picked up radio waves with no point of origin on Earth. Those types of things I've looked into, but no real proof has ever come out of it. But what happened the other day changed all that. I live out in California, pretty much the middle of nowhere, out in the desert. Gotta be close to the action, you know? At night, I routinely go out in my pickup and see if I can get a glimpse of anything. I have numerous outposts I go to where I've had experiences and where I know people have known to have seen UFOs. I was at one such place, sitting in my truck, in the absolute darkness of the desert, sipping my coffee, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a bright light streak up into the sky, like really bright. It was coming from the middle of a rock plateau in the distance. Naturally, I revved up the engine and headed over. I parked about a quarter mile away and walked the rest. I didn't want the noise to scare off whatever it was. so. I snuck up and warmed my way in between the rocks to get to the middle where the light was coming from. I peeked in, and in an instant, everything I've ever believed was validated. I saw two creatures, pretty short but humanoid, no doubt. They had big eyes with no pupils, pure white, and I could see that their flesh was moist and scaly. I could hear them speak to one another, their language is difficult to describe. I can't really put into words what it sounded like. It was high pitched and echoed, though that was more their voices and not the language itself. Hearing an alien language sent chills up my spine. I was so excited. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. There were two pods behind them, and they were both standing around some sort of metallic rod stuck in the sand. That's where the light was coming from. It was shooting out the top, like some sort of beacon. I assume it was transmitting back to the mothership, but I don't really know. To me, it appeared to be sucking something out of the earth. I could hear the device humming, 
I inched closer for a better look, but I cracked the rock, and they both turned to me in unison. I froze. Their eyes cut through me, and my excitement turned to terror. I was so scared, but in that same moment, I could see in them the same thing. Fear. One of them reached out and touched something on the rod, and the light exploded out, blinding me for a moment. As my eyes adjusted back to normal, all I saw were the two pods jet straight back up into the air. There was no noise made, only the sound of the sphere ripping through the air. Now, as much as I'd like you people to believe what I've just told you, that's not really my concern. Because when they left, lying on the ground was the rod. They'd forgotten it or dropped it. I don't know. All that matters is that I have it actual proof of intelligent life and if you looked at this thing held it in your hand you know it came from another world i mean with how bright the light on top can get there's nothing on earth that could power something like that you'd think i'd be on top of the world and believe me i was until the next day i woke up to a knock on my door it was early that afternoon, but naturally I was sleeping in. The knocking was persistent. It didn't stop, just a slow paced knock, over and over, until I finally got to the door. I opened it to see two large men standing in front of me. They were both bald and pale, with no eyebrows or eyelashes, and they were wearing crisp black suits. Everything from their ties to their shoes appeared to be brand new, like it was the first time they had been worn. The man on the left was the only one who spoke. He introduced himself as Agent Quinn and his associate as Agent Reed. Then he addressed me by name, my full name. I didn't think it was odd at first. I mean, he was at my house. I'd buy he knew who I was, but then he asked me the question that almost made my blood freeze. Where's the rod you procured last night? There was no emotion in his words at all, almost robotic in tone. I immediately looked at both their sides and noticed they didn't have guns. I thought it was strange for government agents not to carry weapons, but I was also sort of relieved. I denied knowing anything, saying I'd been at home all night. Agent Quinn, however, didn't seem to have any interest in talking about whether or not I had what he wanted. As far as he was concerned, I had it. It is your best interest if you simply oblige us and gave us the item we have come for. I can assure you it would make life much easier for you. But I stuck to my guns and told them to leave. I stood firm and raised my voice, getting upset with them. But when I said leave, Agent Reed reached out his hand and grabbed me by the arm. Now, I'm not a strong man. I don't work out or anything like that. But the strength in his grip was inhuman. I have no doubt about that. He held me in place while Agent Quinn got in my face, our noses almost touching. I was staring in his eyes, and I could see how lifeless they were, like what made him human had been stripped away. It is unfortunate that you have chosen to lie to us, he said. My sincerest hope is that you will reconsider, and soon. Agent Reed then released me, and the two of them walked back to a black van that was parked out on the street. That was the other day. I'm freaking out. How could they know that I have it? How do they know about it in the first place? I've heard the stories. Stuff similar to this, and I'm afraid of what's going to happen to me because I'm not going to compromise myself and give them what they want. I was smart enough the night before to hide the rod, but I'm hesitant to say where. But I do want to. I want someone other than me to know where it is, but I have no family or friends, so I've turned here. I'm not really looking for advice as to what to do, but I'm not adverse to it either. I only want to have what is happening to me be out there. I can't let them cover this up too. As long as they don't find these posts, I'll keep posting about what's happening. I need it documented. Alright, things have gotten pretty crazy. I'm not much of a drinker, but I've since took up the habit. I'm two drinks in as I write this. I appreciate the comments and advice I've been getting, but I don't really have any intention of handing the rod over. I've dedicated years and years to investigating UFOs and extraterrestrial life, so to finally have something and just hand it over just isn't an option for me. I left a good job paying and another life to come out here to chase my passion, and that's what I intend to do. 
After posting the other night, I waited a few hours until a little past midnight and decided to head back out to the rock plateau where I originally encountered the life forms. It had been a few days and I wanted to get a second look at the site, but after the agents came to my door, my mind had been in a different place. But I refused to let fear change the way I live my life. I went out and crept out, got into my pickup and headed towards the desert. I half expected to be followed, so I couldn't help but glancing back to my rearview mirrors the whole time, but it seemed I was alright. I got out into the desert, no problem, but as I got closer to the rock plateau, I could see it was illuminated. Not by some extraterrestrial technology, but like the lights you see when they're doing construction late at night on the highway. The entire thing was encased in what looked like a white quarantine tent. I parked quite a distance away and got out my pair of binoculars to take a closer look. The tent seemed to be surrounded by black vans, the same that I'd seen the agents leave in. There were men similar to the agents all around, no hair and in the same fine suits. I have no idea what they were doing, but I got extremely nervous as I watched them. Some were going in and out of the tent while others stood motionless, as if they were on guard like statues. There was no way they could see me from the distance I was, so I decided that even though it wouldn't be that clear, given my range, I thought I'd record what was going on. I got my phone out and zoomed in as far as I could. It wasn't good enough to see what exactly they were doing, but I could see one thing that didn't show up in my binoculars. The eyes of every single person there were glowing, like some sort of bluish white, but I could see it very clearly through the screen. It sort of disturbed me, but I didn't really know what it meant. Some of you have commented that you have thought that the agents were themselves aliens, and I didn't really think that until seeing that. Though I do also believe they work for the government, there's no way they would be able to churn out an operation like that without people having questions and them having the right answers. I have in the past heard some of the crazier UFO researchers make claims that our government has been working with extraterrestrials for as long back as the 50s, but I never put too much validity into those claims. Seeing this, however, made me question everything. Anyway, sorry, I got sidetracked again. I recorded them for about a half hour, for no real reason, other than I thought something more interesting might happen at any moment. You couldn't tell what they were doing at all, so it was a half hour of guys with glowing eyes walking around and standing. I would have just kept filming, but all of a sudden, I could see that two of the eyes had turned and were staring out into the distance towards me. I didn't think much of it, just that he had moved, but then slowly, I noticed the same stationary eyes turned towards my direction. It wasn't long until, on my camera, it was a wall of eyes staring. I immediately jumped in my truck and peeled out of there. As I rushed home, I kept assuring myself it was nothing. There was no way they could have seen me. It was pitch black out there, and I was so far away. I assured myself something else had to have caught their attention. I got home and rushed inside. I just stared out the window for about a good hour, expecting a black van to show up or something along those lines, but nothing. I breathed a sigh of relief and opened up my laptop to transfer the footage from my phone. I hooked it all up and opened the file, and much to my dismay, the video was fuzzy. And not like a normal fuzzy video, this was like the black and white fuzz you'd see when the VHS tape stopped running, something I'd never see on digital video. To say I was pissed is an understatement. It had recorded so smooth, it makes no sense that it was corrupted like that. I was shaking. I was so angry, so you know I decided to get a drink to calm my nerves, and I just kept drinking till I woke up the next morning, or I guess afternoon on my couch with a splitting headache and a bad taste in my mouth. I looked out the window, and sitting in front of my house was a black van. All the windows were tinted, I couldn't see anything. I was pretty scared, I'm not gonna lie to you, but I had things I had to take care of, and to do that I had to leave my house. I mustered up the courage and walked outside, where I suppose ran is more accurate. I wanted to get into my truck as quick as possible, but the moment I stepped outside, the van drove off. 
I was relieved, but I knew there had to be more to it, but I didn't have time to worry about it. I had things I needed to do, so after a few hours of running errands, I came back home to my door being wide open, pulled in my driveway, and took a deep breath before heading in. The place was a mess. Furniture turned over and ripped up, books and knickknacks thrown about. I turned my couch back right side up and just sat on what was left of the cushions, looking at everything I owned, broken and beaten. I knew that they thought they'd find and I knew it wasn't there, so they gave me a bit of relief. Then as I sat there, I remembered the rest of my research. I went back to my bedroom and sure enough, everything had been tampered with. Cords had been yanked out of my computer, boxes of documents emptied out all over the floor. But as I looked at everything, I noticed nothing was missing. It was all there. They hadn't taken anything. I did notice, however, there was an envelope amongst the mess. I didn't have anything that I kept in an envelope, so I knew whatever it was. It must have been them who left it. I opened it up, and inside was just a single piece of paper, typed up. It said, It has come to our attention that you are not only continuing to hinder our investigation by keeping what we desire from us, but that it appears that you have begun an investigation of your own. What you saw the other night was not for your eyes. To continue on this path you appear to be on would be unwise. Now I'm just sitting here, three drinks deep in, what used to be a nice and tidy house, typing this wondering what to do. I'm at a loss. I don't know how far they'll go. Right now, I think they're just trying to scare me into doing what they want, and since I know I'm not going to, I'm nervous as to what's coming next. I work night audit at this semi-swanky hotel next to the airport. One night, I get a call from a lady in two or four. She says there was arguing, loud banging, and crying coming out of 206. Check the computer, and no one has checked into that room due to maintenance issues. What the fuck? Called my supervisors to see what to do. She tells me to call on site security and follow them up with a key. I decide to be the bigger man and go up anyways. As we get off the elevator, we can hear the crying. It's loud. My heart starts racing as we near the door, so I hand the key to the security guard. The next five minutes seem to happen in slow motion. He opens the door and immediately flicks on the light. Keep in mind 206. We're on the second floor, only door was by me, and this is at like 3am and there was no one around. As we enter the room, the shower is on, steam is coming from under the door. There is only one lamp on in the room. It's super cold, and there is a lady in red, lacy bra, black panties, with super red hair curled up crying in the bed. She was facing away from us as Frank approached her. He asked if everything was okay. She sort of just stopped crying and rolled over. When she did, a wave of horror came over me. She was super pale, covered in blood, and was just staring behind us. That's when we realized the shower had stopped and the door was open. There was a man about six foot five standing in the doorway. As we turned around, cops tased him and arrested him. Turns out he was a rapist who hides in hotel rooms, kidnaps women who stay there, and cuts them open. To this day, I will never go to a hotel again. I'm currently a janitor at a gym. We have a stairwell that leads down some stairs to a door that doesn't open because we lost the keys years ago. One night, there was a loud banging sound coming from the door. It sounded like someone was banging it every second for a couple minutes. I stood at the top of the stairs and listened and watched, and it stopped. It started up again a few minutes later. I went back up there to see, and it stopped again as soon as I got there told my manager the next day and had a locksmith come in. He got the door open and it's just an old supply closet that's empty. Every so often someone hears a banging sound coming from the door at the bottom of the stairs. Third shift gas station attendant, my first night alone, 
I'm out cleaning trash around the pumps and refilling the windshield fluid containers. Cop pulls in, drives by really slow, staring at the store, doesn't see me standing near pumps, parts, and walks into the store really fast. He's clearly looking for an attendant, so I walk into the store. He jumps when the door opens and I say, hey, what's up? The Dunkin' Donuts, two streets over, just got hit and the guy doesn't fit any profiles. We think he just likes to shoot people, so we're letting people know. He gets in his car and drives off. Was sitting at a desk in front of a good sized window, reading a binder. Sort of had that feeling like someone was watching me, so I looked up and there was a face pressed to the glass. No idea how long he was there before I looked up. Ran out to the foyer where there was a glass door on the porch that should be locked. It wasn't. He started shaking the door trying to get in. Ran to the next room and he just followed me around the house while I was on the phone with the cops. Watching me through the windows, they didn't catch him. That night, he came back the next night. They caught him. Creepy as fuck. Surprise. Sometimes patients come in for other problems and don't mention that they sleepwalk. There have been a few occasions where I've been sitting in my office watching vitals and writing reports when I turn around to get something and a patient has sleepwalked into my office and is standing right behind me. At 2am in the dead quiet, that gives one quite a shock. Right out of college, I got a job as a nanny for two elementary school aged girls. For their anniversary, the parents went on a week long cruise and I stayed home with the kids. The first few nights, the 8 year old come into my room multiple times a night and wake me up. It was obvious she hadn't pre-planned what she was going to give me as a reason for waking me up, so she would stumble through an excuse on the spot like, I just wanted to make sure we are still going to the park tomorrow, or I think I forgot to brush my teeth and wondered if I should do it now or wait till the morning. I figured she was just missing her parents and feeling out of sorts, so I let it slide at first, but by the fourth or fifth time, knowing I needed sleep to keep up with two active kids, I told her that she wasn't to wake me up unless there was an actual emergency. I got a couple more hours of undisturbed sleep, but wake up with a weird feeling around 5am. I turn over and nearly piss myself. The girl had brought over a chair right next to the bed and is staring down at me. It didn't help that she had long, dark hair and this happened a few months after the ring came out. Her explanation? I just thought it would be fun to watch you sleep. I didn't wake you. Touché kiddo. It was the summer of 1992. I was 20 years old and I had just completed my junior year of college and I was staying in the same city as the campus to take some summer classes. I also worked a couple of part-time jobs to handle living expenses. One of my jobs was as a fast food delivery guy. We cooked and delivered steaks, chicken, and burgers instead of the usual pizza or Asian food. One night after completing my shift, I was bored and for laughs, decided to check out an adult movie and novelty store that I had seen sometimes in the course of all my driving for that job. I parked amongst several other cars and got out of my car to go into the store. I saw a middle aged man with a pasty appearance with greasy dark hair and receding hairline in the car parked closest to the store. I approached the car on the way in and he raised his hand hello to me. Not wanting to be rude, I raised my hand and returned. As I walked directly by the driver's side door, he said hey, and I said um, hello. He leaned his head out of his window. He said, you want to get it off? I browsed about and put off by the sheer seediness of the place, quickly left. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the guy in the car in a different parking space. I got into my car and started out of the parking lot. As I got to the road, I saw the guy start his car and start to come out as well. Hoping this was coincidence, I turned out of the parking lot to go home. It wasn't coincidence. Suddenly, this guy was following me very closely and blinking his high beams at me every few blocks. 
I tried to lose him at some traffic signals, but was unsuccessful. I decided to go an alternate route at that point, not wanting to direct this creep to where I was living. Luckily, my delivery job had made me familiar with a lot of the roads in the city. I headed for a particularly labyrinth neighborhood, turned in, and took as complicated a route as I could, and quickly as I could, and finally lost him in there. I thought that was the end of it. A few weeks later, during work, at the takeout place, I stopped at a convenience store in the course of delivery to get a soda. After I checked out, I saw this same guy. He smiled and raised his hand hello again. I hurried outside to my car, but this time, I was in my shirt and hat from the takeout place. Now he knew where I worked. By the time I left the convenience store, he followed me again. Fortunately, I was able to lose him again. I spent the rest of the summer afraid to see him pop up in the place of my work, or worse, order food and bring me to his house. Thankfully, that did not happen. A skeevy guy who likes to follow people, let's not meet again. You believe in ghosts? If so, then boy, do I have a real ghost story for you. Being so involved with the paranormal from an early age on, you tend to open yourself up to experiences that you've never previously had before. I'm of the belief that if you commit to actively hunting spirits, they will start to manifest and make themselves known to you. However, if you close yourself off to this realm, the chances of finding yourself in a paranormal situation are slim. A lack of commitment will result in most spirits ignoring you. Just think about it for a second. If you have absolutely no desire to see paranormal activity, why would a ghost waste their time trying to communicate with you? It would be just like talking to a wall. Just like the saying goes, seeing is believing, or in this case, investing is believing. This story I'm about to share with you, though just a story, is undeniable proof that ghosts are living among us in the human world. These experiences occurred late in September of 2005, and at the time, I was 15. My mother tragically perished in a car accident the year previously, and that left my dad to care for me alone. It was an absolutely miserable existence from then on, as this was the love of his life. My dad ended up being so depressed that I would often find him crying alone in his room at my house every single day for the next month and a half. I personally have never seen my dad suffer so much, and although I was also hurting, I was more concerned with my dad's well-being. It was then that I would start praying for mom to return and give us a sign to at least help comfort my dad and let him know that she was okay. However, all that praying didn't seem to help. All of the nights begging God to send her back down to us for a message almost seemed futile. I remember doing spirit sessions alone to frantically contact my mom, using a Ouija board, a spirit box, anything I could get my hands on to help. I never got any signs, and the house stood silent, as quiet as it's ever been except for the faint sounds of my dad crying most nights. It made me start to doubt and think that ghosts and God were imaginary. I lost my faith in nearly everything. I remember angrily saying to myself that God and ghosts don't exist. My dad is hurting so much. I wanted to connect with the afterlife so bad and yet nothing is coming through. Show me something. I remember saying that in utter and complete frustration. Still nothing. But all that was soon about to change. I remember one late night, I could once again hear my dad sobbing in his room after a hard day's work. He came back later that day, around 10 p.m. He was lying on the bed, and to comfort my dad, I went to sleep with him in his room. We had a bed across from my dad's that I would sleep in. I reassured dad that everything would be okay. Even saying, dad, I can't lose you too. Please, 
You have a daughter to raise. Mom wouldn't let you go on like this. My dad simply smiled and told me that he would never give up on me or his life. So he fell asleep. I tried to fall asleep as well, laying in the bed across from me. This was the moment when I was finally going to see a sign that I had been desperately seeking. Although, this was not the sign I was looking for. An hour or so passes. I was drifting off to sleep when I saw a shadow outlined in the form of a person. This wasn't a good shadow because I felt a very negative energy. There were no features except the shadow person looming over my craving father. I then got up, turned on the light, and that shadow was gone. I went to wake my dad, and he wasn't waking up. I screamed so hard for dad to wake up, but nothing. I went and called the ambulance immediately. They rushed him to the hospital. This nightmare just couldn't get any worse. I had already lost my mother, and I was on the verge of losing my father as well. So I waited, and I waited in the hospital. My aunt and uncle swung by to give me the most gigantic hug I've ever felt in my life. We were all waiting on the word for the status of my dad. As the doctor walks out, he has a very somber and stern look on his face. Your dad suffered a heart attack in his sleep. We are doing everything in our power to make sure he recovers from this. What they didn't tell us in the moment was that he was fighting for his life and receiving life-saving emergency surgery. It turned out that he also died on the operating table, but came back. After hours of surgery, thankfully, my dad recovered and eventually woke up. The crazy part is, years after this incident, he finally told me that he experienced an out-of-body experience and said that he felt like he went to heaven. He remembers being able to see the doctors working on him. Then suddenly, he was in a sunny field with roses and daisies, all these beautiful flowers surrounding him. He then saw my mom in a blue dress, just smiling at him from a close distance. My dad saw his grandfather, who he had been really close with as a kid. He also saw his childhood dog Spike, and he was running around the field. They both waved at him, gesturing him to come forward. He felt nothing but peace as he moved forward. Everything just felt great for a moment. As he approached mom, he gave her a great big hug, and my grandpa as well. He said he didn't feel like leaving this place at all, but he knew he couldn't stay. Grandpa said with a great big grin on his face, we will see you later. Then suddenly, he woke up back in his body in intense pain. That same night my dad was having that episode, my uncle took me back to his house. As I waited for my dad to recover, I had a dream. I dreamt of the Grim Reaper, and he was literally trying to drag my dad up into this dark room with red wallpaper. I remember screaming, no, I need you, dad and trying to physically pull my dad away from the reaper so he wouldn't take him through the door of the strange room. Eventually, the reaper gave up and disappeared. My uncle rushed in to hug me, and I told him I had a nightmare. Years later, when my dad told me about what happened to him, I told him my nightmare as well. My theory is that the whole incident, the black shadow, the heart attack, the out-of-body experience, and my nightmare, they were all connected. Something dark and sinister was trying to take my dad away from me. And I feel like my dad's grandpa and my mom were somehow stopping this from happening. My uncle believed that my dad was just so worn out and hurt by the loss of my mother that it caused him to have a heart attack because of a broken heart. He does admit, though, that what my dad told us in the nightmare were very eerie, too coincidental to be one. The fact that I was praying for a sign, then challenged something from beyond, and then demanded one, 
made me feel like I really angered some sort of evil entities. I also believe that in those dark moments, good and evil were fighting for my dad to stay alive. My theory is that these dark forces are trying to take him away from me. I also know that because we're surrounded by so much darkness after we lost Mom, these dark spirits were taking advantage of us in the worst possible way. And I think they were feeding off of us. This whole time that I was hoping for a sign, it was there all along, and I should have realized this. Maybe we were consumed by a dark energy that whole time, and we needed a priest to bless this house. Eventually, that's what we ended up doing, and all felt pleasant and better. My dad slowly started feeling like himself, and the rest was history. I know this sounds insane, but I swear that all this happened, and it is 100% true. Thank you for my long story. Update. Fast forward 10 years. To my surprise, I recently found out that my old house, which was built in the early 1900s, was built on old Indian burial ground. I went to a psychic witch who did a reading on me, and we found out some fascinating things that I could be surrounded and attached by spirit guides, one that represents good benevolence, and the other which is bad. She said that these two clash with one another, and when the bad spirits get through, they have the power to influence the entire mood of life, and the events occurring. All this could have played a factor into what happened to my dad. She said this, plus the entities that are living in our home, including that dark force cloud that I told you about, seem to have a spiritual clash where the good could be fighting evil. Now, I know this sounds wild, and maybe the witch was just making educated guesses, but after what had happened, I truly believed that there was something going on there. She suggested that she come to the house to perform positive rituals with her group of witches as sort of a good omen to ward off the bad spirits, even though we seem to get rid of them. The psychic also stressed that, because I still have these attachments, it is very possible that these things could continue and come back. She also suggested that the road my mom was driving on when she passed may have been cursed. She told me that just in case, they could go to the area of the accident to perform a positive healing ritual for the road. We also invited a group of witches to visit my dad in our old home, so we could defeat whatever darkness looms in our home. Well, they ended up showing up to our house late at night. Three of the witches showed up, and me and my dad participated in the seance as well. We also used a Ouija board. First, we gathered around the kitchen table and held hands as the witches channeled for the spirits. They encouraged them to appear. They stated that they didn't mean any harm, and they wanted to figure out who exactly lives in this house. The main witch, Cynthia, who gave me a psychic reading and told me about the clashing spirits, I mean that she felt a tightness in her chest as soon as she walked into the kitchen. She did not sense any good vibes from the kitchen at all, even though the entire first floor, living room, felt more comfortable and at ease. She called out, Who is the spirit that is choking me and making it hard to breathe? That's when the kitchen cupboard opened by itself and slammed shut so hard that it startled all of us. That gave us the confirmation that there wasn't a positive ghost that resided in the home, or at least one of them. It was only seconds later that I heard a voice say go away in a very low and guttural tone. It was more of a whisper, but it immediately sent shivers down my spine. I turned to the psychic, who was sitting right next to me, and I asked her if she heard that. She said no, but that she could feel the presence of a dark shadow standing between us both. Cynthia then told us that she was getting messages in her mind that the spirit was named Tim, and that he used to be a very angry man, about middle age. What we were able to confirm next was crazy. We used a Ouija board and asked about Tim. 
and the Ouija board both confirmed that it was exactly him. Cynthia was right. She then said that Tim was a very lonely man after his entire family died in a house fire. We later found out that the house we lived in had been rebuilt shortly after. We asked the Ouija board to confirm, and to our surprise, the Ouija board spelled out yes. We then asked about mom, if she was still okay, and if she passed on. We never actually got any answers from the Ouija board, nor did Cynthia. However, a few days after the whole incident, and I'm not sure if this was just a coincidence or not, but I ended up getting a random text from some unknown number. The text literally showed up with a YouTube link to the song Found Out About You, a song by Gin Blossoms. That was my mom's favorite song. The song is also about grieving for the loss of a loved one, so it really seemed to be a direct message that tied into me and my family and what we experienced. Anyway, incredibly lengthy story, but I couldn't leave any details out. Thank you so much for reading. Today, me and my dad are doing great. Stay safe, everyone. This is my first, but not my last experience. I'm a slight skeptic and a psychology major, so I believe in scientific explanations first and foremost when it comes to aliens and ghosts for classifying it as a ghost story. I've always been overly curious about my family's lineage and who's related to who in my grandparents' tiny town founded by my grandfathers and grandfather. I was adopted into the family and I always felt like a bit of an outcast with no background of my own, so I linked to adapt my family's history despite our lack of blood relation. One day while my father and I were visiting, he asked my grandmother if she wouldn't mind taking us to the graveyards around the tiny town and showing us around. She took us to the family graveyard, another family's graveyard, who's apparently not related in any way, and finally she took us to a large church and soldier shared graveyard. I was struck by how large this place was and immediately wandered away. It was about 99 degrees that day, with very little wind and high humidity. What happened next could have easily been caused by the heat, but as a half skeptic, I'm not sure. I decided to tidy up around the headstone, believing it wasn't fair to neglect someone in life or death. As I traveled around emptying out dirty vases, straightening flowers, dusting dirt off headstones, I came across four neat little graves in a row. The graves were old, moldy, and worn. Each one had a little weather-worn clip tulip in front of it, and each one bore the same title, Infant. I don't like to talk about it, but I suffer from an anxiety order that causes me to be emotionally numb. It's extremely hard for me to feel empathy or sympathy, but looking at those little graves, I felt my heart break in my chest. I run my fingers over each one, and whispered a little prayer for them. I walked away to continue my volunteered grave cleaning duties and feeling a little strange tug to go back to the little one's graves and stay there. After a few moments, I stopped under a large tree for a rest, drenched in sweat. Someone had hung a wind chime over another grave. On the same tree, I blankly studied it, listening to my grandmother and father talking across the graveyard. I could see the infant's grave out of the corner of my eye. I reached up to touch the chime. When I froze in place, a cold feeling slid down my spine and consumed my stomach. Without thinking, I turned quickly towards the infant's graves and stopped cold. A woman was standing beside the second stone. She had ebony black hair down to her thin waist, and she was wearing the old-fashioned blue dress that looked straight out of the 1900s. That wasn't the most remarkable thing about her. Her face was smooth, round, and pale, and literally blank. She had no eyes, lips, nose, nothing. I gasped 
and voluntarily took a step backwards, flinching at the sight. When I recovered, she had vanished without a trace. The last thing I wanted to mention about the cemetery is another night. I actually went back to the cemetery on my own, and I noticed something that was really, really alarming. What I noticed was something so alarming that it literally made my face turn pale. Now, I'm not saying this was a ghost, but I saw a group of people who were in a circle around a gravestone. Even creepier, they all had what looked like brown robes on and hoods on. It was like some sort of cult. That's why I can't immediately just say that it was a ghost or a group of ghosts because it's pretty obvious that it may have been something else. Maybe it was just some sort of evil ritual that they were performing out there. But I didn't want to last long over there, so I bolted. How's that for a couple of crazy encounters with some spiritual entities or some cult-like figures? Anyway, I really hope you enjoy these pair of stories. They weren't the longest in the world, but I think they were very effective. What do you think? Let me know. When I was four, I shared a room with my mother. I slept in a toddler bed that was low to the ground. If I laid on my side, I could see under her bed. One night after she turned out the lights and got into bed, I happened to look over and see these red eyes staring at me from under her bed. I was so scared that I couldn't move and just continued staring at it. The eyes were close to the ground and did not blink. I finally started to scream and cry. My mom jumped out of bed and turned on the light. She looked under the bed and so did I. There was nothing there. She turned out the light and got back into bed. The eyes were there again. This happened three times that night but never happen again. This is where it gets really freaky. When my oldest daughter was four, she was playing in her room alone. When she started screaming, I ran in and asked her what was wrong. She told me that there were red eyes looking at her from her toy box. I had never told her what had happened to me. Well, I completely flipped out and we ended up running from the room. She never slept in there again. I recently asked her about this, and she told me that the eyes were looking back and forth, but didn't blink. I wonder if this is some kind of demon or something. When my middle daughter was four, she told me that angels talked to her at night. She's five now and it doesn't happen anymore. My son is about to turn four next month, and I'm terrified of what supernatural thing will happen to him. My only consolation is that it should only happen when he's four. This is not my actual personal experience. The house that I currently live in is extremely old and has a lot of history. My aunt had once lived in this house before me and my family. She had never experienced anything out of the ordinary. She had just come back from the hospital, having just given birth to her newborn daughter. The night she had returned home, she had done everything as normal and had gone to bed. The baby's cot stood just across the room. She woke up in the middle of the night simply terrified by what she saw. A ghost with a small figure at its side stood looking into the cot holding a knife. My aunt first lay frozen in her bed, not knowing what to do. She finally worked up the courage after several minutes and ran to grab the newborn baby and ran out of the house. The room in which this occurred is now my room, and I can honestly say I've never seen an apparition, but I've heard many things during the night, 
It's not just when I once heard the banging footsteps of someone climbing the stairs. This had really frightened me. So the next day, I'd asked my sister if she had heard the noises. She replied yes. The weird noises continue up until this day. But we are now used to this. So we never really get scared. As we had done years ago. But just several weeks ago, my sister lay in her room watching TV, and all of a sudden, a black figure emerged in the corner of the room. The figure vanished, and we have never heard or seen anything unusual since. My name is Sam. I've been interested in ghost spirits and other unexplained phenomena for years now. When I was young, between the ages of 6 to about 13, I had experiences in the house I grew up in. I'm now 29 years old, but I know that something happened and that there are things that we as people can't even explain. My story takes place in Tallahassee, Florida, home of the Seminoles. I was about 6 or 7 years old. I always heard footsteps walking down the hall of my house. And sometimes, it sounded like the floor was just simply creaking. Like old wood, I guess. The creaking sound moved down the hall like footsteps, though. On several incidents, I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear footsteps in the hallway. I never saw any apparitions, but I'm sure they exist. There is a sleep paralysis where you can wake up from your sleep, but not be able to move. I've seen many accounts of this on your website. I've personally have awakened plenty of times in my youth, and could do nothing except look around in my room. I've never felt as if someone was holding me down, but I'm 100% positive I was wide awake, and I couldn't move. On one occasion, a Saturday morning, I woke to the sun shining through my window. I wasn't scared, mainly because it was daytime. About 10 a.m. in the morning, when I was frozen solid, I tried my hardest to move my legs, my arms, and just talk, but I couldn't do anything. In the past, I would just lay there, and in time, the paralyzing feeling went away. This morning, I decided to lie in bed and just wait. What seemed like minutes was only seconds when I heard whispering just above and behind my head. My bed was against a wall and my dresser was a foot or two away from the head of my bed against another wall. In the corner, the whispers came from that corner. It sounded as if two people were telling secrets just behind me. At this point, I snapped free from my frozen state and immediately jumped out of bed and dashed into the kitchen where my mother was cooking breakfast. I know something was there, but I was so scared that I didn't look back. I clenched my mom's legs and she asked me what's wrong. I explained to her what had happened and she kind of blew it off. There is no solid evidence that anything had happened, but I know what I experienced. That wasn't the only thing to happen. If you live in Florida, then you've experienced a hurricane. Hurricane Kate hit Florida in the mid-1980s. My mother was a single mom at the time. It was trapped at City Hall during the hurricane. She worked for the city, so during the bad storm, they didn't want to let them drive in the weather and asked the workers to stay until the storm let up. My brother is about five years older than me, so my mom called and asked him to watch out for us until she could get home. The hurricane soon knocked the power out in the entire neighborhood and probably in several parts of the city. She called again and asked my brother and I to sit in the hall. There were no windows or doors. 
until the storm stopped. I, being the younger of the two brothers, felt comfortable with my brother and soon dozed off to sleep. When I fell asleep, my brother said he began to hear footsteps walking up and down the hall. Sometimes the footsteps walked right past us. He also said, no matter how hard he tried to wake me, I wouldn't wake up. So he had to endure the steps and freaky sounds alone. He said it sounded as if three or four people were in the hall walking around. When I woke up, city workers were outside working on the telephone pole, trying to restore electricity to the neighborhood. My brother was curled up by the front door, almost relieved to see light, even if it was just lights from the work truck and light from the sparks of labor to the transformer on the pole. At this time, my brother told me about the footsteps he had heard and how happy he was the lights were coming back on. Other incidents happened, but nothing really worth talking about. I just wanted to share my story because the site is very interesting. I have two experiences that I know are so unusual that I thought I might share. It's a little short, but I know that these were some freaky ghost occurrences and I simply can't not tell it. My eyes don't play tricks on me and I wasn't tired are hallucinating. In fact, this first story, especially my friend's experience, was also very real and happened at school. I was about eight years old. I was riding my bike in trails of the woods near our house. I had been riding for so long that I lost track of time. And being an eight-year-old kid, of course it was the time of my life. I ended up getting lost in the woods and the trail for quite some time. It had to be a couple hours, and it started to get dark. So as the sun was setting, I tried to make my way back the way I entered. As I was going through the woods, I ended up going through a cornfield, and from a distance, what I saw couldn't be ignored. I saw a short figure of a man just standing in between the cornfield bushes. It almost looked like a leprechaun. Obviously, I know leprechauns aren't real, but it was the best way I could describe this ghost. It was a scraggly looking thing, and stood three to four feet tall. It disappeared after a few minutes and was gone. I am the only person who ever saw this thing. There was never any mention of a ghost near these cornfields for a while. I didn't even want to say anything for the fear of looking crazy. Plus, at eight years old, who will take what I saw seriously? Today, there are houses where I saw it, so the cornfield doesn't even exist anymore. Another weird thing that happened, happened to my friends at school. Between the Christian middle school and high schools in town, there are some woods here. I never saw this, but some of my friends at the time did. One time, they looked into the brush and saw a pale-faced man in a hoodie or a robe of some sort. I'm guessing that it was some sort of ghost monk or something. They looked lost, but he didn't move at all. He was just squatting in some brush. When I was told about it, it made me realize that my experience might have been tied to this one that I wasn't as crazy as I thought. What happened was just odd. It's possible that the guy in the robe just could have been a creepy dude spying on the school. Personally, I think the one at school was just some weirdo. But the leprechaun could be something. However, I wouldn't just write it off, as I know that'd be hypocritical in doing so. Thanks for listening. Let me know what you think. A couple of months ago, I was living in a house with my friends that had a history of strange sightings and stories. 
I personally had never seen anything there, but had somewhere else. That was about to change. I was standing in the kitchen with one of my friends, and we were the only two people in the house at this time. The kitchen door was slightly open, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a gentle whisper in my ear. As I looked towards the door, I saw a lady walk past the door, wearing jeans and trainers towards the front entrance of the home. At first, I thought it was my friend Laura, who always used to wear jeans, so I popped my head around the corner to try and scare her, but there was no one there. I wasn't scared because it was in the middle of the day. I actually found the experience quite exciting but also unexplainable. We bought my father's-in-law house with the understanding that he was to stay with us so we could take care of him. He was in his mid-70s and not in the best of health. Before we moved in, we turned the two upstairs bedrooms into three bedrooms. My husband was upstairs taking the panels off the walls and called me upstairs to figure out how and where to move the heating duct. As soon as I got to the top of the stairs, my husband hung his hammer on a nail that was sticking out of a stud. We were standing right next to the stud the whole time I was upstairs with him. We were the only two upstairs. When we were finished talking, he went to grab for his hammer. It was no longer hanging on the stud. We looked for it for about 15 minutes before finding it under a pile of panels about 10 feet away from the stud it was hung on. We just gave each other a raised eyebrow look and didn't say anything about it. The TV would always turn on and off by itself. It was my father-in-law's TV that was sat in the living room. It was the only TV in the house that did that, no matter what outlet it was plugged into. I would turn it off, and by the time I would walk into the kitchen, it would be on again. I would have to say something like, I don't have time to play right now, before I would finally stop. I was at work the night my father-in-law passed away. It was 3 a.m. on a Monday morning, when one of the high-low drivers broke a main water line that caused all the presses to be shut down. I'd been working there for two years, and had never seen or heard all of the press operators being sent home, as there is always something else for us to do. I went straight home, and straight into my father-in-law's room to check on him, and tell him what happened. We had a close bond, and talked about everything. He was gone. His estimated time of death was 3 a.m. It may have been a coincidence, but man, what a coincidence. After my father-in-law passed away, I experienced only one more thing. I was up in my room and heard my son call me from the kitchen. I was at the top of the stairs, and he was at the bottom of the stairs. He asked me what I wanted. I asked him what he meant, because I heard him call me. He just shook his head and said, Oh, not this again. I came home from work early again one night, about a month after my father-in-law had passed away. I walked into my son's room to see if he was home yet. He was lying in his bed with the blankets over his head. My son was 18 at the time. I whispered, are you still awake? He popped out his head from under his blanket and told me that he heard footsteps in his room just a few minutes before I got home. Could have been the cat, I told him. No, definitely human, he said. But when he looked to see who it was, there was nobody there. My oldest brother heard me and her brother talking downstairs and came down. She told me about an hour before I got home. She thought she heard someone walking around downstairs. She thought it was her brother. She heard footsteps from his room to the bathroom. She went downstairs and peeked her head in his room, not in there. She walked to the bathroom, but the door was standing open 
So she knew he wasn't in there. She was spooked. So she went upstairs and didn't come back down until I got home. We moved to a big old farmhouse in 2004. In my former residence where myself, my husband and my teenage son lived, there were lots of paranormal happenings. All three of us experienced strange things, but the one that was the most bizarre happened while I was asleep in my bed. My husband had gone away on business for a few days, so I was alone this particular night. My son was asleep in his room down the hall. I owned a large male cat named Bing, who almost always spent the night on my bed. I also had a hamster that was kept in a cage in my son's bedroom. The cage door was broken, so we tied it up with baggy ties. She had escaped once or twice, so I had planned on buying a new cage the next day. As I lay sleeping in my bed, I could remember hearing someone yelling in my ear, wake up several times. I then found myself standing in the hallway, and to my disbelief, my cat had the hamster cornered and was about to pounce. I screamed for my son, and he came to the rescue before anything could happen. Someone had made sure that I would wake up in time, that's for sure. I know I heard those words wake up repeated several times. I was not terribly afraid at the time because I figured that this entity had to be friendly. Before I moved into the house on Willoughby Lane, I never had given the slightest thought to paranormal activities, and had always dismissed it with a wave of the hand and an offhand comment of how such things are scientifically impossible. However, all that changed a few years ago when myself and my newly acquired husband decided to buy an old farmhouse in upstate New York. The real estate agent, while giving us a tour of the home, had in fact related some disturbing information to us. She told us about 20 years ago, a young woman who had lived there with her two sons and her father, who apparently was an alcoholic as well as an abusive parent, had gone missing. Her remains had never been found. There had been almost certain proof that her father had murdered her, and was shortly thereafter tried, and sentenced to ten years in prison, where he had almost died. I thought nothing of this, except for the fact that one day I might be gardening and dig up a little bit more than dirt. However, this did not stop us from buying the home, which was gorgeous, with green shutters, a post and bean barn which was in good repair, and a drive that was lined in grand old maple trees. But my friend, who was indeed a strong believer in the supernatural, strongly advised us that there might be what she called restless spirits residing in the home. Again, me being convinced that there was no such thing did not take her warning seriously. After a long day of moving all of our possessions into a newly bought home, I'd fallen asleep in what was soon to be the living room. The movers had helped me bring in our couch, as well as an old rocking chair we had found in the barn. Both my husband and I thought we were able to save the old thing, which was made of oak and not damaged, except for the fact that the seat itself was no longer there. I was snoring away on the couch when I awoke, drowsily, to a consistent creaking. My husband, who was at work, and the movers, who had long since gone home, were absent, leaving me alone in the home. As I looked around, I noticed that the rocking chair was moving, as if someone was in it. Needless to say, I was incredibly scared and proceeded to throw a book I had been reading at the chair or running out of the home. As the weeks passed, more and more of these types of things would happen, all ending with me rather frightened. 
things would disappear and reappear without notice, some of which would never be there in the first place. Some of these items consisted of a wide collection of women's jewelry that I occasionally would find in what we found out later used to be a bedroom. Though we converted it into a study, I would hear knockings. Doors would open and shut for no apparent reason. We would occasionally hear the faint creaking of the rocking chair, even though I had insisted it would be placed back in the barn. Occasionally, I would hear hushed voices and see flashes of what appeared to be figures out of the corner of my eye. This behavior increased as time passed, till I was starting to get used to it. I even admit to talking with the spirit whenever I was alone in the home. I would always be rewarded with an abrupt cease in all abnormal activity. On the evening of the housewarming party me and my husband were holding, one of my friends came to me in a state of anxiety. They said that they had been in the basement when they saw a woman standing there, staring at them, then turning and vanishing. Myself and a few others hurried down to the basement where we looked all over, trying to find the woman. What we did find was a hidden cupboard with what was later confirmed to be the remains of Sue Hoover, the woman who disappeared nearly 20 years ago. After this finding, the noises and sightings immediately stopped and we have yet to hear the slightly disturbing creak of the old rocking chair, which we eventually moved back into the home and repaired. However, I will never forget my experiences that year, and never again doubt the existence of spirits in the physical world again. I am a great fan of your site, and have submitted some of my own stories. The other day, I remembered an experience my sister Christy had many years ago. Although I was not a direct witness to this, I was there when she came home in hysterics. She was in such a state that we all thought she was attacked, and we could not get any sense out of her. The story goes like this. Christy had been walking home from a friend's house down a long lane called Langley Lane. On the right hand side of this lane, there was a field which was used for cattle from a local farm. There was also a book with a large tree hanging over it. The summer before, I think this happened later in the year, as it was quite dark early, a young man had hanged himself from this tree during a fit of depression. I recall that other people have hanged themselves there too, at least one other one that I know of. I think I was about 16 at the time, I'm now 36, and Christy would have been about 11. Anywho, myself and my brother were sat in the house one evening, and that's when we heard Christy loudly banging on the front door to be let in. She was crying hysterically, and was trying to talk but couldn't. She was obviously very distressed, and we thought that she had been attacked. When she eventually did calm down, which was sometime later that evening, she told me what had happened. She said that she was walking down Langley Lane when she looked over at the tree and saw a figure hanging from it. She said that the figure was glowing white and had a bend in its neck like its neck had been broken. She then proceeded to run all the way home which was a distance of about a quarter of a mile. She did not want to tell her brother, as she thought he would not believe her. Having had experiences myself, I am open-minded and certainly don't feel like she made it up. She has always stood by her story. I was looking at your haunted places in Houston, Texas. I grew up there. I came across the Jefferson Davis Hospital, and it reminded me of something. Once after a good night of hanging out, a group of friends and I decided to go and check it out. 
When we got there, I immediately felt unwanted. My skin crawled with fear. I kept telling everyone that we were not welcome there. We were only equipped with several lighters, so the shadows were unbelievable. We kept hearing people talk, thinking it was someone else in the hospital. Someone would call out, but nobody would answer. I kept feeling something touch my back, thinking it was my boyfriend. I turned around, but he was a couple of feet away from me. The entire time I was there, I kept telling him that we needed to leave. My friends got annoyed with me, so we decided to leave. As we were leaving the building, I was holding my boyfriend's hand, and something shoved me. I fell so hard that I twisted my ankle. It was swollen for weeks, and my doctor couldn't tell me why. Nothing was broken. It finally healed after six months. I still have problems with my ankle to this day. I have an experience that I would like to submit to the website. I have attached it below. After my encounter one late night in August with my sister, I found out that we'd always been around ghosts. My family has moved five times, and in every place, there had been at least one ghost there with us. When I lived in Texas, I moved from Houston to San Antonio. In that move, a ghost that we'd had for a year followed us to our new apartment. After living there for about a year, we discovered a new ghost. This one would hold the bathroom doors closed and knock over items we had on display. The event that completely changed my view of the paranormal happened in August of 2001. It was the early hours of the morning, about 4 a.m., and for some reason, I couldn't sleep. My older sister was on her computer, and she found a bunch of old music files she had downloaded for her history of rock class. Then she came across a Britney Spears parody song, downloaded from a radio station's website. The song itself was actually an e-clip, about 30 to 40 seconds long. We played it, and for some reason the file was corrupt. The words were garbled, playing in a slow, deep, incomprehensible voice. I had chills listening to it play, and when I looked at the counter, it had been playing for over a minute. My sister finally turned it off. She was just as spooked as I was. We moved on, laughing about the look on each other's face. Then, about five minutes later, we heard three soft, solid pounds in the back wall in the far back of the apartment. Neither one of us said a word. We just listened, trying to explain away in our minds. We lived on the second floor and shared only one wall. And that was not it. Another couple seconds passed by and the banging jumped to the one long wall we shared, still towards the back of the apartment, but getting closer. We couldn't help but to stare at each other. After that one, we finally decided to ask others if she had heard that. Of course we heard the same thing, and not a minute later, the banging jumped to the room next to us, on the same wall. Three solid bangs escalating in amplitude. My heart was racing, waiting for the next set, afraid of where it would jump next. A couple of minutes passed, and just as it began to calm down and blame the banging on the maintenance worker that we shared the wall with, the banging suddenly jumped forward to the wall behind the computer. I looked above me to see the ceiling light shaking. Moments later, the banging shot across the room to the balcony. It sounded as if the entire wall was pounded on with one giant fist. Three echoing pounds later, everything stopped. I checked the sliding doors, and they were locked, thankfully. We both ran into my mother's room, and somehow she was still sleeping. She hadn't heard a thing. That was something I never understood. 
My baby brother was in the same room with her, the door closed, and he heard a soft rumble, and my mother heard nothing. After that experience, I've always been a little on edge. I always think about what would have happened if I had left the sliding doors unlocked that night, and what the thing was trying to get in. One thing I know for sure is that my ghost from Houston left that night, and the one already there seemed to get more active. Everyone started to hear their name being called, even when no one was around. Luckily, no one ever attempted to communicate with whatever it was. As a matter of fact, we rarely began to answer unless we saw the person who was calling us. Two years later, after I finished high school, we moved to Iowa when I was accepted to college, and so far, we have not had any strange paranormal occurrences. Eight years ago, myself, my husband and my brother lived at this home. We were told by the neighbor that no one ever lasts, and we didn't either. Not because of the haunting, but because we needed to come back to Massachusetts for family reasons. Anyway, we lived in this house for nine months. We were told the AC was broken, and in the Valley of Folsom it gets very hot, but not in our living room. It was always very cool in that part of the home. On one occasion, I was in the bathroom, and after my shower, I was looking towards the mirror, and I saw an orange blur over my shoulder. I turned to look, but it wasn't there. It looked as though it was a face, and it would have been standing at the right height, to where a head would be on a grown man. After a few weeks, I mentioned it to my brother and my husband, and my brother relayed a story about one night, while sound asleep, he was awoken by a very large thud on his bed. He said it felt like a bowling ball had landed on the bed, like someone sat down. He said he was too scared to look, so he fell back to sleep. After a few more months, we found out that the house used to belong to the town doctor that treated inmates from the Folsom prison back in the 1800s. After putting all the info together, we realized we were living in a haunted home. I was hoping to see other stories about the house on this website. Maybe my story will start to flow. When I was 11, my father died from a heart attack in our home. Because of the trauma on my little sister, she witnessed people trying to resuscitate him. Our mother decided to move. We ended up moving just a little bit further down the road, into an older house that had been built in the early 70s. The owner of the house also died in the house many years before. It was a two-story house, and the bottom level was made of cinder block. I'm guessing because of this, it was the reason that it was always cold downstairs. Luck or unluck would have it that the bottom level would be mine and my sister's rooms. It always was a creepy feeling downstairs. It always felt like you were being watched, but I always just chalked it up to an overactive imagination. Me and my sister both felt uncomfortable in the downstairs area. It consisted of our two rooms, a laundry room, and a cellar. One morning, when I was 14, I was standing in front of my dresser and putting on my makeup. Then, I heard a voice come up to my right ear and whisper my name. The fact that on my right side was a wall really freaked me out. I ran upstairs and asked my mom had she called for me. She told me that she had not. I hated sleeping in that room from that time on and always tried to sleep with the light on even though it drove my mom nuts. My sister had a similar experience. I was staying at my friend's house one night, and my sister went upstairs to make sure the door leading outside was closed. She said that as she went to place her foot on the bottom step, 
She said something came up to her and whispered my name. She said that she also experienced things being thrown in the dark when there was no one to throw them, such as a sock. My mom lives there by herself now, and as far as I know, she has never had anything odd happen to her, but whenever I visit, she knows that I will not sleep in the lower bedrooms. I still feel odd in the lower level, but not as bad as I used to. If anyone has any thoughts or suggestions on this, I would love to hear it. Feel free to email me. Hi, I'm 40 years old, and this story is very true. When my brother, sister, and I were young, about seven, eight, or nine, maybe even younger, we used to see what we would call the brown man. He was brown from head to toe. We came to the conclusion he was a shadow spirit, but with a literal brown look, not talking skin, but visibly brown. His hat, his face, his clothes, and his shoes were all brown, different shades, but all brown. We would see him periodically and take off running when we did, but our parents never would see him. We'd walk from the kitchen and turn the corner, and he'd just be standing there. Sometimes we'd hear the toilet set drop, just little things. After we grew up, my sister was about 25 when she had her first child. She had a girl. My sister's daughter used to what we thought talked to herself when she was about two or three years old, and my sister decided it was time to ask her who she was talking to. And her daughter told her, Mr. Burgess. This went on for some time. She would play, have tea parties, and sing with him just about every time she was in my parents' home. Well, one day, my niece asked my sister why Mr. Burgess wore brown all the time. Needless to say, that really shook us up because we thought we saw the brown man. We would tease each other and say, the brown man's behind you and get a real kick out of it. I've since had three children and my sister and another daughter, but they've never come in contact or ever seen the brown man. We live in a haunted house. It is really not bad once you get used to it. In fact, at times when there's no activity, you can actually get a little lonesome for them. We moved here in 1982. It wasn't long after we settled into our new house that we bumped into the former owner at the local church. She asked us if we had seen the ghost. We didn't know what she was talking about. She said it sometimes appears in the front bedroom, our daughter's room, as a shadowy figure of a woman in a rocking chair. Our daughter overheard us talking about it and she said, Oh, that must be the lady who sits in the chair at my desk at night. She doesn't bother me, just sits there kind of watching after me. We had noticed some strange things in the house, but put them off to natural causes such as the reoccurring footsteps in the hardwood floors after we went to bed, the strange way the television would turn on and off by itself, other electric appliances doing funny things, and objects disappearing then turning up somewhere else, but we dismissed the idea of it being ghosts until one late night. My wife woke up thirsty in the middle of the night, so she went to the kitchen to get a drink. When she got to the living room, she saw someone in the shadows in the middle of the room. Thinking one of the kids had gotten out of bed, she hollered, Get your butt back in bed. The figure streaked off and disappeared. It didn't go around the sofa. It went through the sofa. It didn't walk. It glided. It was the figure of a woman with long black hair. The kids were sound asleep in their beds. My wife came back to bed without her water. My first experience with her was about 10 p.m. one night. I was walking home from next door, and as I approached the driveway, I saw a figure of a woman walking in the drive. She was cutting across the edge of the lawn on the north side of my shop about 20 feet away. The light on the north side of the shop was on, illuminating her faintly. I could make out no details of her, only a dark figure of a slender woman walking briskly towards our house from the west. As I got in range of the motion detector light on the east side of my workshop, it came on. The figure vanished. 
This phantom female I saw matched the description of the Dark Woman other family members have seen in our house. But the Dark Woman is not the only spirit in our home. We have discovered there are others. Some are shy and reclusive. Some are a little mischievous and playful. They like to play with stuff. Just to let you know they are there, I think. They hide things. You put something down and a minute later it is gone. You search all over and then find it right back where you laid it in the first place. They turn things on and off. TVs, radios, just about anything, even water faucets. One morning, my son went into the kitchen to get a drink of water. Uh, Dad, Dad, come here. I went into the kitchen to see what was wrong. What's this all about? My son asked. He was standing back from the sink, pointing to the faucet, which was running full blast. My wife was standing beside him. The knob is turned off, but it's still running, he said. We stood and watched it for a minute. Figuring a faulty valve, I started to walk towards the sink to try to turn it off by myself, and suddenly, it just stopped. Turned off all by itself. I looked it over, turned it on, and then turned it back off again. It worked fine. I checked the valves the next day, and everything was functioning properly and has worked fine since. TVs are a real favorite. I was waking up from a nap one evening when I heard the television on in the living room. I assumed my son was home and was watching a movie. As I rose, I heard the television turn off. When I went into the living room, the lights were off, the television was off, the door was still locked, and my son was not there. My wife and I were the only people in the house, and she was still sleeping. I turned on the television, and the same movie I had heard from the bedroom was playing. Radios are popular with them too. On another occasion with my wife, my daughter and I were watching television in the living room. All of a sudden, the CD player comes on and starts playing a CD at high volume. My wife got up and turned it off. Reaction from all of us was very casual. Go to grandma's if you want to listen to music. We are watching TV, I jokingly said out loud. At the time, my mother was living in a mogul home behind the property. My sister was staying with her. I found out the next day they took my suggestion to heart. My sister called. I went out to go to work, she said. The radio in the van was playing. I thought someone left it on. Oh great, now the battery will be dead, I thought. Then I realized the radio doesn't work unless the key is on. I was holding the key in my hand. That's weird, I thought. I unlocked the door and I reached in to turn off the radio and it was already off. It quit playing when I touched it, so I put the keys in the ignition and turned on the radio and it came on. I turned off the ignition and it went off. Ignition on, radio on. Ignition off, radio off. Does not work without a key. How is it playing without the key and the ignition and the knob turned off? She asked. We have all gotten used to our ghosts now. Our children have grown up around them and have their own stories. The friends in ours have all been scared out of their wits a time or two, but are accustomed to it now. New friends take a little time to get acclimated, though. My son was in his teenage years, and most of his friends knew about our house. His new friend Jason did not, though. My wife and I had gone out for the evening, and my son was having a party. All his friends were over. Everyone was having a good time but Jason. He was tired. Jason was new to Tommy's parties. Jason was also new to our house. If he had known about the things that happened here, he might have not left the main group and gone to the game room where it was quiet. Most of our friends know and have experienced eerie things while here with enough frequency that it really doesn't surprise them. Ah, but Jason was new. Bright picklings from a mischievous ghost. So Jason left the party and went into the game room by himself, where he laid on the floor to get a little rest. My son and his friends were only a little surprised to see Jason run into the living room pale and frightened. The pinball machine, Jason said. Flash Gordon, it came on all by itself and started playing itself. There's nobody in there, and it just came on and started playing. Yeah, so, responded my son's other friend, who was so accustomed to such things here. Flash was Philip's favorite machine, my son explained casually. Philip was our nephew who died in an accident a short time before. He was probably just enjoying a round of pinball, said my son. He is a nice guy. He won't bother you. Everyone went on about having fun, except for Jason. He stuck close to the group for the rest of the night, but he never came back to our house. There have been times when these spirits have saved the day for us. We once awoke to find a fire had started on our patio by a candle left burning when we went to bed. About 15 square feet of one wall covered in rattan was charred from the flames but somehow, mysteriously, it had gone out by itself. The dry rattan, though very flammable, had just stopped burning. 
this was not the only time. It had only been a couple of weeks since we buried my wife's brother, Virgil. Tragically, he was killed by a car while walking home. My wife had been cleaning out his mobile home next door. A terrible task, but she faced it with courage and fortitude. Sometimes I think she is operating an automatic pilot. She came home and told me. I saw him. Virgil. He was just standing there in the doorway of his trailer while I was sorting out his things. He said nothing. Then he disappeared. A few days after that, my dad came into the shop where I was working. Do you know the door on Virgil's mobile home is open? He asked. No, I replied. I'll check it out. The home was vacant since Virgil died. We were watching his property while probate proceeded. I walked over and saw the front door ajar. I feared the worst, that the vacant home had been broken into. We were careful to lock the door and no one else had a key. I carefully entered the premises. The overwhelming odor was unmistakable. Propane, strong. I had to exit immediately, a gas leak. The house was full of it. I went to the rear of the home and found the main gas valve. I turned it off. Covering my mouth, I entered the home again. Quickly, I began opening windows. I could not stay in there for very long. I can't believe this place didn't blow up, I said to myself. It's a good thing the front door was open, but how did the front door get open anyway? Sometimes they go with us. Sort of a spirit field trip, I suppose. In 1998, my wife and I took on extra jobs. I was managing and bartending at a local hotel bar, and my wife was the cocktail waitress. I guess they got lonesome for us. No one at home to pester and all. Maybe just bored. So they started going to work with us. We were at the lounge. It started out small. TV on, TV off. Glasses doing funny stuff. That sort of thing. We had closed for the night. It was clean up time. I was walking to the kitchen when I heard a noise from the juice box. The pages of cards which show the selections were flipping on their own. Page after page flipped, all in one direction, then it would switch and go back the other direction. This was just the start. They seemed to prefer after hours at the bar. We were cleaning up one night when we decided the small table and chairs would look better if I moved them farther away from the pool table. I moved them over near the dance floor. I proceeded to clean the rest of the bar. When I turned around, the table and chairs we moved are back in their original positions by the pool table. The next night we decided to mess with them. After closing, we rearranged the entire setup in the bar. Tables, chairs, everything. Then we went to my office, got our stuff together to go home, and walked out to find everything back where it was originally. What had taken us a couple of hours to do, they had accomplished in a few minutes. We have lived here in the magic spot about 25 years now. I have notebooks full of activity, notes about ghostly occurrences, sightings, etc. We have never tried photography, but being an artist, I have done paintings of some of the entities we have here. We also experience really odd weather patterns, most often in the winter. Radios and televisions, actually just about any electronic device, is likely to act up when used here, and we have learned more about the history of this area. A local Native American medicine man once told me this place gives them the willies. Teenagers refer to this place and the surrounding area as the magic spot and have many stories about it. Over the years, we have actually had a good relationship with our ghosts. Though at times mischievous, for the most part, they just go about their own business and we do the same. We do at times bump into each other, however. Sometimes it is as much surprise to them as it is to us. Sometimes it is nice to have them around. Other times it can be quite frightening. I was actually surprised one late night, and it and I streaked off in opposite directions. I don't know which of us was more surprised. They have become as much a part of our home as our family members. It wouldn't be the same without them. As the youngest of five children, all boys, and the son of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, supernatural followers will know that means a white witch. I've seen many strange things. I and my brothers grew up in what would be described as a haunted house. At a very young age, I loved to play in my parents' bedroom, which overlooked the landing, first two steps, and small landing at the top of the stairs. On an almost daily basis, I saw shadows walking along the landing. They were not ordinary shadows. These were floating. They were not cast on the wall, but were in mid-air, but I could see through them. As I got older, they seemed to happen less frequently. I still see these shadows occasionally, out of the corner of my eye. In the early 80s, 
My brothers discovered the Ouija board method of entertainment, which heralded some very interesting results. On one such session on the Ouija board, the spirit known to us as Paraga put us in touch with a chap called Ray with a message for my father. I can't remember the surname that we were given, but we passed the message on to my father, who accused us of conspiring with my mother to try to persuade him that Ouija board works. Of course, this was simply not the case. It turned out that his friend Ray had committed suicide while my eldest brother was very young. Therefore, it would be impossible for us to know anything about it unless we were told by someone. We simply had no knowledge prior to the session of events that had taken place so many years before. On another occasion when I was 11 or 12, we had a very strange encounter. My mother and father were out for the evening and my brothers were left to look after me. The session took place in the dining room which had one exit into the kitchen. From the kitchen, you could exit to the hall towards the front door or a door latch with one bolt lock to the back garden and side entrance to the property. There was a window looking into the garden that the strange phenomena took place in. It was a strange session that seemed to pick up an angry persona. All of a sudden, there was a bluish glowing light out the back of the house and the window started to shake violently. As we made a mad dash for the kitchen, the door to the back garden also started to shake violently. We all ran for our lives out the front door and scattered in all directions up and down the road. There was snow on the ground and I was dressed in PJs and no shoes. It was almost half an hour and much deliberation before we returned to the house and went in. There were no signs of any strange happenings. We used playing cards with letters drawn on the back and yes and no written on separate cards and numbers in the middle of the table in a row and some excellent shaped wine glasses that were virtually impossible to push. In an early experiment, the glass zoomed round and round with great speed. All of a sudden, it left the table lifting up to the top corner of the room and smashing it to small pieces. Even the stem and base broke into pieces, the biggest the size of your little fingernail. Anyone who has ever broken a wine glass will know it takes a tremendous force to break the stem and base to that extent. In 1985 at the age of 15, I was walking home to the family home around 10pm from a friend's house. It was a wet and windy night and I walked with a collar up on my coat with my chin tucked into the top of my zip, only looking up every now and then to see where I was going. There was a small village in the outskirts of the city, just down the road from the family home. I was walking towards the village, where I would have to turn right to go in the right direction to get home. Approximately a thousand yards before the road I was walking along came to an end. There was a ten-story block of flats, and next to that, a retirement home. As you get nearer to the end of the road, approximately 500 yards from the end, there was a row of attendant bungalow flats going along the road I was approaching and intending to turn right towards home. To the left was a large grass area between them and the main road. I passed the end bungalow flat, heading to the T-junction with the grass area to my left and approximately 100 yards of space all around me to the nearest object, some small bushes. All of a sudden, I saw a pair of brown shoes come into view a couple of steps in front of me. Startled, I looked up to see an elderly gentleman in front of me. I took a step sideways and went around him. Something struck me as strange and after a few more steps, I turned around to see nobody behind me. There was absolutely no way that the old man walking slowly with a walking stick could possibly have moved quick enough to get behind something to obscure him from my view in such a short time. In fact, the distance between me and the nearest object was too great for Ben Johnson at his prime to reach before I turned around. It wasn't until I thought about it while walking home that it struck me what it was that was so strange about the gentleman when I first laid eyes on him. Despite being quite persistent, rain and strong wind driving the rain, the man was dry and there were no drops hitting him. He was all dressed in brown. Brown shoes, suit, and flat cap. I can't remember the color of his shirt or if he was wearing a tie, but I will never forget his face as he smiled a gentle smile thanks as he moved out of his way. His features were very clear. I have never seen him since. This village was quite a friendly community where most people knew everyone else, but I did not recognize this gentleman. There were many strange things that happened in the family home, from power cuts that were localized to just our house in the whole street. We had electricity meters that took coins to pay for the electricity supply. If the electricity went out, it should need to be topped up by popping a coin in the slot. Even after putting money in the meter, the electricity would not work. It would be found to have been switched off, and in those days, there were no such things as circuit breakers that would trip the switch. 
When my father knocked out the dining room window to put in a patio door, we found three patio negatives of an old gypsy man. The first of him, out the front of his caravan. Another of him stood on the caravan steps and the last of him laid out dead. We intended to have them developed. They were missing from the place we put them. We assumed they fell down behind the kitchen cabinet where they were left. When the kitchen was remodeled, there was no signs of them and other things we assumed had fallen down behind the cabinets. On many occasions, I have told certain people to answer the phone because it was for them and it was. The problem was the phone had not actually rung until after I had told them but within a few seconds. I can't explain it, but it still happens. It was in October of 2004, around 3.30 in the morning. I was slowly waking and was in the state where I could hear the TV, but wasn't quite awake. I remember having this eerie, scared feeling, and in my sleep started singing Jesus Loves Me, the old childhood Sunday school song. Anyways, I remember feeling a presence on my legs, real heavy, and I felt something was watching me. I snapped awake and moved and the thing made a swooshing noise, and my cat even looked up in the air where this went over my head and out the door. I was on the couch and the front door was behind me. My cat was acting funny even before this, and at times, I would come home and feel a nervous, scared feeling like someone was in the house. That's when I saw it. It was the silhouette of the hat man. I looked petrified, and I couldn't just shake the feeling it was almost inside my head like it was screaming voices at me. The voices released from the hat man into my head were all mumbled, so I couldn't really understand any of them. A split second later, there is silence, and the hat man slowly fades into the abyss, actually fading into the TV screen once and for all. I don't know if this has anything to do with the paranormal, or if I'm just losing my mind. Was it sleep paralysis? Was the hat man real? Or was it just all in my imagination? I have no idea, but I'm kind of hoping and praying to God and Jesus that this doesn't even exist and that I'm all hallucinating this just to make myself feel better. As I previously stated, my cat has even noticed weird things that have occurred in this house, and I'm just not sure what to trust anymore. Are my senses going crazy? Am I just in touch with the paranormal? Am I opening up another portal? to the paranormal dimension in which beings and spirits, including the hat man, come to greet me with demonic images and voices in my head. I don't know, but I'm just hoping that I will never find out the true answer to this mystery. Thank you so much for reading. I know it's short, but thank you. In my life, my family and I had numerous paranormal incidents. There were always heavy footsteps, sounding like a person in boots upstairs in the attic, Sometimes I heard them coming down the stairs or on the front porch at night, but oftentimes I had trouble keeping them. They said the TV kept going off and on. One said she saw a man in the attic through the window. My boys were afraid to sleep in their room alone sometimes because they saw people in the backyard. There were two very strange occurrences that happened in the winter of 1991. I was married at the time to a man who was abusive to my children and myself when he drank. One night, I smelled something burning in the bedroom, and the bed was smoldering. I woke up my husband, and he pulled the mattress off the bed. There was a burning area right in the bottom of the top mattress. He had not been smoking in bed, and wouldn't have been there anyway. Another night, I took the kids to get ice cream. When I got back, the doors were all dead bolted and windows locked to where I couldn't get in. I looked through a crack in a curtain and saw my husband lying unconscious on the floor and the heavy dining room table was turned over. The phone was dangling from the wall. I pried open a window and climbed in. I called for an ambulance and called the police. My husband was taken to the hospital and the police detective was totally baffled. Later, my husband said that he was talking on the phone to his mother when he was hit hard from behind and knocked out. His mother called to check in on what had happened, saying they had been talking, she heard noises, and he was no longer there. I felt like maybe we had a ghost that was protective towards us, but angry with my husband for his actions. I usually felt safe in the house, but on occasions, I was very frightened. After my husband and I divorced, I felt the need to move. While checking out the history of the house later, I found that it was originally owned by a doctor who kept his ill patients in his home with him. This was in the early 1900s, around 1907. After he left, there was a terrible train wreck just outside of town where some Mexican immigrants and a couple of local workers were killed in a train collision. 
Their bodies were badly burnt and thrown into a massive grave, which turned out to be in the back acre of our yard. I feel certain that we had multiple spirits, though before this time, I never believed in ghosts. I was visiting California on a school trip. My friends and I were hanging out in the hotel's hot tub. We were playing truth or dare. I was dared to leave the hot tub and dive into the cold pool, then run back to the hot tub. I got out and went to the edge of the pool. Looking at the clear water, I dove in. Next thing I knew, I was face to face with a dead body. He was face down at the bottom of the pool. It was like it was slow motion. He turned to me with his eyes closed. He slowly opened his eyes and stared into my eyes. He was missing his left eye. I was scared. I breathed in to scream and breathed in water. I pushed through the dead man on accident and in my struggle to get to the top, I was thrashing around quite a bit. A friend came and helped me out, panting. I said I didn't feel like playing anymore. Me and my two friends went back to our hotel room. One friend was taking a shower and my other friend was watching TV. We noticed their phone blinking. We checked the messages. We had 362 messages. We were only out for an hour. We had no way to trace the calls. No one even knew our hotel phone number. We listened to the first few messages. They seemed like they were all blank. Finally, we heard something. One word, hell. This freaked me out. I haven't told about the man at the bottom of the pool. I tried to downplay the message. Later that night, we went to sleep. I don't recall any of this next part, but my friend said that at 3 a.m. I got up, turned on the curling iron, and turned on the faucet. I then hit my head really hard on the headboard of the bed and went back to sleep. I woke up that morning with nothing but an eerie feeling, which was soon forgotten since the next day we went to Disneyland. A week later, we drove home. The thought of this man still terrified me. I just pushed it to the back of my mind and continued on. I did not believe he wanted to harm or scare me though. Weeks went by. I remember doing chores around the house. I was putting laundry away in my mother's room. Her dresser has a huge mirror. After placing the clothes in the drawer, I looked up into the mirror. Standing behind me in the back of the room was this man. I could see him very clearly. He was young, long blondish hair. His skin was grayed and almost green, waterlogged, and a little wet looking. His good eye was brown, and where his other eye should have been was just a hole. It seemed to go on forever. It was almost hypnotizing. I noticed this all in an instant, because when I turned around, this young man turned and walked away. I sensed that his name was William. I didn't see William for a very long time, although I felt him following me. Our house began to change. Radios would turn on when they weren't even plugged in. A music box would start to play randomly. Shells would fall off the wall. Everyone noticed it. Everyone was afraid. I wasn't. Years went by. I started to feel a difference over me. At night, I would wake up to voices in my room, like a crowded room where you could hear only a few words that made sense. I tried to ignore the voices. Sometimes, I would wake up with a single voice in my ear talking to me. They seemed to never make sense. It was like the end of a sentence or the beginning. I remember waking up one night. I felt scared for the rest of the time. It was very late at night. I knew no one was awake. A blue light was outside and a closed door. My door began to shake very violently, but the beads on my door didn't even sway. I kept all of this to myself. Who wanted to tell their friends and family they heard voices in their head and see people in swimming pools? I don't think so. Later that year, I moved out and started going to college. My family said that since I left, the strange happenings seemed to have moved out when I did. Strangely, my roommate said that since I moved in, strange things started happening. Pictures falling off the walls, TVs turning on, shadows, and the feeling of being watched. I still heard voices at night, but never anything scary. I learned to live with it all. Now, in 2009, I'm married. I still hear voices at night, but they're making more sense now. Sometimes, the voices say things to me like, get out, I'm not kidding, get out, and laughing followed. Evil laughing. I tried to go back to sleep. One night, a few weeks ago, 
I woke up feeling like someone was in the room with me, a different energy than my husband's. I looked up and saw a dark figure standing over me. My dog started barking and growling like crazy. The dark figure turned his head and walked out the closed door. I went back to sleep and woke up to a voice telling me, your destiny will be at the Valley of Thunder, then all the voices shall be heard. I haven't ignored that one. Sometimes, I will go to Yosemite National Park, the Valley of Thunder, and see what my destiny is. It just doesn't seem right yet. Two nights ago, I had a dream. William came to me. He didn't say anything, but I sensed he was telling me it was okay not to be afraid of him. I feel as if since I've met William, I've become sensitive to spirits and energies. I've met other spirits beside William. I feel as if now I have the ability to read energies and sense thoughts. I almost regard William as a friend. As an avid EVP researcher and long haul truck driver, I've had many opportunities to get EVP recordings from all over the country. My research has revealed some startling results lately. On the 20th of January this year, an EVP has attached itself to me somehow. Now, no matter where I am or where I go, this EVP named Desmond Heathers is in every recording I make on my Olympus digital voice recorder. Even when I'm traveling down the road at 65 miles per hour, Desmond is there ready to talk when I turn on my recorder. I know a lot about them and where he is now. One startling development occurred when I asked Desmond if he knew anyone that I knew. He said, yes, Joe. I said, Joe, my brother? He said, no, Joe, who is with me. I asked him if Joe was with us now, and he said, he is in you now. So I asked, Joe, are you there? And I got this voice in the recording that was very deep and gruff sounding. I can only say it sounded like Mr. T from the TV show The A-Team. Joe said, go away, leave me alone. Well, I don't communicate with those who don't want to, so I just do what I always do with the ones I get who I don't think deserve my attention. I just ignore them. Here's where the story takes a strange turn. The week after that, I was talking to my doctor about a fatigue problem I've been having lately. Nothing serious, just tired during the times of the day I don't think I should be. He asked if I was sleeping okay, and I said I tend to wake up several times during the night. He recommended I get a sleep study done. After finding the only sleep research center within 100 miles of where I live, I was told the study would cost an excess of $1,600 for one night. Well, I thought this was ridiculous, so I figured I would do it myself. I was on the road the night I decided to do my sleep study and set up my digital voice recorder and DV camera on the sleeper of my big rig. I fell asleep within 15 minutes. When I reviewed the recordings the next morning, I was so startled at what I had recorded, I could hardly listen to it. The recording revealed that I snore rather loudly. What was startling, though, was the EVP Joe was using my snoring sound to speak to me in my sleep. With every rattling snore, he formed words. He said things like, Don't you know you love me? Don't leave me. Don't wake up. I'm not done yet. Don't you remember me from the Navy? You know you're listening to me. You know you love me. How did I get in here? What happened to me? I need you. I'm just jealous of you, Tony. Tony, please help me. Not just that night either. Every night I've recorded, he's talking to me in my sleep. It concerns me because I don't know if there may be some subliminal influence with him talking in my sleep like that every night. I think I know him. I vaguely recall a friend I had in the Navy named Joe back in 1980. I remember feeling sorry for the guy because of his drinking problem and was always trying to help him when he got in trouble. I used to buy him gifts for his birthday and Christmas because his family wanted nothing to do with him. Other than that, I can't recall very much about him. When I asked him how long he has known Desmond, he said about five years. That's how long Desmond told me he's been dead. Actually, Desmond didn't even know he was dead until I convinced him he was. He kept trying to tell me he was alive. So I asked what it looked like where he was, and what did he see around him. He said nothing but a faint amber and turquoise colored light that was all around him. He desperately wants out of there. He says he can see me sometimes. One day, when I was sitting at my office desk at home, I asked him if he could see me, and he said he could. So I reached in my pocket and pulled out a $20 bill, and asked if he could see what I had in my hand. He said a dollar. 
Thinking it was just a lucky guess on his part, I dropped the bill and picked up a Bic lighter. I then asked again, what am I holding in my hand right now? And he said, a light. I reached in my desk for it and had my hand closed around it so I couldn't even see it. How did he know? Many times Desmond will ask if I can see him. I've never been able to do so, so I got on my digital camera and asked if he would let me take pictures of him. He said, I will try. I told him where to be in my living room at home while I snapped a few dozen pictures. Nothing showed up on review, so I asked if he would mind trying something else. I explained what white noise was to him, and he was already familiar with it. He helps me to adjust the levels and spectrums of white noise to be able to hear him better. I explained that I could generate a different type of noise that is not audible, but that I might be able to see him with. So I set up my DV camera to form a video feedback loop with my Sony Trenton 32 inch TV, manually adjusting the focus in such a way that the feedback picture was focused on the pixels on the screen as it oscillated slightly due to some technical reason I can't explain now. After talking with Desmond during the setup and adjustment period, I told him where I thought he could best try to show himself. Desmond appeared to me only once for about two seconds in the video. He had very plain symmetrical features and was shown from the waist up. He seemed to be in his mid-thirties with dark sunken eyes. He was wearing a bowler hat and a 1940s type jacket with wide rounded lapels with an open shirt that had no collar. Further research with Desmond shows he can see me and some things around me when his energy level is high. For example, I can give him instructions on how to travel somewhere. One time I showed him a map on my Microsoft streets and tips and showed him the same roads and satellite photos taken from Google Earth. With this information, I am able to ask him to get a specific place and get information I desire. One time I sent him to the Powerball Lottery Drawing Headquarters located at Urbandale Drive in Urbandale, Iowa to see if he could see the Powerball numbers being drawn six hours before the draw. I have reason to believe he is not bound by time as we know it and thought he could travel through different threads of time and different timelines. While well, I asked him to go and do this one for me, after about an hour of instruction on what to look for and how to get there. Then, when I asked if he was ready, he said I'll try. Then, I'll be right back. He returned in approximately 30 minutes and gave me some numbers. I was all excited and purchased our ticket. Later the next day I went to check the ticket and realized I had sent him on the wrong day. I explained to Desmond how sorry I was for the mistake and how much time and energy we wasted. I asked him what the numbers were he gave me because he was there 24 hours too early to see the actual drawing and realized he must have witnessed one of the practice draws they do to check out the machines. Lately, I've been having some other problems. I injured my back seriously at work and have not had the desire to record anymore due to my pain and medication. I've been recovering well and expect my research to continue. My new job doesn't offer me as much travel and time to do the things I'd like. I just hope when I start recording again, Desmond and Joe will let some other people talk to me. I wanted to share my experience with you guys. I'm not sure what it means or anything, but if you do make it to the end of the story, you can decide for yourself and let me know what you think. One night when I was 13, I couldn't sleep, so I tried to turn the other way, on my side, to try to get myself comfy. As I turned around, I saw a figure of a woman against the wall in front of me. She was kind of a black figure, and she seemed to have a hunchback and a hump on her back from the way she was standing. This, of course, freaked me out, especially since I was only 13 at the time. I lay in shock and not knowing what to do, and after like two seconds, I put my head under the covers and called for my mom. She came in, and I was really afraid to tell her in case she thought I was crazy, so I just told her that I had a really bad dream. I was definitely not asleep. I couldn't sleep for a few nights, as it freaked me out so much. This kind of went away after a few weeks, and I was gradually able to sleep again. However, a few weeks after this had happened, I was getting pains in my back and I went to the doctors to get scans and things. I then found out I had sclerosis, curvature of the spine. I eventually started getting a slight hump in my back because of this. It has been 10 years since I saw this woman, but I can never get it out of my mind. I've since told my mom about this, and she seemed freaked out about it as well. 
I'm not sure what this means, or if it was a ghost or spirit trying to tell me something. I have no idea, but it really did freak me out. This is just a short experience I had, at about 17. A group of four friends and I were sitting at my house, bored out of our minds. My buddy Joey, not his real name, was literally banging his head against the wall out of boredom. Tommy, also not his real name, was reading a book he brought. His sister Alexis, of course, not a real name either, was teasing my dog with a flashlight. Henry, had his earbuds blaring. Finally, my friend Annie was on my laptop, looking for something that might be fun. Annie came across a story a few guys had posted on a ghost website about an abandoned local farm. They posted how they went exploring the farm and got the hell scared out of them by a black figure. Annie is into the paranormal and asked if we wanted to investigate it. I said sure, better than sitting around waiting for my dog to bite Alexis for teasing him. The others agreed, so we hopped into my truck. It's a single cab with three seats. The girls rode in the cab with me while Henry, Joey, and Tommy rode in the truck bed. I didn't believe in ghosts. If someone told me they saw a ghost, I would have to say stop watching Scooby-Doo and return to reality. Annie told me how to get there with the directions the guys posted on the ghost site. When we arrived, we all hopped out and walked up to the gate. We hopped the gate and started talking about where to go. We agreed to split up. Tommy and Joey were with Alexis. They went to the old barn. While Annie was with Henry and I, we went into the two-story farmhouse. I looked in the upstairs window. All the glass looked like it had been smashed out of the windows. The house looked wrecked. It looked like whoever lived there had been a hoarder. While Henry and I were exploring, we heard what sounded like footsteps upstairs. We were intrigued, so we took off upstairs. When we got to the second floor, it was empty. While walking down the stairs, I felt like someone had been pushing me. I was mad. My right shoulder was cut thanks to the old wooden steps I had twisted my ankle on. I asked Annie and Henry, what the hell are you guys trying to do? Are you trying to kill me? Annie said she and Henry were in the bedroom to the right, looking through some of the old junk when they heard me scream and they came running. Henry held me up and we were about to leave when we heard something slam hard in the kitchen. We went in and saw a toolbox we had seen on the table on the floor with various tools around it. Henry said no way in hell that toolbox had a damn padlock on it. We all looked around the lock. It was on the table now, besides where the toolbox used to be. Henry tried to get in the toolbox earlier, but the lock prevented him. We heard footsteps upstairs again. Annie said screw this and ran outside along Henry while I hobbled out. The jerks left me behind. When we were out of the house, we saw Alexis, Tommy, and Joey. They were panting out of breath and looked terrified. We asked what happened. Alexis said that they saw a black figure with red eyes and it charged at them. We all heard a loud snarl like a big dog and we took off towards my truck on the way there and said, look, in one of the upstairs windows, we saw two glowing eyes go from the middle of the window to the top. Then they separated. One went left and one went right. We all hopped the fence and peeled out of there as fast as everyone could. I am not currently experiencing any hauntings, but I do have a tale of a spiritual encounter. I will begin by prefecting story with the events leading up to the event. My grandfather passed away in hospice care in July 2000. I spent his last night on earth with him, holding his hand and reading the Bible to him which was his favorite literature. He was an artist and a carpenter and spent his last remaining years up in his home carving beautiful artwork out of wood. He loved his simple life and carved because he wanted to, never once selling his museum quality work. He would only give it away to anyone who truly appreciated it. At 88, he was about 80% deaf and completely blind in one eye and nearly blind in the other. After a stroke six months earlier, his health declined quickly, and he simply gave up on life. As he lay in the bed, I sang to him, although he probably could not hear me or even knew that I was there, and he was in a coma-like state with his eyes open. He had stopped eating, and he was severely underweight, and it was hard for me to see him like that, knowing how much he loved life and living. Many times he cried in his last few years, 
saying that he loved his life and didn't want to die. During his last living moments with me, I looked down into his distant foggy eyes, knowing he couldn't hear or see me, and told him that the baby goose that he held in my house the last time he visited had grown up now and had four babies of her own. His eyes filled up with tears and turned red, and his mouth began to quiver as if he was trying to say something. He hadn't spoken in nearly two weeks. His love for animals and nature transcended through his limitations that night. I knew he would probably die that night, so I sat next to him with my hand on his chest, feeling his every breath and heartbeat. He didn't pass away until the next day, after I left. He was alone, which is what I didn't want. I didn't want his spirit to leave his body and to look down at an empty room. That bothered me for a long time. In an attempt to comfort ourselves, we turned to his Bible. He was much more dedicated to the word than we were ever, but knowing that it was so close to his heart, we thought it would ease our minds. My mother said to read something that he had underlined or highlighted, which is something his Bible was full of. I read the first thing I opened that was underlined. You do not have to understand the Bible to feel the power behind these words, which read, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, where there comfort one another with these words. We all felt a chill run through us. At his wake, I waited until everyone left, and I cut a small lock of his beautiful thick white hair and placed it in an envelope. As myself and my friend walked to the vehicle to leave, I opened the door and a mourning dove flew into me as if trying to enter the truck with me. It injured its wings and I brought it home. I rescue and rehabilitate small animals all the time, so I mended its wing and let it go about a week later. I took that as a sign for my grandfather, as we had that bond of loving all creatures great and small. A couple of weeks later, in August, my best friend was at my house and I was showing her videotapes of Papa, that is what I called him, because she had never met him. I wanted to share with her the kind of person he was. For nearly two hours we watched him talk about God, Leonardo da Vinci, his childhood, his 24 brothers and sisters, his beloved mother, and we saw him play his guitar and sing old, sad songs about homeless children and hobos, songs that made grown men cry including himself. After the tape was finished, I got up to go to the kitchen for something to drink, and my friend went to the restroom. At that moment, we both heard a loud musical tone that sounded like a doorbell. Since I do not have a doorbell, we both said, what the heck is that? We both re-entered the living room where we had been watching the tape and searched everywhere where the sound had come from. My heart sank as I realized what it was. About two years earlier, I had one of those cheap doorbells that you plug into the wall, using a battery-operated button at your front door to operate the sound. I became so irritated by all the neighborhood kids ringing it that I just took the button off and put it in my piano stool. The battery had gone bad anyway. I never unplugged the part that rings. I had forgotten it was there because it was hidden behind a chair. That was eerie enough, but what really got me thinking was when I explained to my friend that I had the ringer set to only ring one long tone. To change it to the traditional two-tone ding-dong, you had to take the back off of the unit and set the switches according to the manual. Needless to say, it did ring in the ding-dong fashion. Oddly enough, it was my friend who said, maybe it was your grandfather saying hi. It hadn't even occurred to me. Shortly after that, I was explaining what happened to my mother on the phone, and it happened again. She could hear it, and we both fell silent. He was letting me know that his fears of leaving his family behind were pointless, and that he was with the rest of his family in heaven.
I believe he was thanking me for being there for him when no one else could. It has been three years since his own death, and the doorbell has not rang since. Hey, my name is Maddie. Today, me and my best friend Summer had a strange encounter with a malevolent spirit. Let me explain what happened. A few months ago, me and one of my other friends, Alicia, met an eight-year-old spirit named Reese through a Ouija board. She seemed like a very sweet and innocent girl. She told us at her own will, and I repeat her own will, how she met her death. She apparently got beaten to death by her abusive father. Then a few weeks went by, and I introduced Reese to my now best friend Summer. They got along very well. It didn't seem like she had any sorts of problem with her, or anyone she met. The next day we were playing, when we got a call from my friend Amy. Long story short, she had an encounter with a spirit named Sarah. She claimed that Sarah was a very stubborn spirit, it took her hours just to get her to say goodbye. Amy also stated that Sarah seemed like a very lonely and clingy spirit who did not want to let her go. Then we made an attempt to contact Sarah through the board. It was a success. After we talked to Sarah for a bit, we asked her if she knew Reese. Sarah suddenly stopped moving to Planchet. We asked her if she was alright. She answered no. She also said that Reese isn't Reese. She said that Reese is actually a man named Roger. Sarah also told us that Roger was the one who killed her at the age of 27. The final thing she said about Roger was that if we ever told him that she was the one who told, that he would send her straight to the gates of hell. We tried to contact Reese, Roger, on December 10th, 2016, around 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We successfully contacted Reese. At that period of time, he didn't know that we knew who he really was. Then, we did something that we both regret. We asked if she was hiding anything from us. He responded this in his own words. Fine, you fucking caught me. Then right after that he said, Who told you two idiots? We simply responded to the internet in hopes to keep Sarah safe. Then Roger responded by saying, You are a liar. Then the planchet started the circle around the alphabet counterclockwise, excluding the letter M. It did not touch the corners whatsoever. Summer and I started to panic, wondering what it was trying to do. I thought he simply lost control over the planchet, but Summer thought it was something more because at that time, it was spinning around continuously for about 30 seconds. So I suggested that if we put pressure on it, it might stop it. It just kept going even with pressure, but just slower. But after we lifted the pressure, it continued to spin and got even faster. After a while, it just randomly landed on Dubai. Maybe it just got tired or got sick of us panicking, I really need to know your thoughts on this, and if this occurrence was really legitimately something evil, because I don't know what to explain it for. Thank you for reading. I didn't believe in the Ouija board because they sell them at Toys R Us, so I didn't think they would sell something dangerous to kids and adults. I've read stories about the Ouija board, but I don't know if it's true. People do make up stories, so it's hard to tell if it's true or not. Some people say the Ouija board is just a game. Others say it's not just a game, and some say it's dangerous. I had to find out for myself if the Ouija board is really dangerous. On Sunday, I decided to go to Toys R Us to buy the board. I drove my car in the morning to Toys R Us, and I was just looking around at first for about an hour. After looking around, I went to the game section and I purchased the Ouija board. I drove back to my apartment and put the board in the closet. The same day about 10pm, I decided to try it out. I took it out of the box and put it on my bed. I didn't have any candles so I just dimmed the light. I put the board on my lap and the planchet on the board. I put my fingers on the planchet 
and I started around in circles for about a minute. I stopped and I started saying, is anybody out there? I kept saying it for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then all of a sudden, I felt a strange presence right above me. I was so scared that I ran out of my room and I threw the board in the garbage. I was very shaken. I went back to my room and turned the lights on and I didn't sleep at all. And that's why I don't mess with Ouija boards. I have had several experiences, but I will tell you two of my most frightening. A friend and I had started playing with the Ouija board and it ended up turning our lives upside down for the span of around two years. One night, my friend Judy, her husband Luke, Loma, and myself were watching a movie called Witchboard right in the middle of a winter storm. All footprints had been covered at this time and the streets were empty. About halfway through the movie, the front door blew open and we heard running footsteps come into the house, up the stairs, down the hall, and into the bedroom where Judy's two-year-old lay sleeping. We were all just sitting there frozen in shock and fright when we heard a loud slam, which turned out to be the bedroom door, and the poor little boy started screaming, monster, monster. Luke took off up the stairs, only to find a very upset little boy, and nothing or no one else. As things started to calm down, Judy and I went to shut the front door, and there were still no footprints in the snow. The only snow that had come into the house was blowing from the wind. It was around March now, and one day, as I laid down for a nap, I felt the bed start to shake under me. I was uncertain if I had really felt what I thought I had, so I was not frightened, but I got up anyway. That was only the beginning. Not long after that, it became a constant thing every time I tried to lay in my bed. The shaking started to get more violent, and it also felt as if someone was punching up at the mattress from beneath. I complained several times, and no one believed me. It was now to the point where I was afraid to go to bed. I began sleeping at my friend Loma's house because her bed didn't shake. After staying at her house for two weeks, my mom said it was time to come home, and I did agree, but not until she promised to spend the first night sleeping in bed with me. That night, we had only been in bed for about 10 minutes, before the bed started its usual shaking. It was very minor at first, so my mom started to make excuses for why it was happening. By the time five minutes had passed, it was now undeniable, and I could tell my mother was getting scared, but was trying to stay calm for my sake. The last straw for my mother was when the punching started. It was harder than I had ever felt before. We laid there for a moment while my mother mustered up the courage to peek under the bed. Of course, she didn't find anything and we promptly left the room and set ourselves up in the living room for the remainder of the night. My bed continued to shake and punch for some time thereafter, but it eventually quit. However, once in a while it will start, to this day, and I just get up or ignore it and it stops. This encounter involved a Ouija board and possibly my guardian angel. Years ago, a friend and I were goofing around with a Ouija board. Being a bit ignorant of the unknown, I mistakenly asked it how old I would be when I died and how. It replied that I would be 16 and that I would die in a car accident. A month or two after I turned 16, I was asked if I wanted to go out with my parents the next day to run errands. I said yes. That next morning, I woke up to discover that my parents left without me. I was annoyed. An hour after I woke up, my mother called me from the hospital. They had been hit by a transport truck an hour before. When I asked why they had left without me, my mom replied that her and my dad had tried for a half hour to get me up, and then they gave up. What makes it so scary is where the truck had hit. My one brother has to sit behind my mom, and my dad does not wear a seatbelt. Had I been in that car, I would have been sitting behind my dad with the seatbelt on. The transport truck hit the car on the driver's side. 
almost imploding on the driver's and left backseat side. That's where I would have been sitting. Guardian Angel, I think so. I was celebrating Halloween around my best mate Felicity's house. We usually have a laugh and a joke, but neither of us had played with a Ouija board before. So, we gathered about seven friends from the neighborhood. First, we lit candles, one black, one red, one green, and one clear. Fliss had purchased the board from an old shop in the Stoke Town Center. We sat down in her dining room and placed the board right in the middle of the dining room table. We all placed our fingers on the gold planchet. I was the reader, so I asked the questions. At first, we did not get any response, so we all giggled and made fun of the silly people who got themselves worked up about these silly boards. About five seconds after we stopped giggling, we heard a massive bang on the floor. I thought it was one of the boys playing a trick, so I suggested that we all sit legs crossed on the chairs. I made sure we were all cross-legged, and I said, If it was a ghost that made the bang on the floor, can you please do it again? And it did. I spoke again. We will now try to communicate using the board. So we started to use the board again, and I again asked if anybody was present who wanted to communicate with us. The planchet moved to yes. I asked for a name, and it replied, I am unclean. Fliss's uncle had passed on, so I inquired if we were talking with her uncle, Ian. The response was no. Again, the planchet moved to the following letters, I am unclean. We had made contact with an apparent demon. We decided to say sorry for disturbing, and we thanked the spirit for its presence. However, it did not go. The spirit of demon flung Fliss back into the wall. Then it came for me. I had a vision of hell itself at that moment, and I remain grateful to this day that it did not hurt me. In telling the story, let me assure the reader that it was passed to me by my grandmother, Eileen. Eileen is in failing health, but her memory is untouched, and her ability to spin a tail is uncanny. This particular story is about her father, Joe, his first wife, and a house that will never be forgotten. My grandmother is a devout Christian, but she believes these tales of the unexplained to be completely true. Judge for yourself. In the late 1800s to early 1900s, it was common practice in the coal fields of Kentucky and West Virginia for a miner to spend the majority of the week at the mines while leaving his wife at home alone. This is exactly what Joe, my great-grandfather, did during his first marriage. After a hasty marriage, Joe bought a small, quaint home for himself and his new wife, Sue. Sue quickly alerted her husband to a potential problem. The house was directly across the road from the local cemetery. Joe, being a firm disbeliever in such superstitious nonsense like ghosts and spooks, had a good laugh when Sue begged him not to make her stay alone in a house so close to a graveyard and told her to get used to it. When Monday morning arrived, he left her alone and laughed as she sobbed on the porch, that night, after completing her tours, she settled down in the bed for a good night's rest and doused the lamps. As soon as she had climbed into bed, a strange noise became apparent outside. As she pulled the covers up around her head, she could hear something like barrels rolling or horses galloping around the house. She tried to sleep and eventually, as the sunrise drove the mysterious sounds away, found some comforting slumber. Every night, the noises started getting louder and louder seeming to get closer to the house and, on Friday night, Sue heard three knocks on the door. In a terrified fit, she screamed, leave me alone, and suddenly, the noises faded. The next morning brought Joe's return, and the first thing Sue did was beg him to let her leave the house, telling him of the haunted noises. He laughed unsympathetically and told her to get over this stupidity. In desperation, she bitterly screamed, Joe, I hope to God it gets you. Joe wasn't the least bit frightened and told her that it was Cheryl's local men playing tricks on her. Later that night, Sue slept well in Joe's arms, but some subtle suspicion began to eat at the unbeliever. As he drifted into a shallow sleep, he was startled at a loud crack coming from the fireplace that startled him, and as he sat upright in the bed, 
He saw the apparition of an elderly woman staring at him from the rocking chair at the foot of the bed. My grandmother says that Joe knew exactly who the woman was, but he took the knowledge of her identity to his grave because simply, she had been dead for six months before they moved into the house. Joe shut her with fear in her bony, cold hands, stretched to clutch his ankles as she latched onto his foot and began pulling him towards her in the footboard of the bed. Joe fainted with fright as he felt his foot slide down to the foot of the bed in the dead hand of the spirit. The next morning, Sue roused her pale husband and sat up in the bed as he opened his eyes and screamed with terror. The footbed of the bed was broken and the rocking chair had been toppled during the night. Joe immediately promised his frightened wife that not another night would be passed in this restless house, simply telling her, Sue, whatever it was, it got me. Thank you for reading my grandmother's story. I hope you found it entertaining because, well, I thought it was pretty frightening. See you later. I have told this story to people who are not there to witness the actual event, and some look at me as if I am just telling a story to get a good laugh, but I find nothing funny about it. Everything I am about to relate is true, and I guess in some bizarre way, I feel that by retelling this story to anyone who is willing to listen to it will bring me some comfort. On July 6, 1990, a high school friend shot himself in the head with a rifle in a nearby local baseball dugout. The act shocked and saddened everyone, especially his parents, of course, who did not want to believe their only son would take his own life. The days that followed his death were happening, for me, as if in a dream. Fearing this act would spark some sort of chain reaction, school's counselors were sent in to help the students grieve and discuss their feelings of loss. Days went by, and there seemed to be a cloud of despair and confusion hanging over our entire high school class. If he had lived, my friend would have graduated from high school with the rest of us that same year. When he died, he was two months away from his 18th birthday. About a week after his suicide, I was visiting my best friend at the time, we'll call her Anne, in her home. We were both still very affected by the death of our friend, and we began to talk late into the night about his possible reasons for taking his own life and how crazy and unexpected it was. We had been discussing the whole chain of events and basically trying to make sense of something we couldn't even imagine when I suddenly became very uncomfortable talking about our deceased friend. I was sitting at the time in a desk chair across from Anne, who was sitting comfortably on her bed facing me. She was looking directly at me, and she could see the discomfort on my face. She assumed I was just overreacting, and our discussion had gotten to me, so she stood up and moved towards the door of her bedroom and gestured in a sweeping motion with her arm for me to follow her into the kitchen down the hall. There was a single small desk light on behind me when she made this motion with her arm so that when she moved, her body created a shadow on the wall. This is going to sound ridiculous, and I'm no physics expert, but when Anne swept her arm up into the air, gesturing me to follow her, her shadow did not follow her arm. Instead, there was a strange kind of delay, and I saw her arm move, and about 5-10 to 10 seconds later, the shadow of an arm moved, mimicking the same gesture she had just made. I, of course, thought my eyes were playing tricks on me and ignored the shadow, and I would have kept it to myself if only Anne had not turned to me and asked, Did you just see that? I answered yes, of course, and we fled out of the room and into the kitchen. Anne's house was large, and our frightened voices bounced off the columned walls, but nothing ever occurred after that. My friend Anne and I no longer speak, and I am sure that if she knew I was relaying this story to strangers, she would think I was crazy, but I remember the death of her high school friend as if it were yesterday, and I can't help wishing that the shadow we saw was indeed a sign from our friend, but I will never be too sure. I write this story in his memory, and in the hope that he is in a place where his problems have been all taken away. Thanks for reading. This story I'm about to tell you has been talked about in my family for years. Now it has been passed down to my own daughter who tells it to her friends at slumber parties. It begins with the first time I ever saw anything when I was around the age of seven. It happened in a house that we lived in years ago in western New York. I shared a room with my sister. We both had the feeling something was always watching us, but being so young, we never really worried all that much about it until one night while I was trying to sleep. My bed was up against one wall and my sister's bed faced the other. 
I turned so I was facing the wall. When I opened my eyes, after getting that feeling of being watched again, there, standing in the wall was a woman. She was a young woman, dressed all in black, high white lace collar, wearing a cameo, and hair pulled up neatly in a bun. She stood there with her hands folded in front of her, smiling sweetly at me. Now mind you, I was 7 years old, so I pulled the covers up over my head and then down again to take a peek just to see if she was still there, which she was, and this time with a bigger smile. I got so scared I jumped from my bed and ran across the room to my sister's bed. I landed right on top of her, waking her up of course. I told her there was a lady in my wall, but when we looked again, the woman was gone. The next day I told my mom about it. She said it must have been just my guardian angel and left it at that. She refused to talk about it any further or even years later. Then recently, my brother and I got to talking about that house. He said, don't you remember what the neighborhood kids used to say about our house? And of course, I didn't remember a thing. He told me that apparently a couple had died there years ago. Then he asked me if I remember the time that he and I were in the backyard and we saw the old man in the attic window. And all of a sudden it rushed back. Bam. Right when he told me about the old man in the attic window, I had a major flashback and remembered it like it was yesterday. I don't even have to tell you even after all these years it scared me. Well, many years have passed since we lived there, but I still have dreams about that house and I wish the dreams would stop. I have many other scary stories to tell, but I freaked myself out telling this one so the others will have to wait. This incident happened about two years ago. I was 17 at the time working at a restaurant motel in Old Saybrook, Connecticut called The Castle. The scariest thing about this place, besides the low pay, was the old story of what happened to one of its original owners. From almost my first day working there, I was told that one of the members of the family who built the house had killed himself on the grounds. The story was that one night, the son had discovered that his fiancée was cheating on him with one of his close friends. Deep in depression, the son climbed to the tallest tower of the castle, tied a rope to some type of pole on the roof, and hanged himself. The next morning as the parents were leaving the home, they saw him hanging. They immediately sold the mansion and it has been a hotel ever since. Many employees said that they had heard and seen things, yet I, as most people believe at first, didn't believe the stories. That is, until one night, I was working the late late shift with a friend of mine named Katie. We were cleaning up the dining room after closing when we heard the kitchen door slam shut. I had popped them open, but as the wind off Long Island sound is pretty strong, I figured they had been blown shut. Katie yelled at me to get over there and look at the kitchen. When I arrived, I saw a weird green light pouring through the round window of the door and flooding out the crack at the bottom. Still unconvinced of any supernatural going on, so I tried to open the door, but it was not happening. I thought someone was in there and I knew if the place got trashed I would get fired so I reared back and tried to put my shoulder through the door. At the time I was about 6'2", 200 pounds, played football and lifted a lot of weights. The door should have popped right open but not this time. Katie and I peered into the window and there, plain as day, was a man dressed in antique clothes with a noose around his neck looking right back at us. He walked by and the green light left us. We instantly figured, forget the boss, it's quitting time. We ran outside and could barely light our cigarettes. Our hands were shaking so badly. From then on, I was a believer and I knew I would never, ever doubt ghosts ever again. My aunt and uncle had a passion for restoring old country houses, the last of which had been at an inn at the turn of the century. The house sits on 50 acres at the top of a hill, next to a historic old church with an equally historic old graveyard. I can't claim to recall for certain, but I think the church was used as a field hospital during the Civil War. My uncle would tell us the stories about the months after they moved into the house. Their bedroom was on the second of three floors, near the large, almost spiral staircase that emptied into the foyer to two sitting areas. Late in the evening, while they were in bed, my aunt and uncle would hear what sounded like a distant crowd of people in conversation. Living in quiet country houses most of their lives made them fairly light sleepers. The local volunteer fire department changed that over time. I'll get to that. 
My uncle would get up to check out the noise and find nothing, but since it was an old house with a boiler, and that it was more or less near town, there were many possible rational explanations for the noise. Still, over the course of a few months, the noises grew louder and louder until it sounded like a party was being thrown in their own house and my aunt and uncle weren't invited. This had grown so gradually that my uncle was much more annoyed than fearful. One night, he went to the stairs and shouted for them to shut up so we can get some sleep. That seemed to scale back the noise enough to satisfy him, although it didn't go away completely. The next weekend, he took a walk for the first time through the local graveyard and noticed many of the stones were overturned and some of the plots were neglected. He righted the headstones and cleaned up some of the plots that weekend and never again heard the noises in the house. My uncle passed away in that house one year ago this October. Subsequently, I spent a great deal more time there last winter than I had before taking care of a few things for my aunt. I slept on the top floor across from the game room. Many nights an air raid siren would go off, summoning the local volunteer firefighters to the station house. I never did get used to sleeping through that. Then one night, the siren wailed at about 2am, and I was having a hard time going back to sleep. I was wide awake when I heard something. It lasted only an instant, and seemed to me to be a crowd in the distance that had just been told the punchline to a very funny joke. Whatever it was, it reminded me of one of my uncle's stories. As an epilogue, I should mention that my aunt is trying to sell the house. So far, the most likely buyer is the local funeral home. While sitting around looking at photo albums with my grandmother, we came across some newspaper clippings. The clippings were from a newspaper in Indiana. They were about an old brick house being torn down. Since we live in Mississippi, I found it strange that my grandmother would have these clippings, so I questioned her about them. She then told me one of the eeriest stories I have ever heard. In 1946, my grandmother lived in Nobile, Indiana, with her husband and their child. They lived in an old brick house that was built before the Civil War and stood on the outskirts of town. It was a large house with very high ceilings and wooden floors. In the master bedroom was a closet with a heavy wooden door that did not have a knob, only a wooden latch to keep the door closed. My grandmother would shut and latch the closet. When she would leave the room and return the closet door would be standing wide open. She would shut the door again and go about her chores. When she returned, the door would be open. She did this several times a day. She said the door stayed open more than she could keep it closed. She was more annoyed than scared by this strange event. About eight months later, she and her husband divorced and she moved to Mississippi with my grandfather. The house she had lived in did not cross her mind until 10 years later when her aunt Bonnie wrote her a letter and sent her the newspaper clippings. The clippings talked about her old house and reported that it had been torn down. While they were tearing down the house, a hole was discovered under the closet floor. They had found the remains of a man in the hole. It was believed to be the body of a soldier from the Civil War. After lurking around here for ages reading everyone else's story, I finally got up the nerve to post one of my own. My story isn't as dramatic or interesting as some of the other stories posted here, but I feel confident enough to post it because three other people have had experience in this particular house, so here it goes. This happened a few months ago while I was visiting a friend's house one evening. I'll refer to my friend as G. A mutual friend of ours, J, was also present. This was my first and only visit to the house, and no one else was home at the time apart from the three of us. The house in question is an old wood villa, which would be, at a guess, 80 to 100 years old. It's a rather large one-level structure with two long and connected hallways, one that leads from the front door to the back of the house and another that spans across the back of the house. Together, the hallways form the shape of a T. While eating dinner in the kitchen, dining room area located in the back portion of the house, something drew my attention to the right, so I glanced down to the top section of the hallway. As I watched, a dark shadow moved across very quickly from right to left, as though it just moved up the other long hall, through the center of the house, then straight ahead crossing the top hallway. I didn't say anything at the time, although I was curious about what I had seen. I have to say that while I definitely believe in ghosts, 
I didn't want to get too excited about something which could have a very logical explanation for. After dinner, G invited us on a tour of the house, and while exploring the rooms off the back hallway, I carefully checked to see if there were any windows that could have let car headlights in to cause the shadow I'd seen, but I couldn't find anything to explain it. Sometime later, G left the lounge to make coffee and, while she was out of the room, I whispered to Jay that I had seen a shadow cross the back hall. She surprised me by telling me that she too had seen a ghost moving from right to left in the same exact place, only she seen it twice before in broad daylight. We were intrigued and quite excited about this, but didn't say anything to G as we didn't want to frighten her. Interestingly enough, G approached Jay recently to ask her opinion about ghosts because a young woman who also lives in the house claimed to see a shadow move up the hallway. She was concerned because she too would be spending several weeks alone there and understandably, she was frightened. G explained that while she hadn't seen anything herself, there was one occasion when she was walking up the hallway and she felt like she accidentally pushed someone out of the way, even though she couldn't see anyone there. I've been in various places before where I've been able to sense unseen presences. I've had one experience where I used to get a feeling of overwhelming fear every time I went into one particular room in a house my parents owned. With the shadow that Jay and I saw, we didn't feel any strong feelings or emotions connected with it. At this moment in time, I haven't heard any more events in that house. When I was about 12 years old, my brother, sister, and I moved into my grandparents' house. Ever since, we could remember we heard stories about the house being haunted. Nothing too big, but strange things happened a lot. Rumor had it that there used to be a horse track room stable where my grandparents built their house and a little boy had been trampled in there. We have never actually checked into this story, but it is what we heard. At least, it is what we were told. Anyway... All of us grandkids were petrified of going upstairs. It was always so cold up there and just freaky, but that was where all the bedrooms were, so when we moved in, we had no choice. Actually, I had no choice. My little brother and sister had beds set up downstairs, and I slept upstairs. When I was about four, I had taken up smoking cigarettes, but no one knew about it. I used to turn off my bedroom light and smoke cigarettes. I turned off my light just in case my grandparents happened to come up the stairs. They always turned on the hall light to help their way up the stairs. This way, I would know how to put out my cigarette and spray air freshener. One night, I was upstairs alone smoking when I heard someone coming up the stairs. It was late and everyone had been in bed. The hallway light never came on, but all the same time, I butted out my cigarette and waited, but no one ever came up. This happened quite a few times and I just got used to it. This house is about 50 or 60 years old. The doors are the old latch type and made of nothing but wood. They are solid. To close the door, you have to lift the hook and latch it onto the other part of the door. To open the door, you have to lift the handle and pull the door open. On my bedroom door, I also had an eye hook lock to keep my room locked and my little brother out. I would be laying in bed at night watching TV and my bedroom door would just pop open, but it would never open all the way because of the lock on my door. I never thought anything of it. I just thought it was a breeze until my brother and I started sharing stories about what was happening in that room in the house. I have since moved out and my brother moved into my old room. We have all grown up and started sleeping upstairs and we have gotten over our fears pretty much. There were four bedrooms upstairs and they were set up weird. The house was square, two bedrooms on each side of the house with a staircase up the middle. To get to the two rooms, you have to walk through the main two ones. When my little sister finally decided to move upstairs, she moved into the room behind mine. She swears to hearing a little boy crying in her room at night. Recently, I bought a Ouija board and have been using it at my new house. One night, my cousin, brother, sister, and boyfriend were using it when my cousin and I started talking about how we used to use the board when we were younger at my grandparents' house. My cousin remembers talking to a little boy who died at this location, and she remembers the little boy telling us his vision of the story of what happened to him. He told us his name was Brandon, and his father beat him in the tack room, and that unlike the story being passed around, he hadn't been trampled at all. Which story is true, I don't know, and I guess we'll never know. My little brother is the only one of us left living with my grandparents, and he is now living in my old bedroom. 
He has heard the footsteps coming up the stairs when he was doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. He has heard whimpering, and he has talked to this little boy. Not literally talking, but questions will pop into his head that he already knows the answers to, like, what year is it? And he will answer out loud. He will not even be thinking about a certain thing, and then all of a sudden, he'll have a question. The door pops open on him, but he doesn't have the latch, so it pops open and closes again. Now, here's the last we have heard from the spirits in our grandparents' house. He was sitting in his room talking to his girlfriend on the phone when he heard someone coming up the stairs. The footsteps stopped at the top of the stairs. He hung up with his girlfriend and went into the hallway, but nobody was there. Now, what happens next makes us believe that the little boy was beaten to death and not trampled as everyone had been told. The footsteps were heavy ones, definitely not of those of a child. When my brother realized no one was there, he just assumed that it was the father because of the heavy footsteps. He told the father that if he didn't leave Brandon, the little boy, alone, that he was going to kill himself and haunt his butt down. He would then beat him to a fine pulp, then come back to life, yeah right, dig up his grave, and burn his mangy hide. My brother has become attached to Brandon and has not heard anything from him about his father or heard his father around the house. I'm here to tell you about the strange occurrences that happened to my mother at the Lawrence Family Mansion on Teddington Park Avenue in Toronto. The first thing you need to know is that my mom is a down-to-earth, no-nonsense type, and she believes that the house was, as all its tenants have believed in the past, that it is haunted. My mom lived in an apartment, dirt cheap because it was haunted, at the top of the mansion. It was, she says, extremely beautiful. High vaulted ceilings, many rooms, and spacious too. In the kitchen, there was a mirror called the talking mirror. This was because anybody who stayed in the kitchen long enough started randomly talking to themselves in the mirror. My mother says no matter who passed it, they started the babble. My mom even talked to herself without realizing it, until something brought her attention back to where she was and what she was doing, making her realize that she had been talking to herself. On the bottom floor, a German man named Hans, I don't know how to spell it, he was the most serious man my mom had ever known. My mom visited him sometimes, and oftentimes she would go into this bathroom that was there, and just study the CLW-footed top that dated back to the 1930s. She got the most creepy feeling looking at it, like she could almost see a body lying in it. She compared it to the portrait of Murder of Merit, which is a painting of a man with his throat and wrist slit. She told the man, and he said that he heard noises coming from it at night, and that he knew it must have been haunted because he said you could almost see the outline of a body in it. They looked into the history of the home, and sure enough, somebody had hurt themselves in the tub around the 1950s. Another thing near the bathroom was a hall, where people would say they felt a deep desire to run to get down it, and that before going down it, you had to stop and brace yourself, getting up your courage, like there was a wall there stopping you from going that you had to get through. Another place in the house was a great living room. It was in the apartment of a policeman and his girlfriend. They always argued, mostly in that room. One night, the girlfriend took the man's gun and held it to his head as they argued. People always reported that happy couples would always go into that room and just start arguing. Old spots were numerous in the house. I could tell you many other stories about various spots, but I have to get going. My mom says the house is sold for over five million dollars, and that she suspects that someone tore the house down to get rid of the hauntings and build a replica. My name is Lindsay. I've lived with my family in this home for four years now, and ever since we've lived here, we've experienced some things. 
It seems though that most things have happened in my bedroom. And I often thought my parents did not believe the things I had told them about. The first month of living in my home, my mother awoke in the morning to find a painting of a woman. This painting was lying on the floor in the closet. It appeared overnight. She had questioned all of us in the home, and nobody had seen it before. The music boxes would play randomly in the middle of the night. Doorknobs turning seconds before turning them yourself. My bedroom door always sounded like it was opening by itself when it was really shut. It wasn't for a while when I actually started to see people, or should I say ghosts, in my room while I was sleeping. I have seen a translucent woman wearing brown rags several times. The first I'd ever seen her, she was standing at the foot of my bed with her mouth wide open, as if she was screaming, but I never heard a sound. It felt as though my heart had stopped. I was frozen with fear. I had rolled over and told myself it wasn't actually there and that I was seeing things. Then about a month later, the same lady sat in my chair in my room just watching me. I then covered my face with my pillow and went back to sleep. In the morning, I told my mother about both times this lady being in my room and she just mocked me. She just kind of laughed and joked about it. She told me that the first time that the lady was there, it was because her teeth hurt, because I'm planning on becoming a dentist after schooling. I didn't think my mom believed me at all. Sometime after that, a tall man stood next to the head of my bed, once again, just staring at me. When I awoke, I started screaming, and my mother came running into my room. She told me it was just a dream, and to go back to bed, but I knew it wasn't. She was just saying what parents would say, just to make me feel better. It was strange how my room was the only room I'd ever seen them in. My family would just make fun of me and would make stupid jokes about the ghost in my room. Later one night, my sister was across the hall from me sleeping when she woke to a flash that lit up the room at one in the morning. This was when she was 20. She then ran into my room and slept next to me. She was not sure that it was a flash from a camera, since we were upstairs and everyone was sleeping. We never figured what the flash was. When my mother was away on vacation, and I was the only one home, I was sleeping, and when I woke in the middle of the night, I found myself eye to eye with a young girl who had to have been at least 10. She had a wound in her head her eye had been. Terrifyingly, there was a hole through her head. It was the right eye that had been gone. This was the most frightening thing I'd ever seen. I once again couldn't do anything. I was the only one home, so I laid there and went back to sleep. Once again, I see the woman lady, except this time, I find myself fighting her in my dream. The weird thing was, a mobile that was hanging above me on my ceiling had fallen and hit me in the stomach while I was sleeping. I still found that my parents didn't believe me until one night, my dad went downstairs for a drink at one in the morning. That's when he heard some girl humming a song. He thought it was me until he realized that he and my mom were the only ones home that night. Later the same night at three in the morning, my mother awoke and had to use the restroom. While she was walking down the hall, she heard a lady talking. My parents told me about this when I arrived home the next morning, and now they believe me. We don't know about who these ghosts are, but we are trying to find some history about our house as it was built in 1890. Maybe the history will reveal who these ghosts are, 
and why they are there. I grew up in a typical Maribyrish small southern town in southeast Tennessee. Our home was less than 80 feet from a Norfolk Southern Railroad line. The tracks were on a rise in the hill, and from the second story window of our home, you would be parallel with the tracks. The town I grew up in was once a coal mining camp and then grew to be a coal mining town. Point of fact, the town's name came from the original proprietor of the first train depot. It was called Daisy, after his only daughter. From my house, the original train depot was situated just about a mile north, and the area of the train tracks in between was often referred to as Black Track because there were several curves in the railway, and coal was often spilled in these curves, leaving the soil covered in the black, chalky coal residue. It is purportedly haunted, and there are several ghastly and ghostly tales attributed to that area of track. What I'm able to gather, one story is that a female slave was once accused of leading other slaves to freedom via the train tracks, and when her trajectory was discovered by her owner, she was tied to the tracks until a train came through, chopping off both of her feet. Once this was done, she was carried to the slave quarters as an example of what would happen to all others who attempted escape or assisted others in escaping. Slowly she bled to death, despite the other slaves' best effort. I know several people who have laid their hands on the Bible today and testify seeing her feetless body in the area. Other stories about a train wreck that happened about 15 yards from the back door of my old home. In southern Tennessee, we do not get much snow, but we can get quite a bit of rain, apparently in the late 30s. A weather front came through, bringing a lot of rain and flash flooding to the area. One night after the rain had slowed to a drizzle, a fully loaded train was slowing to stop at the depot, not knowing that the ground below was giving way under its weight. During the initial wreck, several railroad workers and hobos were trapped in the rubble. Many of the rescuers were local farmers and residents who perished as the mud shifted under the weight of the debris, and ultimately, a large land and debris slide halted all rescue efforts. As many as 50 people perished, and the old timers would say that they could hear people moaning and screaming for help for days after the wreck and how help never came. Some people swear that they could hear the sorrowful screams and moans of the trapped on bright, still nights. Lastly, another story about the area of tracks has to do with teenage hormones and stupidity. Along the section of track is an old paved road that weaves back and forth across the tracks. In the 50s and 60s, this area of road was used by teenagers to prove the muscle in their machines and the guts in their drivers. More than one person has perished in their efforts to outrun the train. Many people say that those untimely deaths are the culprits of strange flashes of light that are often seen in that area. I am new to this site, and I've read many of the stories posted. I wanted to share my experiences. For the past five years, myself, my son who is turning six and my daughter who will be two this fall, have lived in a small cottage style house with a full basement. The first weekend that I moved in, I of course had a party. My son stayed with my parents for the night. I also had a roommate for the first two months that I moved into the home. She had a cordless phone in the basement, and I had a regular phone upstairs. After our guests left for the evening, I took the cordless phone upstairs to make some calls. When I went to bed, 
I left the phone on the floor in my room. The next morning, I heard someone walking up the basement stairs. My bed was on the other side of the wall that led to the basement. I heard the footsteps walk through the kitchen, small dining room, and into the living room. I had my bedroom door shut, and I tried to call out to my roommate to tell her to come in. I thought that she was looking for the phone. It was then that I realized that I couldn't open my eyes, move, or even speak. I heard the footsteps pass through my doorway. The door never opened. I noticed that the closer they got to my bed, that the floor appeared to be shaking, hence the shaking ghost. The only auditory comparison I can give is it sounded like when my dad would do laundry and try to cram 20 pairs of jeans in a washer that had five. The whole machine would shake and you could hear it all over the house. The bathroom floor would even vibrate. That is what it felt like to me. I realized that whatever it was, was standing over me. And soon, I felt a hand resting on my hip. It was just a gentle pressure. I think that he was trying to see who was in the house. At that moment, I was extremely terrified and still couldn't move, speak, or even open my eyes. There was a banging on my window. The noise stopped, and whatever had touched me let go. I jumped out of bed, and there was nothing in the room. Apparently, my dad had been standing outside for ten minutes banging on the door. I never heard him pull into the driveway, which is right outside my window, or knock on the door. He also said that he tried to call us, and I'd never heard the phone ring. I never had this happen again until just two nights ago. My daughter and I share a room, and around two in the morning, she woke up. I could hear her cry out, Mama, and I tried to get up. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move anything but to lift my head off the pillow briefly. I realized that the floor was shaking again. I tried to open my eyes to look at it, and I couldn't. I believe that I was looking to the crib at my daughter. I didn't feel anything evil, but I don't think it wanted me to see it. After about five minutes, the shaking stopped and my daughter was back asleep. It all happened so strange that I even considered that I was maybe dreaming it all. When I checked the crib, my daughter seemed fine and nothing was out of place. Some other just normal haunting things I've experienced are footsteps and cabinets open when I know that I had left them closed. The ghost seems to like my kids and likes to check up on them. I smoke, so during the winter when it is cold, I go down into the basement and smoke by the back cellar steps. I have often heard footsteps go from one bedroom to another, but they never go back out of the last room they entered. Also, when my daughter was in her baby swing, any time it went downstairs, I would hear footsteps walk over to the swing and stop. They are always too heavy and slow to be my sons. Also, whenever I hear them and go back upstairs, he is soundly asleep in his room, so I know that it was never my son. There have been a few times though, that I felt that I was unwelcome in the basement. I feel like I'm being watched in there, and that something doesn't like me to be there. I have also felt that feeling walking past my kitchen at night. It's like something is standing there watching me, and this thing seems very cold. I have never been harmed or felt completely threatened by anything. My son has complained of being scared, but if he has seen or heard anything, he doesn't tell me. I just wanted to share my story. We are moving in a month, so it will be interesting to see if the people that end up renting my house have any experiences too. When I was about six or seven, I woke up in the middle of the night for a strange reason. I had a loft bed, 
I had to look down in my closet. As I was looking, I saw my bead curtains that were hanging over my closet starting to sway. I then felt something brush the side of my arm. I flipped out and almost ran to my parents' room. About halfway to my parents' room, I came to the realization that maybe my fan was on. When I went back to my room, I noticed that my fan had been unplugged the whole time. I knew then that my curtains were definitely moving on their own. I didn't even own any pets, so I had no logical explanation for what had happened. I remember always seeing someone in the corner of my eye. I would turn to see who it was, but when I did, no one was there. Things would disappear such as homework and school supplies, then they would reappear on the kitchen counter and on my dresser. I would always feel someone is watching me, then I turned around to see that no one was there. I remember one time in particular, I had a friend sleep over. We were up in my tree fort, and it was dark out, and we were hiding inside. We had dared each other to turn off our flashlights, so that it was pitch black. We were getting ready to open the side door, when a pair of red eyes appeared on the door window. We rushed inside, and started to shake from fright. I have moved from that house five weeks ago, and have lived in that house for seven years. I'm glad not to be in that house anymore. I feel a presence here, but I don't know if it's good or bad. <laughs> This actually began here in Lazuka, the capital of Zambia, back in 1983 when I was a young girl of five. For some reason, I always woke at 3am on the dot whilst living at our home at the time and found myself walking down the hallway. We had security lights in the garden, therefore shadows would play off trees, bushes and windows onto the interior walls of the house, like a Russian puppet show. With a security guard present each night, I would think the shadowy shape of a man appearing or disappearing suddenly was simply that, our guard doing the rounds. It wasn't until one final night, after my usual check of the houses, I was walking back to my room when I just felt something behind me. Wish I had it, because the shadowy figure of a man was right behind me, away from the walls and lights, but very distinctive. I was scared, but to be honest, looking back now, cannot even remember feeling evil, just curiosity. A few months after, I started experiencing visions and dreams. I would start having a dream of a little funny white man standing in my doorway, looking at me with a mean little grin on his face. Then, he would walk off in the direction of my brother's room, whereby I once woke up to hear my brother screaming for my mom, saying there was something in his room. This experience happened only once, but the dreams of this little man continued. When we moved to the UK in 1986, my final experience occurred with this man. I heard my name being called from downstairs. When I reached the top of the stairs from my bedroom, looking down into the pitch black and feeling utter malevolence directed at me, I couldn't see anything, but it was the same sensation I feel when dreaming of the white man. Let's just say at the age of 11, I had the good sense not to investigate. After that, I stopped experiencing a little white man, but I feel I became susceptible to other things from then on. Our house in the UK is set on what was once the Beanoka State Farm. It's said that a mass grave of 1800s cholera victims lies within the vicinity of our state, which could explain the experience, and not just from me. 
our cat would get spooked, and my mother was terrified one night. Our cat would suddenly sit up and stare at the corner of the room, or the doorway, or an armchair, and suddenly start to growl and raise his hackle. Then he would move his head as though watching something walk through the room. It frightened me one night when he sat up from my lap and dug his claws into my thighs. The growling reached a crescendo as though he was going into battle with another Tom. I got so spooked I left the room and went upstairs. My cat had left by the cat flap into the night. He wouldn't come back until the morning. What really spooked me the most was this also happened during the day when February morning. I can handle the nighttime frights because of the sense of normality when the sun rises. But when you are invaded during the day, all your security is shattered. My brother and I both experienced what is now learned a sleep paralysis event at exactly the same time, one night. Both of us also witnessed just before a sudden flash of brilliant blue. For two people of differing sexes to experience exactly the same time makes it disturbing and we still discuss it today. My other experience of sleep paralysis was when I was fully awake. Lying on my tummy reading a book on my bed, I suddenly had the overwhelming terror swamp me from my feet upwards and I couldn't move. Then, at the foot of my bed, I could feel as though someone was taking a step onto the mattress between both feet. When I could finally move, I turned around to see an indentation of a foot where the sensation was. Thank you for taking your time to read my experiences, if that is all I can call them. I did have one other experience, but it's too terrifying to write down and causes me fear, even to this day. When I was six or seven months pregnant with my son Anthony, I had a terrifying nightmare. I believe this nightmare was a portal to the afterlife, that what I saw was in fact a ghost trying to communicate with me. Every night I would sleep with the bedroom door half open and also had the hallway light on just because of the weird and bizarre events that would occur in this old home. I'd always thought I'd hear laughter during the day, sounds of doors opening and closing, and other little things that made me convinced my house was haunted. One evening, I swore I saw a small dark shadow figure float into the kitchen from my bedroom. It happened so fast, I didn't have much time to process it. My nightmare was very similar to this experience. I was convinced that I woke up in my bed before, at least at the time I thought I was conscious. I was glued to my bed, couldn't move at all, virtually paralyzed. I started hearing strange noises, like a gargling coming from the hallway outside of my room. I remember struggling to open and close my eyes. All of a sudden, I was able to focus my eyes and move my head where I could see that the door was open. I saw this little girl standing in my doorway. She was a black shadow from five feet away from my bed. She approached closer to me, all while I was still paralyzed and couldn't move. The black shadow whispered, don't be scared, I'll be home soon. That's when I woke up, sweating and screaming. Even after realizing it was a nightmare, I could still feel the presence of the shadow in that house. The same girl from my nightmare. I thought it was a bit ridiculous, because I knew at that point, my mind had just conjured this up in my head, even with all the previous signs of ghostly activity. What's even weirder, a few days after I received a call from my sister, she was very emotional because she announced to me that she was having a child. The reason why my sister was so emotional 
was because she had tried for years and years to have children, and she was never able to. Her doctor even told her that she was never going to be able to produce a child. I bet you the shadow from my nightmare came back as her living child. I was never able to find out the history of this house or who lived there, but I can bet you that the little girl used to, and she told me that she was coming back to life. I've noticed that you don't have any ghosts listed for the University of Calgary residences in Calgary, Alberta. I had a strange experience in the residence tower called Randall Hall. I'll give you some brief information. There are two identical towers, plus some apartment style residences that were built in the late 1960s when the university was founded. They are both seven stories tall with a central communal lounge and three hallways radiating out like spokes. Each hallway has 11 rooms and a bathroom. Originally, they were built as a female dorm and a male dorm. I spent three years of my university living in Randall Hall. The room that I shared with my roommate was in the co-ed hallway of the sixth floor of Randall. This kind of applies because we shared all facilities with guys. Toilet stalls, urinals, sinks, and showers were all communal. Think Allie McBeal. And we often had guys hang out in our room. Let's just say that there were quite a few of us engineers on that floor. I started the year living in room 661. One night, I awoke frequently, and I could have sworn that there was someone in my room, sitting in the chair in my roommate's desk. I passed it off as being asleep, but the next day I did ask my roommate, were there any people in our room last night? All she said was yeah, I thought that one of the guys had come in during the night. Weird. Anyway, a little later in the year, I moved into room 557, on the same side of the hallway, two doors down. We started noticing that in the common room which was a large open area in the center of the spokes. One of the elevators would often come up to our floor on its own accord, open, close, then go back down to the main floor. Sometimes it would stay on our floor with the door open for almost an hour before going back down. My real experience came during reading break. I guess your guy's equivalent to spring break. Only we have ours in early to mid-February, and most people leave, because the skiing's awesome in the Rockies, only a few hours away. In our hallway, the only people not gone was me, my roommate, the girls across the hall, and the girl at the end of the hall, on our side by the fire escape. To start my real story, I'll give you guys a little explanation about how our room was laid out. If you walk into the door from the hallway, there is a closet on each side that extends about two feet into the room that goes all the way to each wall, no doors in the closets. The room is approximately square. My roommate's bed was against the left wall, with her desk against the window, directly across the door, and the chair between her headboard and the desk. My bed was against the window, with a headboard against the right wall, with my desk along the right wall. I awoke one night, because I swore that the door to our room had opened, and that one of the guys from the guy's wing had come in. He had gone on a date that night, and was a close friend. I looked over at my roommate's bed, and it looked like this guy was whispering something to her. I found it kind of creepy though, that instead of crouching by her bed like a normal person would do, he was standing with his legs straight, bent at the waist, with his face about two inches from hers. Now, I got kind of pissed off, because it was the middle of the night, and this guy had come in to tell Lauren about his date. I wanted to see what time it was, so I sat up in bed, so I could see her on my desk to my alarm clock which was on a dresser in the closet. 
It was 2.30ish in the morning. So I turned my head to yell, or whisper strongly at this guy. Then I realized it wasn't who I thought it was. This is the creepy part. He stayed bent over my roommate in the same position, but slowly turned his head to look at me. While he was turning his head, this grin spread across his face. One could interpret this grin as malevolent. I sure did at the time. Then he slowly stood straight up and took a few steps backward towards the closet, folded his arms across his chest, and looked at me with the same scary grin on his face. It was strange because really, he had no facial features. Nothing of a face that I could see, except for this grin that I could more sense than see. Well, that was enough for me. Like any 20 going on 6 year old, I dove beneath the covers of my bed and stayed there all night. This was very hard to do since the heating is very efficient in those buildings and most of the rooms are usually hot enough to be in shorts and tanks in. Anyway, I didn't sleep again that night. After a week or so, thinking about this experience, having insomnia, and sleeping with the light on, I have second thoughts on what was going on there. I think that yes, he was intentionally trying to scare someone, but only out of a sense of fun because he knew he could. I think he had my roommates in his target sites, and he had his face by my roommates, waiting for her to wake up with this ghost face two inches from hers. Well, you could wake my roommate up with a cherry bomb when she's sleeping, never mind waking to a ghostly presence like so many of us do. Instead I woke up, and his grin was more of a, finally, someone's awake that I can scare grin. So that was it, other than the knocking, which is actually quite funny. It was about two days after my experience, when all three of our rooms got simultaneous knocks at 5.30 in the morning. My roommate got up to answer the door, and scared the crap out of both her and the girl, directly across from her, by opening the door at the exact same time. Also, the girl at the end of the hall had her head out of the door, asking if someone had knocked. There was no one in the hall, and no way someone could have left without us hearing. The door into the central common room was on a mnemonic hinge and made a whining noise when you opened it. The door to the fire escape at the other end makes a crap load of noise which echoes through the floors. The door to the bathroom also has a mnemonic hinge and bangs when it closes. Anyway, to close this outrageously long story out, I worked for housekeeping during the summer because the residents are rented out like hotel rooms. I didn't go back home in the summer. I was talking with the cleaner from the sixth floor while doing laundry one day. She related that she has had experiences with this guy over the last few years. She was cleaning a room after move out and had the door propped open with the garbage can. A guy poked his head around the door, looked her in the eye, kicked the garbage out from in front of the door, and slammed it. There was no one there when she went to look. There are rumors that a guy got really stressed out during exams in the 80s, and threw himself off the roof into the parking lot. I've not substantiated these claims, so who knows. I do know that the roofs are now off limits to students, whereas they weren't in the past. The cleaner says that he is quite shy and is only seen during summer, Christmas, on reading breaks, never when the residences are filled with people. This isn't the first time I've told someone this. Normally people don't believe me because I'm only 14, but I swear that everything I'm about to say is the honest truth. My first experience happened six years ago, 
my friend was sleeping over at mine. We couldn't sleep, so we were just talking in the dark. Well, it wasn't that dark, because I had the curtains open. I remember it being a few minutes past midnight. I also remember thinking my friend had stood up, because there was a shadow on the wall opposite us, but she was still lying down, but she too had seen the shadow. It had no features, and was only head and shoulders. It was where my light switch was. We both looked outside to see if anyone was there. Nothing. So we started to really freak out and closed the curtains as quick as possible. And when we reopened them a few seconds later, it was gone. I have no explanation for this. I definitely wasn't dreaming and neither of us had imagined it. Later on that year, I was alone in the house watching a video. I stopped the video to get something to eat downstairs. When I came back, the video had been took out from my video player and was on my bed. My next experience happened maybe about five or four years ago. I was on the computer and I was the only one in the house as my brother was out and my mom and dad were out working. I didn't have any music on at the time, and the TV wasn't on either. Basically, things were silent. I heard this voice coming from downstairs calling my name. It was definitely a woman's voice. Maybe in her late 20s, I wasn't sure at this time. I really started to freak out. It lasted for around 5 minutes, and then it stopped. The next couple of times I heard it really scared me. The last time I heard it, I was home alone again. The TV was on mute and I was on the computer again. The voice came from right next to me. It shouted my name into my ear. It shocked me so badly that I actually screamed so loud that the people next door heard me. Since then, I haven't heard it. But recently, I've been hearing music playing in and outside of my house. Also recently, things keep happening in my room, like I keep feeling cold spots. And a lot of the time, I feel like I'm not the only one in the room. It's really scary. Plus, my TV has been on mute or changed channels when I'm nowhere near the remote. It scares me a lot. It shook me up so bad that I hate being alone in the house. This occurred roughly 20 years ago when I was 19 or 20, and I was sleeping over at my boyfriend's apartment in Spring Valley, California. My boyfriend left for work by 4 a.m., and I was alone in the apartment. This one morning after he left, I awoke on my back to a heaviness in the room. It was still dark, but becoming dawn. I looked to my right, and standing next to me by the bed was this tall black shrouded shadow entity. I was terrified. I could feel its presence surrounding me. Then, it spoke. I was lying there wide-eyed and in shock. I'm not still sure how I heard it. Was it audible or just in my head? The voice was deep and gruff and asked, what are you doing here? I'm familiar with some experiences with the paranormal, just never had it been so terrifying. I closed my eyes and began the Lord's Prayer. By the last words, deliver me from evil, amen. The room had cleared. I felt the change immediately, and when I reopened my eyes, all was normal again. I told my boyfriend later that day, and he thought it was his deceased grandfather being curious. My boyfriend's grandma was recently staying with him, and she would tell him stories of the grandfather visiting her. Possible, I guess, but I still wonder what the black shrouded entity was and what its intentions were. For 
for many years. I had a great cat named Kitty. Kitty didn't like many people. She mainly only liked me. She always slept up against my legs at night, on the outside of the covers. She loved to be close to me. After she died, I was absolutely miserable. I missed her so much. After a few days, I started getting a glimpse of her walking around the house out of the corner of my eye. I didn't say anything to anyone for a while. One day, my aunt said that she didn't realize that we had gotten another cat after Kitty had died. I told her that we didn't have any other cats, or any other pets for that matter. She was absolutely convinced that she had seen a cat walk across the doorway in our living room. One night, just as I was going to sleep, I felt Kitty jump up onto the bed and cuddle up against me. I could feel her pressing up against my legs. I tried my best to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but my husband felt her jump onto the bed also. Over the years, she has gradually stopped coming around us so much. She still shows up whenever I'm upset or sick. I guess she just likes to comfort me, just like she did when she was alive. Hello. I grew up in an old apartment building in the Fordham Hill section of the Bronx. When I was about 14 years old, I was speaking on the telephone to my best friend, who lived upstairs on the fifth floor of the building. My apartment was on the second floor. My friend said that she was going to go down to my apartment in a few minutes. As soon as I hung up the telephone, there was a knock on the door. I wondered how my friend could have possibly made it down three flights of stairs so quickly as we hung up the phone that second. I went to the door and looked out of the people to see if it was her. There, at the door, stood a tall young looking man wearing a ruffled white shirt, a thick black belt, black pants, and black boots that went almost to his knees. Hanging from the side of his belt was a sword or a saber. As I stared at him, it appeared as though he was looking right at me with piercing blue eyes, even though the door was between us. I then noticed that I could see the number on the apartment door across from mine through his shirt. I quickly ran from the door, realizing what I had seen, thoroughly frightened, and called my friend asking her to hurry and calm down as I was alone in the house. I will never forget it for as long as I live. I did some research and learned that there was revolutionary battles on in a mug for damn hill. I came to the conclusion that the ghost was a revolutionary war soldier, probably British from the clothing. I only wish I could learn more. Nothing occurred for the rest of the time that I lived in that apartment. Thanks for having a great site where people can share their experiences. Like a lot of people, I've had friends and family members pass away. One of my best friends was John, who died from pancreatic cancer while still in his early 30s. Many years later, I started a habit while praying. I asked God to help me always remember my friends and family who have passed away, who influenced me, and who are a big part of my life. Then I think of their names and say them silently in prayer. About a year ago, our friend and family priest passed away, and I attended the funeral mass. As I was kneeling in the pews, I felt someone beside me. I looked to my right, and there, plain as day, was John. He was there for only two, maybe three seconds, and then disappeared. I shook my head and looked again, but he was gone. I hadn't thought about John at all that day, 
and I may never know why he decided to show himself. I know that God puts people into your life for a reason, and I know that even after they are gone, they are always with you. I love you, brother. Thanks for the visit. I met my first ghost when I was four years old, in the bathroom of the first house I can clearly remember living in, and ever since then, I've been chased by them. The first ghost was a young boy in overalls and a button-down shirt and a straw hat. He looked to be about six years old and didn't do anything except stand there in the bathroom watching as I brushed my teeth. He appeared there several times over the next few months until my family moved to a house just up the road. In the new house, which was the same property, I never felt comfortable. Sometimes at night, I woke up hearing someone call my name, but the voice was unfamiliar. I was always too afraid to get out of bed and assumed that if it was my mother or father calling me, they would come to get me. The house was always cold, as I'm told newly built houses usually are for a while, but even years after I moved in, there was always a chill in the air that neither the electric heat nor the wood-burning stove could chase away. Even in the summer, the first time anything appeared to me in that house, I was seven and my brother Josh was a few months old. His crib was kept in my room and I was always the first to wake up when he was crying. One night in March, when Josh was five months old, he was crying and he woke me. I sat up in bed and waited for mom to come in and get him, and as I looked out my bedroom window, I saw something silvery and translucent, standing on the railing of the deck on the back of the house. As my eyes came into focus, I made out the vague figure of a heavy-set woman with a little boy in her arms, the same little boy who had appeared to me in the bathroom of the old house three years before. She extended her arms and held them, dangling from her hands, and then let them go. I quickly closed my eyes, not wanting to see what happened. I heard the sound of a child crying. I covered my hand with my pillow and tried to go back to sleep. Through the rest of my childhood, there were many more experiences of this type. I saw male ghost that I presumed to be the father of the little boy ghost, a much younger little girl ghost, and an older girl who had a distressed look about her, as if she had been through something terrible. Her clothes were ragged and torn up, and appeared to be stained with something dark. I speculated that it might have been blood, and every year, on the night of August 1st, I lie awake at night, listening to the sounds of children screaming. I gave up trying to explain the sights and sounds to my parents, who just laughed at me. Their excuses for not believing me went from inadequate to just ridiculous. At one point, when I was 11 or 12 years old, they told me ghosts don't haunt new houses because they can't make enough noise. All that changed when I was 15. My mom and I were up late watching a movie. After she had come in from work, around 2 a.m., she drifted off to sleep and I went to the kitchen for a glass of water. When I came back, she was sitting bolt upright on the couch where she had been lying asleep. Her eyes were wide and fearful and she was pointing at the front window. I followed her gaze and in the light on the front porch, I saw the shadow of a man hanging from a rope. Together, Mom and I opened the front door to investigate, but nothing was there. Mom was proactive. She began researching the farm we lived on, desperate to find any reason for the hauntings we were experiencing. In the meantime, I experienced more and more alarming sightings. I found old toys under my bed, ragdolls with button eyes that were pulled loose, and wooden pop guns and handmade bears all of them dirty and obviously ancient. 
the two small children kept appearing wherever I was, calling my name and tugging on my clothes. The most frightening thing happened a few weeks before I left for college. I was packing up my books and CDs and felt an unwelcome chill. It was early August again, about the same time I always had the most intense experiences. I stood up and moved the box I was packing. And when I turned around, I saw a large man in the corner of my room. He was different from any of the other ghosts I had seen, with a darker coloring and sharper, more defined details. He was wearing dark clothes and had his back turned towards me. I looked closely and saw that there was someone with him, so when he backed into the corner, the older girl from the family ghost I'd been seeing for years. He was harming her, though I couldn't tell if he was just beating her or trying to mess with her or what, but she was crying and screaming, and it was absolutely bone chilling. As I stood there in the room watching, the other male ghost came into the room holding an axe and approached the other two in the corner. I couldn't watch and ran out of the room. Over the next few years, my mother documented everything she had seen and heard in this house, ranging from the same sorts of things I had seen to some even more aggressive appearances. One day in early August, a couple of years after I left for college, she was in the barn watering the horses and tripped over an ax. Later that same year, she was cleaning out the basement and came across a rope that none of our family had put there. Her research on the farm in the original house that stood on the land revealed that it had once belonged to a wealthy family named Hawkins. The father, Thomas, was convicted in 1893 of the murder of a young man named James Logan after discovering him in his daughter's Francine's bedroom. Thomas was put to sleep later that year. His wife Josephine and their two young children were killed during a tornado in March of the next year, and the property was sold at an auction the following August, a year after the murder of James Logan. I've seen and heard ghosts for many years, ever since I was a small child. These are a series of ghost stories that you probably haven't heard. Forgive me, the formatting is a little different, and it's scattered, and the writing isn't very good, but I think you'll get the gist of it. This one occurred in Elong Road, Croydon, Surrey. That's England. My mother saw and heard a little boy walking up the road and singing. He then walked up a pile of sand and disappeared through a wall in a different city in Surrey. I saw two ghosts there, next to the chalk pits. The first appeared and disappeared, and was an old man in brown. The second was younger, and he appeared and disappeared twice before my eyes. Two people walking towards me walked right through him and didn't see him at all. It was very eerie. My sister and I saw the apparition of a man in dark clothes and wearing a hat standing in our bedroom. The room was cold and eerie. We were both very frightened. Several months later, my sister saw a girl with a Scotty dog come in the front door and walk up the stairs. There was nobody there when she went to investigate. In this next small tale, this event occurred in Eversfield's old people's home. It's in Surrey. In the caretaker's house, and in the house next door, there were noises heard when nobody was around, blood dripping through the ceiling onto mirrors, which could never be cleaned. They also heard the sounds of coat hangers being rattled about next door when nobody was in the house. Doors would open and shut violently. A bed moved away from the wall, silently, while the room was full of people. 
you could also hear the sounds of women's voices downstairs, of laughter and chatter. When you open the door to listen, it then goes silent. The lights swing violently as though there is a strong wind, but there is no wind to be seen or felt for that matter. At the Rygate Parish School, now converted into houses and flats, the sounds of children playing and talking can be heard. I don't mean the voices of the children while they're still in school. By the time they leave, after hours, you could hear the voices of children still ringing. People have also reported piano playing as well, as well as a tambourine. When they go to open the door, the playing stops, but the piano is reverberating. On the road of Wallfield Annex, Rygate Road, there is an extremely haunted house now, also converted to flats. The ghost of a man in period costume stands at the window on a full moon. I've had the privilege of staying the night at these flats before, and let me tell you, the ghost is a real thing. He's aware that you are watching him, and each night he gets closer to your bed. One night, he was peering into my face, and he winked at me before disappearing. Apparently, the house was owned by artists who liked to paint by the light of the moon, which may explain the haunting. There were times when my daughter had certain experiences as well. My daughter told me that she had a friend, a child, who visited her at night and stood at the end of the bed. Obviously. She's referring to a ghost. This house is a Gregorian mansion, and you can feel its history. It's a very spiritual house. I often dream of this house. Perhaps my spirit is there, even in life. Anyway, that's all my stories that I have to share. I work really early in the morning, so by the time I get off work and head home, I'm really tired. I was sneaking in a nap before my husband came home. I've seen some unexplained things when I was younger, but I've never had this happen to me. This was in my parents' basement because at that time, my husband and I were building a home. When I think about it, the dogs never came down in the room. They hated it down there. Anyways, like I said, I was taking a nap. I remember waking up in complete horror. I was being attacked. By this I mean, this shadow figure was trying to get at me while I was asleep. It started at the foot of my bed, and I was kicking my feet at it to get away from me. It then moved up right next to me. I could feel it trying to touch me. And that horrified me. Something about this thing was not right. I was still kicking my legs at it. I remember thinking in my head, no, no. I then sat up straight in bed and looked around. Nothing was there. My heart was pounding and I was sweating. I didn't know what to think. I still don't. I wasn't fully awake during this fight to keep the shadow away from me. I guess I could have been dreaming, but it felt so real. Living with a ghost is not all that bad, as my family and I have found out. We moved to our home in the Skyland Estates in 1991. At the time, we had our three and one year old boys living at home. We started to get clues that something unruly was living with us. When my wife and I started to hear our three year old talking to someone in his bedroom, he told us that it was an older lady that came to talk to him. He stayed in that room for three years until he moved him to another room and put his younger brother in that room. The same thing started happening with the other brother. We have two younger kids who also stayed in that room once, and they all reported that an old lady had visited them. 
oftentimes, the lady would speak through them. The kids would call her Miss G. Miss G would also make herself known to my wife and I. She was very active any time we made improvements to our home. She would come and watch us, often from the closet, as we would consistently hear and see the closet door open. One time, my wife even swore that she saw a floating face there as she was cleaning. When we were working in the house, we would also feel as though a hand was placed in our bodies. At this moment, we'd also feel a draft of cold come in. When I was working alone, I'd feel the hand again, thinking that this time it was my wife. I would stop to say something, look over my shoulder, and there would be nobody there. This happens to my wife too. She would think I was touching her as well. I saw Miss G once in 1993. I was sitting in the living room late at night. I remember I had the doors leading to the living room closed. A short moment later, I heard what I thought was the sound of my wife walking behind the door. I turned to look back and saw the silhouette of a figure walk by. I immediately went to open the door and look for my wife when I saw a figure move quickly from the hallway into the kitchen then turned the corner. It happened so fast and it spooked me. That's when my wife walked through the front door. She had been shopping. That's when I suddenly realized that this was the presence of Ms. G that was making herself known to me. Even though it spooked me, I don't think she meant any harm by it. As if to say sorry, I'm just passing through here. My wife has had many interactions with her in the kitchen while cooking. She would set the table and ask her to move a plate. The plate would move slightly forward on its own, not a big movement, but enough to let her know she was there. After these encounters, we did some research about who our ghostly ghost really was. We found out that an older lady had the house built as her dream home to retire in. Unfortunately, she passed away only a day after she moved in. There was another homeowner who bought the house before us. They only lived there for a month before moving out to live with their kids. I really don't think Miss G is a threat to us, but I believe when we do eventually move from this house, we'll miss her presence even if it's a bit scary at times. My name is Stacy, and I reside in Brownsville, Texas, approximately two minutes from the International Bridge into Mexico. What I'm about to tell you is something that happened to me when I was in the third grade, and haven't been able to forget since then. I'm now 25. I remember very distinctly that it was Halloween night, and my brother, father, and I had just returned from a night of trick-or-treating. It was almost midnight when my parents sent us to bed, worried we wouldn't wake up in time for school the next day. At this time, being so young and so close to the border, I shared a room with my nanny. We slept on two twin beds. Mine was situated right under a window to my left, and my feet pointed towards an adjoining room we called the laundry room that also doubled as a closet. There was a window in there as well, which illuminated to little room with light from the moon in conjunction with the street lamps. At this time, our house didn't have central air, so we slept with the windows open and a floor oscillating fan. I'd been asleep for a while, and I woke up because I felt hot and looked at the fan as the blades had a tendency to jam. As I had suspected, the fan wasn't working, and I stared at the ceiling, contemplating going to the kitchen for a glass of water. While doing so, I happened to glance into the closet, and standing in front of the washer was the figure of a man dressed all in black 
and wearing some type of hat, a fedora maybe. Also, his face was not visible to me at all, and all I could see was the black underneath his hat. He was chuckling, but at the same time, I thought it was the most horrifying noise in the world. He started to talk, very casually, about how he was going to get me and my family. I snapped, and finally I realized that this wasn't supposed to be happening. He wasn't supposed to be there. Where was his face? I jumped up from the bed and sprinted to the door, hoping at the same time, not wanting anything to be able to reach out and grab me. I could still hear him laughing, and I felt him getting closer. By the way, when he said all those things to me, it was like a telepathic thing. I don't know if you understand that, but that's the best way I can describe it. I then noticed a faint banging that kept getting louder as I got closer to the door. I then realized it was my brother banging on his wall. That was when I realized that I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I reached the door and no matter how hard I pulled on it, it wouldn't open. I also tried turning on the lights. I had a dimmer and I kept turning the knob but it wouldn't turn on. Suddenly, my nanny woke up and yelled at me to stop screaming and asking me what was wrong. Was I crazy? Then, just as suddenly as it had began, the laughing and the whispering and everything else stopped. The door opened and the light turned on. My parents had no idea what was going on because their room was at the other side of the house. My nanny still tells me that I was white as a ghost, and as soon as she touched me, I fainted. Needless to say, I was not able to go to school the next day. When I was about seven years old, I can remember this very strange house in West Virginia I used to live in. First, it started with my brothers and sisters and I. We all had one bedroom upstairs we slept in, and one night, waking up, I saw a strange figure of a little child by our bed. I recall turning the opposite way and holding on to my older sister. Being that age, I never thought nothing of it until about eight years later my family and I moved out, and we were talking about how nice it was to live there, and my mother and father were telling us that we only knew the strange things that they had seen and heard. My father said he woke up one night seeing a little child and thinking it was one of us, and he said go back to bed. The figure never moved, so we sat up from the bed realizing it was a shadow figure and not one of us. And when we went to wake my mother up, it was gone. And other times, here my mother would get up in the middle of the night and see that figure all the time, thinking it was okay, nothing bad was really happening. A few months after that, he heard loud noises, like a baby crying. He said it sounded like it was coming from the wall. My father would really have loved to know about the spirits, but my mother really wanted to move. It's funny when you are little, you really don't know what's going on. When I was little, I used to play outside a lot. In my country, the weather is really, really hot. So hot that if you stay under the sun for five minutes and then go back inside, your head hurts and you will see lights everywhere, for a while anyway. I always used to see figures that those lights would make, but I wasn't scared at all because I knew that the sun was making them. One day, I was outside playing with my brother, but it wasn't as hot to make your head hurt or see figures and lights. I saw the shape of a black dog walking or going somewhere, and then it disappeared. Well, the dog wasn't walking, he was just going somewhere. The figure was not perfectly clear to say that it was definitely a dog, but it really looked like one, and once I saw it, I didn't say anything 
because I was used to seeing things because of the strong sun. But as soon as I saw it, it disappeared. My brother said, hey, did you see that figure of that black dog that went by and disappeared? I was shocked because I thought I was the only one that saw that thing. It was crazy. So that was a very strange experience. We both asked each other what the heck that was. We were very confused. I'm sure that the figure we saw was a ghost. When I was a small child, around 7 or 8 in the late 1950s, my parents took our family consisting of my sister and two families of cousins, and all their parents, plus one grandmother, to the UP in Michigan. The reason being for this was, there weren't enough bedrooms downstairs in the rented cabin, circa 1920s. That's where all the adults slept, and all of us kids were put in the sleeping bags up in the loft. Not too much time after going to bed, I felt a heavy presence, and looked around to see if any of the cousins were feeling this, whatever it was. Alas, they were all sleeping soundly, except for me. After a while, I became very afraid, and a man's face appeared right above my sleeping bag, glowing like it was daytime. It was well after midnight. I remember seeing this face for a moment or two, before the face vanished entirely. I was so scared, I screamed in terror to leave me alone, waking up my family in the process. They asked me what the matter was and I told them that I saw a face. They both tried to confront whatever it was, and told me that it was just my imagination, and that there was nobody there to scare me. All night long, I laid there frozen in my sleeping bag, unable to move. Years later, I returned to the same cabin. I was 18 years old now, and I was with a couple of friends. At this point, I'd become so fascinated with ghosts and the paranormal that I wanted to do some spirit sessions in the process. We ended up using a Ouija board to contact the spirits that I thought appeared to me years before as a kid. So, me and my friends began the Ouija board session. We began to ask it all sorts of questions and requested it do things for us. Things such as turning the lights on and off knocking on the walls of the cabin, anything to get that extra confirmation. It wasn't until my friend James told me that he was getting bored of this because we weren't getting any answers and the Ouija board wasn't even moving the planchet. It almost seemed as if the spirit had completely left until late that night when we went to bed. There was a rocking chair in the cabin that had been left there for years. What my friend James saw next swears it was true. I'd fallen asleep, and James had woken up to take a smoke break out on the front porch. The rocking chair was on the front porch. As James was smoking, he suddenly turns to face the rocking chair, and the chair literally rocked back and forth, as if someone was sitting there. This wouldn't stop for about 30 seconds. Then it suddenly stopped. He called me over, and by the time I had a chance to witness it, the chair stopped. This was in the middle of the summer, and there was absolutely no wind. I believed James, because he had no reason to make up any stories about the rocking chair. I mean, to be honest, it wasn't like it was the most unbelievable thing that could happen to someone. Definitely creepy considering what we were asking for hours before. I don't exactly remember when in our friendship James said this, but we made an agreement that one day, that if either of us passes on before the other, we would give each other another sign to yet again prove that ghosts in the afterlife is a real thing. Fast forward another 12 years, James unfortunately died in a car accident the year before, it was so devastating because he had just gotten married a month prior and had a baby on the way. I was very close to his family 
nor remained good buddies throughout his life. Creepily enough, I had a dream that I was in the same cabin and was again playing the Ouija board with James. I then remember the Ouija board suddenly disappearing. Then, we were sitting on the couch together, drinking beers, and just hanging out. James looked at me and said, if you only knew. I asked what he meant. He then remarked, I wish I wasn't dead. I miss you guys so much. The dream ends, and I wake up with tears in my eyes. I've never had a dream about him after that. You may say that this was just my magic mind making up a dream of us together because I was mourning. However, I took it as a sign that maybe James was telling me he was still around. This was the only sign I had gotten from him, as in the waking world, I've never had any. I've also been back to that same cabin for many years after, and I never saw the rocking chair move or that face ever again. Weird. I will start by telling a story that happened to me when I was about 13. It was very early in the morning, dark as a matter of fact. I was half asleep on the couch in my living room, just about to wake up. In the hallway from the kitchen, I heard a growl, then a scratching sound. This scratching turned into a tapping, like how a dog runs on a hard floor. This sound seemed to rush from the hallway closer to me, when all of a sudden, I feel something hit me as I try to wake up. What happened next can be explained as sleep paralysis, but instead of just the feeling of being pushed down, I felt as if my chest was being torn open and my sides were ripped apart. The growling was still present, along with my whimpered voice trying to let out a scream. After I tried to put up a fight with whatever it was, a hallucination or some other being, I jumped back awake with tears dripping. My chest felt that pain for that entire day. The reason why I told this story, even though I'm not sure if it was a hallucination or not, is that it closely relates to another experience that happened not too long ago, almost a week actually. I was again half asleep in my bed, the same room where I've mentioned seeing a ghost lady at the foot of my bed and another experience I've emailed, where I was practically having a nightmare. It was a strange nightmare where there were faceless beings surrounding me, ripping my body apart. It's a dream, so it's very hard to explain in words. Well, usually in nightmares, you widely awaken in fear before you go back to sleep. The most disturbing thing about this is, after I became widely awake, these same apparitions were still in my room, surrounding me, muttering and growling. I then closed my eyes, fell back on my pillow, and I let out a cry. I woke my mom up. She rushed in to see what was wrong, and she saw me laying there with my eyes wide open on my pale face. I felt sick for a week since that day. I thought hard about this occurrence when I realized that the sounds and feelings I've sensed from the first story were present in what happened in the second one. It's a rough connection, but I felt the very same emotions and I feel like there must be a connection. They both happened in my waking stage of sleep. The spirits, as I think they are, rush an attack towards the inside of the chest and are disturbingly similar. In any case, it's something I really want to look into. I've had plenty of people spend the night here, in the living room mostly, and hear strange noises coming from that branch of the house. My room, the hallway, and the kitchen are all in the same branch of the house, which is the newer addition to the old schoolhouse building. Some of my friends who have been here late at night have felt a strange presence from that hallway too. I know I felt it as a child. I remember trying to avoid that hallway for my life. I 
remember when I was a little girl. My grandparents own a colonial farmhouse that had been standing for at least 150 years. My grandmother thought the house may have been used for the Underground Railroad, because it had a few little doors and rooms off some of the closets in the bedrooms and in the basement. I wasn't allowed to go into them because they didn't have electricity and my grandmother was afraid that I would hurt myself. Members of my family said that I wouldn't want to go in them anyway because there were ghosts in there. Of course, I didn't believe them. I thought they were just telling me this to scare me as any seven year old would. But that was all going to change one night when I spent the night there one night. I was staying in their guest room, which had one of those little rooms off the closet. The little room was probably for extra storage, or maybe a staircase, because the back was all boarded up. And late that night, I woke up because I thought I was being watched. I looked up and noticed that the closet door was open and a small figure was standing there, glowing bluish. I screamed and ran into my grandmother's room and wouldn't go back into that room. I never saw that figure again, but I did see another ghost of an elderly farmer on the property. I was nine this time and playing in the barn. I was upstairs in the hayloft, burrowing around in the hay, again, like I wasn't supposed to be. Again, I had that same feeling of being watched. I sat up and looked around and in the corner, an elderly farmer was standing and watching me. At first I thought it was my grandfather, but then I realized that his feet weren't touching the floor. As soon as I noticed this, I screamed and ran out of the barn. There have been many sightings of him since then, including one of my brothers seeing him floating outside of a second story window. This is an experience I've had repeatedly over the course of several years when I'm in bed for the night, just falling asleep. Still, to this day, it tries to return, but I've found ways to avoid it or fight it because it scares the heck out of me. It's almost as if it were a dream, but I'm not actually asleep when it happens. I feel as if it is when I'm on the verge of sleep but still almost awake, like just before your mind actually lets go and sleeps. There's a place in between, and it only lasts a second, but that's when this thing happens to me. I can only speak for myself. I don't know of anyone else who has experienced this, but I've heard stories. Also, whenever I remember this, it is always in slow motion. I feel as if it is something coming at me, from behind always, always towards my back. It's like a shadow, and it tries to suck me deeper into sleep, and if I don't fight it with all my might, I truly believe I'll never wake up again. While this is happening, I'm frozen and cannot move, yet I'm aware of my room. I'm aware of things around me and what is happening. I can even hear my TV. I can scream in my mind and barely hear it all come out of my own mouth. It takes all my might and effort to open my eyes. But once I get my eyes open, I can focus on things in my room, like my dresser or door, anything, and come out of it. But it is so strong, I sometimes feel I cannot make it, and that is why I believe I will never wake up. The entire time this is happening, I'm frozen to my bed and cannot move. Please note, it's hard to explain. It doesn't feel as if it is pulling my body. It is pulling me deeper into sleep. One time, it was pulling me so strongly that when I did get my eyes open, I actually could see my room, but it was as if looking through water or fog. It still had me even though I was opening up my eyes. This is a true experience. Believe this, I'm not joking. I would not type this much otherwise. If I were to compare it to anything, I would say it resembles the dark figures or shadows in the movie Ghost with Whoopi Goldberg. 
that come and take someone away right after they have died. Please note, I cannot physically see whatever this is. I'm saying that this is my guess of what it would look like. To this day, I still cannot sleep without the TV. This has happened to me repeatedly, countless times within a span of several years. When this began, I lived in an apartment near the Piedmont Hills in the Bay Area, California. I was always uncomfortable and felt as if I was being watched there. I started sleeping in the front room with the TV on because I started having really evil dreams and was so scared to be alone at this point. I would desperately beg my boyfriend to please stay home with me, but he couldn't take any more time off because he wasn't able to use any more sick days. Sometimes I'm just too scared to be there alone, especially at night. I never used to be that way, and I'm not faint of heart. I'm actually 4'11 and 90 pounds soaking wet, but I forget I'm not 10 feet tall and bulletproof sometimes. Still, when this began, I became scared. Whatever it is that followed me when I moved, and to this day I still feel it, Although it has been a while since I have struggled with it, when I go to sleep, I must have my boyfriend hold me with my back at his chest, spoon fashion, and this works, and when he rolls over, I can make sure my back is touching his, and I feel comfortable this way. As long as my back or behind me isn't opened or exposed, for some reason, it isn't as bad as when I feel my back is protected and I'm not as vulnerable when I'm facing it. I know this all sounds strange, but it is true. I work in a nursing home, third shift. For the last year, I've been transferred to the first floor. I, among others, have seen some pretty weird stuff. It starts like this. About six months ago, I started seeing off the wall things while all of us were at the nursing station. There are only four employees on third shift first floor. People coming out of the dining room, not in wheelchairs, but walking upright and pretty darn fast. A person down one hall walking out of one room and into the next on the same side of the hall. Both rooms have non-ambulatory residents. Water turning on in one's room's bathroom. One resident that passed away about four months ago can still be heard laughing. I've never heard this personally, but others have. An entity that always runs in the same direction at lightning speed with arms flailing. I'm talking 28 days later style. Only two of us have seen this. I see it sometimes up to five times a night, but only when I'm down one certain hall. I call it the track runner. These are some of the real common things that happen. Now, for the ghost stories. About three months ago, I had a resident that is mentally with it asked me to get that man out of her room. It literally gave me goosebumps. When I asked her where he was, she sat there by the mirror. Needless to say, I saw no one. So later on, I asked a coworker if she had seen anything that was different or odd. She told me to stop and went pale. About 10 minutes later, she came to me again and started talking, mainly about the things I posted above. We ended up at the nursing station in a pretty good discussion, and all of us had pretty much the same story. Fast forward to Thursday, October 14th to 15th third shift. The same resident that had asked me a few months ago to remove the man by the mirror from her room rings me her call bell. I go down and ask what I can do. She tells me to get him out of here. I ask who, the person by the dresser, she replies. Now I'm thinking too cool. I step out in the hall and get another coworker and have her wait outside the door out of sight. As I return to the room, she's now asking me, why is my husband with that stranger? My husband is dead, and I don't know that other person. 
I ask her where they are, and she tells me, don't act that way with me, I'm not crazy, I know what I see, then proceeds to get verbally abusive with me. The other coworker comes in at this point after hearing what went on, and the resident goes through the same routine about her husband and the stranger with him. So we get the change nurse, same routine. Three, about an hour later, another resident rings her call bell. At this point, two of us go down together, different hall. This resident is bugging us to get her out of bed. Her words, I don't want to be in bed with him. He's not my husband, and I don't know him. She was definitely shook up, so we transferred her to her chair and brought her out to the nursing station with us. While we were getting her some coffee and graham crackers, another bell rings. Again, different hall. The charge nurse got that one. She comes back out and stated that the residents that the man by her TV told her she wasn't going to be here much longer, and she insisted that he was still there, although the charge nurse couldn't see him even after turning the lights on. Number 5. The first lady that saw her husband and strange rings again. So three of us went down and left one aide to watch the hall's answer and answer call lights. This time, two of us stay in the hall and only the charge nurse went in. The residents started talking about possession and demons, very detailed and very scary to say the least. I figured with all the weird stuff happening at work and all, I would share what I've been experiencing with my coworkers as of late. I've had other uncanny things in my life at other places, but nothing with this much activity or so many other people that either agree with me or describe what I've seen to me first without me asking. I have a confession to make. I'm not an ordinary person. I don't mean that I've exhibited quirky behavior in the past and I'm simply unorthodox, but I have this uncanny ability to sense things. Whether these energies that I've learned to embrace are malevolent or benevolent, I can't say, as I'm unable to clearly make the distinction, but I and to attract unusual energies, which permeate all around me. If you happen to come in close contact with me, you may be susceptible to these energies as well. I could say that there's a supernatural component to this, but because my mind has relentlessly wreaked havoc on me, I can't say for certain what is going on. Sometimes I see things, shadows, Hearing strange noises, knocks on the walls, a faint whisper in my ear, reinforcing the idea that something otherworldly resides inside these walls. All the while, while I'm sitting in the kitchen of my old Victorian home, and I'm the only one who lives here, I can honestly say that I don't know what is happening, but I have nowhere else to turn to. There's the cellar that I'm terrified to go into. I've literally haven't stepped foot down there since I moved in. But it's like I can telepathically hear the growls and moans coming from that dark space that I refuse to enter. I've always wanted to know if the source of all these energies came from that cellar. The thing is, I've no pets, no estranged relationships, Nobody ever sits foot in my home. I had a wife once, but she's been gone for what seems like a millennium. I don't remember what it's like to interact with anybody. I'm virtually imprisoned. I work from home. So, I became a recluse. I don't go out much these days for fear of inadvertently transferring these energies to those who come in contact with me. Isolation is unconscionable. The fear of going insane inside my mind constantly lingers in the foreground. 
The helplessness of not being able to do anything about it still traps me internally. I'm mentally paralyzed. And then I have these unusual nightmares. My doctor tells me they are night terrors. So I'm laying in my bed, and the shadow opens the door. It doesn't do anything, but simply stands in the door for I don't know what it wants, but I can only make out its eyes, glowing brighter than the sun. The rest the outline, a silhouette. I sweat, my body temperature drops, and I feel a cold breath on the right side of my shoulder. I look over, temporarily taking my eyes off the shadow figure. And yet there is nothing there, but a mist that looks as if someone is breathing in the cold air. I look back at the doorframe, and the shadow is gone. I then lay down, staring at the ceiling. I simply just can't ignore what's going on. I want to, but even the pills don't do enough. I still see these things hear these things, and most importantly, feel these things. I'm so scared. I don't want to be a prisoner anymore. I want a release. I want it all to end. I'm sick and tired of the suffering. My mind just won't heal. I don't want to feel. It's almost better if I don't. But I can't turn it off. Still, these images persist. In another moment, I can clearly see this elderly woman silently screaming at me. I can feel the terrible darkness emitting from her. And when she opens her mouth, there is nothing but darkness. Almost as if it is a black hole. No sound just the mouth opening. The woman with her old tattered clothing, not from this time period, definitely not present, Victorian times, with a black dress from that era, long black hair, matted and uncombed. This being was just standing there. I ask it what it wants from me, but I remain silently screaming for a few seconds. I blink my eyes as hard as anybody could. The figure simply won't disappear. I see a single cockroach move out of her mouth. I had to have dreamt this. This night terror felt so real. It consumes me. I can't get it out of my head. I go back and forth thinking this has got to just be a hallucination, but the more I think about these events, the way they truly never disappear, it makes me believe there is an entity in this house that I can't ignore. They are communicating to me through my dreams, and through some of my hallucinations that I've had as well. The therapists, the doctors, they all tell me that I've got some psychosis. Trauma from my youth remains unsolved. But these walls inside this old home has so much history engraved into it. Tell me that spirits don't exist, and I can't prove it to you. I can only tell you about my experiences and how sensitive I am to the other side. That. I think to myself, why are we so arrogant about this other side? Why do we dismiss what we do not understand? Maybe I'm just crazy. Or maybe the world wants to shield us from the fact that these beings live among us. If you truly open up your eyes and begin to understand that there is nothing that the world can't see. And you can believe. Several years ago, 
I was planning on moving from the USA to Australia to be with my partner, Craig. My partner and I would talk for hours on the web. What else can you do when you're 9,000 miles apart? My daughter, Catherine, who was seven at the time, would often get in on it too. Her and Greg developed a very loving father-daughter relationship, even though he is her stepdad. One day, no different than any other, Greg and I were chatting. He wanted to talk to Catherine. I yelled for her. She was in another room, and I couldn't see the monitor. She came running and stopped dead inside the doorway. She could not see the monitor and started wigging out, demanding that Greg shut his bedroom door, which was clearly visible behind him. She wouldn't move from where she was. We tried to coax her, but she wasn't having any of it. Greg got up and closed the bedroom door. Catherine ran into my lap and buried her face into my shoulder, away from the monitor. She wouldn't even look at the monitor. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, he's mean, and I don't want to see him. Completely caught off guard, I asked her who was mean. She answered, the mean guy in the doorway. I asked her to describe him. She said he was tall, had red hair, blue eyes, and wore a dressy shirt. Deeper voice than Greg's. Oh. And by the way, Greg's voice is already pretty deep enough as it is. I tried to get more information out of her. That was all she had, or what she wanted to tell me anyway. I relayed what she had told me to Greg, and he just didn't get it. Catherine left my lap as fast as she had flown into it, yelled goodbye Greg from the other room. I wondered if she had seen something. I had episodes like that when I was her age, and they've continued. I asked Craig if she had described anyone he might know. He looked shocked for a second, and then asked me to wait. He went into the bedroom, and came out a few minutes later with a pick in his hand. He looked at me, held up the pick, and said, wonder if this is who she saw. I asked who it was. And he said it was his grandfather, Bill, who passed away in 92. It was 2007. Now get this. The pick was exactly the description Catherine had given. He was tall, red-haired, blue-eyed, had a dressy shirt in the pick. I asked Craig how he talked, and he said that Bill was old-school Aussie. His voice was deeper than most, and with the accent, it was even harder for Greg to understand him. I excused myself, and went and told Catherine who he thought it was. As soon as I said the name Bill, she smiled. She said, I thought that was his name. That was the only thing I could almost understand. She seemed more at ease after learning it was his name. Greg, on the other hand, didn't know what to make of it. Apparently, her and Bill made peace and became friends. When I was leaving for Australia, she told me that she didn't need Bill anymore and wanted him to come over and watch over me and Greg till she got there. Gotta love kids. Fast forward a few years. Since my arrival here in Oz, I've heard a man's voice. Sometimes I can understand him. Other times, it's too deep and garbled for me to get. I ask him to repeat slower, and it gets him a little pissy. He has never told me his name, but I know it is Bill. I have that feeling. But lately, over the last year or so, I've been hearing a lot more voices. It's like being in a crowd where everyone is talking at once. I asked someone to step forward and talk only to me, but it just stays garbled. This is a weekly thing. It has gotten to the point where, when it starts, I simply say, 
if you're all going to talk to me at once, that I won't be able to understand any of it. What I was wondering is if anyone else has ever heard this, and if so, what did they do? Might this be more family members who saw that Bill was able to talk to us and want to try themselves? Or might it be something bad? Sometimes, not very often, I get a bad feeling when they start talking. Bill is still with me. I asked him, but he's given me nothing. I lived in Chicago up until I was 18 and had graduated high school. My grandfather lived in the house, and we lived on the first floor in the third flat apartment building we owned next door. We had the basement that was connected to the first floor apartment as well. The basement had three main rooms. The front room that led outside held a half bath, a washer, dryer, and two storage closets. This is where we kept our bikes and skates and stuff. The center room had four storage closets, the water heater, and the furnace. This was the room that held all my dad's and grandpa's tools. The back room that led to our upstairs apartment was where we had the deep freezer, old clothes, camping gears, old toys, etc. The center room was awful. Just looking at it, you felt like you were being stared down. Something was sending very angry energy out from that room. If you were in that room, it was just overwhelming and overpowering. It felt as if something was going to grab you and actually hurt you. None of us were hurt, but it always felt like it could happen at any time. My sister believed it to be female. I believed it to be male. This makes me think that it could have been a demon and was just appearing female to her and male to me. The stairs from the basement led to my brother's room. The stairs and the door were extremely creepy. We always kept it locked and bolted, but that didn't do much. It always seemed like someone was going to come bursting through the doors at any time. In the bedroom I shared with my sister, we have both seen strange things. I've seen a man a few times. He would start at the head of my bed, which happened to be by the door to the bedroom, and walk towards my closet. My closet and my parents' closet shared a wall. From there, he would kind of nod his head and then disappear. I could tell he was wearing overalls, work boots, and had gloves in his back pocket. He was tall, about six feet, dark hair, dark eyes. I could see all of this, but I could also see the other side of my room through him. He was kind of a misty gray color. I saw him first when I was five, then again when I was eight, and the last time when I was 14. When I was 12, I felt a pulling on my blanket. At this time, we didn't have any pets that would roam loose, and there was no way for them to get out or even reach my blanket. I feel my blanket being pulled. I kind of grumble and try to pull it back up, but I can't. So I look at the foot of my bed, and there was a boy sitting there, grinning at me, gripping my blanket. I tell him, you let go. I'm not scared of you. Go away. And he disappears. I pull my blanket back up and go to sleep. Then we just had weird things happen. Bread would slide across the counter. Things would be moved from one end of the bar to the other. Things would go missing for a few days. These types of things not only happen in our apartment, but in the upper two levels that we rented out. I was in Arizona a few years back. I was at the Snorin Desert Museum outside of Tucson. It is more like a zoo than a museum. It was summer, very few people there, 
in a pretty warm morning. I was in the very back of the property all by myself, taking photos of the native cactus. I was completely alone and enjoying the beautiful outdoors. I suddenly felt a terrible sense of dread behind me. I turned and looked, and there was an elderly Native American man standing there. He was dressed in all black, long sleeved black shirt in the middle of the summer. His hair was snow white, and his face was wrinkled. When we made eye contact, I felt like someone tweaked my soul. I started to walk fast. I wanted to get back to the front of the zoo and be where people were. I was really moving, and every time I looked back, the man was about six feet behind me. He never seemed to increase his pace, but kept up with me no matter how fast I walked. He casually started straight ahead and kept walking. I made it up to the front and walked into the gift shop. He stayed with me the whole time. I decided to get the heck out of there. I hurried to the parking lot. All I wanted was to get into the car and get away. He was still behind me. When I reached my car, a coyote was standing by the trunk. I made eye contact with that animal. I can't describe it. It sounds nuts. But that coyote gestured towards the exit with his head. Of course. He didn't speak to me, nor did I hear a voice, but I just knew that the coyote would watch over me while I drove away. As I was about to get into the car, I turned back to look, and the coyote and the man were gone. I never went back. Every time I think of this, I feel as if I escaped something terrible. It's so strange, but it's like the coyote knew me, and I knew him. Thoughts, anyone? I don't take drugs. Wasn't drinking or overheated. I swear this happened. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it did. This happened in the summer, and at the time, my horse was living on an old farm not far from the sea. The farm was from 1925, with the original stables and barn. Anyway, on this day, it was only me and my horse there, and I had him standing outside while I was tacking up, since the weather was nice. Where he stood, he had the back entrance to the stables on the right side, and straight in front was the door to the barn. You had to go through the barn to get out. Everything was fine at first. Then, I got this feeling like I was being watched from inside the stable. I looked inside, thinking that maybe one of the other girls who had their horses there had come, but it was empty. I shrugged it off and continued grooming. Then, I noticed my horse had his attention towards the stables. I walked up to the door and looked inside, but again, there was no one. I got my saddle and stuff and started tacking up. And then my horse suddenly tensed up. He stood completely still, his ears forward, and all his attention on the entrance to the barn. I looked over, thinking it was a cat or something, but what I saw made the hairs of my neck stand up. In the barn stood a tractor. Behind this, I could see a dark figure. It didn't really look like a man. It was more, I don't know liquid sort of. It stood on the one side of the tractor, hardly hidden, and I could swear that it was staring back at us. It moved backward towards the back of the tractor and just vanished. Well, I hurried up with my Sadie, grabbed my helmet, and though I really didn't want to, I walked my horse towards the barn. Let me tell you, it was no easy task getting him to go inside and when I got him inside, he refused to go anywhere near the tractor and almost ran out the other side, pulling me alongside with him.
I'm having some problems with the spirit in my fiance's house again. For the past few months, the house has been dormant, and so we didn't worry much about what was going on in the home. We had one of my fiance's friends move in, and things were fairly calm and peaceful. Her friend, though, began to never stay at the house, and due to some issues, emotions got rather heated between the three of us. Two days ago, her friend moved back after a fight, and activity has escalated in the home since then. Yesterday, I got an overwhelming sense of fear and dread while at the house, and I had an overwhelming headache come over myself. I began packing up my things, and told my fiancé to pack her things, because we needed to stay a few days at my house. She became overwhelmingly tired, and had a headache, much like mine, and passed out. When she woke up, she wasn't herself, but quickly came back out of it. Then, I went to the bathroom, and when I looked into the mirrors from the corner of my eye, I saw something I couldn't explain. The thing was, though, it looked inhuman and comprised of only bones, I think, and it seemed to be wanting out of the mirror. I ran back, and my fiancé was packing and taking her time out, humming to the tune of old music box that used to be in her friend's room. She started to have a play fight with me, and threw a shirt at me, then casually kicked the door shut. The next thing I know, she screams, and I kick the door open. She said I'd been standing in the mirror after I'd left the room. She seemed fine at the moment, and so I just watched over her as she kept packing. She began stalling again though, and I told her we needed to get going or we'd be late for dinner. She then told me that she didn't want to. She liked the house and wanted to stay there. I began to hear voices as well, other than hers in the house and got drowsy, but kept my head about me. She finally was packed, and I got her to go outside for a brief moment to see if being out of the house would snap her out of the trance. She got rather defensive, and ran off and ran under a doorway where there was a crucifix standing above the doorway. When she ran through it, she collapsed and then woke up again, perfectly fine, and not remembering about the past 45 minutes except for bits and pieces, like she had been dreaming. I had been having concerns that she may be channeling spirits by accident in her sleep, and such, and this incident definitely confirms my suspicions. I'm psychologically trained from the mental strength it took the two of us to get out of the home. We're going back to the house in about four or five days, and figure it should be fine. Whatever this entity is, it fed strongly off the negative emotions that had built up in this house. I know at the strength it was yesterday, it would be much hard for me to face it and cleanse the house on my own, so we are leaving the house to settle and calm back down. By then, I feel this entity will have lost most of its power, and it would be the best time to cleanse the home and seal any portals that may have been opened in the home. I'm still a little bit apprehensive though, and if anyone could offer up some help, it would greatly be appreciated. If my fiance is the target of any danger, I can pull through any fight normally and keep her safe, but I've been so drained, and I don't know if I can handle the cleansing of the home by myself. If anyone could please help, either physically or through even psychological support, it would greatly be appreciated. Hey there, I live in Akron, Ohio. About a year ago, I moved into my ex's house since it was nice, and well, we were in love. I lived there for about six months before she broke it off and decided to live in Ireland. I've been heartbroken for a long time, but I do remember some extra stuff that happened in that home. It's on Spicer Street in Akron, Ohio. About a month after I moved in, the first thing I noticed was waking up with her and every single clock in the house, 
including the computer clock, wristwatches, etc., would be turned around 40 minutes ahead than what they were supposed to be. This only happened once, and after I arrived at class, she called me to explain how each clock had changed overnight. Later, she told me that the previous tenants believed the house was haunted and refused to move back in. They were both girls, I was told. We began to notice other things too, such as their stuff would get moved if we left the kitchen, the television would turn on and off, lights would turn on and off if we left the home, fan would move and not move, TV would turn channels with the remote being on the TV, and certain spots in the house would be unusually cold. She was scared at times, but I typically wasn't. I just thought of it as having a little kid in the home. I wasn't really worried, and I was confident that I'd be able to protect her from that kind of stuff. If you read some of my earlier posts, I see specs a lot, and I guess it gives me some sort of confidence, even if I don't understand them. My thoughts were confirmed, I believe, when I was sitting in the living room with her and thought I spotted a blonde haired boy's face under her table. It looked a lot like a German kid, but naturally, I blinked, and it was gone. There were two spots in the house that seemed really weird. The basement was odd, but not too odd, since students in the past used this place for studying. The oddest part in her house was her bedroom closet. I would step at the door and not go in. She refused to even sleep close to it. I was the one who slept closest to it while she slept between me and the wall. I didn't really see anything from it, but it did feel really weird, and it didn't feel like the kid. It was something else. Also, that closet was connected to the attic, which neither of us ventured into. After I saw the kid, I felt some sort of attachment to it. I remember she used to complain that sometimes my eyes would go completely black in the house. I'd usually counter it with me complaining about staring at me, as she slept as if I woke up around 5 in the morning, but we wouldn't argue about it. It was just weird. When we broke up, or rather, when she broke up with me, I'll admit it. Way messages often wrote how she was scared and didn't want to hear any noises. So I guess the activity in the home increased when I left. Again, not sure why. So I want to find out more about the home, but I don't know where to start. I've been lurking on here for about two years now, and well, I decided to finally post about my experiences with ghosts. Really only one ghost. It happened to be here in my house for a number of years throughout the 70s. The house had been built in 1970 on an old lot where an old man had lived on a shack and had died. Now, the spirit that had stayed on the property was one of a child though. Maybe the old man had a kid and died. Who knows? Anyway, all sorts of stuff that one would imagine a child would do happened. You know, things would get lost, stuff would move from one place to another, vases and sculptures would be on their place on tables, and when the family would come back, the sad items would be in pieces, smashed against a wall about three or four feet away. Sometimes, of course, you couldn't get into the house because the screen door would be locked and nobody was in the house at the time. Just imagine the door with the simple hook going into the circle slot. Now, over the years, I've tried to get that hook to slip over into the lock, you know, to see if it could happen by accident. It could never be an accident. If one wants to lock that screen door, you intentionally do it. Feelings of being watched and feeling the weight of someone or something next to you in the bed. My grandma would tell me that I would go off in the house in my walker, 
circa 1981 or 82, and I would travel all the way from the kitchen, delivering him to the hallway. Now, when one enters the hallway, even in the daytime, if all the doors to the room are shut, it is pitch black. She claimed that I would be in the hallway for a couple of minutes, and that I would come shooting out from the hallway as if my walker was pushed or shoved by something, all the way back to the kitchen and crash into the wall. Now, it would take me a couple of minutes to get all the way to the hallway since I was a toddler, yet it wouldn't even take me a minute to come crashing into the wall of the kitchen. Now, I remember seeing some sort of whitish gray ball floating when I was laying down on the rug one day. This must have been 1982 or 83. I can still see that image in my brain to this day. My grandmother noticed me getting up and looking under the dining room table and I started to shout, get out, or in my way of talking back then, get ye out. My grandma started yelling, what's wrong? What's the matter? I kept on shouting and punching and kicking at nothing, all the way towards the front doorway. And when I got to the door, I kept kicking the door, and then I stopped. By this time, my grandmother, who was rather slow due to wait, had gotten to the hallway that led to the front door and was asking me what was wrong. She told me that I had said that I didn't want it here, and I told it to get out. I think I had some sort of hold over it, as I was the only child born in the house. My uncle, who was only 12 at the time, had been born in an older house. I think the spirit was attracted by the fresh new life that was now in the home, much like the spirits in Poltergeist were attracted to the little girl. You know, they wanted some sort of that life force. I think that was the case with this. I got rid of it before it got too powerful, much later on. What do you think? I've lived in this house for the past 27 years. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened since those early years. I have seen many paranormal entities during my life. Here's my first quite shocking meeting with a ghost. I was seven years old then. I was in my grandparents' house with my mother. The house is about 80 years old. I was relaxing downstairs when the phone suddenly rang from upstairs. My mother proceeded to go upstairs to answer the phone, and I followed her. After climbing about halfway up the old staircase, I felt that somebody or something was behind me. I quickly turned my head, and that's when I saw a middle-aged lady climbing the stairs, holding out her hands as if to grab me. She was wearing a bathrobe, and her hair looked mangled. I freaked out and ran upstairs as quickly as I was able to. She surely was a ghost, because she wasn't a family member or a friend. I had never seen her before, and my mother didn't even notice her. She disappeared as fast as I would seen her. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only ghost experience I had in that house. I was about 10 years old when the second meeting happened. It happened in the same old staircase in my grandparents' house. It was late night, and I was going upstairs to get some sleep. That's when I quickly discovered that my route was blocked. At the end of the corridor where you turn right to get to the staircase was a man, a very unusual man standing there. He was wearing a gas mask, so I wasn't able to see his face. He didn't speak, nor did he move at all. He just stood still and I was too afraid to go past him, so I then got my grandmother and went back to the corridor with her. The gas man was nowhere to be found. Understandably, I was too afraid to sleep, so my grandmother stayed the night with me. I'm pretty sure that my grandparents' house is haunted, 
and my friend has witnessed that too. As the next experience tells, I was 11 years old, and my friend was 12 when this happened. We were playing in the basement of my grandparents' house. It's no surprise that the basement is also quite unsettling, just as much as the rest of the house is. We were in the big room just under the staircase that leads to the middle floor. We were having fun, until both of us felt a strange feeling that made it obvious that we were not alone in the basement. We felt that there were other beings present, entities that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. We are also sure it wasn't our grandparents, because both of my grandparents were upstairs. That feeling also told us to leave the basement. It felt like we were surrounded by invisible people, and that we really needed to leave the basement immediately. After a few minutes, in a panic, we fled back up fast. Even at this stage of my life, it is still frightening for me to walk that staircase or be in the basement. I often feel the same feeling in these places that I felt 10 years ago. My friend also feels the same energy as well. Luckily, I haven't seen any ghosts since then. Regardless, one thing is certain. There's a lot of paranormal activity going on in that house. And I'm the person the spirits need to target, for whatever reason or another. My story starts back in 1991, when I first hooked up with my then boyfriend, now husband. My boyfriend lived on the bottom floor of a house that his aunt owned. His aunt and her family lived on the second floor. His cousin was my best friend, and so I was always at the house. We had a small close-knit group of friends, and were over a house one time playing truth or dare. I remember it as being late at night, and we were sitting on Holly's bed playing this game. When one of the girls asked her if the house was haunted, Holly said that it was, and that it was her maternal grandmother. She then went on to tell us certain things that would happen, and most situations would take place right next to the father's recliner chair. About 15 minutes after we finished playing the game, I had to use her bathroom. Though I was so totally afraid to go alone, I didn't want to seem chicken, so I went on my own to the bathroom. Just as I was passing by the recliner, I noticed I suddenly got cold. It was a warm summer night when this happened. Okay, I chalked it up to being my imagination, seeing as we had just been talking about it. Then, years later, I had this woman I was working for, and we got along really well. So, one day she had invited me to her house. Well, as we were at her house, we were talking about ghost stories and the like. She excitedly pulled out her digital camera and led me upstairs to their master bedroom. We stood just outside the bedroom doorway, and she told me to take the camera and just scan around the room, starting in one corner and going to the next. Just see if you see anything, she said. I took the camera, still not knowing if I was truly a believer, and scanned the room. Suddenly. I moved back to the corner I just scanned over. She said, you see something, don't you? I did. I saw a greenish male figure standing in the corner, looking out the window. I was scared to death. But even when I scanned the corner again, the figure was there. We returned to the first floor of the house when she started to tell me all about it. They had bought the house just about a year prior. The first week they lived in the house, their children, very young children, would awake in the middle of the night, screaming and crying. Finally, one night, my boss's husband got so furious, he yelled, I don't care that you're here. I don't care if you just stay. Just leave my children alone. 
the children never woke up crying again. Then about a week later was when my boss had noticed the image through her camera. She had been going through various parts of the home, taking photos of central relatives that lived out of state. When she was scanning the master bedroom, looking for a good view of the room, and found the exact image I found. She yelled for her husband who saw the same thing, but it could only be seen through the screen on her digital camera. After I saw it, I was a believer. There was no way I would have seen it if it weren't there. A couple of days after she saw the first image herself, she was cleaning in the basement when she found a hidden room. She went into the hidden room and found a box of papers. They started investigating the roots of the home. She found out that the old police chief of Renister, the town she had lived in, had built the house a very long time ago. The only thing she could figure is that the greenish male figure is the police chief looking out the window and watching over his town. They still live in that same home and they still live with their chief, all of them living peacefully together. Since I was little, I've been sensitive to ghosts. Sometimes I had dreams that would later turn out to be true. Also could tell which song was on next on the radio, knew who the phone call was next, etc. My experiences tend to happen at times, when I'm either feeling low or just open towards the other side. My stories. As a little girl, I didn't like being in my room after it got dark or darker when it was summertime. I remember feeling watched and something wasn't right. A lot of times, I was so afraid of the door leading to the back of our house and the stables. I felt like something was looking at me and wanted to hurt me. This went on from when I was around 8 and stopped when I was 12. At times, they would show up only once. Once I was in bed and was close to falling asleep, suddenly I heard a voice calling my name. I woke up completely and looked into the corner of my room and there was an old woman there. I couldn't see her clearly. She was kind of blurry, but she had a friendly feeling about her. She then disappeared, and I never saw her again. When I was 17, my dog died, and I was devastated. A few weeks later, I heard him coming up to my room from the kitchen and saw him enter my room. He then jumped up on my bed, walked around three times before sighing, and got down. I could feel him on my bed and against my leg. When I tried to touch him, he disappeared. My parents' farm, where most of the events happened, is old. It burnt down once there, and there seems to be quite a lot of ghostly activity. In the barn, my parents got their car. Since I was little, I was afraid being alone there. I felt something was wrong and that something was hanging in the dark. I always felt uneasy there until a few years ago, when my mom told me that someone had off themselves there. My worst experience I've had was when I was around 15 to 17 years old. My room was connected to the kitchen by a little hallway. From the kitchen, you can go directly to the two living rooms. The last one I've never felt easy in was always feeling unnaturally cold and just weird. One night, I woke up and my room was ice cold. I heard someone open the door from the hall to the kitchen. It was a man and he was going directly to the last of the living room. Somehow I was there when he went there. I saw him take his rifle and then off himself. It was feelings more than actually seeing him do it. I then was back in my body, but heard him fall down to the floor, moved a bit, and moaned before he died. The second that happened, the coldness disappeared, 
and I could breathe again. I told my friend at the time about it, but I was too afraid to ask my parents. One day, I sort of jokingly asked if anyone had offed themselves in that room. My dad turned around and looked at me with a strange look. Yes, your godmother's father offed himself there. They hadn't told me because my godmother didn't like me to know. I found his grave and it happened the exact day he had offed himself. I've had nice experiences though. A friend of my parents and their friend had offed herself. My friend was really devastated about it and couldn't get over it. One day we were in the kitchen when I saw a sort of fog that turned into a ghostly hand. It may have looked ridiculous, but I'm telling you, I know with my own eyes what I saw. It was right on my friend's shoulder, almost as if to soothe her. After it disappeared, I immediately alerted my friend and she said that her shoulder felt really cold. My friend then told me that she felt a lot of peace. To the both of us, it really meant a lot. The latest year, the happenings happened without any real pattern. Last year, when I was at my parents and sleeping in my old rooms, I didn't get any sleep for the last four days I was there. There was a presence in the room, and it was not a pleasant one. It just radiated hatred, and it was pointed at me for some reason. The next time I got home, it wasn't in there, but then I had to sleep in my mom's bedroom. I was woken up by someone slamming their hands into the bed very hard. I looked at the end of the bed, and I saw a shadow standing there, and then disappeared. Since then, I haven't felt it. For some reason, I knew it was male, but I didn't know why it felt so badly about me. When I'm home at my parents now, there's a young girl there, something I can't feel what it is, and a man. None of these are evil, but just looking out for me. I've seen the girl from the corner of my eyes, and seen her reflected in the mirror. I think they are protecting me and just looking out for me. At times I can enter a house and know that there's more than just what the eyes see. I felt the presence of family or just passerbyers. I do believe that at my parents' house, there's some kind of field of energy where these spirits can enter. Some stay, but others don't. I got one in my room where I live now. Just a little prankster, really turns on my computer or opens all the cupboards. I did have an old man though who loved to watch me shower. I told him that it was rude and I didn't like it. Since then, he hadn't been there. At the same time, there's a girl running every night on the upper floor. My brother is sensitive too, but apparently never experienced the same as I have at my parents' house. Seems I'm the only one they get attracted to. Also felt being pushed, but that happened at my parents' house as well. I don't mind having this ability, but I know I have to learn to control it. It can get to be too much at times. I've been doing some research about black spirits and ghosts. I had an experience in January 2000 when I lived in an old house in Portland, Maine. It was late in the evening, about 10 p.m. or so, when I felt something peering at me from a closet in my basement apartment. I thought nothing of it, but when I looked again, a materialistic, three-dimensional human-shaped figure with no facial features darted from the closet and stood behind me. It was suspended above the floor, about a foot or so. Before I knew it, Two more had come out of nowhere. It happened so fast, and they moved so quickly, that I didn't even know what to make of this incident. I was a skeptic at the time, and had been all my life on ghosts, supernatural, etc. I was 36 years old at the time. There were multiple instances where I seriously felt like the house was shaking, doors being slammed, 
open and shut, cabinets being open and shut as well, pots being moved around. It was seriously like a horror movie. I remember one time this happened, and it scared me half to death, almost literally. I ended up having a mild heart attack, and I ended up waking up in a hospital. All I remember was feeling the energy of what was happening that day, and then I lost consciousness. And that's when I was in the hospital bed. The doctor told me that the neighbor noticed something was wrong in that house, and noticed me lying on the floor. So she went and called the cops for me, and the ambulance arrived. They even told me that my heart stopped for a moment, and they had to use a defibrillator to bring me back to life. I was clinically dead, even though they only classified it as a mild heart attack. Anyway, I know this all sounds absurd, but I'm telling you, it definitely did happen. I'm just glad that I don't have to deal with it anymore. I don't live in the same place I do now. It was not worth it in the end. And after the heart attack, I don't think it'll ever be worth it. Scary stuff. Hold your guys and black beings on the walls. Definitely not something I want to deal with. One night, me and two guy friends were driving into Howard City, Michigan. We were driving down the road, and on each side, there's cornfields, and we saw two girls, one standing at the opposite side of the road, and another walking directly into our path. The girl walking into our path was wearing a gray sweatshirt, blue jeans, had blonde hair, and white eyes. The girl that was standing on the other side of the road was wearing a red sweatshirt had brown hair, and wore blue jeans. As we're driving towards them, I tried as hard as I could to tell my friend's boyfriend to look out for her, but I couldn't. I couldn't say a word. I tried, and nothing came out, because I was so terrified of what I thought I saw. The girls had completely vanished. After we got to the stop sign, I said to my friend's boyfriend, did you see that? He said yes, and the other guy that was in the truck with us asked me what, so I told him, and he said, we have to go back and check it out. So we turned back around and went back down the road and found no signs of them. This is a remarkable story of ghosts from my experience. This happened when I was studying at my university. At that time, I was far away from home and stayed in a hostel near my university with my friends. Before I moved into the hostel, my friend who lived in the hostel told me that it was haunted. Actually, it was a house whose owner intentionally left this world. That's why many people have said that the hostel was haunted. They said that the spirit of the owner appears near the kitchen at night. Another said that sometimes you could hear the crying voices from the woman who owned the now hostel. At that time, there was only one last room available for me to sleep in on the second floor, so I had to stay in that room. My room was in the last row. Many people have said that my room was terrifying because the surroundings around my room were quite dark and sunshine couldn't enter my room. There were multiple nights in which I kept waking up around 2.30 a.m. One night, I was terribly tired and went to bed earlier than usual. When I woke up, it felt as if somebody was pulling on my blanket from my feet and so I pulled it back up again. However, when I went to pull the blanket back up, I still felt a resistance in my blanket. It definitely felt as if somebody was pulling it down again. I then felt annoyed and wanted to sleep. So I just said, stop it. Don't stir me. I really want to sleep. Surprisingly, it actually stopped and I was able to sleep the rest of the night. In fact, 
nobody ever pulled my blanket again. In the morning when I woke up, I remember what happened last night and I started shaking. After that experience, it was pretty obvious why I always felt on edge whenever I slept in that room. Ghosts are pretty freaky. I was sleeping over my best friend Jasmine's house, and the night before, her mother promised us BLTs for breakfast. So that night, after setting me up in an air mattress for the room, we had gone to bed. That night was peaceful, but I'll forever remember that horrific morning. I woke up and looked up to where a person was standing in front of the closed door from afar and simply staring at me. She was young, around my age at the time, with features almost identical to my friend. I was still half asleep and just figured it was my friend anyway. I began to ask her when we were going downstairs for the BLTs, and she just stared at me without saying a word. I closed my eyes for a little bit, then reopened them. That girl was gone. I never heard the door open in her room, and somehow the girl was gone. I looked at my clock, and only 10 minutes had passed since I closed my eyes to lay down. I had screamed loud, and ran down the stairs to find Jasmine and her mother sitting in the kitchen. They looked very concerned, and asked me why I screamed. I told them that just 10 minutes ago, I saw Jasmine, but she didn't say a word. Her mother looked at me and told me that Jasmine was downstairs for over an hour and had never once went back upstairs in the time in which I saw this girl. It was then when I realized that it was a spirit. Ever since, I've only seen the girl twice. On my friend's birthday, I was downstairs getting cake for some of the other girls and I saw her standing in the pantry watching me. And the other time, I was in the basement with Jasmine. We were getting some laundry done when we all saw the girl run across the basement living room to a storage room. I haven't been back since, but the last experience helped my friends not think I was crazy. I've been enjoying your sight and I wanted to share some of my experiences. Well, I went to Mercyhurst College in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1995 to 96, and I left in the fall when my father died. Anyway, I lived in Egan Hall, which is connected to Old Main and the chapel, and I saw the nun and her antics almost daily in the fall of 96. I saw a reflection in the bathroom windows at night. She often opened and closed the windows and doors, turned faucets and radios on, and flushed the toilets for hours on end. I was absolutely frightened at first. My roommate, a very down-to-earth logical girl, told me a friend of hers who lived on the boys floor saw the sister every morning around 4 a.m. when he got up for crew practice. He would end up seeing her, but she was only there supposedly to look out for us. It turns out that the heartbroken nun story is just a fun, creepy story. And the truth is that the nun died peacefully of old age and stuck around to keep an eye on all the students. I also used to see a blue orb floating from the chapel through Old Main when I was coming back from the computer lab late at night. Other students had seen the orb originate from a small statue in the chapel, and a figure had been seen in the organ loft as well. I have heard that the path between campus and the New Covenant is haunted, but I can't verify that. In Springboro, Pennsylvania, there is a large Victorian house which had been used as a stop in the Underground Railroad. There had been a tunnel between the basement and the barn but the tunnel was filled in the late 70s to early 80s for safety reasons, and the barn was moved to Conneville at some point. There are cold spots throughout the house, and a feeling of being watched. Sometimes, 
you can see strange reflections in the windows and lights or figures, just at the edge of your field of vision. The basement is very frightening. There is a feeling of pressure, and a very dark and menacing feeling. I mean, I feel very threatened if I go down there, no matter the time of day. When I'm alone in the living room without the TV on, I can hear muffled voices from the basement. I have always felt very negatively in this house. Now, about four years ago, I lived at Country Hills apartment in Las Vegas, Nevada. My family and I had some weird encounters there. Well, first, it started with this. My sister and I went to my grandparents while my parents stayed home. We were all the way in Cali from Las Vegas, Nevada for a weekend. My dad woke up at night, the night we left, claiming he heard a little girl singing in mine in my sister's room. He goes in there and sees my sister's rocking chair moving. Our second encounter was when my mom was going to take me to school one morning. And right when we open the door, the DVD player goes on. The radio on the DVD player. My mom and I were so tripped out, we were telling each other to turn it on until eventually my mom does it. Now how freaky and unexpected is that? Our third encounter was when the blinds for the sliding door that leads to the porch just started moving. It was strange, really strange. My uncle had moved in with us a little bit before the second encounter, but the only encounter that he shared with us is when he invited a friend over and the blinds were closed. Then he noticed that all of a sudden they were open. He told us and we got tripped out. I was right next to the blinds too. That was my story and thank you for reading. I work at a cemetery in California. I used to work the graveyard shift. As I was in the office doing paperwork, I suddenly heard a noise that startled me a bit. It almost sounded like faint singing from a distance. I got up, turned to face where I heard the mysterious singing. By the way, there were only four of us in the office. Everybody else was in the other room. And in that direction, I noticed a lady looking at me. She freaked me out so badly because she didn't even look real, translucent. All I could remember was that she had a smirk on her face and disappeared within seconds. It happened so fast, but I knew there was a lady there. She was just nowhere to be found. I walked around looking for this lady. I asked the other employees about it and they all looked at me like I was crazy. So I forgot about it, went back and finished my paperwork. Well, the next night, we got four bodies in. I started to do paperwork on this one lady. As I started typing in the information, I went to check the tab on her toe and took the sheet off to see her face. And it was the lady from the night before. It freaked me out, and after that experience, I never doubted ghosts again. I was at the job for only one week at the time. It's now been 10 years. I believe we walk and live with ghosts and spirits every day. They don't know they have passed on. I say that because I've experienced a few ghost sightings, and I've heard things. It is so fascinating. In September of 2002, I was in Geneva, Switzerland on a business trip, and I was due to return home the day of my girlfriend's birthday. For her birthday, I purchased a violin, and I planned on giving it to her after she picked me up from the airport. The violin was at my house. The night before I was scheduled to return home, I called my girlfriend, 
but she was not home, so I left a message. After I hung up the phone, the phone rang back in my room in Switzerland. I picked the phone up, but I didn't hear anything. After saying hello a couple of times, I hung the phone up. Later that night, I again tried to call my girlfriend, and this time, she was home. As we spoke, she told me that she received both my messages. Having only called once before, I was very perplexed. I asked her what was said on the messages, and she described the first message that left to a T, but she thought that I was teasing her with the second message, since she thought that I might be giving her a violin for her birthday. After some prompting, she told me that she heard scratchy violin music like a beginner tuning their instrument, followed by me saying hello, hello. I thought she was joking, but when I could tell that she was serious, I asked her if it sounded like the music, static or some other background noise. She had the voice messages still on her answering machine, and she played both messages back to me. On the first message, I could clearly hear my voice saying that I just called to say hi and that I would see her tomorrow. The second message starts with about four seconds of clear but scratchy violin music, and then I could very clearly hear my voice saying hello, hello. My girlfriend said that both the messages had my phone number and the caller ID. By this time, I had convinced her that I did not leave the violin music on her machine, nor were there any TVs or radios turned on in my room during the call. All I could think of was that I may have been hearing some future event when my girlfriend would be tuning her violin, that I would not be around to hear it. So I changed my plane reservations to take a different flight home. Nothing happened to the plane that I would have been on, but I cannot help to think that the violin music was meant to be some type of warning. Maybe I would have had a car accident if I took the other flight or I would have been hit crossing the road. Regardless, an omen like that is hard to ignore. I've kept the message recording as a reminder of this very strange experience. In May 2006, it happened again. After over three and a half years, we received another ghostly phone call. Last night, we were sitting at home when my wife's my girlfriend in 2002, cell phone rang. She answered it, and at first did not hear anything. Then, the sound of the same scratchy violin music became slowly more pronounced. She said hello several times, but had no response except the music. She handed the cell phone to me, and I also heard the violin. Then. The sound just stopped. I did not hear a phone hang up. It just stopped. I closed the cell phone lid and then checked the call log. There was no record of a call, incoming or outgoing, to the cell phone at that time. I'm scheduled for another flight to Atlanta on Thursday. I sure wish I could get out of it. In the Chinese calendar, people believe that the month of July is the time where all the ghosts come to Earth from Hell. We call it the Ghost Festival. This is why Chinese people are very used to buying incenses in order to pray for these ghosts. During last year's Ghost Festival, something strange happened onto my family. It was the time where all my aunts and uncles and other relatives came back to my nanny's house. The entire family of mine sat in the living room, watching TV and chit-chatting. Suddenly, one of my aunts started yelling very loudly, I'm cold, I'm bleeding, I'm in pain. She then ran upstairs and started throwing everything she saw. She acted insane, and her face turned pale. Every one of us in the family was shocked by her actions. We were panicked and did not have any idea of what had happened. 
My nanny was the only person who remained calm. Immediately she called the ritual witch, whom we called her as Boombo, to the house. As soon as the Boombo arrived, my aunt ran to her and wanted to choke her to death. She yelled I'm dead and now it's your turn. Two of my cousins immediately captured her and pulled her away from the Boombo. The witch then murmured as if to cast spells on my aunt. About half an hour later, my aunt was awake. She said she felt exhausted and asked everyone what had just happened now. At the moment we told her the truth, my aunt was frightened and couldn't believe that. The witch told us that she was possessed by a ghost who was killed in an accident years ago. I have always been an avid believer in ghosts. I've never seen one physically manifest itself in human form, and I don't think I could cope if I did. I have an intense fear of ghosts, and at the same time, a morbid fascination with them. My first experience happened when I was 14 years old. I was going to stay with a friend of mine in a seaside village in Cornwall, England. I think it's called Portscaith. My dad had a friend who drove me down to the meeting point where my friend, whose family were already staying there, would pick me up. This guy's name was Mike, and he was the nicest guy you could ever imagine. We joked all the way down in the car, and he wound me up with stories of the Beast of Bodeman, a supposed large cat that lives in the moors in Dortmer, the county before Cornwall. We had a good laugh. By the time we reached the meeting point, it had gotten dark. My friend was unable to pick me up. Mike took me back to his house where I met his wife, Jenny. Jenny was as nice as Mike, but she was a little kooky. Looking at things that weren't there and drawing really childlike pictures with crayons. I didn't really think much of it because I was tired from the journey. I was more fascinated with their house. Their house was so large that it had been divided into four apartments, each one with winding stairs, large rooms, and old-fashioned structures. The house itself dates back to the 1700s. After a while, I went upstairs to sleep in their son's room. He was away at the time and set about rifling through his music collection to pass the time. His CDs were in one corner of the room, and every time I was looking through them, I felt like I was being watched from another corner of the room. I looked over to where I felt this presence emanating from, and saw nothing except a barred window. It was only a small window with a few bars across it, and very high up, there was nothing there that should have made me feel so watched. I felt sleepy. So I turned the lights out and got into bed. As I was drifting off, I felt that same feeling of being watched. I snapped my eyes open and felt as if something retreated. Ignoring this irrational feeling, I turned over to sleep on my side with my back to the wall. At that moment, the door, which was one of the old barn-like doors with a latch, made a noise. I heard the latch lift up and the door slowly creak open. Next, the light snapped on and I was blinking in shock, trying to see what happened. Next thing I heard was a scaffolding as something retreated down the slope accompanied by a horrific crackling under the breath laughter that scared the heck out of me. I tried to see what happened, but the door opened towards me and the light switch was beyond that so I had no way of seeing who had turned the light on. From my bed, I tried to call out Mike, Jenny, but the words were really hard to say. I was so scared that any noise might bring the something back. I couldn't sleep with the light on, so I scuffled out of bed, switched it off, and practically jumped back into bed and under the covers where I felt safe. I finally fell asleep and thought nothing of it. I didn't really think about it again until a few months later when, out of the blue, 
My dad mentioned he was thinking of taking me to Cornwall to stay at that house. I told him my story, and he told me that the house was haunted, and that Jenny was one of those people who could see ghosts and communicate with them. He told me that the ghost that did that was probably Harry, a mischievous ghost. He also said that the house is full of them. A lot of children could be heard playing on the steps, and a Chinese washerwoman was always communicating with Jenny while she cleaned the kitchen. This at least explains some of Jenny's unusual behavior. She could sense ley lanes and everything. Being terrified of ghosts, I totally freaked upon hearing this, especially as dad told me we were going to stay there. A few months later, after my exams, he took me there as a treat. Knowing what I know now, it felt a little unsavory. I was absolutely terrified of walking into that house, especially as Mike and Jenny were away. I felt watched everywhere I went, and on the first night, I didn't sleep a wink or turn off the lights. The rest of the holiday, I actually spent sleeping in the same bed as my dad, a little unorthodox for a girl of 15, but it was a choice between my dad and the ghost, and I'd choose my dad any day. The last thing that happened which really scared me was that Jenny popped back for a short while and was there, was cleaning the kitchen. As she did, I repeatedly saw her brush off something that wasn't there and say, with a giggle, get off, in the calm and patient way a mother does to a child that's pestering her for cookies. The next thing I saw was an invisible force actually pinch her clothing and pull it from her. I actually saw the shirt she was wearing become pinched and pulled away by nothing. She looked at me and said, oh, don't worry, that's just Hong Lee, the washerwoman. She thinks I'm not doing a good job of these surfaces. We didn't stay much longer. I've had several paranormal experiences during my life hearing my mother's voice after she had died, and feeling my mother-in-law's presence after she had also died. But in February 2002, an angel guided me from certain death. I awoke on a Saturday morning because I heard our dog whine, and that is when I realized our house was on fire. Our bedroom was off the living room, which was totally in flames. I yelled to wake my husband, who jumped out of bed and ran right through the fire and out the front door. I started to follow him, but a hand touched my right shoulder and turned me to the right. At the same time, I heard a voice in my right ear saying, the window. I ran around the bed, opened the window and screen, and rolled out to the ground. It was a one-story house. I escaped with just a few burns in my back and left shoulder. My husband, on the other hand, was in intensive care for almost a month, with acute smoke inhalation and second-degree burns over half his body. I am certain that if I had followed him through that burning living room, I would have died. When I was in grade 3 of primary school, about 10 years old, I lived with my grandparents. Before my great-grandmother also lived with us, but she had also passed away for approximately five years. I remember that that night, it was Chinese New Year Eve, my family members all came back to my grandparents' house. After dinner, nearly eight o'clock, my parents and other uncles and aunts went to play Minjong game. When I was watching TV with my cousins, I felt thirsty. So I went to the kitchen to find some water, but something happened that I couldn't believe when I saw. It was a lady in the kitchen, a transparent figure. She was standing in front of the stove. However, the lady did not have any legs. She was just hovering above the kitchen. I was so scared to death that I ran out of the kitchen as fast as I could and ran into my uncle's and aunt's arms.
three years ago. I was taking university classes at St. Peter's College in Saskatchewan, about an hour and a half drive east of Saskatoon. The college was originally built as a monastery for monks who came up from Minnesota to found a colony around 1900. Since then, it had been expanded from a boys only school to a fully integrated co-ed college. There are several ghosts on the property. One is supposedly the ghost of the first bishop of the area, who apparently died before the building's construction was completed. He can be seen occasionally walking the grounds. The other is a ghost of a small boy who had left this earth intentionally, or died from an accident, by falling out an upper story window. The year before I came to the college, the fourth floor was used for the drama and art classes, and also had a small room where the staff could go for coffee breaks. One day, one of the women went upstairs to make some coffee. She was standing with her back to the door, loading the coffee maker, when she felt a presence behind her. Turning around, she saw a small boy standing there, then vanished right in front of her. The first year that I attended school, I took part in amateur night one Friday. I was invited back to the girl's residence by some friends for tea. The place had originally been a housing for a small group of nuns that had lived at the colony and was only a few feet from the main buildings. It was after midnight when I finally said goodnight and headed out. I had taken no more than three steps when I had the most unshakable feeling that something didn't want me on the grounds. There was the sensation that I was being chased, that I just couldn't stand, and I ran to my car. The feeling didn't stop until I crossed the railroad tracks, which, I found out later, was the marker of the boundaries of the college grounds. I told some friends about this, and we all agreed that we should stay some time after midnight and try to see some ghosts. Well, we tried. But that is as far as it went. None of us had the nerve to stay past midnight. Strange feelings and weird noises always promoted us to leave just before the midnight hour. I've been privileged enough to have the luxury of traveling on many cruises over the years. Being born at 12, it's something that you get accustomed to. With that being said, all these experiences are not without their ghost stories. There were times in which I had terrifying encounters with spirits while alone in my cabin. I'm not just talking the stereotypical hauntings, knocks on the walls, objects being moved around, and other supernatural phenomena, but legitimate full-bodied apparitions and dark shadows looming the halls of the cabin as well as seeing the presence of ghost sailors. One of my earliest paranormal experiences on a ship was when I was roughly 12 years old. My parents were wealthy enough to purchase a gigantic yacht for me and my family. However, we were able to buy it off the previous owner, who ended up being a great family friend. His name was Joe. Joe suffered from a multitude of health problems, suffered mild heart attacks, had high blood pressure, I really became somewhat of a father figure for me in my youth. Every time he'd see me, he'd run up to me and give me a giant bear hug and yell, my little Sadie, he was such a great guy. However, being a 58 year old male with all these medical health issues, I kind of felt like our days with him would be numbered. He suffered one last heart attack and it would be the last of his life. That's because unfortunately, this heart attack was the one which would take his life. So let me backtrack a little. Joe had been with us, me and my parents on the yacht, for the entire day. The morning before he died, Joe and I had a heart to heart. We were on lawn chairs on the deck, and he warned me about the dangers of excess to not get so absorbed in these riches. Joe was a successful man, 
but he always reminded me that all of these riches don't mean a thing if you're not a good person at heart. I'll never forget his words. Sadie, you can't bring anything with you when you're gone. These are the moments we live for. It's not about this yacht or the things you own in life. It's about the bonds we share with the people we love. I remember he urged me and said, do not waste this life. You can't get back this life, kiddo. I remember I just sort of smiled at him and nodded my head. Being 12, of course, I didn't really fully understand the magnitude of his words. So the day went on. We all had dinner together on that yacht. And later that night, that's when Joe decided to go back to his cabin to rest. He told us that he was very exhausted and just wanted a good night's rest. The morning after, I knocked on Joe's door in the cabin in his room. We had three separate rooms, and he wouldn't answer. I called for my parents. They opened the door, and that's when they found him dead. I was devastated and cried for days. About a month or so after his death, my parents were again on our yacht, all of our moments on our yacht were a little more somber after the death of our great friend Joe. Anyway, it was starting to get dark when my parents told me to get back into the cabin to go back to sleep. I yelled back that I wanted a few more minutes and they eventually relented. Our yacht is pretty long, so there is a lot of space to get around. The next few events are unexplainable and lead me to believe that our ship was in fact haunted. So, I'm standing right in the spot that me and Joe used to with our lawn chairs, and I'm just taking in the scenery of the blue waters and breathing in the fresh air delicately touching my face. As I began to think of Joe, my eyes began to water. For some reason, I had an urge to look right behind me Right behind me was where I could see the control room for where you could drive the yacht. As I stared into the window of the control room, I recognized the face for a few seconds. I knew it was in my imagination, but I wasn't able to figure out whose face it was. I got kind of spooked and ran into the cabin. My parents were both still there, so I had to rule them out. I didn't even mention what I saw to my parents, because I'm sure they would have dismissed me. Anyway, it's getting super late at night, and my parents are sleeping soundly. I had trouble sleeping because of what I saw, as well as the fact that I was profoundly missing Joe. I remember I went to the bathroom to splash water on my face and try to calm myself down a bit. However, once again, Something insane happened. As I looked into the mirror, I saw the face of a man right behind my shoulder. Again, the face wasn't obvious, so I couldn't make it out. But it was enough to recognize that there was someone in the mirror. It's hard to explain, but it almost looked like a poorly rendered image from a video or something. Either way, I hopped back into bed terrified. It wasn't until days later, when I really thought about it, that I realized it could have been Joe's face in the control room and mirror. Knowing this possibility, it allowed me to become less frightened and more comforted. If I were Joe, I don't think his intentions were to scare me. I think he just wanted to let me know that he was okay, that he was watching over me. Years later, when I was 19, I was on the road, and I got into a terrible car wreck. I crashed into a tree. Luckily for me, I was able to escape unscathed, and my parents drove me home. My parents were furious because I told them I had been texting and driving. Later that night, I had a dream. In the dream, Joe appeared in it. He looked very disappointed in me, and literally said to me, you have learned nothing. 
A phone is an object. Whatever you think is important can wait. All I could say to Joe was that I'm sorry I upset him. And he said, worry about yourself. The dream ended. I remember waking up in a cold sweat and crying. That's all I have for now. I'm 35 now. And to reiterate, the events in this story are 100% real and factual. I noticed that many stories on the site are lacking a bit of variety. And just wanted to share something different than the typical stories I read. I don't have that same yacht anymore, and I've since become a mother with a family of my own. I'm a 20-year-old English writing professional major attending Slippery Rock University, Pennsylvania, and I've never believed in ghosts until this happened to me early last fall. My good friend told me about Snyder Cemetery in Butler County, Pennsylvania, and its alleged hauntedness. He, our other mutual friend and I, decided to visit it one Friday night. We drove up to the entrance, parked his truck, and bought a few lighters and a scented candle. The only things we had in the car that would emit light and ventured in. We as a group initially found nothing out of the ordinary in the way of activity. I, however, started hearing on human moaning coming out of the surrounding trees. My two other friends didn't hear them. However, when I asked them if they heard it, even as it was going on, still skeptical, it surely was some kind of animal, I told myself. I ventured around to the rusted iron gate in the back. As soon as I opened the gate, I felt as if I had walked into a wall. I've been in a life and death situation before. My arm was severed by a large piece of glass when I was young, and I know what it's like feeling and knowing that I may die. I had the same exact feeling as I walked through the entrance. I physically, for the first time that night, was scared, beyond scared, petrified even. It was now dark. I creeped forward and lit my lighter to read a gravestone. I couldn't read it because of my actual shaking and fear. After about 15 seconds in the enclosed graveyard, I quickly exited. Then, the real problem started. As I went back to my friends who were standing at the entrance, they both decided it was best to leave. Apparently, they were bored. We walked out through the entrance and got into his truck, a late 90s GMC pickup. The truck wouldn't start for about five turns of the key. Eventually, it did start. Then the truck's headlights started flickering extremely rapidly, or randomly, from high to low beam, as if being controlled by a person. We started barreling down the gravel road, in fear of whatever it was doing this. Immediately, we noticed that a dense, zero-visibility fog had come around our truck. We could only see about three inches past the headlights, and only the outline of the road. Burton Road extends for probably about two miles either direction out of the cemetery. For that entire stretch, we had no visibility due to the fog, and the truck's lights were behaving erratically, as previously stated. As soon as Burton ended, and we were on the main road, the fog disappeared, and the headlights were fine and have been ever since. No areas that we drove through to get home had fog, and the lights haven't acted that way since. These are the things we have experienced. Cell phones go out as soon as you get onto Burton Road. No service from four different providers, including Virgin, Nokia, Verizon, and TrackPhone. Drums. This is sometimes listed on other sites but not on yours. Odd, bassy but wooden sounding drums are heard. Not like a bass kick drum, a more of a war drum sound, playing simple war beats. Sounds of heavy creatures, peoples, or whatever entities in the woods, snapping sticks, walking in trees, etc. When pulling out, 
a feeling of tugging your extra weight in the car, as if we were riding the brakes or we had about 500 pounds in the trunk. I hope all of this will be helpful in your listings on your hauntings. One last thing, Butler County, Marine State Park, Burton Road, Snyder Cemetery. Red eyes will chase you out. Also, something else will chase you out as well. It is Conrad Snyder who is haunting the family's resting place. I've been reading the stories on the site for a while, and I would like to share one of the many experiences I've had. This was without a doubt one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Now as a little bit of a backstory, I've been aware of the other realm and its inhabitants all my life. Also my mother, her mother, my nana, and her mother, my great nana, have as well. I've been in tune with the entities that are among us my entire life. So, to say that this particular event scared the heck out of me is saying a lot. But I think the only reason why it scared me so much is just because it happened to someone I love and it hit so very close to home. I want to make it very clear that I am absolutely no way being dishonest. Here is my story. My boyfriend and I had just recently gotten together and had only been dating a few months. We were house sitting his parents house while his parents were out of town and we were sleeping in his parents room. Also, we had just gotten our dog, that was a puppy at the time, a week before. This is all relevant to the story. It was a Sunday and things had felt very different that day, not normal and I had taken a nap during the day, which for me, is just simply not something I do. But it was a good thing that I did, and I found out why later. As the day turned to night, around 11 p.m., I tried to get my boyfriend to come to bed with me. He was acting weird, and said that he would be coming to bed really soon. Now, like I said, it was around 11, and anyway, I went to bed, and I ended up jolting awake at 10 minutes till 5 in the morning. I remember because I looked at the clock. Anyway, my boyfriend had not come to bed yet, and all the lights were still on in the house. But I disregarded it, and I laid back down. Then I heard him coming down the hall and got into bed. When he laid down, he obviously sounded very tired, and he said, in almost a dazed voice, that there was a man outside the front window of the house that he and the dog both saw, and they didn't like the way the guy looked. He also said that he had just taken a sleeping pill. Now, my boyfriend kept telling me to look out the window. At this point, I was getting freaked out, because my boyfriend says there is a weird looking guy outside, and he just took a sleeping pill. So I told my boyfriend I was going to call one of my friends that is expertly versed in the ways of the supernatural. And when I told him that, he started saying no, don't call her. And at that point, I immediately called her. Now while I was on the phone with her, my boyfriend shot upright in bed and started repeating the phrase, when all the lights go out. He just kept repeating it. And then, as he was halfway through the saying, his voice changed into the most demonic sounding voice I've ever heard in my life. I have never moved so fast in my life. I turned on all the lights and went to the living room. I was just watching the hall to see if my boyfriend came after me. I was trying to decide if I should go to my car, but I was under the impression that someone was out there, so I felt trapped. But. I finally got enough courage to get to my car, and I never saw anyone outside, and to this day, I still firmly believe the man who my boyfriend saw was the demon. As I sat out there trying to call one of my friends to come to the house so that I wasn't alone, my boyfriend kept calling me from the house. Now, he kept saying on the phone that he couldn't move, yet he was able to call me. Our dog was very small and in a big deep box at the time. 
He kept telling me that our dog was in the hall and bleeding, that he was scared and he needed me. I knew things still weren't right, and then before I knew it, he was speaking and laughing in that demonic voice again. Finally around 6 a.m., my friend showed up and he escorted me into the home. When I got back to the bedroom, my boyfriend was passed out, and I went up to him with my blessed cross, and remember, he's passed out, and every time I got the cross two inches from his hand, he would close his hand. My friend saw that his eyes did not move, and were closed, and he was not awake. If I had not had a witness there, I wouldn't believe it myself. Then, as I turned my back, and started to walk away, he started laughing in that voice again, and telling me to get out. Then, I told the demon that I was aware of what it was trying to do. Then, my boyfriend passed out again. So my friend and I left the home, because I had to go to work. Well, later that day, my boyfriend called me, asking why her dog was in its box in the bathtub with the water running. I had not done that and he obviously didn't do it either. But when I started talking about the events the night, he didn't remember any of it. But he did talk to his mom, and she said that the same thing had happened to his dad many years before. I knew that there was something in that house, but what had visited that night was not it. I grew up on a farm and I had stepbrothers and sisters. We lived in this old farmhouse that had four bedrooms upstairs, and I shared a room with my stepbrother who was about two years younger than me. It was 1986, and I was 17 when this happened. Our room was a small one, but we had two beds in there, and the way I had my bed was at the end of my bed was towards the bedroom door, and then my head was about two feet from the wall because I had a couple rifles, a 22, and my 32 Winchester Special. The night this happened, I was sleeping on my belly with my arms under my pillow, and something woke me up. It wasn't a noise or a light. Maybe it was a dream, but I woke up and kind of pushed myself up a little bit with my arms to look at the door. When I looked, there was this figure, a dark shadow, or better yet, like a silhouette, and for some reason, almost telepathically I learned that it's just one of my sisters. Their room was straight across from mine on the other side, just bringing in one of the cats to sleep with me, because the cat was keeping them up. We had a lot of barn cats that weren't allowed in the house. So I turned back around the way I was before I woke up and laid my head back down and I expected the cat to be put on my bed and the feeling that I got was very comfortable feeling, like everything is okay. A few seconds later, I felt the weight of the cat snuggled up to my side, like it was half on my bed and head and paws on my kidney area of me. I woke up a couple more times feeling this kitty cat still next to me. I was going to reach around and pet it, but I didn't want to wake her up. After a good night of sleep, I woke up and I couldn't believe that the cat was still in my bed and partially on my side, and I did not find a cat on bed with me. I found my 22 rifle laying across my back. I was totally confused by this. I wanted to confirm that it was not me who put my rifle across my back, so I put it back to where I had it before I went to sleep, and to be able to get at it, I would have to have gotten on my knees and reached way over to the corner, and with one arm grabbing it, and I couldn't lift it up at that angle. Of course, nobody had believed in me, so I just never tell the story, except for now. For my next story, I'm going to say something first as it relates to my story. I have what is now known by some as sleep paralysis. I'm sure a lot of you know what this is. When you wake up 
and you are mutually awake, but you cannot move. This is a very terrifying experience. I have heard many theories on this, and the one that makes the most sense to me is by Sylvia Brown. She says that while you sleep, your soul leaves its vehicle, your body, and goes wandering around to various places. As a result, your body wakes up, but you can't do anything about it because your soul isn't back from its journey to whatever. On with the second story. After we had sold the farm, my family moved into this town called Ashland, Wisconsin. I decided that if I wanted to make it in life, I had to go to college. So I stayed in this house my parents bought, which was very old. Not sure what year was built, but it was one of the first ones built when the town started. My room was a very small room, about the size of a large bathroom, but it worked. The year was 1993, and I stayed there throughout my college years till I graduated. One night, again I was sleeping on my belly, and I was in a very deep sleep. Something woke me up, not a noise or light. Everything was as dark as it could get. It woke me up enough where I sat up and I was staring towards my door. I couldn't see my door. It was so dark. I was wide awake and I kept looking at it, almost as if I was in a trance of some sort. All of a sudden, I got this telepathic-like communication that told me that everything is okay. You don't have to worry. This feeling is the most bizarre feeling, as if someone's mind is with my mind, talking to each other. So then I was told to lay down, and don't be scared. Then I got this extremely comforting feeling, so I laid back down, except this time I laid down on my left side. Then I felt someone or something's hand around my neck and it started the squeeze, and then it cocked my head over to the side of my bed, by my neck. Meanwhile, I tried my hardest to yell or scream to wake someone up, but all that could come out of my mouth was a little gargling sound that no one could hear, except for myself. This was extremely terrifying. Then I had the feeling of high voltage electricity that make this humming sound and buzzing sound and feeling this throughout my entire body, I then woke up in the morning in that exact same position that it left me in. So, those are somewhat short versions of my two stories. I have many more like them. Thank you for taking the time to listen. During my college years, my brother and I lived in an old brownstone in South Minneapolis. The apartment itself was large and sublevel with two bedrooms. From the moment we moved in, we knew there was something wrong. On numerous occasions, I saw someone in my hallway moving across the rooms out of the corner of my eye. I always felt that it was my eyes playing tricks on me initially. But then stranger things began to occur. We began to have our television turn itself on at night. The stereo would do the same. I would be sleeping at night, and it would just start blaring. My bedroom was the worst. It was uncomfortable. I became afraid to sleep in there. I could not describe the feeling. I began sleeping out in the living room, or on the futon. Finally, I told myself to stop with the silliness and resign myself to sleep back in the bedroom again. I did so uncomfortably for a few nights, only to be awakened one night by a man's disembodied head hovering above me and smiling. I still very clearly remember it. I screamed as loud as I could and took off out of that room and never slept in it again. We moved out after six months of living there. There was a large home in Martin that I lived in for 20 years. 
It used to be a carriage stop. The first day I was moving in, there was a woman in a black high collared dress peering out at me and my mother. The curtain was being held back and she was fiddling with the brooch and the collar of her dress. Once inside the house, it appeared to be a bundle of gray dusty rags floating in the air close to the ceiling. It swooped down under a doorway and went out through the window. It has been seen many times in the road in front of the house. A man in a black coat with a high collar holding a lantern and swing it back and forth as if to lead the way for persons passing through. Sleeping on the couch one afternoon, a little girl in a blue dress was standing in front of me. I couldn't see her face, but she seemed so real. Lying in bed at night, and sometimes in the morning, footsteps can be heard walking up the stairs. You can't move. You feel a weight that holds you still. All you can see is the boots of a large man. He looks into every bedroom and then goes back downstairs. You can then move. In the parlor, you could hear a party going on, and while that is going on, you hear a baby crying. When my mom and I were sitting in the dining room, we both saw objects being thrown across the laundry room. You feel cold and get goosebumps throughout the house. A while ago, me and my friend were doing a project for school, and we got to choose what we did. So we did ghosts and hauntings, and we used the site, and it helped us loads. But anyway, while we were working, our substitute came over and saw what we were doing, and he asked us if we ever had seen a ghost. I think I've heard a ghost crying, but I wasn't too sure, and my friend hasn't seen anything. But my sub said, that he had seen one. He said that he went to look after his nephew once and he saw something. He said that he went around to his brother's house and while his brother and his wife were getting ready, his nephew came downstairs and told his dad that he had seen the man with the big hat and the funny glasses right upstairs. My teacher asked his brother what he was on about and his brother said that he had seen the ghost again my teacher didn't believe him, but his brother said he'd seen it upstairs. Then when his brother and his bro's wife had gone, his nephew, who was only five, wanted to play football in the garden. So as they were going through the kitchen, his nephew said that the man with the big hat and funny glasses was behind my teacher. He freaked out and was scared to death. He said he just wanted to get out of the house but made himself turn around. He said that he saw a ghastly form that had a pilot's hat on, an old one, not a helmet like nowadays, and that the thing was wearing big goggles. He later found out that his brother's house was built in an old airfield. The story freaked us out. I've been to Rita Road many times and actually know a different story of the road. The ones I saw on your site are new to me. My parents told me the story long ago, and although I've not experienced it for myself, I know others who claim to have. This may be more of a local story, but who knows? It's still something I'd like to share. Back in the 1950s, the road was often used by teens and young adults as a private makeout place. The story goes, that a young lady and her boyfriend made a stop at the road. While they were parked, they heard a thumping on top of the car. They ignored it for a bit, but the girl started to become creeped out as the noise grew louder. The boyfriend decided he would get out and investigate. When he got out, the thumping stopped. After several minutes, the boyfriend had not returned and the thumping started again. The girl panicked and got out of the car. She found her boyfriend bloodied and hung from a tree, and the thumping she was hearing was the sound of her boyfriend's feet hitting the top of the car as he hung there dead. 
supposedly on warm summer nights. If you pull off into the road and park for a bit, you will hear the thumping. And if you get out to investigate, the thumping will stop and you will find a letterman's jacket hanging from the tree above you. There is also an abandoned school out in Cedar Lake where Hammond Baptist used to attend. The story goes that the pastor went crazy and removed some of the little ones from this world, if you know what I mean. I've personally have experienced strange happenings in the school, such as children's voices, windows that were shut on the way in open as we walked back out. Supposedly, it's supposed to be the little ones trying to escape. From what I understand a few years ago, part of the building caught fire inexplicably. I haven't been there in about five years. However, if you would like some directions to the place, it's a little tricky to get to, and I would be happy to share them with you if you are interested. Like I said, this is a story passed on to me by my parents, and others I know also know the story and claim to have witnessed it. I'm also aware of the satanic gatherings in the field, down the trail in the woods, usually occurring during the two equinox every year. This may explain some of the animal parts we found. Also, in this field, I've seen glowing orbs here and there, but never thought much of them since they were out far in the field. But you may be able to look into this more than I can. Oh, and the girl that jumped into the river and drowned. She is also part of this story, and Hammond, of course. She can be seen on Halloween night on Klein Avenue, hitchhiking to get to her wedding. Supposedly, if you pick her up, she thanks you for the ride and then disappears into the night. My name is Gemma. I went to a primary school in a small village where I lived for a year or two. Then we had to move into a town nearby. It wasn't too far away from my friends, so sometimes I would catch the bus there. One day, I went up to see my friend Holly. She told me that my old deputy head teacher had just died. I don't know how old he was, but apparently he got murdered. That night, Holly asked me to stay at her house for the night, so I did. We were only about ten at the time. Her parents were downstairs, and her two little brothers were both asleep. We were the only people awake upstairs. Holly went downstairs to get something to eat for me and her, and left me alone. I decided to play a trick on her. I turned all the lights off and hid under a bed in her room. I looked around. I was really scared. So I looked up and saw two eyes looking at me. They were glowing. At that point, I closed my eyes, thinking it was just my imagination. When I opened my eyes, they were still there. I stayed under the bed because I didn't want to move. Then, I heard Holly coming up the stairs. The eyes backed away into the darkness, and I backed away and hid again. When Holly came into the room, I jumped out and scared her. I told her about the eyes, and she believed me. Then she said, let's take a look inside the wardrobe. So we both opened it slowly and took a look inside. Funny enough, nothing was in there except for her clothes and stuff, so we both decided that it was me seeing things because it was dark. Later that night, Holly turned the lights off, and we both went to sleep. I couldn't get to sleep, and I kept on looking over at the wardrobe. I laid there with my eyes open, when suddenly, I saw the eyes again, looking over at me. I slid under my covers. When I looked out, they had gone, but I could feel something in the room. I knew something was there. 
Suddenly, a black figure appeared in front of me. It laid down, and then I saw the eyes. It was staring right at me. I screamed, which woke Holly up, and she suddenly backed away against the wall. We could both see the black figure on the floor. Then it seemed to sink into the ground and disappear. We both went downstairs and stayed there for a couple of hours. We talked about the figure for ages. Then I said it reminded me of something. Holly said that as well, if we both realized that it looked like Mr. Baker. Why would he haunt us, though? We'll never know. When I was younger, I had quite a few paranormal experiences, as did my mom. The most direct contact either of us had with spirits was with her father. He died at home and lived with us when I was about four. My mom was very close to him, and I was pretty close to him too for being so young. After he died, my mom would often be house cleaning and walk into his room where his old recliner sat and smell his unique scent, cigarette smoke mixed with cologne and whatnot. She never saw or heard him, but she would know he was there and would talk to him for a while. When I was six, we moved out of the house he died in and into the house where my mom still lives. I never had the type of encounters my mom had with them. But I was lucky enough to see him once. First, I need to explain the setup of our house. The front and back doors are directly parallel to each other, and both have glass panes in them. The front door opens into the dining room, and he can walk straight through to the kitchen, and then to the back door. You can look from the front porch all the way into the backyard through the glass in these doors. When I was about seven, I was standing in the kitchen, looking out the window of the back door, and I could see the reflection of the front door in the glass. Suddenly, I saw my grandfather walk by the front door in the reflection, as though he was walking across the front porch. He smiled and waved at me. The whole thing only lasted a split second but he was very deliberately contacting me. I believe he chose to do it in such an indirect way so as to not frighten me. Maybe he was saying goodbye since I was too young to understand when he actually died. What's really strange though is that I described him to my mom as looking younger than he did when he died. And when she showed me some pictures of him in his 40s, I told her that that's exactly how he appeared to me. She thinks he must have been happiest during that time of his life, and so chose to appear that way. I think it was a couple years after that when my mom had her final encounter with him. She was house cleaning again, when she smelled his familiar odor. She was in a hurry, and she told him I'm sorry, Dad. I can't really talk right now and left the room. When she came back in, the scent was gone, and she just knew that was the last time she would hear from him. She feels guilty that she didn't stop to talk to him, but I think she just realized that she was ready to move on, and that's why he didn't contact her again. We do believe that he stuck around for a while after that, because he would often lose a piece of jewelry or something small only to have it turn up right under our noses a few days later. I've had other experiences unrelated to my grandfather, but his was the only human spirit I ever actually saw. Not long after we moved into the new home, I had several experiences with feline spirits. I once saw the hind legs and tail of a cat disappearing into, not up, the top of the stairs from the landing. I know it could have been our own cat, because it was pure white, and our two cats were black. Another time, I was sitting at the kitchen table, 
when I felt a cat rubbing against my legs. I reached down to pet it, but nothing was there. And when I looked under the table, there was no cat to be found. There were also a few incidents in my mom's house where electronics would do seemingly things on their own. The TV turned itself off at least twice that I could remember. But perhaps the weirdest instance was when I was in my bedroom listening to my stereo. It has one of those LED screens that flashes at things as music plays. And when you turn the volume knob, these bars show up on the screen that move up or down as you change the volume. I was listening to music one day, and I had my back to the stereo. When I realized the volume was getting lower, I turned around, and the volume display came up on the screen, and the bars were going down like the knob was being turned. I turned the volume back up, and nothing else happened after that. This has gotten long, but I only have one more experience to share. At another sleepover with my best friend, we decided to leave a tape recorder with a blank tape in an empty room while we hung out in the living room and record whatever there was to hear. No one went in the room while I was recording, and the door was shut. When we played it back, we could very faintly hear ourselves in the living room for most of the tape and nothing else. But there was one spot on the tape where a high-pitched voice spoke in a loud, raspy whisper. It was obviously neither of us, because you could hear us in the background very softly behind it. We weren't sure what it said, but it sounded like shine a light. It didn't make any sense, but it did creep us out. That was the only unexplained voice on the tape, which unfortunately... I no longer have. That was the last experience I had that I'm certain had no physical explanation. This is a story about ghosts that I think is worth sharing. It's a little bizarre and not very detailed, but I think it would capture your interest. When I was young, I always heard ghost stories revolving around these red coat ghosts. These were entities that would often appear in our house. The home I lived in used to house British soldiers from Napoleon's time, so essentially the late 1700s. I remember one particular incident. It was late at night, and that's when I started to hear strange noises in my room. At first, I brushed them off, not thinking anything of it, because you can always explain these incidents away as nothing more than just normal noises. Then, I started to hear noises which were very peculiar. I would hear faded whispers, like a group of people whispering when I would open my door to investigate the sound. It wasn't anything loud, and didn't last for too long. Of course, I ended up going down that staircase to find a root cause of these whispers. What I saw next was actually quite interesting to me. Not scary, although a bit unbelievable. After going downstairs and into the living room, I saw two red coat soldiers for a second, just standing side by side as they quickly faded from the living room. They also had a foggy and faded quality to them to begin with, where you could barely tell a figure was there with the red colors. I'll never forget the moment the rest of my life. Growing up in Lakeland, Florida, my parents purchased a repossessed mobile home. One of the bedroom doors had a deadbolt lock, but face of the child in the room could not get out. My elder sister had this room and reported a small girl about the age of five or six that would appear in a white nightgown carrying a teddy bear. 
she would sit at the end of my sister's bed and just cry. In the closet of the bedroom in the same home, there were stickers and drawings on the wall where it appeared someone was punished and made to sit in the closet. There were also fingernail scratches on the wall in the same closet. In the third children's room of the same home, there was brown carpeting with a lime green shape on the floor that was the same shape of a clothes iron. If an iron fell onto carpeting while it was hot, doesn't it make sense it would just burn the carpet hair instead of change the color to green? My aunt even had to come remove a spirit once that was following my little sister all the way to school and hiding behind things when she turned around to see who was following her. My little sister said it resembled a grim reaper type of shadow. In the same home, items would mysteriously be moved to another area. Things would then come up missing, then all of a sudden reappear one day. I truly believe that we are not living alone on this earth, and that spirits live among us. There are a lot of theories as to why this is, but to me, I believe that ghosts and spirits are almost other living forms trapped in another dimension. Even if we have loved ones who have passed and appeared to us, to me, it's like they are leaving this realm of existence to enter another one, and they behave much like we all do, often unaware of the world they just left. I believe that the ones that chose to bridge the gap between our world and theirs are messengers chosen by God to give us confirmation that we as human beings will not lose purpose once we have left this earth, and that our souls do live on. Even if you aren't the religious type, I do believe that if ghosts exist, then God must exist in some form. Otherwise, how do these souls still live on, and what power is allowing them to exist in the other universe? Anyway, my ghost experience comes at the time I was staying at my grandmother's. It was night, and I was 11 years old. I was watching TV in the living room when I heard what sounded like my grandfather, who was a heavy set man, but tall, make his way through the home. Noticeable footsteps, as if he were wearing boots, and they were walking across the hardwood floor. At the time, I immediately recognized it was probably my deceased grandpa. So I yelled out to Grandpa Bunky, please stop scaring me. I was hoping I would get confirmation of him leaving me alone because I'm a very anxious person. And even though I'm in tune with spirits, sometimes I just don't want to deal with it. I don't think my grandpa honestly meant any harm by it. But I think he felt that he wasn't getting enough attention, if that makes sense, and wanted his presence to really be known that day. He was always known as a loud, boisterous person in life, the kind of man that had to be the center of attention. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I could have swear I saw the shadow of my grandfather materialize. As soon as I got up to turn directly to where he was, he was gone and faded. So I rushed downstairs to where my grandma was. I really wanted to make sure that nobody else was upstairs. So I just asked grandma if she was just up the stairs in the hall. She emphatically said no and asked me why I was so concerned. I told her that I saw Grandpa, and she said that Grandpa is gone, and that while you may miss him, we have to accept this. She didn't believe in the afterlife. Funny thing was, about a year before this all happened, my great uncle died of a disease in his lungs and kidneys. This was the exact same disease that my Grandpa had died from. While that's not unusual, my older sister told me she witnessed the exact same thing that happened to me. 
One night, when I was at a friend's house sleeping over, she was about 17 at the time. So, I'm not entirely sure if it was my grandpa, or great uncle exactly, but I still think my grandpa was the one to visit, because he knew me better than my great uncle did. I also think that it had to be my grandpa, because maybe he wanted my grandma to believe, but since she is closed off to this world because of her views, he was frustrated. Maybe he gave her signs, and she ignored them. Are frustrated ghosts a thing? Anyway, hope you enjoyed my story. I have a crazy story to tell. I live in New Orleans. That's of course located in Louisiana, the deep south. One night, me and my girlfriend were at home, and I'm guessing it was around 5.30 in the morning. I'm assuming, because that's when I got up to go to work, and I always sit by the window and wait for my ride. This morning was a bit unusual and different. I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I felt this overwhelming chill brush past me, like an undeniable cold air. I asked my girlfriend if she was cold, and she said no. I don't know what it was, but something told me to tell her to sit in my chair to see if she felt what I was describing. It was a lingering cold that didn't go away, and told me she could feel the cold chill as well. It gave us both goosebumps, and within a few moments, the coldness quickly disappeared. The crazy part is, I think the chair is haunted. It was given to me as a present from generations in the family. I'm talking an early 1900s style rocking chair. I remember one of my uncles wanted to just sell it off eBay to get rid of it because he didn't want anything to do with it. So I ended up taking it off his hands because of the family history. The most interesting part of this chair is a lot of my family members have claimed to see a black figure in that chair rocking back and forth on numerous occasions. At times, it would be seen rocking on its own without anything being seen. I still have yet to witness anything like this, but ironically, a friend staying over our house actually did. It was later that night, and my girlfriend and I were in a separate room. Suddenly, my friend screams for us to come in because he just saw the rocking chair move on its own without any force. He didn't even know about the history of that chair and our family. So that made it even more terrifying, but intriguing in a way. My dad had stayed in our house once, and he sat looking out the window. There was a tree outside our home, and late at night, he saw a faded man in overalls walk behind the tree and suddenly disappear. Again, none of these things have personally happened to me, but they seem to be happening to my family and friends. None of them are capable of lying. I don't see why anyone would anyway, since we're all older, mature adults, and we have no business lying for attention or any purpose, really. Now, just because I said I didn't experience anything, besides the coldness in the chair, it doesn't mean my girlfriend hasn't. She told me one day when she was out on the front porch where you could see the tree, it was evening, it was getting pretty dark, but not so dark, you couldn't see anything. She too thought she saw a very dark shadow move around the tree and then disappear. She said it was the weirdest thing because it was like a fog and you could easily see the contrast between the tree and this mysterious fog. I don't know if you've seen these type of videos before on YouTube. Will they show this type of stuff? But she said it was very similar to that. She's also seen the blinds from the window where the chair is positioned move from time to time without any explanation. Knocks on the walls 
And sometimes her name is whispered into her ear. Again, these are her experiences. So I can't tell you if it's real based on what she said. But again, my girlfriend wouldn't lie to me for no reason. As you know, New Orleans is a city with lots of history dating back hundreds of years. And with her old home, there's bound to be some entity, especially with the haunted chair. Do you believe in this? Because honestly, as crazy as it may seem, I do, even without having these experience for my own to share. As an open-minded person, I'm not just going to hate on someone just because they have a ghost story to tell. I'll be open-minded. I'll consider their credibility and other things. If all those aspects of their personality check out, then yes, I'll have to believe them. This world is fascinating. It has a lot of mystery. I will not just ignore the spirit world. I just wish that I could experience it too. Just once. What everyone else has as well. Subscribe, 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 share, comment, like, bye.